Today we will examine a horrifying case involving envy and insatiable greed, two powerful yet dark emotions which often drive individuals down criminal paths. When combined with unbridled sexual desire or an obsessive need to control others, these feelings can quickly transform into lethal plans that threaten innocent lives, an idea made even more chilling when these emotions simmer within a family unit. This story takes place in a Sydney suburb and centers around the Lynn family, who were seemingly living a peaceful and large household before embarking on what has since been one of Australia's most notorious crimes. Complex and prolonged, this investigation stands out for its difficulty and duration. As the perpetrator group had every intention of evading justice with their carefully crafted and brutally implemented plan, however, one minor detail eventually led the police to their breakthrough. Let's explore its origins, such as greed, envy for others' success, corrupt passion driving someone into madness transforming into monstrous figures who wouldn't spare children in their spree. The Lynn family story is one of love, ambition, and tragedy. Min Lin and Yoon Lin began their romantic entanglement during their college years at an Australian university during the late 1980s. Both natives of China but separately immigrating for higher education, Lily via an exchange program and Min after completion of his bachelor's degree, respectively. When their paths crossed on campus corridors later, it was love at first sight. Both felt out of place but united by shared hopes for starting new lives after graduation. Min and Yoon married and moved into North Epping in Sydney's tranquil suburb. Over time, their love blossomed into a tight-knit family deeply connected and committed to each other. In August 1994, they welcomed their first child, June Brenda Lynn, commonly known by her middle name Brenda, followed by Henry in 1997 and Terry two years later. Entering 2000, Min and Yoon embarked upon an ambitious business venture, opening a small newsstand. Their commitment soon saw it transformed into a flourishing news agency complete with its publishing arm on Rose Street. The Lin family business thrived, affording them an increasingly comfortable lifestyle with a spacious home, luxury car, and access to elite private schooling for their children. Min focused on business matters, while Yoon took care in nurturing her children at home and homeschooling them herself. Within their community, the Lins were widely respected for their hard work, kindness, philanthropy, and being caring parents, without ever engaging in disputes or dramas with anyone. Brenda was their eldest, an outstanding student with a compassionate nature who demonstrated this through her studies. Henry and Terry, her brothers, shared her zest for sports, especially soccer, as they developed close bonds that almost inseparably bound them together. As Lynn family settled into Australia and experienced growing financial stability, they welcomed relatives from China to visit or stay. Over time, they even invited relatives from China to visit or stay permanently. Early in 2000, Min and Yun moved their parents from California to North Epping for help raising their three children, while Min's father continued working his newsstand on weekends. A few years later, Yun's parents also came over with Min and Yoon purchasing them a small home there, as they bought themselves one too. Later still, Yoon's sister Irene came and lived with the Lins, helping with housework as well as raising Irene and the Lin children. At this point, the Lin family business was producing significant income, reported at nearing one million annually. Their venture wasn't just a shop or publishing house. Instead, it had become a central gathering spot where local residents would meet to read news over coffee. At the end of 2007, Kathy Lin, Nai, along with her husband Liang Bin Robert Z, also made a move to Australia, seeking better opportunities in Sydney. While visiting relatives previously and briefly living in Melbourne before returning home again, this time they intended to make Australia their permanent home. Robert had tried his luck as an ENT doctor in China before attempting entrepreneurship. They opened a restaurant using all their savings but it eventually closed, and subsequent attempts at opening cafes or snack bars also proved futile. Robert, lacking business acumen or financial management skills, struggled in his new endeavors despite best intentions of opening new ventures. Robert and Kathy relocated to North Epping in order to be closer to family. While Kathy found employment, Robert continued his quest for self-discovery, 
and was uncertain of his next steps. Both Lin and Z families were bound together, not just by blood but also strong friendship, seeing each other almost daily and staying in constant touch through regular family meals. This final gathering took place Friday, July 17, 2009, at Kathy and Min's parents' home, unbeknownst to any of them that this would be their final reunion. On the morning of July 18th, the Lin family home became the scene of an unspeakable massacre. Their shop, which had previously operated seven days a week for years, closed suddenly without notice or warning on its doors. This caused alarm among both regular customers and neighboring store owners who tried unsuccessfully to contact Min directly and instead decided to call his sister Kathy instead to inquire into his condition. Kathy was both surprised and alarmed knowing her brother Min had never closed his shop without prior arrangement, often having one of his father's or father-in-law's cover for him. Kathy attempted calling Min, and then his wife Yoon without success. Neither their home phone nor Kathy's calls went through either. Concerned for his well-being, Kathy decided with Robert to visit Min's residence to check that everything was all right. Arriving around 9 a.m., they noticed their family car parked in the driveway and found an unlocked front door, but no sign of its residence. Inside was eerily quiet with calls for family members going unanswered. No evidence was visible indicating forced entry, as she continued calling out for him on her way up the stairs to call out. Kathy eventually decided to ascend to the second floor balcony for support from there. As soon as she entered Min and Yun Lin's bedroom door, she was shocked and horrified at what she found inside an entire room soaked with blood, covering its floor, walls, ceiling, furniture, and curtains. Yun Lin was found lying lifeless near her bed, her face disfigured beyond recognition. In an adjacent room where his sister Irene, aged 39 years, slept, the scene was equally horrifying. Irene lay dead on her mattress with blood-stained face. Henry, 12 years old, and Terry, 9 years old, had both been brutally beaten to death in their bedrooms. Their bodies lay scattered about. Brenda, their 15-year-old daughter, had thankfully been away on a school trip at that time, and so wasn't at home during this horrific night of violence. Min Lin had gone missing, raising hopes that he might still be alive, or injured, or taken hostage, or have managed to flee. Kathy immediately called emergency services, but she was too in shock to properly explain what had happened screaming and sobbing into the phone, beseeching them to come quickly in an effort to save as many lives as possible from what had transpired at their household. Unfortunately, first responders could only confirm all deaths at the site of massacre. Robert left right away to collect Robert Lynn and Kathy Lynn's parents, who lived 10 kilometers from the crime scene, after hearing of its shocking discovery following their calls to emergency services, police, and paramedics arrived within minutes and witnessed one of the most horrifying crime scenes they'd ever witnessed. Unfortunately for all members of Lin family who had already been killed with multiple blows to the head from an object resembling a hammer-shaped weapon which investigators believed had been taken away by its perpetrator. Unfortunately for all members of Lin family, each had already died by multiple strikes, by multiple blows from this lethal weapon which had taken with its perpetrator. Min Lin's body was discovered in his own bedroom, covered by a blood-stained blanket, and had been brutally beaten to death like his family members. An initial inspection of the scene produced no significant leads or clues. No lethal weapon had been seen, and all valuables and money had remained undisturbed, suggesting that their primary target may have been killing off the Lin family as opposed to theft. At first, Multiple assailants were suspected, since it appeared unlikely that one person could overcome so many. However, evidence revealed that children were awake during the attack and desperately tried to flee, evidenced by bloodstains and splatters around the house. All adult victims displayed signs of strangulation, possibly intended to limit resistance during assault. In addition to head injuries, bloody shoe prints were discovered in each room, each featuring its own tread pattern but without being identifiable to a brand or size. No foreign fingerprints were discovered suggesting the killers wore gloves. Initially, there were no leads or theories, as family friends and neighbors of Lin's had no known enemies 
who might have committed such a brutal murder spree of five people, nor a motive behind such an atrocious crime occurring sometime between midnight and 3 OELM on July 18th. The time and date of attack remains unknown, but its time and date remain unclear, most likely occurring sometime between midnight and 3 OELM on July 18th. Brenda Lynn was on a school trip in New Caledonia when the tragic incident unfolded, learning of it via social media and initially refusing to believe that it involved her family. Her Aunt Kathy soon called with confirmation, breaking down sobbing during their conversation. Brenda was quickly flown back home where her new guardians met her at Sydney Airport before moving in together, with them due to the home being sealed as a crime scene. Next day, Grieving Brenda was brought in for questioning at the police station, but could provide no new information, insisting her family had no enemies or ill-wishers, and had witnessed nothing unusual before traveling on this trip. Following their deaths, Brenda became heir to an extensive fortune containing both property and her family business. But as a minor still attending school, her legal guardians, Aunt Kathy and Robert, would manage it on her behalf, although Brenda's grandparents offered support as well. Kathy and Robert insisted upon being her primary caretakers. Robert threatened legal action if elderly relatives attempted to seek custody, arguing they were too old for caring for a teenager. Eventually, however, the matter was resolved amicably, and Brenda stayed with her aunt and uncle. Lynn's shop and publishing business soon reopened under their management as Brenda was yet to take over business operations. Robert began actively reviewing all family accounts, including bank accounts, savings, real estate assets, and any other potential holdings that might become assets over time. Investigation and theories experts carefully examined every detail of the crime scene. Unfortunately, no concrete leads were developed from their efforts. Instead, they concluded that the killer likely operated alone and entered quietly through either an unlocked door or key wearing size 9.5 shoes with an ornate tread pattern and never carrying his lethal weapon, a hammer, never found anywhere in or around the house, wearing gloves meant no fingerprints were left behind, and only trace DNA evidence from five victims could be detected at this location. Bloodstains were observed on all bedroom doorknobs where crimes had taken place, suggesting the killer touched them with his bloody gloves. Brenda's room, however, lacked this marker indicating they knew she wasn't present, and didn't bother leaving his mark there either. As one of Australia's high-profile cases, this tragic event received widespread media coverage. Without solid evidence or suspects to point the finger at, various unlikely theories began surfacing, including speculation regarding Lynn's supposed vast fortune, leading up to their demise. There were speculations of robberies gone awry or involvement of local Chinese mafia clans. Such speculation wasn't entirely discounted considering their area's history with burglaries. Lynn's shop had been attacked months prior, while men had witnessed an armored car robbery, which a week before, fatal incidents. As criminals wore masks, so he wasn't easily identifiable as witnesses, so it was speculated he might have been removed as potential witnesses, as potential witnesses, as men could not identify them so might have been eliminated as potential witnesses before these tragic incidents unfolded. Long months passed with no lead being established on any theory, nor any suspects appearing. Money and valuables were left untouched during the killing, suggesting the killer had only one goal, eliminating household members. Furthermore, power was cut off on the night of fatal incidents, suggesting they knew where the electrical panel was located. Additionally, their familiarity with the house in total darkness suggested they may have even secured an access key beforehand. An investigator reviewed every detail of the perplexing case until one key overlooked clue emerged while listening to Kathy's emergency call recording, searching for any missed clues. Surprisingly, an important hint was found within that recording. It recorded her attempts at explaining the situation, their words often confused and interrupted by cries and sobs until at the end when the operator confirmed emergency services had arrived. She suddenly mentioned her husband by name while speaking, Cantonese directly addressing him as part of the phone call itself. Investigators were intrigued when Kathy began to plead with Robert not to leave her alone at home, 
an important detail given his decision to fetch Lynn parents on his own before calling police, leaving Kathy alone at a grisly crime scene where five had just been brutally taken away and possibly still be hiding inside. Yet he left, seemingly knowing nothing bad would come of it for his wife Kathy. After several fruitless months, police finally managed to secure new information regarding their main suspect and new evidence against him, her. Robert Z was ultimately identified as the main and sole suspect. It was found that Min had given Robert a key to Min's home, just in case anything came up during interrogation sessions. Yet Robert never mentioned this during interrogation sessions or informed Kathy of this key being given him by Min. Brenda accidentally revealed this critical piece of information to investigators. Further investigations revealed that Robert's claims of being an accomplished ENT doctor were no more than an illusion. While he held a medical degree, he never held down a stable job within his field of medicine. According to reports circulating about China bribery allegations, after fleeing there to Australia, he failed to establish himself professionally, spending away all of his savings in unprofitable business ventures before finally moving back home where he depended on his wife Kathy's income, as well as occasionally receiving financial help from relatives. Once his guardianship papers for Brenda were finalized, Robert began acting as though he were inheritor of Lin family assets. His first move was forcing Yun's parents out of a home Min had purchased for them, albeit it legally belonged to Min. Min and Kathy's parents continued living in it. Investigators suspected Robert was driven by intense jealousy of more successful and wealthy relatives of Brenda and harboring long-standing plans to seize their property, funds, and lucrative businesses. Brenda and Kathy lived under the same roof with Robert, the perpetrator of their family's crime, yet neither were immediately in danger due to Robert's lack of insight or clues from Kathy about his true nature. Furthermore, Robert needed her for control of family assets, but due to lack of concrete evidence against Robert, police could not arrest him yet. Interrogation, surveillance, and arrest. The investigation team obtained permission to install hidden cameras in the household with hopes of gathering evidence against Robert Z. Its breakthrough came unexpectedly quickly. During an interrogation with Kathy Z, Robert's preference for one brand of shoes became known. Over several years prior, he purchased two pairs from a limited edition series that particularly appealed to him. One had already worn out, leaving another stored away carefully at their home. Both pairs shared the same size 9.5 foot size that his killer wore. Robert was captured on one of the hidden cameras, carefully destroying a box of shoes from which they had purchased, leading police to issue a search warrant and search his home, where they discovered new pair of size 9.5 sneakers, matching prints found at the crime scene, and also in smeared trace that appeared similar to blood in Robert's garage, which forensic analysis revealed contained all five Lynn family victim DNA, thus connecting him directly with this crime. Arrest, Trial and Shocker Revealer Two years after the tragic incidents occurred, evidence led to Robert Z's arrest in May 2011. He denied any involvement by saying blood found in his garage had appeared after returning from visiting Lynn's house. Further, any significance attached to sneakers with matching tread patterns found on them were disregarded as they were new and that they had already disposed of any old pair he may have owned immediately before their discovery. Robert had unknowingly shared prison cells with multiple informants for three years prior to being sent for trial, unaware that any had known about it. While speaking with one informant, he revealed how meticulously planned and covert. He planned the crime and carefully covered up its tracks, such as purchasing lethal weapon at store without surveillance cameras, drugging his wife with sedative-laced tea so she would sleep through him leaving without waking, disposing of hammer, sneakers, gloves, and clothing so they would never be found again. Dispersal from store without surveillance cameras as well. At his trial, Robert denied everything. All evidence against him consisted of statements from his cellmates and indirect evidence mentioned earlier. Therefore, the jury could not reach an unanimous verdict and Robert was released on bail in December 2015. In June 2016, however, Robert was brought back into court following testimony from an informant that claimed Robert confessed his love of Brenda since she was 13. This testimony caused Brenda to tearfully admit to coercion 
into sexual relationships shortly after moving in with them, but she remained quiet for fear of reprisals so long ago. As a result of these revelations and other evidence, Robert Z was found guilty on all counts and given five life sentences without parole for each of the fatal crimes he had committed. All his subsequent appeals were also unsuccessful. Share your opinion with us in the comments and subscribe to the channel for more. Guatemala has an extremely high crime rate. According to statistics, at least 100 crimes are reported every week here, half being so-called domestic offenses and nearly 70% of serious offenses still unsolved according to the New Yorker. Furthermore, more civilians were killed during Iraq war zone attacks than Guatemala during 2009. Tragic events that we will discuss today occurred in this beautiful but dangerous country. El Maria Lopez began life romantically but ended in tragedy as she fell victim to her abusive domestic partner, whom she spent years forgiving, giving him another chance. There has been considerable confusion surrounding this case, and its perpetrator could have avoided taking responsibility, so let us review everything in sequence. Who is El Maria Lopez? Her full birth name, which was given at birth, was El Maria del Rio Morales Lopez. She was born March 17, 1995, in a small town called San Cristobal Verapaz, to A. Morales and Brian Lopez, who raised two children. Omar was raised separately, but El Maria became close with both. As an infant, she nearly died due to an intestinal obstruction. Doctors offered no guarantees, but her mother still believed she would recover soon, which ultimately was true. Despite the complex operation being performed so soon, after her mother began praying and believing her daughter would recover soon enough. Thankfully, the surgery itself did not hinder or impact her development at all. Despite this early stage occurrence, El Maria was actively engaged in sports during her school years, particularly gymnastics and athletic sections of both. Additionally, she enjoyed classical choreography, something which allowed her to easily connect with different people and quickly make friends. Furthermore, El Maria excelled academically while showing great promise in humanities studies. After graduating school, El Maria decided to further her education at an elite state university. She chose law, then later specializing in criminalistics, something which had always captured her imagination. At age 24, El Maria visited Coban, the capital of Alta Vera Paz, to commemorate her older brother's 25th birthday and give him what had long been on his wish list, a motorcycle, her parents and sister visited a car dealership there and met the polite, attentive sales consultant named Jorge, who provided them with the entire assortment before offering advice about which models might suit best. El Maria decided on one model, but decided it best after consulting her family head first, before leaving with business cards from both dealerships as well as leaving her phone number so future contacts could follow up. Soon she received a phone call from Jorge her consultant from the salon, but this conversation was more personal in nature. Jorge then dialed El Maria's number several more times before finally taking the bold step to ask her out to a coffee shop. It was clear he greatly desired meeting this beautiful brunette, but was uncertain where he should start his pursuit of knowing her better. Attracted by Jorge as much as she was by him, El Maria accepted his proposal of meeting. A year was no barrier between them. Almost instantly, they began an intimate romantic relationship that quickly blossomed. Both felt it was love at first sight, and both believed a long and happy future lay ahead for them. After only several months, they decided to live together despite disapproval from both parents. By six months later, they were married in an intimate ceremony, with only those closest to them attending as guests. Unsurprisingly, issues began on the wedding day when the institution where the banquet would take place encountered difficulties, almost derailing their holiday celebration. They had to overpay in order to have their ceremony still take place on time. Who is Jorge? Mez. Unfortunately, there is only limited information about El Maria's intended partner Jorge available to the public. We know he was born in 1996 in Santa Catalina, Latina town in central Guatemala. Jorge was one of two sons raised together. 
Due to financial pressures at home and family life balancing on the edge of poverty, Jorge wasn't spoiled with extravagant clothes or toys like many children would receive. Rather, only enough was available for basic needs such as housing. Jorge was not driven to seek out better opportunities. Therefore, he did not pursue education and job searching. Instead, he just drifted along his course without bothering to seek better situations for himself. People who knew Jorge described him as being uncommunicative and sometimes aggressive. His emotions often overpowered his rational decisions, leading to him not having many friends or creating successful relationships between sexes. He made every effort to woo her love, then in a rush got married out of fear that she might change her mind. Meanwhile, El Maria's parents initially treated her prospective son-in-law suspiciously. There was something they did not approve of in this young man, yet were powerless to stop their daughter from marrying him. An Unhappily Marriage Soon after their wedding, a young wife became pregnant. But as she had not completed university yet, it proved difficult for her to secure employment. No one wanted to hire an inexperienced girl in such an undesirable position, so she settled for casual labor instead. Meanwhile, her husband had lost his job but was in no rush to find another occupation of his own. After they gave birth to Alice, Jorge convinced his wife that their family's only solution would be temporary living arrangements with his parents' house. Jorge successfully convinced his wife of his plan. El Maria initially refused, but as there was no other choice, and they could no longer stay on the streets with a baby in tow, she eventually agreed. Ah knew of El Maria's family problems and repeatedly persuaded her to return home. But El Maria refused and persisted, saying everything would soon improve with her husband. There was no cause for worry. One day, when visiting her daughter and granddaughter at Jorge's parents' home, the mother found an alarming picture. El Maria was in such poor health that she only consumed food once per day. Jorge's family did nothing for her well-being. El Maria was living at her mother-in-law's home and receiving only limited food. Malnourishment could potentially compromise both her own and the child's health. Unfortunately, El Maria encountered more challenges and troubles at her in-law's home than just lack of sustenance. At first, El Maria was frequently bullied and even assaulted by Jorge's younger brother, as he became angry over Alice's crying and presence of children's items in their house, throwing items like toys at El Maria repeatedly, once even firing off a baby bottle at El Maria that hit Alice while still being held by El Maria herself. Jorge saw all this unfold, but did not stand up for either his wife or daughter, and instead treated them like strangers. Ah convinced her daughter to take her granddaughter back with them and return to Ah's parents' house, but soon Jorge appeared and insisted his wife return, promising that he could get work and taking steps toward that end. Eventually she agreed, but only if Jorge could rent an apartment so they could live independently from his parents. El Maria finally fulfilled a long-standing dream when she won a job as an investigator with the city prosecutor's office. An intelligent, talented, and very responsible young woman, El Maria quickly gained respect amongst her colleagues before gradually climbing her career ladder. Over time, financial circumstances improved significantly enough that their family could afford a car of their own thanks solely to El Maria's hard work. Her efforts were highly appreciated by superiors who respected her efforts. Jorge was still trying to discover who he was, choosing instead to live at his wife's expense. Jealous, lazy, and domestically oppressive were just a few characteristics Jorge displayed. These behaviors escalated over team, with explosive temper tantrums from both him and his wife. Georgia was not happy working, preferring to sit home watching TV with his friends while drinking beer and spending what his wife earned. Additionally, Jorge was pathologically jealous and attempted to control every move made by his beloved partner. He did not permit her to form friendships, have lunch with colleagues in cafes, or be anywhere without him present. He constantly checked her phone, looking at its call history and messages as well as prohibiting her from opening accounts on social networks. At home, when left to his own devices, the husband behaved similarly, creating scandals seemingly out of nowhere and continually clarifying relations before placing all blame for problems and family tension on his wife. 
Jorge was not protective of his wife while living at his parents' house and would allow her to be humiliated, insulted, and even physically attacked by relatives, sometimes succumbing to their force with physical threats, other times allowing his fists to fly even though this action seemed inappropriate at times. He treated El Maria like his property, believing she would endure all his abuse. Neighbors frequently heard screams coming from inside their house, as well as witnessed signs of beatings on her body and face. El Maria repeatedly attempted to leave her marriage and file for a divorce. She tried several times to move with their daughter from their rented apartment into El, Mariah's parents' house, but each time her abusive husband came there and begged for forgiveness. Instead of listening to what her parents advised El, Maria always forgave him, giving him another chance. After another argument over manhandling, El Maria took three-year-old Alice into her car and came crying back home to her mother's house. A day later, Jorge showed up, seemingly seeking either El Maria back or their car back. Instead, he professed that his life would change now that he had found employment, promising never again to raise his hand against her. Surprising, El Maria believed him and went with Jorge back to their rented apartment together. Midway through January 2021, El Maria called her mother, Ah, in distress, about how her husband had both failed to secure employment and stolen all the earnings that El Maria had earned while at work, leaving the family penniless. Feeling sorry for El Maria, Ah offered some money so El Maria and her granddaughter would have enough to cover all needs until Ah received her salary payment. A meeting was scheduled on January 19th, but El Maria never showed up and failed to respond to phone calls or messages, something which was very unusual from her. Concerned, Ah decided to visit her daughter's workplace the next day, where she learned that El Maria hadn't shown up and no one had been able to reach her. Jorge arrived at the prosecutor's office shortly afterwards in search of El Maria. According to him, they had once more quarreled and that El Maria had gone back home and wasn't answering calls due to being offended by him. Ah quickly sensed something was amiss and assumed Jorge was telling lies. Therefore, she took swiftly with her daughter-in-law before heading straight for police, so the search for El Maria could begin as quickly as possible. That same day, an alert system called Alerta Isabel Claudina was announced nationwide as an emergency search was initiated for a young woman reported as missing. At the outset of the massive search, her husband was immediately identified as a suspect Indeed, one might argue he was the sole individual to be suspected in her disappearance. El Maria had no adversaries or reason to suspect she had been taken captive, with Jorge being her last known contact before she had disappeared. Naturally, this individual denied any involvement in the case by alleging he himself had been knocked down while searching for his wife and was now furious that he became the primary suspect. At the same time, he himself was often confused in his testimony and could not clearly explain why he did not alert police about his wife's disappearance on the day she had vanished, or why, if he thought she may have been at her mother-in-law's home, why he did not call or visit there immediately. While police were combing through witnesses and combing the area for clues to find El Maria's whereabouts, her remains were inadvertently found by municipal workers on January 22nd. Workers responded to a report about clogged storm drain near a road, when they noticed something odd in one of the large plastic bags containing human charred remains inside it, they immediately reported this horrifying discovery to authorities. Police officers, upon their arrival, suggested that the body could be that of El Maria Lopez, who was wanted across the country. Forensic experts confirmed the remains belonged to a young woman. Her parents and brother confirmed with certainty that it was El Maria Lopez even though her body had been severely disfigured by fire. Furthermore, it's noteworthy that the package was found near where El Maria worked at an attorney office without surveillance cameras or lighting available in that location. Pathologists were able to establish that despite the body being badly burned, she had been severely beaten before succumbing to asphyxia due to internal hemorrhages, fractures sustained while she was alive, caked blood in the nose and mouth, and deep marks on her neck indicating strangulation. An odd message as no new suspects had emerged, and both of her parents believed it to have been their son-in-law who had so cruelly killed their daughter. Jorge was quickly taken into custody, 
with psychologists and criminalists conducting extensive analyses into his motive for killing Jorge. Additionally, they must assess in detail this marriage and its relationships within its family unit. At one point in this investigation, Lopez provided a harrowing audio recording sent anonymously by someone living nearby. Apparently this person had witnessed several scandals within her daughter and son-in-law's family, but never imagined that these would end in such a violent death of one or both parties involved. Jorge was shaken to hear Luz Maria screaming for help, while sobs could be heard in the background. Jorge expressed shock over what she heard and stated that had that witness called 911 immediately, her daughter may still be alive today. Unfortunately, however, neither he nor anyone he recorded from visited Luz Maria's home, from which the screams originated, and thus could not be involved as a witness in Jorge's investigation as witness. Lopez used the audio recording as part of her criminal case materials and gave a public interview where she asked all citizens to be aware and report any instances of domestic abuse that arise, not simply film them with cameras or record them with dictaphonies. According to Lopez, these simple actions could save lives. This high-profile crime caused widespread public outrage, prompting thousands of people to stage rallies throughout the country demanding justice be served against Jorge. Though Jorge was quickly taken into custody upon discovery of this offense, he continued denying any guilt by maintaining that he personally drove his wife to work the day she disappeared. Yet another avenue of defense against accusations made against him by witnesses who are calling for his punishment. Street CCTV footage did show Luz Maria driving toward his workplace that morning. However, due to tinted windows, it could not be established how many were in their car or whether or not she ever exited it. None of the recordings depicted their car stopping or Luz Maria getting out. At their rented home, numerous washed-out traces of blood and drag marks were discovered that hinted that violent acts had taken place here. Suspicion was confirmed when microscopic fragments of burnt flesh were found in their family car's trunk. At the same time during their search, Investigators were interested in an orthopedic mattress purchased recently by Jorge and Luz Maria. More precisely, not even the mattress, but its dense polyethylene wrapper which they had recently purchased together. When it was compared with similar examples in similar households, Jorge packed Luz Maria's burnt remains in it and numerous witnesses heard him threaten her with death before making this purchase. Just days before Luz Maria suddenly vanished, Jorge had made public threats that if she decided to leave him, he would kill and hide her body so no one would find it again, as evidenced by repeated insults by Jorge, as well as threats threatening to kill her or hide it so no one would find her remains. Based on data compiled by expert criminologists and testimony provided by several witnesses, the investigation pieced together the grisly details of this crime. On January 19, 2021, Jorge went into a fit of anger during a heated marital fight, striking his wife several times before snapping back at her several times, prompting her to cry out in pain, which neighbors heard but did not contact the police immediately. The killing occurred the night of January 19, 2021. Jorge had had difficulty controlling outbursts of anger before, so when his temper had flared again on January 18, when his fists reached his fists on January 18, 2021, just after midnight when his fists hit home again, when his anger control failed him completely and hit her several times, prompting her cries for help from her that neighbors heard but did not call for help immediately or call in police for help when his fists struck during their marriage vows on January 18, 2021, after Jorge gave in to his fists again when, during an argument between spouses on January 18, 2021, after an argument between spouses got physical, which resulted in his use of anger control issues before so, quickly losing control again when outbursts of anger had to control before, but this time just went wild, resulting in hitting her several times, making her to cry out several times before finally sending it. Neighbors heard but did nothing when the phone call for assistance. Jorge beat his wife severely, breaking her nose and inflicting head trauma. Subsequently, he strangled her using only his bare hands before trying to dispose of her body by taking it outside into his backyard, dousing it in campfire liquid and setting it afire. But Horth wasn't expecting such an intense fire starter that his neighbors might notice and report his conduct. 
fearing that they may call the fire department or police upon seeing it burning. Jorge quickly put out the flames, wrapped the burnt remains in plastic, before quickly moving it somewhere he thought no one else would find its remains, before setting it ablaze again, somewhere safe, where nobody would discover it again. Jorge committed these atrocities in full view of their young daughter, who, though still understanding some aspects of what was going on, still witnessed beating and crimes committed, evidenced by cries and screams caught on tape from her child. Jorge had gained some knowledge of forensics, thanks to Luis Maria's textbooks that were abundant in their home, so he attempted to cover up and establish an alibi by finding an area without lights or video cameras where he dumped Luz Maria's body in a drainage sewer, unsuspiciously. On his daily commute to work, he drove along her usual route as if Luz Maria were present, only for him not be found there at her place of work the following morning, then began an active search with colleagues, acquaintances, and relatives until it finally found her. Criminals' lawyers attempted to delay and dilute Jorge's trial as much as possible, while also trying to derail the investigation. They claimed all evidence and witness statements were circumstantial and couldn't unambiguously prove Jorge's guilt. Defense attorneys sought house arrest instead of detention. As well as claimed, Jorge himself was deeply devastated at being charged with killing the mother of his child he deeply loved and cared about. However, the key piece of evidence was obtained from Luz Maria's phone. Jorge held on to it all along and, immediately after her murder, sent messages out using it in an attempt to make her seem alive. Additionally, tracking smartphone movements showed it often coincided with Jorge's phone, although Jorge's lawyers attempted to spin this evidence in favor of their client by saying Jorge found his wife's phone and drove around searching for her. No explanation could be offered for why Jorge was also sending messages through it while calling it from his own cell phone. Expert witnesses recorded photos showing bruises and scratches found on his body the day of his arrest as further proof that the defendant had committed his crimes, with most vivid ones occurring near the area where the victim had attempted resistance. Jorge's neck had suffered from an accidental scratch, yet only tiny particles of his epithelium under the fingernails of those responsible for his murder could not be located due to fire destruction. Due to a number of contentious points, the prosecutor asked for maximum punishment against those responsible. Court hearings and proceedings had to be repeatedly postponed due to coronavirus pandemic. But in October 2022, after numerous delays due to coronavirus pandemic, Defendant was finally found guilty for murdering his wife, sentenced to 50 years. He did not admit his guilt himself, but custody was given over to Alice's maternal grandparents who admitted that their lives now center around their granddaughter. Share your opinion with us in the comments and subscribe to the channel for more. The summer of 1985 in London turned out to be sunny and warm, breathing nature and tranquility. However, at 3.30 on the morning of August 7th, a sudden phone call rang at the home of Jeremy Bamber, heir to White House Farm. The young man, barely awake, picked up the phone wondering who could be calling him so early. On the other end of the line was his foster father, his voice sounding unusual. He was clearly panicking, and Jeremy couldn't make out his father's words. He tried to concentrate and realize what had happened, but his efforts were futile and soon there was an eerie silence on the other end of the line. The last thing Jeremy heard from his father was, Your sister's gone crazy, she's got a gun. Without hesitation, Jeremy immediately called the police, and reported his sister's alarming dialogue, emphasizing its potential danger to himself and his sister. A half hour after receiving this call from Jeremy himself, officers arrived on site, followed by officers assigned to investigate further. As was typical with English police forces, upon hearing what the son of the farm owners had reported over the phone to the police force, since it was suspected that weapons may be involved, English law enforcement decided not to rush in as their professional strategy required. Effectiveness can be debated endlessly. Ultimately, the English authorities must determine their success. When they arrive at a scene of a call, they usually arrive unarmed and observe events without intervening directly, waiting either for the situation to resolve itself naturally or for special units to step in as needed. Police officers remained at a distance from the house while remaining close to Jeremy, 
and asked him about what had occurred in their family home the previous night. According to Jeremy, they had all been eating dinner together as a family. There had been some slight disagreement towards the end of dinner, but nothing serious that could have caused such an unforeseen tragedy. Furthermore, Jeremy revealed that both his pistol and .22 caliber carbine had been left with his parents, both fully functional and loaded. Special team that arrived on the scene determined that all doors and windows in the house were locked, except one on the first floor master bedroom window. Utilizing loudspeakers for two hours, they tried communicating with someone inside but only heard barking of a dog inside. Nearly three hours had passed since the first police officers had arrived on the scene. By eight in the morning, SWAT team officers entered a house marked by an eerie silence. Carefully, they moved through each room until reaching the kitchen where chaos reigned. An overturned chair lay scattered on the floor beside Neville Bamber, Jeremy's father. Their bodies showed evidence of struggle as evidenced by bruises and abrasions on arms, face, broken nose and jaw, although unfortunately due to eight bullet wounds, including six to the head, chances for survival were no longer viable. On a kitchen surface lay a telephone with its receiver removed and several rounds of Dalton 22 caliber ammunition, an image which left police shocked. Nonetheless, they proceeded with their investigation in detail of the entire house, beginning by inspecting its first floor, first if there were no family members present, and later on, its second. Every step had to be carefully taken so as to minimize unnecessary noise. But due to creaky floors in an older home, this proved challenging. There were no further bodies found on the first floor. However, in two bedrooms on the second floor, four more bodies were discovered. June, Sheila, Daniel, and Nicholas. Four children killed by gunshots. Sheila lying near her parents' room, with two bullet wounds under her chin along with 25 bullets used to take out five family members. That many bullets provoked questions. Was someone taking aim at the Bamber family on purpose? What had been their motivation? Or perhaps an attempt by the real perpetrator to mislead police officers? Authorities began conducting extensive investigations to gain answers for all these queries about each member of their deceased family. History of the Bamber family Essex is an idyllic retreat just a short drive from London and attracts an endless flow of tourists, yet retains its value to locals by providing an escape from city life. You can enjoy fresh air while strolling endless green meadows or tasting crystal clear lake water. Visit medieval castles. Immerse yourself in amazing stories. This was probably why Essex became such an appealing location for the Bamber family when they decided to settle here. June and Neville found joy in owning White House Farm and making their dreams of marriage reality come true. At age 25, June married Neville, and together the couple set off on the journey that would see them create a strong and prosperous family life together. Neville served in the Royal Air Force before taking up magistrate duties for local courts after fulfilling his service obligation. Fate brought them some unexpected twists when June's efforts at becoming pregnant failed prompting them to look into adopting children from an orphanage as a means of expanding their family. Two children, Sheila at just three months old and later Jeremy at six months old, became part of their lives. June and Neville proved to be caring parents, filling their children's days with love and care. Growing up, their children received an excellent education at prestigious private schools. The Bamber family's financial situation was extremely prosperous, allowing them to probe into their children with every opportunity. Jeremy, despite his brilliant education, was characterized by a withdrawn character and preferred solitude. From childhood, his tendency toward rebelliousness was evident in elementary school, where he did poorly, leading to his parents' decision to send him to boarding school in 1970 when he was nine years old. The English boarding schools of the time were rigid, and Jeremy quickly realized that there would be strict discipline. The years at boarding school were difficult, but may have played a role in changing Jeremy's character for the better. Having excelled at university, he became more calm and his parents were proud of their son. After successfully completing university, Jeremy's father, Neville, offered him a job on a farm in England. The young man immediately accepted the offer, and in 1982, 
he returned from the journey he had been on since completing his studies. His parents provided him with comfortable accommodations, including a cottage, a car, and a good salary. They also counted on him to help them in their old age. However, despite outward success within the family, Jeremy faced tensions related to religious differences. June, a deeply religious woman, experienced turbulent emotions because her children did not share her religious beliefs. Her attempts to guide them toward faith were futile. Difficulties in family relationships and frustration led her to depression. She underwent treatment that included the use of electroshock therapy, which at the time was considered a method of dealing with mental illness. Sheila, June and Neville's daughter, also had a significant impact on her mother's development of depression. Unlike her calmer brother Jeremy, she was fascinated by the fashion world and dreamed of becoming a model. But June adamantly denied the idea, not wanting to hear about her daughter being involved in the world of show business. These were just a few of the many surprises Sheila gave her parents. At the age of 17, she announced she was pregnant, and June was faced with a difficult choice. Forbid her daughter to have a child out of wedlock, as it was religiously unacceptable, or force her to have an abortion which is also forbidden in the Christian world. In the end, June relieved herself of all responsibility and asked Sheila to make the decision herself, but in such a way that no one in their family would ever know that she had gotten rid of the pregnancy. The result was a deterioration in the relationship between mother and adopted daughter. In 1977, Sheila did marry Colin Caffel, the father of her first unborn child, despite her parents' protests. The young couple became a family and soon had twins, Nicholas and Daniel. However, after some time, Sheila began to suspect her husband of infidelity and filed for divorce. This had a serious impact on her mental health. Sheila spent several months in a psychiatric hospital, where she was also treated with electroshock therapy, just like her mother. Meanwhile, Sheila's sons were sent to an orphanage where they stayed for almost two years. Sheila's health only worsened. She became anxious, often expressing a desire to take her and her children's lives claiming that they were under the influence of the devil. She suffered from paranoid schizophrenia, while Jeremy, who used to cause a lot of problems for his parents, calmed down and was happy with his life. In 1985, Sheila met up with her ex-husband, Colin, again, and they reunited, taking their sons from the orphanage. In August, Sheila and her children were invited to the Bamber home to meet her parents. They were going to stay there for a week, after which Colin and the boys were to take a trip to Norway. He brought Sheila and the children to the farm, and on Tuesday, August 6, 1985, everyone gathered at the beautiful White House farmhouse. It turned out to be the last dinner of the Bamber family. A few days after the tragedy, the Bamber funeral was held, and naturally, Jeremy attended it. It was a difficult and bitter moment for him. He cried a lot and was shocked by what had happened. But it was on this day that the investigation took a new turn. Strange behavior was noticed in Jeremy's behavior, which relatives of the Bamber family reported to the authorities. During breaks between bouts of grief and tears, he would utter ridiculous phrases, referring to himself as the boss. Those around him saw a smile on his face, an unusual smile, but a smile characteristic of a contented winner. All these observations and remarks were passed on to the authorities and they decided to investigate more thoroughly. On this ill-fated evening, everything seemed perfect. A family dinner, a joyous mood, a delicious meal. However, one comment made by Neville and June changed things. The parents suggested that Sheila send the children back to the orphanage, emphasizing that she was unable to provide them with a proper upbringing. This provocative suggestion displeased Sheila, and she reacted sharply saying that she was already thinking about it and would make a decision on her own. The warm atmosphere of the evening was broken at 9.30 p.m. Jeremy headed to his house at the same time Barbara Wilson, the secretary of the Bamber Farm, called with a work-related matter. Neville picked up the phone, and Barbara noticed that he was irritable. There were loud voices in the background. People seemed to be arguing excitedly. This atmosphere amazed Barbara for such a thing was a rare occurrence for the Bambers. She was unable to find out the cause of the conflict. 
However, as Neville quickly ended the conversation and hung up the phone, the next morning all the family members in the house were found shot dead. Jeremy was the only one of the family left alive. He was unable to hide his tears. Years investigators were respectful of his emotions and gave Jeremy time to recover before beginning interviews. Jeremy shared all the information available, not forgetting to mention the difficulties his sister had faced in life and the conflict over dinner on the evening of August 6th before he left the house. At first glance, the crime committed by Sheila appears to be a desperate and certainly unconscious act given her mental state. Under the influence of a parental remark, she could not stand the new invasion of her privacy, lost her mind, and resorted to gun violence shooting the Bambers, her children, and herself. Investigators were certain that's exactly what happened. During an examination of the house, it became clear that the crime, which destroyed almost the entire family, was committed by the Bambers' mentally unstable adopted daughter, Sheila. This was evidenced by the weapon found lying on her body, pointing upwards towards her chin. The actions of the detective subsequently seem rather absurd. The police decided to put the house in order and to organize a strange process of burning the bloody bedding and carpets on which the bodies were lying. The police reasoned that they wished to rid Jeremy of the horrible memories of what had happened. The weapon found at the scene, which was potential evidence, was picked up by the officer with his bare hands. Reopening the investigation required a thorough examination of the scene to avoid jumping to conclusions. The first step was for detectives to examine the weapon. Several people's fingerprints were found on the barrel, including the investigator who apparently picked up an important piece of evidence without using gloves. The presence of Sheila's and Jeremy's prints didn't raise any questions. Jeremy confirmed that it was his gun, designed for hunting. He had purchased it legally. Sheila's prints, being a suspect in this crime, were quite expected. However, it is worth noting that the alleged perpetrator was shot twice in different parts of her body. How did she manage to subsequently take her own life? And that's where things started to become clearer. Suddenly, Julie, Jeremy's girlfriend, began to express doubts about his innocence. She contacted investigators and provided them with some curious details. On the night of August 7th, Jeremy called her, reporting problems at the farm. However, when Julie tried to find out more, Jeremy abruptly hung up. In addition, she recalled that several times before the tragedy, Jeremy had complained to her about his family, expressing fatigue with his in-laws. But the most shocking aspect of her testimony concerned the Bamber will. It turns out that the Bambers had made a will stating that all of their property was to go to their children upon their death, half to each, and also, their mother was going to rewrite their share in favor of the twins. Sheila The events surrounding Sheila were an unexpected shock for Jeremy, and he openly expressed his displeasure with it with friends. Furthermore, Neville stipulated in his will that Jeremy be present on the farm in order to collect his portion from its estate. Julie saw him speak about planning to kill his family, before placing the blame upon mentally unstable Sheila before police officers. According to Julie, he presented himself as the victim, telling them about this not only due to an interest in investigating, but also with revenge in mind. Julie informed police about this incident not just out of wanting to help investigate, but also out of wanting revenge against Sheila. According to Julie told them about this incident not solely out of wanting help, but out of wanting payback against Sheila as well. Once Jeremy discovered who his lover was, in order to cover up his tracks and deflect policemen attention away from himself, he gave them the name of a potential suspect, a plumber whom he had hired as part of their property renovation plan. Yet, this clever plan failed. A plumber was recognized and interrogated, yet his story rang true. Although confused by why he was being interrogated regarding crime-related inquiries, he managed to provide convincing proof that he wasn't present during incidents in question. So, the list of suspects was narrowed to one suspect, Jeremy Bamber himself. Although arrested briefly, due to no tangible evidence, Jeremy was released without further hassle from the authorities, though they attempted to prevent him from traveling abroad, though with an inheritance now on hand. 
Jeremy's financial position had improved significantly. Soon thereafter, Jeremy decided to depart England for Saint-Tropez, France, for a relaxing vacation. Prior to leaving, he sold off his father's vehicle. Meanwhile, his Bamber cousins demanded that Sheila's alleged killing spree by her family members be reviewed. These demands were relayed to both police and media sources who informed them that their deputy, chief of CID, had already directed out all Bamber relatives after hearing allegations that James Bamber could have orchestrated such events. One of the brothers decided to examine the scene separately from his brothers. Doubting Sheila's involvement, he began searching for additional evidence. Meanwhile, his cousin sneaked through every door and cabinet, hoping to find new evidence. It worked. In one cupboard was hidden an object which shocked him, an empty silencer of an .22 caliber carbine covered with bloodstains, which inspired new possibilities. An examination of the length and width of the gun, along with its silencer installed, revealed evidence that Sheila could not turn it on herself and shoot herself, therefore ruling out Sheila as being responsible for murder. After being wounded twice, and bleeding profusely from both wounds, she may have been unable to disassemble the silencer before concealing it away in her closet closet, if she had fired without it. Had this extra device been present, it may have left bloodstain marks that proved it had been connected with carbine at moment of incident. On September 29th, Jeremy returned home and was immediately arrested by authorities for murdering members of his own family. This 18-day trial started on March 3, 1986 at Chelmsford Crown Court, where Jeremy Bamber looked arrogant in the dock during his trial. The prosecution alleged Bamber of lying, and telephone technicians from the station verified this by verifying his telephone line being busy that evening. As well, medical examiner testimony proved crucial during trial proceedings. Experts found a series of bruises, suggesting that Neville could withstand blows from his assailants. 2 caliber carbine. According to the medical examiner, this weapon had also caused similar injuries on other victims. Given Sheila's fragile and small frame, it seems unlikely that she could have caused such severe injuries to Neville prior to his death. More likely is Jeremy was responsible for attacking him. Neville was covered with bruises upon his body. Sheila, too, likely received several blows during their fight, but no marks or bruises could be found anywhere on her body. Lawyers of Jeremy argued that Sheila, despite being mentally ill and physically fit, was capable of committing crimes. Their previous experience with guns and superior shooting ability gave evidence for this claim, along with fresher blood evidence which they believed pointed toward Sheila having killed first her family, then herself, either realizing she'd committed a crime or fear of coming police involvement as reasons. After hearing these theories, the prosecution was able to disprove them with solid evidence. A silencer with blood from Sheila's rifle was found hidden away in a closet, with blood traces belonging to Sheila. This evidence could not be refuted, leaving defense lawyers no other arguments to counter it. According to prosecution claims, Jeremy was motivated by frustration over learning of his mother's will splitting and by money issues in planning his bloodbath. On the day of the accident, Sheila was seen by both Sheila's housekeeper and two employees without any unusual behaviors being displayed by Sheila or her children. Two employees also saw this and reported she appeared content. Barbara Wilson, who worked as farm clerk, reported contacting Neville around 9.15 p.m. and assumed she was breaking up an argument between Sheila and Neville. Instead, Barbara saw Neville become angry and start hanging out his fury as though this were something he has never done before. And she says, Neville usually remains calm person, whereas half an hour later, it is when Jeremy left his parents and went home alone. At nightfall, after a particularly long night, he returned to the bicycle he'd received from his mother just days earlier in order to remain hidden from view and avoid crossing any major roadway. Through an open doorway in a first floor bedroom, Jeremy gained entry and found an unloaded and ready gun before entering his parents' bedroom where he fired two rounds, killing Jane before firing it again at Neville, who awakened to protect himself. Jeremy attempted to commit suicide with this weapon before his father intervened with an attempt at protection himself and ended his own life instead. Fighting ensued between father and son. 
Jeremy managed to kill his father while in the kitchen before retreating back upstairs where he killed Sheila, along with her daughters, making it appear that his sister was responsible. Once killed, Jeremy left his carbine behind before climbing back onto his bike before making his way home. At first, Jeremy telephoned his girlfriend Julie and nearly fainted with excitement before calling the police to report his alleged father's phone call. This incident further raised doubts regarding the investigation, as should Nevola have been threatened, he would have called them himself rather than his son Jeremy. Additionally, blood splatter was not evident around their home phony, despite a testimony by Jeremy suggesting his injury during said call, suggesting the receiver may have been removed for staging purposes. Suspicion about Jeremy's father began when his call came through. Instead of responding immediately, did not rush towards the area immediately? In reality, however, it was his own father. His family was involved, so the jury retired to discuss its verdict based on facts and speculations they knew to be accurate. Prior to that, Judge outlined three main concerns to jurors for them to determine who was more reliable, Julie Mugford or Jeremy Bamber. An important issue was whether they could establish that Sheila wasn't responsible for the murder. According to Judge, it came down to whether the second fatal shot fired at Sheila was fired, with silencers attached or not. If this was indeed the case, then this effectively eliminated any possibility that she was responsible. Was Neville Bamber in contact with his son Jason towards nightfall or not? Without such communication from Neville to Jason at that time, would have disproved Jason's account of events and made them indecipherable to most outsiders. On October 28th, after over nine hours of deliberation by a jury of 11 jurors and two alternates, Jason Bamber was found guilty by a majority vote of 10 to 2, which met the minimum required to convict. Bamber received five lifetime prison terms without parole. Home Secretary Douglas Hurd determined in 1988 that Bamber did not qualify for release. This ruling remains contentious, as there has been no direct evidence suggesting his guilt. Bamber remains imprisoned to serve out his sentence. There may have been an error in the justice system and that his sister Shayla could be responsible. Bamber claims he is innocent by filing appeals and his attorney alleges the verdict was biased due to Jeremy's aggressive conduct during courtroom proceedings. Jeremy Bamber claims there is no proof of his guilt and there remain numerous unanswered questions regarding the trial, such as testing Sheila's hands without conducting tests on them and there being a police mishap at the site. Additionally, there may be reprisal against his ex-partner if found out. Trial for Bamber began in 1991. Unfortunately, in 1996, an officer of the police destroyed much of his evidence, something his legal defense team considered an act of disgraceful misconduct. In 1997, a DNA test revealed the presence of Shaila's blood in June's silencer. However, its results were complex and unclear. Gun experts from both the US and UK suggested in 2012 that marks to bodies weren't consistent with using silencers. Since 2015, Jeremy Bamber filed an appeal asking that all evidence be given over to his defense disguised as attorney, for which he was sentenced to an additional 14-year prison time for fraud. To prove his innocence, Bamber established websites dedicated to his case while offering a substantial reward for any evidence which might reverse it. The Bamber family's case continues to attract public attention and raise doubts about the correctness of the verdict. Share your opinion with us in the comments and subscribe to the channel for more. In the mid-2000s, this high-profile case sent shockwaves through America. For years after its investigation began, no suspect was brought to justice due to an absence of motive and disconnected evidence, as no one believed this man was capable. Six long years were taken for detectives to piece the puzzle together at trial. An investigator even stated he'd never encountered anything like it during all his years of practice. We found ourselves immersed in an epic love triangle, double betrayal, and an ominous pretend no one noticed initially. Jason Young of Brevard, North Carolina was born in 1974 to an ordinary family. After high school graduation, he studied at Raleigh's renowned State University, 
before landing a sales job in a large retail chain where his services proved indispensable. Friends described him as fickle when it came to romantic relationships between people of opposite gender, even boasting about it themselves. Jason himself proudly admitted being known as a womanizer. Michelle Marie Young, nay Fisher, was born in New York on February 1977. Growing up alongside Meredith, they quickly forged close ties from childhood onward. Linda dedicated much of her time and attention to supporting and helping to develop Michelle's abilities and talents, especially as an avid student of law and economics from an early age. From Michelle's school years, she dreamed of a future career in this area. Michelle graduated school, applied to several universities, and soon received a positive response from one in North Carolina's capital city. There she studied diligently at the Faculty of Economics and Law before going on to earn a master's degree. Soon thereafter, Michelle found work with one of North Carolina's premier accounting firms, where she earned well, supported herself fully, and made plans for future ventures. She decided to celebrate her 24th birthday at one of the city's premier entertainment venues with friends and colleagues, until an unfamiliar stranger turned abruptly and accidentally knocked a glass with cocktail out of her hand. As soon as he realized what had happened, Jason Young apologized and bought Michelle another cocktail to make amends for their interaction. Michelle quickly caught Jason Young's attention. He sat at Michelle's table and struck up a casual conversation, joked a lot, attempted to be funny and interesting and at the end of the evening asked her out on a date. Michelle liked this casual acquaintance, so readily accepted his invite, thinking fate had given her something special on her birthday. As soon as they started communicating, it quickly became apparent that they shared many similarities. Both studied at the same university, although Jason finished three years earlier, supported the same hockey team, and shared an appreciation of a musical group. Their romance blossomed quickly. However, living together or even getting married were simply out of reach at that time. As soon as Michelle told Jason she was pregnant during one of their meetings, it came as quite a shock. Neither one was prepared for having children just yet. Both Jason and Michelle had been focused on their careers rather than starting families just yet. He made his feelings known quite emphatically but, after some hesitation on Michelle's part, decided that keeping the child was best option. Jason took one month to consider his situation before moving back to Raleigh to be with Michelle while she was pregnant, which ultimately lead them to legalize their relationship. Not love or pregnancy had anything to do with it. Michelle didn't have health insurance at the time, and marriage allowed them to avoid significant costs associated with childbirth. Their daughter Cassidy Elizabeth was born shortly thereafter and Cassidy Elizabeth began life together, with both of their mothers helping out domestic life tasks as soon as she could manage on her own. Michelle's family carefully accepted Jason as her partner. While wary, they attempted to avoid conflicts. Soon thereafter, Michelle and Jason moved into their own large house located in a quiet and landscaped part of the city, where their mother Linda would come and help manage household duties and visit her daughter and granddaughter regularly. Linda noticed there was an unusually tense atmosphere within this family, due to Jason being over-emotional and easily provoked causing many arguments with Michelle but publicly appearing happy. But only speaking candidly with Linda could Michelle truly express how things were really happening within. An unexpected but significant sign occurred just two years into Cassidy's life when Michelle found herself pregnant again and cautiously told Jason. To their delight, Jason responded positively and seemed even pleased about it. To share this happy news with Jason's parents who were in Brevard for the weekend visit, Michelle decided to travel by car with the family as well, first celebrating their news with relatives before heading off together to a restaurant for another celebration together. While driving home, Jason overcorrected and the car careened off into a ravine. Although Michelle experienced shock and fear after the incident, their lives were unthreatened, and no serious injury occurred, despite its nerve-wracking effects on pregnancy. Jason took it all in stride, yet Michelle experienced miscarriage due to its stress. With all this happening simultaneously, an accident, child miscarriage, and strange indifference towards it from Jason, 
Suspicions arose that something else might be going on behind closed doors. Later, Linda Fisher would describe that accident as an omen that no one paid adequate heed to. Jason and Michelle Manny had known one another since university days. Although they hadn't seen each other in some time, shortly before Jason was involved in an accident, he accidentally met Michelle Manny during a work trip in 2006. After telling his wife about it and inviting Michelle Manny over, they decided to invite her over as well, despite her complaining of family life issues and relationship difficulties with her spouse during her visit, while also constantly complimenting Jason and telling his wife how lucky they were to be with him. Michelle Manny accepted their invitation yet began complaining of her unhappy family life issues while constantly complimenting Jason, while telling his wife how lucky she was in life, and telling his wife how lucky she was in life. By contrast praised Jason, while constantly telling his wife how special she was. Pregnant Michelle wasn't alarmed by Jason Young's behavior, she intended only to comfort and support her during her pregnancy. Yet Jason saw an opportunity in it. What began as friendly support quickly escalated into flirtation and affair-initiating behavior. Jason Young and Michelle Manny began calling each other almost daily and sneaking out together, always justifying his absences as business trips for Jason while keeping their spouse unaware. Michelle informed Jason she was pregnant again in June 2006, yet this time he did not react positively. Michelle thought his distance might have something to do with their miscarriage experience several months prior. Little did she know, Jason had already begun planning how he wanted to end their marriage as quickly and painlessly as possible. Early November, when Michelle was five months pregnant and Jason had another business trip of 300 miles in his own car, but with hotel accommodations booked along the way. That evening, Michelle spoke on the phone with her best friend about family problems, as well as recalling an argument between herself and Jason the night before he left. After this conversation ended, she returned upstairs, put their daughter to bed, and fell asleep next to her. At about 10 p.m. in the evening, Jason checked into a hotel claiming he was tired from traveling, but quickly went directly to bed. In truth, however, he was carefully inspecting entrances, exits, and security camera locations as he carefully plotted how he could exit and enter unnoticed, planning what he believed to be an ideal crime plan. He prepared an ironclad alibi in anticipation. Jason had made contact with Meredith early that morning in order to seek assistance for their wedding anniversary surprise, giving Michelle something beautiful from an online store, but inadvertently sending the page to their home fax machine instead of Michelle seeing it first and ruining the surprise. Meredith agreed to assist Jason, though she disliked her son-in-law a great deal. Meredith had entered Michelle's house through a secret door in the garage that was known to only family members, leaving it always open and unlocked. Michelle's papers, keys, and wallet were still sitting on her table in the hallway as evidence that she hadn't left. It seemed eerily quiet there, too, despite having seen Michelle leave with no one around to claim them, if anything. Meredith noticed when she returned upstairs that Michelle's bedroom door was wide open, but no one answered when she called out for them. When she entered, however, she witnessed an unsettling scene where Michelle lay unconscious with a fractured skull in a pool of her own blood by the bedside floor. Blood was everywhere, on the walls, furniture, and even baby footprints near her body. Unfortunately, no one could help the pregnant woman. She had been dead for hours. Her sister quickly called emergency services when she heard something moving underneath the bed. Cassidy stared back, confused but terrified. Cassidy had seen her mother die, spending hours by her body as evidenced by marks on the floor and toys brought for comforting purposes by Cassidy herself. Later, forensic experts identified numerous bruises, abrasions and fractures on Michelle's body, indicating a long and violent attack by unknown means. Michelle had her teeth knocked out while her skull fractured with something heavy. Unfortunately, this murder weapon never materialized. Bloodied pillows were found next to the body, with evidence pointing toward it being used to smother her. No other items had been stolen from the house, suggesting that murder had been their sole goal. Locks were undamaged, and no signs of forced entry could be seen. This suggests that the perpetrator may have known about 
and had access to a secret door known only to family members. Young was the suspected culprit, yet had an alibi that seemed compelling. He claimed he checked into his hotel room that night and left in the morning for a scheduled business meeting. Checkbacks confirmed this use of Young's room key card, both times, at night time for entering and in the morning for exiting. However, upon closer investigation, a host of oddities and inconsistencies soon surfaced. A hotel employee noticed early one morning that an emergency exit was both open and propped, open with cobblestones to prevent it from closing too suddenly. When the investigation decided to check out the surveillance camera aimed at that door to find out who committed the crime, they found out that this camera had been deliberately disabled on the night of Young's arrival at his room and stopped recording about 30 minutes after Young had arrived at his lodgings. Uneven stranger still was discovered during the night, during which someone who looked like Jason Young was seen purchasing gas at a station between his hotel room and the crime scene. However, when asked for identification as per rule, he refused and quickly left after paying in cash. An attendant later identified Jason Young, but this man maintained that they had slept in their hotel room during that night. Young was also calling Michelle Mani more than two dozen times on the day before the tragedy, and near morning time, five more times with short conversations lasting only 15 seconds each time, suggesting Jason may have been panicked as these calls came from outside of the hotel where he claimed to have spent all night. Additionally, he appeared late for scheduled business meetings and appeared disoriented and confused. Young's evidence, taken individually or collectively, could not prove his guilt in Michelle's murder, thus leading to years of investigation and an agonizingly long verdict process. Meanwhile, Jason lived his normal life, even gaining custody of their young daughter despite their relatives having known Michelle since childhood, further heightening suspicions he may be guilty. Jason Young was arrested at the end of 2009 but, despite an abundance of evidence pointing towards his guilt, was not found guilty due to an impasse among members of the jury. Eventually, in 2012, however, more evidence came forward, including testimony from witnesses who saw Jason Young outside different parts of the hotel that night, as well as testimony from those who saw his distinctive white car parked not far from where his own house stood in an unlit lot. Child psychologist Dr. Lisa Weitz testified of Cassidy's bizarre doll play during which she would depict how Jason spanked and then would not pick up his wife from the floor after spanking her, leading her to stay on her knees until her daddy spanked again and they both dropped to their knees on the floor together. Mani testified as an eyewitness against Jason. She admitted his affair but justified it by explaining he was deeply unhappy in his family life, as stated to everyone by him. Another former mistress admitted she feared his outbursts of anger would hit hard and could hit them both during such episodes, further complicating matters further for both of them in court proceedings. Jason Young was found guilty after an extended trial for brutally assaulting his pregnant wife. For this crime, he was sentenced to life without the possibility of parole. Jason filed his initial appeal, but it was rejected. Subsequent attempts for review of his case by state court of appeals panels also proved futile. Cassidy became virtually orphaned as her mother was murdered while Jason went behind bars, now being raised by an aunt and maternal grandparents in foster care. Share your opinion with us in the comments and subscribe to the channel for more. The Rachel O'Reilly case is one of Ireland's most violent crimes. When a person disappears without a trace or dies in mysterious circumstances, usually the other half becomes one of the main suspects. Unfortunately, in about 80% of cases, suspicions are justified. In such crimes, there is usually not even a clear motive and the crime itself has been defined as domestic, as if it were something ordinary. In the early 2000s, the high-profile case of Rachel O'Reilly literally shocked the whole of Ireland with its unprecedented cruelty and cold-bloodedness. A young woman and mother of two young children were brutally murdered in her own home. Police officers who arrived on the scene admitted that they had never encountered such a horrific crime scene in their practice. To solve this mystery and put all the pieces of the puzzle together, investigators spent several years on painstaking work. During all this time, 
the criminal remained at large and was sure that his guilt would never be proven. Perhaps it would have remained that way, but the killer was let down by his own vanity. Now, let's take the whole story from the beginning. Who is Rachel O'Reilly? Rachel O'Reilly, who was named Callie, was born in 1974 on the northern outskirts of County Dublin, Ireland. Her biological parents, a girl and boy, did not know at an early age that she was adopted by spouses Rose and Jim Cayley. She was brought up with four other adopted children of the couple, since Rose and Jim could not have children of their own. They gave all their parental love without a trace of favoritism. From a young age, Rachel was an active and purposeful child. She excelled in school, played sports, helped her parents with household chores, and never caused any problems. The girl grew up to be sociable, open, and incredibly kind. She easily got along with everyone and avoided conflicts. As a teenager, Rachel was seriously engaged in softball, constantly participating in various competitions, and even setting several local records. She also had a very strong bond with her foster mother, to whom she confided all her secrets, and with whom she maintained constant communication, even after she got married and had children of her own. After graduating from high school, Rachel enrolled in one of the local universities to pursue a degree in marketing. At the same time, she got a job as a salesperson in a city department store, and in her spare time, she continued to play sports representing the locale team. Who is Joe O'Reilly? Joe O'Reilly became widely known for his inhumane treatment of his spouse and mother of his two children, yet little information exists on who he was as a young person. Joe O'Reilly hails from County Dublin, where he was born into an impoverished family in 1972. Raised alongside his elder sister, both children were taught that hard work should lead to success and were taught not to expect special privileges from their parents. Joe was an athletic young man with a deep appreciation of softball. Following graduation, he decided to study advertising via correspondence course. To support himself financially, he secured employment at a department store where Rachel would eventually begin working, a few months later, as manager. At their first encounter, Joe was 19, while Rachel was only 17. Joe noticed Rachel immediately as soon as he heard she was working at his company and introduced himself, being charmed by her diminutive stature and beautiful blonde locks, making a lasting impression upon him. But when Joe asked Rachel out, she emphatically refused. This left Joe baffled. Undeterred, Joe persisted with his pursuit of Rachel by offering compliments and small surprises such as flowers or chocolates at her workplace. Joe's persistence became amusing to the store's staff, but he did not abandon this pursuit of Rachel. To engage her more fully, he even read one of her favorite books so as to provide common ground for conversation. Joe took notice when Rachel became interested in softball and joined her at the stadium and practices, eventually playing alongside her to lead their team to victory. This impressed Rachel so much, she agreed to go on a date with him. Joe quickly took advantage of their rapid development to demonstrate his love for Rachel. To impress her even further, he surprised her by inviting her on an unforgettable trip to Paris, where he proposed on top of the Eiffel Tower, and she accepted his proposal with joy, believing she had found her Prince Charming from fairy tale. Together, they looked forward to an eternally blissful future together. Few years later, Rachel and Angus married and welcomed two sons. Following Rachel giving birth to her eldest son, Rachel became a dedicated housewife caring for both herself and the children. Two years later, they welcomed another son. Joe became the primary breadwinner for his family by working at an advertising agency specializing in outdoor advertising. People who knew Joe personally recalled him as being confident, purposeful, charming, punctual, and willing to put in extra hours as needed at work. Joe led an active lifestyle, often hitting up the gym before starting work each morning. His home even contained exercise machines and dumbbells for him to use before beginning his day. As their sons grew older, Rachel decided to become a distributor for a well-known cosmetics company and sell household goods in order to increase the family income. Her new job enabled her to interact with more of their neighbors, who praised her as an amazing and caring mother. However, Joe became less present at home. He would come home only for sleep, 
showering and clothing changes. His heavy workload and anticipation of an upcoming promotion kept him away. Rachel did her best to support Joe. However, gradually they drifted apart and their family relations began deteriorating significantly. A distressful event took place in 2004 when someone sent an anonymous letter alleging Rachel of mistreating her two sons aged four and two, both at that time ages four and two respectively. A special commission visited their home to investigate and found no evidence to corroborate these allegations against Rachel despite testimony from family, neighbors and relatives about how loving and attentive Rachel is as a mother. Despite this initial letter casting doubt upon her reputation, what happened to Rachel O'Reilly? On Monday morning, October 4, 2004, Joe O'Reilly left home early, while his wife and children slept peacefully. As the day progressed, Joe attempted to contact his wife through texts, phone calls, voicemail messages, voicemail and home phone only to be met by an answering machine, finally leaving an increasingly concerned voicemail, urging his wife to contact him immediately. On Tuesday afternoon, Joe received a phone call from their kindergarten teacher informing him that Rachel had failed to pick up their children as expected, something which had never happened before. Concerned, Joe immediately called Rose, who lived nearby, to see if she knew where Rachel might be located. Since Rose didn't, Joe asked Rose to go check on them, while he himself headed back out quickly to collect his own kids from kindergarten. Rose arrived at her daughter's house and immediately noticed Rachel's car parked in the yard, indicating her presence. However, the house was unusually quiet and dark, and no one answered Rose's calls. Rose noticed, firstly, the chaotic state of the home resembling an attempted burglary scene, where cabinets and drawers had been opened up with contents scattered about, though no sign of Rachel. Rose was shocked at what she found when she entered Rachel's bedroom. The sight of Rachel lying amidst a pool of her own blood was enough to send shockwaves through her. Blood covered walls, furniture, and ceiling, as her skull could be seen through bloody locks tangled with blood. Rose quickly ran toward Rachel, hoping she was still alive, but when she touched Rachel's arm, it was cold and stiff. Rachel was already dead beyond any help being offered to her. Rose was so overcome with grief that she started screaming out for help and calling out to neighbors, including a doctor, that they all ran over to assist. Unfortunately, when they arrived, they discovered Rachel could no longer be saved. The doctor examined Rachel's body first before telling Rose they couldn't save her. As Joe arrived at his wife's home, a crowd had already amassed. On hearing of her death, Joe immediately became distraught, refusing to believe what had occurred. Once in their bedroom near their body, Joe became inconsolable with emotions, ranging from tears and sobbing to vows to seek revenge against those responsible. Police officers arriving on the scene reported never witnessing such a brutal and senseless murder of an unarmed woman before. It was evident that Rachel was brutally beaten with an iron weapon with unimaginable force until nothing of her body remained, seemingly attacked from behind since there were no visible signs of resistance from Rachel herself. While initial indications pointed to a possible robbery, investigators soon became convinced there may have been personal motives or long-held animosity at play behind this attack on a petite young mother of two children. Who could possibly harm such an innocent woman so violently? Detectives promptly began interviewing family and neighbors of Rachel. All reported confidently that there were no known enemies or bad influences among her acquaintances. Indeed, all reported nothing out of the ordinary had occurred that day, such as strange cars or unfamiliar individuals near Rachel's residence. Joe claimed he spent most of the day working at a bus depot on the opposite side of town for work, which was corroborated by one of his co-workers. Although this seemed credible to the police, they could not shake their lingering suspicions that something wasn't adding up, although initially appearing like a robbery with stolen items not fitting typical motives. Notably, your 1,000 left sitting unguarded near jewelry box left mostly intact with only few missing pieces. In addition to Rachel's camera, Silverware, and one of Joe's dumbbells reported missing as well. A bag containing stolen items such as the camera, silverware, and jewelry was later found two miles away in a bush. All these items matched those on Joe's list of missing ones. This undermined Joe's theory of robbery, 
leading him to classify this crime as premeditated murder instead. Suspicious widower. Though Joe tried his hardest to show grief and pain, his efforts came across as fake. As such, he immediately became the primary suspect, since he could offer no proof yet of any crime having taken place involving himself or his former wife. Detectives needed to check his alibi carefully, study the scene of the crime closely, and get an understanding of their relationship before concluding their investigation. Joe said he visited his gym daily before work, which was verified by surveillance cameras both inside and outside the facility. From there, he drove directly to his office before traveling onward to a bus station outside the city to inspect advertisements being placed on vehicles, something his colleague confirmed as well. Investigators visited Joe's workplace and took possession of his computer for examination. Here was where things became most interesting. There were strange correspondences on it, which Joe had partially deleted himself. Yet specialists managed to recover these messages, leading the police to become convinced they were heading down the correct path. Joe would often write to his friend and sister and express his dislike of his wife through insults and profanity in these correspondences. Joe noted how she no longer attracted him as a woman and caused him discomfort. Furthermore, the computer revealed another curious correspondence between Joe and one of his colleagues, Nikki Pell. Their conversations proved that their friendship went deeper than meets the eye. Hence, it was imperative for both to be investigated further. Who exactly was Nikki Pell? Nikki also worked at an advertising firm, and, despite their age difference of 10 years, she and Joe were having an affair. Although it could not be pinpointed exactly when this workplace romance began, Joe would frequently spend evenings and even nights at her place, using work as an excuse for his visitation. What made things suspicious for Joe is when he promised Nikki they would soon be together with his sons as well, including Rachel's sons he mentioned often enough in messages sent between them. Such messages prompted concern since, should their marriage dissolve, the boys would likely remain living with their mother. After initially denying any extramarital affairs on his part, Joe eventually admitted his infidelity when confronted with irrefutable evidence and stated that their relationship had ended over a week prior. At first, Joe O'Reilly's home remained cordoned off as a crime scene. No one was permitted inside. Joe spent this period staying with his sister, while his sons went with their grandparents for the funeral service and burial. At the funeral itself, however, Joe did not behave like any grieving widower would. In fact, when it came time to say his final farewells to Rachel quickly and coldly, before suggesting the coffin should be closed and buried immediately, as soon as they returned home, everything looked just like it did on the day of Rachel's murder, except her absence. Joe asked his in-laws for company, thinking he needed support, but soon started making disturbing claims about how Rachel may have been attacked, walking around his wife's murder room while detailing its contents with pinpoint precision while speculating about how her attacker might have attacked. Joe went as far as suggesting the perpetrator might have gone into the bathroom to wash off blood off their hands before taking their weapon with them, before moving back out into her room, an account which included animated gestures from Joe. His parents initially dismissed his actions as attempts to cope with trauma and relieve stress. Rose later acknowledged she could not shake the notion that their son-in-law might have committed crimes in the past and could possibly be the one responsible for killing their daughter. Thirst for fame. After attending his brother's funeral, O'Reilly quickly initiated dialogue with the media, giving interviews regularly. He readily invited reporters into his home for tours of the crime scene and detailing its timeline. During each interview, Joe would address directly any criminal who may have committed an act by encouraging them to surrender voluntarily with police. Three weeks after Rachel's tragic death, her loved ones agreed to participate in filming of a television program dedicated to the crime. Though Rachel's parents were devastated, Joe made himself seem like a star during filming. He actively interacted with makeup artists and seemed curious as to how he would appear on camera while also eagerly indulging in treats and sipping coffee during breaks. Police, who had been closely following Joe, decided to follow his movements after the TV shoot had ended, 
and discovered that after returning home, he immediately visited Nikki, whom he had been spending his nights with. Once it became evident that Joe was indeed responsible, their focus shifted toward collecting irrefutable evidence for court. Acquiring evidence was a long, complicated and exasperating process, since no murder weapon could ever be located. Still, other evidence began piling up. Nikki and Joe's colleague, who had earlier corroborated his alibi, could face jail time for perjury charges. Therefore, they decided against risking their freedom by giving false testimony against each other. Nikki admitted that she and Joe had not broken up as originally indicated. Rather, they continued their relationship, despite what Rachel thought. When Rachel found out, this caused a heated argument between Rachel and her spouse shortly before tragedy struck. Joe's colleague expressed uncertainty regarding his whereabouts at the time of his wife's murder, but confirmed Joe's alibi when requested, not realizing at that time that Joe might be involved. Joe's computer contained alarming correspondences. These revealed an unsettling pattern. He insulted his wife while making plans with Nikki and their children for an uncertain future, suggesting an alliance. This evidence further implicated Joe. Additionally, police also carefully evaluated multiple interviews with Joe, as well as footage from TV programs, wherein he described details only the perpetrator would know of such as crime scene descriptions, with precision, that suggested their guilt in this case. Joe went to the gym as captured by surveillance cameras in the morning. After informing his colleagues about this plan, he then claimed he would be absent due to work in another part of the city and may not be reachable via phone. Instead of going directly to a bus station as claimed, however, Joe instead returned home where he used a dumbbell to attack his wife from behind as she took their children to kindergarten, with no chance for escape or resistance whatsoever from him. Following this brutal murderous assault, Joe admitted cleaning off both himself and weapon afterwards in another bathroom adjacent to their bedroom in order to eliminate bloodstains left from the incident and to wash away blood from both himself and weapon within minutes after. The perpetrator quickly changed clothes, scattered his belongings around the house to simulate a robbery, and left for work. On his journey, he dumped any stolen items or dirty clothing, as well as disposing of his dumbbell, so as to prevent further detection. Joe appeared overexcited and nervous during office meetings, which some colleagues noted. His alibi story seemed convincing enough on that fateful day, but his actions belied it. Joe's careless remarks during interviews and at the crime scene allowed investigators to piece together an accurate account of his killing. From planning his gym visit to disposing of evidence, everything pointed in Joe's direction as the perpetrator. Eventually, it became increasingly clear who it was that was behind this crime spree. Joe wasn't apprehended for Rachel's murder until two years after the crime had been committed. This allowed time for evidence collection with cell phone signals placing Joe at Rachel's family home at the time of Rachel's killing, which were verified through phone billing records. At trial, it became evident that Joe requested his mother write an anonymous message to Child Protective Services alleging Rachel as being bad and abusive mother, hoping this would give him sole custody if their marriage ended in divorce. Unfortunately, social services officials found no proof to back up such allegations made in this anonymous message. Joe showed no remorse while appearing in court. Instead, he smiled widely and engaged with his defense attorneys with gusto, seemingly believing he would soon be released from incarceration. However, in July 2007, the court found him guilty and sentenced him to life imprisonment. Attempts by his legal representation to challenge this decision ultimately failed despite complaints and appeals being submitted on his behalf. Notably, Joe O'Reilly kept up his relationship with Nikki even after being sent to prison. She visited him regularly, but for reasons unknown, the two eventually stopped communicating in 2022. Joe O'Reilly never admitted guilt while in prison and sought to become an ideal inmate with hopes of one day becoming eligible for parole eligibility. Share your opinion with us in the comments and subscribe to the channel for more. Agnesi Clavina made headlines in fall 2014 when her story made waves of controversy. A young and attractive woman, having fun in a club with friends, seemed to suddenly vanish without trace, 
leaving everyone involved apparently without responsibility. Yet nine years after Agnesi Clavina disappeared into thin air, the case took an unexpected twist. But let's get down to its root causes first. Born July 8, 1984 in Riga, Latvia's capital city, Agnese Klavina grew up as one of two daughters of her parents. With Greta only being two years older than Agnese themselves, these two remained very close and close-knit from day one. Agnese's parents did their best to give both daughters an education they deserved and enable them to pursue their ambitions. Agnese was an outgoing, cheerful, and very active girl from early on in her life. She excelled academically at school, participated in sports activities, made many friends, and dreamt of making tourism or entertainment her profession, as she loved travel and knew how to organize, perfectly sheer time, plus had beautiful features. Men always paid her compliments. From an early age on, she attracted plenty of admirers who sought ways to attract her attention. Agnes began her post-secondary life in Latvia, before attending language courses and studying tourism management. At 20, Agnes decided to move from her native Latvia to London, where she believed there would be greater prospects and opportunities to develop all her potential and talents. Her family did not oppose this decision, but offered their full support in it. Soon after her move, Agnese met Michael Mills, an attractive young man eight years older who owned his own successful movie theater and entertainment complex business and considered himself highly successful. Michael and Agnes quickly connected, quickly began dating, and made plans for a future together. Michael showed his affection by giving expensive gifts. Together they traveled and made plans for their future. It seemed they were truly in love and headed toward a prosperous life together. Those close to Agnes remember her glowing at his side while dreaming of becoming his lawful wife in due time. Kavina received an offer to work on a three-month labor contract as administrator in one of Marbella's most renowned nightclubs, the Club Marbella. Naturally, this job would require her to temporarily move countries. She took this opportunity with great stride. Michael could not follow his lover to Spain due to his job obligations, but wasn't opposed to her signing the contract either. Agnes saw this opportunity as an incredible chance to expand her experience and move further along in her professional development in this direction. Marbella is one of the Mediterranean coast's most renowned and attractive resorts. Visitors come from around the world, typically wealthy people seeking relaxation and spending fun money here. Here you can often meet show business stars, as well as notable athletes and business people like Kavina, who was always highly social and enjoyed working there. Agnese visited her family in Latvia before departing England, informing them of her positive employment contract and an upcoming wedding with Michael. Parents, mother and sister, all expressed genuine happiness for Agnese and offered best wishes for a smooth transition into her new life in England. Agnes packed only what she needed for one season at the end of May 2014 and took off for sunny Spain to work. While her lover remained behind in London, they called each other daily and communicated via video link, telling each other everything that had been going on in their lives. Kavina actively maintained pages in various popular social networks where she posted daily photos, small videos, and stories. Her followers closely tracked all her activities. It was clear Agnese enjoyed an engaging lifestyle full of surprises every day. Agnese decided to stay in Spain for another two months when her employment contract came to an end. Velvet season in her resort meant an opportunity to earn good money during this time. After consulting her boyfriend and receiving his support, and promising to visit for several days as they hadn't seen each other for a long while, Agnese almost instantly secured employment as a hostess at a high-end restaurant and renewed her lease agreement. Michael visited Agnese as promised and they enjoyed planning the upcoming wedding and choosing their honeymoon location. Less than one week later, however, Michael flew back to London, leaving Agnese behind in Spain for another month of work before she would visit Latvia to meet Michael again before flying over. But tragically, these plans would never come true. On September 6th, Agnese went with her friends to one of the popular nightclubs in her region, Costa del Sol. 
A few hours before, she informed her fiancé of their plans and didn't object to Agnese having fun with them. Pictures were taken, which Agnese then uploaded onto her online profile. Recollections from those who witnessed Agnese that night suggest she wore an eye-catching short dress with a tiny white clutch handbag on that fateful evening. At sunrise, as Agnese was about to leave with her friends, she announced her intention of staying an additional hour and then taking a cab ride home. Being known for being responsible and not having had much alcohol herself, no cause was apparent for concern from Agnese's companions. When everyone said goodbye and left for home, Kavina began conversing with an unknown individual who had bought her a cocktail as they attempted to gain Agnese's favor. Once Kavina disappeared into a nightclub on that fateful night, no one remembered if she was alive or dead. No one remembered when or with whom she left or where she went afterwards. Agnese failed to show up for work the following day either, and her phone had been switched off when attempts to contact her failed. Colleagues and friends raised the alarm immediately, while police responded slowly to reports about missing people. Michael became alarmed upon realizing he hadn't heard from Agnese all day, something which never had happened before, and called Agnese's mother to report it. They attempted to contact Spanish police to report her disappearance, but were told their relatives needed to file such reports themselves, or it wouldn't be taken into consideration. Michael and Kavanaugh's family boarded their flight for Marbella, where Michael filed his report himself on an outbound flight the following morning. At last, Agnes's family filed her missing person report only five days after Agnes vanished without trace. First on their agenda was Agnes's apartment. However, it appeared as though Kavina had left soon and would return soon. Documents, money, and jewelry had all been put away neatly. Prepared food had been placed in the refrigerator. Several outfits for Agnes to choose from when attending her last club night were on her bed. Her phone had been switched off since leaving with friends. No further posts had been left on social media, and no messages received in return. No indication as to her whereabouts existed either. At last, police began their investigation of Agnes's disappearance. Too late, though. Friends and family began posting flyers all around town with her picture and pleas for help in her search, while media coverage featured Agnese on TV news programs as well as local newspaper front pages. Police found their first leads and clues by studying footage from CCTV cameras inside and outside of the entertainment venue. But this proved problematic, since all files had already been erased at that time, requiring specialists to restore them. But their efforts paid off when one recording made by a camera at the exit to the parking lot showed Agnes leaving with someone that clearly wasn't her free will at six in the morning. Closer examination revealed Kavanaugh alive. This footage would later become frightening. Agnese was being led by a large man, and it was clear she was following under coercion. Her waist was being held tight by his grip. Agnese appeared frightened struggled to break free several times and expressed herself emotionally. Yet her companion persisted with leading her towards the parking lot, where he forcibly led her into his Mercedes A63 with tinted windows and forced her inside it. At the moment when he pushed her into the cabin, it became evident that another individual was already inside while he headed towards the driver's seat. Agnese managed to open her car door, then attempted to escape. But at that moment, the doorman who was standing close by came up, gestured toward Agnes and told the driver something. The doorman pushed Agnes back into her seat, after which Agnes's driver gave something as payment, likely an inducement to help. About six minutes after Agnes had boarded her car, her phone was switched off and never turned back on again. Furthermore, there were no CCTV cameras to track its further movement thus rendering its further path unknown to everyone except those inside its cabin, who subsequently managed to make contact with Agnese again. Surprisingly, this case was handled with extreme secrecy from its inception. All participants signed non-disclosure documents, keeping information out of the press while also withholding it from Agnese's loved ones, not even her parents and fiancé. For months on end, Parents and fiancé were only informed that an investigation had started, but too early to draw any conclusions, with no trace of Agnese ever being given.
During this period, it seemed unlikely she was still alive. Michael periodically gave interviews in which he sought assistance, but nothing ever came in response. No one ever responded to his pleas for help in finding Agnese. Six months later, Agnese's relatives were shown footage from club cameras, as well as names of all three men who had last interacted with her. Wesley Capper was identified as one of them. Wesley is the son of an influential British millionaire named Wesley Capper, while longtime companion Craig Porter often served as his passenger during rides. Also present was Keon Usman from Dorman Security Services, who served as his dark-skinned doorman counterpart. Porter and Usman both claimed they were innocent during interrogations, asserting that Agneza had entered their car voluntarily. Capper reported seeing her at a club before approaching her to get acquainted. Agnes had already become quite inebriated, contradicting her friend's testimony, yet did not refuse the drink that Wesley offered her. Once Wesley suggested continuing the party at his luxurious country estate house, Agnes readily agreed. Agnes decided she no longer wanted to attend Wesley's party and requested being dropped off in the middle of the road instead, stating she would take a cab back home. The man claimed he dropped off his passenger at her desired destination an unlit stretch of road with no CCTV cameras whatsoever. Craig Porter could neither confirm nor deny Wesley Capper's statements because, according to his confession, he himself was heavily intoxicated and did not understand when and why Agnes had come into their car. Furthermore, he stated that as soon as they left the parking lot, he fell asleep, and when he awoke, she was no longer there. Sean Usman, another doorman suspect, also claimed Agnes A. Clavina was drunk but could not answer the question of her voluntary entry into the car. When the vehicle touched down, however, when Agnese opened her door to almost jump out, while driving she opened it again almost as fast and almost fell up before Shonosmen was asked whether this appeared suspicious. His answer, not at all, and may simply have been an attempt by Agnese to escape while walking while drunk. Additionally, she did not scream out for help at that moment either. On camera, Wesley Capper could be seen forcefully leading Agnese toward her car while holding onto her waist and wrist with both hands. Wesley provided no explanation as to why he did this, other than Agnese was dizzy, so Wesley needed to hold down so she wouldn't fall. Not long afterward, the investigation discovered a video made in Soto Grande in southern Spain at Puerto de la Duquesa port. Here, John Capper, father of one of the suspects, had docked his luxury yacht moored there. On September 10th, four days after Agnes disappeared, footage captured of Wesley, Craig, and two other men boarding the yacht was seen carrying an apparently heavy suitcase as well as a roll of carpet. But upon their return to Puerto de la Duquesa, a few days later without their luggage on board, was unexpectedly shown to have vanished altogether. After viewing the footage, Kerr stated that he and his friends had come to Ibiza for fun. According to him, their suitcase contained their belongings, while what investigators mistook as carpet was actually bedding. Where it all ended up was unknown to him. A search of Wesley's yacht and automobile yielded no results, as both had been cleaned thoroughly with detergent to erase all traces of DNA. Despite finding long blonde hairs in Wesley's trunk, though they mysteriously dissipated during investigation. At trial, the prosecution revealed another intriguing detail. Soon after Agnese was in Capper's car, Capper called emergency services several times before dropping them without waiting for an answer, or as though afraid or doubting his actions. When confronted, Capper explained he had been drinking and made random calls at random times. A lawyer for Claven family believed Agnese had long since died, and her body may even still be resting somewhere beneath the seabed, likely resting somewhere inside one of the suitcases brought aboard yacht by suspects. Further, case was deliberately prolonged, so criminals had plenty of time to hide evidence against themselves from prosecution and erase any proof. Capper, Porter, and Usman found themselves facing charges only 18 months after Agnese went missing. They were accused of holding her against her will and forcing her into their car. Due to a lack of evidence, there were no further charges brought against them and so the millionaire and his friend were released on bail and quietly left courtroom. Naturally, Agnes's relatives were outraged. Nevertheless, the judge stood firm. All three men were brought back onto trial 
five years after Agnes had disappeared, claiming Kavina entered their vehicle of her own accord. The prosecutor asked that Usman be considered an accomplice in this crime for helping drive away victim. Had Usman been found responsible, his actions could have earned him five years behind bars. He made an impassioned defense, alleging that he had been wrongfully charged due to the color of his skin and lack of funds available for legal representation due to sending all his earnings back home to an impoverished African family in need. Capper and Porter's attorneys insisted that their clients had only persuaded Agnes to get into the car, not forcibly forcing her. They believed the young woman was dropped off on the road as she requested, yet during her wait for a cab, she could have been kidnapped and killed by third parties due to being drunk and having no way of protecting herself against being taken advantage of by them. The court verdict surprised and angered Agnese's relatives, as none of the defendants was punished at all for taking advantage of Agnese's drunken state to lure her into Capper's car, while Porter received six months for complicity. All these men received suspended sentences, as they never served any time behind bars, but rather paid her family 101,000 sterling as compensation. Kavina's family were dismayed at this decision and filed an appeal. While waiting for a court's verdict, both defendants in this case managed to violate the law once again. Capper was under the influence of alcohol and drugs when he caused the death of a woman and fled from the scene, while Porter and his friends, also under the influence, stole her car after beating its owner mercilessly. Capper was found guilty of this serious offense, but, thanks to the strong legal defense presented by his lawyers, was only sentenced to probation. He paid compensation to the family of the woman killed under his car while remaining free. Porter, on the other hand, went into jail, but it is unknown what sentence was handed out publicly. At nearly seven years after Agnes had vanished, her main suspect, Wesley Capper, lived an irresponsible lifestyle of alcoholism and substance abuse that severely compromised his health. At the height of COVID pandemic, he found himself hospitalized, just when he thought he had overcome it all, suddenly had a stroke and died on July 26, 2021 in his 44th year. At that point, Agnes's parents filed another appeal with the Supreme Court, though now without their suspect alive any longer, they could no longer prosecute him either. Unexpectedly, nine years later, this unexpected development occurred. Though Agnese Clavina had never been found dead or alive, her body was presumed deceased and later agreed with the lawyer's account of how criminals had concealed Agnese in a suitcase that was then loaded onto a yacht and dumped somewhere on the high seas, making its discovery near impossible. However, in 2023, Nine years after Agnese disappeared without trace, an unexpected turn occurred. In mid-June of that year, while cleaning one of Lita Golf Clubs located along Costa del Sol region's Lita Golf Club, found something odd near shore. Closer inspection revealed it as being a badly damaged suitcase. Therefore, he did not dare open it himself, but called police instead for assistance instead. Law enforcement officials were shocked to find human remains inside of a suitcase found floating on the water near Florida, with examination revealing they belonged to a young woman between 25-35 years of age, who died at about 25-30 years old, at time of her death. Furthermore, examination indicated the suitcase spent over 10 years floating before it was brought ashore for transporting and examination by law enforcement personnel. Based on these facts alone, they suspected it may belong to Agnese Clavina, who went missing nine years ago. To make their hypothesis more certain, examinations must compare DNA between Agnese's DNA with remains found alongside human remains found. Experts are working hard on this investigation, but details have yet to be made public. If suspicions are confirmed, this will provide grounds to reopen the case and bring all remaining suspects before a judge for trial. On November 6, 2014, Mexico City police officers discovered human remains. Part of a torso was discovered in a vacant lot near Mexico City's exit and shortly after found in various parts of Mexico City, along with bags containing arms and legs. Shockingly, these limbs lacked fingers, 
police immediately raised the alarm when it became evident that an extremely violent criminal was operating in the region. Patrol teams of officers quickly mobilized, searching every corner for signs of this individual, as their primary objective was to find his head and arms, so as to prevent future crimes from being perpetrated against innocent bystanders. At first, everyone believed this case to be the work of a brutal serial killer. Though fingers and the head had never been recovered from this site, due to professional efforts of forensic experts, it was determined that all remains belonged to one individual. Yet without fingers and teeth, it was impossible to ascertain who this individual was. Alejandra La Fuente was an attractive brunette living in Mexico City who boasted searing brunette hair, bright brown eyes with thick black lashes, an athletic body built for fitness through yoga and breathing exercises, and frequented beauty salons to receive massages or spa treatments. During warm months, she would lounge on the beach, and on cloudy days, she visited tanning salons. Generally, she thought very highly of herself and was considered an icon of female attractiveness. Alejandra did not lag behind in her career either. Her father is Alberto Dente, an esteemed psychiatrist, renowned for his treatment of such deviating mental conditions as schizophrenia and manic disorder, known both for scientific research as well as experiments conducted with patients. Alejandra found inspiration in him and set about following in his footsteps, enrolling at one of the best universities for psychiatry where she graduated with honors after years of perseverance, resourcefulness, and extraordinary intelligence combined with connections from her father helped her write and defend her thesis about manic syndrome syndrome syndrome. Alejandra eventually decided not to pursue psychiatry but was instead attracted by psychotherapy work, becoming licensed and opening her practice in a new business center at the heart of the capital with help from her father's money. Alejandra soon had clients seeking her services with eating disorders, depression, relationship difficulties, and low self-esteem, seeking counseling sessions, helping family issues along the way while leaving much unfinished. Alejandra had two charming daughters from her first marriage, both having the eyes and sense of humor of Alejandra herself and of their father, respectively. But Alejandra wasn't disheartened. Two children weren't enough reason for her to give up. She still dreamt of finding someone special who could also provide for their daughters as father figures. Once Alejandra had divorced her former partner, the ex-husband, who will remain anonymous, returned home as is often done after separation to spend time with their three young daughters and assist with household duties if needed. Unfortunately for him, this visit would turn out to be his final one. Alejandra asked him to enter through the backyard because the front door lock had jammed, reasoning that her youngest daughter was currently bathing, and requested him come into her bathroom. Surprising himself by following this instruction without question or hesitation, so the man went in. Eruptions were heard throughout the house. No sounds could be heard. Cartoons or children laughing weren't playing either. A man entered the bathroom to discover tape on the floor and no daughter in her tub, an indication that something had gone amiss. At that instant, his ex-wife stood behind him with a hammer and struck with all her strength, striking first to his head, then to another part. The man fell, blood pouring out through an opening in his skull. Everything around him was stained red in seconds as experts later revealed. There was little hope for recovery, as death occurred almost instantly after receiving such a heavy blunt object strike. Unwittingly, Alejandra became an eyewitness to this truly horrific scene when she returned early from a friend's house and witnessed both of her parents quarreling. Their children frequently witnessed Alejandra being mentally disturbed, taking out her feelings on others, friends, and even her own husband who often showed scratched arms and neck. Housemates witnessed her frequent tantrums all throughout their home with inadequate behavior from Alejandra as well. Finally, however, things escalated out of control. Daughter ran outside calling out for help before neighbors rushed over and immediately called police squad, where psychologist was arrested, charged with murder charges by police a neighbor who then called law enforcement officers to arrest and charge him with murder charges. At the station, Alejandra was placed into a cell where she would remain until her first hearing in court. Alejandra denied any guilt, 
lawyers provided her with an argument of self-defense based on an ex-husband who was jealous of Alejandra and claimed she brought men into their home which could negatively impact young girls. On the day of the crime, he arrived unannounced at his former wife's house through the back door, hoping to catch his ex with another man. Instead, he attacked Alejandra, who was trying to put together her nightstand. This forced Alejandra to use self-defense, striking two blows against his back which then returned into his head, causing two blows from self-defense against him as her defense. On June 14, 2012, Alejandra's sentence was handed down, taking into consideration all evidence presented by her defense and two minor children present. Due to coordinated work between lawyers and her father's funds, it was changed into a suspended one. Months later, another appeal was filed, citing assault and self-defense as an argument. Human rights activists requested jury trial as they felt sorry for Alejandra, who presented herself at trial as victim of domestic abuse. Ultimately, the court reviewed and granted an acquittal decision. After being released from prison, Alejandra continued to provide psychological counseling services as before. She created an image of herself as a victim of gender inequality who struggled to uphold her rights, like most women across North America, before finally winning them over and becoming more popular with potential clients. This created image further cemented Alejandra's popularity among potential customers. Maria Alejandra quickly met Alan Carrera, a large Mexican businessman and son of Adrian Carrera Francis. Alan was tall, handsome, and statuesque. His father had previously served as head of special services for the Central District and had seen great success during his career. Soon, Alan expanded his business and opened construction stores throughout the country. While some aspects were legitimate, other parts were closely associated with crime. Alan was dismissed from his position when one of his financial scams was discovered, as well as for having been part of a criminal organization involved in transporting psychotropic substances from Europe into America. Their base was located near a border town and protected by corrupt police officers. This group controlled some portion of psychoactive substance trafficking in South. Alan Carrera's father, Adrian, was found to be involved in his affairs, and police managed to obtain a statement from him. Adrian faced a 20-year prison term due to witness protection program restrictions. Instead, he was released early from custody thanks to witness protection on July 18, 2000, and immediately dedicated himself to raising his son, Alan, while running their legitimate business together. Alan quickly took after his father in terms of values and experiences and eventually decided to become an entrepreneur himself, opening an independent chain of household appliance stores that he managed himself until graduation from college when his dad passed on and ran it all from scratch with zero guidance from anyone. This business wasn't as large, but still brought good profits. Alan had been attracted to one classmate since childhood, whom he eventually married as his spouse. She was smart, beautiful, and came from a good family. Their marriage was short, but bright with one beautiful daughter produced as a result. Unfortunately, due to Alan's work schedule and almost total absence at home, eventually caused it to end in divorce, and Alan found it incredibly hard. Parting ways with his love from high school, new relationships did not bring much fulfillment or comfort, leading him down a path toward loneliness and ultimately leading him down that path towards alcoholism. Alan attempted different means to deal with his depression and alcohol dependence, such as attending Alcoholics Anonymous meetings and therapy. Alan eventually sought advice from Alberto, a world-renowned psychiatrist renowned for helping Maria Alejandra get divorced. During that difficult process, Alan became Maria Alejandra's only source of emotional stability. Though Alan and Maria Alejandra eventually parted ways, Maria Alejandra still felt attached to him, despite their separation and had refused any other man into her life as replacements. Eventually, Alan's ex-wife decided to consult Alberto on her own initiative, as she too decided to see a therapist for herself, as she attempted to cope with her emotions, as she sought therapeutic help herself. Alan was being treated by a psychiatrist, who explained he could not counsel both spouses due to ethical considerations 
and recommended Alejandra as his daughter's counselor instead. Alejandra quickly recognized that Alan's ex-husband could be an ideal match. He was described as being pleasant in life with plenty of wealth and offered her client another consultation, believing she could solve their issue quickly in just one session while breaking their bond together. Alejandra set out from the start to seduce an entrepreneur during their steamy session with great success. Alan quickly noticed her attempts and offered the therapist coffee afterwards so they could discuss family problems together. Though initially unwilling, Alan suggested going out on a date that evening. Though initially contrary to medical ethics, their romance quickly progressed. Within weeks of their first date, they agreed to live together and two more months later, legalized their relationship. Alan had no inkling of any surprises in Alejandra's closet or of why she had filed for divorce from her former spouse. In April 2014, Alan decided to visit his parents in Florida and spend the weekend together. During this visit, he got the chance to discuss both Alejandra and their wedding plans, which they hadn't heard about until that point. Alan's parents were very surprised as Alejandra hadn't ever come up before in his life before. It was extremely strange. One week after meeting his parents, Alejandra asked her husband not to call any of her friends or relatives, and no invitations were sent out due to budgetary considerations. However, her father actually attended the wedding ceremony. At first glance, life with this couple seemed perfect, but quickly disintegrated into disaster. Alejandra could no longer hide her overwrought nature, and their relationship began to rapidly change. Alan kept most of his personal details to himself, and very few knew what was transpiring between them. Yet it was obvious that their previous bond had been severely tested, no longer seeming quite so happy together. Since meeting Alejandra, Alan began distancing himself from his family. The final straw was when his wedding to Alejandra was held without them, and they didn't invite their parents. After which, Alan even stopped calling his friends anymore and his remaining buddies began to notice that Alejandra seemed anxious, sometimes behaving inappropriately and rapidly losing her temper. After experiencing several incidents like these, Alan became embarrassed and decided to reduce joint family meetings. Quarrels arose on a daily basis for seemingly inexplicable reasons. One evening, Alejandra decided to check her husband's phone and discovered correspondence from other women which contained explicit material. Obviously, this could not go ignored. According to Alejandra, this was the final straw. She claimed in court that her husband beat, insulted, and humiliated her in every possible way. His infidelity further confirmed this view. It became evident that this marriage could no longer be saved, and yet, for unknown reasons, Alejandra did not try traditional psychotherapy methods as an attempt at repair. With her thoughts about Alan's infidelity fresh in mind, the young woman decided to use an approach she knew well to deal with him. After making this decision, all her focus shifted toward devising the perfect murder plot, while Alan carried on living life without knowing what was in store for him. Alan still had little contact with his family, yet couldn't miss the annual birthday feast held to honor Alan's late grandfather's birth. Alan attended, but his parents made it clear that Alejandra wasn't welcome in their home, something which further disturbed Alejandra and further soured their relationship. No one could have predicted that Alan would ever leave them alive again. On October 31, 2014, Alan used his phone to send one last text message, informing his family he had reached home safely after attending his birthday party and that his phone had not been used since that day to contact anyone. Since that day, there had been no further contact from Alan and no text messages received or sent from him since October 31, 2014. Alan had not been seen at work in several days, an unusual occurrence given his strong commitment to his work and imminent plans for opening a new store, so his presence was vitally needed. Alejandra devised an ingenious plan to end Alan's life after returning from vacation. She added a powerful sleeping pill to his usual milk before bedtime and then covered him up with a pillow before slowly watching him lose consciousness while desperately trying to remove it and breathe again. Alejandra reveled in seeing his valiant attempts at breaking free but quickly saw through them and got rid of him instantly. 
Once that was over, Alejandra faced her most daunting task yet, disposing of Alan's body. In such an unexpected event, without much preparation or foresight, she found herself having no choice but to use whatever means available. Alan being too heavy, she made do with what she had. Time was running short, so Alejandra ran to a neighbor's vegetable garden in search of an electric saw, before sawing his body into pieces with grim determination. Only an extreme sadist could do something like this. Packing all body parts away into garbage bags, she also cut off fingers and extracted teeth so investigators could identify who it belonged. Alejandra tried her best to remove the body without raising suspicion, but this plan proved unsuccessful as dawn approached and Alejandra was unable to leave without being noticed by a nearby elderly resident who suffered insomnia and saw Alejandra leave early with the suitcase, behaving very strangely, and her husband refusing to assist in lifting its heavy weights. This alarmed her. At dawn's break, Alejandra returned home. To the surprise of vigilant neighbors, this surprised Alejandra even more, as it would later emerge that she had scattered bags containing her ex-husband's remains throughout different neighborhoods to conceal her tracks and continue with life, as usual. Once day broke, however, she resumed normal living. On November 6, 2014, Mexican police officers made an awful discovery, an anatomically correct torso without teeth and fingers on its hand. Their entire force was on alert due to this horrific event, but less than 24 hours later body parts began turning up in various parts of the city. Their distance apart could later be linked back to Alejandra's long absence from home. All the body parts were taken to an expert forensic lab, where experts quickly established that all of them belonged to one individual. To deflect suspicion away from herself, the perpetrator began writing messages to Alan's relatives in an effort to disprove suspicion. But she only made things worse, as she didn't even realize that Alan had recently disassociated himself from family ties and had no further contact with his relatives. Alejandra informed Alan's parents on his behalf that she and Alan would be traveling and out of contact for some time. However, Alberto, Alejandra's father, began making calls to Alan's father's home to ensure his son-in-law knew where his daughter-in-law was located. Since he hadn't heard from Alejandra in a while, and the patients were extremely worried that they wouldn't be attending counseling sessions as scheduled, he wanted assurance if this plan worked or not. Later, Alan's relatives received another phony call informing them that Alan's daughter had been found and needed to be forcibly admitted into a clinic as she was suffering from depression due to Alan's infidelity. This caused great alarm among his relatives. All attempts at finding him failed, so the businessman's family turned to police for assistance. Laboratory experts decided to compare Alan's characteristics with those found recently, and the similarities were undeniable. All his family and relatives identified him. It was especially difficult for Alan's grandfather, as soon after being told, he became sick with heart disease from grieving over losing one grandson out of three grandchildren he cared about so deeply. Following this confirmation from investigators, search warrants were issued for both his home and office address. After digging, fingers and teeth of a deceased individual were discovered, sending shockwaves through the capital city. Alejandra was quickly arrested. Blood was also detected in one room, as well as on her trunk car and in her garage. Alejandra initially attempted to deny her guilt, hoping to get away with it without being caught as she had with her previous husband. But the investigation quickly narrowed it down. An elderly witness provided testimony correlating her time of death with that estimated by Alejandra herself. Alejandra used her position with Alan to procure powerful sleeping pills only doctors could obtain which further implicated her in Alan's death. Evidence obtained was critical in connecting Alejandra with the brutal murder of her husband, as CCTV cameras provided proof that the man entered their house but never left again. Suitcases had also been removed, as confirmed by footage. On December 10, 2014, the jury reached its verdict. Alejandra was sentenced to life imprisonment for murder with brutality, an attempt at concealing it with official position abuse and using her official position for personal gain. Her father tried his hardest through connections and bribes to help keep his daughter free. Unfortunately, 
he failed. Although keeping the trial closed from public view helped, his career suffered greatly. Few would turn to someone who raised such an uncontrollable monster, nor quickly identified issues within their family, such as Alejandra's. At trial, Alejandra's first husband's death also came up. Although due to its length of time, there was no evidence in this instance. There were speculations as to Alejandra's father being involved. There were suspicions he may have conspired with his daughter in crimes committed for scientific interest. But none was ever found as proof against this hypothesis. After numerous appeals from victims, the sentence was commuted to death, an unprecedented event since such sentences are extremely rare in Mexico these days. Furthermore, neither defendant was eligible for a review of his case, meaning his house and all property should go to family of the victim, though this provided little comfort since their loved one could never return from death. Alejandra was an apparent pragmatic and cruel woman with severe mental health issues. Medical examinations denied this claim. She was heavily influenced by her father and used her official position to carry out her evil plans. Following her first crime, impunity only emboldened Alejandra further. Perhaps Alan would still be alive today had she not managed to escape justice so easily the first time around. Share your opinion with us in the comments and subscribe to the channel for more. Becoming engaged can be thrilling, yet Tina Thomas felt even more anxious than Gabe Watson when discussing the idea with their parents. Both were 26 at the time, and this would be Tina's third serious relationship and second attempt at wedding plans. Tina McCulloch's first attempt at family formation failed. Their relationship was fine. Only her mother objected. Scott wasn't someone Tina was fond of either. There weren't any specific claims against him, but rather just general dissatisfaction with life, as it existed at that moment for Tina. As such, the couple soon parted ways as their illusionary future faded. Tina had tried dating Stan Marks again, without parental involvement, and they couldn't overcome their first three-year crisis, parting amicably by mutual agreement. Finally, on Christmas Eve, at a party of friends, she met Gabe Watson, Although we cannot say love at first sight occurred instantly, instead it developed more as mutual support after both recently experienced breakups. While not the ideal starting point, two years later, Gabe proposed marriage. Tina accepted but needed parental permission first. Gabe decided, like any good prince would do, to try to charm Tina's parents on Valentine's Day. But due to him being away on that date, the dinner was postponed until February 15th instead. At dinner, when Watson announced his decision to marry Tina forever, Gabe stammered like a schoolboy but did not answer. His father of the bride asked another question which seemed simple at first. Does he love Tina? However, Gabe never answered directly or even made eye contact with his own groomsmen before leaving without speaking further with Gabe about the issue. His father took this reaction as an awkwardness common among strangers and asked his daughter the same question. To his amazement, Tina also did not directly answer this query, but began speaking by declaring she feared being alone at 26. Taking time to consider, his father blessed them both. Preparing for a wedding takes considerable time and effort, yet while Tina was focused on her outfit, guests, and overall wedding arrangements, Gabe was solely focused on planning their honeymoon. His plan included traveling to Australia's Great Barrier Reef in the Pacific Ocean near Australia, for diving sessions to view sunken ship the Townsville Titanic, which had sunk in 1911, something Gabe enjoyed doing, but Tina didn't enjoy doing. Gabe would sometimes take Tina scuba diving in calm water pools with lifeguard supervision, but no further. Gabe himself was an experienced scuba diver. He had completed over 50 dives before enrolling in his rescue diving course, not necessarily all underwater, mind you. If you don't learn to dive by our honeymoon, let me be clear. You will stay home, walking the dog or pruning rosies in the garden, not going anywhere with me, warned Gabe. Tina had no other choice. Gabe took out a loan in order to purchase a Tina her equipment and pay for her classes with her first instructor, who had been disappointed in Tina's abilities. Even warning Gabe that his fiancée did not possess sufficient abilities for open ocean swimming. 
Gabe became increasingly annoyed with the diving instructor, accusing him of failing to explain and refusing to continue class. Tina received credit quickly from a second instructor, but this only served to emphasize how everything she does from under the stick is solely meant to please Gabe as her future husband. On October 11th, Tina and Gabe finally tied the knot, spending $10,000 from their wedding gift of travel to Australia within two days after. Gabe dedicated part of his trip specifically for Tina. Together, they visited Sydney Aquarium and Zoo before traveling onward to Townsville, where on October 21st morning, they boarded a boat to one of Earth's most breathtaking places, every diver's dream. Employees at the diving company quickly reveal that upon closer examination, neither Gabe nor his partner seemed like experienced divers. Even after graduating from diving courses and having years of experience under his belt, Gabe could barely comprehend any aspect of equipment as though it were all new to him. But, nonetheless, Tina relied on him for help passing the exam prior to diving, despite its being conducted independently. When offered his help underwater, Tina declined. Diving logs also recorded that there was a strong current on that particular day. Its significance should not be missed or minimized. Gabe helped his wife sort through equipment they'd purchased back home, before heading out to rent tanks for diving trips they were making together. Gabe took an 11L tank for himself and gifted Tina an 8 and 1 2 L1, which for this location would have been too small or even dangerous given her inexperience. Without these tanks, it would not have been possible for Tina to descend to the Townsville Titanic from its first try. Tina requested additional cargo since she could not dive to depth, while Gabe initially was having issues using an underwater computer that calculates and displays dive ascent speeds, as well as oxygen content of tanks. Once back at their boat, however, Gabe's computer worked, and they tried again at 49F Deep Wreck, where Tina submerged first while Gabe followed behind her swimming behind them both. Gabe said everything started off fine. At some point, Tina stopped, began waving at me, and signaled she wanted to head upwards. I quickly recognized this was just her panicking, something she used to do often. At this point, we had already reached half our ascent. Therefore, I decided to attempt to calm her and remain at the same depth for a time so she could adjust psychologically to pressure changes. She continued breathing deeply, which was dangerous. It was at that moment I noticed she was sinking. I attempted to grab Tina's belt to hold her down, but she swung her arm so hard it knocked my mask off my face, and I struggled to put it back on, quickly realizing Tina was already too far away for me to catch her again. For a while, I attempted swimming after her, but without success. After Gab told me of Gab's statement about my death at depth, I decided to return to the surface in search of help from lifeguards. On my way, I met another swimmer with narrow set eyes who did not pay any heed to my signal for assistance. Two Asian men had also been present, but neither confirmed Gab's statements that his body was lying there at depth. Later, when police took underwater computer readings, they confirmed Gabe attempted to swim after his drowning wife briefly, before quickly giving up and ascending as instructed, stopping at each depth level along the way. When interviewed by police, each diver claimed that Gabe could have saved his wife had he done more to try. Gabe had enough oxygen in his tanks to reach the bottom and return back up again before this tragic event occurred. Rescuers aboard the ship quickly responded upon realizing what had occurred and quickly went in search of Tina. Unfortunately, they found her very quickly but unfortunately too late. Tina lay with eyes open under her mask at an estimated depth of 82 ft. Tina was immediately lifted off the deck and given artificial respiration on board the yacht for approximately 40 minutes. Unfortunately, it proved futile and she ultimately passed away. Gabe stood nearby during this ordeal but did not approach his wife. According to witnesses, he simply sniffed naively from time to time. Employees from Gabe's company reported that, while on his way to shore, he smiled and even played cards with other passengers en route. Gabe denied this in court, and Tina's post-mortem examination indicated otherwise. Yes, Tina's body showed no obvious signs of violent death. However, there were bruises on her neck, as well as blood in her nostrils, which is common at an 82 ft depth, like where Tina was discovered. Tina had no traces of alcohol, 
in her bloodstream, but high levels of medications like ibuprofen and paracetamol use it for seasickness treatment, including small amounts, in her lungs that suggested fluid retention. According to reports, Tina is believed to have drowned due to oxygen deprivation before actually drowning. Tina's gear was examined by Australian Water Police, but no malfunctions were noted. At first, this could have been taken as an accident. An inexperienced diver ignored safety regulations and paid with their life, but suspicious elements persisted, such as rather vague autopsy results and Watson's unusual behavior according to diving team observations. These factors prevented investigators from quickly solving this case, therefore prolonging the investigation considerably. Gabe realized the detectives were investigating him. In addition, Tina's parents did not accept what had occurred as an unfortunate coincidence and wanted their son-in-law dragged before the courts, either as her murderer or at least for having neglected to assist in her escape. At Gabe's first interrogation, police noted he was shocked, crying and laughing frequently while being interrogated, asking to call his father, who complained of severe hearing pain, and beseeching him to inform Gabe's wife's parents of the tragedy. Late that evening, he was released. He went back to the yacht belonging to the company that sent them out and asked for one night's lodging, explaining that their trip had originally been scheduled to last two days, but due to his wife's death, had only lasted 24 hours. Additionally, he asked for half of their dive costs back since he never actually saw any sunken ships during their dive trip. On October 24th, Gabe's mother flew to Townsville to assist him and find legal advice. At his request, they visited the morgue on that same day in order to see his wife one last time before her demise. Because her husband was still being investigated as a suspect, the morgue employee called in the detective assigned to the case. Gabe could have attempted to hide some evidence, but instead only wept and begged his wife's forgiveness while crying incessantly, unaware that police officer Lawrence was standing outside, recording him on tape recorder. At court hearings later on, Detective Lawrence will quote Gabe saying, I didn't mean to hurt you. At the morgue, you told Tina you didn't mean it either. What exactly does that mean? Lawrence will pose his question of Gaby about that statement at length. Gabe repeated the story of his sore ear during his travel home with Tina's body. While in Oakland for their layover, he sought medical assistance on airport grounds and was held there to be evaluated. According to investigation, this action may have been undertaken intentionally in order to avoid meeting Tina's father. Divers can vouch that this condition is fairly common among divers. At Tina's funeral on November 5th, Gabe took off his wedding ring from Tina and placed it over his own finger, in full view of everyone, immediately giving over earrings that would later come from Tina Thomas' family before never seeing each other again that day. Watson never met again this day either. Gabe will later be asked in court, Did you really remove your wife's jewelry during her funeral? To which he would only smile and shrug in response. I don't think I could have done it. At this point in time, everyone had different opinions of Gabe. Some thought he was kind while others called him an abusive and manipulative partner. All had one thing in common though. The relationship between Gabe and Tina didn't appear happy with Tina confiding to her father during family dinner on February 15th that her marriage to Gabe was solely meant as an avoidance tactic so she wouldn't die alone on February 16th. One victim who died shortly before their honeymoon revealed to a friend that her husband forced her to buy life insurance with a higher interest rate in case of his death and put his name as beneficiary in the policy's beneficiary column. Insurance agent was also present and confirmed Tina's testimony. Additionally, Tina cried throughout their journey on board, despite not getting any response from her husband, who ignored her anguish. Amanda Phillips provided another telling account, which shed light on Tina and Mike's true nature as a couple. According to Amanda Phillips, Mike videotaped Tina, urinating in the bathroom before editing and including it on their Christmas celebration videotape. That would have been fine, but he decided to perform at an open viewing with multiple guests present. He laughed like a horse while we all tried explaining to him it was inappropriate behavior. While I clutched crosses onto my fingers so Tina wouldn't think she wanted to marry him. While removing jewelry right during a funeral 
may seem like a frightening and denunciatory act on Gab's part. During the trial in 2008, the jury was shown an extremely disturbing footage of Watson visiting Tina's grave, taking all the flowers from it and carrying them away. They were later found in a nearby trash can. Tina's father noticed the missing flowers and, to find out the thief, he set up a hidden camera in the next row among the monuments. But he never expected to see Gaby on the tape and was outraged by such an act. In court, Gabe's defense was that he and his wife had discussed the death of one of their own on an extreme honeymoon, and the lack of flowers on the grave was her request, which sounded very strange and unlikely. There's no telling how long the search for evidence would have dragged on if the cops had put on the exact same gear the newlyweds had and hadn't tried to stage that incident. Gabe said Tina drowned while he was trying to put a mask on her face. It turned out it was impossible to put the mask on underwater by yourself unless you used another source of air, in this case Tina's oxygen. In late November 2008, the Australian police arrested Gabe, and on June 5, 2009, Gab's trial began, where he pleaded guilty, but only to failing to save his wife. So, he was charged with negligent homicide and sent to prison for 18 months. After completing his sentence, Gabe returned home to the U.S., but a year later, the now U.S. court charged him with first-degree murder, the motive for which was to receive insurance payments after the death of his wife. Gab's lawyer tried to defend his client, shifting all the blame on the diving company, claiming that the employees of this company did not take care of the safety of tourists and now, afraid of losing their license and therefore the whole business, are trying to shift the blame onto the unhappy husband who has already served his time in another country. As for the money received from the insurance company, the payout amounted to $33,000, while Gabe spent much more money on lawyers and additional expertise. Nevertheless, the prosecution continued to insist that this spending was only because the husband could not assume that he would not be believed. The prosecutor also refused to accept the fact that Gabe, with a degree in drowning rescue in hand, could not even save his wife. When Gabe had his say, he addressed the jury. It's been seven years since the tragedy, and there hasn't been a day that I haven't thought about that terrible day. The public has pounced on me, blaming me for my wife's death, calling me a murderer. There wasn't a single person who looked me in the eye and said, Yes, I understand how bad you feel, but it's not your fault. On the contrary, everyone just wants me dead, and here I can only understand my late wife's parents. Yes. They will never forgive me, no matter how much I kneel before them, and no matter how much I beg their forgiveness. You often hear the phrase, I can't imagine what it's like to lose a child, but I've never heard anyone say, I can't imagine what it's like to lose a wife, especially on a honeymoon. If I can be accused of anything, it's that I didn't make enough effort to save Tina, but I've already received my punishment for that. Perhaps you all would have been satisfied if I had drowned with my wife then seven years ago. But I was afraid to die. Afraid I wouldn't be able to rise from the bottom to the top. I just wanted to live, as I still want to live now. No evidence of Gab's guilt was presented to the court. The jury found Gabe not guilty. What do you guys think? Is Gabe guilty of Tina's death? Share your opinion with us in the comments and subscribe to the channel for more. In 2012, Marcos Matsunaga's family became one of the focal points of attention in Brazil. Marcos disappeared hours before signing a billion-dollar deal that sent shockwaves through the nation. Photos showing his distraught widow made headlines across multiple national publications. Police initially assumed the culprit was one of his competitors, who wanted to use kidnap and murder in order to stop an impending deal. However, the truth turned out much darker and crueler. A cold-blooded murder and subsequent attempts at covering it up provided material for several documentaries about this terrible event. Marcos Matsunaga was one of Brazil's wealthiest individuals and managed a family business known as Yoki founded by his grandfather Yoshizo Katano and taking its name from its initial letters taken from both of his names, surname first. Yoki began as a small flour milling operation 
that endured turbulent economic and war conditions and ultimately transformed into an international enterprise known for producing various food products with global recognition and an impressive product lineup. It all began mid-century. Marcos was fortunate enough to be born into a wealthy family and was never denied anything from an early age. Instead of starting over with business development on his own, everything his grandfather and father had created had already been handed down. Being CEO of their food company gave Marcos every chance at becoming their first billionaire, something which he strived for nearly his entire conscious life. But Marcos's ambitious plans were doomed to fail. Everyone who knew him praised his business acumen. Not only had he saved family capital, but had multiplied it several times, increasing profits as a result. Yet Marcos wasn't always easy on himself or others around him, capricious and arrogant with an overbearing personality who desired control over everyone who came near him, this businessman was far from handsome in appearance. At an early age, this boy struggled with childhood overweight, vision problems for which he wore glasses, short stature, and somewhat clumsy traits. All this presented many difficulties when communicating with peers. Consequently, he had almost no friends, as female representatives from female sex shunned him for his unusual and peculiar appearance. Marco struggled for years to build lasting and serious relationships, which went beyond a handful of dates. Even his multi-million dollar inheritance could not make him seem appealing or desirable as an eligible bachelor. Marcos often turned women off due to his arrogance and egotism, prompting them to hire professional escorts as Marcos rarely mentioned his first wife in public sources. Unfortunately, few details exist on her existence or who exactly was her husband's first choice as his muse. As far as is known, his marriage wasn't founded in love or passion, but rather desperation and due to pressure from relatives. Still, this union lasted several years, though both spouses began regretting their decision shortly thereafter. Initial attempts by Marcos's wife to accommodate his complex personality failed miserably, with little progress. Over time, they only increasingly distanced from one another. Furthermore, he frequently and openly cheated on her without trying to hide or justify his behavior finding mistresses mostly through websites offering intimacy services in exchange for money. Alice was one of those girls. She worked as an escort, and her portfolio could be found online. It was there that a businessman noticed an attractive, bright blonde with an alluring figure. He began regularly inviting her on dates, generously paying for them. Alice was six years younger than him and came from an extremely poor and dysfunctional family growing up among alcoholics who shared their addiction with men she didn't know as father, not knowing who their own father was either. Also at such an early age, Alice was subjected to beatings by roommates of her mother, as well as being bullied and bullied by these roommates of mothers. Alice had just barely finished school when she uprooted herself from home and moved permanently away from the neighborhood she'd grown up in. Taking nursing courses and eventually working at a hospice, Alice quickly realized her dreams were far exceeded by caring for dying patients. Furthermore, becoming attached to each patient she cared for made each death seem personal to her. Over time, Alice decided to obtain higher education and change careers entirely, eventually choosing law as an occupation which promised many opportunities in life. Alice had spent months preparing to enroll at university and managed to score the required number of points on her entrance exams, yet couldn't afford her studies from her modest nurse salary alone. Since she'd abandoned all ties with relatives after moving away, young and attractive, Alice decided to use external data, such as her external profile data, in order to generate income by signing up with an escort site, which assisted in creating her personal page, and soon wealthy men began showing an interest in the young blonde beauty. Alice found escorting and intimate services a source of income that enabled her to pay for her studies and fully support herself, but planned on moving on to something more suitable once she earned her diploma and secured employment in her specialty field. At that time, Alice met Marcos, one of her regular customers who generously gave gifts while meeting regularly without hiding from anyone. Although Alice knew Marcos was married, at that point in time she couldn't have dreamt 
he'd leave his wife for her. Alice Matsunaga was like the heroine of a fairy tale, an impoverished girl from an unstable home, working as an escort service provider, meets Marcos, an eccentric multimillionaire who falls madly in love with her almost instantly. Marcos may or may not have made efforts on Alice's part to seduce Marcos. Either way, after six months, he realized he wanted more than just dating and filed for divorce while proclaiming Alice his fiancée instead of continuing. Their relationship, due to his desire for privacy, Marcos didn't want anyone else knowing the details about how and when he met Alice. Therefore, the couple made up an ordinary story of an accidental meeting in a cafe and stuck to this version. Even close family and few friends didn't suspect anything. However, Alice in the Matsunaga family received less than warm reception. His parents suspected she used all her charm in order to seduce Marcos. Now that their child had married a rich but ugly person and fallen in love, Alice had used all her abilities against him and would come out later with his parents believing she used all her charm on him. Alice received not very warm reception as his parents had already fallen under his spell and now betrayed him by falling for him and now was involved with him despite everything she put out to do. With his parents wondering who had duped him into falling for rich but ugly Marcos, who was now living under his spell, to seduce Marcos, after all, she would likely become his wife after she had met her. But Alice got an unwelcoming reception in Matsunaga family, where parents believed she had used all her charm to charm to fall for rich but ugly Marcos, while now had done nothing but run away with him and now taken back her place. Marcos went out of his way to pretend she didn't notice his harsh character. Nevertheless, when he announced his plans to divorce his first wife and marry Alice instead, no one voiced any objections strongly enough for this proposal. Businessman Marcos Matsunaga had planned an extravagant traditional wedding, complete with white dress, large guest list, and tiered cake as per tradition. Following their marriage, he moved his wife into his lavish mansion, where she became his full-fledged mistress. Long known for collecting expensive wines and rare weapons, he amassed an extensive wine cellar, where bottles were carefully organized by year and country, while for weapons there was an entire room displaying firearms and edged weapons, much to Marco's pride, he kept adding new additions over time, which were replenished. Marcos took great pleasure in replenishing his collections by continuing to add new additions from time to time. His house was overflowing with antiques, luxury goods, and modern art that tastelessly decorated every surface in his house. After their wedding, they decided that they wanted an heir. But despite their best efforts, Alice struggled for months without becoming pregnant naturally. After exhausting all other means, the couple turned to in vitro fertilization, but even here success did not arrive immediately. As soon as their daughter was born, Happiness seemingly flourished beyond all expectation for this couple. Young parents were enthusiastic to educate and raise their daughter with love, care, and luxury, truly creating an ideal childhood for her. Plans were made for future adventures when she began walking. Soon thereafter, they began traveling the globe together to experience different cultures and traditions firsthand. Their little princess truly became part of their hearts as she enjoyed every bit of lavish upbringing possible. But the couple shared one particular hobby, hunting large animals. Though strictly speaking this was Marcos's passion, many women disliked or were put off by it, and many did not embrace his pastime. Eventually Marcos stopped trying and gave up. Alice took up hunting to gain favor with Marcos and ultimately win his heart. Initially by learning how to handle various firearms at shooting ranges, and then in the woods, hunting wild animals together. Alice had no qualms about taking animal lives, as she treated it as a kind of competition. Either you do it, or you don't. Marcos enjoyed this approach, and would watch Alice handle weapons and hunt her prey with relish. Together they taught Alice to skin and carve wild boars, deer and other forest creatures together, using large knives, special cleavers, and axes skinned them separately using large knives while using special cleavers axes and large knives to separate body parts, using large knives as well as special cleavers axes. Also, rather than cats or dogs for pets, they owned poisonous snakes which had special terrariums created specifically to replicate conditions 
as close as possible to natural conditions, fulfilling another long-standing dream of Marcos, who adored snakes, but his first wife disapproved of having one as pets, despite wanting one. But then, Alice had done wonders to keep Marcos at ease by sharing in his unusual hobbies. In 2012, Matsunaga was prepping to make what would likely become his signature deal and make him a billionaire, selling off family company and using proceeds of sale to invest into another profitable enterprise. At this time, he rarely appeared, being consumed by work and grandiose plans, moving with wife into an opulent apartment complex close to main office of company where his work resided. Marco seemed to be away almost all of the time, while his young wife remained lonely in a luxurious apartment with panoramic city views. Marcos's work schedule was packed full of meetings, business appointments, and consultations with specialists. So much so that often he did not even spend the night at home, promising his wife that as soon as the deal was signed and sealed, their lives would change and transform completely. On May 19, 2012, on the eve of a multi-billion dollar deal, Marcos vanished without trace. Alice only reported it the next day, due to believing he was at work. According to Alice's account of Marcos's schedule for that evening meeting, that could last into the night and early morning, meeting with business partner. So he took some items, warned he might spend the night in office before going directly for deal. When Marcos didn't return home nor answered his phone anymore, she became concerned and reported him missing immediately. Police were quick to notice when Matsunaga failed to appear for meetings that he simply could not miss, such as evening events and morning appointments he absolutely could not miss. Initial speculation suggested he may have been kidnapped. Ransom demands likely would soon follow within 24 or 48 hours, and hopes of Matsunaga still living were dissipating like smoke before our very eyes. Investigators were swift to act. They interviewed relatives, friends, and business partners of the businessman in question in order to discover any enemies who might wish for his death or disrupt an imminent deal. But it proved futile despite our best efforts. No single individual or group were capable of orchestrating a strategy to target or kill this businessman who ran his enterprise with diligence. Each strategic decision from him benefited almost everyone involved in his endeavors. After collecting her daughter, Alice returned home to inform Marcos's father-in-law and mother-in-law what she had not dared tell the police, that her husband Marcos was cheating with Natasha Villalima for years without hiding it from Alice or hiding their affair from anyone. Although after several major arguments and threats of divorce, Marcos promised that he would drop Natasha for family reasons, but instead continued meeting up with Natasha more subtly, so as not to create yet another family scandal. Alice suspected Marcos's infidelity and decided to hire a private detective in order to gather evidence. Alice had photographs and videos showing Marcos on romantic dates with Natasha. It was notable that Marcos took Natasha with him to restaurants and entertainment venues frequented by both himself and Alice. It seemed Marcos wanted others to witness his disdain for Alice by openly cheating without hiding it from anyone. Later, Natasha Lima, a businessman, discovered escort services through the same website where he met Alice. They spent about five months together, during which he gave her an expensive car and paid an exorbitant sum to have Natasha take down her profile from that site. Photos and videos showing Marcos's infidelity were presented to his parents by his daughter-in-law before disappearing without explanation or apology. Instead of making excuses or asking forgiveness from anyone involved, Marcos simply packed his things, told his wife he was leaving, and left their apartment without explanation or apology or explanation without asking forgiveness, or making excuses or asking forgiveness. Instead, he simply packed his things and told his wife he was leaving before leaving without explanation, or making excuses, nor asking forgiveness from anyone involved, dissolving without trace. Alice told how, consumed with passion, Matsunaga decided to run away with another woman. However, everyone who knew him insisted he could never simply abandon the business, because his family had built it over decades. One week later, answers to many questions were finally provided, 
when a passerby discovered scattered garbage bags near a deserted area half a hundred kilometers from where the businessman resided, containing human remains in each bag. This man immediately reported his discovery to police, and soon it became evident that Marcos Matsunaga, whom police had been looking for across the nation, had been killed. Experts determined that the businessman was killed with a gunshot to the head, then dismembered, packed in garbage bags, and taken outside the city for disposal. Pathologists noted that, according to them, the murderer was either a surgeon or experienced butcher, with skill at using a carving knife. Their conclusion was inevitable, as cuts had been precisely placed to separate body parts from each other and keep them apart. As no leads were immediately apparent in the investigation, it was decided to begin in the location where the deceased had last been seen alive. Marcos lived in an elite residential complex equipped with numerous video surveillance cameras, the records from which were then closely examined. On the evening prior to Marcos' disappearance, his wife and daughter ordered food delivery service directly into their home. Marcos could be seen going down to the first floor and returning up with pizza boxes in his hands, entering his apartment without leaving until morning time, when his wife left with three large wheeled suitcases that she struggled to move. According to camera recordings from an elevator's camera recording device, Marcos never left his own home again until leaving with them in hand and never returning later that evening or day either. Matsunaga seemed content in his home until morning came along when his wife left with three heavy-wheeled suitcases, which she struggled to move along a hallway corridor. The footage showed her struggle as she moved them along a hallway corridor before exiting. Investigators had a good sense of what type of luggage had been found. On the same day, the businessman's widow was taken into custody and brought to testify at a police station. Initially, she denied everything and maintained her initial story that her husband had left her for another woman. However, when Alice saw the elevator footage, she quickly broke into tears and started talking. According to Alice, their family life had long since fallen apart, with her husband routinely humiliating and belittling her often criticizing her work as an escort by criticizing his efforts in pulling her up out of poverty and giving her false hope about recovery from mental illness. Marco stated that Alice was an inadequate mother for their daughter. He attempted to control every move his wife made and would forbid her from making friends. When Alice brought up divorce as a possibility, Marcos laughed it off by responding that he would leave her with nothing, take their daughter, and prohibit any contact between him and Alice. Alice stated that on that fateful evening, she showed Marcos pictures obtained from a detective showing his mistress with Alice. Instead, he only responded by getting angry, slapping his wife, and becoming abusive towards Alice. According to Alice herself, this all happened so suddenly, she cannot recall how or where she got the gun with which she shot him. When Alice realized what had occurred later, she decided to dispose of his body so as to appear as though it had disappeared without trace. Knowing human anatomy, as well as having learned how to skinning and cutting up animal carcasses, which they had tools at home for. This task became part of an easy process that Alice took part in with ease and ease compared to what had previously taken place only moments earlier. As Alice cut up and bagged Marcos's body in their living room, their young daughter slept soundly nearby. Alice's testimony soon raised many doubts and questions. Also, it soon became evident that pictures and videos proving Marcos's infidelity that his wife received from the detective were only obtained on May 20th after Alice had killed him. Alice took these images back to his parents, claiming he had abandoned her by running off with another woman. Natasha Lima testified as a witness against Marcos in court. According to Natasha, Marcos himself wanted a divorce but feared Alice as she was mentally unstable and capable of doing terrible things. Natasha saw Marcos shortly before his disappearance, complaining about constant family arguments while saying he planned to relocate from Vernia after selling his company, moving with Alice being no part of his plan, as she would simply fade into memory like some nightmare dream. Experts made another shocking and horrifying discovery. Blood was still present in Marcos's lungs after Alice separated his head from his body, suggesting he was alive and trying to breathe when his wife separated them apart. Alice flatly denied this account of events, 
insisted instead that Marcos died instantly from being shot with a bullet from her gun. Furthermore, pathology found that Marcos didn't react at all when his head was struck by bullet, contrary to Alice's claim of him, attacking her before trying to defend herself with weapons from her gun, contrary to Alice's account, that she tried defending herself with gunfire from behind which came a bullet shot directly from behind and didn't defend against its effect either. Contrary also contradicted Alice's account that her husband attacked her before trying to defend herself by trying defensive measures against it all from Alice herself. Nearly all witnesses who testified at the trial denied that Matsunaga could have physically hurt Alice. While he may have had a difficult character and said hurtful words, in real life, he never raised his hand against anyone. Instead, this episode seemed as though Alice herself had made up since Marcos could not refute it. As a result, Alice Matsunaga was found guilty of premeditated murder with particular cruelty and concealing it from police. As punishment, 20 years in prison were handed out. Many considered this punishment excessive for such a serious crime. Alice is now responsible for raising their daughter as well. Share your opinion with us in the comments and subscribe to the channel for more. North Carolina, famous as home to Cherokee Indians, is currently an extremely conservative and prosperous state located in the northern region of South Atlantic states. Crime rates here tend to be much lower than South Carolina. When North Carolina makes national news outlets, it usually because of snowstorms, tornadoes, severe thunderstorms along the coast, tropical storms flooding large areas, dense wildlife refugees at risk from wildfires or landslides that pose more danger than humans themselves, though that isn't always the case either. Tristan Borras, 17 years old at the time, unleashed the storm on April 10, 2019. An adolescent from a religious and large family committed a violent act at their Deep Gap residence on Wednesday evening, which resulted in their deaths. Emergency services received a call from a young woman reporting significant amounts of blood in her residence, as well as three family members she could no longer contact. Her parents and younger brother were missing. Law enforcement arrived quickly at Deep Gap, located approximately one mile from both Watauga and Wilkes County borders, to make an arrest or investigation possible. Once they arrived at the residence, patrol officers saw blood on the pathways leading up to it, on its doormat, and trailing up the staircase. Police officers discovered an injured male concealed by leaves outside his vicinity, who was suffering multiple stab wounds and was located beneath a hammock. At 10.30 p.m. that same evening, family's pickup truck was discovered hidden in a forest nearby where female body had been hidden behind blanket with mulch bags piled upon it. Jeffrey Boris, Tristan's father, was born April 16, 1975. He served as pastor of Conservative Pist Bible Fellowship Church, a Protestant religious group with Mennonite roots. Jeffrey raised Tristan in an environment which stressed individual devotion as well as his sense of always being closely observed by God. Through careful and careful examination of Bible passages at gatherings, as well as moral guidance, he received guidance throughout his upbringing. All forms of amusement such as humor and colorful clothing were disapproved of. Acts of kindness, philanthropy, missionary efforts, compassion towards adversaries, and rejection of aggression were seen as positive attributes. Jeffrey learned all these basics as Pastor Harry Boris's son, thus becoming an affectionate, mild-mannered youngster raised by him. Jeffrey found his first summer job at Big Surf Water Park, located on Lake of the Ozarks in Missouri. On his initial day of employment, he met Tanya Mae Trandum, who shared similar perspectives and upbringing as Jeffrey. Tanya, too, had been raised within a Christian household. An altruistic girl, she saw this devout young man as an ideal future spouse and nurturing parent. Tanya Brown gave Jeffrey a photograph, depicting an older couple clasping hands, telling him it would be their future. Jeffrey's mother, Kathy Brown, began praying that God would provide his son with someone who shared a strong devotion to Christ. Eventually, the young couple married and carried forward similar traditions within their family unit, saving Tanya's picture in their family photo album as proof. 
Soon thereafter, they welcomed their first child, a charming girl named Taylor. Three more babies soon followed, Tristan being their youngest. Taylor quickly proved herself an exceptional older sibling to her siblings, providing care, assistance, and friendship towards all but most notably being best friends with Tristan as their youngest sibling. Tristan found Taylor his best and only companion despite an age difference, even though they both attended different churches. As they became older, Jeffrey and Tanya decided to fulfill their Christian responsibility by adopting four additional boys from an institution. Family was open, affectionate, and friendly, and eventually expanded to eight children Taylor, the twins Kay and Alexis, Miss Ariel, Stephen Miku Tristan. According to religious views in their family home, Cell phones and social networks weren't permitted until a certain age, and children were encouraged to exercise self-discipline with regard to demands and desires. Boys were not permitted to begin romantic relationships until they finished high school, typically around the age of 18, which required attendance at Bible studies and religious affairs. Otherwise, children matured similarly as typical boys and girls would. Parents did not distinguish between biological and adoptive children all received equal consideration, care, and affection from them. A thoughtful mother created an atmosphere of peace by paying close attention to internal dynamics and sibling relationships, praying frequently, and performing acts of kindness. Together with her partner, she realized it was essential to develop good qualities through their behavior and set an example for her children of how important kindness can be in society. After Hurricane Ike struck Haiti, Tanya decided to sell her expensive wedding ring and donate the proceeds to an organization building homes for those affected by it. She bought herself an ordinary and inexpensive band instead. In 2015, Taylor completed high school and relocated to Boone for Appalachian State University. This event greatly affected Tristan. Without his friend around anymore, he felt alone and abandoned. Taylor returned home quickly living her own independent life, while Tristan continued with the same restrictions and routines imposed upon him since early years by his parents' religious beliefs. Tristan felt restrained by not having access to social media, as this form of communication has become integral in teenagers' lives today. After Taylor had moved away, tension between his parents only worsened. In December 2017, however, Jeffrey and his family made significant positive steps forward when they relocated to a spacious lot in Deep Gap in Watauga County, in North Carolina, on an unpaved road that led into forested areas. It was significantly larger than their former residence. Robin was Tanya's mother and the children's grandma. This close proximity allowed for easy access in case additional care were necessary for caring for Tristan or not. While moving had likely been positive overall, Tristan may have needed time to adjust to his new environment by switching schools and adapting to life with new peers. At first, Tristan Boris's life may have seemed trouble-free. Attending Watauga High School and joining its track and field team seemed effortless, while other children found work as counselors at summer camps. While Tristan may have seemed perfect from outsiders' perspectives, over time his behavior became alarming enough that multiple meetings with a psychologist were scheduled in 2018. These meetings centered around his problems with managing anger and impulsivity. In 2019, when this young student was attending high school, he experienced difficulties understanding certain subjects despite his strong capabilities. These challenges persisted with every passing day and, since his relocation, have worsened significantly. Once settled in, he quickly transitioned from an enthusiastic student who actively participated in school activities into an indolent, and disinterested adolescent who lost all interest in academic pursuits. Tristan began arriving late for lessons and had no desire or motivation to study, often wearing headphones in class with an uncommitted expression on his face. Teachers attempted to help, even reaching out directly, yet nothing seemed to change his apathy or enthusiasm toward studying. Tristan was not always behaving appropriately at home. At that point in his life, he already owned everything. There were often arguments between he and his parents over his mobile phone use and social media usage. In addition, Tristan spent hours surfing the web using Instagram as his portal of expression, 
where he described himself as a musician. Taylor had always taken an avid interest in her siblings' lives and noticed that Tristan frequently clashed with both of his parents over religious matters. She discovered other issues at school as well. Although she attempted to communicate with Tristan again, their former intimacy no longer existed. Tristan eventually met Evelyn Faith Jackson, a girl from his religious community. They began meeting regularly, without paying attention to any restrictions on close relationships, occasionally smoking prohibited plants together, and Tristan often complained to his mother, who would debate his behavior with him at night, leaving him exhausted and unable to focus in school. The young man expressed concern over his numerous shortcomings that prevented him from meeting his mother's expectations and earning her pride. He noted that while with his father he could be his true self, that wasn't necessarily the case with her. On April 10, 2019, several previously undisclosed aspects of Tristan's life came to light. Security cameras were set up in his barn where goats were kept, his previous mobile phone, which he often used without telling his parents about, became an avenue of access for Tanya. She found texts showing that Tristan had engaged in explicit talks with female visitors, as well as discussed illicit substances. Tristan was at school when his phone started beeping with new messages from Tanya Boris and her husband, Daniel Boris. Alarmed, Tristan's parents communicated with each other over what had been found on Tristan's old phone. Upon learning this news, they started text messaging him and discussing the data discovered there. That same day, Sher King, Tristan's English instructor, called his mother with concerns regarding Tristan's academic performance and conduct. Later during trial, Sher King testified that Tanya Boris informed her they would collect Tristan early from school to discuss his grades with Tanya Boris, who she would also discuss it further with Sher King, regarding concerns she expressed about Tristan's academic performance and conduct before later testifying that Tanya Boris told her and her husband would pick Tristan up early from school in order to discuss grades with Tristan before collecting him beforehand, in order to discuss grades with Tristan himself, before anyone else would know about this matter, involving Tristan being spoken about by Sher King, who then phoned his mother, expressing concern regarding academic performance and conduct issues, of which Tanya Boras informed her, and husband would arrive shortly, and collect him ahead of schedule in order to discuss possible academic performance and conduct issues concerning him being involved. Later testifying, Tanya Boras informed her and her husband would soon arrive shortly thereafter in order to collect him ahead of schedule from school, in order to discuss his grades together before collection from school shortly. Sherry King relayed Tristan's parents' message to him, who was shocked at what he heard. Tristan and Sherry left their youngest child with his grandma before heading over to his middle school to address the situation. Upon their return home, it was relatively peaceful. During trial, Tristan would recall that his mother appeared distressed while searching through his phone. Home discussions lasted approximately 90 minutes. Following their session, Tanya sent a text message to Tristan's mother informing her that Tristan wasn't bothered by his phone and car keys being confiscated until his grades and behavior improved. Tanya also mentioned she would soon arrive to collect Tristan. Tanya sent this text at 4 more p.m. Once Tristan and Tanya discussed performing well academically, maintaining healthy relationships with girls, illegal substances risks as well as her preference that Tristan focus on Christianity rather than other religions. He was made to listen and became acutely aware of where improvements needed to be made in his life. They created a list of traits necessary for personal growth, empathy and integrity among them, later to be discovered by cops. Tristan recounted how his mother approached from behind, placed her arm around his neck, exerted force upon it, forcing him to respond impulsively by rising, pivoting, and unwittingly striking her with his elbow, something his mother had never done before, which may explain his response. Her response? to grab what appeared to be scissors from a shelf. However, as Tristan felt overwhelmed by his surroundings, he took action himself by stabbing his mother, believing he was protecting himself and fled for assistance from his father before returning. Subsequently, a forensic investigation would fail to uncover evidence on Tristan's neck, proving his mother strangled him. At trial, 
the prosecution would present photographs from a medical examiner depicting a fractured neck bone. In contrast to this testimony provided by psychologists who demonstrated Tristan Boris was mentally sound when the crime was committed but suffered from compromised cognitive conditions which caused depersonalization, derealization, and an unreal feeling. Unfortunately for Tristan, both court and jury would disregard psychologists' interpretation by simply concluding he is an adept manipulator and socially risky individual. Tristan was confused and disoriented during this encounter with his father, as he could not comprehend why he was fleeing him and why, upon finally catching up, he ended up stabbing him despite pleas for assistance. Tristan remembered his father grabbing a stone and shouting, Tristan refrained before apparently preferring that his life end rather than attempt to harm or maim Tristan further. Neighbors reported hearing loud screaming coming from Boris' property around 5.30 p.m. Wednesday. Once it was over, Tristan returned home and vomited, according to his psychologist's analysis. This indicated a high degree of stress rather than premeditated murder. However, the jury held a different view than the psychologist. Eventually receiving reports from a forensic medical examiner, at trial, Jeffrey Boris's post-mortem report listed several knife wounds to his left chest and back, slash wounds on both arms and hands, and abrasions to his skull and forehead. Tanya Boris's autopsy report showed numerous stab wounds across her left chest, back, arm as well as possible neck trauma from pressure applied by Jeffrey. Additionally, injuries could have resulted from pressure applied when Tristan felt threatened by Tanya. These findings demonstrated that Tristan could distance himself from his mother should he feel threatened, also provided him the chance to distance himself in case his mother should he feel threatened himself during his attack on Tristan. Though her actions were likely caused by a rapid error of judgment and misunderstand of self-defense, their son Tristan's murder and subsequent behavior was immediately clear. After taking Tristan's mother's body from her residence and placing it into their vehicle covered with a tarpaulin cover for transport, later he cleaned up the area surrounding his residence for around an hour before using a garden hose to rinse out its porch next door. At approximately 8.30 p.m., Tristan arrived at Robin's residence to collect his younger sibling from school, something she found peculiar, only for him to inform her that their parents needed to run to a store quickly and didn't have time to collect him themselves. Twenty minutes later, she received a phone call from another grandson, upset because neither parent was responding to his calls, nor arriving as per usual at his part-time work site, where they usually picked him up afterward. Grandma called Alexis and asked her to fetch Robin. Once at Jeffrey and Tanya's residence, Robin noticed blood on the porch. However, because the couple owned pets, she wasn't overly concerned. When entering the house to collect a flashlight and inspect her animals, she noticed there was significant blood present. At that moment, Alexis quickly entered her home and reported her discovery of a body near the animal barn, along with believing she saw Tristan with bloody wounds escaping in a car used for escape. Alexis quickly contacted emergency services. An operator advised Alexis and family members to lock themselves into a vehicle until police arrived to respond. After ten minutes of waiting outside and speaking with other officers, all were transported back to the station where they learned of Jeffrey and Tanya Barassi's deaths. While inspecting the crime site, officers discovered a computer interface linking an indoor video surveillance system with monitors in the house. The display showed multiple cameras streaming live footage onto monitors, prompting authorities to obtain login credentials from the firm that maintained it and request a warrant to obtain its login data from that firm. Tristan reached out to Evelyn and met up at her house, causing concern among Evelyn as well as some scratches to appear on his forehead and arms. Tristan assured Evelyn that all was okay after an argument between his parents and playing with their dog led to scratching. Evelyn later noted three scrapes on Tristan's forehead, two cuts on his hand, laceration on one fingertip, a bruised fingernail, and more scrapes than were visible. Tristan uploaded an image to Snapchat of his injuries after the incident and claimed they had been caused by his father's dog. Evelyn believed they matched up to injuries she saw him suffering during that evening's visit to Tristan and offered for him to stay overnight at her place and then visit Walmart and McDonald's the following morning.
before visiting Walmart and McDonald's as planned, but later decided against going. Tristan desired temporary separation from both of his parents, so Evelyn suggested staying with one of her family members for some time until Tristan agreed, and they journeyed together across state lines. On April 11th, officers from the sheriff's office obtained login and password credentials to the video surveillance system at Borley Residence and examined video footage to unearth details regarding this crime. Police obtained an arrest warrant for Tristan and provided details regarding his vehicle used to flee to the National Crime Information Center, leading to an intensive search and pursuit operation being initiated in its search for it. Investigator Matthew received information that Tristan had been seen in Tennessee, so he began the necessary paperwork for extradition. To facilitate conversation between themselves and Tristan due to his young age, Robin, Tristan's grandmother, joined Investigator Matthew on their apprehension trip. Tristan noticed blue lights following him while driving his Ford with Evelyn. Attempting to distance himself, Tristan drove quickly along the highway, but eventually surrendered and stopped for good, being restrained with handcuffs before being led away into an officer-manned police vehicle, with ease by officers observing he did not seem distressed or anxious during this encounter. Investigator Matthew captured both video and audio of Tristan Boris's interview, held April 11, 2019, both videotaped and audiotaped. Tristan responded to all inquiries, admitted his conduct had violated law, and provided an in-depth account of it, sometimes breaking down in tears during their conversation. Tristan, who was only 17 at the time, was detained without bail. Shortly thereafter, the sheriff's office obtained a warrant to examine Tristan's Snapchat account, as well as five cell phones, which may contain evidence on this incident. A search warrant was also issued for Tristan's Orchard Road residence, where investigators discovered an additional mobile phone in the main bedroom, as well as paper cups, hammers, straws, knives, swabs with red stains, eyeglasses, kitchen towels, hammock digital video recorders, a rug, and various papers, cards, and boots from storage. Legal papers indicate that a search warrant was also authorized for Tristan's Ford F-150 vehicle, where a swab with red stains, a charger for his laptop computer and steering wheel cover were taken. Another search warrant was also issued against his girlfriend's residence in Boone, as he had spent the night there. Pillowcases, zipper sweaters, and notebooks were confiscated from these premises by court order. Investigations and searches provided detectives with enough evidence to reconstruct every detail of events, even those seemingly minor ones that had not occurred yet, thus making self-defense unfeasible. Funeral ceremonies for this couple took place on April 17, 2019 at Bible Fellowship Church, and were led by pastors William C.R. and Brad Gray. Even after losing both parents so soon in life, their children found the strength to write heartfelt obituaries for them both. Jeff and Tanya brought immense happiness and pride to both of our parents. As such, we aim to carry on their legacy by loving others fully while following Jesus. Following her brother Tristan's funeral, Taylor visited him for the first time in prison and was shocked at his behavior. Tristan showed no regret or attempted to place blame onto other family members. To her sister it appeared like he believed he'd eventually gain his freedom again. She felt repulsed and left quickly. On May 11th, she returned to commemorate Tristan's birthday with his grandma Robin present, but the encounter mirrored that of previous visits, with Tristan commending their organized birthday celebration at a correctional facility to mark his special day. Despite Taylor considering this behavior inappropriate, given their parents' untimely demises. Following this visit, their family made the decision to end any further communication with Tristan. Trial began on February 16, 2022. At trial, Tristan expressed regret over what had taken place, agreed with what his family had said about him, and supported the choice for long-term restrictions to ensure their sense of security. On March 3rd, he was sentenced to life without the possibility of parole on each count of first-degree murder by Judge Horn, who noted mental health was an element in this case as Tristan Boris still experienced anxiety, depression, and post-traumatic stress disorder, like symptoms according to psychologists' reports. Judge Horn noted, 
that although the psychologist did not detect signs of psychotic disorders, anxiety and despair might have been compounded by her use of illegal narcotics. One striking aspect of Tristan's case was his family, lawyer or himself, not providing any explanation as to the reasoning for his crime. On one side, there is a religious household and socially risky person, using illicit drugs who did not fully grasp why events transpired nor effectively manage miscommunication. While on the other is Tristan himself, who wasn't sure why something went wrong. On the other side of the coin is a young man with an inadequate self-perception, no confidence, frequently experiencing depression, showing symptoms of anxiety, and not seeking professional health care services. At his court hearing, it was brought up that he experienced panic attacks, which his mother helped manage as she too experienced them frequently. One of the central principles of teaching PISM is based on the belief that children born with original sin are inherently immoral and therefore need education and schooling in order to rectify their behavior and prepare them for living an ethical lifestyle. Establishing strict discipline and suppressing children's self-awareness are effective in accomplishing this aim, according to some. Strict love may even prove helpful. Children genetically predisposed for increased sensitivity of the nervous system often struggled when raised within severely limited environments that were overprotective, leading them to feel insufficient when it came to religious belief systems. Some individuals naturally require more affection, while others demand less. As his older sister recalled, the young child felt threatened by the arrival of new siblings that caused their parents' priorities to shift in response to them. Initial reactions included revolt, followed by feelings of sorrow and low self-esteem, evidenced by illicit marijuana usage, sudden attacks of anxiety, and feelings of being detached from both oneself and their surroundings. His religious beliefs differed from his parents. He could not fulfill his mother's expectations, and the changes needed were listed in a joint document they created together. Instead of finding contacts for competent therapists, they had reached the breaking point, leaving no way out but separation in what had once been an affectionate family unit. Share your opinion with us in the comments and subscribe to the channel for more. Royal Caribbean was sailing across the Asian Sea, where its expanse seemed endless, carrying newly married couple George Smith and Jennifer, who had recently been joined together in marriage. Sitting on deck, enjoying the cool breeze in their hair, and gazing upon beautiful surroundings, Asian Sea was stretched out before them like an expansive canvas filled with promise and potential. Thus began an extraordinary wedding journey that eventually turned into an unexpected voyage that led to unexpected results and ultimately to an intriguing tale. On July 5, 2005, at approximately 8 a.m. in one of the cabins on Deck 7 of Royal Caribbean Cruise Liner in Chicago, 16-year-old Emily Roosh noticed something that caused concern. Something resembling blood was spread across a canopy that protected lifeboat in her immediate area, as well as an apparent blood mark near its outer part suggesting someone had fallen through and vanished into the sea. Emily could not help reacting when she noticed these strange footprints and quickly informed the staff of the liner about them. Shortly thereafter, other passengers from nearby staterooms noticed similar evidence on Deck 7. An engaging discussion began about what might have caused these footprints to appear, leading to stories that eventually appeared on multiple international magazines' front pages. Unforeseen events took place within cabin number 962 that caused immediate and profound distress for this young couple on their Mediterranean honeymoon vacation, disrupting their happiness abruptly and suddenly. Accounts of this incident varied and were confusing, including accounts that ranged from an accidental mishap, potential theft, and possible even intentional murder. Investigators grew increasingly confused as their inquiry unfolded with evidence collected on board, suggesting multiple potential culprits who kept undisclosed information to themselves. It seems as though many on board knew more than they wanted to share. And now investigators, reporters, and others tracking this mysterious case are left scratching their heads as to exactly what transpired on that ominous night aboard ship. George Smith was an optimistic, curious, and intelligent young person 
born in Greenwich, Connecticut. George enjoyed an enjoyable childhood, filled with happiness, thanks to the love and support from his family, most especially his parents, George Sr., an owner and manager of a liquor business himself, who managed it himself with passion. Though Bree was his primary priority, as she always felt safe around them both. His family business, George Sr., ran by Bree, was owned and managed personally. For him, it wasn't simply work, but an endeavor worth dedicating hours every week. George took pride in making sure his family were his top priority, an activity they all shared, along with Bree, also owned and managed personally by George's father, George Sr., and owned and managed a liquor business managed personally by him himself, more than simply work. Its operation became his true passion. George Smith Jr. graduated with honors from Babson College, located in Massachusetts. Following graduation, he spent some years as an analyst specializing in computer data mining in Boston before returning home and joining his parents' store as an assistant manager to gain insight into all its details so he could eventually take over and give his parents time for much-needed vacation. George Smith met Jennifer from Connecticut and recently offered a teaching position during one of his gatherings with friends in 2002. They quickly fell deeply in love, with George's parents also being thrilled about this choice of partner for their son. Three years later, in 2005, when George was 26 years old, they made the decision to get married and start a new chapter of their lives together. They held their wedding at Castle Hill Inn, located in Newport, Rhode Island with the ceremony taking place by the waterfront, an idyllic venue for such an important milestone in life. Following their ceremony, the newlyweds went on their 12-day honeymoon cruise aboard one of Royal Caribbean's grand vessels, sailing around Asia from Barcelona. Visits were made to France's Côte d'Azur and Italian coast. On their cruise, George and Jennifer quickly made friends with another couple from California, as well as Josh Asen, a 20-year-old with an engaging sense of humor, from California. Josh quickly befriended George before joining their cheerful group for fun hangout sessions aboard ship. On July 1st, after departing Italy's coast, they made plans to disembark and spend all day having fun on land together. On July 4th, youth explored Mykonos Island with eager excitement, strolling through its historic town's narrow alleyways and taking a dip in its clear Asian seawater were highlights for them along with sampling delicious local cuisine and charming eateries. Happy and content, they enjoyed one another's company and this lovely location. Mykonos created lasting memories and they planned to finish their evening together on the ship's deck. George and Jennifer joined their friends on board ship for another enjoyable dinner and decided to come together as a group and share in some good lacks to remember this special part of the world. It was an energetic evening as George, Jennifer, and Josh Asen all took advantage of tasty starters and beverages before moving on to having fun at the casino aboard ship. George liked sitting at the craps table while Josh found entertainment playing poker, while Jennifer preferred poker tables for entertainment purposes. By the end of their evening, newly married couple had lost considerable sums but laughed about it without regret. After all, this was their honeymoon. Following casino closure, companions made the decision to continue with their evening. George was most recently seen exiting the casino at approximately 2.30 a.m. and did not necessarily indicate that he would return to his cabin. On June 5, 2005, in the early morning hours, an unusual plan began unfolding on Mykonos in Greece. George Smith, recently married 26-year-old from West Virginia, was on an Asian cruise when he mysteriously vanished that evening. Witnesses described a vibrant, exciting evening on board which George loved. However, everything soon proved more sinister in its aftermath. The ship's captain conducted an examination of the stateroom, where strange footprints had been found, as well as surrounding deck areas, including where any possible acts of aggression might have taken place. There was nobody inside this cabin where such footprints had been left behind, and evidence hinted at something significant having taken place in it. Potentially related acts had led to its disappearance by violence against newly married couple. Word quickly spread among passengers aboard the ship about these mysterious happenings, creating unease among all of them and prompting Deck 7 to be closed off 
so no passengers were permitted to enter or leave their cabins. Meanwhile, ship's crew extensively explored all potential locations on board in an effort to track down George and Jennifer who had vanished without trace. After discovering blood, it was assumed that newly married couple had vanished for unknown reasons. A senior officer took control of the situation by taking action himself. Going back to their cabin to assess what had occurred, all available evidence indicated that George may have fallen into the water and disappeared off ship. Meanwhile, on the opposite side, searches continued for George and Caroline. At 10 a.m., Jennifer was discovered receiving an otherwise scheduled massage in the ship's spa. To her shock and concern, Jennifer disclosed that her husband hadn't been present when she woke up today, though initially this didn't appear odd as they'd shared a cabin together before moving into different cabins for sleepover. So instead of searching for him immediately, she decided to indulge in some spa treatment rather than worry. At midday, Turkish officials arrived aboard to begin an inquiry. The captain comforted anxious passengers by explaining that recent events necessitated working closely with local authorities in order to clarify them quickly. He expressed hope that any issues would be dealt with quickly. Police officers began their interrogation of Jennifer, wife of the missing guy. Due to her unsettling state and apparent ignorance about George's whereabouts, Jennifer became the primary focus. She mentioned having not seen George since last night. Men from Royal Caribbean came knocking at her door, telling her it's possible he may have fallen overboard from their ship. Bloodstains could also be seen on its awning, suggesting something terrible had taken place with George. Investigators conducted an inspection of Stateroom 962 aboard a cruise ship. When they entered, the room was in disarray from a quick search or conflict. Fingerprints could also be seen on the balcony railings in the bathroom area, where spots of blood could be seen on rugs, towels, and surfaces like the balcony railings. Turkish investigators discovered two two-centimeter bloodstains on bedspreads belonging to George. Samples were identified as belonging to him before disappearing mysteriously from cabin 962. All indications pointed to George having experienced trauma prior to his mysterious departure, suggesting trauma had taken place prior to his unexpected disappearance from cabin 962, prior to his untimely disappearance, a short while after experiencing trauma within this cabin, before his mysterious departure, without explanation from its confines, before its vanishing meant, from which all records could not be traced. Detectives were particularly intrigued by a chair on the balcony, which had been moved closer to the railing so someone could sit on it next to it, and discovered indications on it suggesting someone had been sitting. This aroused suspicion among many, including the captain of the ship, that George may have fallen from there and injured himself. However, due to tall barriers on either side of him, as well as bloodstains found inside both cabin and awning of boat, also leading them to suspect that there had been an act of murder committed on board ship. Investigators began piecing together what had transpired that evening, trying to ascertain who George had been socializing with and what could have caused this tragic incident. Though their inquiry had only just started, it soon became evident that it presented them with an intricate tale filled with riddles and unexpected developments. Turkish authorities entered the ship to begin investigating George Smith's disappearance and decided to begin by interviewing a group of young men with whom his newly married couple had socialized prior to leaving port. Since the case remained obscure, each clue could potentially provide important insight. Company members reported that George and Jennifer had consumed excessive quantities of wine on that fateful night. George was under the influence of alcohol, so they assisted him back to his cabin where they helped him into bed before taking off his shoes before leaving him alone. Jennifer could not be found, and they speculated she might return later. Josh Askin's statement contains other inconsistencies, including his claim that he witnessed Jennifer leaving with casino staff member Lloyd, believing there to be an intense emotional bond between George and Jennifer, and them not hiding their feelings towards one another in George's presence. Video camera footage, however, showed Jennifer leaving without Lloyd at 3.25 a.m., leaving George with new acquaintances. Lloyd returned home around 3.25 a.m., as confirmed by key card data 
as well as by his girlfriend waking up when entering their cabin at this time. Detectives were perplexed by these discrepancies and began to suspect Josh Askin had personal motivations for concealing certain information from them. Investigators continued their probe, uncovering more and more details that deepened the enigma surrounding Greg Rosenberg's tale. At 19 years old, Greg was enjoying himself aboard a cruise ship with family and friends, such as cousin Zach Rosenberg and close acquaintance Rostislav Kaufman. All three had Russian origins, but held American passports and resided in New York City. Jennifer and Greg Rosenberg decided to test their luck at poker at the casino. Betting activity continued well into the evening. When it closed at 2.30 a.m., their group decided to continue the fun at a club, dancing, sipping drinks, and enjoying drinks while Lloyd Botha, the manager of the casino, was present and joined it in their nightly amusement. After this incident, accounts of what transpired began to diverge as members of the group slowly made their own ways back to their cabins. Some boys intoxicated with alcohol had become particularly boisterous late into the evening. Pursuant to ship regulations, delivery staff refused to serve two intoxicated guests who claimed that they had bought absinthe on Mykonos Island, but this wasn't permitted, as passengers weren't permitted to consume their own alcoholic beverages on board. At some point, Josh returned to his cabin on the same deck and obtained an extremely potent bottle of absinthe, which had an alcohol content exceeding 70%, one of the strongest alcoholic beverages available on the market. George decided to help Josh out and concealed it beneath his short waistband so as to remain undetected for as long as possible. After 3 a.m., when the ship had become totally silent, a vigilant janitor observed something unusual. Four young individuals, including Greg, Zach, Rostislav, Josh, and George, were drinking from an absinthe bottle and making noise about drinking more. This incident was taken seriously and became another factor in the investigation. Not only were men drinking heavily that evening, even Jennifer, who had initially appeared more reserved, began showing signs of impairment later that night. Witnesses had varied interpretations of her behavior. Some saw it as her trying to maintain balance, while others took it as flirtatious behavior. No one knows exactly what happened after this, though eyewitness accounts indicate a disagreement between them. Perhaps they were discussing events from the night before, either in an upbeat or serious tone, when Jennifer struck George without apparent provocation. Whether this act of violence could have been playful or caused out of anger is still unknown. Following that, Jennifer abruptly left the disco at 3.30 a.m., seemingly under the influence and leaving George behind in the company of his newly acquired friends. This act marked an abrupt turning point in their evening together. Staff witnesses were essential in providing accurate accounts of what transpired at the incident scene. Jennifer, walking unsteadily down the hallway, caught the janitor's attention, and, according to him, young men drinking absinthe had previously been seen doing so. He provided her with assistance, accompanied her to the elevator, and observed as she made an odd right turn when reaching her floor, despite having a stateroom on her left. Jennifer was eventually discovered sleeping in the corridor, some distance from her room. Two security personnel and a female cop used a wheelchair to transport her back. At 4.52 a.m. when they arrived back in their living quarters, George was absent and his balcony drapes had remained tight even with gusts of wind. Raising questions, could he move independently out to his balcony once his new acquaintances left and left him in bed? Chit Hyman and his spouse were enjoying a relaxing getaway at a nearby cabin when the situation escalated rapidly. While sleeping peacefully for some time prior to 4 a.m., when an inexplicable noise began disturbing their rest, Chit Hyman immediately reported the noise to guest services. Additionally, he banged on his wall and shouted at his neighbors until there was some relief in their cabin. After another noisy conversation lasting approximately three minutes, an extremely heated discussion broke out on the balcony. Chit and his spouse overheard someone repeat, Good night, as if encouraging people to leave the cabin, followed by sounds resembling furniture rearrangement, followed by what could only have been an item dropping to the ground. Chit Hyman decided to investigate and opened up the door, 
whereupon he observed three individuals whom he could not recognize. Other passengers on board reported hearing loud sounds that seemed to mimic someone hitting the roof of the boat, followed by a female's scream for help. However, none of the witnesses could provide conclusive proof that a female was present during that period in the cabin. Eyewitness accounts indicate four young males entered, yet only three of them could be seen leaving at any one time. Question was, could one of them have remained indoors to attempt to obtain money from a newly married couple following a large gambling session and possibly try to steal? Heist appears likely, although Greg, Zach, and Rostislav may have had other plans after Chit Hyman noticed three unknown individuals outside his room. George Smith had no trace of two men entering his stateroom after entering it at 4.05 a.m., according to their evidence, and leaving without returning within the same hour, prompting several hypotheses as to what may have transpired since. Here are a few theories as to what might have transpired regarding George. Robbery Robberies are of great concern, and George and Jennifer had become intoxicated quickly that evening, yet witnesses saw them leave the casino at 2.30 a.m., seemingly relatively sober. At 3.30 a.m., however, they could no longer access their cabin alone due to possible exposure to illegal substances. This theory is supported by reports from casino patrons who reported hearing George and Jennifer boast about possessing significant amounts of money, which may have come either as wedding gifts or won in gambling at the casino. Witnesses reported having fortunes worth several tens of thousands of dollars. It appears likely they may have been targeted for theft. George owned an expensive Breitling watch, while Jennifer owned an exquisite engagement ring. Both items signaled their wealth. Perhaps their living space was searched in an attempt to discover it. Blued stains on their sheet may have resulted from George's watch being taken off his wrist by a kidnapper. Alcohol's Impact, the second rendition of events related to the effects of alcohol and hallucinogens. When informed of passengers' intoxication levels, and footprints left on the balcony. Captain concluded there may have been an inadvertent incident such as when grappling instructor George fell into the water while grappling. A special focus is given on hallucinations caused by drinking absinthe. Specialists in toxicology stress that concentration of active ingredients such as thujone is key. At present, this beverage is being sold across Europe. However, its strength has been severely limited by restrictions set forth by the European Union. This evidence suggests that in legally sold absinthe, the amount of thujone present is so small as to prevent hallucinations. However, illegally produced absinthe that contains much higher potencies can be obtained via illegal channels and could theoretically cause hallucinations effects. Given that the Smith couple obtained their absinthe legally in Europe, and could not have caused such harmful results, this situation seems improbable. Experts agree that in order to experience hallucinogenic effects from legal absinthe, a person would need to consume a substantial quantity. Unfortunately, such an amount would likely exceed what their body can tolerate and could even result in potentially deadly alcohol poisoning. Alcohol and hallucinogen use appear unlikely here and lack compelling proof. Questioning individuals from George Smith's company as part of the investigation into his disappearance remains key. FBI investigators conducted lie detector interviews with several key figures involved in this story, such as Jennifer and casino manager Lloyd Botha, both successfully passing their lie detector tests. Josh Askin did not pass his polygraph interview, however. It could indicate that the Russian had knowledge about George's disappearance or it could have been caused by questioning methods designed to extract more details from him. Furthermore, video footage was produced showing three individuals discussing it casually and playful. The audio was found to be significant evidence and was taken into consideration by FBI investigators. One of the unknown individuals on the recording can be heard speaking the phrase, we taught him a lesson in paragliding without parachute, which could suggest something related to George. Greg. Zach, Rostislav, and Josh Osson were interviewed as witnesses during an investigation into George Smith's mysterious death in 2009. Zach Rosenberg and Josh Askin did not provide straight answers or make statements clearly explaining events, which transpired as Zach relied on self-incrimination clause of Fifth Amendment of U.S. Constitution 
to avoid providing straightforward responses, leaving their statements unclear or lacking completeness. Greg Rosenberg was among those present at George Smith's gathering that evening and made statements which undermined his investigation. For instance, one such statement from him stated that they ordered food delivery that day, an allegation which provided them with a plausible alibi against Russian boys present there. Yet this assertion remains suspect given there are inconsistencies with it. No orders were recorded by ship's service logs on that date. Stateroom delivery had been banned that morning, employees were instructed not to assist with them that evening, and Greg remains uncertain who placed orders. Witnesses offered varied responses about George and Jennifer's relationship based on their observations and memories. Greg testified that due to excessive alcohol intake, it was difficult to assess their quality relationship due to intoxication in general. All members in their group were truly drunk, making definitive statements difficult. Josh Askin suggested Greg had left shortly after placing an order for meals, but Greg denied this claim by asserting he never left. Consistencies added an additional level of complexity to the investigation and necessitated further verification and gathering of facts. Greg stated he knew nothing about any connection between Jennifer or Lloyd Botha and George's disappearance. Yet, according to him, it must have been intentional as something strange occurred that night. Sooner or later, this will all come out into the open. Greg Rosenberg was murdered in December 2019, and the cause of his death remains unanswered. Authorities are currently conducting an investigation to ascertain any link between this killing and George Smith's demise. George Smith's untimely disappearance became a national scandal that devastated his family. The circumstances became more intricate as time progressed, drawing interest both from law enforcement authorities and members of the general public alike. Meanwhile, George's relatives continued pressing authorities to uncover the truth and provide justice. The FBI's Connecticut Regional Office transferred George's case to New York. Their determination and media outreach efforts resulted in little progress on this undisclosed matter. George's family offered a $100,000 reward for any information which might lead to finding and punishing those responsible, while also encouraging people not to support shipowner firms as they suspected these firms of trying to cover up what had occurred for financial gain. After the incident, Relations between George's parents and Jennifer became unstable. A comprehensive assessment of her conduct began publicly. She appeared excessively composed and calculated, while refusing to provide sufficient details sparked suspicion. Yet, according to FBI agents, she stated she was simply following their instructions and adhering to their guidelines. In their pursuit of fairness and truth, the Smith family became disillusioned when Jennifer accepted an offer from an arbitration firm to settle the litigation privately for $1 million. Seen by many as betrayal and as a way to avoid further accusations against Cruz organizers. They were unhappy with Turkish authorities' investigations as well as Jennifer, accepting this settlement offer too quickly and accepting an arbitration firm offer too quickly, believing she may be hiding something and not showing curiosity enough about uncovering truth. Jennifer herself reported having very few memories after 2.30 a.m. that night. She wasn't aware that ship's crew discovered and brought back Jennifer to her room from where they found her in the hallway. Since the Turkish inquiry didn't meet their expectations and their doubtful attitude toward official conclusions, the Smith family decided to seek justice on their own and sought help from independent forensic scientist Henry Lee in their pursuit for justice. Henry Lee conducted several tests inside and on the balcony that were not included in his official report, hoping to uncover key facts about what had taken place and validate one of two possible explanations, murder or accident. Henry Lee suggests that due to the height of the balcony, its fall could cause injury in any number of ways. A third party could have pushed George over or, being in some state of mental confusion, he could have climbed up on it himself and fallen. Either scenario generated numerous inquiries and uncertainties. An expert wanted to conduct an experiment designed to replicate such an occurrence. However, however, this proposal was turned down by firm owner of liner. Henry Lee conducted investigations in the cabin, on the balcony and boat, without disclosing their findings to anyone. 
Simultaneously, the FBI began their own probe. Their studies and discoveries remained undisclosed as well. They seemed particularly intrigued with four young guys who spent one night with George, Josh Asin from Los Angeles, as well as Greg Zach Rosenberg, Rostislav Kaufman from Russia, who differed significantly in account from that given by other witnesses, creating an unusual and confusing scenario. George Smith's mysterious disappearance remains an incomprehensible puzzle, shrouded in secrecy and unfamiliar conditions. Following an exhaustive investigation and consideration of various hypotheses, his loved ones remain committed to uncovering the truth about her disappearance. At first, they doubted Jennifer's involvement, but later, they became convinced of her innocence and raised their lawsuit settlement amount against a corporation. With this money divided amongst themselves as family and obtained access to findings from ship owner company, inquiries that included testimonies from witnesses as well as any relevant details that revealed by ship owner's company. Inquiries that included testimonies of witnesses, as well as relevant details regarding other details regarding George Smith's disappearance. Jennifer was left with memories of her first spouse and dedicated herself to charitable associations in his memory, striving to perform acts of kindness. Over time, she married again. Unfortunately, Despite all attempts and investigations by the FBI to uncover what had occurred or where George's body might have been hidden, their efforts failed. At its conclusion, it was determined that George died accidentally. Furthermore, there wasn't sufficient evidence available for further investigations as stated by their official statement of the Federal Bureau. George Smith has vanished and his loved ones continue to search for answers as to his demise. They feel deeply distressed that they cannot pay their respects to him at his burial site, yet hope they'll eventually unravel his mystery and uncover its truth. Share your opinion with us in the comments and subscribe to the channel for more. At London 2012 Summer Olympic Games, Felix Vero Sanchez stood out. Dubbed one of Puerto Rico's greatest talents and most anticipated athletes, Many anticipated him winning championships and gold medals for Puerto Rico. All eyes turned towards him believing that this young person would go far in athletics. In 2021, boxing once again made headlines worldwide media, this time in relation to criminal news. This storyline involves an early romantic connection that eventually developed into dependency that eventually lead to devastating consequences. Also includes details regarding who orchestrated 2014 main knockout which earned praise from two-time Olympic champion Vasil Lomachenko before receiving almost severe punishment but eventually getting sentenced to life imprisonment. Be mindful that despite evidence and confession from his boxer's accomplice, he refuses to own up to his guilt. At nine years old, an unexpected incident altered his future direction dramatically. An acquaintance visited with their nine-year-old, prompting an altercation that included physical contact that required both parents to intervene to separate the youngsters. His father later suggested that should any fights arise again in future, they should wear boxing gloves for protection. After his altercation, Felix requested being taken to a gym nearby. During this initial training session, he discovered his passion for boxing, later confessing it himself. At 16 years old, he won Pan American Junior Championships with flying colors. One year later, he won his national championship, while two years later, he participated in London Olympic Games where he reached quarterfinals, all markers of success in professional boxing. That year marked his path toward great success as an athlete. Verdeo took part in 29 bouts, winning 27 victories en route. In 2014, he earned recognition for delivering an outstanding knockout against Sergio Villanueva. Felix won his inaugural championship belt when he won the WBO Latino belt which he successfully defended six more times over two years. It became clear to those watching that this young boxer would leave an indelible mark in global boxing history. Now let us get acquainted with KLA Rodriguez. She was born in San Juan on November 23, 1993, with the name KLA Marlene Rodriguez Ortiz, and raised by Jose and Kayla Rodriguez as one of their children. Barris Nicole was also adopted into their family alongside Jonathan from Kayla's prior marriage.
KLA was known to be both friendly and outgoing during her upbringing, performing admirably in school while harboring deep affection for animals that may lead her down a career path as a veterinarian one day. KLA was especially close with her sister Barris, with whom she shared all kinds of secrets regarding personal matters as well. KLA Rodriguez attended school alongside Felix Verdejo, her contemporary. They first met as children, but later began an intense romance during adolescence. Following Rodriguez's parents' separation in 2011, Kayla relocated to Florida, while her daughters chose to remain behind in San Juan. Though their separate lives had taken different directions for years, both sisters still shared close bonds that kept them close and shared the details of each life with one another. When an accomplished Olympic boxer named Elisa Maria Santiago Sierra became interested in dating him. At 18 years old, he met young schoolgirl and model. Elisa Maria Santiago Sierra, who at 14 was attending school but still harboring big aspirations, one being to partner with an internationally acclaimed athlete such as himself or herself. Eliza's parents did not object to this relationship. Felix, both beautiful and skilled, attracted many admirers due to his boxing success as well as media attention he received for being good-looking and skilled. Many women took an interest in him. He took advantage of any chance for casual encounters or brief affairs, even while in a relationship with Eliza, even meeting up with KLA regularly afterwards. Keisha's brother Barris and parent Kayla Rodriguez knew about Keisha's affair, yet did not approve. Furthermore, Eliza believed she was Felix's only female companion and made plans for their future together. Keisha, on the other hand, was aware that he was engaged, but Felix refused to end their relationship. Furthermore, he was her initial strong affection, while deep inside Keisha still craved acceptance as her chosen one. In 2016, boxer Anthony Jabari married Eliza, then nearly 19 years old at that time and who had already garnered significant recognition as a model with numerous followers on social media. Additionally, she had established her own beauty studio specializing in eyelash extensions. Shortly after their wedding ceremony took place in August that same year, shortly before driving his motorcycle in a hurry, an athlete was involved in a serious car accident while riding it quickly. Ricky Marquez, Felix's trainer, had serious concerns that his great athlete may lose control at an important juncture of their careers. Yet contrary to expectations, Felix experienced rapid healing and quickly returned to boxing ring competition. At September 2019, boxer Jose Verdejo Santiago shared a photo on social media featuring Eliza, who was far along in her pregnancy. In the caption of the photo, he stated, In the near future, I will meet my father's beloved daughter, and one month later announced her birth, Miranda Verdejo Santiago. At first glance, he appeared to be an attentive husband and loving parent, yet unbeknownst to Eliza, he continued meeting up with Keisha without breaking off his relationship, each time emotionally promising that this relationship would end, yet each time he would promise this would end too, thus increasing Eliza's suspicions, each time he promised his promise, and they would end it but eventually she revealed this fact through confession later. KLA attempted multiple times to end her difficult relationship, but Felix would not let go. She avoided dating other guys since Felix warned her that any time he discovered she was with another, it could have severe repercussions for both parties involved, especially because KLA herself had developed feelings for Verdejo since high school. Their feelings continued regardless. Rodriguez pursued an animal care career and found employment at a veterinary medicine and aesthetics clinic. Her colleagues described her as hardworking. Eliza was responsible and reliable. She lived with two dogs and a cat whom she loved dearly. However, in 2020, Eliza found out her husband's involvement with other romantic partners, such as KLA. As soon as this came to light, Eliza made waves by expelling him from their house, with threats that she would initiate divorce proceedings and prevent him from seeing their daughter anymore. Eliza's warnings had an immediate impact. Additionally, at that point in KLA's athletic career, there had been an abrupt decrease, leaving no time or desire for unwanted issues to arise. 
For some time, he stopped seeing Rodriguez. Felix, however, still kept an eye on nearly every action of Rodriguez and attempted to monitor each interaction they had together. After some unspoken meetings, they resumed dating, and in April 2021, KLA found out she was pregnant through purchasing a quick test at her pharmacy, which only confirmed what KLA already suspected. She bought quick tests there, which confirmed what she already suspected was already confirmed in KLA. KLA reached out to her sister first, as someone familiar with her connection with an athlete, for advice. Keisha did not consider abortion an option due to being 27 and being willing to raise the child independently. A few days later, she informed Felix, believing he would understand. Instead, he became angry and advised his mistress to visit a doctor immediately to determine her pregnancy, suggesting an abortion if necessary, if confirmed by medical testing. Rodriguez denied Felix's allegations, but continued to receive intimidation and persistence from him. Felix asserted that the existence of an illegitimate child could compromise his reputation, something which he could no longer tolerate. Keisha was then taken to the hospital, where her pregnancy was verified and she received an official certificate as evidence. When Keisha called Felix with the news, his response was immediate. Anger. Felix raised his voice to demand Keisha take the child immediately from her care, but she refused. Instead, Felix chose to act discreetly by raising questions and personally reviewing KLA's medical certificate before scheduling an evening meeting at an unobtrusive spot. KLA wasn't surprised. Their effort had always been to avoid drawing unnecessary attention to themselves and not cause interference with anyone's agenda. Before the encounter, Felix visited an old acquaintance named Luis Antonio Cadiz, who worked in a nearby workshop and had connections to the illicit drug trade. Felix briefly described the scenario to Luis and asked it for his assistance in resolving it with his pregnant partner. Luis had attracted the attention of police, fearing prison would follow them home. Felix assured him there would be no issues and they wouldn't go anywhere. Additionally, he promised a substantial monetary incentive and Luis agreed. Felix sought help from her partner and told KLA of his plan to meet on April 29th to discuss her pregnancy and make decisions moving forward. Keisha phoned Barris as soon as she spoke with Felix. Keisha expressed hope that Felix would accept their child and would not push for an abortion. Barris was concerned, knowing Felix had threatened Keisha before, so was fearful he might take some form of action against KLA. Even together, Barris and her mother attempted unsuccessfully to convince KLA not to meet on that fateful evening on April 29th. Even together, they failed in convincing KLA, of course. At the scheduled meeting time, Rodriguez came bearing a medical letter in her Kia Forte car and arrived with Verdejo in his truck, carrying Luis in its bed. Keisha promptly entered Verdejo's vehicle to present test results to him, once again discussing ending her pregnancy but being met by tears from KLA. Once this discussion occurred again, Felix struck Keisha in the head with his fist causing her unconsciousness, and an intense argument ensued between the couple before Felix abruptly hit Keisha with his fist and caused her unconsciousness almost instantly. After KLA had become unconscious, Felix used Luis to obtain a syringe filled with illicit chemicals from the glove compartment of their car and administered them directly to KLA. After transporting Rodriguez with his partner to the back of their vehicle, where there were already set out sections of wire and concrete blocks, they bound her and concealed her under a tarp in order to reduce any chance of visibility. Felix then returned to his pickup truck while Keisha took her partner's seat as they headed towards a bridge that crossed San Jose Lagoon. Once there, Felix made sure he wasn't seen while tossing KLA into the river as quickly as he could without anyone noticing. Later, however, they decided to fire several trial rounds from guns they brought along while chasing after him in order to eliminate any risk for victims of violence. When their mission had been accomplished, all returned home. Keisha's colleagues were the first to express concern when she failed to arrive at the Veterinary Medicine and Aesthetic Center the following day, knowing she is always highly reliable. Since she didn't answer their phone call or respond when called back by KLA herself, it was decided to reach out to Keisha's sister to inquire further into what had occurred. 
After trying several unsuccessful methods of communication with KLA, Barris decided to visit her house. There was no response at the door, but thanks to an extra key, she gained entry without difficulty and found mostly starved animals who had gone 24 hours without food, giving rise to fear as Barris realized something horrific or irreparable had occurred to KLA. She called her mother and shared all details before notifying authorities of threats made against KLA. When calling Felix directly, he insisted on staying home with his family and Steed. Kayla Rodriguez flew from Florida to San Juan as soon as an airplane became available, fearful that her partner may have taken Keisha without permission to a confidential medical facility for an abortion procedure without her knowledge or consent. After speaking with neighbors and co-workers of Keisha Rodriguez, her missing sister, but no useful details emerged from them during this phase of investigation. Posts were put out asking anyone with knowledge regarding Rodriguez's fate or whereabouts to contact them immediately. After it became known that the girl missing was engaged to an athlete and pregnant, journalists immediately sought interviews with Rodriguez's relatives. Many expressed doubts and blamed Felix as being responsible for this tragedy, among other charges. Keisha's car was discovered abandoned on April 30th on the eastern edge of the city, still filled with her paperwork and personal items, without signs of struggle inside. On May 1st, while walking across Lagoon Bridge, someone noticed something which seemed like human remains floating near shore. This person promptly reported this sighting to authorities who quickly located a young female corpse, likely the one everyone in town had been searching for over multiple days. Rodriguez family members came to identify the body, holding on to hope until the very last moment that it wasn't Keisha, but unfortunately, their hopes weren't fulfilled. Though submerged for some days and showing visible changes due to being submerged underwater for many hours, her distinctive tattoo on her arm helped identify Keisha swiftly and identify who had killed her. When learning of this horrifying discovery, the citizens of the city reacted harshly and began organizing spontaneous gatherings demanding justice against those responsible. On that same day, Verdejo was arrested and taken to the police station for questioning, yet he vehemently denied any involvement and stated he was home with his family on the evening of Keisha's disappearance. Felix was released without charges against him. One key witness for Verdejo's alibi verification was his wife, who confirmed her husband wasn't at home during that evening of crime. Investigators initially examined traffic surveillance footage along the route leading up to the bridge from which Keisha had been thrown, identifying Felix's pickup truck and Kia Fort as vehicles driving near each other. It became evident that Felix wasn't driving his Kia. On that same day, Felix's vehicle was brought in for inspection. Within it, they found some hair of deceased person found within it. Louise was the first to turn herself in to police, agreeing to provide all the facts in exchange for a shorter sentence. Felix was detained as well, yet refused to participate with the investigation or respond to inquiries, even in spite of overwhelming proof against him. A gun that Felix used to shoot the victim from a bridge was recovered with valid license documentation attached. Furthermore, a mobile phone check verified all three as being present during that fateful evening. Keisha Rodriguez had her final farewell on May 8th in a funeral service which received widespread media coverage. Not only was this held to demand that those responsible be punished as legally as possible, but also to raise public awareness on gender violence issues. Her body was brought to her burial in an unconventional white carriage vehicle, while white flower petals were scattered from above. Puerto Rico was gripped with excitement after Verdejo was accused of stealing a car, abducting someone, planning murderous plots, and killing an unborn baby, crimes punishable by death sentence. However, family members of deceased ask that instead a life sentence be issued so that Verdejo may experience lifelong incarceration instead. Due to a global coronavirus outbreak, hearings for this case were frequently postponed until spring 2021 when an online trial took place. It determined that a group of individuals had committed the crime through premeditation and extreme brutality against an expectant mother. Reconstructing events from that night and its details was made possible thanks to Luis's testimony, 
as he did not deny his guilt. Rather, he confessed his involvement by purchasing medicine for injection upon request of his friend, as well as gathering wire and concrete blocks with which to dispose of his body. Felix repeatedly asserted his disengagement from the case, even if his statements made no noticeable impactful statements about it. Coincidentally, his spouse who testified shortly after his imprisonment has begun divorce proceedings to distance herself from the situation and focus on growing their business while raising their daughter. According to various reports, Alisa Santiago recently married again and, during an interview, revealed she had received multiple anonymous phone calls and texts with death threats and requests that both she and Miranda be killed. Miranda's spouse was suspected in this crime, but no tangible proof was ever discovered against them. In 2023, it became public knowledge that after reviewing all available evidence and listening to testimony from all witnesses, the jury would make its final determination on Felix Verdejo and Luis Cadiz for all charges brought against them. They have both been found guilty on all allegations brought against them. Yet their respective court hearing is scheduled for mid-November 2023, with both individuals most likely receiving life imprisonment sentences without parole for killing Keisha Rodriguez and her unborn child. Share your opinion with us in the comments and subscribe to the channel for more. Wendy OGG was born February 15, 1958. While much is not known about Wendy's early life, what is certain is that by 1978, she was living in Bellingham with her daughter Charlena as a 29-year-old single mother and attending McDonald's Beauty School to further her own education for an improved future for herself and Charlena. Whatever Wendy's motivation for learning may have been, one thing is clear. She was clearly an amazing individual with immense determination and resilience. On April 24, 1987, Wendy found herself taking a break from beauty school to visit La Paloma restaurant across the street for lunch. With spring just around the corner and hopes of relaxation high in Bellingham, Wendy likely relished this chance to stop studying for a moment and relax while having lunch with family and friends. Wendy returned from lunch with some exciting news for her classmates at beauty school. She told of a chance meeting she had at La Paloma restaurant with Mike Johnson, whom she immediately liked due to his distinguished three-piece suit and charming personality. Wendy revealed she planned on going out on a date with Mike later that afternoon. As the sun began to set that evening, Wendy left her daughter in the care of a trusted babysitter and set out on her journey towards Mike for their first date. With anticipation and excitement consuming her thoughts, it wasn't long until Mike and Wendy found themselves growing more comfortable with one another as the evening progressed, eventually ending up at one of Wendy's friends' homes, where they chatted until early hours of morning before calling it quits and heading off into darkness together. No one could have predicted it would be the last time anyone would see Wendy alive. Wendy had failed to come home as planned and collect her daughter, leading the babysitter of Wendy's daughter to become anxious and ultimately fearful that something was amiss. They eventually reported her missing to police and sought assistance in finding Wendy. The police acted swiftly, arriving at Wendy's house quickly in hopes of discovering evidence or leads that might help locate her. Once inside, they began their search of the house. When they reached her bedroom, they found something unsettling. Two pools of dried blood at the head of Wendy's bed, with its sheets saturated in bloodstains from two pools at its head, as well as another unidentifiable stain on its sheet soaked with blood that shocked them. It became evident that something violent had taken place within this home, and the mystery behind her disappearance had taken a dark turn. Detectives were immediately put into action upon discovering the horrific scene in Wendy's bedroom, interviewing her friends to gain any information they could gather, including interviewing Mike, her recent date who vanished with stolen cash and liquor from La Paloma restaurant where they worked bartending for two days before going missing with stolen funds and liquor from La Paloma's liquor cabinet, driving off in Wendy's 1972 Ford Torino vehicle making his disappearance even more perplexing for investigators. They knew they must find Mike as soon as possible, 
or else risk further investigation would further delays could ensue in finding their target's whereabouts as soon as possible. Mike had quickly disappeared from Bellingham, and they quickly discovered a promising lead. They learned of an individual entering the United States from Canada in Wendy's car the day after Mike vanished. United States Customs Authorities even snapped a photo and collected information on him. Hours after this photo was taken, Wendy's vehicle was found abandoned near Eugene, Oregon. Authorities conducted a search of the vehicle and made an unexpected find, bloodied men's pants. Additionally, they discovered a Burger King hamburger box where they were able to lift fingerprints belonging to one Darren D. O'Neill, who had an extensive criminal background that included robbery and assault offenses. After further analysis revealed this result, Detectives quickly realized Mike may be an alias used by O'Neill himself. To verify their suspicions, they obtained the job application Mike had submitted to La Paloma Restaurant and ran it through fingerprint matching software. Their hunch was proven right when O'Neill's fingerprints matched those on Mike, leaving no doubt as to his identity as being who had gone by Mike since being seen last with Wendy. Authorities were determined to locate O'Neill but he seemed to vanish without trace. Additionally, his identity and appearance often changed frequently, making tracking him nearly impossible. Finally, in September 1987, detectives finally had success when O'Neill was apprehended in Florida on an outstanding stolen car warrant and then extradited back to Washington State, where charges for his heinous crimes would be filed against him. O'Neill faced several charges related to Robin Smith, 21, from Pierce County in Washington State, who had gone missing just four weeks prior to Wendy. Her body was discovered in May 1987. When asked by police about Wendy, O'Neill refused to reveal any information and instead refused any information regarding Robin's whereabouts or whereabouts. Two years later, in 1989, he pleaded guilty and received life imprisonment while also being found guilty for second-degree auto theft for having stolen her vehicle, thus providing some level of closure for Wendy's family and friends. O'Neill's crimes became public knowledge once again in August 1990 as another victim story emerged. O'Neill was charged with kidnapping and perpetrating unspeakable atrocities upon a 14-year-old Portland girl back in 1987. Following swift and decisive jury deliberation, he was handed 135 years imprisonment as punishment in this particular case alone. O'Neill's imprisonment certainly brought some measure of justice. However, his silence surrounding Wendy's disappearance was deafening. No one knew if she was still alive or where her body could be located. Efforts by authorities, Wendy's family and friends, as well as Wendy herself, failed to shed any light into what had transpired with her disappearance. Instead, it seemed as if she had seemingly vanished without trace, leaving only speculation and speculation by community members regarding what may have transpired with her fateful journey. As time passed, hope of finding Wendy alive began fading, and only search for her body was left. Bellingham Police Department had given up hope of solving Wendy's disappearance until in 2015, they received a startling report from Washington State Patrol Crime Laboratory about evidence found at her home that could potentially open the case wide open. Detectives had noticed a suspicious stain on Wendy's bedsheet years before, but only now was its identity confirmed as semen stain. DNA extracted from the stain was used to create a profile, and results were final. O'Neill had already been serving a life sentence for various crimes, and now justice might finally be done for Wendy after all these years. In November 2020, the Washington State Patrol Crime Laboratory informed detectives about an important development relating to Wendy O'Neill's car after it had been abandoned by O'Neill, specifically that blood from one pair of pants found there belonged to Wendy herself. As more pieces fell into place, it became evident that O'Neill was responsible for Wendy's disappearance and likely death. Finally, in October 2022, authorities moved against him, charging him with second-degree murder of Wendy with an astonishing 10 million bail set amount. On March 1, 2023, 
O'Neill was extradited from Oregon, where he had been serving a 135-year prison term, and on March 10th, he appeared before Whatcom County Superior Court, where despite overwhelming evidence against him, he pled not guilty, leaving the courtroom stunned in silence. O'Neill's public defense attorney, Stark Fallis, argued that due to its long gap since Ogg's murder, and charges being laid upon O'Neill should also be considered. Additionally, Fallis asked why O'Neill wasn't charged back then, for stealing her car instead. At present, O'Neill's next scheduled appearance is set for April 5, 2023, leaving many to speculate as to its outcome. But these five cases demonstrate how justice may take its time, but never forgets. Thanks to law enforcement efforts and advancements in forensic technology that enabled investigators to solve cases once thought unsolvable, families of victims now can rest easy knowing their loved ones haven't been forgotten. Jeremiah Watkins was born August 22nd in Morgantown, Monongalia County, to James Edward Watkins and Enid Nicola, who were filled with pride at bringing into this world their precious bundle. Tragically, however, tragedy struck just four years later, with James Edward Watkins dying, leaving Enid to raise Jeremiah alone despite her grief. Nevertheless, she remained strong and loving toward him, providing all he needed as she raised their son with all their love and care she could. After their divorce, Enid was living in Terra Alta with Jeremiah and her infant daughter Jamie, only just months old at that point. But there is no evidence she remarried. Jeremiah had always found immense pleasure in doting on his baby sister, spending hours playing and making her laugh. Additionally, there was one other thing which brought him great pleasure, his beloved Kit Kat. After every tasty, crunchy bite of that sweet and salty goodness, Jeremiah felt like the happiest boy alive. To work off some calories after feasting his eyes upon its delicious sweetness, he'd explore every inch of West Virginia with his bicycle. His adventurous spirit would often lead him down different routes in West Virginia's rolling hills and valleys, just what his life needed, family love and natural splendor. However, as they hoped for it, things took an unexpected and tragic turn. One day when Jeremiah went for his usual playdate, but never returned home, Something that happened sometime during early November 1985, when West Virginia was hit with a powerful rainstorm that caused severe flooding, which destroyed roads and bridges, leaving authorities scrambling to assist those affected while also taking over 40 lives. Shocking. Authorities started looking for Jeremiah as soon as the floodwater receded, yet their efforts were hindered by floodwater, and Jeremiah was missing for days. On November 12, 1985, deputies discovered a shallow grave near train tracks near Terra Alta, about 30 miles from Morgantown, containing his lifeless body. Their hearts broke at this news. Initial investigations led the officers to believe the flooding had claimed another victim, but upon closer examination, they made a shocking discovery. There was a stab wound on the boy's back that revealed a violent end. Desperate to discover any leads, officers searched around. But the torrential rains and flooding had washed away any potential evidence, leaving only questions and heartbreaking tragedy as answers. Enid was left in pieces when she learned of Jeremiah's death, as she could not comprehend such a senseless and tragic event happened to her son. The pain of losing him was immense, and Enid struggled with accepting that her child may never see another day. An autopsy conducted later revealed that in addition to suffering a fatal stab wound, leading directly to his demise, Jeremiah also experienced a devastating blow to the head, which resulted in a fatal brain bleed causing his death. Due to this news, detectives launched an intensive investigation to bring justice. After interviewing many witnesses and following every lead possible, none of their efforts proved fruitful as no suspect was ever identified or arrests made, leaving the case open and unsolved for years. Yaimi couldn't help but reflect upon her brother she'd barely known, whom she only vaguely remembered. I have some memory of him, but how much do you remember at first glance? When Jaime learned the truth behind how her brother had died, it left her devastated and full of unanswered questions. Who had done this, and why had it happened to him? 
It haunted her daily thoughts for days after. Jaime struggled with the unsolved murder of her brother Jeremiah after becoming an adult. While attending college in the early 2000s, she took action by reaching out to authorities seeking information. Unfortunately, however, their response was disheartening, as the investigation had long since gone cold. Any possibility of finding the culprit being minimal at best. Captain T.N. Ticknell of the Preston County Sheriff's Office took on the decades-old unsolved murder case of Jeremiah in February 2023 with great enthusiasm, out of compassion for Jeremiah's family being denied justice for so long, to uncover any overlooked clues that could lead to an investigation breakthrough. After hours spent poring over interviews and witness statements, he came upon David Monroe Adams, aged 18 at time of murder and living in Terra Alta. This caught his attention. Captain Ticknell noted some discrepancies in Adams's statement and decided to find and interview him again, although those discrepancies remain undisclosed. Captain Ticknell's dedication to solving Jeremiah's case led him to track down Adams that same February. With the assistance of other law enforcement agencies, he conducted several interviews with him. One interview led Adams confessing to killing Jeremiah. The pieces finally fitted together. Adams had apparently engaged Jeremiah in an argument over a stolen bicycle, which quickly escalated to violence. Adams subsequently attacked Jeremiah with a blow to the face before taking him to a nearby shed, where he fatally stabbed him before tossing his lifeless body into a shallow hole that eventually led to its discovery. Detectives were overjoyed at Adams' confession to them. They finally felt as if the unsolved case that had haunted their community for nearly four decades had finally come to a conclusion. Adams was immediately arrested and charged with second-degree murder before being taken to North Central Regional Jail, where he remains held today. Enid was informed by a deputy that her son's murderer had been captured. Enid immediately reached out to Jaime to share this news. Jaime was stunned and in disbelief at being given such good news. Though questions still linger regarding Jaime's brother's demise, everyone remains hopeful for justice to finally prevail. Back in 2011, Hyannis, Massachusetts's charming seaside town, was alive with an infectious energy. On April 7, 1959, Joseph and Elisa Bellino welcomed their fourth child into this world. They named him Brad the tiniest bundle of joy they'd ever laid eyes upon. Growing up, Brad became known as the baby of his family, growing up alongside two older brothers and one older sister. However, his connection with his siblings remained undisruptible, built over years of laughter, tears, and mischief-making. From an early age, Brad was drawn to adventure. His insatiable curiosity drove him forward, as he explored unknown territories or tried new experiences, something which kept Brad upbeat and excited by life. Never one to back down from a challenge, Brad never hesitated when presented with one. Brad was very outgoing. We both took risks, but he often initiated them and I always agreed, explained Don Templeman, Brad's close friend and confidant. In reality, Don and Brad shared an excellent relationship. At what point exactly they became friends remains unclear, though their bond probably began after meeting at Boardman Center Middle School, where they both were students. Both shared an appreciation of adventure which bound them together. It eventually kept them apart as well. Children often rode bikes through town, discovering every corner and crevice possible. A favorite location was Boardman Mall, where they would meet friends to exchange gossip and exchange news of what's new in school life. But their thirst for exploration didn't end there. These children also hitchhiked often. The two boys shared an interest in rocks and gemstones and would visit a rock and gem shop near Brad's house frequently to marvel at its breathtaking display of rocks and minerals. Not only did their shared love for adventure bring them together, Don's father served as their coach. Soon enough, these two became regular house guests for each other. Brad and Don lived just three miles apart making it easy for them to meet whenever desired. Don would head over to Brad's house every Friday night, where they would head off to the cinema together. Brad lived near a cinema, so every Friday and Saturday they'd walk there together, discussing new movies they were looking forward to watching 
and what adventures lay in wait for them over the weekend. However, on Saturdays, Brad would visit Don at Applewood Acres for a sleepover party. These two would spend their evenings playing games and talking late into the night. On Sunday mornings, Don and Brad joined his family for church, an important tradition that only deepened their bonds further. His mother would usually drive Brad home after this service was complete, before saying their goodbyes with hopes that another sleepover was soon coming up. Don and Brad found these weekends to be filled with pure happiness and friendship. They cherished every second they spent together, living life to its fullest in all its adventures. But then something devastating occurred, changing everything forever. Brad, 12, and Don, 11, who were sixth graders, were excited about having some time off school and spending it together. Soon enough, they met up and set off exploring as usual before becoming disturbed when a brown van began following them around everywhere they went. The boys first thought it was mere coincidence, but when it continued happening over and over, it turned from playful into fearful. Sensing danger, they acted swiftly to head back towards Don's house in order to escape the mysterious vehicle. At that time, it had begun to set and it seemed wiser for them to return home after such a long day. Little did they know their day was far from over. Brad was eager to begin an enjoyable evening at Don's home when the phone rang, only for it to be answered by his father demanding that he come home immediately, before reluctantly breaking the news to Don that he needed to leave. Due to circumstances beyond his control, Don was at a grocery store when Joseph, Brad's father, called and therefore couldn't take him home as usual. Additionally, his own father was sick in bed so Brad was forced to travel alone, home from his destination. At dusk and after 7.30 p.m., Brad decided to walk back home. Before long, he bid farewell to Dawn, as they said their farewells and waved goodbye through the door as he left. These would likely be Dawn's last memories of him alive. Joseph had spent much of the evening out late, and when he returned, had no inkling that Brad was missing. He assumed he'd returned from his outing to find Brad sleeping peacefully inside and had simply gone back out again, only to be surprised to discover his world had just been turned upside down. Elisa was away on an important work trip in Cleveland during this fateful day, unaware of what was transpiring back home. On Saturday morning of April 1, 1972, which was also a Saturday, Joseph took advantage of sleeping until noon before realizing something was amiss. Brad was nowhere to be found. With growing concern, he called Templeman's house and learned he'd left their residence the previous evening at around 7.30 p.m. without anyone reporting him as missing. Hearing this information brought an immediate feeling of unease. Joseph dialed them immediately as well to confirm what he'd heard earlier from Brad himself. They hadn't seen or heard from him since then. Joseph's heart pounded as he hung up the phone. Where was Brad? Knowing it was urgent that he find his son quickly, Joseph immediately ran from home and began searching his neighborhood, calling out his name in desperation and hopelessness, until finally midday came along and Joseph made a call to 911 for assistance. He reported that Brad, whom he dearly loved, had gone missing. Soon thereafter, word spread quickly around town of his disappearance. Elisa was devastated up on hearing the news. No trace had been found of her son despot and intensive police and volunteer search, effort that included both departments. Brad's disappearance quickly reached the media, and local newspapers soon joined in the search efforts. They published a detailed description of Brad, hoping someone might recognize him. They described him as 4 feet 8 inches in height and 80 pounds in weight with striking blue eyes and short blonde hair that fell below his ears. Last seen wearing blue jeans. Tony DePolito, his first cousin from Youngstown and police officer himself, knew something had to be done when news of Brad's disappearance reached him, so he joined search efforts in Boardman with hopes of finding and returning his cousin safely home. Unfortunately, their efforts had no success as it seemed as though Brad had simply vanished into thin air, leaving his loved ones heartbroken and the community feeling vulnerable. His absence created an air of uncertainty around town, which hasn't subsided since. Paul Smith, a sanitation worker, began his regular trash collection routine on April 4, 1972 at Isali's Dairy Store when he noticed something unnerving. 
The dumpster was partially full with sneakers sticking up at an odd angle and partially filled. Closer inspection revealed the body of a young boy, covered in cardboard boxes from Asali's dairy store waist. His head lay downward, with his neck tightly fastened by an iron belt. Paul immediately made calls to authorities to report what he found there. Paul found himself overwhelmed by what he saw, so he immediately called the police, who arrived within moments. Once inside the dumpster and witnessed a small body lying therein, which may or may not have been that of the missing boy they had been searching for, they felt despair. They immediately reached out to Tony who had also been helping searchers locate his cousin, asking him for identification assistance in order to confirm its identification as theirs. Tony quickly arrived on the scene and confirmed the horror. The body in the dumpster belonged to Tony's beloved cousin Brad. With heavy hearts, Tony removed and transported Brad's remains to Southside Hospital for autopsy, then faced the heartbreaking task of informing Brad's parents of this devastating news. Tony described how tragic this event had been for his Aunt Elisa and the entire family. You never truly recover from something like this happening to someone close to you. Don was in school when his teacher broke the news of Brad's passing away. Shock and grief hit hard. It took several minutes before Don could even process what had just occurred. While Brad's family and friends were reeling from the shock of his tragic death, results of the autopsy were released. According to the coroner's report, Brad had been strangled to death and subjected to some form of physical abuse before passing away at 9 p.m. on Saturday, April 1st, over 24 hours after he had last been seen alive. These details only compounded their grief. Police initiated an immediate investigation to identify those responsible. As part of their efforts, Don was called into the station where he was shown Brad's clothing that matched what he was wearing when leaving Don's house. Don confirmed this was correct, and when shown his own belt found on Brad, he identified it as belonging to Brad himself. Don couldn't get his mind off of seeing a brown van on Brad's day of disappearance, which may have had something to do with his death. Don believed this might have played some part. Don, as part of his investigation into Brad's murder, suggested that someone within that van may have waited until Brad was in a dark area before seizing him. Following this tragedy, members from across town came together for his funeral, attended by pupils from his school as well as parents and teachers, all mourning his sudden departure far too soon. Almost the whole community seemed united in its sorrow. Sadness permeated the air in an outpouring of sadness. After Brad's death, Boardman never seemed the same again. Don and his family could no longer bear to live with reminders of this tragic event, so they decided it was time for a change and decided to relocate their family from Minnesota to Tennessee and start over from scratch. Two months after Brad's funeral service, they packed their belongings and left Boardman forever. Days turned to weeks and then months and the investigation into Brad's death seemed to progress no further. Even after following up numerous leads and interviewing several suspects, detectives assigned to this case kept hitting date ends at every turn. Tony recalls of the investigation into Brad's death as being one of absolute nothing. Over time, hope of justice being doned for Brad wanted rapidly and eventually vanished altogether. In 2001, Boardman's former police chief Jeffrey Patterson refused to let Brad's case die quietly. Instead, he took bold action by reopening it, dispatching detectives to exhume Brad's body for DNA evidence collection and taking Brad's clothing as evidence for submission at the State Bureau of Criminal Identification and Investigation, BCII. On closer examination, however, forensic scientists discovered something that dismayed them, DNA that did not belong to Brad. The discovery provided new life to the investigation as detectives set about searching for justice without compromise, yet despite of their best efforts the investigation stalled for several years. In 2007, Police Chief Jeffrey decided to assign the case of Brad's disappearance to two new detectives, Jack Nichols and Bob Rupp. Nichols had grown up near where Brad went missing in 1972. At 14, he witnessed what became a tragic event. So this case had always lingered with him. Now it was finally time for justice for Brad, so he promised himself that this case would receive all his effort and dedication. 
Nichols and Rupp began the investigation immediately upon being assigned the task, diving headfirst into sorting through mountains of paperwork and boxes of poorly organized evidence. While this task proved challenging, the two forged ahead in making the best use of their time, looking through files, eventually noticing seven individuals' names pop up repeatedly as persons of interest that might ultimately become suspects, but without enough concrete evidence, they couldn't yet be considered such. However, Nichols and Rupp did not give up. They quickly obtained search warrants and set about serving them, collecting DNA samples from each of those involved and sending them off for testing in hopes that any would match up with what had been discovered on Brad's clothing. But their hopes were dashed when none did. None could match with Brad. Under such adversity, Nichols and Rupp were back at square one, yet they refused to give up on finding answers. Instead, they diligently combed through case files in an effort to unearth new leads. Unfortunately, their efforts yielded nothing new. After years of working on the case together, however, Nichols and Rupp retired while another team took over their investigations. Albert Kekasik led an experienced Boardman police captain team. Armed with fresh eyes and perspectives, this investigation would soon take an unexpected turn. Boardman police detectives understood that advanced technology would be required to analyze the DNA found on Brad's clothing. In 2018, they turned to Virginia-based DNA technology firm Parabon Nanolabs, which utilized familial DNA matching methods to narrow down suspects to those sharing similar physical traits or family trees. Over four years, detectives labored tirelessly, gathering DNA samples from individuals identified by Parabon as possibly related to Joseph Norman Hill and performing DNA tests on them. With help of these tests, they narrowed their search to specific branches of an extended family tree while eliminating others. Eventually, all their hard work paid off with Joseph Norman Hill becoming their target. Follow this lead. Detectives worked diligently to locate Hill and collect DNA samples for testing. Testing Hill's relative revealed an almost 99.2% likelihood that Brad's clothes contained Hill's DNA, suggesting they had finally located the person responsible. Unfortunately, however, Hill passed away due to cancer and had since been cremated, which prevented further testing being conducted on his remains to ascertain his guilt. Detectives were taken aback as they dug deeper into Joseph Norman Hill's life, discovering both that he had gone undetected all these years, but also his living situation at the time of Brad's murder. 32 and living on Shadyside Drive in Boardman, with no known connections to Brad or his family, driving for a bottled water company before moving out west in 1978 for work purposes, driving truck for them until eventually moving permanently in 1978 when relocated for employment opportunities there in California. Yet no connection between him or Brad himself and Brad or his family, leaving detectives baffled. His only brush with law being an arrest charge from 1986 for disorderly conduct and solicitation for conduct related to rude acts committed in Los Angeles that year. Gina Deganova of Mahoning County Prosecution Services was charged with reviewing all the evidence compiled by Boardman Police in Brad's murder case. Her team carefully examined every piece of information until they reached an understanding that Joseph Norman Hill could present all this to a grand jury without fear. This marked a massive breakthrough for this investigation and finally allowed detectives to relax knowing their hard work had paid off. Boardman Police Chief Todd Worth revealed during a press conference held on January 24, 2023, that Brad's family had chosen not to make any public statements and requested space and privacy during this difficult period of their healing journey. Any additional disturbance from media intrusion or further disturbance would only add further distress for them and disrupt their healing journey further. Terra Alta, West Virginia's Unasaming town took it into its rolling hills offers up an unforgettable experience. Boasting just over Watson 400 residents and plenty of charm, Terra Alta stands out as an idyllic small community. On August 9, 1980, high school sweethearts Tim Hack and Kelly Drew, both 19 years old at the time, went missing after attending a wedding reception at Concord House in Concord, Wisconsin. Over time, 
Searchers found some clues as to where Tim and Kelly might have gone. Pants left behind by Tim in his car with wallet inside, ropes used by searchers in Concord as well as undergarment containing women's underwear belonging to Kelly. These leads ultimately led two months later when bodies of Tim and Kelly were found violated and left lying neglected among trees near Concord House. But nearly 30 years later, advances in DNA technology combined with an unlikely witness and an investigator's tenacious search for truth led to the identification of the perpetrator, who had gone so unnoticed by even his neighbours that no one suspected anything sinister from him. So who was this man, and why did it take so long to locate them? Our story today takes us back to Concord, Wisconsin, a small town located within Jefferson County that boasts just over 2,000 people. Concord was an idyllic town filled with parks and natural spaces, making it the ideal place for people who loved being outside. Activities such as hiking, biking, fishing, camping, and other outdoor pursuits were popular with residents. Concord boasted an incredibly low violent crime rate of just 7% during the 1980s when Tim Hack and Kelly Drew's story took place. That figure was significantly below the US average of 22.7% that decade. People didn't lock their doors and neighbors looked out for each other, precisely the type of place where Tim Hack and Kelly Drew believed they could get married, settle on a farm, raise their children while growing old together. Tim Hack and Kelly Drew were 19-year-old high school sweethearts engaged to be married. Tim resided with his family in Hine, a small town located within Jefferson County. Kelly resided with hers in Fort Atkinson. Tim first met Kelly while attending Fort Atkinson High School. They first met again while attending Fort Atkinson Middle School together, where Kelly excelled at cosmetology, while Tim excelled as a hard-working farmer. Both were highly admired among friends and family for their kind-hearted qualities, and Tim was revered among young people, aspiring to emulate them both as individuals or couples themselves. Tim started his professional life after graduation as a farmer. His best friend was his beloved tractor, known as the Lonesome Loser. Meanwhile, Kelly attended beauty school and graduated in 1980 in hopes of becoming a hairstylist or beautician, Tim and Kelly attended a wedding reception at Concord House in Wisconsin on August 9, 1980, with plans of meeting friends afterward to visit a carnival, but never turned up. At 11 p.m. on August 9, 1980, when they left the reception, Tim Hack was seen leaving by anyone alive. On August 10, when no trace had been seen or heard from them, since leaving reception, his father David Hack filed missing person reports for both of them and later found Tim's brown e-mobile in Concord House parking lot with $67 in his wallet locked inside, along with jacket and checkbook inside. There were speculations as to where exactly they had taken a bus ride to. On August 15th, searchers discovered Kelly's pants and underwear by the roadside about three miles from Concord House, with male bodily fluids on them. Additionally, searchers discovered some ropes tied with various knots, suggesting military experience. Over the course of ten days, multiple pieces of Kelly's clothing were found within a six-mile radius from Concord House, as well as about a dozen rope pieces tied with various knots. This discovery marked an immediate transformation in the case. Suddenly, it wasn't just about finding two people who may have just decided to escape together for romantic getaway, but more about finding them alive because their lives could now be in imminent peril. Two months later, some squirrel hunters from Milwaukee were hunting squirrels near Aonia, Wisconsin, about seven miles from Concord House. As they traversed through wooded areas paralleling Highway 16 east of Watertown, they came upon Kelly Drew's badly decomposed remains near a railroad track paralleling it. She had been completely naked. As well as a hundred yards later, found Tim Hack's fully clothed male body, 
both had suffered fatal stabbing wounds on their bodies, as well as ligature marks suggesting deaths by stabbing and strangulation, respectively. It became known as sweetheart murders. Investigative interviews began by conducting in-depth interviews of everyone associated with the couple to ascertain any motive for harm against them. Police interviewed attendees of their wedding reception at Concord House as well as staff. Edward Wayne. Edwards, who lived nearby but worked at Concord House as a handyman, was interrogated for clues as a possible suspect. Edward claimed not having seen them and wasn't even at Concord House around when they went missing. Instead, he claimed deer hunting in nearby woods which raised suspicion as deer hunting season typically started around November. After questioning Edward in September 1980, his wife and five children left Wisconsin for good. Investigators' most promising lead came from eyewitness accounts of a dirty-looking van parked next to Tim's car at Concord House parking lot that suddenly drove away suspiciously around the time Tim and Kelly were last seen alive. Edward owned Sucha van, which often housed his 357 revolver. However, without license plate numbers or strong evidence linking Edward to the crime scene, there were limited leads they could pursue further. As all leads for investigation were exhausted, the file was shelved and eventually forgotten about. Twenty years after Tim Hack and Kelly Drew's murders had taken place, Richard Lewell, from Wisconsin Department of Justice, requested its reopening due to advances in DNA technology, which gave him hope there might finally be an answer. After digging through files, witness statements, and interview recordings for two months without success, one name stood out. Edward Wayne Edwards. Lewell and her cold case investigator team decided to pursue Edward as a potential suspect when interviewing his former neighbors from when he lived in Concord, Wisconsin. Interviewing Edward's neighbors revealed a difficult person who was short-tempered and volatile. John Edwards described his father as troubled. In 2009, April Baseo, Edward's daughter, contacted authorities with disturbing details regarding Tim Hack and Kelly Drew murders that could assist the investigation. Investigators quickly concluded the case. However, this information implicated Edward Wayne Edwards, her own father, who had served in the Marines for some time prior, who has an extensive criminal background. April was drawn into exploring her father's strange life due to her curiosity, wondering why their family had to move around so frequently. Later, as an adult, she came across a news article regarding the unsolved murders of Tim Hack and Kelly Drew from Concord, Wisconsin, around this same period, and remembered having moved from Concord shortly thereafter. This triggered more pieces of puzzle coming together and prompting April to reach out to authorities immediately. Edward Wayne Edwards was born in Akron, Ohio in 1933 and suffered at the hands of nun-run orphanages due to early parent loss. Abuse from nuns led to restless and rebellious teenagehood that manifested itself at 18 when released from juvenile detention on condition that he join the U.S. Marines, but just months after signing on, he mysteriously vanished and had to be dishonorably discharged from their ranks. Edward's life quickly took an illegal path with numerous run-ins, with police for shoplifting and breaking and entering. By 1955, at 22, he had served time at a juvenile detention centre before escaping in Akron, Ohio, and robbing gas stations along his journey across states before spending much of his twenties and thirties as a fugitive, working odd jobs, committing crimes, while enjoying notoriety from doing so. Edward refused to use any aliases when engaging in these criminal activities because he wanted his crimes to become known and famous. At 27 years old, Edward was placed on the FBI's 10 Most Wanted list due to suspicion 
for two homicides in Portland, Oregon, though no proof was ever produced to implicate him directly in these murders, Edward already had an extensive criminal history that included robbery, vehicle theft, fraud, and arson. Also possessing characteristics associated with serial killers, such as starting fires easily and exerting extreme control. Edward was arrested by authorities and jailed at the United States Penitentiary in Leavenworth until 1967, when he was paroled due to good behavior and credits his personal development to a kind guard during this period of incarceration. After his parole expired, Edward married and became a motivational speaker. By 1972, at 39, he appeared on TV shows such as To Tell the Truth and What's My Line. Edward wrote his autobiography entitled The Metamorphosis of a Criminal, the true life story of Ed Edwards, chronicling his criminal lifestyle while reveling in its notoriety. At 44 years old, Edward committed his first confirmed murders, 21-year-old Billy Larko and 18-year-old Judith Straub in Sterling, Ohio. They had gone out on a date together but never returned. Their bodies were later found with gunshot wounds, but investigators couldn't tie Edward to it at that time, and so he remained free. Edward continued his criminal activities after release, and by 1982, at age 49, was back behind bars in Pennsylvania on arson charges. Proud of his past accomplishments, in 1993, Edward sent letters to 19 states demanding criminal history records of individuals, including Tony Provenzano, Charles Manson, and Jimmy Hoffa, that had come across his path during their time in prison. Edward committed his third confirmed murder at age 63 when he killed Danny Boy Edwards, his foster son, who had recently returned home after serving in the U.S. Army tricking him into nearby woods, shooting two bullets directly into his face before leaving him in a shallow grave that was eventually found by a hunter. Edward was a confirmed serial killer with an increasing body count who managed to avoid capture for years. People close to him, including his children, described him as troubled and abusive, leading them to distance themselves from him. Due to this behavior and criminal history, Edward became the prime suspect when DNA from Kelly's clothing matched Edward in 2009. Edward Wayne Edwards was found guilty in April 2010 for the 1980 murders of Tim Hack and Kelly Drew, receiving two concurrent life sentences. Although Edward initially requested the death penalty in Wisconsin, no such option existed at that time. Subsequently, in 2011, during a jailhouse interview, Edward confessed to another two murders from 1977, which took place. Billy Lacko and Judith Straub's deaths had also occurred. However, these convictions received life sentences due to being unconstitutional in those years. Edward finally got his wish when he admitted killing Danny Boy Edwards, his foster son, in 2011. This act resulted in the death penalty being applied. While Edward was charged with five murders, investigators believe there could have been up to 15 victims or even more involved. Edward Wayne Edwards died from natural causes on April 7, 2011, at 77 years old at Columbus, Ohio Corrections Medical Center, marking an end to a deadly crime spree which had claimed five lives and broken numerous families apart. Although Edward's arrest and conviction provided some closure, Kelly Walker's mother noted how it reopened old wounds, while Tim's father, David Hack, expressed relief and expressed thanks for DNA technology that identified Edward as her killer. April Baseo, Edward's daughter, who played an instrumental role in solving this cold case, now dedicates her time and efforts to providing other victims' families with closure through her podcast, The Clearing. Tim Hack 
and Kelly Drew had an optimistic future ahead of them that was tragically cut short when Edward Edwards killed them without provocation or personal malice. Rather, they were caught in Edward's crosshairs at an unfortunate time and place. Although Edward was ultimately arrested and sentenced, some believe he escaped full justice by dying of natural causes shortly before scheduled execution. At 4.45 p.m. on January 24, 1991 in East Harlem, New York, 13-year-old Pa Allah returned home after attending school and entered her apartment building's elevator, headed toward her 30-floor unit, yet somehow mysteriously vanished during that short journey. Three hours later at around 7.30 p.m., when sunset approached on that tragic day, a passerby discovered Pa's lifeless body half a mile away prompting questions regarding who might have been behind her disappearance and death in her community. Why did she vanish and why did her body not appear at home? Pa and her family resided in East Harlem, also known as El Barrio, situated at the heart of Manhattan in New York City. Renowned for its eclectic blend of traditions, art, and community spirit, East Harlem boasts an eclectic population with strong Hispanic-Latino roots that is evident by lively festivals, eateries, and colorful murals that adorn its streets, also home to Museum of the City of New York, which highlights New York history. Statistically, your chances of crime being committed are roughly one out of 22, which is where our story began. Pa Ala was born in Colombia to Caesar and Olga Alera. She had two older siblings named Julio and Alexander. In June 1990, Pa moved with her mother and siblings to East Harlem in New York City in search of better opportunities. They resided on the 30th floor of an apartment building at 420 East 111th Street. Pa stayed with Uncle Guo Opina. Her father, Caesar, continued working as a taxi driver in Colombia while saving money to join his family in New York one day. As soon as they arrived in New York, Pa started attending junior high school 99 and excelling academically, according to her sister, Alexandra. Her Uncle Guo described Pa as highly intelligent and mature for her age, with many plans in the future, she had many friends but few confidants compared with those at school where she resided, with only a handful of classmates as friends, her goal being becoming a lawyer. According to Alexandra, she thrived academically as her focus lay in English and mathematics studies during free time. Her mother described her as highly intelligent, as well as enjoying time spent learning these subjects outside her class, with classmates like classmates as peers. She only had few classmates as close friends due to studying English and mathematics during free periods at school where she attended. Her uncle Guo described Pa as highly intelligent for her age while thinking beyond her years, something her uncle Guo noted because Pa delighted in New York thanks to her love of English. He noted as well as being happy because of loving the English language itself, according to him. Uncle Guo went on describing Pa as highly intelligent with plans of her own while saying something along these lines when speaking. Of course being told the words spoken, of course being read aloud about plans of future plans. When asked by him in class on being told by him as told her uncle Guo, that Pa said something similar on an earlier time, saying it seemed that made him extremely impressed upon hearing, of course had not occurred when learning more of course than ever would. At first, everything seemed to be going as expected for Pa and her family, until an unfortunate event changed their lives forever. On January 24, 1991, 13-year-old Pa left school early and made her way home through familiar streets towards her apartment building, arriving around 4.45 p.m. via intercom call to her mother Olga, who answered and let her in by pressing the button that unlocked the lobby door. However, this would be Olga's final interaction with Pa before passing away in 1993. Paula entered the lobby and boarded an elevator, only to never arrive at their 30th floor apartment. When Pa hadn't come home after 10 minutes had passed, her brother and uncle became concerned. Something wasn't right, so they went searching for her. Upon arrival at the lobby, they found it completely vacant, searching desperately through their neighborhood, but no sign of Pa could be found anywhere. Three hours later, at approximately 7.30 p.m., while out walking his dog, he made a shocking discovery. He saw a lifeless figure lying near the East River, 
with items related to drugs strewn about such as vials, syringes, and lighters scattered nearby. This tragic discovery turned out to be Pa's slender body lying there after she had died, half a mile south from where she resided in an apartment building nearby. Detectives were met with a deeply saddening sight at Pia's scene. She had sustained a single stab wound in her center chest area, and further examination revealed a ligature wrapped around her neck with minimal blood pouring out from it. No evidence indicated who committed this act. All they found on Pa was a new kids on the block watch on her wrist and some chalk in her pocket. Pa's murder had an enormous impact not only on her immediate family, but also the surrounding neighborhood. Her mother, Olga, struggled to accept the loss of her daughter. At her school, both students and teachers were devastated. Teachers held meetings with affected classmates in order to provide support in helping them cope with grief. In addition, all pupils were advised against walking alone around that area for safety concerns. As a response to this incident, reporters were not permitted access to the school and principal and district officials declined to speak with them. Detectives were left with numerous unanswered questions. They went door to door in the 32 floor building, looking for witnesses who may have seen Pa in the area where her body would eventually be discovered. Unfortunately, they could not locate any. Furthermore, there was no indication as to who may have committed this tragedy, leaving it unknown whether Pei's body had been murdered at this spot filled with crack vials or elsewhere. Detectives were able to unearth several crucial details during their investigation. They learned that Pei'a would often stay after school hours for journalism workshops on Wednesdays and Thursdays. On the day she was killed, she was working on an article for him as a Valentine's Day gift. Furthermore, they determined that after leaving school around 4 p.m. after her workshop on First Avenue with another friend at around 4 u.m., both eventually dispersing at 106th Street, with Pia deciding she wanted to continue on to her family apartment building alone. Detectives learned through their investigations that another teenager named Aaron Wofford had entered the same elevator with Pa, yet claimed to have exited at only 19th floor while Pa continued ascending the tower. As a result, detectives changed their focus away from him as a suspect. An autopsy showed the full extent of Pa's ordeal. She had been violated, strangled, and stabbed three times near her heart, in addition to this mark being observed by medical examiner. Pa had shown great courage in resisting an assault, with her attacker using force to separate her legs, leaving bruises that mirrored their fingers on both thighs. Additionally, an examiner collected male hair from Pa's body. This evidence would be stored. On February 2, 1991, Paola Pa was laid to rest at St. Michael's Cemetery in East Elmhurst, Queens, four months after her tragic murder. Victim services was there for them when they relocated to Flushing, New York. Olga found solace through counseling at Families of Homicide Victims Program, operated by Victim Services. She and the rest of her family also held on to hope that Pa's case might yet bring justice. But as time progressed and justice seemed further away than ever, their journey for answers became more challenging than ever. Murder of a 13-year-old girl should have been an explosive news story anywhere and at any time, yet in New York of 1991, it largely went unnoticed. Between 1990 and 1992, New York City reported over 2,000 murders annually, with six bodies found daily across its five boroughs. Most occurred in impoverished, predominantly minority neighborhoods such as East Harlem, the South Bronx, or East New York and Brooklyn. Unfortunately, very few cases like these received significant media coverage. Instead, more upscale crimes involving white victims or wealthy victims located elsewhere than East Harlem or East New New York, Brooklyn. Without media or political pressure, Paya's case quickly became low priority and her murder remained unresolved and forgotten for much of the 1990s. By mid-1999, crime rates in New York City had decreased, but East Harlem housing projects saw an alarming trend develop involving several seemingly unrelated assaults and killings of young, attractive teenagers with large-scale DNA evidence connecting Iran to six out of seven cases. John Earn and Richard Plansky presented an impressive case against Iran during his fall 2000 trial, 
offering testimony and DNA evidence against him. Prosecution witnesses included two victims, as well as 13 prosecution witnesses overall, with Iran himself taking the stand first, as his defense witness, and then testifying over two days. During these sessions, he displayed emotions ranging from giggling like a schoolgirl to crying like an infant. Furthermore, he expressed his disdain at being prosecuted as well as anger towards being tried. His monologue, mostly uninterrupted by judge or attorneys, or his own attorneys alike, covered topics including pop culture, drugs, rap music, jail food issues, as well as reflections upon criminal justice systems. Iran presented an elaborate defense before his trial began in 2000 for his violent serial violence against young women. He maintained that police conspired against him as part of an elaborate cover-up scheme orchestrated by an organ-harvesting medical examiner he suspected was involved with harvesting and selling human organs, even asserting that his DNA had been altered through what he termed genetic shuffling. However, when the jury rendered its guilty verdict on December 16, 2000, they burst out into cheers and relief. As Iran was led past a crowd of grieving relatives, he directed an impolite curse at them. At his sentencing a month later in January 2001, family members of Iran's victims had the opportunity to address him directly. Olga Pa's mother addressed Iran directly and conveyed to him her wish that he understood their torment. Sleepless nights, loss of appetite, inability to walk or breathe properly. Lack of peace all while thinking of her daughter's suffering at her death. She expressed her pain at having brought her daughter here from Russia as they pursued American dreams together with her daughter Olga, spoke directly about her daughter, having brought her daughter here from Russia, as she spoke of her pain due to her having brought her daughter here from Russia as she talked about her family. Iran wept openly as he spoke at his sentencing hearing, offering his apology and saying that he felt responsible. At that moment, Joas Castro's male cousin became infuriated and attempted to leap over the barrier so as to attack Iran directly. Justice Joan Sedan then rendered her verdict. She issued three life sentences without parole for each murder, as well as four 400-year sentences for four counts of abuse against Iran, who was then sentenced at Clinton Correctional Facility, located in Dannemora, New York. Before Iran's sentencing, lawmakers in New York and many other states had passed laws mandating DNA testing for individuals arrested in relation to violent crimes. Since then, DNA testing has expanded to cover most felony arrests, spanning both violent and nonviolent offenses, and even some jurisdictions have instituted testing of individuals arrested on misdemeanor charges. Olga's anguish over Pa's sudden and senseless death remains fresh. She understands well the trauma caused by such sudden loss doesn't fade with time, especially if there are unanswered questions. We journey along Pa's heartbreaking tale as Iran commits crimes such as these heinous ones against society, leaving us to ask what drives such behavior and how can society identify and address such triggers. At 2 a.m. on October 31st, 1991, in Tyler, Texas, as the fall season settled in, it struck two. Everyone was asleep in their beds, except a small framed house on 29th Street at this peaceful moment, unaware that it would soon become the scene of horror for eight-year-old Chad Choice, who lay dreaming away when an intruder silently entered and abducted him out into the darkness of night. Initial considered as a runaway case due to lack of evidence, this case shifted into an investigator's nightmare when 48-hour window closed without Chad returning home. His captors may have found ways into his home without leaving any trace, taking him without trace, or ever returning for reunion with family and return, but the primary question still stands. Would Chad ever rejoin them and return home? Tyler, Texas, named after John Tyler, 10th President of the United States, is one of the largest cities in northeastern Texas and often known as Rose City due to its extensive rose production, cultivation, and processing history. Each October, it welcomes thousands of tourists. However, October 1991 brought unexpected sadness, as Chad Choice mysteriously vanished without trace 
souring an otherwise vibrant atmosphere. Ernest Chadwick Choice, affectionately known as Chad Choice, entered this world on April 26, 1983, in Texas. As one of four cherished children living within his household, Chad was highly loved by both family and particularly his mother, Karen Elaine Choice. Chad was known to make many friends easily and enjoyed spending quality time with them. Furthermore, his bond between siblings was evident and they often spent quality time together. Chad was known for his energetic and playful nature, as evidenced by his frequent visits to the playground. Chad had an older sister named Angela Choice, who recalls that Chad loved riding bikes, scaling trees, and engaging in sports. Details on any further siblings have yet to be made public. Chad was just eight years old, attending Mommy G. Griffin Elementary School when his life took an unexpected and tragic turn. Destiny often plays havoc, and unfortunately, Chad's destiny had already been determined. On October 31, 1991, my birthday, the daily routine of the Choice family was abruptly altered. While preparing to attend church services and drink coffee and read, as is often my custom on such days, without disturbing Chad or his siblings, Karen rose early and went to church without waking them. As planned. Just minutes into her service, however, she received a phone call from my daughter asking where Chad had gone, to which I replied no, instead leaving him at home as planned, and she asked why I hadn't brought him along, to which she replied she searched everywhere but couldn't find him anywhere. Finally, she told her church service that her time of peace had run out, leaving Chad at home on their own accord. Karen returned home and immediately began searching the neighborhood for Chad, seeking assistance from neighbors as well. However, their collective search efforts proved fruitless, as Chad appeared to have vanished without trace or even seeming to disappear entirely into thin air. At first, we thought he was just playing a trick on us and were wandering around looking up at trees to see if he was there, but something kept bothering me. Something kept feeling off about this whole situation. Now, it was the police's turn to investigate. Karen dialed 711 and reached Tyler Police Station. Sergeant Bill Ging quickly arrived at their house soon afterward for his initial inspection, where he looked for signs of forced entry, struggle, or pry marks on their door. None were detected during this initial assessment. Ging began to wonder whether Chad might have fled home. Her initial investigation suggested this possibility. No signs of forced entry or ransacking were apparent at any point during our inspection of this building. None of the indicators that might point towards crime scenes. Karen had long held on to the belief that her son had been abducted, and as the sun set and day turned to night, her anxiety turned into fear. Fear sets in as you wonder what's happening and who he may be with, knowing it's getting dark outside and that he should come home soon. Fear gripped her heart even further as 48 hours had gone by without any sign of him. Of course, this rule of thumb doesn't always hold true, but generally, if something hasn't been resolved within 48 hours of becoming apparent, it will likely become harder and harder to tackle later on. Angela Choice provided a key piece of information during her interview with Detective Coat. She claimed her house keys had gone missing the day prior, recalling placing them by the back door of Chad's residence. This revelation raised serious concerns, suggesting the possibility of kidnap, kidnap for hire, or something even more troubling. Two days after Chad disappeared, Greg Sterling, Chad's uncle, discovered a ransom note at his business. Although hopes that Chad was alive were diminishing by this point, so another demand seemed very odd to us, thus prompting our investigation to quickly focus on kidnapping scenarios instead of waiting around, hoping he might resurface alive. 
As the family tried to deliver their money at the Greyhound bus station as instructed, their kidnapper did not appear. Shortly afterwards, however, our hopes were revived, only for that momentary renewal to quickly fade and remain unfulfilled as time went on and they failed to appear. Chad's mother received an anonymous phone call revealing that Chad had vanished due to an ongoing drug debt with Paco, who owned three Colombian drug dealers located nearby, Paco Jr., Carlos and Greg Sterling, who collectively owed over $20,000. Although these discoveries provided insight into potential motivations behind Chad's disappearance, no definitive resolution had yet been found in his abduction case. On the one-year anniversary of Chad's disappearance, Karen Choice found a note on her car windshield asserting that Chad was still alive and demanding $66,000 to bring him home safely. This development reignited their investigation, giving hope to Karen Choice's family that their son might yet return safely. Unfortunately, however, that hope was dashed when his kidnapper failed to contact them once more, and the case became moribund again. Time was against them. Each passing year reduced Chad Choice to an open case, as his disappearance turned cold case. Four years later, in October 1995, an unexpected package arrived on their doorstep that seemed harmless enough. Upon opening it, however, something that would haunt Karen Choice forever became evident. There was an actual human skull inside. Part of me thought, this could be Chad, while another part said, nope, Chad is still here and alive. After providing Choice with DNA samples from her family members for analysis, the skull was sent back to the FBI for examination. DNA testing on samples taken from these relatives allowed for comparative purposes between the samples that came back. Although our DNA experts performed tests to identify Chad's skull, their efforts proved inconclusive. Therefore, the skull was shipped off to a university in Texas for further forensic anthropological analysis. Sometimes, especially in cases involving children where there are few medical or dental records available, we might use alternative techniques if we think we know who the remains represent. For instance, we might request photographs of that individual in an attempt to compare skeletal remains with them and see which matches best. Karen was devastated to learn of Chad's fate after forensic analysis confirmed his skull belonged to him. Detectives struggled to comprehend a person capable of not only perpetrating a crime, but continuing to terrorize victims' families for years afterwards. All Karen knew was that Chad would never see another day alive and was forced to pray for justice in his behalf. Whoever was responsible for placing such an unsettling act at our family's doorstep sparked something deep within me. An anger that I hadn't experienced before rose up within me. I needed to figure out who this person was before any more time could pass. As Chad Choice's case became harder and harder to solve, another story began unfolding at Smith County Jail in early 1996. Patrick Horn was scheduled to be sentenced in federal court for credit union robberies and carjacking, in addition to murdering fruit stand owner J.C. Lazor. Credit Union has been targeted for theft yet again. Two masked men with weapons enter, wearing masks, quickly rush into the tellers, catching them off guard, and demand money. It was our belief that likely these same two people had done this again, as two black males entered, wearing masks similar to previous incidents. As it became apparent that he would spend the remainder of his life behind bars or face potential execution, this man became central to Chad Choice's murder investigation when he mentioned his name during his time behind bars. Although this might have been part of a plea bargain agreement or just accidental discovery by police investigators, for them, this marked an important breakthrough in their investigations thus far. Horn 
was a resident in Chad Choice's neighborhood and close friend. During an interview regarding Chad's death, Horn informed investigators of who killed Chad. According to Horn's account, Chad was murdered by two Colombian drug dealers known by their street names Paco and Carlos. However, this claim would soon prove incorrect. The truth would soon emerge as this story became even more intricate. After Horn made his statement, he received in his jail cell a package containing Chad's leg bone for analysis. Jailers intercept this package addressed to Pat Horn and discover what appears to be a leg bone and a note threatening him if he divulges any information on Chad Choice. In such an event, they'd kill either himself or his family members. Horn told police that Paco and Carlos had sent the package, yet detectives felt like something was amiss with his story. After multiple questions from them, Horn insisted he had no more information other than Paco and Carlos being the culprits. Horn finally revealed something additional on May 31, 1996. He revealed to us that he had assisted Paco and Carlos with digging a grave for Chad at their instruction. He claimed to us that he too was victimized by this crime, as his only involvement was helping bury Chad. He added, Essentially, all I'm guilty of here is helping burying him. Any involvement beyond this was strictly incidental. Horn then revealed the exact location where Chad was interred, prompting police officers to accompany him directly to 401 Sunnyside in Tyler, Horn's personal backyard. Pat Horn was always known for exaggerating and exaggerating his involvement with these guys. Therefore, it fueled suspicion about whether or not he really was as involved as claimed. It opens the door for us to view him as potentially being involved far more than is indicated by what he tells us. Some agents and officers dug deep. After hitting a plastic bag, they continued digging deeper until they located bone fragments and clothing items. At 4.00 p.m. that same day, detectives began digging and discovered Chad's remains along with several. Caliber shell casings, this discovery marked a sudden shift in their investigation and all suspicion now rested with Patrick Horn. In June 1996, investigators immediately traveled to Athens in Texas and to a jail cell where an important piece of the puzzle would sit, one who would aid in conclusively solving this case. Athens police had taken advantage of an opportunity when we conducted a rigorous interview with him in custody and encouraged him to come forward with information. Eventually, he made his choice known. Keaton Horn was Patrick Horn's brother, who had recently been charged with violating probation terms and faced charges related to this infamous crime. With Keaton's statements as evidence, this case became concrete proof that Horn was indeed behind this misdeed. He admitted digging up and mailing Pat in jail some bones from her leg, with instructions to make the letter look like it came from Paco and Carlos as threats against Pat. Keaton demonstrated how Paco and Carlos hadn't reached out to Pat in order to threaten him. Rather, Pat himself reached out in an effort to appear threatened, which proved invaluable as an evidence break in this case. Horn's scheme to mislead investigators had finally come undone, and the solution to what had seemed an unsolvable case was finally in reach. One question still lingered, though. Why had Patrick Horn gone to such lengths, kidnapping Chad, refusing the ransom offer, and ultimately taking his life? Could you shed light on why someone could commit such an atrocious act and do you believe his mother will ever find peace again? Please share your views. We welcome hearing them all. On January 5, 1997, in her 23rd floor apartment in Bronx, New York City, USA, Rosemary Penta, an elderly school teacher aged 64, was enjoying her day off when tragedy struck on January 6th. 
one of Rosemary's neighbors noticed that Rosemary's lights had been on since midnight of January 5th. When she decided to check up on her, she came face to face with an unspeakable scene. Rosemary Pente's cold, lifeless body, lying untouched on her kitchen table, amid bloodied evidence from where she had come. Before calling the authorities, this neighbor collapsed to the floor, sobbing in horror at what could only be described as an act of extreme cruelty towards an elderly schoolteacher. Who could have committed such an anus crime against such a vulnerable individual? Today's case takes us to Bronx, one of New York City's boroughs. Co-op City in the Bronx is widely known, while other notable attractions in this borough include Yankee Stadium, Bronx Zoo, and New York City Botanical Gardens. Bronx offers affordable rent while being close to other high-end boroughs like Manhattan. However, the Bronx does have its share of risks. Only 14% of U.S. neighborhoods are safer than it with violent crime rate, 1 Wyoming 28, making it a highly dangerous location. Rosemary Pente, born July 28, 1932, and living alone at 140 Alla Place in Co-op City of the Bronx for 25 years before moving out and marrying at age 70, was brutally murdered on March 10, 1997 in her own apartment. Although little is known of her early life or relationships, it is certain she never married and mostly kept to herself for most of her adulthood. Although she led a quiet existence with only occasional outings with some neighbors in her building and school teaching, as her occupation, eventually though her life became monotonous until one fateful morning when Rosemary would emerge and would spend time talking with neighbors, whom she had become close over time and would come out and see people she knew from before, leaving on March 10, 1997 when she would step outside, one last time before leaving. On January 5, 1997 in the Bronx, it was an unusually cold day, so Rosemary decided to stay at home. Unfortunately, on Monday morning, January 6, 1997, she never arrived for school where she worked despite repeated phone calls, disruption of pin-drop silence in her apartment, no answer from Rosemary on her cell phone number and lights staying on all night in Rosemary's apartment. This raised concern from one of Rosemary's neighbors. When no response came back during the day, they decided at 6.15 p.m. to check up on Rosemary before leaving her own apartment and checked up on her in her apartment and found Rosemary and decided on her behalf. At 6.15 p.m. that evening came knocked on Rosemary's doorbell. Rosemary was home when they found her at 6.15 p.m., where they found her. Beginning when she arrived at Rosemary's apartment door, her neighbor felt unnerved by its proximity. As soon as she entered, however, her worst fears came true when she entered Rosemary's kitchen and saw Rosemary lying lifeless in a pool of blood, prompting shrieks of horror before quickly notifying the authorities, who soon after sent out Detective George Wood and Sergeant Curtis Oates from New York Police Department to inspect the crime scene. She called out for Rosemary but received no answer. While searching the apartment, she happened upon the kitchen area where Rosemary lay dead with multiple stab wounds on her body, still lodged deep into her back, proof that Rosemary's death must have been extremely agonizing for those present. Detective Wood remembered finding up to 25 stab wounds on Rosemary, including several in her neck area and one or two wounds to her head, with defensive wounds on her right hand suggesting she fought with someone before succumbing. Additionally, Rosemary's throat had been cut open, as evidenced by defensive bruises on her hands, suggesting resistance from Rosemary herself against their attacker. As the two engaged in their struggle outside Rosemary's apartment in the lobby, detectives discovered more evidence to back their theory. Blood stains on a wall near an elevator but no trace inside led them to search the staircase of their building. On the tenth floor, there was another trail of blood leading up a flight of stairs. This gave rise to their belief that at some point during their struggle, Rosemary had managed to wound her attacker during a struggle between the two parties. Detectives were convinced that the blood found smeared across an elevator wall and staircase, thirteen floors below Rosemary's apartment, belonged to her killer, giving detectives an idea of how he might have left. At first, they considered taking an elevator with blood-covered hands to press its button while leaving a trail on the wall, but maybe someone in it suspected them as it took too long, or someone saw through their messy appearance. Therefore, it seemed best for them to take the stairs instead and leave without being noticed. Exactly what happened. 
Bloodstains were strong evidence in Rosemary's murder case, yet didn't provide detectives with enough clues as to who might have committed it. Samples were collected and preserved for future testing and use. An autopsy later confirmed she had been stabbed 39 times. Eight wounds had occurred on her back alone. Furthermore, the knife found jammed into Rosemary was part of a kitchen set belonging to Rosemary herself, which led investigators to conclude her murder likely was not premeditated. They theorized that when Rosemary's attacker entered her apartment, initially they didn't intend to kill her, but when a struggle ensued, they did so anyway, and since several items were missing from Rosemary's place, it appeared like theft was their motive for doing so. Soon after Rosemary was murdered, her funeral was held at Granby Cemetery, Hartford County, Connecticut, USA, with family and friends present to pay their respects and lay her to rest. Unfortunately, months passed with no significant progress being made on this case despite strong evidence and theories to follow. Soon enough, though, New York police departments diverted their focus away from Rosemary and focused instead on another murder investigation. Her case went cold. More than two years later in May 1999, Detective Kevin Lawler from the NYPD Cold Cases Squad was assigned Rosemary's case and began reviewing its feel. While doing this research, he developed an idea for moving forward with it. He requested that any blood found at the crime scene be entered into CODIS to compare with any samples provided from known persons who have provided DNA samples. Detective Lawler sought assistance from Detective Mark Tans in re-examining blood samples found on the elevator wall and staircase and developed a DNA profile of Rosemary's killer that could be uploaded into CODIS, a nationwide database. They now had only to wait and hope for a match. Detective Lawler received word from the New York Police Crime Lab that blood recovered at Rosemary's crime scene had matched with that of Charles Jones, 28 years old at that time, through CODIS. Detective Lawler had long anticipated this phone call, and once he received it, he wasted no time investigating further into Jones's genetic link to make sure nothing had been overlooked. After performing a background check, he found some very startling information or learned of Jones's extensive criminal past, including a past robbery where he attacked his victim with a knife. At first, Jones wasn't suspected in Rosemary's killing. However, since he had been imprisoned after pleading guilty to robbery and assault charges committed against another co-op city resident on August 13, 1998, he was required to submit a DNA sample before being released on August 10, 2001. CODIS accepted Jones's DNA profile on August 20, 2001, and found it was consistent with that belonging to Rosemary's killer. At the time of Rosemary's murder, he lived nearby in Co-op City. Though this evidence strengthened Detective Lawler's case against Charles Jones, it still wasn't enough for her to charge him with Rosemary's murder. Although blood sample evidence placed him within Rosemary's apartment, where the killing had taken place, creating another challenge and prompting additional information and proof to put Jones behind bars. Theory states that the perpetrator of this homicide entered the building with intent to rob someone, looking for an opportunity to gain entry to someone's apartment. Since his blood had traveled some distance before arriving at that fifth floor hallway, they sought to understand how it got there. After unsuccessfully tracking him down through his parole officer and discovering an arrest warrant against him, their plan became to collect him up and talk with him directly. Unfortunately, when they arrived at Jones's apartment, they learned he wasn't there, but his family had covered for him. As soon as the detectives arrived at Jones's place, they were informed that he wasn't home at that moment, so they should come back later since there wasn't any solid evidence against him yet. Being extremely cautious about their case was imperative. One misstep could mean everything going downhill quickly. They wanted no member of Jones's family learning why they were visiting. Any news could give him another opportunity for escape. As a precautionary measure, they left a message for Jones, saying they wanted only to speak with him in regards to an outstanding traffic violation issued earlier. Two days later, Jones took the bite and came into the precinct to discuss his traffic violation. What followed next was key, as Jones would soon discover the real purpose for questioning. Detectives tried to create an inviting environment before confronting Jones directly. 
They offered lunch and soda as comfort measures before beginning interrogation after just 30 minutes of being friendly towards Jones. When asked by detectives if he had ever been at a 140 Alcott place, Jones initially denied it, but after hearing that his blood had been discovered there at the same time as the murder, he changed his story and claimed he used to deliver groceries and had cut himself on a shopping cart, thus possibly accounting for why his blood could be found there at that same moment as murder occurred. After being pressed further by detectives who asked how this could possibly explain itself, he eventually admitted being inside the building for a while prior to confessing. At first, Jones was still not fully cooperative, prompting detectives to question and interrogate him extensively. They even showed him images from the crime scene to try and induce a confession from him. Finally, after hours of interrogation, he finally confessed and proposed a plea bargain, offering an eight-year term in exchange for his confession. According to Jones's account of what transpired that night, Rosemary attacked him first and claimed self-defense as the motive. Detectives, however, had their doubts regarding Jones's story, as it seemed unlikely that such a physically powerful individual like Jones could defend themselves against such an elderly and much smaller woman like Rosemary Pacente. Jones was nonetheless arrested for robbery in Rosemary Pacente's death, charged with robbery but eventually plead guilty and received 19-year sentence in January 2002 for first-degree manslaughter conviction, pled guilty on January 11, 2002, to first-degree manslaughter charges related to Rosemary Pacente's death. Charles Jones's capture provided relief to many Bronx residents, particularly Rosemary's neighbors and friends. Her case had remained an unsolved mystery for nearly four years. Detectives used DNA technology to solve even more cold cases and bring justice for victims and their loved ones. Jones confessed differently than what had been Theory Zed raising questions as to whether he was withholding information from authorities. Jones was linked to another assault from 1998, prompting further questions as to whether there might be additional incidents where Jones went undetected. Cheryl Monique Taylor lived in Weldon, North Carolina in 2002. She had married John Osby from high school and they had one daughter named Justice who was seven years old at the time. On August 16, 2002, she woke up and realized Cheryl hadn't woken her in time for school bus stop, so Justice missed it and went back into Cheryl's bedroom, only to discover someone had taken Cheryl's life. Autopsy results revealed Justice had been strangled and likely assaulted, though details about any signs of forced entry or any possible evidence belonging to her perpetrator have never been made public. Although authorities conducted extensive investigations, no arrests were ever made, and the case went cold. Grieving partners John and Justice continued grieving together for 17 more years after her passing. John Osby went missing in December 2019 and was later found shot and covered with a blanket near Sycamore Street in Weldon. Investigators were unable to track down who shot him leaving his family with unanswered questions as to his whereabouts and the fate of Cheryl Taylor and John Osby. Sheriff Tyree Davis made a change when, in January 2023, he hired Detective Sergeant Samoji as Halifax County's dedicated cold case investigator. Detective Samoji began by studying John Osby's case before realizing Cheryl's life had been taken by someone years earlier. On July 21, 2023, 46-year-old Lewis Turner Jr. of Northampton County in North Carolina was arrested and charged with the voluntary manslaughter of Cheryl Taylor. It remains unknown as of yet whether or not Turner is also responsible for shooting John Osby. It has, however, come to light that Turner was known to Cheryl and her family in 2002 when he killed Cheryl, age 25 at the time he committed this act. It also has two criminal assault charges from when he was younger that resulted in probation being issued against him after his arrest. After being charged, he was held at Halifax County Jail under a $250,000 bond until further notice to appear before court hearing. Scott Hall, patrol captain for the Halifax County Sheriff's Office, explained why voluntary manslaughter charges had been leveled against this incident. 
This was not premeditated or malicious killing based on facts of this case or elements of its crime. Therefore, we charged accordingly. Sheriff Tyree Davis expressed his emotions by sharing that arresting a suspect for Cheryl's case brought tears of joy. I received the call that we were able to close one of our cold cases dating back over 20 years. No one knew, and until we informed her family, we couldn't say anything. When I found out the news, I was immediately overcome by emotion and tears began streaming down my cheeks. As a member of the state commission, I sat front row alongside other board members, trying my best to keep myself together by wiping away tears as they came. Once my sniffles began surfacing, though, I knew I needed to leave. Folks, I can assure you that these tears were tears of joy and excitement, not only for M. Taylor's family, but also her friends co-workers, schoolmates, and anyone she has crossed paths with before. Additionally, this beacon of hope serves as a beacon for other families that require closure as well. Justice Osby, Sheral's daughter, expressed her sentiments upon hearing of Turner's arrest by saying it was an amazing feeling and she never expected it. Justice extended her gratitude to those involved with helping bring Turner to justice by saying, Today is such a good day. Thank you all. Laura Kempton was 23 years old in 1981 when she lived in Portsmouth, New Hampshire. She attended Portsmouth Beauty School while also working at Macro Polo Gift Store and Karen's Ice Cream Parlor. Laura was known as an outgoing free spirit with an outsized personality who enjoyed socializing. Laura was last seen entering her Chapel Street apartment alone during the early morning hours of September 28, 1981. A police officer serving a court summons for unpaid parking tickets found Laura's body hours later. Upon making his way up to her residence and discovering a wooden panel piece had come loose from its hinge, creating an opening through which he could see Laura lying dead just inside her apartment. Autopsies showed that she died shortly after entering her apartment suffering massive trauma to the left side of her head, including skull fractures, lacerations, and contusions on her brain. Additionally, she had been assaulted, which allowed DNA evidence collection from her body as well as evidence from the crime scene itself. Investigators collected other evidentiary items at this location. Interviews of other residents at Laura's apartment complex yielded no useful information, and the case ultimately fizzled out. In 1986, investigators revealed they had interrogated Ronald Spock about Laura's death after learning he had also killed two other women in Boston, Massachusetts. Spock denied any involvement. Portsmouth police, however, were monitoring his case closely and reviewing any criminal allegations made against him. Only Ronald Spuick being from nearby NH gave a strong nudge in that direction. But this alone wasn't a strong link either. Spock had met his victims, Gina Quare and Kathleen McGuire, on two separate occasions in Boston and admitted later to ending their lives, though at first he claimed each time was self-defense based. Spock strangled both women before disposing of them in various locations, Gina in an abandoned railway car near South Boston and Kathleen near an information booth on Interstate 95 near Kittery, Maine. No real links between Laura's case and that of Dina Kittler were ever discovered but two Portsmouth detectives attending a conference in Florida at that time listened intently as an investigator from the Naval Investigative Service described its investigation into Dina Kittler. Dina was assaulted and strangled with rope at her Mayport, Florida home in December 1990 with signs of intense struggle being visible throughout her home as well as numerous hair clumps which had been cut off in the bathtub. Her naval officer husband had been deployed at the time of Dina's death. Portsmouth Police, Captain James Tucker could hardly believe what he heard. Dina's case bore a striking resemblance to Michelle Leon's murder in New Hampshire, and authorities had already arrested someone named John Brewer as being involved with Dina's case. John Brewer had been released shortly after his arrest due to insufficient physical evidence. However, as more details emerged concerning Michelle Leon's case in Dublin, New Hampshire, Brewer was brought back into custody and held without charge. Soon, Portsmouth investigators were able to establish a link between Brewer and Michelle Leond. James Tucker found in records 
an application John Brewer had filled out listing Gary Leond as his reference. This led directly back to Michelle herself. Police identified John Brewer as being involved in both cases based on DNA evidence taken from hairs collected during the Kittler case and DNA sample collected for Leon case. Based on this discovery, Brewer was charged and brought before court for both. News of Brewer's indictment spread quickly across the Granite State, prompting reports that she had links to three additional cases, two in Portsmouth and one in Florida. At the time of Laura Kempton's murder, Brewer was living in New Hampshire, but his actions seemed distinct from those of New Hampshire natives. Unfortunately, no correlations could ever be drawn. Perhaps this was just an inference based on his arrest being performed by detectives from Portsmouth. Rumors in Portsmouth of what happened to Laura swirled about two young men known as drug suppliers. These individuals had appeared on police logs with various offenses before becoming more violent in nature. Thomas Faragi led one such operation that escalated to far more brazen criminal activity. Faragi had been arrested several times for assaulting women before being indicted in March 1982 for fatally shooting 24-year-old Valerie Blair of Rye at Odeorn State Park after she had been hit with five shots fired from a 22 caliber pistol. She had found her in Odeorn State Park with five bullet wounds to her head and face from Faragi's operation. Thomas Faragi remained in prison for years while maintaining his innocence of Valerie Blair's murder, attributing it to one of his associates whom he believes must have stolen his gun. Later in an interview, Faragi suggested the same man may have killed Laura Kempton too. Faragi claimed she was one of their customers and one of their employees became upset after seeing Laura kiss someone while they were conducting business at her apartment, while they were there conducting transactions. In 1982, his girlfriend attended Portsmouth Beauty School together with Laura Kempton. Faragi's DNA was collected, but never charged further than this incident. Instead, police looked into and cleared one suspect from Faragi's accusations in both cases before moving on with their cases until far later cases against them was cleared as being responsible. On July 20, 2023, investigators finally released an important update. Laura's case had finally been solved after 42 years. Officials identified Ronnie James Lee as her perp. He resided and worked in Portsmouth. Rachel Harrington, Assistant Attorney General, stated there is no indication Lee knew Laura Kempton personally. Lee served in the U.S. Army from May 15, 1981 until May 15, 1982, before taking up employment at MBI Security at Liberty Mutual of Portsmouth from June 1981 through August 1982. Lee provided his mother's address on Rock Hill Avenue in Portsmouth when arrested by Portsmouth police for attempted theft on November 8, 1982. Lee was arrested and pleaded guilty to four residential and one commercial burglaries during 1983. Two of these burglaries he pled guilty to in 1987. Additionally, Lee was convicted on assault charges stemming from a burglary committed in Keene, New Hampshire that included assaulting a female resident in her own home during this incident. Lee was sentenced to prison from December 1987 until July 1990 and ultimately passed away after overdosing on February 9, 2005, at age 45. Attorney General officials stated that were Lee still alive, he would face first-degree charges of endangering Laura during an attempt at aggravated felonious assault and striking her with an object believed to be a wine bottle. Investigators used genetic genealogy techniques to identify Lee. Physical evidence at the scene in 1981 yielded male DNA profiles. Officials stated that starting in 2022, Portsmouth Police have collaborated with the New Hampshire State Police Forensic Laboratory, Maine State Police, Forensic Laboratory, Attorney General's Cold Case Unit and Genetic Genealogy Research Organization, Identifiers International, collaborated in conducting forensic genetic genealogy to identify Lee as the donor of DNA found at the crime scene. Since he no longer lives, this case can now be considered closed and solved. Laura's family issued the following statement upon hearing of its resolution. We wish to extend our sincerest appreciation and thanks for solving Laura's case through Portsmouth Police Department. Their dedication and hard work along with decades of personal commitment, 
has brought Laura to this point in time. Family would like to extend a sincere thank you to retired Captain John Parash and the Portsmouth Police Department Investigative Division team, members past and present, for all their hard work on Laura's case, which led to this important moment today. Their tireless dedication made this momentous event possible. Over the last 41 years, numerous other hands have touched Laura's file, and we express our profound thanks for all your contributions. At this time, however, the Kempton family requests privacy as we process this information. Thank you to all. Law enforcement officials have stated in the past that Laura's case and Tammy Little's death in Portsmouth in 1982 could possibly be linked. When asked by reporters about Tammy, Attorney General John Formella responded that it is still under investigation, while for Little he stated, Our hope is that what we announce today may provide additional insight into that investigation. Tammy Little had not been heard from since Sunday evening, after friends dropped her off from a night out at Portsmouth Beauty School. Friends had seen her arriving home after the event, after an overnight party on Saturday evening, and dropping her off in her Maplewood Avenue apartment, after spending Saturday night out together. No one knew why Tammy would remain unreachable for so long. When something appeared wrong, it became evident. Tammy's mother decided to check in on her daughter at Maplewood Avenue apartment and discovered an unspeakably traumatizing sight. Her lifeless body in their apartment, where they had been severely beaten on by someone. Authorities quickly responded when Tammy's mother called them about the case at 315 Maplewood Avenue. Investigators collected physical evidence from within her home, as well as interviewing nearby neighbors before conducting an autopsy the following day which revealed she had died of massive head injuries caused by being viciously struck on the head with something. As Tammy's family and friends mourned her tragic death, many residents in her city found themselves living under an aura of unease. Many residents' worst fears had seemingly come true, and an air of uncertainty filled the neighborhood. Again it had happened. Another girl, another crime, and no arrests made. Laura and Tammy share much more in common than just how their lives ended. Tammy and Laura lived alone in ground-level apartments in Portsmouth and attended the Portsmouth Beauty School. Both women attended modeling agencies to try to secure work. Both women were outgoing, frequented some of the same bars downtown, and tragically both died on an autumn weekend day only one mile apart from one another. DNA will soon provide answers as to whether Ronnie James Lee also played a part in taking Tammy Little's life. Seventeen-year-old Gladys Ariano lived in Boyle Heights, Los Angeles, in 1996. She was beautiful, intelligent, and had big dreams for her life. Gladys was last seen on January 28, 1996, leaving her home. When she failed to return home later in the day, she was reported missing by her family. Two days later, her body was found off a main road in a ravine in Topanga Canyon. She had been assaulted and strangled. Forensic evidence was collected from her body, and a DNA profile of the unknown offender was uploaded to state and federal DNA databases. However, a match could not be found. An extensive investigation was conducted by the investigators at the time, but it led nowhere, and the case went cold. That was until 2019 when Los Angeles police arrested a man by the name of Jose Luis Garcia for domestic assault. During the booking process, DNA swabs were taken from Garcia and processed. Investigators then realized that his DNA matched the DNA that was taken from Gladys's body in 1996. The crime took place when he was just 19 years old. They obtained a second DNA swab from him. The Los Angeles Crime Lab was then able to confirm that Garcia's genetic profile matched the unidentified sample taken from Gladys's body in 1996. 43-year-old Jose Luis Garcia was arrested by U.S. Marshals on September 29, 2019, in Dallas, Texas. He was extradited on October 14 to Los Angeles County, where he was held on a $1 million bail. Detective Hugo Rega said, this case is typical of the type of cases that unsolved detectives are faced with on a daily basis. We are gratified that we were successful in bringing this tragic case to a close. 
Rega confirmed that investigators were looking into the possibility that Garcia was involved in other crimes as well. Gladys's niece and goddaughter Samantha Marino spoke movingly of the need to remember her godmother, as well as all other women who were victims of violence. Recognizing her life is important. Beautiful Latina souls from Boyle Heights should never be forgotten, Moreno said. Acts of violence against women should never be forgotten. Samantha Moreno thanked the detectives who never lost sight of finding justice. Gladys Ariano's case was worked on by retired detectives Joe Purcell and Sean McCarthy, who both work part-time on the Sheriff's Department's Unsolved Case Unit. Thank you for not giving up on our Gladys, who was a loving daughter, sister, aunt, and godmother. Gladys was only 17 when her life was taken. She had a beautiful soul. She was beautiful, intelligent, gorgeous, and she had a radiant smile. She had such big dreams for her life. My grandparents would have been so proud of her, Moreno said. She was grateful Garcia was off the streets after nearly a quarter century. We want nothing more than for him to pay for his brutal crime, she said. We recognize that this will not bring Gladys back, but we are relieved to know that there will be justice for Gladys. This is a victory that we acknowledge in her honor, and we look forward to more victories. Jose Luis Garcia was found guilty of all the charges against him on July 18, 2023. It was a day the loved ones of Gladys Ariano had been waiting decades for. It is never enough for having taken the life of such a beautiful soul, said Elizabeth Ariano of her sister Gladys. Gladys Ariano's sister and best friend told the court that what Garcia did nearly destroyed them, as they wondered for more than 25 years what happened to her. It was tough, but it felt really good to finally get it off your chest and actually see him and release it and have some kind of comfort, said Vanessa Ariano. Gladys Ariano's younger sister, Janet Ramirez, said the plea deal gives her some comfort, but it is not enough. Nineteen years is never enough but I have comfort knowing now she can rest and that the perpetrator is going to be behind bars because for 25 years, I've lived with the guilt of not knowing what I could have done differently, Ramirez said. Jose Garcia was sentenced on August 15, 2023 to 18 years and eight months in prison for taking Gladys's life. Garcia pleaded no contest to voluntary manslaughter, kidnapping, and domestic assault according to the district attorney's office. He waived his credit for the just over 1,000 days he has spent in jail since his 2020 arrest. Retired Sheriff's Detective Joe Purcell handled the cold case investigation. The fact is that we can give justice to people and to society. It is really important not to let these cases go unresolved. We need to have people pay the debt they owe to society, he said. Crystal Rogers lived in Bardstown, Kentucky, with her partner Brooks and two-year-old son Eli, as well as four additional children she had from her 2015 marriage, and that ended shortly before the incident occurred. Bardstown is widely known as the bourbon capital worldwide, but with only 14,000 residents. Crystal was Tommy Ballard and Sher Ballard's youngest child. By all accounts, they were extremely close. Crystal worked two jobs to ensure her children's well-being was taken care of properly. Crystal, Eli, and Brooks visited his parents' two on 45-acre farm over 4th of July weekend 2015. Crystal dropped two children off with her ex-husband before leaving two with babysitters on July 4, 2015. Brooks awakened early with Eli beside him but found no trace of Crystal. Even her car wasn't in the driveway. However, Brooks didn't report this mysterious disappearance at first, since he wasn't concerned she might just have gone out with friends late into the night before returning later than expected in the morning. Apparently, though, as it often did happen from time zone differences or simply not making their return time. After numerous unsuccessful attempts to reach her on July 3rd, Crystal's family became extremely worried. Her mother, Sherry Ballard, reported her missing two days later on July 5th. The newspaper reported that she told Brooks she would take her to the police to report her as missing, and he agreed that it was the appropriate thing to do. Tommy Ballard found her maroon 2007 Chevrolet Impala 
with a flat tire near mile marker 14 of the Bluegrass Parkway on 5 July. Keys still inside its ignition, as well as her purse and cell phone had been left inside. Crystal's car was found with its driver's seat shifted out of its usual place, and her family quickly realized she wasn't driving alone. Unfortunately, finding her vehicle did not yield any useful leads on where to look for her. Eventually, her family announced a 25,000 reward for information leading to her abduction. Cher Ballard of her family offered with tears in his eyes, We love her, and hope we can find her, with tears running down his cheeks, adding, But until then, we just hope she can be found. Community involvement was immense as strangers and relatives from far and wide set out searching every inch of Nelson County and its surroundings for victims. Sammy Johnson of the Ballard family stated, We have searched every inch of water, home, farm, and well, as well as wells and sinkholes where she may be. According to reports, they held strong suspicions against Brooks for being involved with Crystal's disappearance. Crystal's sister claimed in an interview that Brooks never offered to search or help the family of Crystal, or assist with search efforts in any capacity. Brooks admitted their relationship was tenuous, but strongly denied any responsibility in her disappearance, stating, I am totally innocent of this. In spite of criticisms from Crystal's family, he claimed he was helping out in some form with search efforts in the background. After Crystal's vehicle was located on July 8th, Brooks was brought in for investigation by Nelson County Sheriff's Office and told they he and Crystal were on a date the evening she last seen. Brooks stated they fed cows, went for a late night walk, and returned home only to sleep together in bed when Crystal had already been using her smartphone to access social media apps on her device. His narrative did not add up or make sense in other aspects. At nightfall, it had rained heavily, and it made little sense for Brooks and Crystal to walk in a field together at that same time. Nelson County Detective John Snow was conducting the investigation, noting the disparities in their narrative, yet Brooks insisted he had no part in her disappearance. John Snow questioned Brooks in the taped interview regarding an early morning call with an unknown number. The night Crystal disappeared. Brooks, Crystal, and the children had been traveling home in their car at that time when this call came through. Detective Snow questioned Brooks as to who had called, and Brooks reluctantly revealed the number belonged to Steve Lawson, whom Brooks revealed was one of Steve Lawson's employees. Brooks admitted to Detective Snow that he could not recall why Steve had called so long ago, prompting her to have Brooks contact Steve directly in the interrogation area. Steve claimed he called Brooks about rental property. Brooks told him to speak to Katie, who would follow up with Steve following their conversation. But Brooks immediately corrected him by informing him it should have been Crystal instead. Detective Snow questioned Brooks on why he told Steve Lawson that Crystal would call back later when she was sitting right beside him in his vehicle at that moment. Brooks offered as an explanation that he did not want to disturb Crystal during her work-related issues and not pester her with unnecessary phone calls or messages. Nick Hal, Brooks's brother and a Bardstown police officer, was the one who first contacted Brooks via his cell phone when aware that he was being interrogated by detectives. Nick advised his sibling not to contact police. Nick had been summoned by officials from his city the previous evening to testify before an unidentified grand jury. This led police to suspect his possible involvement with Crystal's death. At this stage, Nick could no longer cooperate with the sheriff's office. However, after being interrogated by Kentucky State Police, he agreed to undergo polygraph examinations. After being approached with the FBI, Nick finally took an exam for polygraphs on 20th of July. When confronted by what the examiner found from his test results, Bardstown Police Chief McCubbin raised grave concern with him over what had transpired from them and claimed Nick had lied during their examination, upon which Nick responded by declaring, I don't care what your computer results say about me being considered an untrustworthy liar, and I don't appreciate being called one by others. Tommy and Sherry Ballard, Crystal's parents, started seeking custody of two-year-old Ely, the child she shared with Brooks. On August 8, 2015, at court hearing, they finally saw Brooks again after Crystal disappeared. 
Tommy said afterward. During eye contact between me and him, there was eye contact between us both. My grandchild seemed content that day compared with any others around him, and thus the decision was made at that time that Eli would stay with Brooks. Three months after Crystal was reported missing, authorities from Nelson County Sheriff's Office declared her deceased on 16 October 2015 at their press conference. Nick Hal was fired from Bardstown Police Department due to interfering with their investigation of Crystal's disappearance. Police accuse him of warning his brother about an interview and instructing them not to talk with the detectives. Nick later informed Kentucky State Police that he only spoke with his brother to inform them they may be trying to scare him and that he needed to take measures in order to safeguard himself. Kentucky State Police officially charged Brooks as an individual involved with Crystal's disappearance this October, with eight documents that led them to believe he was their main suspect in direction. Hal denied these accusations against him. My family's name has been ruined over an issue that does not pertain to me and requires lots of energy and effort. Driving past without appearing as though I am being dishonest is becoming tiresome and unreasonable, since there is no reason for an attorney, since I am innocent. For me, this seems ridiculous. For myself, this situation seems ridiculous. Police released video footage of both Hal brothers' interviews. Additionally, in December 2015, the local paper announced that police had arrested Danny Singleton on 38 counts of false swearing for lying under oath before an unnamed grand jury investigating Crystal's disappearance investigation. Singleton is close associate and long-term employee of Brooks. After being held for six months, he pled guilty and was released. An investigator from a private firm discovered a white Buick to be key evidence after discovering it was in the garage at Hal Farm on the night Crystal disappeared. Evidence showed Anna Whitesides owned a white Buick that she sold shortly after Crystal vanished. Police issued a subpoena requiring the 82-year-old woman to appear before a grand juror for questioning in June 2016. Subpoenaed for use as evidence disposal, the car was cleaned out and offered for sale to prevent evidence being discovered. Anna Whitesides invoked her Fifth Amendment rights and refused to testify before an impartial jury for fear that giving testimony would incriminate herself further. Whiteside's lawyer Jason Floyd informed the court, In a high-profile, fast investigation case such as this one, many things could come together to trap an elderly woman like Whiteside's who is 82 years old, according to Mr. Floyd. Anna Whiteside's confession and vehicle details were enough for police. A judge decided to keep any legal proceedings regarding Whiteside's confidential, although Crystal has never been found or charged with her disappearance. Crystal was missing for approximately one year prior to August 2016, when police conducted a more intensive search using 14 dead dog teams across 300 acres in search of Hal Family Farm and Crystal. John Snow reported, There may have been an incident involving Crystal on Hal Farm, Hal Farm. Anna Whiteside's house, as well as those of Nick Hal, his brother and Rosemary Hal, were examined in order to uncover evidence such as DNA or human remains. John Snow stated afterwards, I am optimistic. I believe we are heading in the correct direction, although this journey has been long, but I feel we're getting closer. Brooks's then lover, Crystal Morin, was arrested after she was caught ripping down signs supporting Crystal Rogers' case and family in Bardstown. Following Crystal Rogers' disappearance and her family's dispersal from Bardstown, signs supporting them could be found all around town and were stolen by Crystal Morin. Sherry Ballard expressed her opinion. Crystal could have apologized by simply saying, I apologize for my actions, but instead tried to defend herself with false claims of guilt instead of apologize. Instead, she attempted to defend herself with accusations. Tommy Ballard searched daily for Crystal and even initiated an independent investigation on her behalf. Thirteen months after Crystal disappeared on November 19, 2017, her devoted father prepared to embark on a hunting excursion at Ed Brent Lake property with their 12-year-old grandchild and attendant. Tommy Ballard was attacked by an individual and shot in the chest. Unfortunately, he did not survive his injuries and passed away at 54.
Nelson County Coroner's Office has reported that Crystal's father was shot once before the bullet exited through his back. Sure Ballard believed he had been shot while close to finding their daughter, whom had gone missing. According to newspaper accounts, his death may have been related to searching for their missing child. Cher Ballard had long been obsessed with finding his wife Crystal and was the prime figure in their search efforts. He believes that he was targeted, having seen himself being watched over for weeks prior to being shot dead. Anna Whiteside's home was searched after she was shot dead, yet nothing was discovered there. Commissar Rick Sanders hired two retired troopers to investigate a series of high-profile and unsolved cases in Bardstown and surrounding areas, including her murder. Crystal Ballard, as well as her dad. Tommy Ballard had died recently, and this caused them to go in search of any information regarding it. At that time, Crystal's mother was trying to gain custody over Eli Crystal's youngest son, as Brooks was sole guardian of him. Nelson Circuit Judge Stephen Hayden issued his final ruling regarding this custody dispute and found there to be clear and convincing evidence of strong hostility between Brooks and members of the Ballard family, such as Brooks' mother, and that could cause psychological harm for their child. Cher Ballard filed a petition with her late husband's estate seeking grandparent visitation rights shortly after Crystal went missing, telling local papers, I have done all that the court requires of me yet still cannot visit my grandson. My daughter claims the boy as her own, and I refuse to acknowledge he's not my child, though they would like for me to remove him from her life, something which I'm no longer willing to do, according to this decision. Following that ruling, numerous custody hearings were held at trial court level. Ramon Pina was elected sheriff of Nelson County following former sheriff Ed Mattingly's departure, serving as primary investigators in Crystal's disappearance case. Ramon stated his resolve in solving it and told reporters they have an idea what occurred with Crystal, and their job is to find enough details and evidence to make an arrest possible. Over time, Crystal's family never stopped fighting for justice in her disappearance, broadcasting it via True Creamy podcasts and TV series. Case of Mother of Five Crystal Rogers has inspired podcasts, documentaries, and many reports. The Disappearance Crystal Rogers is a crime-themed series. Bourbon Town Mystery, produced with help from HLN Investigations team, presents its third season. This docu-series delves deeply into the mysterious circumstances of Crystal Rogers' disappearance. Various crime dramas have focused upon this case's since her disappearance. Crystal's family erected posters throughout Bardstone and nearby communities in search of any details surrounding her disappearance, which had left law enforcement officials puzzled, her family infuriated, and Bardstown struggling with an unexplained tragedy for years. John Snow, the detective in charge of Crystal's case, retired after one final interview where an air reporter asked whether her body had ever been found. Up on hearing that response, he answered in the affirmative. Nelson County Sheriff Chief Deputy Joe Gillang would shortly thereafter become her principal detective within months. In 2019, Crystal's family held a memorial service and stated, Every day is difficult, despite everyone telling her it will get easier. A vigil for prayer was held not only to remember Crystal, but also in hopes of finding answers about her whereabouts. Her favorite color pink was prevalent throughout including pink t-shirts and ribbons as well as a balloon released at the close of the evening by Cher Ballard, who said it was encouraging seeing people continue showing support throughout these many years. She plans on taking Crystal home, regardless of the length. Before Crystal disappeared, her household was extremely close. Though it has been difficult for the children, I do not want them to give up hope as God works miracles. And there's always hope. With regard to clues in the case, Sure expressed confidence in the police to find Crystal. Court records reveal a second hearing for Crystal Ballard's youngest child took place on September 10, 2020, and new evidence was presented during this hearing. On October 5, 2020, Judge Hayden denied temporary visitation rights to Sure Ballard. Sure Ballard. Hayden determined that the child had an intimate relationship with Brooks, whom the judge described as an attentive father figure. Brooks testified in court that their son spends all of his time with his mother, him, and Crystal Mopin, as his only three immediate family members. 
Judge Hayden stated that while they believe Sher Ballard's testimony was honest and they didn't intentionally violate the law, the court is uncertain that they can uphold their vows because of their strong dislike for Brooks. Judge Hayden further commented, stating, It would be fair to suggest there exists an irreparable gap between the parties that may never be closed. July 2020 marked five years since Crystal had last been seen at Bardstown. Her disappearance caused widespread attention, but still no answers or evidence had surfaced of where she might have gone. For the first time ever, Kylie, one of Crystal's five children, sat down with an radio station and spoke openly about life without her mother. Kylie stated, waking up every morning not being able to say, hey mom, what are we going to do today? Like normal things, small details matter more than big things, millions that she missed out on all these years now. Kylie was only 14 when her mom went missing, yet still recalls texting and calling to reach her, but with no response or way to contact her. Graduations became particularly difficult due to this experience. As I graduated high school, it was amazing to see all the children and their mothers so happy for each other. Although my mom felt proud and I knew she wanted me there physically too, it was difficult for her to stand aside while looking around at other moms. Kylie admitted that, following such events, she often uses journals and her mother to relay details from that day to her mother and share with her. What happened? Over time, her family raised funds in an attempt to gather evidence that could lead to arrest for Crystal and Tommy Ballard trials. When Kylie was 19 years old, there was even an impressive $100,000 reward. As long as justice does not arrive for Crystal's death, her family made one simple request. Keep praying and do not allow hope to slip away. Your presence brings us hope and helps us keep pushing forward. Federal authorities made their intention known in August to assume control of the investigation into Crystal Hall's disappearance, known and issued search warrants at several homes belonging to her family. In June and July 2017, the FBI assumed the roles of Kentucky State Police and Nelson County Sheriff's Office as principal investigators of this investigation, with over 150 agents serving search warrants on three properties owned by Hall and his family members. An FBI Louisville spokesperson previously noted that three locations had been thoroughly explored over time, particularly Woodland Springs subdivision, where Brooks Hall constructed several homes shortly after Crystal vanished. Federal agents working together with Nelson County Highway Department personnel surveyed an area suitable for driveway installation. Once determined, concrete pieces, as well as other items from outside an apartment building, were stored away securely before concealing them from view. Photographers working for the local newspaper were able to witness police using a jackhammer to clear away driveways of houses in an estate subdivision. Officers allowed only certain cars into the subdivision during this investigation and reporters were barred. Crystal's mother noted, I don't believe they would randomly choose driveways without some justification. My daughter had been missing for some time while Hall was building in this area. On August 27, 2021, the FBI made public their investigations in this area and announced that an object of interest had been discovered from concrete in one of the homes they searched recently. Furthermore, they mentioned knowing of residents in Bardstown who may have knowledge about this case, calling upon them to come forward if possible. Some properties owned by Brooks Hall while another belonged to his brother, Nick Hall. On September 7, 2021, the FBI made public their announcement that their search in Bardstown had concluded and several items of interest had been sent off to a laboratory located in Virginia for testing. Sherry spoke to a local newspaper with hopes that her family can learn the truth of what had occurred with their daughter. She told the paper, I believe that this is where investigation should take place as they can give me information here. Sherry indicated her desire to know what occurred with her daughter but acknowledged it would be difficult. She hopes she can handle being confronted with their announcement. Having been waiting six years, closure has long been needed, as do the children who want answers about what they may have experienced and been told about by Sherry herself and others involved. This will be very challenging on us. To date, the FBI has provided no further details about items of interest submitted for testing by Virginia Laboratories.
In October 2021, spokesperson Katie Anderson informed a local newspaper that no new updates had been received regarding the ongoing Crystal Rogers investigation. In 2021, the FBI offered a reward of $25,000 to any individual or persons, providing information leading to the identification, arrest, and conviction of anyone responsible for Crystal's disappearance. Crystal's case remains unsolved due to being passed around between various agencies. Sherry Ballard disclosed during an interview in 2022 that her daughter's children at the time of Crystal's death were aged 21, 19, 17, and 9. Crystal was an extraordinary girl. We miss her dearly. She was an incredible daughter, always kind and helpful to all she encountered, even offering to stay with a friend who couldn't leave due to illness, because we were a close family unit, and I would do nothing different from any other mother for my daughter's well-being. Crystal's mother expressed hope for some sort of closure as well. She recalls vividly the day she visited the station of police to report Crystal as missing, and was told it could take up to one year before any answers come through. Ballard expressed this shock with tears rolling down his cheeks. In October 2022, the FBI conducted another raid at Brooks Farm for five days and announced they would not share what information was gathered during their investigations. Brooks Hall owned this property along with her mother. Brooks Hall Sr. Daniel Cameron appointed a special prosecutor in January 2023 to investigate Crystal and her father's murder cases. On July 3, 2023, eight years after Crystal disappeared, her agency announced substantial progress had been made toward reaching a proper conclusion of this case and promised, we will follow every lead possible until those responsible for her disappearance are held accountable. On September 7, 2023, the investigation took a dramatic new turn when reports surfaced of Joseph Lawson, 32 years old and currently accused, being accused of participating in the probe. Joseph Lawson had never been officially identified as a suspect or had any connection to Crystal's case before his arrest marked an important shift in recent years. While not being charged with her murder, Joseph is now facing accusations of conspiracist activities against him. Authorities suspect He's involved with some aspect of planning or carrying out actions, which led to Crystal's presumed death, as no body had yet been located. Investigators believed Lawson may have hidden, destroyed, removed, or altered evidence so as to derail proceedings against her. Lawson was charged with conspiracy on July 24th, as well as tampering evidence in June, but neither case could be resolved due to his hospitalization and Zoom, while being brought before Nelson Circuit Court for trial. Lawson appeared before Nelson Circuit Court, and his indictment was read aloud before the judge accepted his plea of not guilty for both counts, with $50,000 set as bond on one and $500,000 on another, conspiracy count and involvement in tampering with physical evidence respectively. Although Crystal wasn't specifically mentioned in the indictment, the charge outlined that on July 3, 2015 and or 4, 2015, defendant committed the criminal conspiracy with the intent to take away life by signing contracts to assist any one or more of those involved in planning, executing, soliciting, or attempting to commit the offense when either themselves or one of their co-conspirators intentionally committed suicide. Kevin Coleman, Lawson's attorney, confirmed the charges related to Crystal's case but refused to provide further details. Lawson is scheduled to appear before a court for an initial pre-trial conference on the 26th of October, 2023. Lawson had an extensive criminal history, which included methamphetamine possession, burglary, trespassing, and assault charges. Investigators were not certain as to whether Steve Lawson, who called Brooks Hall the night Crystal disappeared, was related to Joseph Lawson. However, an exhaustive lookup of public records published shed by newspapers revealed the following information that Steve Lawson in Bardstown, Kentucky is related to Joseph and that they share a common birthday. Till Ballard, Crystal's grandpa, confirmed to the local paper that Lawson has been arrested by FBI. Mr. Ballard Sr. believed both murders may be linked and was hopeful that Lawson's arrest in Crystal's case might result in some changes regarding Tommy's shooting. Someone had to do something, 
Someone needed to know about Tommy, and someone needed to intervene against Tommy. Till believed Lawson may know about both murderers, although federal law prevented his exact place of residence being disclosed at this time. Lawson remains in federal custody, however due to federal requirements, this information won't be disclosed due to federal requirements regarding federal jurisdiction and legal obligations regarding reporting requirements on federal legal requirements regarding federal requirements for legal matters regarding reporting requirements when reporting requirements arises regarding lawful authorities when reporting criminal activities are ongoing against them and not disclosing details regarding either victim relatives who can report suspected killers that could make arrest warranted charges brought against Tommy's shooters as he intended stop looking something someone needed to change in Tommy's shooting of Tommy was made public resulting in some kind of change by arresting someone else that someone knew about Tommy was shooting of Tommy being given custody however his exact whereabouts won't be revealed due to federal regulations requirements being revealed at all times during this case Lawson is being held as per federal regulations regarding his exact place of residence being kept confidentially Brooks Hall was arrested and charged with the murder of Crystal Rogers on September 27, 2023. Bail has been set at $10 million cash, and he's not allowed to communicate with Rogers' family. A statement issued by the FBI office stated their agent's dedication in finding those accountable in the case of Crystal Rogers. Today is an important step toward fulfilling that commitment. Hall was in court on October 5th, and will likely face trial later that month. Another suspect could also be detained as well. Cher Ballard wrote this when the arrest was made, to say that today was overwhelming is overstatement. She said, I've endured eight long agonizing years to get here. To witness Brooks Hall put in handcuffs was an experience that was completely surreal to me. I've always believed that he was guilty, but now everyone knows that. I'm not sure of the feelings I experienced today. I'm sure that's all you can imagine. I would like to say thank for the FBI. God sent me an angel when they showed up at my house. I am personally familiar with the effort that a particular agent put into this case as well as the long and exhausting hours he worked to make this happen. He never once forgot how I had been a mom as well as a wife, experiencing the most difficult time spouses and mothers can endure. I can't even imagine the impact it caused on him. This event would never have been possible without his help. Thank you for his team for all the help they provided in his office. His co-workers worked extremely difficult. I would like be grateful to them for watching out for myself and our family. Thanks also for my family and friends at the Nelson County Sheriff's Office for helping in ensuring that this event took place. Thanks to both the attorney for prosecution and office. Kevin Coleman, Lawson's attorney, confirmed the charges related to Crystal's case but refused to provide further details. Lawson is scheduled to appear before a court for an initial pre-trial conference on the 26th of October, 2023. Lawson had an extensive criminal history, which included methamphetamine possession, burglary, trespassing, and assault charges. Investigators were not certain as to whether Steve Lawson who called Brooks Hall the night Crystal disappeared, was related to Joseph Lawson. However, an exhaustive lookup of public records published shed by newspapers revealed the following information, that Steve Lawson in Bardstown, Kentucky is related to Joseph and that they share a common birthday. Till Ballard, Crystal's grandpa, confirmed to the local paper that Lawson has been arrested by FBI. Mr. Ballard Sr. believed both murders may be linked and was hopeful that Lawson's arrest in Crystal's case might result in some changes regarding Tommy's shooting. Someone had to do something. Someone needed to know about Tommy, and someone needed to intervene against Tommy. Till believed Lawson may know about both murderers, although federal law prevented his exact place of residence being disclosed at this time. Lawson remains in federal custody. However, due to federal requirements, this information won't be disclosed due to federal requirements regarding federal jurisdiction and legal obligations regarding reporting requirements on federal legal requirements regarding federal requirements for legal matters regarding reporting requirements when reporting requirements arises 
regarding lawful authorities when reporting criminal activities are ongoing against them and not disclosing details regarding either victim relatives who can report suspected killers that could make arrest, warranted charges brought against Tommy's shooters as he intended stop looking, something someone needed to change in Tommy's shooting of Tommy was made public resulting in some kind of change by arresting someone else that someone knew about Tommy was shooting. Of Tommy being given custody, however, his exact whereabouts won't be revealed due to federal regulations requirements being revealed at all times during this case. Lawson is being held as per federal regulations regarding his exact place of residence being kept confidentially. Brooks Hall was arrested and charged with the murder of Crystal Rogers on September 27, 2023. Bail has been set at $10 million cash, and he's not allowed to communicate with Rogers' family. A statement issued by the FBI office stated their agent's dedication in finding those accountable in the case of Crystal Rogers. Today is an important step toward fulfilling that commitment. Hall was in court on October 5th, and will likely face trial later that month. Another suspect could also be detained as well. Cher Ballard wrote this when the arrest was made, to say that today was overwhelming is overstatement. She said, I've endured eight long agonizing years to get here. To witness Brooks Hall put in handcuffs was an experience that was completely surreal to me. I've always believed that he was guilty, but now everyone knows that. I'm not sure of the feelings I experienced today. I'm sure that's all you can imagine. I would like to say thank for the FBI. God sent me an angel when they showed up at my house. I am personally familiar with the effort that a particular agent put into this case as well as the long and exhausting hours he worked to make this happen. He never once forgot how I had been a mom as well as a wife, experiencing the most difficult time spouses and mothers can endure. I can't even imagine the impact it caused on him. This event would never have been possible without his help. Thank you for his team for all the help they provided in his office. His co-workers worked extremely difficult. I would like be grateful to them for watching out for myself and our family. Thanks also for my family and friends at the Nelson County Sheriff's Office for helping in ensuring that this event took place. Thanks to both the attorney for prosecution and office. Twelve-year-old Jennifer Renee Odom was a seventh grader at Thomas E. Waitman Middle School in Wesley Chapel, Florida, in 1993. She played the clarinet in the school band and was also a barefoot water skier who often placed high in tournaments. She was the skier who climbed to the top of the human pyramid, gliding atop the water. Jennifer was born on August 25, 1980. She was the eldest daughter of Renee Converse and stepdad Clark Converse. She had a nine-year-old sister, Jessica Ann Odom, and was the granddaughter of Jim and Margie Denny. They lived in St. Joseph, a small community near Dade City, Florida. Jennifer and Jessica had a rabbit called Beanie. Jennifer also absolutely loved her Springer Spaniel, Gypsy. The two sisters built forts, rode four-wheelers, and spent summer days swimming in the creek behind their house on the family's 15-acre property. It was a crisp morning on Friday, February 19, 1993, when Jennifer Odom put on her white jeans and a white turtleneck to get ready for school. She put on a red cashmere sweater, a gift from her grandmother, over her shoulder-length chestnut-colored hair. She was slim and tan due to spending a lot of time outdoors. On that same morning, after lacing up her pair of black boots, she got into the car with her mother. The two drove 200 yards up the winding Lime Rock driveway to wait for the school bus near their mailbox. Jennifer climbed onto the bus and took her usual spot on the back seat so she and her mother could see each other until Renee, following behind, turned left to head to work. After school, at around 3 p.m., Jennifer stepped off her school bus, waved goodbye to her friends and started walking the short 200 yards to her home. At about 4 p.m., Jennifer's sister arrived at their home from school to find it locked and unable to enter. She then called their mother to tell her that her big sister was not home yet. Renee Converse then realized Jennifer must not have made it home, so she called Jennifer's best friend, Michelle, who stated that she saw Jennifer exit the bus and begin walking home. 
Jennifer's mother knew something was very wrong and called the police. Within hours, deputies launched a wide-scale search, and a search party of about 400 volunteers was formed to help scour about 60 square miles of countryside. Family friends, neighbors, and other volunteers searched for Jennifer, and law enforcement was equipped with police dogs to comb the rolling groves, pastures, and woods surrounding the tiny Pasco County town of Dade City. Every law enforcement agency in the Bay Area was looking for a blue truck that was seen in the area by some of her classmates, children riding the school bus with Jennifer. They remembered seeing an older light blue, unknown model pickup truck, slowly following Jennifer down the road in the direction in which she was walking. The children described it as having a silver-painted rear bumper, not chrome, and a trailer hitch with wires hanging and pipes, or a ladder in the back. The driver was described by the children as a white male in his 40s with shoulder-length brown hair. The blue truck became the focus of the search parties, as investigators believed that the driver may have been involved in Jennifer's disappearance. As a last resort to find the truck, the FBI, as well as Hernando and Pasco County Sheriff's personnel, worked from a dock in a boathouse as divers searched Lake Rovita for the vehicle. Six days after Jennifer vanished, on Thursday, February 25, 1993, a man and a woman searching an abandoned orange grove about 10 miles north of Jennifer's school, bus stop found her badly decomposed nude body. Her body was found near a horse trail off Powell Road, south of Brooksville, amid a cluster of pine trees in the orange grove. She was found viciously assaulted and had suffered blunt force trauma to her head. Detectives said she likely lost her life there in the woods not long after her disappearance. Hernando County Sheriff Al Ninhase stated, We are not exactly sure how long her abductor kept her captive or when exactly the slaying took place, but we are relatively confident it took place in that field. Jennifer's clothing was never found, neither the blue truck nor its driver. While Jennifer's family was still busy with her funeral arrangements, country music star Vince Gill was scheduled to sing at the local Strawberry Festival on Monday, March 1, 1993. Jennifer's stepfather, Clark Converse, said the girls had looked forward to Gill's performance for weeks, hoping they could get him to autograph photos before the concert. Clark Converse and Jessica went to the festival to fulfill Jennifer's wish that Gill autograph a photo in which Jennifer and her sister had posed with the singer at a previous concert on January 10th. Between shows, festival vice president Joe Newsom took the three snapshots to Gill, who was eating dinner. Jennifer's stepdad had asked that Gil autograph one for Jessica, one for Jennifer, and one for both girls. Newsom said afterward, I told Gil this young lady had been slayed, and her dad was outside. Gil replied that he remembered hearing about the incident. He, who also had a young daughter, autographed the photos writing on one to Jennifer. May God be with you. As both Gil and Newsom wept, Gil then went to the night's second show. Before singing the last song, he told the audience about Jennifer. I'm going to try to get through this the best I can, he said, his voice cracking. Gill sang his Grammy-winning hit, I Still Believe in You, and dedicated it to Jennifer, who was tragically robbed of her life. Midway through the song, with tears running down his face, Gill asked the crowd to help him finish. Nearly 15,000 voices joined in. Radio Personality Jeff Moore stood backstage and looked out at thousands of tear-stained faces. He said, It was heart-ripping, he said afterward. Unfortunately, with no one in the community providing investigators with useful information, her case went unsolved for 13 months. Before Jennifer was abducted, on January 16, 1992, a 17-year-old girl was kidnapped as she got off a school bus in north-central Pasco County. She was found in a pool of blood behind an abandoned house, brutally attacked, assaulted, and beaten. Sheriff Ninhai said she suffered injuries to her head and skull that were very significant. She survived, but her life was forever changed, as she was paralyzed on her left side. Ninhai said she was a former honor roll student and a track and field participant and was a true victim. She was not engaged in a high-risk lifestyle. Law enforcement was able to collect DNA from the crime scene at the time, and since there were similarities between what happened to Jennifer and the unnamed girl, detectives believed the cases may be related.
Both victims were adolescent girls who were abducted after getting off the school bus in Pasco County, taken to a remote field, assaulted, and abandoned with the belief they would succumb to their injuries. The other victim was found just a few miles from where Jennifer's body was found. After a series of blind alleys, the police called upon psychic Nancy Meyer, 16 months after the incident, to assist in finding the person responsible for what happened. Nancy Meyer is a psychic from Pennsylvania who has been working with police around the country for decades. According to Nancy, she had consulted in more than 300 criminal investigations and had offered critical clues more than 80% of the time. Nancy believed that two men were involved in taking Jennifer's life. She described them as white, muscular mechanics, and she said one may be a smoker with a heavy cough. The crime scene photographs were classified, therefore Nancy Meyer was not allowed to see it. Despite this, she was able to visualize two men in detail. She was taken to the site where Jennifer's body was found, and Nancy pointed out that there were belongings in a nearby area that had not yet been discovered. She was able to describe several of Jennifer's items that were still missing, including her cousin's clarinet case with the letters L.O. on them. She continued to give information about the perpetrators in the hope of solving the case. Detective Carlos Douglas of the Hernando County Sheriff's Office said, Nancy Meyer was extremely accurate on some things that led us to look in other areas that we had not thought of, so we obtained a lot of information from what she had to offer. On December 2, 1994, Jennifer's Unsolved Case was aired on an episode of Unsolved Mysteries on national TV. After the show aired, more than 50 phone tips and even more investigative leads from around the country arrived by mail at the Hernando County Sheriff's Office. A spokesman of the Sheriff's Office said, The show did for us what we wanted it to do. It got us some more exposure. Despite the new exposure, former Hernando County Sheriff's Major Gary Zorn Smith who oversaw the investigation in its early years, said the investigators were stumped. He said there was a strong possibility the crime would go unsolved, and what's even worse is that if we solve it, it may take another crime to do it, he said at the time. Approximately two years after Jennifer's body was found, on Thursday, January 5, 1995, a couple hunting for scrap metal in a rural area of Hernando County discovered Jennifer's missing book bag and clarinet case. It was found several miles from the location of her body. Police were able to lift fingerprints from her backpack and clarinet case from what is believed to be the person responsible. Unfortunately, there was never a hit in the database for a suspect matching these fingerprints. Over the years, the case garnered national attention and haunted the Tampa Bay region. Thousands of dollars in reward money offered for tips when unclaimed. Detectives logged tens of thousands of hours chasing leads and Jennifer's family waited for news as the years turned to decades. Jennifer's mother, Renee Converse, wondered if it was somebody Jennifer knew. Clark Converse, Jennifer's stepfather, added, There is a real chance that the person who did it is somebody we have contact with. If they catch someone, we're going to be thrown into the spotlight. Learning how to deal with a trial and confronting this person is going to throw us to square one in learning to deal with this. Renee said she cries a bit more each year. The reality is that Jennifer is gone and will never be in our lives again. Nothing is going to change that. She also said that the family is thankful for what they do know. We are blessed that we have this much closure. We are not looking for her. We know where she is. It is going to be a bittersweet finale. She could still picture her 12-year-old daughter slim and sun-kissed, waving goodbye at the back window of the Pasco County school bus. It was the last time she would see her brown-eyed first-born girl. In 2015, Detective George Lundgren was contacted by Pasco County Sheriff Chris Nako, who stated that new technology had led to a solid lead in the 1992 case in which the teenage girl was found alive. It was the case investigators believed was linked to Jennifer's. The odds of finding another match, Nako said, was 1 in 7.7 .7 non-Ilian, a number with 30 zeros. Lundgren commented, I think DNA is going to be a big part of Jennifer's case, as it is with any of the old cases, because items were collected. 
it is just now that the technology has advanced. The biological evidence found in the investigation of the 1992 case was tested before February 2015, and detectives got a full DNA profile. Investigators used a DNA procedure known as familial searching, which allows law enforcement to find a suspect by comparing male DNA left at the scene with that of family members. The shortfall of a standard DNA search is that a suspect's genetic fingerprint must be on file in the offender database for law enforcement to make a match. Sheriff Ninhai said, until 2015, there were no leads on that particular piece of DNA. The Florida Department of Law Enforcement compared the DNA to local DNA to see if there were any close matches, which would be a family member. The sheriff said they found the DNA match, that of Jeffrey Crum, who was in jail at the time. Investigators then obtained DNA samples from Crum's brother, father, and grandfather. A direct comparison between the DNA found in the victim and that of Crum's father found a match, leading to the indictment of Jeffrey Crum. Crum was already serving two life sentences for the assault and kidnapping case out of Pasco County that was prosecuted around 2015. In February 2015, the arrest and sentence of Crum gave Detective Lloyd Grant a new resolve, and Jennifer's family knew hope that the person responsible would be caught. Detectives then began an intensive investigation and interviewed everyone they could find for the next several years who may have been associated with Crum around the time Jennifer was kidnapped. This information was turned over to the state attorney, and the facts and circumstances were turned over to a grand jury. On July 27, 2023, a month shy of what would have been Jennifer's 43rd birthday, officials announced that they had finally made an arrest in the case and prosecutors would seek capital punishment against the accused. State Attorney Bill Glass made the announcement during a press conference, just after the Hernando County Sheriff's Office announced that it had charged the 61-year-old Jeffrey Norman Crum with the kidnapping, assault, and slaying of Jennifer 30 years before. Glass also said, I have confidence that we have the right person and we have the right aggravators in this particular case to treat it as a capital punishment case. This is every parent's nightmare. This is the thing that keeps parents up at night, worried about their children. Detective George Lundgren, who had spent years investigating Jennifer's case, said, Shock is probably the best word to describe the reaction of Jennifer's family when he told them about the arrest. He said he did it quickly because I did not want to get emotional. It is a lot for them to take in and absorb, and I can imagine it is going to take some time before it really sinks in. According to Sheriff Ninhais, every viable lead for the past 30 years, including those that came from the Pasco County Sheriff's Office, the Florida Department of Law Enforcement, or private citizens, was thoroughly investigated. He added that the investigation never stopped. Hundreds of items were tested and retested every time new technology came out in the hope of finding the smoking gun to solve this case. The sheriff added that countless detectives, sworn law enforcement personnel, Civilian tipsters and countless others have had a hand in this investigation. The minute Crum was identified as a suspect in the case, Detective Lundgren went to work, putting a mosaic together like a puzzle. I can tell you that other than the conviction in a previous case, there was no other significant piece of the puzzle. Every other piece of the puzzle that brought us to this point consisted of tiny fragments that gave the state attorney and the grand jury enough confidence to indict Crum. He also said that they are searching for additional victims, as authorities fear Crum may be responsible for other crimes. A picture of him from 1993 was released, asking that anyone who recognizes him from the 1980s and 1990s contact Sheriff Ninhais. We urge anyone who had interactions with this individual has information on other crimes he may have committed or may have themselves been a victim of Jeffrey Crum to reach out to the Hernando County Sheriff's Office and speak to our cold case unit. Despite keeping a lot of information close to the vest, authorities did say that in 1992, Crum worked in construction as a drywall installer and lived on Somerset Lane in Spring Hill, the Pasco County area where Jennifer was abducted from. His residence was about 21 miles from the place where Jennifer was last seen and 12 miles from where her body was found. Officials also say that at that time, he drove a blue truck. 
During Thursday's press conference on July 27, 2023, Sheriff Ninhais kept reiterating that Crum was not on the investigators' radar until the past few years. Records showed that Crum has a significant history of convictions for violent crimes. The sheriff said Crum had been arrested in the early 1980s for armed robbery in Hillsborough County. In 1985, he was charged with kidnapping, assault, and false imprisonment in Hillsborough County. He was arrested by Tampa police in 1987 for carrying a concealed weapon. In 1988, he was caught again carrying a concealed weapon and was charged with aggravated assault. In 1998, he was arrested for domestic violence in Hernando County three times. In 2001, he was arrested for a violation of probation in Hillsborough County. He was arrested a few years later for aggravated assault with a deadly weapon in Hernando County. In 2015, he was arrested in Pasco County for aggravated assault on a child under the age of 12. Sheriff Ninheis stated, He is a bad individual who enjoyed violence. Crum is already serving two life sentences for the assault and kidnapping case out of Pasco County that was prosecuted around 2015. He is currently in the Hernando County Jail, and Judge Kurt E. Hitzman ordered him to be held without bond and appointed a public defender to represent him. Communities in Pasco and Hernando counties were on edge after Jennifer Odom's kidnapping and slaying back then. They shared their thoughts and feelings after the news of the arrest was announced. Jeannie Cameron, the general manager at Papa Joe's Italian restaurant in Brooksville, said she and others in the community remember hearing about her disappearance all too well. So, we all remember hearing about her disappearance, Jennifer's, and about the blue truck, and everybody was on alert, looking. I think the bottom line was finding out who did it and getting him off the streets so that another family doesn't have to be tormented. Because I really feel like the whole community was tormented until they found out the answer. Joseph Gioratan, the owner of Papa Joe's Italian restaurant, said, Back then, 30 years ago, as a parent, I was very angry that someone could do something like that to a child and then leave her there in the middle of nowhere. Jessica Ellis said she went to Waitman Middle School with Jennifer and played in the same clarinet section in band class. I would say we saw each other a lot. We weren't like close friends, but we knew a lot of the same people. We rode the school bus every day, and I just remember her always being nice with me and everyone else that rode her school bus that knew her. You know, a lot of us are parents ourselves now, and the fact that anyone would do this to a child makes me hold my five-year-old a lot tighter now. Grief and fear followed in the days, months, and years after Jennifer lost her life. The arrest of Crum is closure for many in the community. Sixteen-year-old Kimberly Lysel lived in Livingston County, Michigan, in 1982. She loved poetry and spending time with her sisters. On March 20, 1982, Kimberly left her boyfriend's home and called her mom from a gas station payphone to tell her she was on her way home. She decided to hitchhike, something she had done before. She started in the area of Eight Mile and Inner Roads, and she got a ride to the area of Eight Mile and Merriman Roads in Livonia. At around 6.30 p.m., she made at least four phone calls trying to find a ride the rest of the way home. Sadly, Kimberly never made it back home, and she was not seen alive again. Her family searched for her, tracked down her friends, but could not find any trace of her. She was reported missing to the Green Oak Township Police Department the next day. Kimberly Liesel's mother said police kept asking her about her daughter being a runaway, but she was not a runaway. She was on her way home. Joanna Liesel said the days turned into weeks, and then her body was found on April 14, 1982. Kimberly Liesel's body was found behind a park and ride in the Island Lake Recreation Area near Grand River Avenue and Kensington Road, just five miles from her home. She had been assaulted, beaten, and strangled, and her personal belongings were not located. An autopsy revealed that even though she had been missing for more than three weeks, she lost her life four or five days before being found. Investigators with the Green Oak Township Police Department exhausted all leads before the case went cold. Kimberly's sister, Cindy Authors, dedicated herself to helping track down the perpetrator. About 15 years ago, I had just started Googling her name to see if I could find anything on her, 
and I found two really old articles that did not have the right information. Cindy author said, that kind of upset me that I could not find any information on it. It was like she just did not exist, so that was where I started because I wanted to correct the wrong information, and then it just went from there. Cindy author started a Facebook page to share information about the case, posted flyers, and tracked down her sister's friends. She became a pseudo-detective. Kimberly's case got a new set of eyes recently when Michigan State University students, taking part in a cold case internship with Michigan, state police took interest. The students sifted through boxes of evidence and files, and there was a name that caught their eye, Charles David Shaw. Back in 1983, someone had tipped police that Shaw had lived in the area where Kimberly Lysel lived, and they said he had recently destroyed his apartment, which they thought was suspicious. Police took note but never tracked Shaw down. That was interesting because in early 2023, Livingston County cold case investigators announced Shaw as the suspect in the 1983 slaying of 19-year-old Christina Caston. Christina lived with her mother and father in Redford Township at the time of her disappearance. She was last seen between 7.30 p.m. and 9.30 p.m. on March 19, 1983 walking westbound on Five Mile Road near Lola Park in Redford Township. Her mother reported her missing on March 21, 1983, and her body was found on March 29, 1983, in the Oak Grove State Game Area on Forest Road in Deerfield Township. Police were able to obtain DNA from Christina's body in March 2022. Investigators applied and received grant funding through Season of Justice, a nonprofit organization dedicated to funding DNA testing, on unsolved cold cases. In May 2022, the DNA evidence was sent to AAM Lab in Texas, the company behind DNA Solves. AAM used the genealogical profile to identify leads in the case and turned that evidence over to investigators. Investigators said through that work and cooperation from the suspect's family, they were able to identify beyond a reasonable doubt who the perpetrator was. The cooperation of the Shaw family during the investigation was paramount to identifying Charles Shaw as the person responsible for what had happened to Christina Caston. Livingston County investigators said in a press release that investigators then began focusing on Shaw as a suspect in Kimberly Liesel's case. They created maps of areas where he was known to spend time, like where he lived and where he worked, and they discovered that those locations surrounded Kimberly's location. Investigators did a property audit on all the property and all the evidence that they had in the case. The students and detectives took that evidence to the Michigan State Police Crime Lab and asked for it to be retested. They were hoping for a miracle and then, four months later, they got a hit. DNA was found on one of the items that had been collected from the crime scene. The DNA had been among the evidence for 40 years and had gone unnoticed. The cell was uploaded into the system and linked to Shaw. The announcement came in September 2023, and investigators believe Shaw kidnapped Kimberly while she was walking. Police said they are 100% confident that Charles David Shaw is responsible for taking the life of Kimberly Liesel. Shaw's body was found in Detroit on November 27, 1983, and the medical examiner's report listed the cause as accidental asphyxiation. Unfortunately, there will never really be justice. Shaw had several interactions with law enforcement beginning at a young age. One such interaction resulted in his arrest in 1981 for the attempted abduction of a woman in the Phil McDonald's parking lot. Detectives are exploring the possibility that Shaw is responsible for additional crimes during the early 1970s until his end in November 1983. Six year old Lewich Teutsch lived in Windsor, Ontario, Canada, in 1971 with her parents and her eight-year-old brother, Michael. On the evening of May 14, 1971, Lewich and Michael were playing outside their Jouad Road home. A man approached them just before 9 all p.m. He offered Lewich eight ta dollars to take a walk with him down the street, which she accepted. The man also offered Michael money to go ride his bike to distract him while he walked away hand-in-hand -hand with Lewich. Michael alerted his mother when the man and Lewich did not return, and the police were called. 
Four hours later, Lewich's body was found less than a mile from her house in the backyard of a Hickory Avenue home. It was around 1 hours a.m. when an officer scanning yards with a flashlight found her body. The perpetrator left her body close to a gate leading to the back alley. Police found two of Lewich's teeth along with an adult tooth next to her body. She had been severely and violently beaten. The adult tooth and other evidentiary items were collected by investigators so that they could be used later on. Witnesses came forward, saying they saw a strange man hanging out at a restaurant across the street from the Toysh house, but he was never located. The case attracted national attention, and hundreds of tips came in from across Canada and the U.S. At one point, there were more than 500 persons of interest in the case. In the 1990s, investigators were able to extract DNA from items found at the crime scene. In 2015, investigators announced that they were able to create a DNA profile of the perpetrator. Investigators sought the services of Parabon Nanolabs, a DNA technology company in Virginia that specializes in DNA phenotyping, the process of predicting physical appearance and ancestry from unidentified DNA evidence. Law enforcement agencies use the company's snapshot DNA phenotyping service for narrowing suspect lists and generating leads in criminal investigations. Parabon came up with two different images. One showed what the suspect looked like at 25 years old when the crime was committed. And the other image showed what the suspect may look like now at approximately 70 years old. In December 2019, Windsor Police Staff Sergeant Scott Chapman announced that Lewich Toich's case was finally solved. Chapman said that Lewich's case was one of the very first Canadian cases that used the technique of genetic genealogy. On ancestry research websites such as GEDmatch and Family Tree DNA, users have the option to not share their genetic information with law enforcement. Chapman said police were ultimately able to identify the perpetrator through the DNA of a distant cousin found in a database. Parabon Nanolabs assisted with the identification. Windsor police made the decision at the time not to reveal the unknown man's name. They only said that he recently passed away and settled out west after committing the crime. While police were applauded for finally solving the crime, the refusal to release the man's name was met with some public criticism. Finally, in 2023, Windsor police changed their stance and it was announced that Frank Arthur Hall was the man responsible. He was 22 years old back in 1971, and Hall lived less than two miles from the Toich family. He was never a suspect or a person of interest until the DNA match confirmed his guilt. Paul passed away in February 2019 in Edmonton, Canada, just a few months before the DNA match. Windsor Police Staff Sergeant Scott Chapman was the one who announced that Hall was the one responsible. He explained that in 2019 when he announced the case was solved, it was unclear whether they could legally name Hall, since there was such little precedent. That was part of the reason Hall's name was withheld at that time, said Chapman, acknowledging the landscape has since changed as genetic genealogy has become more mainstream. Prior to the release of that information, Chapman flew to Edmonton to tell Hall's family members. They were shocked, but showed strength, he said. We have to keep in mind, whatever Frank Hall did in his life is not a reflection on these people, Chapman said. They've been victimized by this information too. According to Chapman, police records are unclear as to whether Hall's home was canvassed as part of the initial investigation back in 1971. Hall was, however, known to police in Windsor and in other places, mostly for property crimes like theft, though his name was not known to the public. Other law enforcement agencies have been made aware of Hall since 2019. Now that Hall's name is out there, Chapman believes it could lead to more tips from the public regarding other cases. It will give potentially new life to different investigations, he said. It is entirely possible. Twenty-eight-year-old Terry Ladwig lived in Concord, California, in 1994. She was married to Navy Petty Officer Stephen Ladwig. On December 2, 1994, Terry was beaten and strangled in the apartment she shared with her husband on Adelaide Street in Concord. 
Stephen Ladwig found Terry's body after returning from a tour of duty aboard the USS Parch submarine. Stephen Ladwig was never a suspect in her demise, and no suspects were named by the police at the time. Forensic evidence was taken from the apartment, and the only other lead investigators had was that there was no sign of forced entry. This possibly meant that Terry knew her attacker. Investigators were unable to identify a suspect, and the case went cold. On January 27, 2023, 55-year-old James Grimley was arrested in Salt Lake City, Utah, and charged with taking Terry Ladwig's life. Originally from Oregon, Grimley was employed as a trucker in Salt Lake City at the time of his arrest. We are not certain of the motive, Concord Police Lieutenant Shaw Donnelly said. There was no sign of forced entry, and we can presume that the victim led him into the apartment. I can tell you it was a violent scene. It looked like there was a violent struggle between Terry and the suspect. There was forensic evidence obtained from the scene, along with many interviews conducted at the time of the initial investigation, Donnelly said. However, at this point we are not going to state the exact connection. That information may come from the district attorney's office or U.S. after the arraignment. Grimsley was booked into jail in Salt Lake County on a $1 million warrant and was subsequently extradited to Contra Costa County. One of Terry's friends, Brittany Shuzz, had this to say after news of the arrest was made public. She was a great woman. She had a great personality. She made people laugh and would brighten my day when she came in. Thirty-four-year-old Leonard James Irving lived in Portland, Oregon, in 2011. His family and friends referred to him as LJ. He had three children aged five, six, and seven on June 25, 2011. LJ, dressed in a long green shirt and dark jeans, went out to celebrate his nephew's 21st birthday. He had gotten off work at 9.30 p.m. from his produce job at Winco Foods, and had to report to his part-time chef's job at the Lloyd Center's Courtyard Marriott by 7 the next morning. However, he told his girlfriend he had to join his nephew at Season and Sports Bar and Lounge on Northeast 82nd Avenue because family was important. Outside the bar after midnight, his nephew Lamar Lovett Hill and another man exchanged angry words, and LJ stepped in to calm the situation. LJ then walked across the street with his nephew to his minivan in the lot of the new Happy Fortune Chinese restaurant. But before they could get in and leave, someone fatally shot LJ four times in the back and shot Lamar in the neck, wounding him. Samuel Thompson, who owned the Season Inn restaurant, said he did not hear the gunfire because he was in the rear lounge where Benson High School alumni were celebrating their 10th reunion. But Thompson knew something was terribly wrong at about 12.30 a.m. when people rushed into his business Thompson ran across the street and found LJ on his back, his right arm on his chest, beside his van with the driver's door open. Thompson checked to see whether he was breathing and dialed 911 at 12.37 a.m. I sat down on the ground next to him, Thompson said. LJ's aunt heard that he had possibly been shot and drove to his mother Lucy Mashia's house, and they drove to the crime scene together. It was there that Lucy learned LJ was not alive anymore. My son was an innocent bystander, she said. Some coward shot him. LJ's girlfriend, Adrian Malam, said she thought it was a bad dream at first. She got word while at home where she was caring for LJ's three young children and her own four-year-old daughter. I kind of cried to myself, Adrian said. Why do people do this? Why is it so easy for people to get guns? It is still surreal. I am thinking he could still be at work. Maybe he is not really gone. It's crazy how he can be there one day and not the next. They did not see the guy coming. It really hurts that it was cold-blooded for no reason. LJ grew up in Portland, but spent time during his high school years in Seattle with his dad's family. They described him as a dedicated father who saw his children on his days off and weekends and dreamed of working full-time as a chef. His specialties were spicy foods, prime rib on Christmas, and jambalaya. In 2005, LJ was sentenced in federal court to 60 months in prison for distributing illegal substances and had been on federal supervision since June 2009. I thought my heart was broken that time, his sister said. 
but she was proud that LJ took responsibility for his actions and served his time without blaming others. His family said he matured, got his GED, and since his release had worked hard to make ends meet for his children, holding down two jobs. Investigators had few leads to work on, and the case unfortunately went cold not long after the investigation started. Then in January 2023, 37-year-old Jan Marcian Polk was arrested in connection with what happened to L.J. Irving. Polk had been living in Multnomah County Jail since May 2022 for another case in which he faces similar charges. He has pled not guilty in that case. Portland Police Bureau Chief Chuck Lovell said he was thrilled with the news of the arrest. I spoke to LJ's mother today, and she passed along her appreciation for the work of the detectives, Lovell said in a statement. I agree. This arrest is the culmination of almost 12 years of diligent, meticulous work by investigators, and I am grateful to them for their tireless efforts to achieve justice for LJ. A trial date has not yet been made public. Samuel Johnson, who was one of the first people at the crime scene, formerly worked at Self Enhancement Inc., a nonprofit organization that works with at risk youth. He left SEI to start his own business, but launched Reclaim in the Village, a personal effort to spur the community to get involved to combat such violence. After Andre Paton, a 19 year old on his SEI caseload, was fatally shot in Old Town, a case that remains unsolved, he said, Portland needs to wake up. Thompson said, at the end of the day, it has to be a call to action. The community needs to start preaching love once again. Too many lives have been taken for nonsense. It needs to be understood that a good man in LJ lost his life. Seventy-three-year-old Gregor and 72-year-old Irma Six lived in Canberra, Australia in 1999. On the night of November 6, 1999, two masked men forced their way into the Pick Grover Crescent home at around 9.30 p.m. The couple was bound with cable ties to their eyes and savagely beaten before the men ransacked their home, stealing cash and jewelry. Gregor managed to free himself and call the police, but Irma suffocated on her own blood and lost her life at the scene. Detective Sergeant Craig Marriott recalled the event. They were assaulted, bound with cable ties, duct tape, and a telephone cord, and the house was ransacked after a period of what is estimated to be about an hour. Mr. Pick, who had been in and out of consciousness, was able to free himself from his bindings and found his wife face down in the hallway. He rolled her over and removed her bindings, but she had passed away. She had effectively drowned in her own blood from a broken nose. Detectives who started investigating the case found that the Picks were also victims of aggravated burglaries in 1997 and 1998, which are thought to be linked to the third fatal break-in. Police made it known that they believed someone in Melbourne's Hungarian community could hold vital information on who was responsible for what happened to Irma. Investigators found DNA evidence at the crime scene, but with DNA technology not being as advanced in 1999, there was little they could do. In 2012, a $500,000 reward was offered for anyone able to help the police secure a successful conviction. In the case of 2019, investigators decided to take another look at the case. DNA technology was now a lot more advanced. Almost immediately, a DNA match was established through the National Crime Investigation DNA Database. DNA testing led investigators to Stevie Fabrizi. It took a while to track Fabrizi down. When he was questioned by investigators on September 8, 2023, Fabrizi made partial admissions to his involvement in the incident. He admitted being on the premises for the purpose of the burglary and gave details of the burglary that were not known publicly. 68-year-old Steve Fabrizi from Melbourne was then subsequently arrested and charged with taking the life of Irma Palak. Fabrizi faced Dandong Magistrates Court on September 21, 2023, where he applied for release on bail. The opposing bail detective, Sergeant Craig Marriott, told the court that police had serious concerns that Fabrizi, also known as Istvan Fabrizi, could flee the country if released, as he is a dual citizen of Hungary. Marriott said they also feared the 68-year-old might interfere with witnesses, 
with his alleged co-offender still on the run. The court heard that while Fabrizi owns his own home in Australia, he has no family there. The police were aware that he planned to return to Hungary, where he owns land upon his retirement. Fabrizi also has about $250,000 in savings, Marriott said, creating further concern that he had the means to leave Australia. I am also aware he has made statements to Victoria Police, while in custody, about wanting to harm himself. He made the same statement to us. He said he asked us to shoot him. The court heard this. While the 68-year-old has had no prior offenses for failing to answer bail, he did spend time in prison from 2010 to 2012 after being convicted of conspiring to hijack a truckload of cigarettes. Magistrate Jason Ang eventually denied bail and ordered Fabrizi to appear in Cour Magistrati's court on an undetermined date. In a statement released on behalf of the Pix family, they said that after nearly 24 years of pain, questioning, and uncertainty, they had never given up hope of finding out who was responsible for this heinous act. Only Irma was taken from us, but Gregor's life all but ended on that night, and ours have never been the same, they said outside the court. Detective Superintendent Scott Marer from the ACT Police said this arrest was immensely satisfying for investigators. The family of Irma Picks never gave up hope, never ceased asking for community assistance, and always worked to keep the case in people's minds, he said. Marrier said police were continuing to work to identify and charge a second suspect and believe it is only a matter of time before this occurs. I am confident it is only a matter of time before we are able to provide full closure for the family and the Canberra community. Marrier said. The 500,000 reward offer remains active, and information received can still be considered for this reward. Furthermore, investigators released an image of a man they believe may have information on what happened to Irma. Krista Martin was living alone on South Osage Street in Wichita, California, when tragedy struck her life on November 5, 1994. This apartment complex had recently become her new home. Krista Getz had been missing since she could no longer contact her family members. On October 2, 1989, police visited Krista's house to check on whether she was still living and discovered her corpse there. She suffered blunt force trauma to the left side of her head and was also attacked, but investigators could not locate the weapon used. Fingerprints were collected at the scene of the crime as evidence that it may have been present during any stage of this crime. DNA testing and CODIS systems were not readily available. However, Evidence was preserved during the investigation process. Police reported a domestic disturbance near Krista's house about one week prior to her death that involved threats being made against her life and property. Police were unable to link Krista's murder between 1990 and 1992 to this incident. A case detective submitted information to an FBI crime lab in hopes of identifying potential suspects. However, this failed and the investigation remains open. In 2009, DNA evidence was submitted for analysis to the Sedwick County Regional Forensic Science Center, which produced an alleged suspect profile without any matches to any CODET database. In 2020, the police department of Witcher utilized cutting-edge technology and requested assistance from the FBI in reviewing DNA evidence collected since 1989. They joined forces with Ohm to determine whether advanced DNA testing could assist them in identifying an attacker. Ohm Laboratories of Woodland, Texas, was used to conduct DNA tests on evidence collected by forensics, creating a complete DNA profile of the suspect in question. Once this process was successfully concluded, this DNA sample was sent over to the FBI's forensic genetic genealogy team in order to generate new investigative leads. In 2021, a group comprised of a witch cold case detective and an FBI special agent embarked on a mission in Alabama and Arkansas, alongside federal agents from Maryland. Tasked with conducting extensive interrogation sessions and gathering additional evidence in order to solve the case, their task consisted of conducting rigorous interrogation sessions and gathering any additional evidence they might require to solve it. By April 2023, 
it had become apparent that Paul Hart was an individual to investigate after it was learned he died in an automobile crash in Memphis, Tennessee, in March 1999. In June of 2023, a Witch Police Department detective and FBI special agent traveled to Arkansas, where they collected additional DNA samples taken from family members of Paul Hart for further analysis through tests. Their investigators confirmed their suspicion that Paul was indeed responsible for Krista's murder. Mullen noted that by spring 2023, we had identified an individual family via genetic genealogy. Their core family has no known connections to witches. They weren't witches. In fact, they came from Arkansas. I asked what the link between witches and these individuals was, since none lived nearby, and what could possibly be behind this connection. Together we started investigating their family tree. As we explored their family tree, we came across one individual who lived among witches in 1989. After Krista Martin's murder in October, that individual left them and returned home, without leaving any records behind of themselves, or knowing anything more about themselves, or where he may have gone next. No information could be found regarding him at that point in time. Krista's relatives have been asked if this name sounded familiar. There was no doubt when the initial investigators reviewed their investigation file in 1989 or more recent investigations. No mention was ever made of this person by anyone involved between then and now. Krista Martin lived nearby. Her body was later discovered six houses away. Vander Mullen pointed out that had this been someone from Krista's social circle, it could have been discovered more quickly. However, since her detectives had no way of knowing who they were looking for at first, this made me shudder, knowing it could still exist out there somewhere. Unbeknownst to us, until recent months, two young adults living at the same address began meeting and apparently have no common ground. According to all accounts I've tracked so far, it seems as though their meeting was entirely coincidental and they simply happened upon each other by chance. What exactly caused it? remains a mystery that may never be answered. What we discovered was that Christo was an extremely outgoing individual, frequenting local bar establishments and making friends wherever she went. Christo would often accept rides home from new acquaintances whom she had just met, inviting them all over to her home afterwards. Fander Mullen expressed confidence that this case will demonstrate his department's willingness to handle cases until they no longer require being handled by Mark Bennett, the county district attorney who also attended. He stated that after police presented details regarding Paul Hart to Bennett, he was able to ascertain charges would be brought in his event of his survival, thus concluding the case. Law enforcement officials shared with me their work on the investigation, and once they had obtained as much evidence and drawn all possible conclusions using help from the Forensic Science Center, they reported it back to me, as they would any other case. After hearing all the evidence and information compiled as well as conclusions drawn based on DNA analysis, it became apparent to me that I would have pursued this case had the suspect been alive to file charges against him. Ember Moore, Martin's niece, thanked all the investigators and volunteers involved in solving the mystery at a press conference held today. I am immensely relieved to know that we can move forward, secure in knowing that the perpetrator has no chance to harm us or ourselves again. She urged us all to express our sincerest appreciation to everyone involved in bringing justice to Krista's story. She deserved much more from life than was left for her to experience. On June 27, 1983, Sheriff's deputies were summoned to Rohner Park, an unincorporated community located 50 miles northeast of San Francisco, due to a reported theft from within its borders. Seven-year-old boys found the body of a woman inside an office of real estate on Petaluma Hill Road and East Coda Avenue at their intersection. When police arrived, they discovered that she had been fatally wounded with wood from a pile of timber in the office. Officers quickly collected evidence at the scene and stored it until later use by police, who quickly identified Noel Russo as 37-year-old victim, last seen three days prior to her body being discovered on June 24, 1983 by friends. 
Noel had recently engaged in an altercation with one of her partners before being found deceased three days later on June 24, 1983. Noel Noel had been staying with one of her friends on the streets of Santa Rosa, California that evening when their friend took them towards Courthouse Square where Noel planned to board a Golden Gate Transit bus back home in Roner Park, but instead vanished altogether. Detectives began tracking Noel's past events. She was raised in San Mo County and gained national fame by winning Miss Burlingame when she was only 16 years old. According to the San Mato Times, her aspiration was to become a model, with dancing, the twist being her favorite activity. I was shocked that this bubbly teenager won. They said they entered only to please their mother. Noel can be seen smiling broadly in the accompanying photograph and holding out her arms adorned with roses. Over the next 20 years, she was divorced twice, married twice more, and gave birth to an infant son. She worked as a ranger trainer in Colorado before returning home to Santa Rosa Junior College in California and enrolling as a student. At the time, she lived in an apartment on Avam Avenue in Roner Park with her 18-year-old son, Noel, planning on moving toward Boys Hot Springs with him as her final destination. Noel loved cycling around town. Noel would often hitch rides, prompting some of her friends to worry that she may be too trusting of strangers. Investigators believe she did not use an expressway back home. Rather, it appears she met someone prior to when her bus arrived in Roner Park. After Noel was murdered on June 24, 1983, police used an artist to sketch her wearing the clothing that she wore that day and distributed this artwork in order to find leads and establish suspects. Detectives and deputies gathered considerable evidence during this investigation and conducted multiple interviews. Over time, certain people became of particular interest. However, no arrests were ever made and thus this investigation was concluded with no arrests being made or charges laid against any individuals identified as such. In 2010, the Sheriff's Office reopened this case, and for the next 12-plus years, investigators began using DNA analysis and then submitted numerous pieces of evidence to Santa Clara County Crime Lab. Officials announced in a press release that 65-year-old Alfredo Carrero Jr. had been arrested on October 2, 2023, and charged with killing Noel Russo. Sheriff Rob Dillon noted Russo's family had been informed of Carrero Jr.'s arrest and expressed appreciation for Cotero Jr.'s privacy during their detention process. Investigators immediately targeted Noel as one of their primary subjects of investigation. According to the Sheriff's Office, they believed he was aged in his late 20s at the time of incident and confirmed he was indeed responsible. Catro Jr. has been detained on DNA evidence and other sources without bail being set in his case. Rob Dillon noted that throughout this investigation, detectives worked closely together with Sonoma County District Attorney's Office. Note that both the Sonoma County Sheriff's Office and District Attorney's Office are committed to justice for victims regardless of when or how the incident took place. VCI team continues to investigate multiple cases of insolvency and seek justice for victims of violent crime. Alfredo Carrero Jr. is scheduled to appear before a judge on October 18, 2023. Investigators have yet to ascertain if Noel knew anyone related to her former flames. However, they are investigating the possibility that Noel may have known them all along. Authorities have not provided details about Keo other than his conviction in 1995 and 2001 in Sonoma County for property theft, as well as possessing illegal drugs, respectively. Court records also reveal that Keo was involved in a civil domestic violence case two years after Noel died, two women of whom Noel counted among his closest acquaintances and friends. She recalls their time together when they lived in San Francisco. Bar hopping was something they enjoyed doing together like many others in the area. This is apparently what they were up to before she disappeared, before their relationship broke apart and they eventually separated, she stated. Noel had not realized it when they left. However, when they did split up at night and Noel couldn't reach her for most of the day, later that day they found Noel and made a discovery, which brought great remorse for Noel's mother for quite some time after. My mother admitted enough about her friend being killed 
that she kept a diary and frequently wrote about her in it. My mother clearly expressed how beautiful and important this woman was to her, something which came through in her writings. It showed my mother's sense of loss over losing someone she cared deeply about and was devastated about losing them. On the 18th, 1981, two delivery men aged 9 14 discovered Rachel Zendos's body in Camaro, California's carport. They made this discovery while making deliveries. Rachel lived with two young daughters aged 1 and 2 in her home, which was located nearby the carport she used as storage. Rachel attended college. An autopsy determined that she was attacked and strangled to death. Investigators discovered that Rachel went out for dinner and hired two babysitters when returning from an evening out then drove the group home. Officials from Rachel's home believe she took her life when she returned to her vehicle and attempted to exit it. Detectives of the sheriff's office conducted their own investigation until all leads had been exhausted, eventually closing it 11 months after Rachel died. Although an identical crime had occurred near her residence on 11 December 1981. Lisa Gandek, 21, an Oxnard retail worker located 10 miles west of Camaro, was at Port Wanaime Naval Base nightclub after enjoying an evening with friends. Lisa was taken home to her residence around 11.30 a.m. At around 3 o'clock a.m., Lisa's neighbor called police to report and fire at Lisa's residence. Oxnard Fire Department extinguished any lingering flames before searching the scene for any victims of any sort. Lisa was found strangled and her body found in the tub, along with those of Rachel, and Rachel, also found strangled. Each case was investigated separately until 2002, when new information surfaced about each case at once. The suspect DNA collected at Rachel's murder scene was submitted to the FBI's DNA index system, that is combined, however this search proved fruitless. However, in 2004, Investigators working Lisa's murder case informed the Ventura County Sheriff's Office that DNA tests indicated a possible connection between both cases, although their results weren't what was anticipated. As no suspect was identified through DNA tests, the investigation was closed in September. In December, however, Ventura County Cold Case Unit initiated a line investigation using genetic genealogy, an increasingly popular technique to identify potential biological relatives through advanced DNA tests. New leads provided new leads with further DNA evidence which identified Tony Garcia of Oxnard as being responsible for Rachel Zenas and Lisa Gandek's deaths, with him being arrested on February 7th at Nard, California. Sheriff Fryhoff noted that Garcia, born in Roswell, New Mexico, and stationed at Point Mugu near Oxnard, after being discharged in 1980, he remained in the region teaching karate classes, as well as taking lessons himself for some time after being called up again for duty in 1983. At present, the suspect has remained unknown for more than four decades. Sheriff's Office, Chief Benitz confirmed they identified some commonalities between victim and suspect, yet refused to discuss specifics on what those were. Benitez indicated that Lisa traveled from Connecticut for an initially two-day visit with the intention of visiting an acquaintance from the U.S. Navy. Ultimately, she decided to relocate there shortly before her death, although it is unknown whether Garcia was one of them and therefore whether Lisa knew him prior to visiting Oxnard. Ventura County District Attorney Eric Nasarenko announced on March 8 that after nearly four years, justice has finally come for Rachel Zass and Lisa Gondek and their families. As the case illustrates, charges can be filed at any time without regard to statute of limitations. Ventura County Sheriff's Office, District Attorney's Bureau of Investigation, and Oxnard Police Department are to be thanked for continuing the search for Rachel or Lisa's killer. Investigators are currently exploring whether Garcia could have committed further crimes and they've appealed for public support in this matter. On Sunday, November 15, 2015, a family living on Farley Lane near Lillian in Baldwin County, Alabama, 
made an unexpected and shocking discovery on their road. Authorities discovered a vehicle with Devin Deshaun Kennedy of Pensacola, Florida still inside it. She had been fatally shot by law enforcement. Baldwin County Sheriff's Office conducted its investigation and identified some persons of interest. However, Lieutenant Andrew Ashton from their office informed us there was no concrete evidence supporting them and no potential link between any one person and another and justice being served at that moment. However, this wasn't sufficient evidence against them being any sort of suspects in any capacity. On April 19, 2023, 32-year-old Dakota Darnell Herring was arrested for stealing Deza's life and was brought before a judge for trial on April 21, 2023. At this hearing, he informed them he had served seven years in a federal firearms prison sentence and therefore would now need to make court appearances to face his accusations. Herring had just completed serving his prison sentence when Baldwin County investigators identified him as their primary suspect, according to Lieutenant Andrew Ashton. As soon as his term ended, Herring was released. At that time, Escambia County held him for any charges they might be facing against him, and he was shuttled between Escambia County and Escambia County while we awaited for Escambia County to address any issues related to whatever charges it had against him in order to release him to Alabama. Desa and Herring may have known each other, which was likely the reason behind their robbery attempt. Further evidence points towards another location for shooting to have taken place. Lieutenant Ashton served as chief investigator on this case during 2015. Being able to bring news of this arrest and release it to family of the victim was truly fulfilling and gave me immense satisfaction. Since this case had been in limbo, I believe there was some relief and hope that as time goes on, more details will surface. We are happy with what information is currently available about Dakota, and I'm glad we are taking steps forward with our investigation. Ashton mentioned that at Dakota Herring's bond hearing, District Judge Bill Scully set bond at $150,000 in order to satisfy his relias conditions. Should an offer of bond be posted for Dakota Herring, it must include wearing a GPS uncle watch and not leaving the country. On July 26, 1974, in Provincetown, Massachusetts's Point Dunes area, a 12-year-old girl was observed following a barking dog and coming across the body of an animal that had recently passed. Remains of a body were discovered near a riverbank, with numerous insects present nearby. Two sets of footprints led directly to it while tire tracks could be seen up to 50 yards away. Police believe the victim knew her attacker or was asleep when assaulted, so no fight ensued between the two parties. At the scene, neither beach blankets or sand were disturbed, suggesting that her body may have been transported there by someone. A blue bandana and pair of Wrangler jeans could be seen on her head. The blonde had long red or auburn hair which she pulled back in a ponytail using an elastic band with gold flecks. Her toenails had been painted pink. Police estimated she stood 5-6 inches, weighed 145 pounds and had a muscular physique. This woman underwent extensive dental procedures, with crowns costing up to $10,000 being placed and several teeth extracted, both hands and one forearm being missing and she being close to dying from strangulation. One part of her scalp was injured by what is suspected to have been a military entrenching tool. During an autopsy conducted two weeks before being discovered, it was found she had passed away. It is difficult to ascertain her exact age. It could possibly be less than 20, or possibly older than 40. At the time, some investigators believed that the lack of teeth, hands, and forearms showed the perpetrator was trying to conceal both their identity and that of their victim. Police conducted a comprehensive search through thousands of missing person cases, as well as a list of certified vehicles traveling throughout the region. However, no conclusive results or other tangible evidence was discovered beyond a bandana, jeans, ponytail holder, and blanket, even after conducting extensive searches in the region. Dunes investigators could not locate anyone responsible. She became known as the Lady of the Dunes after she was buried in 1974, after an investigation that was unfortunately concluded 
without further leads being revealed. Face reconstruction was first attempted using clay in 1979. Her remains were discovered for further examination in 1980, but no leads could be identified. In March 2000, her body was examined again so as to perform DNA tests. A CT scan of her skull was conducted in May 2010, providing images that would later be utilized by the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children to create a new reconstruction in 2014. One of the investigators working on the case contributed funds towards purchasing a brand new casket as its metal predecessor had become rusted and damaged over time. In 1987, there were several potential leads but none could be exploited when a Canadian woman told her friend that she saw her son's father strangle a Massachusetts individual in 1972. Police made multiple attempts to locate this individual, but were unsuccessful. Another woman claimed that the reconstruction of the victim resembled her sister who went missing in Boston in 1974. Yet this wasn't accurate. Investigators were also investigating Rory Jean Cassinger, then 25 years old when she committed her act of violence in 1973 after breaking out from prison. Authorities found a striking resemblance between Rory Jean and the victim. However, her DNA sample from her mother did not match up. Two other missing women, Frances Ewalt of Montana and Vicki Lighton of Massachusetts, had already been dismissed over time. Theories and suspects abounded in relation to this crime. Investigators realized in 1981 that an identical-appearing woman was photographed together with mobster Whitey Bulger. At the time of her alleged killing, Bulger was notorious for extracting her teeth. No proof could ever be established between Bulger and her death in prison in 2018. Tony Costa of Truro, Massachusetts, was initially suspected in this crime, but eventually cleared. Costa died on 12th, May 1974 and his body was discovered three months later in July 1974. Hayden Clark confessed to investigators he was responsible for killing his partner from the Dunes' life. However, the authorities soon learned he suffered from schizophrenia with paranoia, which can cause someone to lie about their confessions of crimes committed. In 2004, Clark wrote to one of his close friends informing them that he had murdered the body of a woman on Cape Cod, Massachusetts, and included two drawings one depicting an image of her lying prone and another detailing where the body had been discovered in April 2000. Clark led police to an area he claimed he had murdered two individuals. Twenty years before his declaration that he had killed several more individuals between 197 and 1990 in several states, investigators were unable to definitively link him with the murder of Dune's woman. In August 2015, it was speculated that this lady may have been an extra in the film of the same name, filmed at Martha's Vineyard between May and October 1974, in Mana Village, approximately 100 miles south of Provincetown. Joe Hill, son of horror writer Stephen King, brought this incident to police attention after reading The Skeleton Crew. While viewing its Fourth of July beach scene a few weeks ago, Hill noticed a woman dressed similar to those found on Stephen King's body wearing blue jeans and bandanas similar to those found on Hill's own body. Hill contemplated what would happen if an unidentified child victim from a film, like one of Hollywood's cult summer classics, were seen by millions without realizing they were looking at her. An investigator leading this case has expressed interest, yet others dismiss it as mere speculation and unsubstantiated claims. In 2022, remains of a skeleton were brought to AAM for examination. After studying these remains, a DNA-based profile was created that allowed researchers to locate distant relatives as well as identify who died. In October 2022, the FB Bi Field Office in Boston officially named Ruth Marie Terry as their victim and provided no details or indication that any potential suspects might not have been present at the time of her murder. The FBI announced that Ruth's identity had been established through their investigative genealogy method used to track down unidentified victims and over 150 criminals. Ruth Marie Terry was born September 8, 1936, in Whitewell, Tennessee, to Johnny and Eva Terry. However, Eva died at 23 after becoming pregnant after an unplanned marriage.
and giving birth in 1957. Ruth relocated from Whitewell to Leonia, Michigan for work with Fisher Bodie Automotive, but due to financial issues was unable to support Richard properly. Ruth agreed to permit Richard Hannett Sr., the head of her workplace, to adopt her son as part of their agreement to cover Ruth's expenses once that process had concluded. Once completed, Ruth left Leonia and relocated to California. Ruth attempted to contact the son she gave birth to in 1972, but due to an overdose of drugs, he wasn't ready. On February 16, 1974, Ruth married Rockwell Maven, who was an antique stealer, from Reno, Nevada. Just months prior to her passing away, Ruth and Maven visited family in Whitewell. Brittany Novengonski observed that Ruth did not act herself when in Maven's company and displayed possessive tendencies. After traveling to Chattanooga to visit Ruth Maven and Maven's half-brother Kenneth, as well as Carol, who had moved there after Ruth died, they remembered hearing Ruth Maven tell Kenneth and Carol that they planned on visiting America to search for antiques. Kenneth noted that Maven discussed moving Ruth back to Tennessee after reporting her disappearance from California. Kenneth mentioned they discussed making plans to go there when on their journey together during summer 1974. Maven traveled back from Tennessee to inform Ruth's family of Ruth's whereabouts. Jan Terry, Ruth James's sister-in-law, claims he stayed only briefly and told the family they weren't sure of Ruth's whereabouts. To locate Ruth James himself, her brother went to California and hired an investigator from a private firm. Ruth's family were advised by Ruth's private investigator that she had left the country of her own free will, following involvement with religious cults, over two decades prior to being investigated. All her belongings would be sold off. Ruth had been listed in family members' obituaries as deceased, leading some to suspect she may have entered witness protection and be unable to communicate with them. On November 2, 2022, some family members suspected Ruth may be part of such an arrangement. Massachusetts State Police released information regarding Rockwell Maven, Ruth's husband-to-be who was born October 27, 1923, and died March 14, 2002. Maven was adopted by Abram Albert Zadorsky, Maven, and Sylvia Lily Silverblatt. Malavan had an older brother named Michael J. Maven. By 1942, he resided in New York City and attended the American Academy of Dramatic Arts. Unfortunately, due to an infection in his mastoid, active military service for World War II could not be granted due to this. Mavan was married to Joe Ellen May Loop on May 11, 1946, while teaching in Bellew, Pennsylvania. The couple resided together between New York, California, and Seattle, Washington, where Mavan worked as a disc jockey before parting ways on July 16, 1956, six years after marrying. On September 30, 1958, in Cout, Idaho, Mavan married Manzanita Eileen Manzi Ryan. At this point, Manzanita already had an infant daughter from her previous relationship, and Mars, who at 18 was her lover. They vanished together on April Fool's Day, 1960, from Seattle. Mavan has since been identified as their primary suspect. Malavan managed to escape Seattle, but was arrested by the FBI upon trying to take an illegal flight route in order to avoid testifying about her husband's death. Malavan was never charged with killing either woman, but received 15 months for illegal flight, refusing to testify after their disappearance on July 29 and 19, 1960. Soon afterwards, he married Evelyn Marie Emerson of King County, Washington, before having another wedding ceremony on 10 August 1963 in Los Angeles with Evelyn Marie Emerson's family for another $10,000 debt they incurred when her disappearance occurred in 1961. Malavan then faced larson charges related to this fraud committed while Evelyn Marie Emerson was missing from Los Angeles. He was found guilty on all three charges and given a 15-year sentence, but in March 1962, his punishment was suspended with the condition that Maven pay back all money collected illegally. Anne Rule's 2007 novel True Crime features an extended examination of Maven's second spouse and daughter and attempts by police to link Malavan with crime. Malavan was named as a key suspect in both the murder of Henry Lawrence Redbeard, a 28-year-old bread truck driver, and in the disappearance of Barbara Jo Kelly, 17, in June 1950. 
Barbara was killed at Humboldt County, California on June 17, 1950, when she went out for a romantic rendezvous with her bear-loving partner's bear. Her body was discovered lying face up on the beach near Table BL the following morning. He had been shot through his back of his head, and other than socks and shoes, he was fully naked. Barbara's clothing was discovered folded neatly and neatly placed beneath all other clothes, with only her stockings and shoes being the exceptions. No sign of Barbara could be located. Malavan relocated to Chur, California, an isolated community near Silanese around 1985 according to his article, and has not been heard from or seen since then. Maven had decided to step down as executive vice president of Rodeo Store, located on Avenue in Beverly Hills. According to an article, he was employed by radio station Kazoo in Pacific Grove as a volunteer host of a three-hour weekly call-in show about growing old, changing priorities, and adapting. Additionally, he worked at a shop selling tobacco in Carmel. According to his death notice, he passed away peacefully at home in Salinas following a long illness. Born in Santa Fe, New Mexico, and described as an artist, painter, poet, actor, his spouse Phyllis Malavan survived him along with Joan who owned Towers of Salinas. On August 28, 2023, Capon Island's District Attorney Robert Galbois released a statement explaining that following their investigation, it has been concluded that Maven was responsible for an incident which took place with M. Terry in 1974. With this conclusion in place, the case has officially closed, with investigators now considering any evidence suggesting Maven might be linked with other crimes. Taryn Pad entered El Champ Food Store in Orlando, Florida, between 5 to 6 a.m., to prepare for his shift as an employee and was attacked by an unknown attacker, being stabbed multiple times while working the store. Since he had recently relocated there and worked long shifts, he did not have many acquaintances. Therefore, police quickly exhausted every lead they could in an effort to solve this crime and arrest those responsible. Finding those responsible for Terence's brutal death in 2003, after reviewing evidence at the crime scene and searching for new leads in their investigation, a DNA profile developed from these evidence exclusions were made. However, no culprit was ever identified, and thus the case became cold. Until October 2019, when Orange County Sheriff's Office hired Florida Department of Law Enforcement as helpers in their probe. They collaborated with AM to utilize latest DNA tests for genealogy building. AM used forensic-grade genome sequencing to generate leads that led to the identification of suspects in Terran Pet's investigation, using genealogical clues provided by AM and using it as part of their forensic genetic genealogy system to create an exhaustive genetic profile for potential suspects that would trigger it. After successfully creating this profile, AM provided it to police who then utilized genealogical research techniques in order to identify potential suspects who could have been activated by it. They verified his identity as 54-year-old Eustace Kenneth Robert Stowe Jr., who remains detained without bail as part of Taryn Pett's investigation. Kenneth Stowe Jr. was found guilty of first-degree murder and robbery with firearm in August 2023 and awaits sentencing. Carrie Ann Cummings was a 25-year-old transient living in Eureka, California in 1997. Carrie was admitted to an institution for mental illness treatment, yet decided not to stay. Even when family members begged Carrie to go back home, she refused their pleas and refused their treatment plans. Family was informed that she planned on staying in Eugene, Oregon for some time. They tried contacting her but failed. Eventually, they went to authorities to file a missing persons case as well as hire an investigator. Kathy claimed she was informed by Carrie's sister that Carrie had reached the age of adulthood, making the choice to live her own life without immediate threat to herself or anyone else, with no immediate decision makers available to intervene on her behalf. The sister also provided this insight regarding her attempts to locate Jane Doe over time. As internet use increased, I began searching sites in case I'd lost her and searching images that referenced Jane Doe's tattoos. One year after Carrie Ann disappeared, 
Wayne Adam Ford entered a police station in Eureka and found his long-lost love, who would later be known as Carrie Ann. Wayne Adam Ford entered an open seat. California Ford admitted to killing four women, but did not know their names. However, three have since been identified. Tina Renee Gibbs was born April 20, 1972. Tragically, she passed away near Las Vegas on May 16, 1998. Her body was later located on June 2nd near Button Willow. Lynette Dion, age 25, was found dead in Fontana and executed on September 25, 1998 in Ontario, California, before being interred near Loy Patricia and Thomas Thomas, age 29. HPUA located her body as her remains were discovered inside an aqueduct located in San Bernardino on October 23, 1998. However, one female was unidentified at this time. Investigators spoke with Ford and collected descriptive details about this person. As part of their investigation, detectives conducted a search at Ford's camp, using DNA to identify more remains from bodies discovered there by duck hunters near Eureka in October 1997, when his body part had first been brought there. Detectives were then able to link what Ford brought into the encampment with one discovered there by duck hunters from that month, October. Authorities discovered Ford's additional remains at Clam Beach in January 1998, nine months prior to his death and within his encampment. DNA samples were run through California Lost Persons Database, as well as the National DNA Unidentified Person Index without success. No matches to Ford's profile could be found in either database. Eight years after being charged with murdering her son, Ford was sentenced to life imprisonment at San Quentin State Prison. Investigators know who was responsible but do not yet have information regarding who the victim may have been. This investigation stands out in that neither party knows whose side it was on. William Hunnell had created the cold case unit specifically to review Humboldt County Sheriff's Office case files to discover new leads with OAM, a forensic genealogy lab, as their partner to use advanced DNA tests for forensics to help identify an unknown female or close relatives using DNA forensic syncing. They then created identity profiles of anyone they suspected could possibly be close by creating family trees until eventually finding the connection they needed to solve the case. Detectives contacted an intimate relative of a female who went missing in late 1990 and received confirmation from them that this extended family member had gone missing from her life. They contacted Carrie Ann Cummings' sister Kathy, who was believed to have gone missing. Kathy provided investigators with her DNA sample, which they then compared against that from unidentified female remains taken 25 years prior. Kathy could recall Carrie having an attractive facial structure. She was hilarious, smart, and an artist. Creating laughter through comedy was her specialty. However, mental illness can wreak unimaginable damage within two years of diagnosis and treatment. Sheriff William Hansel applauded his team, noting in a statement that while no words can bring back lost loved ones, this recognition could bring closure for both their family members and members of the local community. I am immensely appreciative of our investigators who never gave up searching for answers to cases still outstanding. It has been reported that Humble County Coroner's Division is in the process of releasing the remains of a caregiver, so she may be interred alongside family members. Catherine Spacito attended high school in Brooklyn, New York during the 80s, before moving to Prescott, Arizona, to enroll at Prescott College as an art major and avid hiker. On June 12, 1987, she moved into her new residence, where she quickly made many new friends. Kathy informed her friends during dinner on June 12 of her plans to go hiking early the following morning, June 13, at 700 a.m. Kathy rode her mountain bike directly to the trailhead and started uphill from there. Trail is located within Prescott National Forest, approximately 10 minutes from downtown Prescott, and has long been popular with hikers in the area. Soon after Kathy left, other hikers heard someone calling out for assistance. Unfortunately, due to dense terrain, it took some time before anyone located her, by which point she had died. 
At first, it appeared as though this grisly scene could only belong to Police Kathy, who were hiking through Yavapai County, when their thumb trail became insecure, and Kathy died as a result of blunt force injury to her left side, caused by two rocks and ratchet wrench discovered at the crime scene. Subsequent investigation determined her cause of death to be blunt force injury from two rocks striking together, as well as being struck in her eye using 22 caliber instrument that failed to enter her brain and struck an instrument with 22 caliber bullet that hit her eye with 22 caliber instrument, after which an instrument hit her eye using 22 caliber instrument struck through her eye using 22 caliber instrument, which hit her face using 22 caliber instrument, which never managed to enter her brain before going on attack again and making cut marks visible at back of her head area. Therefore, police began their investigations on scene. Searching for perpetrators proved extremely challenging due to a lack of witnesses in certain cases, proving extremely challenging in terms of investigations. Over time, investigators determined there may have been multiple perpetrators. Yavapai County, Sheriff David Rad advised everyone involved to keep all doors open. My team may be closer than ever before to discovering answers. If the case is solved, chances are DNA played a significant role. With recent developments of DNA tests such as family tree DNA tests available today, new breakthroughs could potentially solve it all. Yavapai's silent witness provided the reward, offering anonymous tips in order to solve cases more effectively. Sal Bazito flew in from New York to visit the crime scene, along with detectives. Sal asked anyone with information to contact him immediately. One classmate from high school sent an email out. I hope you'll forgive my posting this grim information here, but I'm sharing it in hopes that prayer and closure for one of our own may find peace now. Kathy Spacito was brutally murdered in 1987. The case remains open. Kathy had recently visited Prescott with her partner when it happened, and they visited some downtown stores together. On one visit, they saw an enormous window display featuring Kathy's picture. Despite this fact that police continue searching for those responsible, Kathy and her partner spoke with the store owner, who offered new possibilities that may help their search efforts. Recently, new evidence has surfaced which has renewed hope of solving this mystery. An alumni also noticed posters with similar slogans in local stores across the city. She was delighted to discover that memory of Kathy and her pursuit of justice were not lost to time. I thought you might find this information interesting, and please remember her spirit along with this investigation during 2021. Sheriff Rad commented on how 34 years can seem like an eternity, yet our department as well as cold case investigators still recall each investigation by name. What happened to Kathy? Our legal team is currently investigating. We have information regarding what transpired to Kathy, so we hope they take the necessary steps and speak up especially since Kathy's brother advised her in an interview conducted in 2021 that one should never give up hope of having an optimistic future. He vividly remembered the day when he received such a shocking and painful news. It was shocking and unbearable, something no one should experience. Unfortunately, this wasn't an accident either. Someone with extreme anger was looking to end her existence as soon as possible. Sal Bazito revealed their father died suddenly without explanation in 2010, and their mother passed away a couple of years later, leading him to speculate that it could have been due to heartbreak over events happening with Kathy. Sal concluded the interview stating he believes his mother passed due to broken hearts due to what had transpired with Kathy. Kathy Spacco died a horrid death on August 25, 2023, and Sheriff David Rhodes revealed at a press gathering that DNA evidence indicated Brian Scott Bennett as the suspect in her case. Sheriff Rhodes stated to reporters, I can state today with absolute certainty that Brian Scott Bennett killed Kathy Spacco. She was one of his serial predators. Bennett would have turned 53 by the time of his death in 1994, having just recently relocated from Calvin, Kentucky to Prescott for only 16 months before leaving Prescott High School in 1988 and entering temporary service with the Army before eventually leaving that branch and joining in 1989 when it reformed itself temporarily again. Bennett was eventually charged with forgery in 1991 and sentenced to three years of probation by Prescott Sheriff's Office 
despite never having been found guilty of violent offenses. Additionally, he was imprisoned at Arizona prison due to document forgery charges as well as wanted status during 1993. Investigators believe Kathy was Bennett's initial victim. Additionally, investigators believe he was also responsible for an assault against another female victim age 30 at approximately the same location on April 13, 1990. Her boyfriend was camping alongside her when Bennett came from behind and threatened her by throwing a boulder over her head, then attacked before fleeing back into the woods. Sheriff R. H. subsequently provided details at a press conference regarding an additional incident along the same trail, wherein DNA tests from this incident led investigators to a relative of Bennett. In 2017, using advanced DNA technology, investigators were able to connect DNA evidence found from the second incident with Kathy's story as told by Sheriff R. H.'s. Their DNA samples were sent off for testing at laboratories where female descendant Bennett could be found. After performing a tree analysis of family members, authorities traveled to Kentucky and then Bennett in order to ascertain if there was indeed someone related. Bennett's body was then cremated so they could obtain her complete DNA profile profile for analysis purposes. Investigators confirmed that both attacks along the hiking trail had the same DNA profile. Family forensics analysis continued. DNA was extracted through cheek swabs taken from Bennett's brother and sister of Bennett. Investigators were not able to locate the DNA from a wrench that ended Kathy's life until March 2023, according to Bennett's testimony, when they identified its DNA on a wrench used in killing Kathy. Bennett stated that a male suspect assaulted two female attendees of an event held in Chino Valley during July 1990 before assaulting one more who lay drinking before collapsing in bed for the night. Bennett followed Renee Sandal into her room, attempted to attack her, and attempted to open fire before witnesses were able to break down the door and force Bennett out before fleeing again. Later detained by Chino Valley Police Department, but cleared due to conflicting witness testimony. Sheriff Road identified Renee Sandal as Bennett's fourth victim from that incident on June 6, 1993, as she left her post. Prescott Bennett Police Office at Prescott Bennett forced Renee Sandal into her vehicle at knife point and assaulted her repeatedly before stopping it because the headlights weren't dimming properly, prompting Renee Sandal to flee. With Rad reporting that Renee believed her life may be threatened by this individual. Renee Sandal was 22 when she was kidnapped and assaulted. At Friday's press conference, she spoke of what happened during that ordeal as part of Renee Bennett's testimony. Unfortunately, he was released again, based on differing stories and insufficient evidence. Renee Sandal spoke at this press conference, as Renee Bennett wasn't charged due to inconsistencies between their accounts, as well as lack of evidence against him. When she said that it took an extended wait, my response was immediate. Thank God. I gave him all praise and glory because he was with me during prayer time that evening. His Lordship spoke directly with me as well, and is ultimately responsible for why I'm here today. Today, she is at peace. Kathy You are liberated. There are too many feelings I cannot describe to you in words alone. It is impossible for me to enumerate them all. Devil believes it's essential for young people, both younger and older alike, to keep an eye on themselves as well as be conscious of those in their surroundings. Be alert for anything suspicious. My grandchildren often hear me remind them about this fact as well, since mom's cold case detectives were able to link four distinct victim cases involving Kathy Renee Sandal and two others through DNA analysis, even though Bennett is not being prosecuted in these matters. Rad pointed out at a briefing for the press how such an act could occur in such a lovely location, raising doubts as to their significance and gravity. Authorities were inquisitive as to whether there might be additional victims beyond Kathy and three women linked with suspect. Investigators believe there may be multiple victims. The suspect continued to stress the serious nature of violent crimes. These predators noted it's highly likely, considering how frequently their actions occurred, that there aren't four instances existing of him being involved with these actions. 
Sheriff R.H. has noted that we accomplished our second purpose with this case by giving voice and answers back to survivors, as well as providing information back into the community. Volunteer detectives and their many colleagues spent much time and energy solving four cases today, providing relief, closure, or perhaps even validation to four women involved in those cases. Prescott Mayor Phil Good, who attended the press conference, expressed that recent advancements in DNA technology provide closure for those involved with cold cases, like Kathy Spacito. There is now more information than ever available that may help bring justice into people's homes. Jeremy Stoner was born in California on 16th of July, 1980, as one of three siblings, Jason, Joshua, and Justin being his older brothers. Growing up within Vallejo was beautiful in its own way, Jason being especially energetic, loving both family and friends as he attended school regularly while riding his bicycle to school while also playing with toys and watching cartoons. Jason boasting an exceptional smile with a large heart, both qualities which Jeremy shared as well. On 21st February 1987, at six years old, Jeremy was playing outside when tragedy struck, yet again. On this Saturday morning, 21st February 1987, six-year-old Jeremy was playing outside when tragedy struck, in Vallejo. Jeremy was playing outside with his two brothers, aged nine and eleven, near their house, when their parents went back to work being cared for by an auntie while their parents worked. This auntie abruptly had to leave abruptly in order to transport their sick daughter to an emergency room, instructing the boys not to go anywhere until their parents returned. Instead, they went over the neighbor's house where one neighbor reprimanded Jemmy for spilling ketchup before sending him home again at 400 p.m. when his mom came back home. At first, she assumed her boys had played with neighbors as they usually do. However, two hours after returning with him, Jeremy wasn't found anywhere. Vallejo police quickly learned Jeremy had been taken and believed his last known sighting occurred at Dairy Queen on Springs Road, just five minutes away. An employee there informed investigators they saw an adult male accompanied by Jeremy at about 7.30 p.m. that evening, four days later on February 25th, 1987. On Sherman Island in Sacramento County, Four motorists became stuck in the mud and stopped to look for something between their tires. Instead, she found Jeremy's body, assaulted by a group of thugs with stabbing wounds and strangulation injuries. As soon as police learned of this discovery, they quickly arrived on site to gather as much evidence as they could before storing it for later use. News quickly spread throughout Vallejo of what had happened, leaving residents shocked and upset about what had occurred to Jeremy Stoner. People sympathized with his family members and wanted to help in any way they could, sending cards, flowers, and even hugs as support, looking for him who had disappeared, holding candlelight vigils in honor of this man while offering prayers for both him and his loved ones. Vallejo Mayor Terry Cura stated that Vallejo residents played an integral part in supporting Stoner family during four days prior to his passing away. Residents cried, prayed and offered prayers on his behalf for four days prior to his passing away. A few short years after this tragic event took place, Vallejo residents grieved as soon after this news broke about this incident that the residents cried, prayed, offered prayers as it happened, and offered prayers before offering prayers on their behalf, and offered prayers on his behalf and offered prayers on his behalf during those four days, when his death took place just days later when it all happened too soon after Stoner family tragedy occurred, and it all unfolded, tragically ended in four days from time of course of Terry Kura, who stated Vallejo residents being an integral part of Stoner family during that period, and offered prayers on their behalf during that short four-day period, ended up playing their final role before Terry Kura officially stated they offered prayers, and gave prayers before being killed himself by police forces, before finally calling him for help for prayers over four days, before finally joined upholding him until finally lost cause that day, and offered prayers while Terry Cura stated Valle became mayor a few days before leaving Valed. It all too quickly before people knew where it all stopped, until Terry Cura himself stated, just four days apart when all involved. It didn't four day but not long Terry Cura stated B, 
it only four. It just days when Volley for four is mayor. Volley cried their integral part in four days out their final. He stated them off on Terry Kura confirmed the statement regarding him later. Then Terry Kura himself stated, It all were included within fourth. It soon. It quickly. And then had left Valet had offered prayers for four. Day when Valet did finally left. Valet was his passing away. Left Valet had his death. It soon turned off too soon. Too soon took too soon. He knew then it all soon became ceased. It just never had left this time that his statement about them to long enough. Because Valet. It. It became part. It didn't's mayor Terry Cura's mayor. As mayor Terry Cura as one finally became part four. It soon afterwards until after four days, but also, a, it only four, until Terry Cura, it only four days, it long when Terry Cura too, but long when Stoner family and Volley until then it too, until then was time too, it wasn't long, but soon. Its mayor Terry Cura later removed himself reaffirmed once more than it wasn't's turn. Soon enough time until Volley's only went, but only four, but only long. It had long, until, it too long, though before residence became in another family. Unfortunately before long too. Which also stated how long before residence became officially announced. Until last, and before before soon, before too sadly passed. But eventually, long, it's next. It became his turn. Soon too soon too. Until eventually passed for Valet as long as that. He remembered. Shaw Quincy Melton was arrested after coming directly to Vallejo Police Department approximately one week after Jeremy died and confessed that he might possess details regarding Jeremy's case based on self-admitted details about himself. Melton wanted to impress detectives with his amateur investigations by showing them his amateur detective skills. In other words, impress them enough so he could become one. But footage from Melton's interrogation revealed his gradual transformation from charming investigator to confused criminal suspect with turbulent background history and unpredictable mental state shown through his behavior during interrogation sessions, revealing more erratic mental state traits in which Melton's face showed. Sean Melton wrote The Wolf's Den, a story about child abuse. Although he claimed it to be fiction, some believed it may have been inspired by personal experiences he'd had. Melton visited the police station to share information regarding this case. He reported hearing of rumors and seeing certain events that could aid them in searching for the culprit. But police suspected Melton of involvement due to valid grounds. Prior to visiting, Sean Melton had informed authorities and informed them about his confession of disturbing fantasies regarding young boys raising concerns regarding risk posed by him as possible link between this confession and Jeremy Stoner's case. Police conducted a comprehensive 30-hour interrogation, asking various questions as well as administering polygraph exams, sketched pictures of his body compared it against that of witnesses during this process. Abductor's purpose was to obtain more information about Sean Melton and possibly ascertain his involvement in the incident. Melton denied any knowledge of what had happened, passed the polygraph test without incident, and claimed his sketch didn't correspond with witness descriptions, all while insisting. His only purpose was assisting police solve their mystery. Unfortunately, police continued searching for Sean Melton with an entirely new theory in mind, suggesting he may be hiding in plain sight all along. Sean Melton was diagnosed with multiple personality disorder. They hypothesized that one of his alter egos known as John Wolfe may have committed the crime while Sean himself did not remember any details surrounding it. Authorities took custody of Sean and charged him with kidnapping and killing of Jeremy. However, neither trial managed to produce enough evidence supporting this conviction resulting in disqualification by the judge and Sean eventually being freed from custody by himself. Melton died in 2000 without admitting his involvement in Jeremy Stoner's death and it remained an unsolved case until 2023, when DNA tests provided new clues and proof that allowed police to reopen it. DNA is an involuntary trait found inside every human being that helps identify them through unique genetic codes that exist inside our cells. This new technology provided another breakthrough and an entirely new direction, 
in which to investigate Jeremy Stoner. Police employed DNA tests on samples taken from Jeremy's body and those found in their criminal database in order to shed new light on his tragic case. Police soon identified an underlying pattern, leading them to suspect Fred Marin Kane III, age 69, detained at his Central Point residence by Oregon District Attorney Krishna Abram and eventually detained there as well. Kane's identity will likely come up during further investigations of his case, said Abram, who added, I am deeply thankful that Oregon District Attorney Krishna Abram provided such vigorous guidance throughout his case. Oregon District Attorney Krishna Abram said, I am tremendously grateful that we now know who did what we know and that we know who this time. Investigators remained relentless in their dedication to solving these gruesome cases. According to reports from 1984 in the media, Kane, who at that point was age 30 at the time, was accused of attacking a 17-year-old girl within San Bernardino County using a knife. Kane, along with his roommate, were later arrested and charged with forcible attack and use of an enhanced weapon, but were found innocent during trial later in 1984. Solano County District Attorney's Office issued a statement declaring it an open investigation, saying it would open investigation. Due to ongoing investigations, no further details are being released at this time. However, Can's arrest likely caught both police and Martinez's attention since its start. Eric Coy's disappearance was widely discussed shortly before it occurred in late January 1987, only one month prior. Eric would frequently ride between Martinez's home and that of family member. Eric left home at 11 a.m. Hopes were held out that he'd call, as was often done upon reaching his family home, which was only blocks away. When no call came through, search began in earnest until eventually his body was discovered near Martinez Junior High School, having been stabbed multiple times and succumbing to its wounds. Eric Kane's case remains open at present, and anyone with information should reach out to the District Attorney's Cold Case Unit of Solano County at 707-784-48477 as soon as they are aware. Kane was the first individual who appeared before a judge for trial in Solano County courtrooms on September 28, 2023. Family members, including Jeremy Stoner's mother, Karen Tabler, were in court as Kane was brought before it for prosecution. Karen stated, I don't know whether it's relief or feeling unwell, but one thing is certain. Further commenting that being with Kane could be hard work. Paul Secour, Solano County's Chief Deputy District Attorney stated, I don't believe you will ever find closure. In all my years as an investigator and advocate, I have yet to see families come to terms with their pasts fully. However, justice will eventually come. For now at least, it gives families relief that someone is being held accountable. On February 16, 1979, Monica Pritchett was born in Anniston, Alabama. She had two sisters and two brothers, and she was the daughter of Donald and Dorothy Pritchett. After being married, Monica lived in Heflin, Alabama, with her high school lover, Jeremy Rollins. Up to the birth of their second son, Aaron, their marriage was stable. The couple chose to live apart for reasons they never disclosed. This was true even though Monica was expecting their third child. Midway through 2001, Monica and the boys moved into their house on Sugar Hill Road. Every other weekend, Rollins could still see his two sons under visitation rights. Monica cherished her kids very much. Aaron was two years old, and Dalton was six. In just a few weeks, her third kid will arrive, and she was quite excited about it. Monica was going to name him. With two boys to raise and a full-time job to manage, Shane was a busy mother. Up until July 2002, she was employed at Kitty Castle Daycare. On Friday, September 13, 2002, she decided to take a higher-paying position at ITC Deltacom. Monica went to see her father, Donald, with her sons. After working at his Aniston house, Pritchett was finally able to offer his oldest grandson, Dalton, a gift. A Dalton filly by the name of Mojave was the present. At 8.30 p.m., the evening consisted of dinner games, horseback riding, and chat. Monica returned to their Heflin house with the boys. Later that weekend, they intended to come back and spend more time with Monica's father, 
and his spouse. But after the weekend went by with no word from Monica, family members made the decision to visit her and make sure everything was all right when they showed up at her mobile home on Monday, September 16. They could not have been prepared for what they were about to discover. Inside their house, Monica and six-year-old Dalton had been brutally murdered. Monica appeared to have gone into labor due to shock during the incident. The infant was discovered, not breathing, and only partially delivered. Aaron, age two, was discovered hiding in a closet, alive and unhurt. On the same day that the discovery was made, a relative dialed 911. At approximately 6 p.m., Monica's ex-husband left Southwire after his 12-hour shift and headed home. When the police showed up at his house a few hours later, they informed him of what had occurred. Officials said they requested him to come to the police station. After being cleared out as a possible suspect right away, Jeremy Rollins cooperated with the inquiry. Jeremy expressed his feelings after being ruled out and learning what had occurred to Monica and Dalton. It was astounding. According to early press accounts, stab wounds sustained at some point throughout the weekend claimed the lives of Monica and Dalton. When you live in a tiny town with less than 3,500 residents, you pretty much know everyone. Heflin is among those communities where a horrific triple homicide shakes the community's core, particularly when the victims included a young mother carrying her unborn child, her six-year-old son, and the perpetrator. The community was so afraid of this incident that people strengthened their home security and stayed indoors with their children. According to family members, Monica is a kind, patient mother who is terrific with children and always smiles. Debbie Clark, the director and owner of Kitty Castle, described her as a kind person who was constantly grinning. A young boy was really valuable. On September 19, 2002, funeral services were held in the chapel of Dryden Funeral Home for both Monica and Dalton. They were scheduled to be buried in Cedar Creek Cemetery, but first investigators felt they had to. Governor Siegelman announced on September 20, 2002, a $10,000 prize for information leading to the capture and conviction of the person responsible for this horrific crime. There were not many information released concerning the killing. The Heflin Police Department used the information as a tactic for their investigation, even years later. They thought that eventually the murderer would say something about the never-publicized killing, which would cause unrest. Of investigation verified that additional evidence, including DNA fingerprints, had not been gathered at the site and was forwarded to the Alabama Department of Forensic Science for examination. Processing was delayed at the time because the department was dealing with severe backlog problems brought on by financial restrictions. The Attorney General's Cold Case Unit was approached by Heflin Police Chief A.J. Benefield in June 2014, and new information led to the two authorities collaborating on the case. They resumed interviewing people, held meetings with the local prosecutors and the State Bureau of Investigation, and initiated fresh conversations. Officers at the time of the killings, Chief Benefield held the rank of officer. When a relative discovered Monica and her son's bodies, they called 911, and he and his partner responded. In 2014, Benefield said the following on the case. So really, there were three victims. The crime scene was the worst I had ever seen. Every day that passes, we are discussing this or working on it in some capacity. It is quite meaningful to us. Benefield made a vague suggestion in 2015 that they were considering someone they had known since 2002 but he did not provide any other details. The Alabama Attorney General's Office joined the investigative authorities in March 2015, and they have since made repeated posts on social media requesting further details about the matter. Sadly, no helpful leads were received, and the case was abandoned for a while. Captain Scott Bonner and Chief McGlawn reopened the case in 2021. They kept in regular contact with some of the family members and did their best to offer comfort, even though they were unable to share specifics because of the continuing investigation. They also sent numerous things to state and private forensic labs. According to Captain Scott Bonner, there is evidence and a suspect in this case, but at this point, the person poses no threat to anyone. 
my unidentified suspect is incarcerated in a different state for unrelated offenses. He said that investigators were able to apprehend Lewis Landon Spivey on June 26, 2023, more than 20 years after the murder, and charged with killing Shane and Monica Dalton. They did this with the aid of state grant money from Seasons of Justice and an actual truckload of evidence. The announcement was made public by the Heflin Police Department on June 30, 2023. It was a dark secret that Louis Spivey held to himself until his release from prison in Florida. When he did that horrible crime in 2002, he was 18 years old. He is currently 39 years old. They knew each other. They were romantically involved, according to Captain Bonner during a press conference. Bonner withheld the reason behind the killings as well as their prelude. Louis Spivey was sentenced in February 2010 for an unrelated robbery and aggravated assault case out of Bay County, and he has been incarcerated in a Florida prison cell for the past 15 years. Louis Spivey was taken into custody by Captain Bonner and Chief McLean upon his release from the Florida prison. Louis Spivey has subsequently assisted with the investigation, according to Captain Bonner. Before we launched the case, he was examined by other agencies early in the inquiry. Our investigation work produced several excellent leads. Bonner claimed that neither cameras nor surveillance photos were there. The things that you would have now were not available to us. Louis Spivey is said to have provided investigators with a comprehensive A confession, accepted full responsibility for the killings, and described the incident. June 29, 2023 was the day of the bail hearing. After finding that the requirements for applying a NIA statute had been satisfied, the court kept Louis Spivey in pre-trial detention without the option of posting bond. Legislation honoring Anaya Blanchard, a college student whose life was cruelly lost in 2019, is known as Anaya's Law. Judges may refuse to grant bail or parole under the bill, which attempts to toughen penalties for some serious crimes in Alabama. The law aims to prioritize public safety and protect prospective victims by keeping people deemed dangerous off the streets during legal processes for those charged with certain violent offenses and guaranteeing that they remain in custody throughout their trial process. Few specifics were provided by detectives regarding the circumstances that led to the case's break-in, but we do know of the confession, the department's receipt of a grant for DNA analysis, and the processing of many items by Canadian state and private labs in a statement on behalf of Mayor Robbie Brown. The family of Monica and Dalton received condolences from Chief Ross McLawn. With any luck, this will help you put a stop to this terrible phase of your life. Captain Bonner, the Heflin Police Department, and all the other organizations and people that showed steadfast dedication and tenacity in their quest of justice for Monica Dalton and her bereaved family have our sincere gratitude and respect. That was undoubtedly the most difficult case I have worked on in my career. Nevertheless, as the investigator and Captain Scott Bonner described, the box of reports and everything we had to go through took many months on its own. Bonner said that this case had grown personal to him and that he had likely spent more time with Monica and Dalton's family than with his own during the previous three years. He added, I feel great that I can give them some peace. Ingrid Rollins 2011 saw Monica's ex-husband remarry and he and his new spouse have twin girls. Aaron Clayton after completing high school in 2018, Monica's second son is currently in his early 20s. The family still calls Heflin home. After being sent to the Cleburne County Jail, Louis Spivey is currently being held without bond while he awaits trial. Thirty years old, in 1986, Teresa Scal, a compassionate nurse, was employed at Lakeland Regional Health in Florida. She cherished caring for her eight-year-old son, Jason, and assisting others. As a single mother living in a tiny apartment with her partner, Jason was her sole family. Teresa always had a smile on her face, and she had green eyes and brown hair. She was a gregarious and upbeat individual who enjoyed hanging out with her son in her neighborhood. She also had a large social circle at work. Viewing movies and reading books, she enjoyed learning new things and traveling as well. One day, she hoped to become a doctor and help save more lives. 
On October 15, 1986, while Jason was spending the night with his grandmother Betty Teresa, she also left his DNA on a cigarette butt he had left on the floor. Jason then tried to push Teresa and beat her with a knife. Teresa used every ounce of strength to fight back. She attempted to defend herself with her hands, but he seriously hurt them. Because he was stronger than she was, he severely injured her throat. Her body was left on the floor after he took her life. The following morning, he ran out of the flat. Teresa's mother, Betty, went to check on her when she failed to show up for work. Teresa's body was discovered in a bloody puddle. The police showed up when she called them. All of the evidence from the crime scene was gathered at the flat and kept for future use. Investigators interrogated a large number of individuals and pursued leads, but they were unable to identify the culprit, and the case was abandoned. Grady Judd, the Polk County Sheriff, finally declared the case solved on October 16, 2023. They were able to verify Teresa Douglas's injuries were caused by Donald Douglas. He and his brother co-owned an electrical firm at the time of the crime. At the age of 54, Douglas passed away in 2008 from natural causes. It was even more difficult to link Douglas to the case since he had no prior criminal record and was cremated after his death. Grady Judd, the Polk County Sheriff, was joined by two of Teresa's sisters and her mother Betty Scal at a press conference when Judd gave an account of how his department handled the issue, which dates back 37 years. Douglas lived directly behind the duplex, according to the sheriff judge, and although detectives spoke with him and other neighbors at the time, they never thought of him as a doubtful. According to the judge, Douglas had no visible wounds, and there was no basis for the detectives who initially looked into the case to accuse him. Judd surmised that Teresa killed herself because Douglas tried to get close to her, and she rejected him. Judd clarified that in the early 2000s, the FBI's national database was searched using DNA samples acquired from the crime site and the agency. However, due to technological advancements, no matches were identified, indicating that the perpetrator's DNA had not been recorded. Judd gave investigator Matthew Newold credit for spearheading the endeavor. After taking up the investigation in 2015, Newold promised Teresa Scal's family that he would not retire until he had found the criminal. He also placed a picture of Teresa Scal on his desk in an effort to solve the case. Newold collaborated with AM, a Texas-based business that specializes in creating genetic samples from crime scene evidence, utilizing DNA that individuals voluntarily provide through 23 and Me and other publicly accessible programs. The business assisted in constructing the suspect's family tree. Douglas's third cousin, who had conceived a child outside of marriage, was the target of one strike. What Polk County Sheriff Grady Judd called an extramarital affair in 1949 turned out to be a new branch in the family tree. According to AM spokesperson David Nutting, it was the 106th solution to an unresolved issue that had been made public. He added that after identifying Douglas as the culprit, there are an estimated 330,000 unsolved cases in the U.S. thanks to AAM's DNA study. His kid was approached by sheriff's investigators, who requested a sample of his DNA. The judge stated that he provided complete cooperation and was horrified to discover that his, the presence of Donald Douglas's blood at the crime site, was verified by a sample. Pam's Hugh first and foremost, Teresa was a beautiful and incredibly caring lady, according to Teresa's sister. Our family did not deserve this, and neither did she. She continued by saying that she attended respiratory school, began her career as a nursing assistant at the bottom, raised her arm and felt incredibly proud. Never have I seen someone so proud. She said, I did it, Pam. And a month after we had this, she passed away. Discourse. I hope that knowing who did this now will reassure everyone. In addition, I would like to encourage future victims by saying, law enforcement don't give up. As long as they don't give up, neither do you. As a warning to current stalking victims, Lyscaf, Teresa's other sister, claimed that although Teresa could not completely describe her neighbor, she did disclose that she had some uncomfortable experiences with him. 
Teresa had informed us about an unsettling neighbor who had visited her home. He had a rather stalker-like appearance, as if he had plucked a flower from the ground and slapped it into a pot. She had told us about him, but she never gave us a description, so if anyone is acting strangely, especially women, don't just tell your sisters, tell them what he looks like. Betty Scaff said, All I want to say is I am 84 years old, as she seized the microphone. I want this to be finished. That's probably why I lived a long life. In 2018, Sarah Ashley Hill, a mother of two, was employed as a waiter at a neighborhood diner in Patrick County, Virginia. She was 33 years old. She was well known for her gentle disposition, upbeat smile, and passion for dancing and music. She was very close to her sister April, who frequently assisted her with her kids. Out of her five siblings, Sarah had the only attractive red hair and vivid blue eyes. She used to get teased by her siblings, who would tell her she was adopted in June 2018. At 1.30 a.m. on June 6, Sarah was in North Carolina visiting friends. Using her cell phone, she called April and said she needed a ride since she was on Blue Hollow Road, close to Mount Airy. Sarah did not give an explanation for her early morning stroll. April was unable to simply leave her job, which was about an hour away. At Ellen's Chatham Memorial Hospital, she worked as a registered nurse. Sarah Hill was vanished by the time the family reached Mount Arai. They presumed she had acquired transportation somewhere or even managed to get into her own vehicle, a white 2000 Ford Taurus. April texted Sarah the following day to check on her and to ask if she still needed a ride. April never heard back. When April called back, the voicemail message was left. Sarah's phone had been switched off for two weeks. It was highly atypical for Sarah to be disconnected. April claims that they spoke at least once a week, if not more frequently. April mentioned that Sarah had a drug addiction and had a lot of questionable associates. She questioned whether it had anything to do with her sister going missing. Sarah was officially declared missing one month after her last sighting. After she vanished, detectives got to work looking into her disappearance. Her white Ford Taurus appeared at a business on NC-89 close to the intersection with Blue Hollow Road. Sarah was not named among the people accused of misconduct there despite the fact that it was captured on camera footage that the business owner obtained while attempting to apprehend shoplifters. When the police investigated the vehicle, they discovered Sarah's handbag, phone keys, and a few personal belongings, but they were unable to locate any evidence of her disappearance, such as fingerprints or DNA. The cops thought about every scenario in which Sarah might have vanished. They looked into any enemies or issues she might have had with anyone who could have hurt her. They looked into any indebtedness or financial issues that might have been the reason behind her escape. Investigators also investigated whether she had a history of substance misuse or mental illness, which could have influenced her behavior or judgment. They did not discover any evidence to bolster any of these arguments, though if she had any love relationships or household conflicts that could have resulted in aggression or jealousy. Three separate residences on King Park Circle in Mount Airy, North Carolina, were among the many sites the Sioux County Sheriff's Office examined during the investigation that began in January 2019. Following Sarah's final known movements, detectives surmised that she was in the Stokes County vicinity where she had been spending time. They were taken to an Ashbury Road property in Stokes County, North Carolina, where Sarah was last seen at the time of her disappearance. With a guy, this person of interest acted suspiciously, refusing access to his home. It was later found that the man had been charged with assault in 2012. Detectives brought in specialized personnel to use heavy equipment to move dirt and terrain and stabilize an existing structure on Monday, October 17th, 2012, when the Sweet County Sheriff's Office, the Stokes County Sheriff's Office, and the North Carolina State Bureau of Investigation executed a search warrant for the property of 1791 Asbury Road, Westfield, North Carolina. Human remains were discovered beneath the floorboards. On October 20, 2022, the remains were delivered to the Atrium Health Wake Forest Baptist Medical Center. On October 11, 2023, an autopsy was conducted 
and it was determined that the remains belonged to Sarah Ashley Hill. Leroy Hoover was detained and accused with killing Sarah, according to a statement released by the Stokes County Sheriff's Office. Hoover is still awaiting trail while being held without bond in the Stokes County Jail. He is still involved in other cases with the Stokes County Sheriff. We can only imagine how difficult this has been on the family of Ms. Hill investigators from the NCSBI agents that worked on this investigation, as well as the investigators from the Patrick County, Sioux County, and Stokes County Sheriff's offices, according to Joey Lehman. They never gave up and accomplished an amazing work. Nothing can bring back a loved one, but we can only hope that this gives M. Hill's family some closure. Patricia Chuka Bender gave birth to her only child, Susan Robin Bender, on November 27, 1970, in Modesto, California. She passed away on April 25, 1986. At 15, Susan left her family's house to spend the weekend with friends in Carmel by the sea. To get to the Greyhound bus station at 10th and G Street, she strolled. Susan ran into friends while she was waiting for the bus. She informed them of her coastal excursion and her intention to return in a few days. After their conversation was over, Susan made a call at the depot payphone. A full-sized, olive green 1977 Ford van arrived ten or so minutes later. Susan entered the car. Susan was last observed at this location. In the 1980s, it was not unheard of for a 15-year-old to have so much freedom. Bender, Pat. When Susan didn't return her usual phone call to her mother, she assumed that her daughter had arrived safely in Carmel and was enjoying herself with her friends. On May 1, 1986, her mother reported her daughter missing, which worried her. Investigators quickly concluded that a horrible thing had occurred to Susan, a detective revealed to the neighborhood publication. There is concrete evidence that suggests Susan Bender's disappearance was the result of foul play. The same newspaper was informed by Susan's mother that although Susan had fled home twice previously, she had always returned rather quickly. She claimed that before she vanished, things had been going well between us and that she had shown no signs of planning to flee. She said that Susan's phone book, clothes, and diary had been discovered in the possession of an unidentified male person of interest. His ownership. Pat went on, I fear a man who the police questioned but never arrested, attacked her. Despite having a lot of circumstantial evidence against him, they chose not to arrest him. The police always believed Susan was not missing her own voice. Detective Richard Ryau, who was assigned to the case until his retirement in 2000, told a newspaper in 1987 that he thought Susan was most likely not alive anymore in 1999. Susan's mother said in an interview that the police said there is little they can do without a body detective commented in that same year. Susan Bender just fell off the face of the earth. What is really strange about this case is that nothing has ever come up about her in all these years, and no one has ever come forward with any information about what happened to her. Also in 1999, Lauren Herzog and Wesley Shermantine, two childhood friends from Linden, California, targeted young women in and around the nearby Stockton area. There was some speculation that perhaps Susan was one of their victims. Many of their victims have never been identified. Authorities did not know if the men had anything to do with Susan's abduction, but it is possible, as she vanished in the time that they were busy with their evil deeds. Susan's disappearance fit their modus operandi for victims, but despite years of investigation into Herzo and Sherman Tyne's crimes, there had never been a link to Susan's case. They went on a spree in the 1980s and 1990s, taking the lives of several females and may have had more than 15 victims in the meantime. Remained unsolved for nearly four decades, investigators spoke to family and friends who fought to keep Susan's story alive. Sandy Silveria, a friend of Susan, commented in 2021, Where is she? What happened to her? Whoever did this, they have to be held accountable. In October 2021, the Modesto Police Department announced that they reopened the case in the hopes of finally locating the long-lost teenager. The department said in a statement that in reviewing this case, we identified potential areas of opportunity that may assist in moving this case forward. This includes the use of advancements in technology. 
Given the circumstances of the crime, we also believe there may be individuals previously unidentified who may have pertinent information surrounding Susan's disappearance. Modesto's cold case investigators were hoping that the many years since Susan's disappearance had increased witnesses' willingness to speak out. The police department said in a statement in 2022 that it is important to remember that Susan was a child with a family. Unfortunately, that family has gone 36. Years without closure or justice. It is our job as an agency to assist in providing some level of closure with the ultimate goal of getting justice. Then, on Thursday, August 17, 2023, the Modesto Police Department announced the arrest of Raymond Lewis Stafford, who is 76 years old. Stafford was arrested on August 15 in Wills Point, 50 miles east of Dallas, where he had been living for around five years. Stafford appeared to be hiding in plain sight for decades. Detectives got an arrest warrant on August 10, but it was not until on Tuesday members of the Van Zant County Sheriff's Department in Texas showed up at his home and took him into custody. He was arrested without incident and subsequently booked into the Van Zant County Jail and charged with taking Susan's life. Modesto police did not give further details about what they believe happened to Susan Stafford, who is currently incarcerated in Texas and awaiting extradition to California. Exactly how the detective zeroed in on Stafford as a suspect has not been detailed. Modes of police are differing. Questions to the Stannis County District Attorney's Office, saying there was no other information they could release. Newspapers and local radio stations did reach out to the Modesto Police Department and Stannis County District Attorney to learn what led to the suspect's arrest, but did not receive a response. No information was released about how exactly Susan might have met her end, whether there is any chance of recovering her body, or what new evidence resulted in the charges against Saint in a news release. Modesto police expressed their gratitude to the Stannis County District Attorney's Office, the California Department of Justice, and various Texas authorities for their help in the long and challenging investigation. It said the collaborative efforts of these agencies have been instrumental in bringing closure to Susan Robin Bender's case as detectives suspected foul play right from the start. They had a suspect nearly from the start, according to court records filed in Stannis County. Investigators at the time traced the green van to Stafford after he was arrested on suspicion of an unrelated burglary a month after Susan vanished. He had not been publicly named at the time. In the course of their investigation, they learned that Stafford had briefly worked with Susan's mother, Patricia Bender. At the time, she said that she believed Stafford may have formed a relationship with her daughter after calling their home phone. Court documents showed that Pat worked for Stafford for a few days back in 1985 at his security business. They also said she admitted to dating Stafford on a few thus. Stafford was well known to Susan. It was his rental van that Susan had been seen getting into at the bus stop. She got into his van without hesitation, according to her friend, who witnessed everything on the day of her disappearance at the bus station. A woman who lived with Stafford in the 1980s said he confessed that he strangled a female with a cord or wire and buried her near the Big Oak flat entrance to Yosity. He said, according to court records obtained, that he drove to a campground near the Big Oak flat entrance to Yosity. National Park and dug the grave less than a year after Susan disappeared. Stafford, then 38, ran for Modesto City Council. He was asked by the local newspaper about his criminal record, but told the paper in July 1985 that it was a result of him being in the wrong place at the wrong time. His arrests were listed as operating an unlicensed private investigator business and carrying a badge, saying he was a private investigator. Stafford said that his campaign was focused on policies to protect children from predators. We do not spend any time getting the people who are harassing our children. Unsurprisingly, he lost the election five months later, in December 1986. Stafford was convicted of setting a business on fire and pled guilty to making a false police report. He reportedly faked a kidnapping to avoid appearing in court. In 1994, he emerged once again on law enforcement's radar. He was put on an offender's register under alias Greg Tunningly for abusing a 13-year-old girl in California. New court records identify the man as Stafford Pat, 
revealed she always suspected Stafford was behind her daughter's disappearance. After she discovered the pair had carried on a secret relationship, Pat said, I have known. I have known from the start when my daughter came up missing. I have known that he was the person responsible. The investigators did not listen to me. Pat added that that thought had lived with her for the past 37 years. She continued, and it was like I was lost. People talking about their grandkids and their kids, Pat said the memories of her 15-year-old daughter were what kept her going. She remembered Susan as outgoing, funny, and just an average teenager trying to figure out where she fits. Pat never lost hope, but the quest to find her daughter was agonizing until now. She said she has had to lean on her faith. She stated, I'm grateful. I'm glad that the system has finally decided to step up and do something instead of having me wonder if those closest to Susan hope to learn where she is in hopes of giving her the farewell they always felt she deserved. Now in the final act, her mother says the one thing she has never wrestled with is forgiveness towards Stafford. I know this is going to sound kind of strange, but I have forgiven him for what he did to my daughter. I really have because I would not want to carry that with me for the rest of my life. Pat said this arrest has lifted a dark cloud from her shoulders. Now I am not looking forward to how the trial will play out. I just want Susan's body found. In July 1980, the remains of an unknown man were discovered in a wooden crate in the Chicago Greater Area Sanitary and Shipping Canal. The crate containing the body had been removed using heavy equipment, along with other debris from a grate that prevents objects from flowing and blowing into the power plant. The crate broke open sometime during removal and dumping by power plant employees. The body was found by an employee a couple of days later, looking for driftwood. Advanced decomposition made identification difficult. Items recovered along with the remains included several vehicle key investigators determined that someone had taken the unknown man's life as his autopsy revealed that he had been shot in the abdomen with a shotgun and then multiple times with a handgun. Investigators suspected that the man had lost his life several days before the discovery of his body. Investigators believed that the unknown white male was between 25 and 35 years old at the time his life was taken. They estimated that he was 5 and 11 in tall and weighed approximately 175 lebs. Investigators observed that he had a light brown to blonde hair that was approximately two inches in length at the time of discovery. The man was wearing dark blue work pants that had a laundry marked Jim 5, a green pullover t-shirt with pocket wool socks, and a single dark colored herringbone house slipper. Partial fingerprints were recovered from the body. They were submitted to both state and federal databases for comparison but failed to match anyone. Some dental evidence was developed, but did not match any known missing persons. For over four decades, law enforcement has diligently pursued November 2009. His case was entered into the National Missing and Unidentified Person System, and Stoddard testing was performed, but there was no match for anyone. Despite exhaustive efforts from law enforcement, the man's identity has remained a mystery with few leads for investigators to pursue. The case eventually went cold in 2022, when the Will County Coroner Office, as part of a long-standing collaboration with AAM, decided to leverage forensic genetic genealogy to see if they could establish an identity for the man or a close relative. Bill County Coroner's Office has contributed substantial funding towards the testing for this case, and the rest of the needed funding was crowdfunded using the DNA Solve platform. Skeletal evidence was sent to AAM, and a suitable DNA extract was developed. AAM scientists used forensic-grade genome sequencing to build a comprehensive DNA profile, and AAM's in-house genetic genealogy research team used the profile to develop investigative leads. The leads were returned to the law, enforcement, and a follow-up investigation along with confirmation DNA testing of a family member, confirmed that the 1980 victim was Webster Pfizer, born September 25, 1950. The Will County Carers Office announced on March 22, 2023, 
that the remains belonged to 29-year-old Webster from Chicago. Sergeant Mike Ernest said obviously, there were a lot of mob-related crimes back in that era, and a lot of those came into Will County, so is that a possibility we will explore? Yes, it is something I can say for certain, but I do not Webster's wife recently told investigators that her husband left home in mid-July 1980 to get cigarettes at a gasoline station about a block away, but never returned. Relatives said Webster was eventually reported missing to the Chicago Police Department. Joe Piper, a deputy coroner and cold case investigator with the Will County Coro's office, said this gentleman is somebody's father, somebody's uncle, somebody's brother. And it is nice to be able to give the family some kind of closure because they are looking and wondering whatever happened to their loved one. A group of kids playing off of Amherst Street in Granby, Massachusetts, found a woman's body on November 15, 1978, buried under a pile of leaves. Investigators were able to determine that she had been fatally shot in the temple. There was also evidence that the woman's body was dragged by a man's belt. It was estimated that her life was taken roughly three months before her body was found in August 1978. Investigators were unfortunately unable to identify the woman, so for decades she became known as a grandma's girl and was buried in a local cemetery with a headstone marked unknown on March 6, 2023. The office held a news conference at the Granny Police Station to announce the major breakthrough in the case. It was announced that the remains found back in 1978 belonged to 28-year-old Patricia Tucker. She was born on July 28, 1950. First Assistant District District Attorney Stephen G. said advances in DNA technology allowed them to find Patricia's half-sister in Maryland, who led them to her son. He was just five years old when Patricia vanished. Stephen Gagnier said that while it is satisfying to finally know who the Granby girl actually was, the investigation will not stop until we identify the person who took her life and bring the family an additional measure of closure and justice. This investigation has spanned decades and will continue until each and every possible lead is explored. Stephen G. said Patricia was married to Gerald Coleman and they were living on the shore of Lake Pecog in East Hampton, Connecticut, back in 1978. Coleman never reported his wife missing. He passed away in prison in Massachusetts in 1996, according to Stephen Gaynor. Coleman is now a person of interest in Patricia's case. Patricia had earlier gone by her married name, Patricia Heckman, Patricia Dale, and later Patricia Coleman, at the time of her disappearance. Anyone with information about the case should call Granby Police at 413-467-9222 or email jwhite at pd.org. Patricia's son, Matthew Dale, who is now 50 years old, also spoke and recalled his last memories of his mother. She was in the front seat of a stranger's car wearing a vest. It was 1978. Matthew was in the back seat on Nubby Upholstery, a man he did not know. Was driving, but Matthew vividly recalls the last words his mother ever said to him before she disappeared. She told me to go across the street to the playground. Matthew said, referring to a group home for juveniles, she said goodbye. Now in middle age, Matthew's memories are fuzzy. The facility was outside Boston. His father collected him the following day and raised him after his mother left him. Matthew has lived in North Carolina most of his life. He grew up dogged by the mystery of his mother's disappearance. Rumors swirled among family members, including speculation that Patricia may have entered the Federal Witness Protection Program. Matthew said that he was in his 30s when he accepted that his mother was no longer alive. My mother fell in with the wrong crowd. She was not a hiker like some of the stories said. Through the years, I've been told so many lies about it. His father passed away in 2015, and Dale has felt somewhat of a drift, although he is happily married, is a father, and has been a union electrician. For most of his life, several weeks before the identification was made, police showed up at his door. They asked him a few questions, explaining that they found him through his uncle in a DNA database. They said, Grandma girl, I thought, what is a Ramby girl? Matthew said state police investigators did not offer many details, but said they had accumed Patricia's body. 
Matthew had filed his DNA in a database in case his mother was ever identified. He sent investigators a file of his digital DNA profile, and they contacted him by phone within hours. He said it was a clear genetic match. He has scant keepsakes of his mom, a single photo baby book she created for him, a lock of his hair, and a small tapestry she painted when he was small. Matthew said he plans to arrange for a proper grave for his mother for years. The grave has been marked only with a wooden cross since 1998. Gry residents donated money to create a more dignified marker. Matthew said it was an awful end. What I want to do is have a new gravestone made for her. She deserves to have her name on it. On March 17, 2005, a hiker walking the Lone Mountain Trail in Carson City noticed a shoe sticking out of the ground and alerted authorities, who found the buried body of a woman wrapped in a sleeping bag. Authorities estimated that the woman had passed away about a year before she was discovered. Investigators followed the usual procedure to identify the woman, but were unable to, and she became a Jane Doe of the Carson City Sheriff's Office, brought the case to the DNA Do Project in 2019 to attempt to investigate genetic genealogy to trace Jane Doe's identity using DNA matches to build her family tree after a complex series of laboratory processes to extract DNA and translate it into a workable profile for a comparison to the millions of records in the databases. Volunteer investigative genetic genealogists get to work in May 2020. The DNA Do Project said that since research began, more than 13 volunteers have worked to connect the matches with family trees going back to ancestors born in the mid-1700s in England. It took a little less than a year to narrow the in a search of a single family. In the vast tree, three of the six siblings were women, and this lead was offered to the investigating officers to follow up. In October 2022, a family member's ancestry DNA test was uploaded to Gedmatch.com, a public database that can be used in law enforcement cases. After this DNA match, investigators confirmed that Jane Doe is Joyce Rogers Annis, originally from Michigan. In addition to providing the critical lead to this identification, the DNA Do Project team also provided information about a man associated with Joyce who later confessed to burying her body on Lone Mountain. It turned out that 72-year-old Joyce passed away due to natural causes and her husband Edward Barton buried her in the mountains. They were homeless and had no money for a funeral. Unfortunately, there is no way to prove or disprove Edward Barton's version of events, and the case is currently considered solved. Twenty-two-year-old Kyle Klinkscales lived in El Range. In 1976, the sports-obsessed young man was attending Auburn University in Alabama. At the university, he was beginning to search for his place in the world and map out what career to pursue. On January 27, 1976, Kyle left his part-time job at a bar in Larange and headed out for the roughly 45-minute drive to Auburn University, where he was a sophomore. Kyle never made it to the university when his parents could not get in contact with him. He was reported missing and nothing out of the ordinary was found at Kyle's apartment to suggest that he ran away or had moved elsewhere. Investigators believed that something happened at some point on his trip. They just did not know what it could be. The county sheriff's office and Kyle's parents intensively searched for him in those initial weeks after he went missing. Lakes were drained and rewards were promised. Deputies searched woodlands for a single clue for Kyle's parents. John and Louise Klingscales, the effort was a passionate, all-consuming quest, mirroring scores of other missing person cases across the country, with loved ones pleading for tips. Searchers growing wearier with each unsuccessful venture, and members of an exhausted community looking on a gasp that something so haunting could have happened to one of their own. The determination was the source of admiration for many. Kyle Klink Scales had always liked New Orleans, so his parents bought ads in the city asking for help to find their son. He had loved Hawaii when he visited on some vacation as a boy, so his parents sent letters to every police department in the state. When tips came in that a person had been found matching his description of a strong jaw, shaggy brown hair, thick eyebrows, 
They drove to the places where those tips originated two years after their son's disappearance. The clink scales had distributed nearly 5,000 bumper stickers, seeking information. They became supporters for families of others who had missing relatives and tried to call attention to cases not as well publicized. The clink scales were among those invited to the White House in 1985 to meet with President Ronald Reagan about ways to address the issue of missing and exploited children in their home, the same one where Kyle Clink Scales had been raised, and that was decorated with pictures of him smiling in and wearing a bow tie. His parents' drive to find their son would sometimes give way to fatigue. In an interview in 1978, John Clink Scales expressed unease. Maybe he said his son, who did not really like college, felt like he was a financial burden on his parents, Instead of dropping out or sharing his feelings, he might just have wanted to make it easier on us by disappearing. Every time Louise and John Clink Scales left their home in Lorange, Georgia to search for him, one of them would leave behind a note if their son returned while they were gone. They wanted him to know that a lot had changed since he was last seen in 1976. They loved him so the Clink Scales would write and there on the dining room table was a spare car key for him. Both John and Louise Klingscales submitted their DNA samples to investigators for testing in case their son's remains were ever found. Sadly, John Klingscales passed away in 2007. Louise passed away in January 2021 at the age of 92. A driver in Seta, Alabama, about 30 miles southwest of Lorange, was on a two-lane road on December 7, 2021, when he saw the hatchback of a rusted vehicle sticking out of the creek and called the authorities. It was a 1974 Ford Pinto poking out from the creek. There were human remains inside the rusty car and about 50 skeletal fragments encased in the mud. It was not clear what allowed the car to become visible from the road after all this. In February 2023, the Georgia Bureau of Investigation confirmed that the remains belonged to Kyle Clink Scales, the creek where the car was found in Chambers County, Alabama, outside of Lorange was never searched because the road would not likely have been Kyle's main route to Auburn, though it might have been an alternate one. Aaron Hackley, the coroner in Troop County, Georgia, said that it might take investigators months to determine the exact cause if they can pinpoint one at all given the age of the remains. M. Hackley said when she got the call from investigators that the remains had been identified. She called Kyle's Aunt Martha Morrison, who responded with relief and regret that his parents were not alive to hear the news. Human remains were unintentionally found in a sealed well close to an abandoned warehouse in Opino south of Vigo and close to the Portuguese border in February 2021 by a worker. The remains had undergone a process known as decomposition and had become severely the unidentified man's identity remained a mystery, despite investigators being able to establish that he had suffered a fatal blow to the head and other severe impacts to his body. This was because of a process known as saponification, in which bacteria that thrive in a warm, wet environment turn a body into a wacky, soapy substance that is completely unrecognizable. The DNA test results revealed no matches to any known or missing person in police databases. When the investigation came to a standstill in 2022, the Guardia Civil Police Force turned to Fernando Kula, a forensic scientist from the Institute of Legal Medicine in Galicia. Forensic facial reconstruction involves using a combination of anatomy, anthropology, and artistic interpretation to reconstruct a face from skeletal remains with the help of artist Alba Sanin. Dr. Kula produced six distinct images of the man's face, each with a slight variation in the man's facial hair color and amount. The photo is fashionable. Developed Perceptions A few weeks later, a Portuguese woman came forward and said she recognized her brother, even though she hadn't seen him in over three years. After the woman's account was verified by DNA testing, the man who had been missing for 20 years was found to be Carlos Alberto Vieira de Oro, a Portuguese native who had been operating a used car company in Vigo for 20 years. The 37-year-old Carlos's disappearance was traced back to October 13, 2018, 
by Guardia civil investigators who followed his movements until his death. Five suspects have been identified by the investigators, all of whom are thought to have varying degrees of involvement in a slaying that may be connected to scams Carlos committed when dealing with used cars. The investigating judge in Opino has remanded two of the accused men in custody and released on bail the third man who was allegedly involved. Dr. Kula has gained recognition for his ability to identify bodies and advanced stages of decomposition. He has worked at Darwin Cemetery in Falkland, where the International Committee of the Red Cross has spearheaded an initiative to provide names to over 120 soldiers from Argentina who are currently unknown. Additionally, he helped identify the victims of the 2004 Madrid Train B bombing. He also gave a face to Manuel Blanco Romasanta, the first known serial killer in Spanish history who murdered 13 people in the 1800s claimed a curse had turned him into a wolf. There has been no public update regarding the men who are suspected of killing Carlos Alberto Vieira de Oro. On October 6, 1982, at 4.30 a.m., a hiker discovered a man's remains close to Natural Bridges State Park in Santa Cruz County. Investigators discovered that someone had been robbing the unidentified man of his life for 41 years. The case remained unsolved until AM Labs entered into a significant collaboration with a developing forensic-grade genome sequencing company. AM is the first private laboratory in North America designed specifically to use forensic and crime scene evidence to create human identification. AM received a DNA extract from the victim's bones from the California Department of Justice, and they are working on cases similar to this one all over North America with great success. AM measured the amount of DNA that was actually present by performing what is known as a suitability analysis on it. AM labs can examine hundreds of thousands of DNA markers, which facilitates the process of tracing more distant ancestors and retracing one's lineage back to the direct family. In this instance, the victim's family was identified through genealogy. The FBI then became involved, and once they had a suspicion as to who it might be, they were able to confirm that identity through the use of some fingerprinting. After making that crucial connection, law enforcement was able to identify the body that had been known to investigators for so long as John Doe. The public was informed in October 2012 that 28-year-old Rodney's remains were found there the date of Alan Rumsey. Rodney's birth is May 25, 1954. Sacramento, California was his home. AAM Labs Director of Account Management, Michael Vogan, stated that while the case involving the unidentified human is still ongoing, they are currently looking into a completely different matter. Decades of family members impale the detectives and have an impact on the community. We celebrated, and it felt great, and now we move on to the next one. Rodney had a tattoo of a skull and a red rose with three leaves on his left forearm. The skull featured red around the eye sockets, three red-tipped feathers protruding from the head, and black braids. Santa Cruz Police Spokeswoman Lt. Karina Chinya. Authorities said that although there is still much work to be done, they will make an effort to get in touch with Rumsey's family. In Fontana, California, a city nestled within San Bernardino County, boasting a population of over 215,000 residents. This city is renowned for its steel mill and the California Speedway, offering not only an industrial landscape, but also a variety of parks and recreational activities for its inhabitants to enjoy. However, beneath its seemingly ordinary facade, Fontana holds a chilling secret one that unraveled with the mysterious disappearance and murder of a man in 1988. On the morning of June 8, 1988, Angel Martinez, a 27-year-old man, awoke before the sun had even graced the horizon. His day began like any other, as the dedicated owner of Arrowwood Apartments in Fontana. Angel's responsibilities included collecting rent from his tenants, and on that fateful morning, he gathered a bundle of cash rent money ready to carry out this routine task. 
Little did Angel know that this seemingly ordinary transaction would be the last of his life. As the day progressed, Martinez inexplicably vanished, leaving behind a community in shock and distress. The kind-hearted owner of Arrowwood Apartments had disappeared without a trace. His wife reported his sudden absence, and a frantic search began immediately, with friends, family, and authorities alike, eager to discover his whereabouts. The mystery deepened when, on June 17, 1988, Angel Martinez's abandoned car was found in the parking lot of a Duarte bowling alley. This discovery only raised more questions, as there was no sign of Angel, and his car yielded little in the way of evidence. Three days later, in the desolate expanse of the Arizona desert, a grim revelation was made. A lifeless body, buried in a shallow grave, was unearthed and identified as Angel Martinez. However, the scant evidence found at the scene and in his car offered few leads. Investigators faced a perplexing puzzle, with foreign DNA on Angel's clothing being one of the few tangible pieces of evidence. It became increasingly apparent that this heinous crime was likely an inside job, but the identity of the mastermind and their accomplices remained shrouded in uncertainty. Determined to unravel the truth, Fontana Police Department Detective Catherine Clark devoted herself to the case, knowing that justice must be served, no matter how long it took. With unwavering dedication, Detective Clark delved into the enigma surrounding Angel Martinez's disappearance and murder. Through exhaustive interviews with Martinez's neighbors and colleagues, a mosaic of the events of that ominous day began to take shape. It was revealed that Angel had scheduled appointments with several individuals, none of whom he met as he inexplicably vanished. Beyond this, investigators struggled to glean further insights, and the case eventually went cold, haunting them for 35 long years. Yet their determination persisted. After meticulously reviewing evidence and conducting numerous forensic tests, a breakthrough finally occurred on March 1, 2023. The Fontana Police Department filed murder charges against Kelvin Keith Emmons, a 63-year-old man whose DNA matched the foreign DNA discovered on Angel Martinez's clothing. An arrest warrant was issued, igniting a spark of hope in the prolonged quest for justice. On March 5, 2023, in a determined pursuit of justice, law enforcement officers traveled to Wisconsin, where Emmons resided. With the assistance of the De Pere Police Department, the moment that had eluded them for decades finally arrived. Kelvin Keith Emmons was apprehended, marking the end of years of anguish and uncertainty for Angel Martinez's grieving family. Emmons now awaits extradition to San Bernardino County, where he will stand trial for the murder of Angel Martinez. The resolution of this cold case stands as a testament to the tireless dedication of law enforcement officers and investigators in their relentless pursuit of justice for victims and their families. Fontana Police Chief Michael Dorsey lauded the unwavering efforts of all those involved in cracking this case, from the cold case detectives to the district attorney investigators. In a heartfelt statement, he expressed his gratitude for their relentless commitment to bringing justice to the Martinez family. This case serves as an inspirational reminder that one should never give up on unsolved cases even when decades have passed since the crime occurred. The Fontana Police Department shared this sentiment on their Facebook page, emphasizing that justice can still be achieved, regardless of how much time has elapsed. The story of Angel Martinez's murder, the perseverance of those seeking the truth, and the eventual resolution of this chilling case exemplify the enduring pursuit of justice in our society. Then in 2022, authorities made the decision to revisit the case armed with advanced scientific and investigative tools. Detectives were resolute in their determination to finally bring closure to a case that had plagued them for so long. By developing a DNA profile from evidence collected in 1970, detectives embarked on a new path of investigation. They compared this DNA profile to publicly accessible genealogical databases and embarked on the painstaking task of constructing a family tree. This led them to identify potential relatives of the suspect, 
a crucial breakthrough in their pursuit of justice. A DNA sample was obtained from one of these relatives, whose identity was kept confidential by the authorities. With bated breath, the DNA sample was tested, and the long-awaited breakthrough finally occurred. The suspect was identified as Forrest Clyde Williams. However, the excitement of this discovery was tempered by a painful realization. Williams had passed away in Salem, Virginia, in 2018 from natural causes. Justice, it seemed, would remain elusive in this case. The bitter pill to swallow was that they had finally found the man responsible, but they could not hold him accountable for his crimes. In a press conference held on March 10, 2023, the police announced this breakthrough in the case. They revealed that Williams, who was 21 years old at the time of Pamela's death, had faced a few minor charges in the early 1970s, but apart from an assault arrest, he had no significant criminal record. The police disclosed that had Williams still been alive, he would have been charged with Pamela's murder. At present, they have not ruled out the possibility of additional suspects and are appealing to anyone who may have known Williams during that time to come forward with information. While justice may remain elusive for Pamela's untimely death, the resolution of her case does bring some closure to her grieving family and the community that has carried the weight of this unsolved mystery for so long. In the quiet town of Hattiesburg, Mississippi, on the chilly day of January 13, 1954, a newborn girl named Pamela took her first breath. She was the eldest of three siblings, born to Mr. and Mrs. William Conyers. Pamela's early life remained largely private, but her journey would soon take a remarkable turn. Fast forward to 1970, and Pamela had blossomed into a talented high school student attending Glen Burnie High School in the suburbs of Baltimore. At school, she proudly joined the ranks of the school band, showcasing her exceptional flute-playing skills. Like most teenagers, Pamela cherished her family and friends, eagerly creating unforgettable memories. Life seemed to hold endless possibilities for her. However, as fate would have it, Pamela's life would take an unexpected and dark turn that no one could have foreseen. It was the evening of Friday, October 16, 1970, and the air was electric with anticipation for Glen Burnie High School's homecoming bonfire and pep rally. Pamela was among the enthusiastic crowd, cheering on her school's team and soaking in the festive atmosphere as the night wound down. After the event, Pamela headed back home with excitement brewing in her heart. Her next task was to plan her outfit for the upcoming school dance, and she had a particular idea in mind. She needed shoe dye to match her dress, and her destination was the Heronlel Mall, just a short drive away from her home. Pamela's mother, always supportive of her daughter's fashion choices, and eat her $5 for the show day at 8.30 p.m., Pamela left the house promising her mother that she would return shortly. She got into the family's car, a 1966 Dodge, and set off toward the mall. Little did Pamela's parents know that this night would mark the last time they would see their beloved daughter alive. If only they had possessed the furry sight to anticipate the harrowing events that lay ahead, they might never have allowed her out of their sight. As the night grew longer, Pamela failed to return home, causing her parents increasing anxiety. It was unlike their daughter to stay out so late. Their worries and concerns deepened, and eventually, they took the painful step of reporting her as missing to the local police. That very night, law enforcement officers sprang into immediate action, determined to unravel the mystery of Pamela's disappearance. Their investigation began by retracing Pamela's steps, commencing with the Herondale Mall, where she had gone to purchase the shoe dye. There, they discovered that she had indeed visited the mall and made her purchase, but what happened afterward remained shrouded in mystery. It was at this point that suspicions of an abduction began to emerge. The following morning, state and county law enforcement launched an extensive search effort, even utilizing a helicopter to cover as much ground as possible. However, it was as though Pamela had vanished into thin air. Two days later, on October 19, 1970, a man walking in the woods stumbled upon an abandoned vehicle. The car was situated in an overgrown field, about a hundred yards off Mountain Road Extension in Pasadena. 
Recognizing that something was amiss, the man promptly alerted the authorities. When the police arrived at the scene, they confirmed that the car was the same one Pamela had driven on the night she went missing. Yet, there was no sign of Pamela herself, and a crucial detail captured their attention. The car keys were nowhere to be found. This new piece of evidence deepened the mysteries surrounding Pamela's disappearance. As dawn broke on October 20th, 1970, the search for Pamela intensified as officers scoured the densely wooded area around where her abandoned car had been discovered. Among the officers present was patrol officer Robert Switzer, who would make a gruesome discovery. Pamela's lifeless body lay on her side, off a deserted farm road. She was dressed in slacks and a pullover which had been turned inside out. It was later revealed that her underwear was missing. As additional officers arrived at the scene, they were overwhelmed by shock and sorrow. They diligently collected as much evidence as possible from the crime scene, and Pamela's body was transported for autopsy. The news of Pamela's death sent shockwaves of grief through her family. The autopsy results confirmed that she had died from strangulation, leaving no doubt that her death was a homicide. The hunt for her killer began in earnest, with detectives tirelessly following every lead that came their way. Pamela's clothing, along with soil and dirt samples vacuumed from the 1966 Dodge, were sent to the FBI crime lab in Washington for analysis. Regrettably, the technology available at the time proved insufficient to yield any leads, and as time passed, the case grew cold. The unsolved murder case remained a haunting presence for the investigators, a stark reminder of a tragedy that had eluded justice for over five decades. Boulder County, Colorado, is renowned for its breathtaking natural beauty. With the majestic Rocky Mountains gracing the backdrop of Boulder City and the neighboring towns, this region is undeniably a unique and inspiring place to call home. But even amidst its serene charm, it harbors unsettling secrets. On June 4, 2006, two hikers stumbled upon a grisly discovery in South St. Frame Canyon along Highway 7 approximately 3.3 miles outside the town of Lyons, in unincorporated Boulder County, a badly decomposing nude body. The shock of their find prompted them to alert the authorities, setting in motion a dark and mysterious tale. Upon the arrival of law enforcement, it became evident that the human remains belonged to a woman. The district attorney's office noted that the body seemed to have been dragged to the location by a large animal from a shallow grave situated 20 feet away. Curiously, detectives uncovered a sleeping bag, a pair of yellow ski pants, and a pillow inside a pillowcase all neatly folded. The deceased woman had no identification on her, except for a cross ring adorning her left hand. Given the advanced state of decomposition, identifying her proved impossible. Therefore, investigators turned to other clues found on and around the body, delving approximately 14 inches deep into the gravesite. During their examination, Forensic experts uncovered roughly 50 pounds of a white, powdery substance, which subsequent tests revealed to be calcium oxide, commonly known as quicklime. An autopsy conducted by a coroner three days after the shocking discovery estimated that the woman had been deceased for several weeks to possibly several months. However, the cause and manner of her death remained elusive. While her body bore evidence of animal predation, no broken bones, stab wounds, or gunshot wounds were found. Strangulation was considered a possibility, but the advanced decomposition offered no certainty, and the pathologist could not find conclusive evidence during the autopsy to support a homicide. Instead, an artery blockage hinted at a potential death from a heart attack. Nonetheless, detectives retained their suspicions and continued to consider foul play. The circumstances surrounding the victim's burial before her body was dragged to its exposed state left investigators with a dearth of leads. Their desire for closure, both for the woman who had lost her life under these mysterious circumstances and for justice, remained unfulfilled. Initial inquiries within Boulder County's residents yielded no fruitful tips, leaving the victim unidentified for several months. It was only in the fall of that year that a significant breakthrough occurred. In October 2006, a woman contacted the Longmont Police Department, 
expressing concern about her long unseen friend, Angie Wilder, whom she had been unable to contact. The missing friend's physical description closely matched that of the remains found in the canyon a few months earlier. Additionally, the woman mentioned a distinctive ring that her friend was known to wear, similar to the cross ring found on the victim. With this crucial information, investigators were able to identify the missing woman as Angela Wilds. In November 2006, she was officially identified as Angela Josephine Wilds through a DNA analysis on the rib bones, comparing them to those of her four sisters. Angela was 38 years old when she lost her life. Curiously, none of Angela's family members had reported her missing or conducted further investigations into her disappearance. Detectives learned that around the time she vanished in April 2006, she lacked a stable home or steady employment. Her life revolved around living with friends, but beyond this, Investigators had little information to work with. Despite interviewing Angela's family, friends, and acquaintances, investigators remained no closer to unraveling the mystery of her fate. As investigators delved deeper into the case, they conducted DNA tests on the items discovered with Angela. These tests revealed the presence of unknown male DNA on the ski pants, sleeping bag, and pillowcase. However, it would take three more years to identify the contributor of this male DNA. On January 22, 2009, information reached investigators working on Angela's case from the Colorado Bureau of Investigation, CBI, indicating a preliminary match between the suspect's DNA and a man named John Michael Ankerer, who was incarcerated at a correctional center in Palmer, Alaska. Two months later, in March 2009, investigators traveled to Alaska and collected additional DNA samples from Anchorer, further solidifying their suspicions. On February 24, 2009, detectives from the Anchorage, Alaska Police Department took John Michael Anchorer into custody on a warrant issued by the Boulder County Sheriff's Office, charging him with the 2006 murder of Angela Wilds. As investigators sought to establish the connection between Angela and Anchorer, they managed to locate several individuals who claimed to have seen them together in late 2005 and early 2006. On August 26, 2009, a detective from the Anchorage Police Department conducted a formal interview with Anchorer. In this interview, Anchorer recounted attending a dive school in Texas in February or March of 2006 and subsequently living in various Colorado locations, including Canyon City, Longmont, and Monte Vista, until July 2006. He stated that he moved to Alaska in August of that year. Curiously, Anchorer denied any knowledge of a person named Angie or Angela, and when shown her photograph, he maintained that he did not recognize her, failing to provide a confession or substantial information. Despite the initial challenges, investigators persisted. In September 2009, they re-interviewed Anchorer, who again denied knowing the victim. He also denied being in the South St. Francis area around the time of the crime. However, his own family members contradicted his claims. Anchorer's parents reported that he frequently visited a cave in the South St. Francis area, located off Highway 7, approximately three to four miles from Lyons. He hiked and camped in the vicinity, and his sister recalled dropping him off there on occasion. In March 2010, investigators issued a court-authorized arrest warrant for second-degree murder charges against Angela Wilds. At the time, Anchorer was already incarcerated in an Alaska prison on a probation violation charge. Anchorer's preliminary hearing took place in the Boulder City Court on July 12, 2010. While the evidence pointed to him, including DNA evidence and witness testimonies, it fell short of conclusively placing him at the crime scene. Prosecutors also struggled to establish a motive behind the killing. Anchorer's defense attorney argued that there was no physical evidence directly implicating Anchorer in Angela's death, especially considering the pathologist's inability to definitively declare it a homicide. Judge Thomas Reed, after considering the evidence, determined that probable cause did not sufficiently support the charge and subsequently dismissed the case. Despite this setback, detectives remained determined to solve the case. 
Over the years, the Boulder County Sheriff's Office and the District Attorney's Office continued their relentless efforts, collaborating with the Colorado Bureau of Investigación and the Federal Bureau of Investigation. These efforts included conducting interviews with various individuals and consulting with pathologists. In 2005, a pathologist re-evaluated the case, concluding that Angela's death should be considered a homicide due to the circumstances surrounding her discovery, a nude body covered in lime in a remote wooded area. Although the specifics of her death remained uncertain, asphyxiation emerged as the most probable cause. Nevertheless, this evidence alone was insufficient to hold the suspect accountable for the victim's death. Several years later, in December 2022, a new witness emerged, altering the course of the investigation dramatically. This witness happened to be Anchorier's former girlfriend, who had separated from him between December 2022 and January 2023. In subsequent interviews, she revealed disturbing details about Anchorier's past, describing him as extremely jealous, possessive, and prone to mistreatment. She believed that he suspected her of infidelity and claimed that he had repeatedly strangled her during their relationship. However, when initially questioned in 2009, she had denied being strangled. Moreover, she believed that Anchorer harbored dark secrets, becoming particularly unstable and violent when consuming alcohol or drugs. The mention of certain women's names, including Angela, triggered his rage. In December 2022, Detectives also contacted two other witnesses who claimed to have seen Anchorer with Angela at the El Motel in Longmont, Colorado, a mere 10 miles from the South St. Francis Canyon crime scene. When examining the motel records, investigators confirmed that Angela and Anchorer had stayed there together between December 26 and January 4, 2006. Based on the accumulating evidence, both new and existing, the Boulder County District Attorney's Office presented the case to a grand jury on February 16, 2023. The grand jury subsequently indicted John Anchorer once again, this time for second-degree murder. Investigators now hold confidence that justice will finally be served in this disturbing case. Boulder County District Attorney Michael Doherty expressed their determination to secure justice for Angela Wilde's murder, offer closure to her loved ones, and provide answers to the community. On March 9, 2023, John Anchorer, now 53 years old, was arrested in Anchorage, Alaska, and extradition to Boulder City is currently pending, marking a significant step toward resolving the mysteries that have shrouded this case for far too long. Ada Pearson's arrival on March 14, 1982, marked a joyous occasion for the Pearson family. As the eldest among her four siblings, Ada possessed a natural inclination to care for her younger brother, Jonathan, as well as her sisters, Ashley and Joanna Pearson. Yet Ada's influence extended far beyond her immediate family. Everyone fortunate enough to have crossed paths with Ada described her as a radiant beam of sunshine. Her contagious laughter and quick-witted humor had the power to illuminate even the gloomiest of days. Her heart of gold left an indelible mark on the lives of all who had the privilege of knowing her. She served as a constant wellspring of inspiration and positivity. Upon her graduation from El Capitan High School in California in 2000, Ada embarked on a journey of self-improvement, enrolling in sign language and mathematics courses at Grossmont Community College. Alongside her pursuit of knowledge, Ada's heart found its counterpart in a young man named Michael Plummer, then 20 years old. Their love story unfolded organically, and eventually, Ada moved in with Michael, sharing an apartment on Bancroft Street in San Diego, California. Their union appeared unbreakable, and a bright future beckoned. However, fate had other plans, and tragedy struck unexpectedly, forever altering the course of Ada's promising life. The fateful night of September 4, 2000, would be etched into the annals of tragedy. A frantic call to the police reported gunshots erupting from Michael's apartment, sending officers racing to the scene. What they encountered was a nightmare beyond comprehension. The apartment lay in disarray, and amid the chaos they discovered Ada and Michael sprawled on the living room floor, 
drenched in pools of crimson. Michael's body bore multiple gunshot wounds beyond salvation, while Ada clung to life, her form riddled with bullets. Tragically, the horror did not end there. 21-month-old Julio Rangel, Michael's nephew, had also fallen victim to the violence, fighting for his own life. Fortunately, Julio's parents had managed to escape unscathed. The neighborhood was left shell-shocked, and authorities grappled to unravel the unsettling puzzle. In a desperate bid to save Ada and Julio, both were rushed to separate hospitals. Yet, the extent of their injuries proved insurmountable, and they succumbed to their wounds shortly after arrival. As detectives relentlessly pieced together the events leading up to this tragedy, a shocking revelation emerged. Mere moments before the gunfire erupted, Michael had ventured next door to procure drugs from a man named Sergio Lopez Contreras. However, upon returning with the drugs, Michael reneged on payment, infuriating the dealer. In a surge of rage, Sergio unleashed a hail of bullets from outside the apartment door, firing a total of 14 rounds into the living room, with devastating consequences. Once the truth behind the murders came to light, detectives were resolute in their determination to bring Sergio to justice. However, the cunning Druk dealer recognized the gravity of his predicament and chose to flee the country, escaping to Mexico. His evasion threatened to thwart the relentless pursuit of justice as detectives speculated about his whereabouts. It was believed he had sought refuge in Tijuana, where he had family ties, but leads grew scarce, and the investigation reached a disheartening impasse. The families of the victims yearned for answers, closer, and justice. Yet, as days turned to weeks and weeks into months, it seemed increasingly unlikely that the perpetrator responsible for this high noose act would face accountability. Their grief was compounded by the knowledge that the individual who had torn their loved ones from them remained at large, seemingly untouched, by the law. For two agonizing decades, they clung to the fragile hope that justice would eventually prevail and the perpetrator would be apprehended. Finally, in March 2023, after a protracted period of waiting, long-awaited news arrived. The police announced the arrest of Sergio, the primary suspect in the triple murder case, in Mexico on unrelated charges. While the specifics of his arrest remained undisclosed, this development infused a surge of relief and optimism into the hearts of the victims' families, who had endured years of suffering and uncertainty. At long last, there was a glimmer of hope that closure might be within reach. On March 22, 2023, Sergio, now 44 years old, was escorted across the U.S. border with the assistance of the U.S. Marshals and La Fiscalia General de la República. He was promptly booked into San Diego Central Jail, facing three counts of murder, along with special circumstances, including allegations of employing a rifle in the commission of the killings and lying in wait. The courtroom atmosphere brimmed with tension when he was arraigned two days later, on March 24, 2023. Appearing via teleconference, Sergio entered a plea of not guilty to the three counts of first-degree murder brought against him. The families of the victims, who had endured more than two decades of grief, expressed their profound gratitude to the law enforcement officials who had steadfastly pursued the case. With the suspect now in custody, their hopes rested on the legal system to deliver the justice they had yearned for over the years. It was a moment of renewed hope for the families, a glimmer of light piercing through the darkness of their long, painful journey towards closure and justice. In the serene Nakamixon Township, nestled within the rural confines of Bucks County, Pennsylvania, a tranquil community thrives, with approximately 3,000 residents calling it home. This picturesque area is renowned for its unwavering dedication to preserving natural beauty and promoting tourism. However, this peaceful setting was forever scarred by a heinous crime that unfolded in 1980, casting a long shadow over the region. On the ill-fated day of September 18, 1980, a construction worker toiled away on a cottage undergoing renovations. The cottage was nestled amidst the dense woods off Center Hill Road, 
approximately one mile south of its intersection with Kintner Hill Road in Nokomixon Township, in the midst of his labor, fate led him to stumble upon a gruesome sight, a lifeless body concealed beneath the wooden structure. This grim discovery shattered the tranquility of the forest, leaving the entire community in mourning and investigators grappling with an enigmatic puzzle. The lifeless body, upon its grim revelation, was conveyed to the morgue, where it underwent a thorough examination under the skilled hands of the medical examiner. The results were chilling. The man had sustained four fatal gunshot wounds to the head. The victim was subsequently identified as Richard Wesley Wheeler, his identity confirmed through a fingerprint match in the records. Armed with this critical information, investigators embarked on an arduous journey to uncover the layers of Wheeler's past, seeking to unearth the truth behind his tragic demise. As the investigation into Richard Wesley Wheeler's murder unraveled, a troubling revelation emerged. Wheeler had a criminal record. Having been released from prison just a year earlier in 1979, it appeared that he wasted no time reacquainting himself with trouble. He was soon linked to a perilous venture, an illicit methamphetamine lab jointly operated with two other men, Peter Eric Marshall and Leslie Schmidt. This lab was clandestinely housed in a camper parked near Lake Nakamixon, a risky endeavor fueled by determination. However, the enterprise took a sinister turn when Wheeler mysteriously vanished, and shortly thereafter, his lifeless body was discovered. Detectives understood that to solve this perplexing case, they needed to delve deeper into the workings of this illicit operation. It became evident that Wheeler was the mastermind, residing on the same property and closely overseeing the activities. The operation was further guarded by the formidable and loyal bodyguard, Peter Eric Marshall while imprisoned financier Leslie Schmidt, though detained, kept a watchful eye on proceedings. Fate intervened when Richard Wheeler, a former convict, found himself incarcerated once more for a previous crime, theft of boats which earned him the nickname The Captain. Schmidt, on the other hand, was serving a sentence in a different facility, but had entrusted Wheeler with a substantial sum of money for management. Their unlikely companionship flourished, leading them down a dark and perilous path. Upon delving further into Marshall's background, it was revealed that he had been imprisoned for stealing a 41-foot sailboat. Despite being ordered to leave the islands and deported back to Germany, Marshall's love for the sea remained unquenchable. He found work as a crewman on a private yacht, relishing the freedom and adventure of the ocean once more. However, in February 1977, while the yacht's owners were ashore enjoying an evening out, Marshall used his nautical skills to abscond with the 41-foot sailboat, along with a substantial amount of cash totaling $10,000. Marshall's audacious exploits continued when, just a month later, in March 1977, he targeted an even larger prize, a 43-foot sailboat docked in a harbor in St. Thomas, U.S. Virgin Islands. Marshall's insatiable thirst for adventure and penchant for eluding authorities were evident. Nevertheless, his criminal journey eventually led him to a federal prison in Danbury, Connecticut, in May 1977, where he crossed paths with two notorious individuals, Wheeler and Schmidt. Bonding over their shared criminal histories, the trio hatched a plan to enter the illegal drug trade upon their release from prison. Wheeler was the first to regain his freedom in November 1979, marking a pivotal moment in their operation. Later that same year, Schmidt was granted a 30-day furlough from prison, a decision that would significantly impact the methamphetamine operation. Seizing this opportunity, Schmidt orchestrated a critical connection for Wheeler, leading to the lease of a property in the tranquil township of Nakamixon. The collaboration reached its apex when Schmidt generously provided Wheeler with a substantial sum of $250,000 intended to support Schmidt's family while he completed the remainder of his sentence. Wheeler understood the weight of this responsibility and the need to use the funds wisely. In July 1980, Peter Eric Marshall was released from prison, but his newfound freedom was short-lived. U.S. immigration officials from JFK Airport in New York City 
were escorting him to his homeland of Germany, a place he had not called home since his youth. Marshall knew that he had to act swiftly to avoid an undesirable fate. As he boarded the plane, he covertly scanned for an opportunity to escape, and then, as if Providence had intervened, the pilot announced a flight cancellation due to mechanical issues. Amidst the ensuing chaos, Marshall seized his chance and vanished into the bustling crowds of the airport. In 1983, armed with a wealth of information and a growing resolve, investigators embarked on a renewed quest to unravel the unsolved murder case. Witnesses were interviewed, and through their testimonies the fragments of the puzzle began to coalesce. It was revealed that the trigger man of German descent had been hired by none other than Leslie Schmidt himself. The shooter's identity traced back to his time in Danbury Federal Prison. As the intricate web of connections and relationships slowly unraveled, it became evident that a tapestry of deceit and greed had precipitated Wheeler's tragic demise. The investigation posed formidable challenges, but through unrelenting determination, Bucks County Detective David Hanks eventually untangled the mystery. In 2023, Peter Eric Marshall reappeared in Upper Bucks County, but his return was far from harmonious. Tensions simmered between Wheeler, Schmidt, and the two businessmen, hurtling them toward a violent collision. Schmidt had grown suspicious of Wheeler, convinced that he was swindling him out of his share of the methamphetamine profits. In a fit of rage, Schmidt ordered Marshall to eliminate Wheeler, whom he believed had betrayed him. Marshall, who had been fiercely loyal to Wheeler for years, found himself in a precarious situation. Ultimately, he reluctantly followed Schmidt's orders, fatally shooting Wheeler, and then hastily fled across state lines into New Jersey. The investigation laid bare a dark facet of human nature, where the insatiable craving for wealth and power could culminate in unimaginable acts of violence. The once enigmatic cold case which had long cast a shadow of uncertainty, finally found resolution. The meticulous investigative work pieced together the missing elements, constructing a timeline of events that ultimately led to closure. The relentless pursuit of Marshall, who had vanished after the murder, resembled a relentless hunt for a phantom. However, investigators refused to yield, scouring every shred of evidence and pursuing every lead. In March 2023, a breakthrough emerged, a critical piece of information from Marshall's criminal history that would finally lead them to their elusive target. It was akin to finding a needle in a haystack when investigators unearthed that Marshall had been arrested in 1982 on drug conspiracy charges in New York. During that arrest, he had identified himself as Charles McLaren. Leveraging modern technology, Investigators matched the fingerprints from McLaren's arrest to those taken in 1977. This discovery exposed how Marshall had managed to obscure his true identity, assuming a new persona as Charles McLaren. Under this new identity, Marshall crafted an entirely different life, complete with a wife, children, and even a thriving limousine service in the bustling metropolis. For over two decades, he remained hidden, with his criminal past a distant memory. After years of relentless pursuit and the painstaking assembly of the puzzle, the Bucks County District Attorney's Office finally brought closure to the case, although the culprits had already passed away, Marshall in 2006 and Schmidt in 2022. Justice had ultimately been served for the victim and his grieving family. While the legacy of the crime and the names of the individuals involved would forever be etched in history. The resolution of the case serves as a poignant reminder that law enforcement perseveres in their quest for truth and justice. With the case now closed, the Bucks County District Attorney's Office can move forward, knowing that they have fulfilled their duty to seek justice and bring closure to a dark chapter in their community's history. Lake Worth is a coastal city located in Palm Beach County, Florida, and it boasts a population of approximately 38,000 residents. The city is well known for its vibrant downtown area, which is home to a variety of shops, restaurants, and art galleries. Additionally, Lake Worth features numerous parks and recreational spaces, making it an appealing destination for both residents and visitors alike. 
the city has a rich history, characterized by its Mediterranean revival architecture, but it's also the site of a tragic event, the brutal murder of a woman in 1985. To fully understand the backdrop of this crime, we need to rewind the clock to February 28, 1907, in Wilma, Arkansas. This was the day that marked the birth of a precious child named Mildred Warren. Mildred's arrival brought immense joy and hope to her family. She was the second of Jesse Warren and Margaret Warren's six children. From a young age, Mildred exhibited a heart full of love and a curious mind that thirsted for adventure. However, fate had different plans in store for her family. In 1915, tragedy struck when Mildred was just eight years old. Her father, Jesse Warren, suffered a fatal heart attack at the tender age of 37, leaving behind a grieving wife and six young children. Margaret, Mildred's mother, stood tall and resolute, determined to raise her children single-handedly. As the years passed, Mildred grew into a strong and independent woman with a heart of gold. Her innate desire to help others led her to pursue a career in psychiatric nursing in 1931, dedicating over four decades of her life to serving those in need. Along her life's journey, fate smiled upon her once more in 1940. At the age of 40, she met and fell in love with Harmon Matheny, a professor. Their bond was beautiful, and they exchanged vows in 1942. Three years later, they were blessed with a son, Gary Matheny, in 1945. Gary eventually got married and had two children of his own, bringing immense joy and love into Mildred's life as she embraced the role of a doting grandmother. However, life had more challenges in store for Mildred. Tragedy struck again when her beloved husband passed away in 1958, leaving her widowed at the age of 51. Despite the heartbreak, Mildred refused to be defeated by grief and found a new purpose in life by caring for her beloved brother, whose mental health began to deteriorate. With her nursing background, Mildred was well equipped to handle the challenges that came with caring for her brother, and she did so with grace and compassion. As the years went by, Mildred's health started to decline, and her memories began to fade away. She was diagnosed with Alzheimer's and dementia, which made it increasingly difficult for her to manage even the simplest of daily tasks. Nonetheless, her determination remained relentless, and she found herself needing more and more assistance with everyday activities. While it was heartbreaking for her family to witness her struggle, they were committed to providing her with the care and support she needed. Ultimately, it became evident that Mildred could no longer live independently and had to rely on others for help. The decision was made to relocate Mildred from her home in Arkansas to live with her sister Gladys in Lake Worth, Florida. This transition was not without its challenges, as Mildred's condition made it difficult for her to adapt to her new surroundings. Her mind often felt like a confusing maze, causing her to reminisce about visiting her long-departed parents at their childhood home, oblivious to the reality that they were no longer alive. Mildred's confusion grew worse with time, and she required constant supervision to prevent her from wandering off. Despite the best efforts of her family, it was impossible to keep a watchful eye on her 24-7. Tragedy struck on April 27, 1985, when a family misunderstanding resulted in Mildred Matheny venturing out alone in the afternoon. Her sister Gladys had last seen her around 3 p.m. that day, but less than an hour later, she reported Mildred as missing to the authorities in Lake Worth. The family's worst fears were confirmed when, seven hours later, at approximately 10 p.m., Mildred was discovered naked and unresponsive by passers-by on the desolate old Indian Town Road in Jupiter, Florida. The passerby immediately alerted the authorities, leading to the arrival of investigators from the Lake Worth, Florida Police Department at the scene. The sight that greeted them was gruesome and horrifying. A frail, naked figure lay motionless on the ground, surrounded by pieces of discarded clothing, with signs of a violent attack apparent. Blood and broken dentures were scattered near her battered body, and her head and face bore severe injuries. Mildred was barely conscious, and she was quickly rushed to Martin Memorial Hospital in Stewart, in critical condition. The assault on Mildred was beyond comprehension, and her injuries were so severe 
that even the hospital staff struggled to conduct tests due to her unresponsive state. Despite their best efforts, Mildred Matheny succumbed to her injuries 11 days later, on May 8, 1985, at the age of 78. On that fateful day, at 12 p.m., the medical examiner's report confirmed that she had been assaulted, and her cause of death was attributed to a homicide caused by cardiac arrhythmia, a skull fracture, internal bleeding and other injuries sustained during the brutal attack. While examining her body, examiners managed to obtain a genetic profile from swabs collected from her, revealing a mix of Mildred's and her assailant's DNA. However, the technology required for analyzing such DNA samples was not available at the time, so the genetic material was preserved, awaiting future advancements that could bring closure to the case. The case of Mildred Matheny's brutal murder quickly gained widespread attention. News of the heinous crime spread like wildfire, capturing the interest of news channels, publications, and the public across the state of Florida. Conversations about the case echoed in coffee shops, on the streets, and in homes. Investigators launched a thorough canvassing of the neighborhood, hoping to gather any information that might lead them to the perpetrator. It was during this intense investigation that a young couple stepped forward with crucial information in May 1985. The couple consisted of 21-year-old Ty Martin and 28-year-old Robert Steffi. They bravely recounted their encounter with Mildred at a busy intersection near a Burger King restaurant. Despite her frail appearance, Mildred stood out in her pink trousers and vibrant orange blouse. Concerned for her well-being, the couple engaged her in conversation for about 15 minutes. Suddenly, a 1967 brown Oldsmobile, two-door Delta 88 Holiday Coupe pulled up beside them, and a man with blonde hair and a missing front tooth claimed to be a neighbor, offering Mildred a ride home. Without hesitation, Mildred entered the car and left with the stranger. However, despite the young couple's report, investigators faced a frustrating roadblock in their quest for justice. They were unable to locate the car or identify the stranger who had offered Mildred a ride that day. Frustrated by the lack of progress, they turned to the media for assistance. In June 1985, a Crime Stoppers reconstruction was filmed in an effort to jog people's memories and potentially uncover new leads. However, even this effort did not yield a breakthrough. For the next 35 years, the case remained cold and Mildred's killer remained at large. Loved ones were left to wonder if justice would ever be served. Finally, in March of 2021, a breakthrough occurred, thanks to the relentless and dedicated work of the Cold Case Homicide Unit. They utilized the latest advancements in DNA processing technology to re-examine the case. The DNA samples from Mildred's case were submitted to the state's database, and a forensic scientist with the Palm Beach County Sheriff's Office took on the mission to uncover the truth. Despite the limitations posed by the previous analyses, which had depleted much of the swab's cotton tips, the forensic scientist refused to give up. Instead, she employed a clever solution by collecting DNA from the wooden bases of the swabs, utilizing cutting-edge software. Through this innovative approach, a partial genetic profile of the unknown DNA found on Mildred was created using the Combined DNA Index System, CODIS which holds a vast database of convicted offenders' DNA. This breakthrough provided a crucial lead in the search for the perpetrator. The buzz surrounding the long cold case was reinvigorated as news of the DNA match spread. The Florida State CODIS DNA database revealed a link between the DNA profile found in Mildred's case and the DNA of an offender identified as Richard Curtis Lange, a 62-year-old man born on April 13. 1960, in Florida. Lange had a troubling criminal history, with an aggravated assault conviction on his record by the age of 25. Shockingly, he had managed to avoid jail time on both occasions, receiving only probation. However, Lange's criminal activities did not stop there. Records showed that he was later convicted on weapons charges in both 2006 and 2012, spending some time behind bars. Lange's history of violence and brushes with the law raised questions about whether his unchecked behavior played a role in the heinous crime against Mildred.
confirmation of his involvement, required further investigation and a direct DNA saliva sample from Lang himself. To obtain this final confirmation, the sheriff's office secured a DNA confirmation search warrant against Lang. Detectives made their way to Lang's residence in Boynton Beach, Florida, which was approximately 10 minutes from where Mildred was allegedly kidnapped. They collected a sample of Lang's DNA, which ultimately confirmed the match to the DNA found on the victim. Despite Lang's vehement denials of involvement in Mildred's murder, the DNA evidence left no room for doubt. With the DNA confirmation in hand, the case that had remained cold for decades was finally heating up. The trial of Richard Lang began on April 5, 2021, in a West Palm Beach courtroom. The courtroom was filled with tension as all eyes were fixed on a small vial containing preserved genetic material, a tiny but powerful piece of evidence that had the potential to unravel the mystery that had shrouded Mildred Matheny's murder for decades. Prosecutors meticulously outlined their case arguing that the DNA unequivocally belonged to Richard Lang. The defense attorney, on the other hand, remained stoic, his focus on the judge as the evidence mounted against his client. The scientific evidence presented by the forensic scientist and her team of experts was indisputable. DNA analysis demonstrated that the likelihood of the genetic sample belonging to anyone other than Lang was infinitesimal with the odds being 27 quadrillion times more in favor of it being his DNA. Lange's defense attorney countered by claiming that such statistical evidence was misleading and insisted on his client's innocence. He suggested that the same likelihood could apply to Lange's close relatives, such as his father or brother. But without their DNA profiles in the CODIS database, this remained a mere possibility. To address this contention, Tiffany Roy, an experienced forensic analyst, suggested that Lange's defense attorney obtained DNA samples from Lange's close male relatives to demonstrate their genetic similarity and determine if they could be excluded as potential contributors to the DNA found on the sexual assault kit. Following Roy's advice, the defense attorney reached out to one of Lange's brothers, who consented to provide a DNA sample. The results confirmed what was expected a 100% match with Lang's DNA. As the trial continued, the prosecution vehemently challenged the defense's theory, asserting that it was baseless speculation. They emphasized that there was no concrete evidence to support the defense's claim that Lang's relatives could have been in Florida in 1985. Records indicated that Lang had only moved to Boynton Beach from Massachusetts in his 20s and had no known connections to Florida before that. After two intense days of court proceedings, the final verdict was announced, and justice was served. Richard Lang was found guilty of first-degree murder and battery, finally bringing closure to a case that had remained unsolved for 38 long years. Despite sitting in a wheelchair during the trial, Lange remained calm and composed, occasionally nodding off during slower parts of the proceedings. His silence spoke volumes as bailiffs escorted him out of the courtroom on May 27, 2021, under the watchful eye of Circuit Judge Dahlia Weiss, who booked Lange into the Palm Beach County Jail without bail. Gary Matheny, now 88 years old, fondly remembers a woman who was not just his mother, but also his friend and confidant. He speaks of her with great admiration and respect, describing her as a woman of many talents, articulate, creative, and talented. He cherishes memories of her sewing eighth-grade shirts out of hogfeed sacks, which, despite their humble origins, were just as good, if not better, than store-bought shirts. After decades, the book on his mother's case is finally closed, and Gary can find some solace knowing that justice has been served. Although justice cannot bring his mother back, he can at least find peace in the knowledge that her attacker has been held accountable for his heinous crime. The determination of investigators and advancements in DNA technology ultimately led to the resolution of this cold case providing closure not only to Gary Matheny and his family, but also to the community of Lake Worth, Florida, and beyond. Mildred Matheny's memory lives on, and her story serves as a testament to the tireless pursuit of justice and the enduring resilience of the human spirit. In the picturesque town nestled among the stunning mountains of Preston County, West Virginia, 
with a population of approximately 1,500 residents, Terra Alta stands as a testament to natural beauty and a rich historical legacy. The town's charm and welcoming community spirit have long been celebrated by its inhabitants. However, it was within this idyllic setting that a tragic incident unfolded on August 22, 1972, claiming the life of a 13-year-old boy named Jeremiah Matthew Watkins. Jeremiah, lovingly known as Jerry to his parents, James Edward Watkins and Enid Nicola, was born in a Morgantown home in Monongalia County, West Virginia. Unfortunately, his family's dreams of a happy and complete life were shattered when James passed away in 1976, just four years after Jeremiah's birth. Despite this profound loss, Enid displayed remarkable resilience and dedicated herself entirely to raising her son, hoping for a fresh start in life. Overcoming numerous obstacles, Enid made the decision to move to Terra Alta, determined to provide Jeremiah with the best possible life. Jeremiah, for his part, was content with life's simple pleasures. As he grew, his adventurous spirit became increasingly evident, as he could often be seen riding his bicycle through the hills of Terra Alta while singing along to the tunes of old-time rock and roll. It remains uncertain whether Enid ever remarried, but in the mid-1980s, she welcomed a daughter named Jamie Jeremiah into their lives. Jeremiah cherished his baby sister immensely and cherished every moment spent with her. He would play with her for hours, bringing laughter to her little world. Despite his gentle and patient nature with his younger sibling, Jeremiah eagerly awaited the day when Jamie would take her first steps, sharing candy and tender moments with her. The last time Jeremiah laid eyes on his beloved sister was in 1985, when he was 13 years old, and Jamie was approximately a year old. While the exact date is unclear, it was in early November of that year when Jeremiah left home to explore the town, but tragically never returned. When Enid could not locate her son anywhere in Terra Alta, she reported him missing. This marked the beginning of a distressing period, not just for Jeremiah's family, but for the entire state of West Virginia, as it coincided with a devastating flood that swept through the region. The flood, one of the deadliest natural disasters in West Virginia's history, claimed 47 lives, injured countless others, and caused extensive property damage totaling an estimated $580 million. Amid the chaos and destruction, the search for Jeremiah was severely hampered by the floodwaters. Despite the relentless efforts of law enforcement, the 13-year-old boy remained missing, and Enid clung to hope for his safe return. However, that hope was shattered on November 2, 1985, when officers stumbled upon a shallow grave along the railroad tracks in Terra Alta. Upon closer examination, they made a gruesome discovery. Jeremiah's lifeless body lay in the shallow grave. Initially, it appeared as though he had fallen victim to the devastating flood. However, a closer inspection revealed a stab wound on Jeremiah's body, suggesting a more sinister and violent end. The investigation swiftly transitioned into a homicide inquiry as law enforcement scoured the area for clues. Unfortunately, luck did not favor the investigators as the flood had washed away potential evidence, leaving them with more questions than answers. An autopsy revealed that Jeremiah had suffered a brain bleed from blunt force trauma to his head, but the fatal blow had come from the stab wound in his back. The loss of Jeremiah devastated his family, who grieved in silence while hoping for justice to be served. The Terra Alta detectives worked tirelessly, interviewing numerous individuals and pursuing every lead. But their efforts yielded no suspects or arrests. As time passed, the case grew cold, and Enid, frustrated by the lack of progress, attempted to move forward with her life as Jamie grew older. Nevertheless, the questions surrounding her brother's death continued to haunt her. In the early 2000s, while attending college, Jamie made the courageous decision to reach out to authorities in an attempt to uncover the truth about her brother's murder. Regrettably, her efforts were met with discouragement as many believed that finding the culprit after so many years was unlikely. In February 2023, Captain Tian Ticknell of the Preston County Sheriff's Office took it upon himself to revisit the decades-old unsolved murder case of Jeremiah. 
He delved deep into the case, meticulously reviewing old files, interviews, and witness statements. During this thorough examination, Captain Tishnell stumbled upon an interview with a young man named David Monroe Adams. Adams, who was only 18 years old at the time of Jeremiah's murder and a resident of Terra Alta, had provided a statement with inconsistencies, prompting further investigation. Authorities have not disclosed the specific inconsistencies that caught Captain Tishnell's attention, but they soon located David Adams, who was living in Westover, West Virginia. After several interviews, Adams initially denied any involvement in Jeremiah's death. However, during one of these interviews, he finally confessed to the murder. Adams revealed that on that fateful day in November 1985, he had engaged in a heated argument with Jeremiah over a stolen bicycle. This disagreement had escalated into a violent confrontation, with Adams striking Jeremiah in the face in a fit of rage. Unable to decide how to proceed, Adams dragged the injured boy to a nearby shed, where he ultimately fatally stabbed him. Afterward, he disposed of Jeremiah's lifeless body in a shallow grave near the train tracks. This confession marked a significant breakthrough in the case and provided a semblance of closure to Jeremiah's family, who had waited for justice for nearly four decades. David Adams, now 56 years old, was promptly taken into custody and charged with second-degree murder in connection to Jeremiah Watkins's death. He is currently being held on a $1 million bond in North Central. Upon hearing the news, Enid and Jamie were overwhelmed with a range of emotions. Although questions surrounding the murder still linger, they found solace in the fact that the perpetrator had finally been apprehended and could no longer pose a threat to anyone else. It was a bittersweet moment, one that allowed them to begin healing after years of uncertainty and anguish. In the 1980s, a sinister presence began to cast a dark shadow over South Florida, particularly in the Miami-Dade and Broward County areas. This malevolent figure targeted vulnerable women, leaving behind a trail of trauma and fear. Despite his anonymity, his method of operation remained consistent and horrifying. He would infiltrate their apartments, armed with a sharp object, often obscuring his face or theirs with a cloth, typically a pillowcase. His modus operandi included menacing threats, not only against the women, but also their loved ones if they dared to call for help. Once inside, he would restrain his victims, ransack their possessions, leaving them utterly defenseless, and subject them to unspeakable violations. All his victims shared eerie similarities. They lived alone, were attacked during the night, and the perpetrator seemed to possess intimate knowledge of their routines and apartment layouts. One survivor, identified as Catherine, recounted how the intruder had rifled through her wallet, knew her address, and even her name, instilling paralyzing fear in her. South Florida became a place of dread and apprehension as he continued his reign of terror. As fear gripped the community, the media was quick to broadcast news of this monstrous assailant lurking in the shadows. The situation was dire, and law enforcement realized they needed to act swiftly. Task forces comprising highly skilled and determined officers were established across the two counties. The stakes were high, and the pressure to apprehend the culprit mounted. Investigators tirelessly pursued leads, amassing an impressive volume of evidence, yet the identity of the criminal remained elusive. Unfortunately, the technology of that era was not advanced enough to process the evidence from the crime scenes effectively, so it was stored with the hope that future technological advancements would help bring the perpetrator to justice. However, a glimmer of hope persisted in the form of a rare O-blood type subgroup. By 1987, the trail had gone cold, and the task force set up to capture the enigmatic criminal was disbanded in 2019. Then Sergeant Cami Floyd, by chance, stumbled upon the case and became captivated by it. She poured countless hours into studying the evidence, determined to find a lead. Despite hitting numerous dead ends, she refused to concede defeat. In an unexpected turn of events in 2019, Robert Kohler Jr., a 29-year-old man, was arrested on charges of attempted burglary, domestic violence, and criminal mischief. Pursuant to protocol, his DNA was collected and entered into a federal database. Astonishingly, 
his DNA matched a sample collected from a December 1983 case in Miami-Dade. In this incident, a 25-year-old woman had been forced to cover her face with a blanket before being attacked with a sharp object, presumably an ice pick. Remarkably, she survived the assault, but there was a startling twist. Robert Kohler Jr. had not even been born at the time of the crime. This revelation implied that the perpetrator in the 1983 case was related to him, most likely his father, Robert Eugene Kohler. With the elder Kohler now a prime suspect, investigators delved deeper into his history and uncovered his unsettling past as a registered sex offender, having committed crimes in Palm Beach County in 1990. He had been sentenced to probation but violated it, leading to a 120-day jail term. However, because DNA collection was not mandatory at that time, no DNA sample had been obtained from him. Determined to build a watertight case against Kohler Sr., investigators decided to closely monitor him. On January 16, 2020, they meticulously followed him to a grocery store, collecting DNA swabs from items he touched, including a shopping cart and a door handle. These samples were quickly sent to the Miami-Dade Police Department's crime laboratory for testing, with results confirming a match with the DNA from the 1983 crime scene. This breakthrough, however, necessitated a final confirmation with DNA directly collected from Kohler's body. On January 18, 2020, law enforcement officers from various agencies and cities descended upon Kohler's residence in Palm Bay to arrest him. During their search, they stumbled upon a chilling discovery, a partially constructed dungeon sending shivers down their spines. Furthermore, they uncovered women's jewelry and a metal nail file believed to be trophies from his crimes. Following his arrest, fresh DNA swabs were collected from Kohler and matched with the original specimens from approximately 24 suspected cases. The evidence was damning, and detectives collaborated tirelessly with prosecutors to bring six sexual assault charges against Kohler Sr., including sexual battery, kidnapping, and burglary, among others. Just when it appeared that justice had been served, the Broward Sheriff's Office announced two years later that Kohler would face an additional six charges in their county. Kohler, however, remained steadfast in maintaining his innocence. The trial for the December 1983 incident commenced in January 2023, with prosecutors presenting a compelling case detailing the heinous crimes he had allegedly committed, including the murders of young girls, sadistic acts, and other atrocities. In contrast, Kohler's defense team argued that there was insufficient evidence to prove his guilt beyond a reasonable doubt. During the trial, the 63-year-old Kohler shocked everyone with his testimony. He claimed that he had been drugged, kidnapped and tortured by corrupt police officers who had extracted his semen and planted it at the crime scene. According to him, the motive behind this sinister plot was to justify increased police budgets. On March 16, 2023, the verdict was finally delivered, finding Kohler guilty of two charges, kidnapping while using a weapon and burglary with assault or battery while armed. The sexual battery charge had to be dropped due to the expiration of the statute of limitations. Kohler was sentenced to 17 years in prison for his crimes, though he still faced additional charges in Broward County, which could result in further years behind bars if he is found guilty. In the tranquil and idyllic region of Victoria, Australia, which has long been renowned for its peace and quality of life, a shocking act of violence shattered the tranquility on March 18, 1992. Geelong West, a part of Victoria, boasts a harmonious blend of residential and commercial areas, offering convenience and comfort to families and professionals while being in close proximity to stunning beaches and major cities. It is an area that prioritizes relaxation and well-being. However, the serenity of this neighborhood was disrupted when a heinous crime occurred targeting 29-year-old Annette Stewart within the confines of her home on Hope Street. Annette Stewart, born in March 1962 to Roy and Margaret Stewart, was a woman who had built a life for herself. She had two children, a 10-year-old son named Aaron and a 13-year-old daughter named Jacinta. 
Tragically, these children were left alone when their mother's life was brutally taken from her. Annette was employed at the Winchester Ammunition Factory in Point Henry, but little information about her personal life was available to the public. To her children, Jacinta remembered her as a loving and ever-present mother. Annette had a vibrant personality and a wide circle of friends who cherished her deeply. She was brimming with energy and positivity, making her sudden and untimely demise all the more devastating. Just two weeks before her 30th birthday, on March 17, 1992, Annette concluded her workday at approximately 4 p.m. She then went shopping in Geelong with four male friends, creating pleasant memories with them. After returning home, they enjoyed a leisurely tea together. However, it was after her friends departed that Annette found herself alone in her house on that fateful day of March 18th. The following day, a friend who had been Annette's former flatmate stopped by. Seeing her car parked outside, he entered the house with the intention of meeting her. Little did he anticipate the horrors he would encounter within those walls. Instead of a warm reunion with his friend, he discovered Annette's lifeless and unclothed body. A cruel electrical cord cruelly tightened around her neck. He immediately alerted the authorities, setting in motion a thorough police investigation. An autopsy of Annette's body revealed that she had suffered head injuries and had been strangled in a horrific and brutal manner, making strangulation the cause of her death. During the initial stages of the investigation, the police faced a dearth of leads and the case eventually went cold. It wasn't until 15 years later in 2007 that a coroner named Ian West identified Annette's co-worker, Craig Cameron Rogers, as the primary suspect. Rogers had remained a person of interest throughout the investigation due to the accounts he had provided to the police. Annette's sister, Jillian Stewart, expressed her relief at the discovery and noted that it aligned with their expectations. However, no charges were filed against anyone at that time, and the police continued to explore potential suspects and leads without success. In a desperate bid to unearth a substantial lead, the Victoria Police Department offered a reward of $1 million to anyone who could provide pertinent information regarding the case. This reward offer came in January 2020, and it led to a significant breakthrough. Detectives from Victoria and Western Australia began to connect dots between murder cases, and they ultimately arrested a 52-year-old man named Darren John Chalmers in Perth's Wembley area. Chalmers emerged as a prime suspect in the disappearance and subsequent murder of a 59-year-old woman named Diane Barrett in Medina. Chalmers, when confronted, admitted to his guilt in the case of Diane Barrett. He disclosed that after having a meal at Diane's place, which was his neighbor, he lured her to his house for tea and then brutally attacked her. He injected her with methamphetamine, strangled her with his hands in a metal bar, and inexplicably discarded her lifeless body in a remote brushland. Chillingly, when he watched news coverage of the case on television with a friend, he casually remarked, Yeah, it's a bit of a mystery, isn't it? Detectives seized this opportunity to inquire about Annette Stewart, and the pieces of the puzzle began to fall into place. While the police did not immediately press charges related to Annette's murder, they issued a strong statement to the media. They declared that they were no longer actively seeking other suspects, and that the investigation would center around their interactions with Chalmers. The authorities were confident that they had finally identified Annette's killer. Subsequently, after transporting Chalmers from Perth to Victoria, he was officially charged with the murder of Annette Stewart in March 2023. As Chalmers' case unfolded, many aspects of his troubled life were brought to light. Born and raised in Victoria, he had been a ward of the state since his teenage years. Throughout his life, Chalmers had endured abuse at the hands of both men and women, which had fueled his growing rage, particularly towards women. His history was marred by violent outbursts, often exacerbated by drug use, especially methamphetamine. In the case of Diane Barrett, he was sentenced to life in prison with the possibility of parole in 2040, marking the end of one gruesome chapter in his life. Following an extensive investigation, during which investigators became increasingly certain of Chalmers' involvement in Annette's death, 
he was placed in custody pending his appearance at the Melbourne Magistrates Court on March 20th. During this appearance conducted via video link, Chalmers could be seen wearing glasses and prison attire. He was not required to enter a plea at this stage, with his next court date set for June 13, 2023, when he is expected to face trial. The exact motive behind Enity's murder remains unconfirmed, but it is a tragic event that robbed the world of a joyful life and a cherished individual. In conclusion, the peaceful and livable community of Geelong West, Victoria, was forever changed by the violent crime that took place on March 18, 1992. Annette Stewart's life was tragically cut short, leaving behind two grieving children and a community in shock. The path to justice was long and complex, involving years of investigation and the eventual arrest of Darren John Chalmers. While his trial is yet to take place, the hope remains that Annette's family and friends may finally find closure and the answers they seek regarding her untimely death. Nestled in the heart of Knoxville, Tennessee, lies Buck Toms Park. It may not have been the largest playground in the city, but it held a special place in the hearts of many families. For those seeking a tranquil escape from the urban hustle and bustle, this park was a haven. During the day, the sounds of children's laughter and the creaking of swings filled the air, creating a joyful atmosphere. However, as the sun set, the park's serenity took on a different tone. Buck Tom's Park, under the cover of nightfall, often transformed into a sacred sanctuary for some, where they indulged in forbidden vices away from prying eyes. Yet, it was on a fateful evening, April 13, 1984, that this peaceful setting was shattered by a gut-wrenching discovery that would leave the entire community in shock and turmoil. What was uncovered among the trees and playground equipment that day would haunt the memories of those who bore witness to it. The unfortunate discoverer of this horrifying scene was none other than a young girl from the neighboring community. She was innocent-hearted and inquisitive, and she had been playing near the park when something caught her eye, a lifeless body. As she cautiously approached the motionless figure lying amidst a pool of crimson, a shiver ran down her spine. The woman's face was concealed, buried in the dirt and leaves, but even from her vantage point, the child sensed that something was terribly wrong. With her heart racing, the young girl edged closer, only to be confronted by a sight that would scar her for life. The woman's clothing was disheveled, and her body bore gaping wounds. The sight of a shattered knifey, with its blade and handle lying ominously nearby, sent shivers down the girl's spine. The brutality of the scene was almost unbearably, even for a child with innocence still in her eyes. Overwhelmed by fear, she ran towards the nearest adult, her voice quivering as she described the gruesome scene she had stumbled upon. Horror and panic gripped everyone who heard her account. The community was jolted into action, rallying concerned citizens who immediately contacted the authorities. In no time, Buck Toms Park, once serene, became a hive of activity as police officers swarmed the area, their faces reflecting disbelief at the brutality of the crime. They wondered who could commit such an atrocious act. With the utmost care, the investigators meticulously combed the scene, searching for any evidence that might shed light on the victim's fate. Every stone was overturned, every bush scrutinized, but their efforts yielded nothing. It was as if the perpetrator had vanished into thin air. Finally, the victim's battered body was loaded into an ambulance and whisked away, leaving behind a trail of unanswered questions. The victim was soon identified as Terry Lynn Majors Kirkland, a 23-year-old woman born in 1960 with roots in Knoxville. Beyond these basic details, little was known about her life, including her upbringing, schooling, and the events that led to her tragic end. The news of Terry's death spread like wildfire throughout the community, eliciting shockwaves of grief and fear. Her family, upon receiving the devastating news, was left reeling with heartbreak and disbelief. How could Terry, so young and full of life, meet such a brutal end? But Terry's family was not alone in their grief. The entire community was rocked by the tragedy. People couldn't stop talking about it struggling to come to terms with the violent incident that shattered their peaceful haven. 
The fact that such a horrific crime had occurred in a public space only added to the fear and paranoia gripping the community. Parents were afraid to let their children out of their sight, and even adults hesitated to venture out after dark. The once familiar streets and playgrounds now seemed to hold a sinister presence, a constant reminder of the darkness lurking beneath the surface. As the investigation progressed, the results of Terry's autopsy, conducted in Ontario, revealed a new and horrifying detail. Terry had not only suffered multiple stab wounds, but had also been struck in the head with a brutal blow. The investigation into Terry's murder soon became one of the most intense and exhaustive hunts for a killer in the history of Knoxville. Detectives worked tirelessly, conducting interviews, following leads and scrutinizing every scrap of evidence. However, despite their best efforts, the killer remained elusive, taunting them from the shadows. In a desperate attempt to crack the case, former Tennessee Governor Lamar Alexander offered a substantial reward for information leading to the capture of Terry's killer, but even the promise of a cash windfall failed to coax anyone forward. For the detectives assigned to the case, it was a frustrating and demoralizing period. Every lead seemed to peter out into a dead end, and every interview yielded nothing but vague rumors and hearsay. As the years passed, Terry's family was left to grieve alone, and it seemed as though the killer had gotten away with murder, with justice for Terry forever out of reach. After years of silence, the investigation into Terry Kirkland's brutal murder was reignited in 2018. Detective Jeff Day from the Knoxville Police Department was assigned to the case, and he was determined to bring the killer to justice. As he delved into the case files, he became convinced that the killer was someone who knew Terry intimately. The level of violence indicated a personal motive, and Detective Jeff hoped that someone in the community would come forward with information. In that year, they had a strong suspect, but couldn't reveal their identity just yet. As the investigation continued, the people of Knoxville wondered if justice would finally be served for Terry. February 2023 marked a month of new beginnings for the Knoxville Police Department as they launched a brand new homicide unit. This unit was unlike any other, comprised of a team of highly skilled and experienced investigators dedicated to solving some of the city's most heinous and brutal crimes. Their mission was clear, to bring justice to victims and their families, no matter how long ago the crime had been committed. The homicide unit wasted no time getting to work, and one of the first cases they took on was the unsolved murder of Terry Lynn Majors Kirkland. The case had remained cold for decades, but this new team of investigators was determined to find the killer and bring them to justice. They painstakingly reviewed every piece of evidence, re-interviewed witnesses, and followed up on leads, all in the hopes of finally unraveling the mystery of Terry's death. In March 2023, the Knoxville Police Department made a long-awaited announcement that sent shockwaves throughout the community. Less than a month after its formation, the newly established homicide unit had cracked Terry's murder case. While the authorities refused to divulge the identity of the suspect or the method used to identify them, they did confirm that the suspect had passed away in 2021. The District Attorney General's office had also deemed that there was enough evidence to prosecute the case if the suspect had been alive. The community experienced mixed emotions, relief that the case had finally been solved, yet frustration that the person responsible could not face justice. For Terry's family and friends, the announcement brought a sense of closure and peace after years of unanswered questions and grief. While the details of the investigation remained shrouded in mystery, the fact that the killer had finally been identified and held accountable offered some measure of solace. Perhaps one day the police will decide to share more about how they cracked the case, but for now the community can rest, knowing that the homicide unit achieved a remarkable feat in a short time. Todd Lampe, a man born in 1980 in Mississippi, emerged from a rather mysterious early life, with scant information available about his formative years. Nonetheless, one thing is certain. In 2002, he made a life-altering decision to leave behind his hometown in search of a fresh start. The picturesque coastal town of Hienges, 
Massachusetts, became his new haven, a place where he would craft a new chapter in his life. People who had the privilege of knowing Todd often spoke of him in glowing terms. Described as vibrant and charismatic, Todd was a magnetic force within the community, radiating positivity that drew people towards him. His welcoming nature and infectious energy left a lasting impact on those he encountered. He was, without a doubt, a beacon of optimism in the lives of many. Adding to his identity, Todd was also the proud father of three beautiful daughters, each born to a different mother. Despite the inherent complexities of co-parenting, Todd remained steadfastly devoted to his daughters. He tirelessly worked to provide for them, channeling his every spare moment into showering them with love and attention. Nevertheless, Todd's life was not an unbroken chain of sunshine and rainbows. He had encountered his fair share of adversity and run-ins with the law. However, Todd was resolute in his refusal to allow his past to define him. He possessed an indomitable spirit and was determined to create a better life, not just for himself, but for his loved ones as well. Tragically, the course of Todd's life took a dark and unforeseen turn on February 27, 2011. At the age of 31, Todd was enjoying a tranquil evening at his Hyannis home. His girlfriend Tyasha was present, as were the mother of one of his daughters, along with her mother, Deborah Cook Warren. Curtis Collins, a close friend of Todd, arrived, and the group gathered for dinner. Following their meal, they settled into the bedroom to watch a basketball game. However, this peaceful evening was violently disrupted by the sudden sound of gunshots that reverberated throughout the house. Todd's screams pierced the air, prompting Tiasia to rush to the bedroom in a state of panic. What she witnessed there would haunt her for the rest of her life. Todd, standing with blood pouring from his body, had been shot. She hurried to his side, but it was tragically too late. The tranquility of the evening had descended into a horrifying nightmare. In a state of panic, Curtis called 911, and soon after, the police and paramedics arrived at the scene. Tragically, they discovered that Todd had already succumbed to his injuries. The investigators meticulously combed every inch of the house, searching for clues to unravel this disturbing mystery. Their examination led them outside the front bedroom window, where they discovered three 22 caliber federal ammunition shell casings, indicating that the shots had been fired from outside. But that wasn't all they found. A sweet potato with a flat cut on one end was also discovered, suggesting it had been used as a makeshift silencer to dampen the sound of the gunshots. The detectives couldn't help but draw a connection to a scene from the HBO crime drama series The Wire, where a sweet potato had been used as a silencer to mask a gunshot. As their investigation continued, they found a Black Boost mobile cell phone in the grass near the corner of the house, which belonged to Curtis. He explained that he had lost it during the chaotic aftermath of the shooting. A day after this tragic incident, the autopsy report was released, revealing that Todd had suffered three gunshot wounds, resulting in fractured ribs and lung injuries, ultimately leading to his untimely demise. This devastating news only fueled the determination of detectives Jason Laborer and Thomas Chevalier to bring justice to Todd and his grieving family. The two detectives wasted no time and called Curtis in for questioning. Curtis provided his account of the events leading up to the shooting, admitting to using his blue Sanyo phone. However, during the investigation, suspicions arose when the detectives reviewed Curtis's phone records. The call history on the phone didn't align with the call records obtained from the telecommunications company. Calls made and received by Curtis from a particular number just before and after the shooting were mysteriously missing from his phone's log. It appeared that Curtis had deliberately deleted them, raising further doubts. Their inquiry led the detectives to a man named Tavares Hampton, the individual Curtis had been communicating with before and after the shooting. Hampton was already entangled in legal troubles and was being monitored with a GPS tracking bracelet at the time of the shooting. The detectives delved into the data recorded by the bracelet and uncovered shocking evidence. The GPS data indicated that Hampton had been in close proximity to Todd's home precisely at the time of the shooting. Days after Todd's murder, detectives Jason and Thomas saw an opportunity to extract answers when Hampton was arrested for an unrelated matter. However, their hopes were dashed as Hampton remained tight-lipped 
and uncooperative. Their persistence finally bore fruit on March 18, 2011, when two workers from Sullivan Engineering stumbled upon a firearm in the murky waters of the mill pond in the Marston's Mills section of Barnstable. Upon examining the weapon, the detectives were astonished to find that it contained live rounds of the same caliber as the spent shell casings found at the scene of Todd's shooting. It was almost certainly the murder weapon, but despite this crucial discovery, the investigation into Todd's death appeared to stall. Nevertheless, the detectives remained vigilant, particularly in their pursuit of Hampton. They were convinced that he was involved in some capacity and were unwavering in their commitment to uncovering the truth, regardless of how much time had passed. In 2012, a significant breakthrough occurred in Todd's murder case. Detectives conducted a DNA analysis on a potato found at the crime scene. The results revealed a mixture of two human DNA samples, with one belonging to a man. They obtained Hampton's DNA to make a comparison with the sample found on the potato. Unfortunately, progress in the case came to a halt until a stroke of luck in 2016. In October of that year, detectives observed Hampton spotting phlegm in a puddle and quickly collected it for analysis. In 2018, the detectives received even more incriminating evidence against Hampton. GPS tracking data showed that on the night of February 28, 2011, Hampton had made a stop at the mill pond in Marson's Mills, just 23 feet from where the firearm was used in Todd's shooting. Furthermore, the analysis of the phlegm yielded results indicating a high probability that the DNA on the potato found at the crime scene matched Hampton's. With this compelling body of evidence, it was evident that Hampton had a direct connection to the crime. On February 24, 2023, justice finally caught up with Hampton. He was apprehended and charged with murder and assault with a deadly weapon in relation to Todd's death. On the 12th anniversary of Todd's tragic demise, which fell on February 27, 2023, Hampton appeared in court where he pleaded not guilty. He was ordered to be held without bail, pending his probable cause hearing scheduled for April 5, 2023. A few days later, on March 7, 2023, Curtis, who had been considered a potential accomplice, was also taken into custody and charged with one count of murder. He appeared in court the following day and pleaded not guilty to all charges. The community held onto a glimmer of hope that justice would finally be served for Todd, bringing closure to a case that had spanned over a decade. The road to justice had been long and arduous, but the persistence of detectives and the strength of evidence had brought them closer to unveiling the truth behind Todd's tragic death. Battle Creek, located in southwest Michigan, is a welcoming town celebrated for its friendly neighborhoods and robust economic industry. As a thriving community in the United States, it boasts a diverse population of residents. Among those residents was an innocent 21-year-old girl named Ashley Parlier in the year 2005, a year that would forever change the course of her life. Ashley Parlier was born on October 16, 1983, to Sherry and Russell Parlier. She grew up as a shy and quiet child, with only a few close friends. Her family had always been concerned about her trusting and naive nature. Ashley's older sister, Nicole Campan, remembered her as a trusting soul who believed in the inherent goodness of people. Ashley saw the world through a lens of positivity, always hoping for the best in others. Ashley with her brown eyes and a beautiful smile that showcased her crooked teeth, graduated from Battle Creek Central High School and found employment at the nearest Taco Bell restaurant located on Northeast Capitol Avenue. At the age of 21, she was a lean and petite girl, weighing just 100 pounds. Her mental capacity was estimated to be that of a 12 to 14-year-old, which made her particularly vulnerable. In 2005, Ashley's life took a tragic turn. She found herself pregnant, a fact that deeply worried her parents, Russell and Sherry Parlier. They urged her to see a doctor and receive prenatal care, but Ashley resisted their intervention. Frustrated and upset, she left her family's home in Bedford Township, a neighborhood called Urbandale in Battle Creek, 
on June 12, 2005. All she had with her was $700, which she had been saving to purchase a car. Little did her family know that this would be the last time they saw her. Initially, her family assumed she had gone to a friend's house to blow off steam and expected her to return soon. However, as days turned into weeks without any sign of Ashley, their worry grew. Finally, about a week later, they decided to report her missing to the police. The authorities released information about Ashley's physical appearance, describing her as 5 feet 9 inches tall and last seen wearing a checkered shirt and blue jeans paired with brown leather sandals. The police received several tips from the public, indicating sightings of Ashley in different parts of the city, with a focus on the Houghton Lake area. Unfortunately, all these leads turned out to be dead ends, leaving her family increasingly anxious. As the investigation continued, suspicion turned toward Ashley's parents, who had not immediately reported her disappearance. Her father agreed to take a polygraph test and was cleared of any wrongdoing. However, Ashley's mother, Sherry, who was showing signs of Huntington's disease, declined to undergo the polygraph. Nicole, Ashley's sister, defended their parents, explaining that the family had been embroiled in an argument and they assumed Ashley needed time to process things and would return soon. In their small Michigan town, sudden disappearances were rare and they never imagined it would take years to uncover the truth. The police also looked into Ashley's ex-boyfriend, suspecting him to be the father of her unborn child. However, their investigation did not yield any conclusive evidence tying him to the crime. Despite their dedicated efforts, the police could not find any leads, suspects, or evidence related to Ashley's disappearance, and the case eventually went cold. In March 2021, officers renewed their efforts to uncover the truth about Ashley's disappearance. Detectives from various law enforcement agencies, including the Calhoun County Sheriff's Department and the Michigan State Police, joined the investigation. Sheriff Steve Hinckley even informed the media about the extensive efforts made to solve the case, including trips to California, Maryland, and Pennsylvania. A breakthrough in the case came unexpectedly when Pennsylvania law enforcement contacted Calhoun County officers in January 2021. They had found a lead in Ashley Parlier's case while questioning Harold David Holman III, a 44-year-old serial killer, about the murders of two other women, Tiana Phillips and Erica Schultz. Holman, seeking to avoid the death penalty, requested that all three cases be merged, shocking the detectives who had not previously connected him to Ashley's disappearance. Further investigation revealed that Holman had committed another horrific murder, this time admitting to killing Ashley Parlier. All that remained were the answers and reasons behind this heinous crime. Harold David Holman III was born on November 29, 1978, and had lived in Germany during his late teenage years. His criminal tendencies emerged when he was just 20 years old. On May 30, 1999, Holman was sitting around a campfire when he attacked Joseph Whitehurst, a 21-year-old son of an Air Force colonel. Holman felt threatened by Joseph's dancing and brutally assaulted him. Joseph was initially thought to be missing, but was later found outside Ramstein Air Base, bludgeoned to death with a club found at the crime scene. Holman's admission to this crime occurred after he was arrested for an unrelated offense and confessed to Joseph's murder. In Germany, Holman was tried as a juvenile, receiving a six-year term at a reform school. After returning to the United States, he pursued a career as a truck driver. Holman's partial confession about Ashley's murder led to the Calhoun County Police Department taking over the case. It was revealed that Holman had been a resident of Battle Creek between 2002 and 2009, and he had crossed paths with Ashley at a bowling alley. To everyone's shock, it was confirmed that Holman was the father of Ashley's unborn child. During further interrogation, Holman disclosed chilling details of Ashley's last moments. He revealed that after her argument with her parents, Ashley had come to his house in Emmett Township, Michigan on the evening of June 13, 2005, seeking help for a pregnancy test. An argument escalated, and Holman violently assaulted Ashley, rendering her unconscious. He then transported her to the Pennsylvania Hills, where he brutally bludgeoned her to death. Holman used a log to carry out the gruesome act and left her lifeless body in an overgrown field in Newton Township, 10 miles from town. 
He returned home, took a shower, and disposed of his bloody clothing at his workplace. Holman claimed that he felt deep remorse after killing Ashley and drowned his guilt in alcohol for weeks. He even revisited the location years later, finding only her skeletal remains. Holman's confession revealed his fascination with serial killers, particularly citing the influence of movies like Silence of the Lambs and the character Hannibal Lecter. When asked which homicide he remembered the most, he replied that he could vividly recall all of them and admitted that had he not been apprehended, he would have continued to kill. Holman, who had been diagnosed with schizophrenia, revealed that he had planned to kill again after several years. On June 13, 2018, he targeted a new victim, a mother of two children named Tiana Phillips, who subsequently disappeared without a trace. Similarly, on December 6, 2020, Erica Schultz, a 26-year-old autistic woman, had arranged to meet an online date named Dave. The date went awry, and Erica went missing, prompting her worried family and friends to contact the police. Law enforcement examined Erica's contact history and identified Holman as the prime suspect. On December 27, 2020, a Norfolk Southern police officer arrested him along railroad tracks in Duncannon, Pennsylvania, with a self-inflicted wound. Holman expressed a desire to die for his sins and confessed to the murders of Schultz and Phillips. While receiving medical treatment in the hospital, he was subsequently sent to jail. In jail, Holman wrote a letter to his ex-wife, providing a chilling account of his brutal actions in killing Tiana Phillips. He expressed that there was no real reason to kill Tiana other than seeking the rush he experienced during his murders. Holman nonchalantly described it as, just like another day in the park. It became evident that Holman was not an ordinary criminal. He followed a distinct pattern in his killings. He would incapacitate his victims with blunt force a trauma to the head, ensuring they were unconscious before attacking them. He would then dispose of their bodies without burying them and revisit the remains months later. Calhoun County Sheriff's Department Detective John Pignatero noted that Holman did not maintain a permanent address in Pennsylvania in 2021 and attributed his actions to a failed marriage. Holman held a distorted belief in alpha and non-alpha individuals, referring to a master-submissive dynamic. He believed that when his wife did not submit to him, he sought that dynamic in extramarital affairs. In a surprising turn of events, Holman eventually offered an apology to the Parlier family. He stated that he regretted Ashley's murder more than any other, but Nicole, Ashley's sister, could not accept an apology from a serial killer who had not only taken her sister's life, but also claimed three other innocent victims. Despite identifying the killer, Ashley remained missing, and her family continued to suffer. In an attempt to locate Ashley's remains, the police asked Holman to lead them to the area where he had left her body. As part of a plea deal with the Luzerne County District Attorney's Office, Holman agreed to cooperate in finding Ashley's remains in exchange for avoiding the death penalty. He guided Calhoun County Police to a wooded area at Six and a Half Mile Road in Newton Township, south of Battle Creek. Despite the involvement of nearly two dozen officers in a search on March 30, 2022, her body could not be located. Residents of the area recalled that the land had been farmland in 2005, but it had since been subdivided and sold to different property owners. Holman's inability to pinpoint the exact location where he had left Ashley's body frustrated the search efforts. Nevertheless, the police remained determined not to give up on finding her. In July 2021, Holman was charged with the murder of 21-year-old Ashley Parlier. Faced with the possibility of the death penalty, he pleaded guilty to the murders of Schultz and Phillips in September 2021 ultimately receiving two life sentences without the possibility of parole. Lucerne County President Judge Michael T. Val denounced Holman as evil for taking the lives of these innocent women for no reason. He described Holman's actions as unprecedented in his 30-year career. In February 2023, Holman pleaded guilty to the second-degree murder of Ashley Parlier. He was sentenced to 37 and a half to 60 years in prison during his trial on April 10th, 2023. Nicole, on behalf of her family,
delivered a victim impact statement during Holman's trial. She was joined by the older sisters of other victims from Pennsylvania who had connected with her through a Facebook group called Bring Ashley Home. They found solace in their shared grief and vowed to remember their sisters for their goodness and kindness, not the man who took their lives. Calhoun County Sheriff Steve Hinckley continued to seek any information that could aid in resolving Ashley Parlier's case, which finally received some closure after 18 years of uncertainty and anguish. While Ashley's family may never fully recover from the tragedy, the identification and sentencing of her killer brought a sense of justice to a grieving community that had searched tirelessly for answers. Nancy McKeevers came into the world on October 16, 1954, in Portland, Oregon. She was born to proud parents, Henry Carl Pepper and Lenore Pepper. Nancy was the middle child in her family, having an older sister named Janet and a younger sister named Diane. From an early age, Nancy played a crucial role in keeping her family close-knit and harmonious. Her sisters fondly remember her as the peacemaker, possessing a heart brimming with love and a laid-back personality that strengthened their bond. Nancy's educational journey led her to Reynolds High School, where she excelled both academically and socially. With big dreams and a promising future ahead, she decided to pursue higher education at the esteemed Oregon State University. As she pursued her dreams, fate intervened in the form of Randall, the love of her life. The exact details of their initial meeting remain shrouded in mystery, but it quickly became apparent that their love story was destined to unfold. The couple tied the knot and settled in the peaceful city of Teagard, Oregon, where they soon welcomed their bundle of joy, Baby Ross, around 1982, completing their idyllic family picture. However, as life often does, it took an unexpected turn. On the bleak winter morning of January 2, 1983, Tragedy struck the tranquil suburb of Teagard. A frantic call reached the local sheriff's office, with Randall, Nancy's husband, reporting a devastating incident. His wife had taken her own life. Deputies sprang into action, racing to the couple's residence to assess the situation. What they encountered upon arrival sent shivers down their spines. Nancy lay lifeless on the floor, a gunshot wound to her head, with a Smith & Wesson revolver nearby, the apparent instrument of her demise. Randall stood nearby, visibly distraught, with their young son at his side. The deputies wasted no time and rushed Nancy to the nearest hospital, but their efforts were in vain. Despite their best attempts, she was declared dead. As investigators sought answers, they turned to Randall for an explanation. His account of the events was initially perplexing. He claimed there had been a struggle over the gun, with him attempting to wrest it from Nancy before it was too late. However, as the investigation unfolded, Randall's narrative underwent a transformation. Now he asserted that he had merely walked in on Nancy as she pulled the trigger, with no physical altercation. Detectives were left perplexed, grappling with the challenge of uncovering the truth behind this tragic incident. Despite the initial assertion of suicide by Randall, their suspicions were piqued. They understood the need to delve deeper into the available evidence, seeking the assistance of the Washington County Medical Examiner's Office, the Oregon State Police Medical Examiner's Office, and the Oregon State Police Crime Lab. These agencies embarked on a meticulous examination of the crime scene, collecting forensic evidence and scrutinizing the gun allegedly used by Nancy. As the evidence was scrutinized, discrepancies began to emerge. Nancy's hands showed no traces of gunpowder residue, indicating that she had not fired the weapon. Furthermore, her clothing bore signs of charred particles in two areas, suggesting a struggle or attempt at self-defense. Most damning of all was the distance between the gun's muzzle and the wound on Nancy's head a distance inconsistent with suicide and pointing firmly towards full play. With the pieces of the puzzle gradually falling into place, all signs began pointing towards Randall. In the month following Nancy's tragic passing, detectives received a series of phony calls from co-workers and friends of Randall, 
revealing an unsettling reality. It emerged that Nancy had been contemplating divorce, and there were troubling indicators in Randall's behavior that suggested he may have harbored intentions to harm her. As the investigation continued, authorities requested that Randall undergo a polygraph examination to aid in their quest for the truth. However, he adamantly refused and even ceased cooperating with the investigation entirely. Despite the mounting evidence in Randall's suspicious actions, the case reached a frustrating impasse by August 1983, leaving Nancy's loved ones without answers or closure. Nearly four decades later, in August 2022, Detective Enel Sarich and the Violent Crimes Unit decided to breathe new life into the investigation. Armed with advanced technology and forensic techniques, they re-examined the evidence with a fresh perspective. The Oregon State Police Crime Lab reviewed the 1983 lab results, which only strengthened the belief that Nancy had not taken her own life. The detectives conducted over 20 interviews, engaging with individuals such as detectives, deputies, and firefighters who had responded to the scene in 1983. These interviews uncovered new leads that held the potential to crack the case wide open. In January 2023, Detectives finally had the opportunity to speak with Randall, who was still residing in Teagard. During the interview, Randall disclosed seeking therapy to cope with the trauma of Nancy's death. When asked about his wife's mental health history, he stated that she had none, but he vehemently denied any involvement in her death. Despite his denials, detectives remained convinced that Randall was concealing the truth, as all the evidence pointed squarely in his direction. Subsequently, detectives referred the case to the Washington County District Attorney's Office, aiming to secure a grand jury indictment against Randall and finally achieve justice for Nancy. However, just as it seemed that justice might be served, a tragic turn of events occurred on February 8, 2023. Randall took his own life, leaving behind a note in which he continued to deny any role in Nancy's death. The detectives who had devoted countless hours to, the case were left devastated and grappling with a sense of unfinished business. Despite their relentless efforts to gather evidence, interview witnesses, and pursue leads, their main suspect's death left them with the likelihood that the case would remain unsolved. Nancy's surviving loved ones, including her mother and two sisters, were left to pick up the pieces. While the case was officially closed due to Randall's passing, his actions spoke louder than any words ever could. Though they would never uncover the complete truth about Nancy's fate, they found some semblance of closure, comforted by the detective's unwavering commitment to seeking justice on her behalf. In Southern California, a region renowned for its sunny climate, laid-back way of life and breathtaking natural landscapes, lies a place that bears a captivating blend of cultural influences. This area's identity has been shaped by a diverse mix of elements, ranging from the glitz and glamour of Hollywood to the rich Mexican heritage that permeates its streets. Southern California is also home to some of the world's most iconic attractions, including Disneyland, Universal Studios Hollywood, and the Santa Monica Pier. However, it was within this seemingly idyllic backdrop that a series of gruesome murders commenced on that fateful day of July 25, 1980. At the time, a young resident of Brentwood named Carrie Lenander, a Palisades High School student, and her close friend Tony Garfield, both 15-year-old juniors at Palisades High, decided to embark on a hitchhiking adventure to the corner of Wilshire and Barrington. Little did they know that their lives would soon take a harrowing turn. Their ride that day was provided by a man described only as Ken from Canada, a male Caucasian. Ken drove them first to the Hollywood area, where they stopped for a restroom break. Carrie and Tony had been consuming alcohol before hitchhiking, and as they made their pit stop, Tony began to feel dizzy. She informed Carrie that she needed to return home. Ken complied, driving Tony back to her house. Tragically, this would be the last time Tony saw her friend alive. The events that unfolded leading up to Carrie's murder remain shrouded in mystery. However, the next day on July 26, 1980, at approximately 4.30 a.m., 
Carrie's lifeless body was discovered in a street gutter on the 3700 block of Victoria Avenue in South Los Angeles. The only trace of evidence left behind by the perpetrator was white rock material found in her hair and near her body, which matched the material discovered across from Carrie's residence. This grim discovery hinted at the chilling possibility that her murderer might have been someone who either knew her or had been stalking her in the days leading up to the tragedy. Tony Garfield, however, had no knowledge of the person in question. The autopsy report revealed that Carrie had been assaulted and strangled to death. An unidentified DNA sample, presumably belonging to the perpetrator, was collected from Carrie's body but remained of little use due to the limitations of forensic technology in the 1980s. Detective Tim Marcia, who was assigned to the case, believed that Ken and Carrie had visited her residence, where she changed her clothes before their fateful outing. Yet, the exact circumstances and timeline of the murder remained elusive. Carrie Lenander's parents, Carl J. Lenander III and Joyce Fadden, were understandably devastated by their daughter's tragic death. They were determined to seek justice for Carrie, offering a reward of $50,000 in addition to a $25,000 reward from the L.A. City Council, through various news outlets, Carrie's parents spoke fondly of their daughter, who was just nine days away from her 16th birthday, and pleaded with the public for any information regarding her murder, even though her case received limited media attention. Brief coverage on shows like Lost Lives and 60 Minutes shed some light on her story. Despite a lack of concrete leads, investigators remained resolute in their pursuit of the killer. Interviews were conducted and a suspect was on their radar, but an arrest proved elusive. Over time, the case grew cold, and it wasn't until early 2002 that the LAPD Cold Case Homicide Unit reopened it. Unfortunately, even this effort did not lead to the apprehension of the perpetrator. For the next two decades, the case languished in the archives of the Los Angeles Police Department, while Carrie's family grappled with the pain of their loss and the lingering quest for justice. It wasn't until 2022 that the case saw a dramatic development when DNA evidence finally connected a 76-year-old man named Billy Ray Richardson to the crimes. However, the details of how this connection was made after more than four decades remain undisclosed. Surprisingly, investigators also linked Richardson to three additional murders in Southern California from the 1980s and 1990s. Among these crimes were the killings of 25-year-old Beverly Cruz and 22-year-old Deborah Cruz, whose naked bodies were discovered in an apartment in West Los Angeles. Another victim, 28-year-old Trina Wilson, was found with her throat slashed in Inglewood on December 31, 1995. All four murders appeared to be sexually motivated. On July 14, 2022, Billy Ray Richardson was arrested in Fort Worth, Texas, on charges of multiple murders, sexual assault, and burglary. He was subsequently extradited to Los Angeles to face trial and was held in Tarrant County Jail while awaiting legal proceedings. However, a tragic twist unfolded when Richardson was brought to the hospital in a wheelchair and pronounced dead on February 15, 2023. His demise resulted from complications of a cervical spine injury and blunt force trauma with COVID-19, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, and dementia listed as other significant factors contributing to his death. Deputy District Attorney Beth Silverman expressed sadness for the victim's families, acknowledging that they would never witness Richardson being held accountable for his heinous crimes. However, the identification of the perpetrator offered some solace, ensuring that he would no longer pose a threat to society. In the end, justice may have been delayed, but it ultimately found its way to the victims and their grieving families, providing closure and a measure of peace. On a cold and eerie night, as the clock struck midnight on November 21, 2002, the small town of Spanaway, Washington, became the backdrop for a chilling discovery that would haunt both the community and law enforcement for years to come. In the desolate 15600 block of 74th Avenue East, a lifeless body lay motionless 
stripped of all clothing. It was a scene that sent shivers down the spines of the police officers who rushed to the location, their veins filled with tension and uncertainty. The tension in the air was palpable. As the officers arrived at the scene, not knowing what to expect, the sight that greeted them was beyond their worst nightmares. The woman's life had met a gruesome and inexplicable end, leaving them with a bone-chilling question that would drive their investigation. Who was she, and what dark circumstances had led to her demise? Despite the initial shock and the absence of immediate clues, the detectives were resolute in their determination to uncover the truth. They meticulously combed every inch of the surrounding area, searching for any shred of evidence that could provide them with the answers they so desperately sought. However, the scene remained eerily silent, offering no hints as to the sinister events that had unfolded there. One peculiar detail that struck the investigators was the absence of any visible marks or signs of violence on the victim's body. This observation led them to believe that the woman had likely met her fate elsewhere and had been unceremoniously dumped on the side of the road. As the woman's lifeless form was carefully transported away from the grim scene, the detectives stood in stoic silence, their faces etched with fierce determination. Their minds raced with thoughts of the arduous investigation that lay ahead as they plotted their next moves. It was a solemn vow they made to themselves and the memory of the victim. They would not rest until every stone had been turned, every lead had been followed, and the elusive culprit brought to justice. The subsequent autopsy conducted on the woman would reveal a horrifying truth. She had been strangled to death, but the Pierce County Medical Examiner's Office was not content with just this revelation. Recognizing the critical importance of every possible clue in solving a case of this magnitude, they took a DNA sample from the victim's body. Furthermore, through the careful examination of fingerprints, the Pierce County Medical Examiner's Office was able to identify the woman. Her name was Sharon Van Gilder, a 39-year-old devoted mother of two children and a beloved member of her community. Sharon had grown up in Enumclaw, surrounded by several siblings, but little was known about her early life. Those who had the privilege of knowing her described Sharon as a kind and caring person, always willing to lend a helping hand to those in need. Her tragic and inexplicable death left a profound void in the lives of all who had known her. The shock of her passing rippled through her community, leaving her friends and neighbors in disbelief. As the investigation into Sharon's death unfolded, detectives were met with more questions than answers. However, they were determined to crack the case and provide Sharon's grieving family with the justice they so rightfully deserved. As they delved deeper into their investigation, they uncovered a crucial piece of information. Sharon had been last seen leaving a bar in Tacoma with a man named Miguel Angel Urbano Vasquez. This discovery immediately placed Miguel under the intense scrutiny of law enforcement, making him a prime suspect in the case. The authorities launched an all-out effort to locate and apprehend him. Simultaneously, the Washington State Patrol Crime Lab worked tirelessly to gather additional evidence, including DNA samples taken from the crime scene. These samples were destined to play a pivotal role in the unfolding drama. However, capturing Miguel proved to be a daunting task, and he managed to evade the authorities, escaping to Mexico just as they were closing in on him. Despite their best efforts, detectives were unable to track him down. As time passed, the investigation ran dry and the case went cold, leaving Sharon's loved ones with heavy hearts and no closure. Meanwhile, Miguel continued to live his life freely seemingly oblivious to the relentless pursuit of justice that was never going to give up on finding him. But the story was far from over. In 2012, a glimmer of hope emerged for the investigators when the Pierce County Sheriff's Department established a cold case unit. A dedicated and determined detective named Tim Cobble took over Sharon's murder case. Tim threw himself into the investigation with unwavering resolve determined to solve the mystery that had remained unsolved for years. During his painstaking proby, Detective Tim made a shocking discovery. It was a revelation that sent shockwaves through the Tacoma community. A series of crimes had occurred around the same time as Sharon's murder, and the same man was connected to all of them, Miguel. Astonishingly, the Tacoma detectives who had been working on those cases 
had no idea about Miguel's connection to Sharon's murder. This critical oversight had resulted in a missed opportunity to submit DNA evidence from the crime lab for comparison to its database. Detective Tim felt like he had finally found the missing puzzle piece, and he wasted no time. He sent the DNA samples from Sharon's murder, as well as those from the other two crimes, for testing. The results that finally arrived in late April 2012 confirmed what he had suspected all along. Miguel was the perpetrator behind all three heinous crimes. But the investigation didn't stop there. Months later, detectives were able to link Miguel to yet another crime that had occurred in October 2002. The victim recounted a harrowing tale of being lured into a car with two individuals who initially offered her drugs. However, when she refused their proposition of exchanging money for sexual acts, they turned violent, resorting to physical force. DNA samples taken from this crime scene matched those found at the two earlier crimes and in Sharon's murder. It was a breakthrough moment that investigators had been tirelessly working towards for years. After a long and arduous journey filled with twists and turns, they had finally gathered enough evidence to charge Miguel with the murder of Sharon Van Gilder as well as the other crimes that had terrorized Tacoma. With charges filed by the Pierce County Prosecutor's Office and a warrant issued for Miguel's arrest, the detectives faced another formidable challenge. They had no idea where Miguel was hiding in Mexico. The search for the fugitive suspect became intense and challenging, but the detectives refused to give up. Their eyes remained peeled, their ears to the ground, and their determination unwavering. As days turned into weeks, weeks into months, and months into years, the detectives were on the brink of losing hope. But then, in 2019, a glimmer of hope emerged when the FBI informed them of Miguel's whereabouts. Determined to see him face justice, the detectives sprang into action, embarking on the lengthy process of securing the necessary paperwork to extradite him to the United States. The extradition process was long and arduous filled with bureaucratic hurdles and legal intricacies. However, the detectives refused to yield, driven by their unwavering commitment to justice. Finally, after four years of tenacious struggle, the necessary paperwork was processed. Working in collaboration with Mexican authorities, the FBI executed Miguel's arrest on March 14, 2023, bringing an end to his years on the run. Miguel's capture marked a significant turning point in the long and arduous journey for justice that had begun over two decades earlier. At this moment, detectives continue to work tirelessly to finalize Miguel's extradition to Washington, where he will stand trial for his heinous crimes. His arrest has brought a renewed sense of hope and closure to Sharon's family and friends, who had endured years of anguish, uncertainty, and heartache. In conclusion, the tragic story of Sharon Van Gilder's murder is a testament to the relentless determination of law enforcement, forensic experts, and detectives who refuse to give up in their pursuit of justice. The case serves as a reminder that even the most elusive criminals cannot evade the long arm of the law indefinitely, and that perseverance and dedication can ultimately bring closure to those who have suffered the most profound loss. In the year 2018 in the city of Prospect near Blacktown, Australia, there resided a 71-year-old widow named Nadir Sensoy. Her life was intertwined with that of her beloved son, Salim Sensoy. Nadir's early years held many mysteries, but one thing was certain. She had been a steadfast resident of Prospect for nearly four decades. Within the close-knit community, Nadir held a special place in the hearts of her neighbors. She was renowned for her selfless acts of kindness always ready to extend a helping hand, whether it was providing rides to the market or sharing her delectable homemade treats. Nadir's unwavering commitment to her community left an indelible mark, earning her admiration and respect from everyone who had the privilege of knowing her. To Nadir, family was paramount, and she took immense pride in being the devoted mother of five children and a loving grandmother to 17 cherished grandchildren. Her life revolved around creating a nurturing environment for her family. However, the tranquility of the quiet town of Prospect was shattered when tragedy struck Nadir. The beloved matriarch, who was a friend to all, 
mysteriously vanished without a trace in December 2018. The last confirmed sighting of her was on Thursday, December 6, 2018, near her residence. The days that followed were excruciating for her family, friends, and the community that had grown so fond of her. Nadir's sudden disappearance was highly unusual, leaving everyone bewildered and concerned for her safety. It was on Tuesday, December 11, 2018, that the Sensoy family decided to take action and reported Nadir as a missing person, initiating a frantic search to locate her. The local Blacktown Police Command promptly launched an extensive search operation, hoping to uncover any clues leading to her whereabouts. Despite their tireless efforts, the searches conducted around her home yielded no results, intensifying the pervasive sense of unease. Both her family and the police shared deep concerns about her well-being. As the investigation unfolded, detectives uncovered a puzzling detail. They learned that Nadir had made several appointments prior to her disappearance and had not accessed her bank account since then. This discovery deepened the enigma surrounding her vanishing act, leaving everyone with more questions than answers. Investigators persevered working tirelessly around the clock with the hope of finding any lead that could unravel the mystery. They made a public appeal, providing a description of Nadir as a Mediterranean Middle Eastern woman, approximately 165 centimeters tall, with a slender build and short dyed brown hair. Despite their best efforts, no one came forward with any information. As months passed, hope began to wane, and the fear that she may have met a grim fate cast a long shadow over the community. Even if she had been harmed, the question of her whereabouts remained unanswered. The investigation eventually hit a dead end, leaving everyone wondering if the truth would ever be uncovered. The people of Prospect were heartbroken, mourning the loss of a beloved community figure. They clung to the hope of a miracle that would reunite them with Nadir. In 2020, after two years of fruitless investigation, the police made a pivotal decision to offer a reward of $350,000 for any information leading to Nadir's discovery. The hope was that this substantial reward would prompt someone's conscience to come forward with vital information. The announcement of the reward injected new life into the investigation, with law enforcement eagerly anticipating a breakthrough. However, as weeks turned into months, it became evident that the reward had not yielded any promising leads. Despite the desperate efforts of Nadir's family, friends, and the police, she remained missing, and the mystery surrounding her disappearance only deepened. In the same year, a startling development emerged when investigators shifted their focus to Nadir's own son, Salim, as a potential suspect. At the time, Salim was serving a two-and-a-half-year prison sentence for assaulting his sister and possessing an unauthorized firearm, an arrest made approximately a week after his mother's disappearance. While it remains unclear what led authorities to suspect him, investigators cited Salim's behavior as one of the leads they were pursuing in their quest to shed light on his mother's perplexing vanishing act. Then, on May 23, 2020, in a daring escape, Salim managed to break free from the Glen in his correction center where he was incarcerated. Shockingly, he simply walked out of the low-security prison and absconded in a stolen red Subaru WRX. This audacious jailbreak prompted a massive manhunt, launching the police force into overdrive. The stolen vehicle was spotted the following day in Mori, 210 kilometers away from the correctional center. The police initiated a pursuit, but the situation grew increasingly perilous as the car sped recklessly leading to the police abandoning the chase for safety reasons. Nevertheless, the police persisted in their search, aided by helicopters and the K-9 unit. They eventually located the abandoned car, but Salim was nowhere to be found. Salim remained on the run for eight arduous months, constantly evading capture, while the police conducted extensive searches and inquiries in their desperate bid to apprehend him. Finally, on January 11, 2021, officers from the Hawkesbury Police Area Command received a tip-off, indicating that Salim was hiding in a house on New Street in Windsor. In the early hours of the morning, they descended upon the property and with the assistance of the K-9 unit, they conducted a thorough search. 
Salim made a desperate attempt to flee from the back of the house, but it was too late. The police apprehended him and took him to the Windsor Police Station, where they executed two outstanding warrants for his inmate escape and vehicle theft. Despite Salim's capture, there was still no information regarding the whereabouts of his mother, Nadir, and the mystery surrounding her disappearance persisted. As the years passed, the hope of finding Nadir alive dwindled. In March 2023, a coronial inquest into her suspected death commenced. However, before any answers could be uncovered, the inquiry was abruptly halted due to shocking new information. Though the authorities remained tight-lipped about the specifics, it became evident that the spotlight had once again shifted to Nadir's son, Salim. Following further inquiries, the police made their move on March 21, 2023. They finally arrested Salim, now 47 years old, at the Wagga Wagga police station and charged him with the murder of his own mother. On the same day, the court heard that he allegedly committed the heinous crime between December 6 and 11, 2018, in the Blacktown area. Salim's plea for bail was denied, and he now faced a protracted legal battle ahead. Nadir's daughter expressed relief upon hearing the news of her brother Salim's arrest for their mother's murder. The family hoped that with Salim's arrest, they could finally locate Nadir's remains and bring her home for a proper burial. However, the road ahead remained uncertain, with no one certain about the outcome of Salim's case or if the truth about their mother's fate would ever come to light. Amanda Gonzalez came into this world on December 8, 1981, born to Santos Gonzalez and Gloria Bates. Her early years were marked by the separation of her parents, a situation clouded in mystery. In due course, Gloria remarried a man named Michael Bates, who would step into the role of a father figure for Amanda when she was just four years old. Michael, hailing from Madisonville, Texas, watched Amanda grow into a popular girl with a heart of gold. Known for her kindness and her unwavering stand against bullies on behalf of her classmates, Amanda graduated from Madisonville High School in the year 2000. A turning point came when, after her high school graduation, Amanda surprised her family with a life-altering decision. She arrived home with a recruiter, announcing her intention to enlist in the U.S. Army. Her dream was to become a physical therapist for children, and she saw the Army as a means to save up for college. Amanda's family supported her decision, though little did they know the heart-wrenching consequences that lay ahead. With her family's blessings, Amanda embarked on a path that would take her to places she had never imagined. It was the year 2001 and at the age of 19, she found herself stationed in Hanau, Germany. Assigned the role of a cook, Amanda worked diligently, but she also made it a point to explore the cultural wonders of the country in her spare time. She marveled at majestic castles and got lost in the enchanting city of Paris. Europe held countless experiences for her. Several months into her service, Amanda made an unexpected call to her mother back in Texas. The news she delivered was filled with excitement. She was pregnant and eagerly looking forward to the new chapter in her life. Amanda planned to name her baby Alicia Marie, with an estimated delivery date of March 26, 2002. However, the identity of the unborn child's father remained a mystery, one that persists to this day. Amanda's life seemed to be on an upswing. She had a promising future ahead. But fate had a cruel twist in store. On November 5, 2001, a day that began like any other in Hanover, Germany, Amanda inexplicably vanished. Her absence raised alarm among her fellow soldiers, and a search was launched. They arrived at her barracks, only to find her room locked. Fearful of the worst, they forced their way in and discovered Amanda's lifeless body on the floor. Panic engulfed them as they desperately tried to revive her, but their efforts were in vain. The news of Amanda's death spread rapidly, sending shockwaves through the army base. The autopsy report revealed the grim truth. Amanda had been strangled to death. This devastating news reverberated all the way to Texas, leaving Amanda's loved ones with a multitude of unanswered questions. Why would anyone want to harm Amanda? 
An investigation was launched, but despite the dedicated efforts of the authorities, the case went cold. There were no leads, no suspects, and no justice for Amanda. It was a heartbreaking end to a life that had held so much promise. Despite the investigation into her daughter's murder stalling for several years, Gloria, Amanda's mother, never lost faith in justice. She spent years reaching out to lawmakers and even wrote to popular TV shows like Dr. Phil and America's Most Wanted, all in an effort to keep Amanda's case in the public eye. Gloria's unwavering determination extended to her visits to Amanda's grave, where she often spoke to her deceased daughter, vowing to keep fighting. In 2011, a ray of hope emerged when Army investigators offered a reward of $125,000 for any information that could help solve the case. However, still, no breakthrough came. Gloria received weekly updates from investigators, each containing the same disheartening news. No suspects had been identified. Finally, after 22 years of waiting, perseverance paid off. On February 23, 2023, an FBI agent informed Gloria that there had been a breakthrough in the case and that an arrest had been made. This day marked a significant step closer to the justice Amanda deserved. The individual taken into custody was Shannon L. Wilkerson, a 42-year-old former Armed Forces member. The arrest was the result of a collaborative effort between the FBI, the FBI Jacksonville Office of Special Investigations, and the Army Criminal Investigation Division. Wilkerson was charged under the Military Extraterrestrial Jurisdiction Act, which grants U.S. courts jurisdiction over former members of the armed forces for crimes committed overseas. The exact details of how investigators linked Wilkerson to the murder and what his possible motive might have been remain unclear. Nevertheless, he pleaded not guilty to the first-degree murder charge against him, and if convicted, he could face life imprisonment. Interestingly, it came to light that Wilkerson had even attended a memorial service for Amanda at the Army base in Germany after her death. The future remains uncertain, but for Gloria and her family, the arrest of Amanda's alleged killer provides a sense of justice and closure that they've been yearning for over two decades. On January 3, 1979, in Snohomish County, Washington, a duck hunter embarked on a chilly morning expedition, hoping for a successful day of game hunting. His anticipation was focused on capturing ducks and fish, but his plans took an unexpected turn when he stumbled upon something unusual caught in a fishnet along the muddy flats by the shore. Intrigued, he approached the scene only to be met with a chilling discovery. Human remains. The identity of the deceased individual remained a mystery raising questions about what had transpired on that fateful day. Was it an unfortunate accident, or did a more sinister event occur? Snohomish County, a place characterized by its tight-knit community and picturesque landscapes, seemed an unlikely setting for such a perplexing enigma. Despite being the third most populous county in Washington state, it offered a tranquil, small-town lifestyle with a relatively low crime rate. The community thrived on a blend of comfort and stability, making it hard to believe that a decades-long mystery would unfold in this idyllic setting. The new year of 1979 arrived with exceptionally harsh weather conditions in Snohomish County. Freezing temperatures and record-breaking snowfall had enveloped the region, making it challenging for residents to venture outside. January 3rd marked a rare day when the temperature climbed above freezing allowing the duck hunter to pursue his quest for waterfowl profit. He arrived at the Snohomish River Delta on North Spencer Island, determined to catch ample ducks. Little did he know that this day would lead to a grim discovery. As he scanned the area for ducks, his attention was drawn to a peculiar sight ensnared in a fishing line. Upon closer inspection, he realized he was looking at human remains. Alarmed, he immediately alerted the police and their arrival at the scene near Everett, Washington, sent shivers down their spines. The duck hunter's description eerily matched the horrifying reality. The scene revealed a macabre tableau. Tangled in the fishing line were clothing items, a shoe, and a partially skeletonized human leg bone. As they explored further, they discovered a checkered shirt, 
a human skull, ribs, another shoe containing a foot, a leather wallet devoid of its contents, a sock, and a belt. Although these details might appear inconsequential, they held the potential to unlock the identity of the unknown individual. Despite the complexity of the case, there was no immediate suspicion of foul play. Piecing together the events leading to the discovery of these remains presented a daunting task for investigators. The person had been deceased for an extended period, making it challenging to find definitive answers. The remains were subjected to an autopsy in the hopes of gathering any available information. The coroner's findings confirmed that the deceased had been deed for several months, providing a starting point for the investigation. However, efforts to identify the individual through dental records and physical examination yielded no results. As a result, the case was classified as John Doe 79-1, with the cause of death marked as undetermined due to the scarcity of leads. After waiting for approximately two and a half months, the unidentified man was laid to rest in a lavish grave at Cypress Memorial Park in Everett, Washington, a practice that differs from current procedures where skeletal remains are retained until identified. The investigation did not conclude with the burial. Both the police and the community continued to search for leads to unveil the John Doe's identity. However, these efforts proved fruitless, and the case eventually went cold. Decades passed, and the mystery remained unsolved until 2008 when Sheriff's Detective Jim Scharf and retired Superior Court Judge Ken Kausert revisited the old case files, which had collected dust for years. Despite facing numerous obstacles, they were determined to uncover the truth. The data from the original investigation proved to be sparse and insufficient. Detectives struggled to establish a connection between the description of the mystery man and any missing persons from that era. The lack of digitized records further hindered their progress. Nevertheless, they persisted in their efforts to piece together a profile of the deceased. By 2015, approximately 36 years had elapsed since the man's discovery, and the investigation remained unresolved. To distinguish the case from numerous other John and Jane Doe cases, detectives gave it the nickname Spencer Eastland. In July 2015, they obtained permission from the Snohomish County judge to exhume John Doe's body from Spencer Eastland. This marked a critical step in their quest for answers. Forensic odontologist Dr. Kyla Tanaka attempted to match the man's dental records with missing persons reports, but found no promising leads. The case was then uploaded to the NAMUS database of missing persons in August 2015, but again, no breakthroughs emerged. Detectives scrutinized the evidence collected in the past, including clothing, wallet, and belt, and concluded that the man likely wore secondhand clothes. They pleaded with the public to come forward with any information, even though immediate identification seemed unlikely. Their persistence paid off in late 2015, when they received a tip suggesting that the description of Spencer Allen John Doe matched that of a missing farmhand from Marysville. This promising lead prompted intense investigation. The man in question had run a fruit stand in Everett, was known for his persistent drinking, had a noticeable limp, and had disappeared in the late 1970s. Detectives pursued this lead diligently, hoping it would bring them closer to the truth. After a month of rigorous investigation, they received a disheartening revelation. They located a tombstone in Yuma, Arizona, for the same farmhand mentioned in the tip. He had passed away in 1981 while in the southwestern desert region, dispelling their hopes of identifying Spencer Allen John Doe through this lead. As detectives continued their relentless pursuit of answers, the medical examiner's office made significant discoveries regarding the deceased man's characteristics. In April 2016, Dr. Kathy Taylor, a forensic anthropologist, examined his exhumed bones. She estimated his age to be between 27 and 61 years old, with a height ranging from 5 feet 1 inch to 5 feet 7 inches. Furthermore, she determined that he had a Native American Caucasian or mixed heritage. The investigation delved deeper into the man's medical history, uncovering a gruesome injury. His left femur had been severely shattered and left untreated, causing him to walk with a painful limp. 
He may have also suffered from temporal mandibular joint syndrome, a painful jaw condition. Despite these apparent medical issues, there was no record of him seeking medical attention, even for his leg injury. The investigation further revealed that he had lost two left anterior top teeth and two molars with healed sockets indicating they were lost before his death. He had alloy fillings in three teeth, suggesting access to dental care. The detectives were left with numerous unanswered questions regarding the man's life and the reasons behind his neglect of medical care in later years. The possibility that he may have been an inmate crossed their minds, but it seemed unlikely as his distinctive features would have made him memorable to those who encountered him. The case relied heavily on theories and speculations, with detectives aware that even the smallest details could hold the key to unraveling the mystery. In 2018, a portion of the man's femur was sent to Othram Labs, a private forensic genealogy company funded by DNAsolves.com. This initiative aimed to use advanced DNA testing to identify the man. Eventually, a match was found through the GED Match and Family Tree DNA databases, leading to the identification of the John Doe as Gary Lee Haney on February 10, 2023. Gary's life had been marked by turmoil and hardship. Born in 1950 as Gary Joseph Condomiti, he faced early challenges with his parents' divorce and adoption by his mother's new husband, Sheldon Lee Haney. The family traveled extensively due to Sheldon's military service and work with Boeing. Despite his passion for music and interests, Gary was believed to have had a mental disorder, possibly autism or schizophrenia, which led to his isolation from the extended family. In the later years of his life, Gary disappeared from his family's radar and he was declared legally dead in 1976, three years before his remains were discovered on Spencer Island. Sheldon Haney's failure to report his son missing raised suspicions about his involvement in Gary's disappearance. The revelation of Gary's identity stirred hope that someone might hold the missing puzzle piece to his mysterious disappearance and death. The investigation uncovered a web of secrets and lies, leaving detectives with more questions than answers. Gary Lee Haney's life remained shrouded in mystery, both before and after his tragic demise. As the news of Gary's identity spread, there was a growing sense of hope that someone out there might have the missing piece of the puzzle, that crucial bit of information that could shed light on his mysterious disappearance and tragic death. Granby, a charming small town nestled in the heart of Colorado, boasts a wealth of artistic and cultural attractions that draw in residents and tourists alike. The town is a haven for adventurers seeking the thrill of mountain life, surrounded by the laughter of those who call Granby home. However, beneath the picturesque facade of this tranquil town, a dark and horrifying incident marred its history in 1978. On November 15, 1978, a group of children were innocently playing along a logging road just off Amherst Road, about 15 miles from Springfield in Granby. Their carefree day took a sinister turn when they stumbled upon an ominous sight hidden beneath a pile of leaves concealed beneath a log. As they cautiously approached the mysterious object, their shock and fear intensified as they discovered the lifeless body of a woman. The children immediately contacted the authorities, and the police hurried to the scene. What awaited them was a gruesome and unsettling scene. A decomposing body of a woman with a gunshot wound to her forehead. Adding to the macabre nature of the discovery, a man's belt was found tightly secured around her neck. The investigators combed the area meticulously in search of any clues that could shed light on this baffling crime. Yet their efforts were thwarted by the absence of a wallet, pocketbook, or any form of identification that could offer a lead to identify the victim. The body was swiftly sent for an autopsy, and the medical examiner's office confirmed the harrowing details of the woman's demise. She had been fatally shot in her temple, and the estimated time of her death pointed to a range between June and August. Beyond that, she remained an enigma, an unidentified woman between the ages of 19 and 27, standing at 5 feet 4 inches tall, with dirty blonde hair. The sole piece of evidence, the man's belt used to drag her body into the woods, 
did little to narrow down the pool of suspects or provide clues to her identity. Granby's police chief, John R. Kirchhoff, shared with the media that very little remained of the victim's body, which had undergone extensive decomposition. Almost all that remained was her skeletal structure. With so little to go on, the investigators had to rely on the details they could extract from her clothing. She wore a blouse, blue jeans, and shoes, all sized 14 to 16, indicating a chunkier build. Her clothing suggested that she might have been a young woman, but it lacked any tags or labels that could provide a lead. Despite the lack of concrete information, her clothing played a crucial role in engaging the public. The most significant detail was the short sleeve pullover blouse, size 14, adorned with a green swan embroidered on the front and a green imitation suede collar. Additionally, a gold ring adorned one of her fingers, possibly a wedding ring. The authorities scoured recent missing persons reports to find a match but came up empty-handed. Furthermore, the victim's dental examination revealed a noticeable decay in her front teeth, prompting a search for dental records among the recently reported missing persons. Unfortunately, this endeavor yielded no results. The location of the discovery off Amherst Road near Route 116 raised the possibility that the victim might have been connected to one of the five colleges accessible via this route. The investigators delved into this avenue of inquiry, scrutinizing the student records of Mount Holyoke College in South Hadley, the University of Massachusetts, Hampshire and Amherst Colleges in Amherst, and Smith College in Northampton. Regrettably, no reports of a missing female student match the victim's description. As their leads dwindled, a glimmer of hope emerged when a motel operator contacted the authorities, believing that the description of the victim's body matched that of a woman who had checked into their establishment in early 1978. Promptly, the police located this woman who was still alive and in good health. The mystery of the unknown woman persisted, and she became known as the Granby Girl. Over the years, sporadic leads would surface only to fizzle out, leaving the Granby Girl's identity shrouded in obscurity. In September 1998, nearly two decades after her tragic death, a group of Granby residents gathered at her resting place in the cemetery. They raised $500 to replace the wooden cross marking her grave with a permanent marker bearing the inscription, Unknown, November 15, 1978, in God's care. It stood as a poignant symbol of a community's enduring care for an unnamed woman, whose hopes, dreams, troubles, and anxieties remained forever concealed from the world. Fast forward to 2021, and a new ray of hope illuminated the case. Detectives reached out to Othram Laboratories, a Houston-based corporation specializing in forensic genealogy. Through their expertise, a DNA profile was successfully constructed for the Granby girl. Detectives reached out to Othram Laboratories, a Houston-based corporation specializing in forensic genealogy. Through their expertise, a DNA profile was successfully constructed for the Granby girl. When compared against the national database, it yielded a match to a woman residing in Maryland. Astonishingly, this woman revealed that her aunt had disappeared in the 1970s and was willing to provide more information about her aunt's disappearance. The trail led to Matthew Dale, who shared a pivotal connection to the Granby girl. He disclosed that his mother, Patricia Ann Tucker, had gone missing in 1978 when he was a mere five years old. The police explained the circumstances surrounding the Granby girl, and Matthew agreed to provide his DNA sample in the hopes of finding his long-lost mother. In a matter of hours, the results confirmed a parent-child relationship between Matthew and the Granby girl, finally providing closure to a 43-year-old mystery. Patricia Ann Tucker, born on July 28, 1950, was officially identified as the Granby girl. Patricia had gone through multiple marriages and bore different last names, such as Heckman and Dale. However, at the time of her tragic demise in 1978, at the age of 28, she went by the name Patricia Coleman. She had married Gerald Coleman just a year before her untimely death, and they had made their home along the eastern shore of Lake Pocatapog in East Hampton, Connecticut. Following her disappearance, many in her family speculated that she had fallen in with a dangerous crowd, and some believed she had entered a witness protection program. 
For Matthew Dale, the son who had grown up amid a cloud of uncertainty and rumors, the revelation of his mother's fate came in his thirties. At a press conference, First Assistant Northwestern District Attorney Stephen Gage expressed gratitude for the breakthrough in identifying the victim. He commended Othram Laboratories for their remarkable technological advancements in DNA analysis. However, he emphasized that the investigation into the murder would not rest until the perpetrator was brought to justice. While they lacked direct evidence, Gerald Coleman, Patricia's husband at the time of her death, was considered a person of interest. Strangely, he had never reported her disappearance to the police, casting a shadow of suspicion over his involvement. Gerald Coleman, convicted of sexual assault, battery, indecent assault, and assault with a dangerous weapon, passed away in prison in 1996. His death deprived the investigators of the opportunity to question him about Patricia's murder while he was still alive. Now they turn to the public, urging anyone with information about the case to come forward and assist in finally closing the chapter on this horrifying crime. Matthew Dale, the son who had long yearned for answers, expressed his gratitude to the diligent detectives, saying, Thank you for never giving up on her. At least I have some answers now after 44 years. It's a lot to process, but hopefully the closure can begin now. While he possessed few mementos of his mother, including a single photograph, a lock of his hair she had kept, a baby book she had lovingly created, and a small tapestry she had painted during his childhood, he remained committed to honoring her memory. He remarked, What I want to do is have a new gravestone made for her. She deserves to have her name on it. In conclusion, the long-standing mystery of the Granby girl, an unidentified murder victim found in 1978, has finally been resolved through advanced DNA analysis and the determination of investigators. Patricia Ann Tucker, a woman who had gone missing and was presumed dead, has been identified as the Granby girl. While this revelation brings closure to her son and the community, the search for her killer continues, with hopes that justice will eventually be served. Patricia's tragic story serves as a reminder of the enduring commitment of law enforcement and the power of science in solving cold cases that have haunted communities for decades. In the heart of Indiana lies a charming little town known as Kokomo, where life is simple and ideal for raising children. This quaint town boasts a reputation for its low crime rate, earning it the nickname City of Firsts. However, beneath its serene exterior, Kokomo harbors a dark and tragic tale that left its mark on the community forever. It's a story that revolves around a young woman named Destiny Pittman, whose life was tragically cut short on a fateful night in 2013, marking one of the town's first harrowing incidents. Destiny Pittman, born on January 9, 1992, in Kokomo, was the child of Melvin L. Douglas Jr. and Carla A. Pittman McCombs. Destiny had a close-knit family with siblings and many friends who cherished her for her beautiful smile and charming personality. Her mere presence had the power to illuminate any room she entered. Destiny nurtured dreams of a modeling career, brimming with excitement about her future endeavors. Just eight months before her untimely demise, Destiny had purchased a house where she resided with her boyfriend and a roommate. Their home also included two children and three dogs, among them a chihuahua and two pit bulls. The clock struck 9.33 p.m. on February 7, 2013, when a chilling call reached the Kokomo police, urgently requesting their presence at 815 James Drive. The report indicated a shooting had occurred. Responding swiftly, officers arrived at the scene by 9.40 p.m., discovering a bullet hole in the wall and the lifeless body of 21-year-old Destiny Pittman lying in a pool of her own blood. Tragically, Destiny was pronounced dead on the spot. What makes this case all the more bewildering is that everyone in the house at the time of the incident, including the dogs, bore witness to the shocking event. Two strangers had entered their sanctuary, ruthlessly ending the life of a young woman with her entire future ahead of her. They committed the heinous act, seizing cash and drugs before vanishing without a trace, leaving Kokomo in shock. Destiny Pittman's autopsy revealed that her untimely demise was due to a single gunshot wound to her chest, which pierced through her body 
and struck the wall behind her. A single 40 caliber shell casing was recovered from the crime scene. Subsequently, the police conducted interviews with Destiny's boyfriend and roommate to unravel the events that transpired that dreadful night. According to their accounts, there was a loud knock on the door, putting everyone in the house on high alert. Suddenly, the door was kicked in, and two armed intruders stormed into the premises. Destiny, perhaps unaware of the impending danger, confronted the intruders, who reacted by fatally shooting her. Chaos ensued as everyone in the house sought refuge, with Destiny's roommate and boyfriend unable to catch more than a fleeting glimpse of one of the intruders, represented by a solitary shoe. The intruders proceeded to ransack the house, with one of them voicing frustration, exclaiming, Where the F is it? After their nefarious act, the assailants fled the scene in a vehicle that remained unseen by the witnesses. Destiny's dreams, aspirations, and the promise of her future were all mercilessly extinguished on that tragic night in 2013. The roommate, though unable to identify the intruders visually, expressed her belief that they were African American, citing their urban sounding voices as the basis for her assumption. However, she conceded that it remained a possibility that they could have been of a different ethnicity. Destiny's boyfriend, in his confession to the police, revealed that both he and Destiny had been involved in the sale of marijuana, although Destiny had withdrawn from the business after inheriting a sum of money. He admitted to having possession of a bag of marijuana and more than $2,000 earned from a recent drug sale a few days prior to the intrusion. The police surmised that the intruders might have been motivated by their knowledge of the drugs and cash kept in the house. Beyond these details, the police had little to go on, with no substantial leads to pursue. Two years passed and it was now 2015, with the police still fervently working to unravel the mystery. The only information available was the cooperation of Destiny's boyfriend and roommate, who provided all the details they could recall. The dedicated detectives refused to relent, driven by the hope of bringing justice to Destiny and closure to her grieving family. In the midst of their anguish, Destiny's family struggled to come to terms with her tragic death. Her mother, Carla Pittman McCombs, preserved everything in the house as it was on that fateful day in 2013. The bullet hole remained untouched, along with all of Destiny's photographs. The only attempt at normalcy was the effort to remove the bloodstains from the bedroom floor. Carla's grief was unrelenting, and she often found herself in tears, battling depression. She clung to the hope that someone would come forward with information about her daughter's death, and she made her sentiments known in a media statement. She lamented the complete upheaval of her life, expressing her dissatisfaction with the perpetrators who had taken her child for no apparent reason, leaving her with immeasurable pain and devastation. Destiny's stepfather, Stephen McCombs, observed that Carla was struggling to cope with her daughter's death even after all these years. She would often welcome visitors into their home, referring to it as Destiny's house or Destiny's home. Destiny's biological father, Douglas Jr., shared his ongoing ordeal, expressing his daily struggles and the frustration he felt. He understood the limitations faced by the police in discussing the case due to its ongoing nature, but couldn't help but miss his daughter terribly. He held on to the hope that the individuals responsible would eventually have families of their own, experiencing the joy of parenthood. In that moment of understanding, he believed they might comprehend the depth of pain caused by their actions and come forward with a confession. Another unnamed family member echoed the sentiments of many, acknowledging that Destiny's heart would never beat again. While no amount of justice could ever be enough, they believed that the family deserved closure. They denounced the cold-heartedness and ruthlessness of the perpetrators, emphasizing the need for accountability. Captain Teresa Galloway of the Kokomo Police Department issued a statement asserting that the case remained an open investigation, firmly rejecting the notion of classifying it as a cold case. They continued to welcome tips and pursue all leads diligently, urging anyone with information to come forward. However, for years, no substantial breakthroughs emerged, 
and the prospects of solving Destiny's case grew increasingly dim. Hope was rekindled in 2021 when the Kokomo police renewed their plea for information regarding Destiny's homicide. They affirmed that her case remained open and that they had been diligently investigating all tips and leads received over the past eight years. They beseeched the public, urging them to share any knowledge they possessed. However, as time passed, it seemed that Destiny's case would remain shrouded in mystery. A significant turning point occurred on December 5, 2022, when the Kokomo Police Department received a voicemail that would change the course of the investigation. A woman reached out, expressing her belief that the case should have been resolved by now. Frustrated by the lack of progress, she felt compelled to share information she had kept hidden for years. After witnessing press releases about Destiny's case for an extended period, she could no longer bear the burden of silence. She disclosed the identities of the two individuals who had barged into Destiny's house on that fateful night in 2013, 36-year-old Jesse McCartney and 32-year-old Joey McCartney. The informant initially conveyed her fear of Jesse McCartney, but when contacted by the police, she revealed that she had been in the company of the McCartney brothers on the night of the incident. They had claimed they were running an errand, and she had tagged along. She had been waiting in a jeep parked outside Destiny's house when she heard a loud noise emanating from within. Within minutes, Jesse emerged from the house clutching a gallon-sized bag of marijuana and a substantial amount of cash. Joey followed suit, and Jesse, the owner of the firearm used in the crime, displayed visible signs of distress and anxiety. The informant further disclosed that the McCartney brothers had sold both the gun and the Jeep within six months of the incident. Jesse subsequently asked the informant to accompany him and drove past Destiny's house the following day, pointing out the police tape surrounding the premises to confirm the accuracy of the story. When the police asked the informant to identify the house she was referring to, it was confirmed to be Destiny's residence on James Drive. She also revealed that Jesse had changed his phone number but was still residing in Kokomo, specifically on Monroe Street. In contrast, his brother Joey had relocated to Kentucky. Building on this newfound information, the police revisited Destiny's boyfriend and showed him photographs of Jesse and Joey McCartney. Destiny's boyfriend recognized Joey, recalling having seen him in their house in the company of a mutual friend. Finally, after a decade of persistent investigation and leads provided by the public, the pieces of the puzzle began to fall into place. With the accumulation of sufficient evidence, the authorities wasted no time in seeking justice. An official statement confirmed that investigators from the Criminal Investigation Section had obtained arrest warrants for Jesse and Joey McCartney. Joey was apprehended by the U.S. Marshals and local police around 6 a.m., on March 2, 2023, at a residence in Graham, Kentucky. Merely two hours later, Jesse was taken into custody at his Kokomo residence. Both McCartney brothers were charged with a slew of offenses, including robbery resulting in bodily injury, conspiracy to commit burglary resulting in bodily injury, and murder, all categorized as Class A felonies. Additionally, they faced a Class B felony charge of burglary. Indiana court records revealed that Joey had a prior run-in with the law, having faced a misdemeanor battery charge in September 2012. Subsequently, a pre-trial diversion agreement was filed on February 28, 2013, and the scheduled bench trial was canceled by March 2014, after Joey successfully completed the diversion program, resulting in the dismissal of the case. Jesse McCartney also had a police record, having been charged with battery in September 2012. The victim in this case was a healthcare provider who suffered injuries, leading to the modification of the charge to a felony. On April 3, 2013, a pretrial diversion agreement was filed, and the case was ultimately dismissed within a year, with the case file destroyed in 2016. Following their arrest, Jesse and Joey McCartney appeared for their initial hearings on March 9 and March 10, 2023. Both brothers entered a plea of not guilty, but the judge ordered them to be held without bond. As they awaited their trial, the community grappled with the realization 
that after a decade of mystery, the McCartney brothers would finally face the consequences of their actions. The tragic story of Destiny Pittman's senseless death in Kokomo serves as a testament to the enduring pursuit of justice by law enforcement and the unwavering determination of a grieving family. Destiny's memory lives on, and her case reminds us that even the darkest mysteries can be unraveled with time, persistence, and the courage of those who come forward with crucial information. As the McCartney brothers await their day in court, the town of Kokomo stands united in the hope that justice will finally be served for Destiny and her loved ones. A young woman who worked at a jewelry store vanished during her lunch break without a trace. Only a few peculiar clues and witnesses were discovered when investigators started to solve this mystery. The detectives were greatly surprised when they learned the truth only a few decades later. In the Australian city of Gold Coast, Linda Reed was born in 1962. She was raised in a devoted household, was a happy, vivacious child, and enjoyed a large social circle in school. Robert is a man Linda met. They started dating, and at age 19 years of age, the young lady wed him. They envisioned building the home of their dreams and raising a sizable, sociable family. Not long after the wedding, the newlyweds got to work on this. To get the house built as soon as possible, they bought a piece of land and started saving a significant portion of their income for construction. The couple opted to live in a trailer in Robert's parents' backyard rather than pay rent. Linda obtained employment as a salesperson at a jewelry store and she took a job at a big shopping mall and liked it right away. She connected with the team and the decent pay helped her save for her dream house even more quickly. Due to the impending holidays, December 1983 was tense because there was a frenzy in the shops. Linda, who was 21 at the time, had to work harder than usual. There was no exception on December 13th. Linda worked hard from the start of her shift and didn't get a chance to take a break until 12 o'clock. She typically ate lunch in the same but on that particular day, it didn't happen. Instead, they went to the mall and came back earlier than expected. Linda had never been late before the workday started, so her co-workers were very taken aback when she still did not arrive after her break at the scheduled time. It appeared as though she had simply made the decision to leave her ship. The young woman approached her job with the utmost responsibility, so her co-workers didn't think she could do it without telling them. When Linda did not arrive home after her shift, he was also taken aback. After some time passed, he got in touch with her co-workers. When they informed him that his wife had not returned from her break, Robert's level of worry increased significantly. He went to the mall and began exploring the area, looking for Linda. The young woman frequented a number of additional locations, which he went to later, but he was unable to locate her. He was getting more and more worried that something bad had happened with each minute that went by. That evening at 7 p.m., the man made the decision to call the police because of what had happened to Linda. He was informed by the operator that a report of an adult missing would only be taken into consideration after 24 hours had passed. The mother of Linda also made contact with them but got the same response. The report was eventually accepted, but the relatives had to wait until the following day. When Linda took her break, the police started an investigation to find out what she was doing. The young lady had gone shopping for New Year's Eve. They discovered, several stores are housed in the same structure. She then went to her bank branch to pick up a check to pay her bills. The last person to see her was the security guard at the mall, who had seen Linda drive away from the parking lot. The young woman's family did not know why Linda left in the middle of her shift or, more importantly, where she was going, so the police were unable to find any additional information. The police started watching Robert while also issuing alerts for the young lady and her vehicle. Statistics show that husbands or Robert had a solid alibi. No other suspects were discovered, and according to everyone who knew Linda, she never had enemies and was generally a very positive person as investigators tried to find new leads. However, it was Robert's case. More men were more likely to commit crimes against their wives. It had been several days since Linda had vanished. On the third day, a report about an abandoned vehicle matching the description of the young woman's vehicle was given to the police. It was 20 kilometers from the shopping center in a suburban area. When the police arrived, they confirmed that the vehicle was Linda's. The car was parked next to some bushes on the side of the road. This region was largely undeveloped and covered in bushes and trees in the 1980s. The police discovered Christmas presents Linda had purchased prior to going missing inside the vehicle. The ignition key was present inside the salon, and the doors were not locked. An odd clue was also discovered by the police. 
a pack of empty menthol cigarettes was found next to the front passenger seat. Robert and Linda never smoked, so the pack might belong to the kidnapper, investigators concluded, which was the most obvious conclusion. The police started looking for evidence right away and shortly thereafter they made a heartbreaking discovery about 40 meters from the car in the stream bed of a small creek. They discovered Linda's body. Her hands were bound together with an eyeglass and bikini cord. According to a relative of the victim, neither of these things were ever hers. Although the young woman was also subjected to violence, medical professionals determined that asphyxiation was the cause of death. However, at the time, couldn't get a DNA sample from the criminal so the investigators presented what they believed to be an approximate timeline of events. When Linda went to load the gifts she had purchased into the car in a shopping center parking lot, an unidentified criminal attacked her. He made her take the wheel and drive to the location where her body was later discovered. After that, he killed her and brutalized her. The investigators decided to attempt an interview because there were no leads that could point them to a suspect. Naturally, attracting the attention of everyone who was in the shopping center during Linda's lunch break was a very difficult task. The victim's car was taken by the police who then parked it in the mall while attaching a picture of the girl and information about her disappearance. The investigators hoped that the visitors would benefit from the visual installation. On that day, who saw Linda? Organize some information. The police were informed by numerous witnesses that they saw a young person in the mall with light hair. However, detectives were unable to place him. Other witnesses related a more intriguing story. They saw a man trying to hitch a ride on the highway the day Linda vanished less than a kilometer from where the victim's body was discovered. The van driver soon informed the police that he had picked up a man who was hitchhiking on the same day and in the same area as other witnesses had seen him. It got interesting at this point. According to the driver, the man was since an empty pack of menthol cigarettes was discovered in the victim's car. The man was seen smoking menthol cigarettes while holding the entire pack in his hand. As soon as this was discovered, Forensic experts looked at the driver's van and discovered a fingerprint on the glass close to the passenger seat that did not resemble the owner's prints. Sadly, a comparison with current databases produced no findings. The driver's superficial description of the suspect did not match that of Prince, the owner, not assist in the man's capture by the police. The search for additional evidence came up empty, and the case's investigation was put on hold for several months. Not until 1985, when a prisoner in one of the state's prisons who was a police informant provided investigators with an intriguing tip, did a new lead come to light. Craig Andrew McConnell, who shared his cell with him, had told him that he had killed Linda Reed. Craig claims that Lyndon caught him and another man trying to steal a car from a shopping center's parking lot. The criminals kidnapped and killed her out of concern that she would recall their faces and call the police. The detectives were familiar with this name. Craig was a suspect in Linda's murder because he was serving two life sentences for killings that occurred in 1984, but the police were unable to establish a connection at the time. When they spoke to Craig in prison following the informant's tip, he insisted that he was not involved in the killing. Killing. He added that his cellmate made everything up and that they never spoke about it regarding the incident, but the police were slow to believe him. Just a few months after Linda's passing, Craig committed two heinous murders, so the informant's account may be accurate. The suspect's fingerprints did not match those on the van's glass when forensic experts compared them. The detectives decided to go to trial in 1986 despite this because they still thought Craig might be the murderer. The only evidence against him was an informant's claims, but he himself did not live to see the beginning of the trial. He passed away shortly before from an overdose of illegal drugs. However, the prosecution had his entire story. According to the informant Craig, who gave him a rough map of the location where he left Linda's body. Experts determined that the terrain was fairly accurately matched, right down to the location of the trees. Additionally, Craig claimed that Linda warned the kidnappers that Rob would seek retribution. The young woman actually did frequently chase after Rob. The informant that after Linda's car was discovered, he consumed a cheese and vegetable sandwich that belonged to her. Despite the fact that experts did discover cheese traces in her purse, all of this evidence was circumstantial and was not enough to support a conviction. Craig was exonerated of Linda's murder as a result. Was not enough to support a conviction. Craig was exonerated of Linda's murder as a result. Investigators tried to gather additional evidence that would enable them to obtain a guilty verdict verdict because they still believe he was involved in the crime, but their other efforts came to a halt. When the murder investigation was reopened in 2014, 30 years after the original murder, the detectives decided to review the evidence. They gave samples of the fingerprints found on the van's glass to specialists who attempted to recreate them using cutting-edge technology. When they finally succeeded and entered the data into the database, 
the detectives discovered a match. Troy James O'Mara's fingerprints were found, and he was already serving a life sentence at the time Linda died. Year old girl, and this crime's specifics were strikingly similar. When she got close to her car, his victim was coming from a store with purchases for her upcoming wedding. James coerced her to sit in the vehicle and then drove her to a remote location where he killed her after violently beating her and tying her hands. James was never considered a suspect in Linda's case and was not even on the police's radar despite this similarity. During the early stages of the investigation, the detectives remembered another fact. Several witnesses reported James, who was only 17 at the time matched the description after seeing a fair-haired teenager in the mall's parking lot. Despite this, the police were determined to gather as much evidence as they could, and they were in for an interesting turn of events. Although it was no longer listed as evidence in the documents, it turned out that a DNA sample of the individual who had assaulted Linda had been kept at the warehouse during this time. It was almost by accident that the researchers found it, but there was one issue. The sample was local experts were unable to reconstruct the perpetrator's profile from the item because it was very small and had already started to deteriorate. The detective forwarded it to a cutting-edge lab in New Zealand, where the specialists were able to extract the profile and it perfectly matched James's DNA. Given that the criminal was already serving a life sentence, the investigation into all of this took the investigators several years. They could take their time and prepare the case for trial in the proper manner. Ultimately, James wasn't detained until August 26, 2018, nearly 35 years after the murder the man was 51 years old at the time. He had spent more than half of his life behind bars and during that time had accrued additional charges. James managed to escape from prison once and even attacked security personnel twice, but he was apprehended the following day for the murder of Linda. Trial planning got underway after he admitted to being guilty. The process took a while, but in March 2021, the offender made the decision to confess. According to him, Linda was in the parking lot. The young lady was eating while seated in her vehicle. He offered her a sandwich before forcing her into her car and threatening to drive to a remote area where he would attack and kill her. James responded that his only goal that day was to murder a random young woman when the judge questioned him about his motivations. James was therefore given the option to apply for early release in July 2022 due to the fact that he had already served more than 30 years in prison. James was sentenced to 30 years in prison for the murder of Linda. He is still serving his sentence as of right now, but he could be let go in the upcoming years. Sadly, Linda's father passed away before he could see the police catch her killer. After a protracted battle with cancer, he passed away despite having spent decades wanting to know what happened to his daughter. Robert promised Linda that he would never remarry after his wife passed away because he loved her so much. At the trial, following the announcement of the verdict, he thanked the investigators and said that James had permanently deprived him of his family. The circumstances surrounding Craig and the informant story are murky. Be aware that the informant was a seasoned criminal himself and would have benefited greatly from aiding in the investigation. He might have lied to the police, and all the pertinent information about the case could have been found in the newspapers. Share your opinion on this story in the comments and don't forget to like it. Thanks for watching. It took 25 years to piece together this strange tale. After leaving a party, a student from American University vanished. With no trace, despite having a suspect since the beginning, the police were unable to establish his guilt. It wasn't until the podcast's creator dug up the horrific details of the case decades later that he alerted millions of people to it and forced the police to reopen their investigation. Kristen Smart moved to the United States with her parents after being born on February 20, 1977, in Augsburg. Germany. At a young age, the family moved to Stockton, California, with the brother and sister. Her parents had a daycare center for kids of American military personnel. In 1996, Kristen entered California Polytechnic University after receiving her high school diploma. She worked as a lifeguard at the campus recreation center in her free time. A large birthday celebration for one of the students was held at the fraternity house on May 25, 1996, when her friends decided against going. Kristen went to the fraternity house by herself. The event took place in in typical American student fashion. A sizable group enjoyed themselves that evening by drinking, dancing, and listening to music. Two other students, Tim Davis and Cheryl Anderson, who had both been at the party, saw Kristen on the street and decided to walk her home after she overindulged and felt bad. At around 2 in the morning, Kristen went to her dorm because she could hardly walk by herself. Paul Flores, a fellow student who had also attended the party, 
joined them after a while and offered to walk Kristen to her dorm because he himself had not yet arrived. Lived closest to Cheryl and Tim bid them farewell before departing because they had to go in the opposite direction. Since then, nobody had seen Kristen alive. Her disappearance was not initially given much thought. Margarita Campos, Christine's roommate, was the first to express concern. After the party, she was certain that her friend would head back home, but she never did. The fact that Christine's belongings, including her wallet, bank card, and passport, were still in her room and she couldn't just pick them up and leave added to her anxiety. After the young woman vanished, Marguerite did not alert campus police until two days later. Campus police apparently didn't take a roommate's claim seriously despite the fact that she apparently hoped up until the very last moment that Kristen was okay and would go home. It was the previous weekend, and the day before was the United States official Day of Remembrance, which honors fallen American service members. The fact that Kristen had left all of her valuables and important papers in the dorm did not cause any concern for the local police. They simply assumed that she had gone home. Separately, the distance between the university campus and Christine's hometown was seven hours making it too difficult to suddenly travel that far without money and identification, especially at night. A few days later, the neighborhood police made up their minds to report to work and called the parents of the young woman. The mother of Christine reported that her daughter had not called or visited the house in a while. The mother was alarmed by that call, and the parents went to the police. But even then, the police were reluctant to launch an inquiry. They claimed that since Christine had vanished not long ago, she might have been out with friends. The search didn't start until the fourth day after she vanished. First, but there were no results from the search. Paul Flores, who volunteered to accompany Chris to her dormitory door and was supposed to be the last person to see her, was the first person the police questioned. He told the investigators that after parting ways, SRI Kristen went to her dormitory and then to her house by herself. He allegedly went straight to bed after that, but this account quickly unraveled. Around 5 a.m., Paul's roommates observed him enter the bathroom, while he and Kristen parted ways after 2 a.m. The young man also had scratches on his knees and a black eye. When questioned by several people, he provided three different accounts of how he sustained all of these wounds. Despite the fact that Paul Florist seemed very suspicious, there was no concrete evidence against him. After Christine had been missing for a month, authorities had widened their search to include Christine's hometown. Because of the case's resemblance to the plot of the well-known TV show Twin, Local journalists hyped it. Peaks the young woman was killed by two men on campus, then driven to the cliff and thrown into the water, according to their version of events, which was even mentioned in the news. Of course, the police have no evidence to support these claims. Christine's parents filed a lawsuit against Flores a year after she vanished, accusing him of being involved in the teen's disappearance. Paul gave sworn testimony in 1997 but he only provided his name in response to one question out of all the others. Every other time, he invoked the Fifth Amendment, which prohibits the accused from testifying against him or herself. Then, Paul's parents sued Christine's family for moral damages, but neither of these lawsuits succeeded because the police lacked sufficient proof to bring charges against Paul. Six years after Christine went missing, on May 25th, 2002, the government declared her dead. They also made no progress toward cracking the case during that time. This continued until 2018, when Chris Lambert, a Californian, made the decision to launch his own podcast series on various crimes. He was eight years old when Christine vanished, and he clearly recalled the spooky news report from that time. He made the decision to conduct his own investigation 22 years later and was shocked by how careless the police had been the entire time. Chris began by speaking with each of the witnesses to the incident. He discovered Paul Flores had a bad reputation from college students. Although the young man had repeatedly harassed female students, no official complaints were ever made. Chris further examined the police's actions and came to the following conclusion, that they had committed a number of serious mistakes. Two months after the young woman vanished, the detectives did not show up at Ruben Flores, Paul's father. The police should have started an investigation into the residence right away given that Paul was living with his father, but when they did show up to search it, they were very careless. The detectives failed to bring a forensic expert or a police canine trained to detect the smell of decay. The search was therefore essentially fruitless. The investigators also missed looking at the Flores family's two vehicles, one of which Paul might have used to transport Kristen from the campus to her father's home. One of the cars was sold, and the other was allegedly stolen a few months after the police visit. One of the key clues was hidden at Paul's mother's house, but the police never showed up there. Four months after Kristen Smart vanished, Chris Lambert learned that Mary Lassiter, who had rented Paul's mother's home, 
had found a necklace link that was remarkably similar to the one Kristen was wearing. This necklace was also visible in photos that had been circulated throughout the city. Lassiter immediately took the evidence to the police but they rejected it as evidence and later lost it entirely. The backyard at Paul's mother's house had always been concreted, but soon after the young woman vanished a small piece of concrete was cut out, and a flower bed had been planted in that location. Mary Lassiter told Lambert an extremely unsettling tale every day since moving and Mary had seen a very strange thing in the backyard of the house. Every day at the same time, at 4 a.m. and 4 p.m., I heard sounds emanating from that specific flower bed. She would hear a sound that resembled a wristwatch alarm, but it would soon stop, and it was probably the battery that had died. Christine's mother, Miss Smart, informed Chris that her daughter had set the alarm for 4.20 a.m. because she had to be at the recreation center for work at 5 that morning. Millions of people who listened to Lambert's podcast in 2019 were horrified by what they had heard, were affected by the police's carelessness and inaction. Even though there was a lot of circumstantial evidence, Chris' discovery shocked the audience even more. Since Paul Flores is still at large, the police have decided to reopen their inquiry into the disappearance of Kristen Smart. Investigators began by searching the homes and vehicles of the Flores family. When the unfortunate flower bed was finally dug up, no one was discovered inside. Even though there was no body, the experts were able to establish that on April 13, 2021, when Paul Flores and his father were detained, there were signs of human body decay in the ground. According to the investigation, Paul was charged with Christine's murder and his father was charged as an accessory. After Tim Davis and Cheryl Anderson left, Paul tried to molest the young woman but was rejected. This could account for the wounds Flora sustained during the altercation. Paul had the option of murdering Kristen and bringing her body home. The father of Flores made a decision after witnessing what his son had they took the young woman to her mother's house and buried her in the backyard which was later changed into a flower bed, to assist him in concealing the corpse. Later, the suspects dug up the grave and took the remains somewhere unknown. Later, the suspects dug up the grave and took the remains somewhere unknown, apparently fearing harassment from the police. First-degree murder was found to have been committed by Paul Flores. He could be sentenced to 25 years to life in prison by a Monterey County jury. Ruben Flores, his father, was charged with being an accessory to the crime and could spend three years in jail. The parents of Christine published acknowledging Chris Lambert and all concerned parties for helping to ease the family's grief over the case's resolution despite the long period of time since their daughter vanished. One thing they ponder is whether Flora's mother was aware that her son had committed a crime. She didn't have any suspicions about the flower bed that had been unexpectedly planted in the backyard, or perhaps she had been aware of what had happened that night all along but had chosen to remain silent out of love for her son. Of course, there would be some unanswered questions, but that didn't matter right now. Maybe someday Kristen Smart will discover the remains of the young woman. Share your opinion on this story in the comments and don't forget to like it. Thanks for watching. A woman's body was discovered in her bedroom. Her two sons, who shared a home with her, were oblivious to what was happening. Detectives began their investigation, but they were unable to identify the offender. Nobody was ready for the truth that emerged when the case finally made progress after 38 years. In 1950, Linda Slatton was born in Alabama, USA, to devoted parents and a younger sister named Judy. Linda showed kindness and ambition from a young age. She always made an effort to assist others, which gained her a lot of friends. She later got married to a man, with whom she had two sons, Jeff and Tim, was Frank. But as time passed, their marriage grew more and more troubled. Frank started abusing his wife and kids after becoming an alcoholic. Linda eventually left and made the decision to relocate to Florida with her sons. They made their home in Lakeland, the city where Linda's parents and sister had previously resided. Linda rented a home in a neighborhood by the lake and spent her entire day working to support her sons. Although Linda worked a variety of jobs, she struggled with money she occasionally had. Sell her possessions in order to pay the bills. Her older son Jeff had to ride his bicycle to school because she couldn't even afford to buy him a car. Despite the financial difficulties, her younger son Tim was a football player and frequently had to ask his coach for a ride home after practice to avoid walking. Linda always made an effort to spend as much time and energy as she could with her sons, she took them on hikes, brought them to concerts featuring their favorite bands, and generally worked to make sure their childhood was full of happy memories. When Linda was 31 years old, on September 3, 1981, she waited for Jim to finish his practice before accompanying him to the neighbor's house where a small family gathering was being held. However, there wasn't much food in the fridge when Jeff got home and wanted to eat dinner. 
As a result of his frustration with his mother, he got on his bike and rode to the other side of the city to visit his grandparents. After everyone had returned home, Jeff and his mother got into a fight over the empty fridge, but they eventually came to an agreement. The following morning, Linda's sister, who also lived in the building, went to her home to extend an invitation for a cup of coffee. When Linda didn't answer the door when she knocked, she assumed that she had left. The woman noticed the bedroom window was open as she turned around and prepared to leave. When she got close, she peered inside and saw Linda sprawled out on the bed. The woman screamed immediately after that and ran to the neighbors to ask them to call the police. She only needed to glance at her sister's face. Detectives arrived at their home and started looking at the crime scene before she realized she was dead. With a wire hanger around her neck, Linda's clothes were partially pulled down as she lay on her bed. Using this information, the police surmised that the victim had been attacked and strangled by an unidentified man who had broken into her room. This theory was soon supported by the discovery of a palm print on the windowsill by forensic experts. Since the apartment lacked air conditioning, Linda frequently left it open, making it simple for the murderer to enter. The victim's oldest son awoke from the commotion as the detectives worked at the crime scene. The detectives took him outside and broke the heartbreaking news of his mother's passing. They then roused his younger brother and let him out of the room. But as the boy passed by his mother's room at that precise moment, another policeman came out. Tim froze in place when he saw his mother's body through the open door and had to be pulled away by the officer. Tim was 12 years old and Jeff was 15 years old. Were utterly shocked. They initially found it difficult to accept that their mother had passed away. When the investigators were able to speak with them later, the brother claimed that despite having their own rooms, they hadn't heard any noise and hadn't even woken up that night. Given the excellent acoustics of the building and the brutality of the murder, the detectives thought loud noises should have been audible from the victim's room. The neighbors, who also had not heard anything, were questioned by the police. None of the complex's residents reported seeing any shady characters that day. After examining the victim's body, medical professionals concluded that she had experienced violence. Although they removed the killer's biological components, they were unable to perform a DNA analysis at the time. The experts also determined that Linda had been strangled to death, leaving the detectives to look into the case with little to no evidence. If they were able to identify a suspect and make a comparison, the palm print could only be of assistance. The Grands moved in with Linda's sons. They never recovered from their shock and lived in constant fear of being pursued by the killer. They slept in the same room as their grandmother due to their extreme fear, and their grandfather kept a rifle in the living room. The detectives thought the kids weren't in any real danger, though. They believed that the murderer knew the victim and that the crime had only a sexual motivation. They learned about Linda's ex-husband after speaking with her family. He was the obvious suspect because he had a history of domestic abuse, but the police soon discovered that he was out of state when the victim was killed. Later, the detectives learned that Linda had begun dating a particular man not long before she passed away. Although they found him, he also had a strong alibi. The investigators ran fingerprint checks on each of the victim's neighbors and compared them to the sample taken from the windowsill. Then, they made a comparable analysis of all previously convicted men. Living in Lakeland, but there were no matches. The family eventually decided that Linda's son's return to school would be the best course of action for them after several weeks had passed since the murder. The brothers eventually started talking to friends again and started leading more normal lives, so it did help them. Tim rejoined the football team because his mother had always been pleased with his performance. He hung a picture of his team in his bedroom a month after she passed away as a reminder of the lessons his mother had taught him about pursuing his dreams and moving forward. The detectives, meanwhile, ran into a brick wall. They searched for a suitable suspect but were unsuccessful, so they decided to start over and think about why the sons hadn't heard any screams or seen any indications of a struggle. When the police went over Jeff's statements, they saw that he had a disagreement with Linda on the day that she was killed. In addition, the teen had admitted to the detectives that he and his mother frequently had arguments, which caused the investigators to wonder. He had murdered his mother, Jeff. They called him in for questioning and resumed their barrage of inquiries. Jeff soon became aware that the police were looking into him for the crime. The detectives persisted in pressing him despite his denial of his involvement. Jeff accepted their offer to take a polygraph test. Although the polygraph operator found no evidence of deception, the police were not willing to give up. Soon after, they planned to bring in a hypnotist to put a man under again for questioning. Trance stayed under constant pressure, Jeff was accused of strangling his mother by the investigators. When Linda's family reached their breaking point over this, they yelled at the police to concentrate on finding the real killer and forbade them from speaking to Jeff. Despite this, Jeff consented to take another polygraph test, and following positive results, he was finally cleared of suspicion. The case remained unresolved after that for many years. Jeff and Tim developed, obtained jobs, and the murder of their mother continued to trouble them as they started their own families, but each time they contacted the detectives, they got the same response, no progress has been made in the case. 
professionals took a DNA sample from the victim's biological material in March 1999. A new detective brought in to work on the case two years later compared it to samples from every suspect, including Linda's two sons, but there were no matches. Nothing came from even cross-referencing it with the FBI database. Jeff had a meeting with this detective when they were aware that they had known each other for a long time. The men were discovered to frequently bowl together with shared friends. During their conversation, the detective assured Jeff that he would crack the case no matter what. Tim and Jeff learned of another long-standing crime that had not yet been solved. Following extensive media coverage, fresh information surfaced that enabled the culprit to be apprehended. The brothers then made the decision to approach reporters and share their. They gave a thorough interview, and the story was published in the neighborhood newspapers in September 2001. When the detective discovered that Jimmy Ulmer, who had been sentenced to 80 years in prison for killing Linda, had kidnapped a young woman through her bedroom window a year prior, he had an intriguing new lead. It was made even more intriguing by the fact that, at the time of Linda's murder, this individual lived in the same apartment building only a few meters from her home. When Homer was detained, the DNA of. Since it did not yet exist, criminals had not yet been added to a shared database. The biological samples of the man himself were lost after his death in 1996. However, when the detective got in touch with the offender's mother, she gave the experts access to a number of personal items from which the sample could be obtained. Sadly, it did not match the killer's DNA, but the detective was not prepared to give up despite the setback. He kept looking for new suspects and repeatedly requested that the FBI run the killer's DNA sample through all. Kept in touch with Linda Sons and used the databases that were available. Sadly, he had health issues in 2015, which made him retire despite his vow to see the case through to the end. At that point, Jeff and Tim had all but given up hope of ever catching the person who had killed their mother. A new hope, however, surfaced in 2019 when C.C. Moore, a well-known authority on genetic ancestry, accepted the case. She collected the murderer's DNA sample, uploaded it to open databases, and started looking for any matches. Typically, these databases can even assist in locating the DNA owner's most distant relatives, who may be spread out across the globe and not even be aware of one another's existence. It is possible to trace their family tree using this information and identify shared ancestors. After all this laborious work, filter out thousands of relatives and identify the DNA owner. One family that was present in the area at the time of the murder was identified by Moore. She came to the conclusion that he was very likely the murderer because there was only one member of that family who met all the criteria. The detectives knew as soon as they heard his name that they had come across him in previous reports. Tim's football coach, Joseph Clinton Mills, frequently gave him a ride home from practice. He was never listed as a suspect, but the police had taken a statement over the incident in 1981, so. He had left Tim at home that day and was calling because of it. At the time, none of the detectives even gave Mills' potential role as the murderer any thought. The police did not compare his DNA and fingerprints with the evidence collected at the crime scene because he was only 20 years old and there was zero evidence against him. The detectives decided to wait before telling Jeff and Tim about this finding. They needed to confirm that Mills was really responsible for killing their mother. They discovered after reading his biography that when Mills was detained in 1984 on suspicion of forging a will, his fingerprints were taken, and they are still preserved in a paper archive today. They were a perfect match when experts compared them to the fingerprints discovered on the victim's window cell. They identified the likely murderer at last after 38 years. The detectives then proceeded to the last step, which involved taking a DNA sample from Mills and comparing it with the biological material from the victim's body. They learned the man was still alive the same residence as in 1981. 58 years old, married, with a small business, kids, and grandchildren, Mills was now. For several weeks, the detectives kept an eye on him in an effort to find something that contained his DNA, it might have been a bottle, a coffee cup, a cigarette butt, etc. However, they were never given the chance, so the police made the decision to covertly take his trash. They gave the bag to the lab, where specialists soon discovered something that contained his DNA. The results for Mills' DNA were quick to come in. The detectives then met with their sons to update them on the case's development. Both of them were astounded, but Tim found it much harder to accept. He couldn't believe that the man who had murdered his mother turned out to be his football coach. Tim respected and looked up to Mills, and even after the murder, Mills still gave Tim rides home from practice. He was constantly applauded by the man, who also inquired about any obstacles. Tim's old bedroom featured a football team photo with the killer of his mother standing behind him. Tim had been following the developments in his mother's case for years. When Mills was detained in the same year, he maintained composure and didn't even inquire as to the charges against him. He denied any involvement when questioned about Linda's murder after being brought in for questioning. He claims to have dropped him off and then left. Although Mills insisted he had never been inside their home, the detectives were aware that this was a lie. Informed him of the DNA and fingerprint match, 
the suspect abruptly changed his account of what happened. As of late, Mills has maintained that Linda invited him to enter her bedroom through the window that evening for an intimate encounter. She then requested that he lightly choke her with a hanger, but Mills misjudged his strength and killed her. Given all the available information, the detectives of course didn't believe this story for a second, they had a much more logical theory based on the fact that Mills had. Tim was frequently given rides home, he had seen his mother and might have chosen her as a target. He dropped the boy off the evening of the murder, and he went right away with his mother to a party at the neighbor's house. The returned returned on foot, sneaking into Linda's bedroom through the window and hiding in the closet. Mills took advantage of the fact that no one would be at home in their house and drove away for a short distance. He waited in that same closet for several hours as everyone fell asleep. He assaulted the victim, then took a hanger and used it as a murder weapon before fleeing out the window. Charges for the murder were filed against Mills based on all the evidence, and the case was sent to court in the state of Florida. On February 9, 2022, Mills made the decision to reach a plea agreement with the prosecution in order to avoid the death penalty, which was a potential punishment for such a crime. He admitted to the murder, but according to the terms of the deal, he was not required to reveal the specifics of the. In the courtroom, Linda's sons expressed their displeasure with this fact. Tim yelled at his coach, demanding to know why he had taken his mother away from him, but the man remained silent, only looking down when given the chance to make a closing argument. I'm a good person, Mills declared. They are trying to portray me as something I'm not. The brothers were even more incensed by this, but in the end they were appreciative of the detectives for solving the case and catching the murderer. Mills was given a life sentence. Jeff and Tim made a promise to try to live honorable lives and devote themselves to their families after the verdict was announced, as that is what their mother would have wanted. Share your opinion on this story in the comments and don't forget to like it. Thanks for watching. A young lady was discovered inside her own apartment. Police launched an investigation but came up empty handed. It took 40 years for a breakthrough to be made in the case, but in addition to the truth, the detectives also learned new, alarming information. On March 30, 1960, Robin Brooks was born in Virginia. She relocated with her family to the sleepy New York town of Highland when she was a young girl. Robin was a happy and outgoing person who always managed to make friends and find common ground with others. Mariah, her older sister, was someone she was very close to. Robin decided to relocate to California after graduation. The young woman had another compelling reason to relocate in addition to the state's climate. Shortly before that, her sister had also moved there, and Robin had made the decision to join her. The young lady obtained employment in Sacramento and rented an apartment there. A few months later, she got the chance to relocate to the apartment building where her sister and her boyfriend were housed. The apartments were vastly superior. So that Robin could spend more time with Mariah, Robin decided to relocate just before turning 20. The young woman had to work two jobs in order to pay the rent on her separate apartment, one of which was a cashier position at a donut shop just a few meters away from her apartment building. Robin decided to combine it with her second job by working the evening shift. The young woman made a lot of friends during her time living in this complex, which lasted about one and a half months. She was happy to be able to see her sister again at work and other times as well. At the donut shop on April 24, 1980, Robin was scheduled to begin her shift at 4 p.m., but to the surprise of her co-workers, she never arrived. She never missed her chefs while she was employed there, and she frequently arrived even earlier than expected, so this was very odd. After waiting for several hours, one of the workers made the decision to visit Robin's apartment. Only one person answered the door when the co-worker knocked on it. Observation and reaction he returned this door and informed them that the young woman was not responding after making several unsuccessful attempts. Because of this, Robin's co-workers were very worried because they believed that if something had happened to her, she would have called to explain why she couldn't come to work. She had made friends with every employee in the brief time she had worked there, and they were all genuinely concerned about her. They thought about contacting the police, but quickly realized that they wouldn't look for. One of them came up with an unconventional solution after Robin missed a shift at work, he offered to open the door to her apartment and see how she was doing. He and his co-workers went to her house, remained at the door for a while, and then made the decision to break in. When they were successful, they witnessed a startling scene. In the living room, where Robin was lying on her water bed, blood was all over the place. As soon as her co-workers called the police, officers arrived. Confirmed the young lady's demise. She appeared to have suffered numerous tab wounds from an unidentified attacker who attacked her with a knife and repeatedly pierced the water mattress, causing its contents to spill onto the floor. Police determined after investigating the crime scene that there were no indications of a break-in before Robin's co-workers opened the entrance door. They assumed that the killer entered the apartment through a window because the back door was also locked from the inside. Soon, forensic specialists discovered proof of According to this theory, 
medical examiners were able to establish the victim's sexual assault through the discovery of fingerprints on the windowsill and obtain the offender's biological material. Additionally, there are minute amounts of blood in the apartment that do not match Robin's blood type. Blood samples were sent to a lab after detectives determined that the attacker had cut himself during the attack. Unfortunately, they were unable to use this evidence because DNA analysis was not available in the 1980s. Investigators started speaking with the victim's friends, starting with her co-workers, claimed that the young woman had finished her shift the day before at midnight and gone home. She was acting normally, laughing, and in a good mood, nothing seemed out of the ordinary. That particular day, Robin mentioned to her co-workers that she had washed her bedding before leaving for work and was unsure if it would dry in time for her return. Detectives deduced that the victim's apartment's bed wasn't made. Shortly after she got home, the murderer attacked her. Her sister also made a worrying report. Robin mentioned that she was being followed by a man a few days before she passed away. She didn't give any information that could be used to identify him, but she did say that he had frequented her store and acted in an odd way in an effort to win her favor. Robin did not take it seriously because he had not done anything to make her fear for her safety. Due to a lack of information, the police were unable to identify this individual. They talked to the victim's neighbors and continued their investigation without any leads, none of them had heard any screams or sounds of struggle that night. The victim was not being visited by anyone unfamiliar, according to the neighbors. Investigators also discovered that Robin did not go straight home from work that evening, rather, she spent some time at a party with her friends before laughing. Her friends reported that she went home alone, and that there were no disputes or unusual circumstances at the party after speaking with everyone present, the police came to the conclusion that they were most likely not responsible for her murder. The investigators ultimately came to a standstill because they had no viable suspects. There were no people from Robin's past who might have had ill intentions toward her, and she got along well with her neighbors and co-workers. They were unable to identify the killer at the time using blood or biological evidence, and fingerprint matching against databases did not produce any results. Authorities thought that the murderer, he was the regular customer that Robin had mentioned. The victim was allegedly followed from her place of employment to her residence, where he allegedly learned her precise address. The following day, while she was waiting at the store, he broke into her apartment through a window. He attacked her, brutalized her, killed her, and then fled when Robin arrived home. The investigation went on for a while despite the complete lack of evidence before it eventually came to a standstill. 24 years after the murder, the investigation wasn't reopened by authorities until 2004. Detectives hoped that the widespread use of DNA analysis at the time would enable them to catch the murderer. They sent biological samples and blood to a lab, where specialists extracted a DNA profile and entered it into the FBI database. However, no matches were discovered. This indicated that the murderer had not previously been convicted of a serious offense or that it occurred before such offenders were required to submit to DNA collection. Despite this, the California State Database held a concerning discovery for the investigators, the DNA. The murderer's profile matched one committed three weeks prior to Robin's death. A different young woman was assaulted at that time in her home by an unidentified man who then left the victim alive. The incident took place at night, so the victim was unable to see the attacker's face. She dialed 911 right away, and forensic specialists were able to take the man's biological material. Detectives searched for fresh leads in this case to finally pin down Robin's killer, but they were all unsuccessful. Investigators were left periodically checking the DNA profile against databases in case the murderer was taken into custody, but they were fruitless, and eventually the case went cold once more. His DNA was added to that view. Until 2017, when detectives learned about a novel technique called DNA phenotyping, this continued. In essence, geneticists examine a DNA sample and, using their interpretation of the results, sketch a rough portrait of the suspect. This approach is not exact and is more of an additional police guideline. Investigators can closely examine similar suspects or cross someone off the list with the aid of such a portrait. Detectives contacted Parabin Nano Labs, which carried out such research, and soon they had a rough sketch of the murderer. He turned out to be a man of African descent, but among all the individuals who even remotely resembled him, investigators were unable to identify anyone similar. Two portraits were created by Parabin Nano Labs, one depicting the suspect's potential appearance in 1980 and the other in 2016. Both pictures were released to the media in an effort to generate more leads. The family of Robin made the decision to offer a $10,000 reward for any information about this person that could lead to his discovery in the hopes of finally learning the truth. Numerous tips were given to the police, but they all proved fruitless. They were still unable to determine who the actual criminal was. However, the detectives and Robin's family weren't going to give up. This murder case was added to the list of unsolved slayings in 2020. By then, funding had been allocated, and a fresh DNA analysis tool was in use, making it possible to identify even distant relatives of the DNA sample owner. 
For this, at least one relative of his had to be listed in national or local DNA databases. The Paramount Nanolabs experts received the Robin Killer sample and waited. It took them several months to research every potential ancestor of the criminal, track down their family trees, and then identify a suitable suspect. As a result, the investigators at last received a name Philip Wilson, 71, was suspected of being guilty, but the research findings did not support this. To compare his DNA to the sample discovered in the victim's apartment, the police needed to take it. They discovered this man's address and started keeping an eye on him. Given that a person is not required by law to provide a DNA sample, the police must use some deception. They frequently try to obtain something the suspect has had contact with. An example of this would be a water bottle or cigarette butt. Investigators also took the same actions in Wilson's case. They obtained something containing his DNA and sent it to the lab, where scientists discovered a perfect match. They identified the suspected murderer four decades later, and on February 24 of that year, he was taken into custody. Although the man claimed he had nothing to do with the murder, the evidence was against him. His fingerprints were also taken by the police because they coincided with those on the victim's windowsill. The investigators examined his biography. I discovered a lot of fascinating information around the time Robin was killed. The 31-year-old man resided a short distance from her complex. In addition, Wilson frequently stopped by the victim's place of employment, a donut shop. The police's initial theory that the murderer was the same enigmatic stalker who had bothered the young woman at work was supported by this information. The lack of the man's DNA and fingerprints in the databases was explained by the fact that he had no significant criminal history. Following his arrest, the trial's preparations got underway, but they took a long time. Years passed before the process started, and it wasn't until 2022 that Wilson and his attorneys prepared a new defense theory, according to which Philip and Robin had a consensual relationship that night, after the man went home, someone else broke into the girl's apartment and killed her. Regarding the suspect's blood that was discovered at the crime scene, Wilson's attorney insisted that he had been hurt at work and that it had become infected while he was at Robin's house. The prosecution gave this version some thought. Absurdity of events First of all, the victim was not involved in a romantic relationship with anyone. Additionally, Wilson was most likely the strange man the victim complained about stalking her at work. There was no understanding between them, and the young woman found his actions and persistence to be infuriating. It would be strange to assume that Wilson left his biological material, blood, and fingerprint while the murderer left nothing at all given that no other men's DNA traces were discovered in the victim's apartment. Furthermore, if we accept the suspect's lawyer, she had not made the bed, which was empty of bedding, prior to reaching out to him of her own free will. Wilson's defense also made an effort to implicate Maria's ex-boyfriend, who she was living with at the time, as a potential murderer. The man was not alive at the time of the trial, but the attorney attempted to persuade the jury otherwise by claiming that he was hostile, threatened Robin and her sister, and also broke into the victim's apartment, but nothing could be proven. Confirmed, so none of these claims significantly affected the legal system. Philip Wilson was consequently found guilty of murder. On his birthday, his sentence was revealed. The man was given a life sentence with no chance of release. He currently has a lot of health issues, so his time in jail won't likely be very long. The family of the victim thanked the detectives for concluding the investigation. Her sister acknowledged that she does indeed still feel guilty. Robin followed her to California. The man received no additional punishment for that crime because the statute of limitations had already passed. Detectives continue to ponder whether Wilson had any additional victims. Typically, criminals who carry out such heinous acts and wait a few weeks before stopping don't stop and keep hurting people. Wilson might not have intended to kill Robin, he may have just broken into her apartment and assaulted her, but she was able to see and recognize him because he had previously visited her store. The man may have chosen to murder and then refrain from committing other crimes out of repeated fear of a prison sentence. Share your opinion on this story in the comments and don't forget to like it. Thanks for watching. At first, the police believed they had the answer in front of them when the student vanished as she was making her way to the dorm. But as the investigation went on, they were more and more certain that there had been many complicated circumstances in this case, and that the truth had ultimately only come to light by accident. On October 1, 1969, Amy Blau was born in Homestead, Florida. She was raised in a loving family and was well-liked, largely as a result of her upbeat and charitable personality. Her father died when she was 14 years old. Despite this heartbreaking loss, passed away. After graduating from high school, Amy found the perseverance to keep a positive outlook on life. Despite the fact that Flagler College only had 13000 residents and was located in St. Augustine, close to Jacksonville, she enrolled there. It was the oldest American city. Spanish explorers laid the foundation for it. 
Amy loves studying architecture at college because it has so many distinctive features that set it apart from the typical American things. There, she made a lot of friends in three years. She had never laughed much before and was 21 years old at the time. She and her friend Kim decided to visit a nearby bar that was well liked by college students on November 6, 1990, when Kim arrived in St. Augustine. Kelly, Amy's roommate and closest friend, joined them. The young ladies thoroughly enjoyed their long-awaited meeting. Sean Nolan, a friend of theirs, eventually joined them. He and Amy did not have a romantic relationship, but they did share sympathy. In the evening, Kim and Kelly both left, leaving Sean and Amy alone, after Kelly claimed she felt ill and returned to the dorm. The young ladies had to go to class the following morning, but when Kelly awoke, she discovered that Amy's bedroom door was wide open and that she was not in it. She thought it strange, but she made the decision to see Amy in class, but the student never appeared. Kelly and Kim were concerned about her absence and made the decision to speak with Sean, who had spent the previous night with her at the bar. The young women went to see him because he worked somewhere close to the college. They initially thought his story was strange, but he claimed to have a powerful. He had a hangover and had trouble recalling the events of that evening. He finally admitted to them after gathering his thoughts that after the bar, he and Amy went in the direction of the beach to take a walk but soon made the decision to return home. The two got into an argument as they waited for the taxi after the guy dialed a taxi from the closest payphone. She ultimately decided to walk the short distance to the dorm. Kelly was annoyed that the guy didn't take Amy to her dorm and instead left her on her own. During this time, she increased even more in. Amy never appeared in her room, and she was concerned that she had nowhere to go but the dorm. Her friends started to seriously doubt Sean because she was afraid that something terrible had happened to her. She became more anxious as a result of his strange behavior because it appeared that he was not at all concerned that Amy had vanished. Kelly made the decision to carry on looking, so she went to the college campus and asked all of her friends if they had seen Amy. The response was the same, no one had encountered her that day, and nobody was aware of her whereabouts at 6 o'clock. Her pal made the choice to make a police call. She told the detectives about the missing girl, and they started to look into the details. They contacted every hospital in the area, but nobody who resembled Amy had been admitted. The drivers of taxis were also contacted, but none had picked up the young woman that evening. There was no proof that Amy had gotten into trouble or been a victim of a crime, according to the police. The young woman was already 21 years old at the time, so despite the concern of her friend, they did not formally report her missing. Orders at that point Kelly was positive that Amy had experienced a negative event. She made the decision to call Amy's mother after realizing she could not persuade the police to begin their search. The young lady later acknowledged that it was the most difficult call she had ever made. Amy's sister arrived in St. Augustine the following morning to help with the search. They went to the police station first, where they were met with the same response, they were unable to launch an investigation because there was no sign of a life threat. The sisters, Kelly, and other friends of the missing young woman made the decision to organize their own search effort because they believed that the young woman had simply left for a few days without warning, contrary to what the investigators thought. They started printing flyers with details about Amy and putting them up around the city. Soon after, a nearby television station stepped in to help them by disseminating news of the young woman's disappearance. All of this resulted in numerous volunteers expressing interest in helping with the search. As they divided into groups, with the help of volunteers, they started scouring the city and the surrounding area, looking through forests, beaches, and abandoned homes, but they were unable to uncover any leads. Before the police finally decided to open an investigation, this went on for three days. By then, Amy's disappearance had become a topic of conversation throughout the community, which is thought to have put pressure on the neighborhood police force and caused them to act. Since Sean was the last person to see Amy, they decided to talk to him first, this is where they had their first unsettling experience. The story the man told them was distinct from what Kelly and Kim had previously heard. Sean claimed that he and Amy left the bar and made their way to the beach before deciding to part ways and return home. When he turned around after using the payphone to call the taxi, Amy was not there. He waited for a while before boarding the taxi and leaving for home. The story seemed strange to the investigators. Sean was standing one meter away when the young woman vanished from the street in a matter of seconds. Why did she not notice, and why did he also give his friends a different account of what happened? 
all of this was sufficient cause to begin suspecting Sean. Detectives made the decision to investigate his claims and track down the taxi driver who was supposed to take him home that evening. They were soon successful. The only issue was that his account varied from Sean's two other accounts. The taxi driver insisted that he did in fact pick up the young man near the phone booth, but that he had to wake Sean up because he was dozing off on a bench when he got there. At the time, there was no young woman present. On the one hand, this gave the boy an alibi, but on the other, he had, for some reason, given his version of events, which only made the detectives more suspicious. Despite this, there was no proof that he had committed the crime, so the police kept looking for new leads. It had been 10 days since Amy had vanished. Her bank accounts had been completely inactive during that time, which only served to further prove that she had not left on her own accord. When that happened, the citizens of St. Augustine and the police started to wonder if Amy's disappearance might be connected to a different set of horrifying crimes, which are covered in a different video. An unidentified maniac murdered five students in Gainesville, which was 120 kilometers away, in August of the same year. The town's residents started to worry that this criminal had relocated there and that they were all in imminent danger. Investigators contacted Gainesville colleagues and started comparing the cases, but soon found that there were numerous inconsistencies the in Amy's case, the police didn't even know if she was still alive or what had happened to her. In addition, at the time of her disappearance, the police had already detained a man who was strongly suspected of being the murderer because a number of important pieces of evidence pointed to him. As a result, the detective soon gave up trying to find a link between those crimes and Amy's disappearance, and the police department offered. When they offered a reward of $10,000 for any information that would help them locate Amy, they received hundreds of tips right away but the majority of them were fruitless. Anytime the government offers a reward for information, people will make up all kinds of tales in the hopes of receiving a quick check. There were six additional potentially significant leads. Many of the witnesses who saw her in the city's various locations also said that she got into a few cars. One call stood out among the rest as being the most intriguing. Amy was allegedly spotted in the city by a man. She was approached by an older vehicle that looked like a Chevrolet Camaro the night she vanished. Inside, there were two men. Amy sat in the passenger seat after having a brief conversation with them, and they departed. This was the detective's most comprehensive lead at the time. But something about the witness's conduct worried them. He agreed to go to the station after the call, provided all the information requested, and made an effort to assist, but for some reason the investigators viewed him suspiciously. Detectives referred to their uncertainty as a police instinct and were at a loss for words. The man accepted their offer to submit to a lie detector test in order to validate his testimony. They only questioned him about two things, whether he was involved in Amy's disappearance, and whether he could lead investigators to her. The witness gave a negative response, and the polygraph operator found no evidence of lying. Investigators realized that they had credible testimony that could help them locate Amy at last. The police started looking for all vehicles that fit the witness description, confirming the driver's identities, and examining their alibi sheets for the night the young woman vanished. The detective searched for several weeks, but he never identified a single possible suspect. There haven't been any leads in this case since then. Two months after Amy vanished, however, a startling call to the police was made on January 1st. Near St. Augustine, a man was strolling his dog. His dog eventually spotted a stack of logs with bricks and began acting strangely, barking and yanking on the leash while attempting to flee. The owner decided to investigate what was upsetting his dog so much and was nearly incoherent when he noticed a skeleton hand poking out from beneath the heap. He dialed 911 right away, and detectives started to remove the body. They were unable to identify her right away due to the high level of decomposition, but one aspect immediately caught their attention, the body was donning a green shirt just like Amy Blunt did the night she was last seen. Disappeared a sheet was used to cover the body. A more thorough examination by medical professionals revealed that the deceased was a young woman. Her shirt was cut, revealing five wounds from sharp objects. Two significant abrasions were also discovered on the body. Amy's dental records were immediately sent to specialists after investigators developed a suspicion that she was the victim, these specialists quickly verified that it was Amy. The news devastated the young woman's friends and family. Up until the very last moment, they had hoped that Amy returned to them without harm now that Amy's body had been found and the police had to look into her murder, they had their first tip, 
Amy had been partially buried and covered with logs on the edge of a sizable private property. For understandable reasons, they called him in for questioning when they discovered the name of the plot's owner. The man was immediately considered a suspect, but after speaking with him, the detectives started to have doubts about his guilt. First, anyone could walk onto the vast plot of land because there was no fence. Enter it was also home to two residential trailers, whose owners paid the landowner rent there. He continued by saying that he frequently had issues with one of the tenants. The police were stunned when they learned his name. The polygraphed witness was the same person. Tim Gatchell, who was 22 years old, was the man. When the man was not at home, the police immediately requested permission to search the residence, and the trailer owner consented. The first thing the police noticed was a sheet that looked remarkably like the one that held Amy's body, was wrapped, upon further search, they discovered long female hair that matched Amy's hair color stuck in a floor exercise machine's mechanism. Additionally, forensic professionals found blood traces in the living room using special chemicals. The house also contained a piece of paper with the name Toby and a phone number on it. The landowner claimed that a man by that name frequently paid a visit to Timothy. The police acknowledged that this individual might also be connected to the homicide and got in touch with him. Toby consented to speak with the investigators and related his tale to them. Toby claims that he and Timothy were driving around town that evening, stopping at various bars, when Amy vanished. They eventually came across Amy on the street by herself. Tim asked Toby to put the car in park. Toby exited the vehicle and approached the girl. She entered the vehicle with them after accepting his invitation to do so. They held a gathering at Timothy's trailer. But Toby's tale began to sound odd, almost like a detective tale. He initially stated that he simply dropped. He later changed his story and claimed that he entered the trailer with them, drank a beer, went to the bathroom, and then left without going into the living room before getting into the car and driving away. Investigators had their doubts about his sincerity, they didn't think Amy would travel at night with two enigmatic men to the city's outskirts. She had classes in the morning, and after the bar she was supposed to head to the dorm. Toby appeared to have created his tale. Detectives did not rule out that Timothy and Toby may have actually abducted the young woman on the deserted nighttime street, but they were unable to establish this at this time. In addition, Toby claimed something else during the first week of the investigation, he saw flyers about Amy's disappearance and recognized her. He then asked Timothy what happened that night, and Timothy claimed that he took the young woman to the city center and dropped her off there. And quickly began. Even though his story raised serious doubts, Toby advised him to report this information to the police. In order to apprehend Timothy, the police needed sufficient proof. When they got to his house, the man emerged holding up his hands. He told the investigators the same tale when questioned. He started to flirt with Amy after Toby left, but she turned him down. As a result of his outrage, he chose to drive her back to the city. He borrowed the landowner's car because he didn't have one of his own. Amy allegedly got into another car at the center after being driven there in a pickup truck by Amy, but the detectives quickly realized that this was a lie. They were already aware that the rental pickup truck had three flat tires and many months worth of worn tires at that point. The moment the investigators informed him of it, Timothy felt uneasy. He was asked by the detectives, Did you kill Amy? I don't know, the man said in response. Apparently so. He started talking about what had happened that night at that point. He claimed he couldn't recall much. He tried to kiss Amy at some point, and the next thing he recalls is her holding a knife. He allegedly tried to take the weapon from her because he was afraid she might attack him. After that, Timothy seemed to have lost consciousness because he had no memory of anything. He claimed that he had experienced this before. Some memories were completely gone for him. When he regained consciousness, he discovered Amy dead on the floor with the knife still in his hand. He decided to dispose of the body out of fear. For the shovel, Timothy went to the storage area and began excavating a hole. Then, after burying Amy there and wrapping her in a sheet, he covered the grave with bricks and logs. He then prayed to God and left the room with his confession in hand to clean up the blood. Murder was alleged against Timothy. Toby was only used as a witness because there was no evidence to back him up. A trial was held on July 15, 1991, where the man hoped to defend himself and escape with a lighter sentence. He intended to use the memory loss narrative and make it appear like self-defense, but everything changed when the prosecutor. Nearly immediately after the prosecution asked for the death penalty and addressed the judge, 
Timothy stood up and declared he was willing to confess to first-degree murder in exchange for life in prison. The court agreed to these terms after only a brief discussion, and Timothy was given a life sentence. They all harbored resentment toward the person who had taken Amy away from them and wanted him to spend the rest of his life in a prison cell, so Amy's family and friends supported this choice. Despite the fact that Toby was never charged, I wouldn't rule out the possibility that he was directly involved in the murder because his story seems suspicious. Timothy, who is currently 53 years old, is still incarcerated. Share your opinion on this story in the comments and don't forget to like it. Thanks for watching. It took 25 years to piece together this strange tale. After leaving a party, a student from American University vanished with no trace. Despite having a suspect since the beginning, the police were unable to establish his guilt. It wasn't until the podcast's creator dug up the horrific details of the case decades later that he alerted millions of people to it and forced the police to reopen their investigation. Kristen Smart moved to the United States with her parents after being born on February 20, 1977, in Augsburg, Germany. At a young age, the family moved to Stockton, California with the brother and sister. Her parents had a daycare center for kids of American military personnel. In 1996, Kristen entered California Polytechnic University after receiving her high school diploma. She worked as a lifeguard at the campus recreation center in her free time. A large birthday celebration for one of the students was held at the fraternity house on May 25, 1996. When her friends decided against going, Kristen went to the fraternity house by herself. The event took place in in typical American student fashion. A sizable group enjoyed themselves that evening by drinking, dancing, and listening to music. Two other students, Tim Davis and Cheryl Anderson, who had both been at the party, saw Kristen on the street and decided to walk her home after she overindulged and felt bad. At around 2 in the morning, Kristen went to her dorm because she could hardly walk by herself. Paul Flores, a fellow student who had also attended the party, joined them after a while and offered to walk Kristen to her dorm because he himself had not yet arrived. Lived closest to Cheryl and Tim bid them farewell before departing because they had to go in the opposite direction. Since then, nobody had seen Kristen alive. Her disappearance was not initially given much thought. Margarita Campos, Christine's roommate, was the first to express concern. After the party, she was certain that her friend would head back home, but she never did. The fact that Christine's belongings, including her wallet, bank card, and passport, were still in her room and she couldn't just pick them up and leave added to her anxiety. After the young woman vanished, Marguerite did not alert campus police until two days later. Campus police apparently didn't take a roommate's claim seriously, despite the fact that she apparently hoped up until the very last moment that Kristen was okay and would go home. It was the previous weekend and the day before was the United States official day of remembrance which honors fallen American service members. The fact that Kristen had left all of her valuables and important papers in the dorm did not cause any concern for the local police. They simply assumed that she had gone home. Separately, the distance between the university campus and Christine's hometown was seven hours, making it too difficult to suddenly travel that far without money and identification, especially at night. A few days later, the neighborhood police made up their minds to report to work and called the parents of the young woman the mother of Christine reported that her daughter had not called or visited the house in a while. The mother was alarmed by that call, and the parents went to the police. But even then, the police were reluctant to launch an inquiry. They claimed that since Christine had vanished not long ago, she might have been out with friends. The search didn't start until the fourth day after she vanished. First, but there were no results from the search. Paul Flores who volunteered to accompany Chris to her dormitory door and was supposed to be the last person to see her, was the first person the police questioned. He told the investigators that after parting ways, SRI Kristen went to her dormitory and then to her house by herself. He allegedly went straight to bed after that, but this account quickly unraveled. Around 5 a.m., Paul's roommates observed him enter the bathroom, while he and Kristen parted ways after 2 a.m. The young man also had scratches on his knees and a black eye. When questioned by several people, he provided three different accounts of how he sustained all of these wounds. Despite the fact that Paul Florist seemed very suspicious, there was no concrete evidence against him. After Christine had been missing for a month, authorities had widened their search to include Christine's hometown. Because of the case's resemblance to the plot of the well-known TV show Twin, local journalists hyped it. Peaks the young woman was killed by two men on campus, then driven to the cliff and thrown into the water. According to their version of events, 
which was even mentioned in the news. Of course, the police have no evidence to support these claims. Christine's parents filed a lawsuit against Flores a year after she vanished, accusing him of being involved in the teen's disappearance. Paul gave sworn testimony in 1997, but he only provided his name in response to one question out of all the others. Every other time, he invoked the Fifth Amendment, which prohibits the accused from testifying against him or herself. Then, Paul's parents sued Christine's family for moral damages, but neither of these lawsuits succeeded because the police lacked sufficient proof to bring charges against Paul. Six years after Christine went missing, on May 25, 2002, the government declared her dead. They also made no progress toward cracking the case during that time. This continued until 2018, when Chris Lambert, a Californian, made the decision to launch his own podcast series on various crimes. He was eight years old when Christine vanished, and he clearly recalled the spooky news report from that time. He made the decision to conduct his own investigation 22 years later and was shocked by how careless the police had been the entire time. Chris began by speaking with each of the witnesses to the incident. He discovered Paul Flores had a bad reputation from college students. Although the young man had repeatedly harassed female students, no official complaints were ever made. Chris further examined the police's actions and came to the following conclusion, that they had committed a number of serious mistakes. Two months after the young woman vanished, the detectives did not show up at Ruben Flores, Paul's father. The police should have started an investigation into the residence right away given that Paul was living with his father, but when they did show up to search it, they were very careless. The detectives failed to bring a forensic expert or a police canine trained to detect the smell of decay. The search was therefore essentially fruitless. The investigators also missed looking at the Flores family's two vehicles, one of which Paul might have used to transport Kristen from the campus to her father's home. One of the cars was sold, and the other was allegedly stolen a few months after the police visit. One of the key clues was hidden at Paul's mother's house, but the police never showed up there. Four months after Kristen Smart vanished, Chris Lambert learned that Mary Lassiter, who had rented Paul's mother's home, had found a necklace link that was remarkably similar to the one Kristen was wearing. This necklace was also visible in photos that had been circulated throughout the city. Lassiter immediately took the evidence to the police, but they rejected it as evidence and later lost it entirely. The backyard at Paul's mother's house had always been concreted, but soon after the young woman vanished a small piece of concrete was cut out, and a flower bed had been planted in that location. Mary Lassiter told Lambert an extremely unsettling tale every day since moving and Mary had seen a very strange thing in the backyard of the house. Every day at the same time, at 4 a.m. and 4 p.m., I heard sounds emanating from that specific flower bed. She would hear a sound that resembled a wristwatch alarm, but it would soon stop, and it was probably the battery that had died. Christine's mother, Miss Smart, informed Chris that her daughter had set the alarm for 4.20 a.m. because she had to be at the recreation center for work at 5 that morning. Millions of people who listened to Lambert's podcast in 2019 were horrified by what they had heard, were affected by the police's carelessness and inaction. Even though there was a lot of circumstantial evidence, Chris' discovery shocked the audience even more. Since Paul Flores is still at large, the police have decided to reopen their inquiry into the disappearance of Kristen Smart. Investigators began by searching the homes and vehicles of the Flores family. When the unfortunate flower bed was finally dug up, no one was discovered inside. Even though there was no body, the experts were able to establish that on April 13, 2021, when Paul Flores and his father were detained, there were signs of human body decay in the ground. According to the investigation, Paul was charged with Christine's murder and his father was charged as an accessory. After Tim Davis and Cheryl Anderson left, Paul tried to molest the young woman but was rejected. This could account for the wounds Flores sustained during the altercation. Paul had the option of murdering Kristen and bringing her body home. The father of Flores made a decision after witnessing what his son had they took the young woman to her mother's house and buried her in the backyard, which was later changed into a flower bed, to assist him in concealing the corpse. Later. The suspects dug up the grave and took the remains somewhere unknown. Later, the suspects dug up the grave and took the remains somewhere unknown, apparently fearing harassment from the police. First-degree murder was found to have been committed by Paul Flores. He could be sentenced to 25 years to life in prison by a Monterey County jury. Ruben Flores, his father, was charged with being an accessory to the crime and could spend three years in jail. The parents of Christine published acknowledging Chris Lambert and all concerned parties for helping to ease the family's grief over the case's resolution despite the long period of time 
time since their daughter vanished. One thing they ponder is whether Flora's mother was aware that her son had committed a crime. She didn't have any suspicions about the flower bed that had been unexpectedly planted in the backyard, or perhaps she had been aware of what had happened that night all along but had chosen to remain silent out of love for her son. Of course, there would be some unanswered questions, but that didn't matter right now. Maybe someday Kristen Smart will discover the remains of the young woman. Share your opinion on this story in the comments and don't forget to like it. Thanks for watching. A young woman who lived with her boyfriend in an apartment was kidnapped on the eve of Christmas. The young man was restrained by an unidentified criminal who also took the young woman outside through the back door before vanishing into thin air. The caveman went unpunished for 36 years before an unexpected truth came to light because the police were unable to identify the perpetrator. Leslie McRae was born in Jacksonville, Florida, on April 14, 1968. She had a great sense of humor, was tenacious, outgoing, and kind. She also loved to have fun. Leslie was brought up in a loving family, but was especially close to her younger cousin Joey was four years old. The girls made an effort to get together as often as they could despite living in different cities. When she turned 18, Leslie even considered relocating to her hometown. Leslie enrolled in the University of North Florida when she turned 17 and completed high school with the goal of pursuing a career in modeling. On the evening of December 24, 1985, she and her 21-year-old boyfriend, Edgar McQuarrie, moved out of her parents' home and into an apartment building. Around 3 in the morning, Edgar heard a noise in their apartment where they were sleeping. He was horrified to see a man with a knife standing over their bed. Edgar's hands and feet were bound with ties, and the unidentified criminal threatened him with a weapon to keep him from defending himself. Leslie was then led outside the apartment through the back door after being similarly bound. Still restrained, Edgar could do nothing but watch in horror as the kidnapper took Leslie. He had to spend three hours getting his hands free before calling the police at around 6 o'clock. Considering that the room was nearly pitch black when Leslie was taken, I took Edgar's advice and started looking for her. With the exception of brown hair, Edgar was unable to make out the perpetrator's face or any other distinguishing characteristics. Although it was obvious that the kidnapper had used a means of transportation to kidnap Leslie, the police were unsure of the type of vehicle he had used. They were looking for witnesses and scanning the street when they got a call at their station. Eight kilometers from Leslie's apartment, three hours after the kidnapping, a man who was out for a morning run came across a woman's body lying in a ditch next to the road. As soon as detectives arrived on the scene, they recognized the young woman. There were numerous wounds all over her body. Her clothes were missing or torn in some places. The young woman had more than 20 wounds from sharp objects, according to medical professionals, and she also had numerous bruises all over her body. In addition, the killer had, despite the fact that DNA analysis wasn't widely used in those days. Experts were able to extract his biological material. Since there were no other helpful hints at the scene and this evidence could not be used to identify a suspect, the police decided to concentrate on looking into the victim's apartment as soon as possible. They had significant reservations about what had transpired that evening. The victim's boyfriend claimed that the intruder had entered the apartment stealthily but there were no signs of a break-in in there. There were no indications of a struggle inside the rooms. The back door through which Leslie was allegedly taken out was also covered in cobwebs. No fingerprints were discovered on it, and despite a thick layer of dust surrounding it, there were no shoe prints. All of this suggested that the boyfriend's account might have been made up, which raised the obvious query. Does he have any involvement in the murder? This version did have some subtle differences, though. Investigators questioned whether the boyfriend could have shot and killed his. Girlfriend then went back to the apartment and dialed 911. Experts suggested that her body was dumped on the street after Edgar dialed 911 making him no longer be thought of as a suspect. The detectives searched for new leads over the following few months, but they were unsuccessful on each occasion. As a result, the investigation was ultimately put on hold in 1986. The only significant evidence in this case was the criminal's biological material, which the investigators hoped would eventually help them identify the murderer. Leslie's kin never gave up hope of solving this case, even though it languished in the records for many years gathering dust. They contacted numerous authorities and independently gathered data that might have been helpful in cracking the case, but due to resource constraints, they were unable to uncover any fresh leads. Sarah Adams, Leslie's mother, diagnosed with a severe nervous system condition that essentially robbed her of her ability to speak. She nevertheless kept in touch with the investigators via nodes. Following that, Leslie's cousin Joey took the lead in the investigation. She frequently traveled to Jacksonville, even though she and her family lived two hours away, to speak with investigators or assist Leslie's mother. However, attempts to contact the police essentially failed. Detectives were hesitant to reopen the. They weren't in a rush to take on a decades-old murder case given the lack of fresh evidence and the fact that they were preoccupied with ongoing criminal investigations. As a result, 
Joey started to charge the detectives with being careless in the initial phases of the investigation or even covering up the offender. Even though she lacked any proof, she speculated that the murderer might have paid off the detectives in an effort to raise awareness of the case. Joey also regularly gave interviews to local news outlets. She recalled their time together and characterized Leslie as an upbeat and optimistic person. She also regretted that her two kids would have never known what a wonderful Aunt Leslie could have been to them. The first outcomes were achieved by her relatives' persistent efforts in late 2018. They got in touch with representatives of the Cold Case Files Initiative, who became intrigued by Leslie's case. This nonprofit, which was founded in 2015, focuses on homicides that have gone unsolved and in which police have been unable to find. The culprits the group gathers and disseminates data, converses with investigators and the media, and supports the victim's loved ones by giving them guidance on how to speak with law enforcement and the media. Employees of the company posted information about Leslie's murder on various websites in an effort to raise as much awareness of the case as they could. Public interest may be crucial in such cases where investigators have now been able to crack the case. The likelihood that potential witnesses to the events will be among them increases as more people learn about this crime. Unknowingly, people may occasionally have witnessed or heard something that could have helped the police find the murderer. Second, as a result of pressure from the public and the media, the likelihood that detectives would reopen the investigation rose over time. They had the perpetrator's biological material, but studying it required reopening the case which police officers frequently do not do due to a lack of personnel or funding. Through months of collaboration with Leslie's family, the organization was able to successfully bring attention to this case. In June 2019, representatives of a well-known local TV channel contacted the family. They had written about it in the news, discussed it in reports, and written about it. They offered to film a sizable interview in which relatives could talk about Leslie and their years-long quest for the truth. The offer was accepted and her mother and cousin met with reporters. They revealed to them Leslie's personality and demonstrated her to them. Photos and were shocked to learn that the police had not been looking into the case for more than 30 years. In addition, family members said during the interview that they thought the boys Leslie mentioned were her killers and that they did not believe her account of a man with a knife. The journalist chose to omit this scene because Edgar was not a suspect in this case and there was no evidence against him. However, the boy could have killed her himself. The TV channel contacted the sheriff's office in an effort to get more details but the police refused to provide any. They cited policies that forbade them from speaking with journalists about cases that were not currently under investigation. This result disappointed Leslie's family, but they were not going to give up. Joey persisted in sending letters to the detectives asking them to reopen the case, and in the end it worked. The family was able to arrange a meeting with law enforcement officials, and detectives revealed their intention to revive the investigation in April 2020. The police re-interviewed the Leslie family and started to review the available evidence. They transported biological samples from the victim's body to a lab, where professionals quickly extracted a DNA profile. This profile was then entered into the FBI's national database and received an instant match. The name of the potential killer was finally known to the investigators almost 35 years later. He was 58. David Nelson Austin The detectives discovered many intriguing passages in his biography. His DNA was present in the Since the man had been incarcerated since 1991 for two sexual offenses committed in 1988 and 1990, the FBI database was not simply a coincidence. He had just relocated from Florida to Michigan, where he was residing at the time. Leslie was 24 years old and residing in Jacksonville at the time of his death. According to the detectives, he attacked and unsuccessfully tried to assault a young woman who was mentally disabled two months prior to the murder. Although the man was detained, the legal system gave his actions very little weight. Austin wasn't given a harsh penalty and continued to be unfettered. He also had a long list of lesser offenses like drug possession and disturbing the peace. More detectives came to the conclusion that he was responsible for Leslie's murder and started putting the case together for court. They went to the Michigan prison to question Austin for the first time in early 2021 after collecting all the required materials. The man denied being involved but no one was going to take him at his word. Investigators obtained a sample of his DNA to directly compare it with the biological material discovered on the victim's body. This was required as part of the standard procedure, and the outcome was anticipated. A full match in August 2021. Official charges were brought against Austin for Leslie's slaying. Detectives have since been working to transfer him from Michigan to Florida, the scene of the crime. It was necessary to transfer because Florida, as opposed to Michigan, had the death penalty and Austin might have received it for killing Leslie. It took a year to complete the process. He was currently incarcerated, awaiting trial, and investigators have no doubt that he is guilty until September 2022, 
when he was finally transferred to a correctional facility in Florida. The only way the murderer can avoid being executed is if they work out a deal with the prosecution and confess to the crime in exchange for another life sentence. Austin was never a suspect in the case and was never interrogated according to investigators who acknowledged this during a press conference. They claimed the man left no traces that the police could use to identify him. DNA analysis was not possible at the time, and his DNA was only added to the FBI database in 1991, making it impossible to pursue him. Joey stated in an interview she gave six years after the murder that she had always thought Leslie's boyfriend was the perpetrator. She didn't realize Edgar was a victim in the narrative until investigators disclosed the identity of the true perpetrator. She is anticipated to be the trial's key witness. She was surprised to hear Leslie's mother say that she had forgiven her daughter's murderer. They were all close relatives but they all respected her choice. Interestingly, Austin has a son named Owen who he has never met, but they keep in touch frequently via email. When journalists contacted Owen, they discovered that he was horrified by the accusations made against his father. Austin himself wrote to him about it and added that he was not involved in the crime. Meanwhile, despite being fully aware of other criminal incidents in his father's life, his son kept in touch with him. If there are no further developments, Austin's trial is anticipated to start soon. Bureaucratic snags despite the fact that the truth has now finally surfaced, he might be sentenced in a few months. The victim's family continues to hold investigators accountable for their negligence, believing that if they had periodically reopened this case, the perpetrator's identity would have been discovered in the early 1990s rather than 30 years later. Share your opinion on this story in the comments and don't forget to like it. Thanks for watching. The student got on her bike and rode off. The police launched a surge after reading without a trace, but none of them could have predicted the shocking information that would be revealed to them in just a few days. Even seasoned FBI agents were horrified by the shocking details that came to light in the case, and none of them anticipated the outcome. Welcome to A to Z Crime Stories. Before we start, don't forget to like this video and subscribe for more. On February 11, 1996, in the small American town of Delta, Ohio, Sierra Juggin was born. The girl had two sisters and two brothers, and she grew up in a big, loving family. Sierra was an avid sports fan who was on she loved to travel and was on the school volleyball team. The girl had always wanted to travel to Italy, and she worked very hard to make that dream come true before she was able to go while she was still in school. After graduating from high school, she began dating Josh. They attended various universities. Sierra made the decision to major in human resources with the intention of landing a job with her uncle, who ran a metal fabrication business. Despite the distance between her home and Toledo University, which is 50 kilometers away, she enrolled there, made plans for their future, and intended to continue dating. Even selecting engagement rings for their upcoming wedding took some time for the couple. The young woman spent her summer vacation in her hometown after two years of university. She still had some schoolwork to complete at that time, but she chose to do it from home in order to spend more time with her loved ones and her boyfriend. Sierra was also participating in an internship program at her uncle's business. The young woman, who was in her 20s, was meticulously preparing to soon after graduating work there. Sierra made the decision to drive to her boyfriend's house on July 19, 2016. A few days prior, she had acquired a new bike, which she was eager to ride. At around 5 o'clock, the young lady left the house and left for Josh's house around 9 o'clock. When her mother got home, she discovered her daughter was gone. She found this to be a little odd. Since it was summer and getting dark outside just now, she had assumed Sierra would have returned home by this point. The young lady was also already in her 20s, so her mother wasn't concerned. She had assumed that her daughter would spend the night at her boyfriend's house, but when Josh called her at 10.30 p.m., everything changed. Sarah's boyfriend was unable to reach her, so he inquired as to whether she was at home. The young man claims that they split up at around 7 o'clock and that she hasn't gotten in touch since. The young woman's mother started to worry a lot because it had been more than three hours since then. Josh joined them in making calls to the young woman's friends and family in the hopes that she had dropped by one of them. Although Sierra was 20 years old, the police immediately started their search after learning that Josh was the last person to see her. 
When they spoke to him, the man said that the young woman arrived at his house shortly after 5 p.m. after traveling for about an hour and a half. The mother then called all the nearby hospitals, but no one there either. Finally, the woman decided to go to the police, and around midnight she filed a missing persons report. Josh rode his motorcycle while Sierra rode her bicycle. The couple's vehicle traveled through numerous cornfields along rural roads. Josh even captured a photo of Sierra riding her bike, which the teenager shared on social media. After some time spent riding around, they made the decision to part ways. A mile or so from her house, Sierra and Josh split up. She rode her bike home while the guy returned on his motorcycle. Other officers were driving around in search of Sierra while the police spoke to the young man. They moved toward the road close to they soon noticed the first unsettling clue as they drove along the road through the fields, where the young woman had started her solo journey home. The corn stalks in one area were heavily pinched, as if someone had waded through them, one of the officers noticed. With a flashlight, he made his way over there and after a short distance, he noticed Sierra's bicycle. The police officers examined the bicycle and discovered blood stains on the handles and a woman's sock next to the bicycle. He informed his co-workers about the fine, and soon additional police officers showed up. A screwdriver, some car fuses, and a pair of men's sunglasses were among the additional items they discovered upon closer inspection not far from the bike. The bicycle was transported across the cornfield following motorcycle tire tracks, which was equally intriguing. All of this was sufficient for the investigators to draw the depressing conclusion that Sarah had most likely been stolen. They started to take a closer look at Josh as a suspect as the case took a serious turn. First of all, statistically speaking, the people who are closest to them are most likely to end up being the culprits. Second, Josh was riding a motorcycle that evening, and Sierra discovered tire tracks near the motorcycle. In addition, the detectives questioned why the man didn't ride his motorcycle home instead of walking the young woman. She had less than a mile to go. Josh agreed to let the police look around his home, car, and motorcycle, so that's where the officers went. Stumbled upon his work overalls, which had blood on them. The young man claimed that the blood on the clothing came from animals, and that he had worn them while hunting. The overalls were given to specialists by the investigators, and they quickly determined that he was telling the truth, otherwise, there was no evidence to support Josh's involvement. The specialists also looked over the field finds and took one DNA sample from them that belonged to an unidentified person. Josh offered a sample right away but it did not match, so he was no longer taken into consideration. A potential suspect, and the police began looking for additional leads. They got a call from a farmer the next day. The man claimed that he and his son were traveling down the same road on the evening of Sierra's disappearance. They came across a motorcycle helmet on the side of the road at one point, and the father instructed his son to bring it to the vehicle. Later, when he looked at it more closely, the farmer discovered some blood on it. The police acknowledged that the helmet may have belonged to the kidnapper when he contacted them later, but their identity was still unknown. When the FBI became involved in the investigation at this point, they chose to closely examine the picture Josh had taken of Sierra just before she vanished. The detectives were able to identify the young lady's clothing thanks to the photo, but they also noticed that she was sporting a fitness bracelet on her wrist. The device had been turned off shortly after Sierra vanished, so the investigators were unable to locate it when they immediately requested geolocation data for it. Added tip was given to the police. Soon after, Josh reported that a suspicious-looking white van had been following him and the young woman as they were traveling down the road. The driver appeared to be following them, according to the man. When the couple slowed down, the car, which was moving slowly, also slowed down. Josh even attempted to drive up to him at one point, but the driver veered off. The man found it odd, and he even partially remembered his license plate number. The car and its owner, who was discovered to be a woman, were quickly located by the police. And investigators found that she was unrelated to the crime. She herself claimed that Josh had attempted to approach her from behind and push her off the road during the conversation. 
investigators came to the conclusion that there had merely been a breakdown in communication between them and kept searching for new leads. After searching for several days without discovering any new information regarding Sierra's disappearance, the police decided to speak with every person who had ever been convicted of a violent crime and lived in the neighborhood. Communities close by as they read through the list of these individuals, they noticed James Worley, a 57-year-old man, right away. He was a short distance from the field where Sierra's bicycle was discovered. The police were so interested in him for a very clear reason. In the 1990s, James had been found guilty of kidnapping a young woman. She was on her bicycle when a man suddenly rammed into her in his van while brandishing a screwdriver. Sierra vanished while he was trying to force the young woman into the car, so she was able to escape. Police immediately suspected James of kidnapping after learning about his bike ride and the screwdriver found next to him. He was consulted by her investigators to confirm this theory. Although he claimed he had not killed anyone and was obviously annoyed by the visit, the man voluntarily allowed the police to search his home. On their 120-acre farm, where James and his mother resided, there were a variety of buildings. The detectives took a while to examine each one. James repeatedly insisted to the police that he had not kidnapped the victim throughout this process. Sierra and it were the only two who were aware of the case. The man was literally saying the same thing over and over, which started to seem strange to them but something more intriguing awaited them after that. Suddenly, James revealed that he had recently traveled along that road on the night of Sierra's disappearance and that his motorcycle had broken down not far from where the police his motorcycle had broken down not far from where the police later discovered the young woman's bicycle. He allegedly saw her bike and decided to approach it, so he entered the field while pushing his motorcycle close by. The man continued by saying that as he was walking there, his helmet, sunglasses, screwdriver, and car fuses all fell out. James' motorcycle abruptly started up once more, and he continued driving without picking up all those items. The detectives, as you might have guessed, were very dubious of this story. In addition, a witness who had seen a strange van on that road the evening of Sierra's disappearance had come up to them just a few hours earlier. The vehicle was traveling at a very high speed exceeding all legal limits when the witness noticed it. He committed the license plate number to memory and provided the police with that information. Detectives discovered the van belonged to James after running the blades, and during a search, he discovered it close to the house. The police found some interesting items inside the van, including a ski mask, duct tape, plastic clamps, handcuffs, and a maze, after the man permitted them to search it. The items themselves did not in any way suggest his guilt, but given James' history of kidnapping, a set like this raised suspicions in the eyes of the authorities. But in one of the barns, the spookiest penalties were waiting for them. Detectives discovered a separate room with an air mattress inside of a hidden door and chains next to it that appeared to have been put there to keep someone inside. The refrigerator that was next to the mattress contained blood traces, which the police discovered. Additionally, there was a noticeable bleach aroma, which led them to believe that the blood had undergone a thorough cleaning. The contents of a small box, however, served as the main hint. There were several pairs of bras and one pair of women's underwear had blood on it. All of this was sufficient to at least temporarily detain James while experts reviewed the gathered proof. The man was brought in for questioning and asked to explain the bloody, chained-up hidden room. James responded by telling them another dubious tale. It was just his improvised film set, he claimed, created because he wanted to set up his own studio to shoot adult material. Naturally, the detectives didn't take him at his word. The space appeared to have, however, they were unable to link it to Sierra's disappearance or find out where she was until, on the third day after she vanished, during a protracted search, police discovered Sierra's body in a freshly dug grave in a field. Her hands were handcuffed, and she had a large plastic toy in her mouth in addition to wearing an adult diaper, and medical examiners determined that she had been wearing one. In addition to not finding any evidence of violence, they were unable to even estimate the time of death. At about the same time, forensic experts were actively going over all the information gathered from James Barn. 
the cops also got geolocation data from James' smartphone and found female DNA on one of the pieces of duct tape next to the mattress, and it matched Sierra's DNA. It turned out that he had spent almost two hours close by on the night of the young woman's disappearance. Another unsettling piece of information came from the psychologist James had a judge appoint for a prior kidnapping. According to him, during one of James' sessions, James said that he was learning from his mistakes with every new kidnapping and that the following time he would bury the bodies. Evidently, the psychologist decided not to alert the police to his client's troubling statements and only did so after the man had been charged with murder. The detectives created the most likely chronology of events using this collection of clues. Based on his geolocation data, it appears that James saw Sierra on the road that evening, struck her with his helmet, and then dragged her into a field with his bicycle. The man remained there until dusk. He called his brother at that time to inform him that his motorcycle had broken down. It appears that he did this to establish an alibi. As soon as it started to get dark outside, James drove home, got off his motorcycle, hopped into his van, and then drove back to the field where he had left Sierra and brought her to his barn. The young woman was either 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 asleep or restrained. James was the only one who knew what happened next, it appears that he mistreated the victim for a while before killing her and burying her in a field. The victim may have stayed there for three days, according to expert speculation. The case went to trial despite the man's continued denial of all of these accusations. The prosecution introduced new evidence that strengthened its case against him before the trial officially began in March 2018. It turned out that James' keychain contained the key to the handcuffs that were placed around the victim's hands. However, they failed to offer any convincing defenses for their client's innocence, so they stuck with the theory that James only wanted to set up an adult film studio in his barn and the police connected that to the murder. In less than a month, the trial came to a close, and on March 28, the jury found him guilty. James was sentenced to death as a result and his execution is set for May 20, 2025. Given everything they now knew about the man, the detectives knew that this story was far from over. James had committed similar crimes in the past, according to the police, but he was able to escape punishment. Although they were still working on James' case, investigators were unable to connect the unsolved disappearances to him. The victim's parents created the Sierra Scholarship and worked on a bill that would have mandated the state to make an open investigation. List of people who have been previously found guilty of murder and kidnapping. The legislation was swiftly endorsed and became law on March 20, 2019. Share your opinion on this story in the comments and don't forget to like it. Thanks for watching. A 16-year-old girl rode her bicycle home and vanished. Her body was discovered the following day in a field close to the road. She had been murdered, and the assailant had fled. Even though the police had the perpetrator's DNA sample, it took them 13 years to track him down. In this video, we'll explain Mary Investor's fate and the reasons that this murder is one of the most infamous in Dutch history. Welcome to A to Z Crime Stories. Before we start, don't forget to like this video and subscribe for more. On August 10, 1982, Marion Vastra was born in the Netherlands. She resided in the tiny town of West Rene with her parents. The young woman was the youngest of six children and lived in a village in the north of the country, far from major cities. She had three sisters and two brothers. Marianne was left to live with her parents and one older brother after the majority of the older kids eventually moved away for other towns and countries. The young lady enjoyed music, went to the neighborhood school, and had lots of friends. Small towns and settlements scattered throughout the area where she lived were only a few kilometers apart from one another. Marianne frequently traveled to other cities as a result of this. Places in the area where she can go shopping or spend time with friends. She also had a part-time job at the neighborhood grocery store. On April 30, 1999, the nation observed Queen's Day, a significant holiday. After finishing her shift at the store, Marion left to spend the evening with her friends at a nearby town called Colum. A short while later, Marianne's boyfriend and his friends joined their group, and they all made the decision to travel to the nearby town of Boynton Post, which was six kilometers away. 
Marianne didn't own a bicycle, so she borrowed one from her friends and went for a ride with them as the group rode their bicycles there. After some time, they made the decision to return home. The young woman set out for the town, which was about 11 kilometers away, but she never arrived. Marianne's parents learned that she had spent the night with a friend who lived nearby. The young woman had promised to be home by evening, and if she had chosen to spend the night with her friends, she would have kept that promise even though it was improbable. Definitely made an early morning call to home. To his surprise, Marianne's father surprised him by calling her best friend Affie's home. He learned that his daughter had bid her friend farewell that evening and left for home. Everyone realized that Marianne might have suffered a bad outcome at this point. They drove along Marianne's homecoming route after her friend called her boyfriend and invited her sister along. The young woman's father made the decision to call the police right away in the meantime. He informed them of his. In the meantime, Affie and her sister and boyfriend were driving near the settlement of Finkleister with vast fields on either side of the road when they noticed something shiny in the grass and stopped as they approached the field they saw a bicycle lying in the grass. Daughter had not returned home and none of her friends knew where she was. Soon two officers arrived to take a missing persons report after which they returned to the station and prepared to begin their search. Marianne was lying there, she had a cut on her neck and was naked. They were all taken aback. Marianne's paws needed to be examined, but Affie was unable to bring herself to approach the body. Although it was clear that the young woman had passed away, her best friend was in such shock that he refused to accept it. She had a difficult time removing her phone before dialing 911. At the same time that several officers arrived on the scene, two of them went to Marianne's home. They didn't have official confirmation at the time. The officers picked up her father and took him to the scene after learning the victim's identity. The father, to his grief, recognized Marion right away while the forensic investigators were already on the scene. The detectives examined the scene and noticed a crucial detail. There were two bicycle tracks leading from the road to the location where the young woman's body was lying and only one track going the other way, indicating that the murderer was also riding a bicycle. The area was combed by the police. They searched the area around the crime scene for hints and even used aerial photography, but all they discovered was a lighter. The police took Marianne's friend to the lab after learning that she didn't smoke and didn't have a lighter. Medical examiners discovered evidence of semen, which they used to create a sample of the killer's DNA, and concluded that the young woman had been abused. The lighter was found to contain the same DNA, which was uploaded to the police database, but no matches were found. As a result, the the perpetrator had never been in trouble before. The Marion boyfriend named Spencer was chosen by the police as a suspect almost immediately after the body was discovered. Although there was no evidence against him, the chief of the local police force believed that the boy was the most likely murderer in this case. The young man voluntarily gave a sample of his DNA, but it did not match the DNA that was discovered on the victim's body. In the interim, the incident had received extensive coverage in the area's print and television media. The public demanded that the police find the murderer as soon as possible because murders were practically unheard of. The issue was that the detectives were already at a standstill after just one week, they had the killer's DNA sample but no suspects. Additionally, there were a lot of calls from locals to the police. There was no evidence to support any of their theories but some of them believed a familiar person might have been responsible for the murder. When asked where Marianne's body was, the vast majority of people pointed to a single location close to the field. A migration center for those who had requested asylum was discovered, the majority of those present were from Iran and Syria. This theory gained ground in the nearby towns with each passing day, and at one point an impressive number of people were absolutely certain that a refugee had carried out the murder. The police had to look into this possibility as a result. Marianne's funeral was held on May 5th. At that precise moment, nearly 1,500 people, many of them residents of nearby communities, came to support her family. The woman's parents planned a memorial two days later. They spoke to the crowd at the conclusion of the procession. A total of about 20,000 people attended the event, mostly as a result of the case receiving widespread national attention. Each day, more and more people called the police, and at one point, the detectives received a really good tip. Many people claimed to have seen Marianne in a cafe one evening as a certain oriental-looking guy tried to get to know her. 
The guy made a gesture toward the young woman after she declined, placing his thumb along her throat because she was. The young man was killed in this way, and the police started looking for him right away. He was a 15-year-old refugee from the same migration center, it turned out. Although he acknowledged making the gesture, he refuted any involvement in the killing. DNA from the boy was provided, but it did not match that of the victim's body. Locals blamed the migrants from the center for the refugees in spite of this. Even more security guards had to be hired by the organization just in case. People arrived 12 days after the murder. Out to protest at the immigration center. They simply shouted commands to hand over the murderer at first, but by evening, things had significantly worsened. The building was targeted by several people who threw Molotov cocktails, prompting the police to step in. Since then, security at the center has been significantly increased, and similar demonstrations have not occurred again. A few days later, the police reported the arrest of Pitt, a 32-year-old resident of Marianne's town. He was a local drunkard and was despised by the majority of the locals. A witness called the police and reported seeing Pitt wearing bloody clothing, which led to the arrest. The man was arrested the night of the murder, and a sample of his DNA was sent to a lab. The news of the new suspect quickly spread throughout the country, but the DNA test didn't match the sample, and the witness later admitted to fabricating the entire case as retaliation against Pitt for a personal vendetta. Police began studying the log in order to look into any potential connections to the immigration center. A book that tracks every refugee departure from the asylum area. They were allowed to leave the center, but before doing so, they had to look in the log and note their destination. As it turned out, two refugees who had left the center the night of the murder had not given any indication of their destination. They were Mohammed, 19, and Ali, 26 years old. Police started looking into their potential involvement, but no information was made public for a while. The fact that investigators were restraining Marianne's family infuriated Marianne's father. Hannah discovered the murderer, he got in touch with a renowned crime reporter, who agreed to take the case and work to uncover more details. First, the two refugees who left the center on the night of the murder were in the same cafe as Marianne. They also left almost immediately after the young woman and her friends left, and second, ever since that very night, the whereabouts of these refugees have been unknown. The victim's father spoke out about these facts on a popular television program on July 1. The men were unidentified, they had left the center and were not traceable by the police. They had pictures of both men at the same time, but for some reason the government withheld them from the public. After all of these details were broadcast on television, the police declared that they and Interpol were currently looking for these suspects. The predominant theory is that they might have left the nation. All of this has once more strained relations between locals and refugees. They came together once more in early October. On October 9, Turkish police announced the capture of Ali, a 26-year-old suspect. He was brought to the Netherlands, where a DNA sample was taken and, and the necessary test was run. It turned out that he had been living in Istanbul the entire time. The man was exonerated because it did not match the sample that was discovered on the victim's body. The investigation has resumed, and even though her boyfriend's DNA does not match the original samples, the police's American family has started to suspect him once more. Spencer acted in a suspicious manner. Marianne would never ride her bike home at night because she was afraid of the dark and the distance wasn't that far, according to the young woman's friends and family. Even Marianne's parents agreed that Spencer ought to have sent Marianne home via camp. He decided to let her ride her bicycle alone instead. More questions were asked of the young man, and then an odd thing started to happen. He repeatedly modified his account of that evening in his testimony. Spencer initially claimed that he had met Marianne at a cafe, followed by a drive to the Butum Post for a second look. He claimed that the young lady had already arrived with friends when he arrived at the cafe, so Spencer rode his bicycle to meet her. He continued by saying that he had seen two guys walking a bicycle on the way there. Spencer initially claimed during one interrogation that he did not recognize them because it was very dark outside before revealing that they were two of his friends. The police had no evidence against Spencer, and his DNA did not match the murderers, making the whole situation seem strange. The case remained unresolved for several more months. On December 20, 
the police made the decision to enlist the public's assistance. They requested DNA samples from all the local men, but there was trouble in store for them. The authorities set a cap for the police because it turned out that the law prohibited the mass collection of DNA from citizens even with their consent. Only 150 samples could be taken, and there were none that matched. After that, the case was essentially put on hold for several years. Marianne's parents attempted to have the law changed to permit extensive DNA screening, but they were denied. Despite the fact that similar actions had already resulted in the perpetrator's capture on numerous occasions in other nations, the justification was to protect people's privacy. The detectives released a rough description of the killer in July 2001. They thought the murderer was a local man between the ages of 20 and 40. Within a five kilometer radius of the Marianne murder scene, the police once more asked for permission to conduct an extensive collection of DNA samples, but they were once more turned down. After that, the case was finally put on hold. The victim's parents continued to appear on television programs and give interviews, but with each passing year the case received less and less media attention and no fresh information to shed light on the horrifying mystery. The police put together a team in 2010 that produced a thorough 3D model of the crime scene and all. Using the most recent computer technology and the available evidence, Marianne's parents once more discussed the importance of DNA testing. Eleven years after their daughter was killed, authorities decided to finally think about changing the law at this time. The required amendments were approved on September 6, 2012, after a process that lasted almost two years. Please ask all men who were between the ages of 20 and 40 in 1999 to bring their DNA samples to the press conference. The Archive they estimated that they were talking about 8,000 men, but not all of them agreed to provide their DNA. The area was also limited to 5 kilometers. Just over 6,500 samples were successfully collected by the police, and experts started analyzing them. Since the lab's resources were constrained and they could only check 400 samples per week, the study had to last up to four months. The experts compared the samples to the killer's DNA profile, but they weren't just looking for a perfect match because the murderer was improbable to have used the samples. Would have provided the police with his DNA. The laboratory was also attempting to identify the similarities that would allow them to establish kinship and connect the murderer to a father, brother, or other relative. A month after the test started, on November 19, experts received the long-awaited match. It was unexpected that they didn't just discover a known connection, instead, they also obtained the murderer's DNA, proving that he voluntarily gave it to the authorities. Detectives quickly reported the arrest of 45-year-old neighborhood resident Jasper Seringa. His home was just a few kilometers from the scene of Marianne's murder. He is a farmer and a father of two. The defendant initially remained silent, but after speaking with his attorney, he decided to confess. The details of this terrible crime were only made public on March 28, 2013, when the trial got underway. According to Jasper, he decided to ride his bicycle before going to bed after finishing up his farm's evening chores. He acknowledged that most of the time he was just using his bicycle as a front, in reality, he was riding to. To take advantage of the intimate services of local women in a nearby village. While his wife was unaware of this, he claimed in court that he had only planned a ride to get away from his wife and the difficulties on the farm and had not intended to go there that evening. He once saw Marianne alone on a deserted, dark road, and he suddenly realized he could do whatever he wanted with her. Jasper pulled up next to her in his car, brandished a pen knife, and yelled threats at her. Then he took her to a field and beat her. And murdered her during the trial. The man insisted that he killed the young woman accidentally and out of panic. He became aware of what he had done and the effects it would have on his entire family. At the time, his children, who were ages 5 and 8, were about to learn what their father had done. Jasper chose to murder Marianne for this reason and then flee, but ever since he stayed in the neighborhood, heard people discussing the murder, saw Marianne's family, his conscience has been troubled. When a widespread DNA screening program was announced in 2012, 
Jasper realized he would be discovered because he had so many relatives in the neighborhood and one of them would have turned in his DNA experts would find a partial match and start looking into all his relatives, which would inevitably lead to his capture. Since then, he has repeatedly considered turning himself into the police but has never made up his mind. Nevertheless, he couldn't bring himself to confess at the police station. The judge handed down his sentence of 18 years in prison, out of a maximum of 20 years under Dutch law, on April 19, following a brief trial that lasted only a few weeks. Marianne's family finally got to see the offender punished, but because of his good behavior, the legal system gave them a nasty shock. Jasper will have served less than 10 years in prison when he is released as early as 2023. Share your opinion on this story in the comments and don't forget to like it. Thanks for watching. In the state of Nuevo Leon, specifically in Mexico, an 18-year-old young woman named Dabani Escobar did not return home after going to a party on the evening of April 8, 2022. What happened to her has become the most discussed news in Mexico, and debates about what actually happened continue to this day. Devani Escobar, the only child of Dolores and Mario. Escobar was a student of law and criminology. Friday, April 8, 2022, at around 8 odd p.m., she went to the party with two friends, but she didn't return home. The next day, a big number of police officers and volunteers joined the hunt for her. On April 11th, Devani's parents, who were desperately trying to locate her, shared a picture on her social media site, which revealed the first anomalies and specifics of her absence. The image, which was taken from the side by an unidentified person, shows the body standing in the center of a motorway. It's unknown if she was aware that she was being photographed at the time. When his daughter did not come home on April 9th, her father received this image and put a caption saying that. This was the final time anyone saw his daughter, according to Mario. Additionally, he noted that Damani's group companions safely made it back to their homes. They allegedly placed Damani in a cab and requested that the driver take her home. This picture was taken at the time by a taxi driver. It wasn't immediately obvious how or why this photo was shot, but in Mexico, where femicide is a widespread issue and statistics show that 10 women disappear on average every day, it went viral and sparked a massive outrage. Protests found new traction in the state of Nuevo Leon alone, where 52 women went missing in the first quarter of 2022. On April 13, hundreds of worried citizens marched through the streets of Monterrey, carrying banners with pictures of the missing ladies, while the detectives working on the case started to piece together what had happened before Devani's disappearance. Their case was supported by the young women's friends' statements and video evidence from security cameras. In light of the fact that Bonnie only met the second young woman on the day of her disappearance, it is important to note that calling the two young women Bonnie attended the party with friends is a stretch. The police discovered video from a business located about four miles away. The tape taken at 11.30 as p.m. shows the young woman standing next to the cashier, five kilometers from the residence of the deceased. They also bought plastic glasses, coke, and a 750 milliliter bottle of vodka. The party waited near the store for almost an hour, during which time they used some of the things they had bought. They departed the business at 12.49 a.m. and took a taxi to Nuevo Castillo Bar, which was about eight kilometers away. When they got there, they discovered the event they were going to had. They were advised that another party was nearby, albeit it had already concluded, so they chose to head there at 1.30 a.m. Even though they were unknown at the private property party, the young women begged permission to enter. Two hours and 15 minutes after they were given permission to enter, the body can be seen attempting to flee from a man on surveillance footage provided by the police but he catches up with her and stops her. When other people arrive, Bonnie tries to kick the man again but misses. The argument appears to have been settled. When party goers were questioned by the police, they said that the argument started because the body was very inebriated. She had earlier purchased a bottle of vodka, which some people tried to seize, but she wouldn't give it up and insulted them. It's crucial to remember that this account of what happened was given to Bonnie's friends who decided to send her home by partygoers, 
They recorded the phone number of the cab driver who had taken them there, and at 3.54 a.m., she called him to request a ride to take the Bonnie home. When the taxi arrived at the spot, Dabani climbed into the back seat alone, leaving her pals behind. They approached Cigar and spoke with the driver there. The interior of the automobile is illuminated in the following recording, which was made only 20 minutes later and 100 meters from where Devana boarded the taxi. The Bonnie appeared to be fighting with the driver, while already seated in the front seat. She was found to be unwilling to depart, and the taxi. The cabbie tried to phone her friend for assistance, but he was ignored. He sent her a WhatsApp message warning her that she was acting aggressively and refusing to leave at 4.25 a.m. and that he didn't know Devani's specific address. The taxi driver let Devani's companion know that she got out of the vehicle. He snapped a photo, the same one that depicts Bonnie standing in the middle of the road, as proof. The taxi driver pleaded with Bonnie's companion to visit or call the girl's parents frequently, but she refused. Devani's buddy ignored the taxi driver's request to gather because there was only 400 meters between where she got into the car and where the picture was taken. The cab driver made several futile attempts to contact your pal before being forced to leave. But before he left, he sent her a message explaining that he couldn't force Devani back into the car since he didn't want any issue or charges of kidnapping or other such behavior. After Devani vanished and this picture was released, rumors started to circulate. The young woman had gotten out of the cab because the driver was harassing her, he claimed. The taxi driver was questioned by the authorities numerous times. He searched his car and phone, but could find no evidence linking him to the young woman's abduction. The taxi driver left the young woman and fled, according to video that the police were able to retrieve from a transportation company's security camera. Dabani was seen in the video standing in front of a camera that was pointed at the road. About 50 meters from the camera, a woman can be seen standing on the road for a while. It's hard to say if she was conscious of what she was doing at the time. But shortly Bonnie begins to approach the camera. There doesn't seem to be anyone pursuing her when she arrives at it at 4.30, as shown by the timestamp. Knowing where Bonnie was last seen. The region where she was last seen was the focus of the search. Police reports state that Bonnie didn't step foot on the transportation company's property, a motel around 150 meters away from the transportation provider also had security cameras put there. However, as law enforcement officials noted, no recordings were created from these cameras because they were solely used for real-time observation of the location. Police and volunteers meticulously investigated the area of the transportation company, the motel, all nearby streets, and vacant lots, but no signs of the body were discovered. 100,000 pesos, or around $5,000 US was offered as a reward, was made in exchange for any details that would help with the investigation. Bonnie's body was discovered on the grounds of the motel, only 100 meters from where she had been last seen. One week after she vanished and after 12 days of assiduous searching by family volunteers and law enforcement, it is important to note that despite several searches by the authorities in the motel vicinity, the body was still missing on April 21st, when the motel personnel noticed a pungent odor coming from an abandoned building. They themselves alerted the police from an underground tank where the body was later found. Let's examine the motel and its surroundings in more detail so that you can determine which tank is being discussed. There is a round building, these are the motel's primary structures, including the restaurant, which has been closed for a number of years, and the pool, which has not been used in a long time. There is only one entry from the road, and the entire area is cordoned off with barbed wire. The subterranean tank where Damani's body was is here, close to the wall. A lid covers the first tank, which has two openings that were both open, and the body was removed from the second tank which has two entrances that were both open. The tank has a depth of four meters, 43 centimeters from top to bottom, and it is divided into two portions by a 20 centimeter partition within. At the time the body was found, the water level in the tank was 90 centimeters deep in both portions. It's also vital to remember that the interior barrier of the tank is not completely solid. 
The right and left sides of the tank are connected by a 23 centimeter wide channel. We shall come back to this point in a moment. Even more oddities started to show up as soon as Dabani's body was found. The young woman's body was recovered from the water, but experts determined that the cause of death was a cranial brain damage in the forehead region, which might have been brought on by a fall into the cistern. The police quickly come to the conclusion that the occurrence was an accident. Accident. It was also found that the death occurred between five days and two weeks ago. Nevertheless, the father of the deceased did not accept the accident explanation and was perplexed as to why the police, who had searched the motel area numerous times, had not discovered the body of his daughter earlier. The Attorney General's Office of Nuevo Leon removed the special prosecutor in charge of missing person cases in response to these accusations, claiming carelessness and mistakes in the investigation. However, the prosecutor was present before dismissed recordings from two other security cameras, one at the motel reception and the other inside the vacant restaurant, also came to light. The police had previously asserted that the motel cameras only functioned in real time and did not record any images. We'll look at these recordings after I remind you that it was 4.30 when Devani was found on the road. The motel property was 150 meters away from the restaurant's entrance. Dabani walked peacefully toward the transport firm, and no one was chasing after her. However, she stormed into the motel's grounds five minutes later, as if someone were after her. Devani was seen jogging alongside the restaurant by the camera that was placed across from the entrance. No one can be seen chasing her in the section of the film that the authorities released. Therefore, it can be assumed that something happened when she arrived at the gate to the transportation company. Anything compelled her to flee. The second recording is for my restaurant camera. We must first comprehend the area that this camera can catch before we can comprehend the locations where the body is visible in the video. Consequently, the door leading to the road is located in the upper right corner, and this glass door leads to the inner courtyard. You can only get to it by traveling around the restaurant at 4 and 35 and 31 seconds without climbing over the barbed wire gate. Bonnie may be seen rushing toward the entrance to the she fled inside the motel grounds on the footage at 4.36 after running to the street, as we've observed before. Bonnie moves closer to the glass door and peers inside before moving on to the spot where the fence edge meets the restaurant structure. She seemed to have spent the last 20 minutes cowering in a corner, concealing. Throughout those 20 minutes, nobody approached her. At 4.56, Bonnie comes around the corner and proceeds along the fence, eventually arriving at those cisterns. The official accounts of what happened state that the body stumbled and smacked her head when she lost consciousness of the open cistern in the shadows. The injury was in the area of the forehead, as was already indicated. If the young lady did really fall down by mistake, it is more likely that she did so after hitting her heed. She would have leaned forward out of inertia had she taken a step without feeling the earth beneath her. The officials released an accelerated recording that lasted more than an hour to prove that nobody else was visible in this camera's field of vision. Upon careful observation at our F-456, the body emerged from the corner and proceeded along the fences. At 5.44, 30 seconds later, a shadow flickered on the door. At 5.47, 11 seconds, a car stopped opposite the door leading to the street. 12 seconds later, a silhouette of a person appeared next to that door. At 5.47, 44 seconds later, the car left. At 6.12, 14 seconds later, another shadow flickered on the door leading to the inner courtyard. To ascertain if someone was pursuing the recording, all available recordings are included below. Bonnie. According to the prosecutor's account, the police withheld the recordings from the video camera at the motel reception, which would require examination. Since Bonnie couldn't see the open cistern lids in the darkness, she fell and suffered a serious head injury that finally caused her death. Damani would have encountered three cisterns on her way to the cisterns. The first one would have been closed, followed by two open lids, but her body wasn't discovered there. The third one, but considering the circumstances surrounding the discovery of the body in the second, 
There were whispers going around that the young woman had been murdered before being put into the cistern. The authorities made evidence that suggested Damani was alive after falling into the cistern public in order to disprove these rumors. Her shoes and a scrap of cloth were also found there, along with her body, which was recovered in the left portion of the cistern. Furthermore, the wall that separates needs to be highlighted, dividing the cistern in half. Its width is 20 centimeters, and its height is 2 meters and 13 centimeters. The body's pocketbook, her face mask, and a white bra were discovered on top of the barrier. It is vital to realize that the only way to place anything on this barrier is to stoop down into the cistern. Since there is no way to go down or up inside the cistern, nothing can be placed on the barrier from the outside. The fact that Bonnie placed the items suggests that she was alive for a while, according to the officials. It is unclear whether Bonnie could have placed her belongings on the 2 meter, 13 centimeter high partition or if she threw them there. This suggests that Devani herself threw the items on the partition, a lighter and a set of three keys. Unfortunately, information regarding Bonnie's height could not be found. The appropriate area of the cistern contained both her phone and pocketbook. Although we can only guess as to what exactly transpired, if the body did fall and strike her in the head, she would have been bewildered, particularly given that it was dark. The barrier may have opened when she opted to toss her purse on it, allowing some of the contents to fall and land in the second half of the cistern. Devani's bra situation that evening is likewise unknown, as is whether or not it was in her purse. It's also not clear if she had a bra on that particular evening, or if it was in her handbag. It's also crucial to remember that she was dressed when her body was discovered. On one of the TV shows, the person's friends who she went to the party with said that she was intoxicated and that some people tried to take advantage of her, decided to send her home by calling a taxi. Right now, everything evidence points to the case being concluded and the death being classified as an accident. Damani's father disagrees with this account, and he thinks that someone was involved in his daughter's passing. The parents performed an independent examination after receiving the body, but the findings have not been made public. Mario Escobar claims that his future course of action depends on whether or not the authorities decide to keep looking into Bonnie's death or rule it out as an accident. What are your thoughts on this incident? Do you think it was a terrible accident or a criminal act? Share your opinion on this story in the comments and don't forget to like it. Thanks for watching. In this video, we'll discuss crimes perpetrated between 1996 and 2014. Despite the wide time span, all of these crimes had one thing in common. They were all committed along Virginia's Route 29, a major thoroughfare. The police looking into these crimes made several attempts, some of which were successful, to connect the incidents in some way. Some of the criminals referenced in this video may have already come up in separate investigations, though. Here, we'll try to look at the events from the standpoint of several offenses. In 1996, more than 20 women went to the police and said they had all been chased by a man in a pickup truck on Virginia's Route 29. He would communicate an issue with their automobiles and flash his headlights. A white male between the ages of 35 and 45 with reddish-brown hair who was driving a pickup vehicle was characterized as this individual. He earned the moniker Route 29 Stalker, 25-year-old Alicia Reynolds. Alicia Reynolds said her husband Mark Farewell on March 2, 1996, at half-past seven in the morning in Baltimore, Maryland, and left for Charlottesville, Virginia. She had a meeting with her mother scheduled for 10.30 a.m., but she had nearly 150 miles to travel. She held off till 11.30 a.m. Alicia's mother contacted her husband, Mark, but did not hear from her daughter. Mark informed her that Alicia had departed four hours prior and that by that time, even without rushing, she should have arrived. After making the decision to call the police, Alicia's car was eventually discovered at 6 p.m. on the side of Route 29. Despite being close to Culpeper, Alicia was nowhere to be found. When the car was inspected, there were no indications of a crime, and afterwards, specialists said the car was mechanically fine. What caused the young woman to leave her automobile unattended is unknown. An inquiry was launched. 
Soon, witnesses who had observed Alicia conversing with a man in a blue pickup truck on the side of the road were located. The alleged first victim of the stalker on Route 29 is Alicia Reynolds. All the women who had been pursued by the man in the pickup truck before she vanished and who hadn't previously recognized they were in danger came forward to the police and related their interactions with the unidentified pursuer after she vanished. It was discovered that three other ladies had previously dated in addition to Alicia. Two of them were delivered to their destinations in the pickup truck, but the third woman, Carmelita Shomo, was not. Sadly, no picture of her could be located. A week before Alicia vanished, Carmelita stopped at his request. She saw someone flashing their headlights at her in the rearview mirror as she was traveling home from work on Route 29 that wet night. She stopped, and the pickup truck's driver followed suit. She was said there were sparks as the man approached her after getting out of his car. He then offered to give her a ride home, and she consented, telling him that it was coming from underneath her car while she was driving, and that it might be unsafe to keep using it. The pickup truck stopped on the side of the road after a brief trip, and the woman was then attacked. Despite having a fractured ankle, she was able to get out of the pickup truck and draw the attention of oncoming traffic, which startled the driver and caused him to speed away. However, Carmelita, an immigrant with poor English language, reported the event to the police. At that moment, no steps were done to identify the pickup truck driver due to the police officer's dismissive attitude and lack of respect for her word. Despite the efforts of law enforcement, the police were unaware that their incompetence would eventually result in a tragedy for the Reynolds family. Two months after going missing, Alicia was not located. Her body was located 15 miles from where her car was found, in a forested location. Laura Winans is 26 years old, and Julianne Williams is 24. May 1996, the same month that Alicia Reynolds' remains were found again, saw the father of Julianne Williams call the police on May 31st to report his daughter missing. She hadn't arrived at the appointed time since she and Laura Winans were on vacation in Shenandoah National Park. They were last seen extending their stay at the campground on May 24th at around 5.30 p.m. Following the police report, park rangers found the two women's bodies the following day. They were both killed by incisions to their necks and the binding of their wrists. Authorities gave May 28th plus or minus 30 hours as the date of death. It was discovered that there had been no sexual activity before the victims' deaths, and their possessions were still in their tent. We shall return to this incident later. This motiveless crime baffled detectives, and the authorities were unable to crack the case right away. Sophia Silva, 16, is a teenager. On September 9, 1996, three months later, 16-year-old Sophia Silva vanished from her yard in Spotsylvania County without leaving any evidence of a struggle. Numerous searches. Sadly, it didn't produce any results. Her remains was discovered in a King George County Creek a month later. The test found that Carolyn McDaniel was 20 years old and that Sophia Silva had also experienced sexual assault before to her death. 20-year-old Anne Carolyn McDaniel left her home in Orange and vanished 12 days after Sophia Silva was kidnapped. Occasionally, hitchhiking was something Carolyn McDaniel enjoyed doing. She was last saw hitchhiking on the road on September 20, 1996. Her burned bones were discovered two days later, located in Culpeper County, only 15 miles from the location of Alicia Reynolds' body. Katie Lisk was 12 years old and Kristen Lisk was 15. Despite the police's best efforts, seven months had gone since Anne Carolyn McDaniel's death was discovered, and none of these crimes had any solid suspects. In the meantime, Spotsylvania, where Sophia Silva was kidnapped on May 1, 1997, was shaken by a fresh incident. Kristen Liskey, 15, and her sister Katie, 12, went missing. The girls would typically contact their father when they got home from school because he was at work at the time. On this particular day, though, the father didn't hear from his girls, so he began making calls home. He went home right away because there was no response. None of the nearby residents had seen the girls and they were nowhere to be found. The girls had come back, as shown by the bag with their school books that had been placed on the grass. 
but something had transpired since I got there. In the wake of it, a police report was made, and some 1,500 people joined the hunt for the girls. Their bodies were found in the South River, 40 miles from their house, five days later. The test revealed that drowning was the cause of death. Strangely, the water discovered in their lungs was probably clear tap water, much like in Sophia Silva's case. In their last moments, the girls' sexual integrity had been compromised. The types of crimes and some supporting evidence shown that a single person was responsible for these crimes. A Canadian visitor was riding in Shenandoah National Park on July 9, 1997, when she heard the sound of an approaching automobile. She was expecting the car to drive past, but it didn't. She noticed that the car was approaching her in an odd manner. The pickup truck's driver tossed a soda can at her before getting out and ordering her to take off her clothes. The woman tossed a water bottle at him and used her hands to block his path as he approached her. He tried to drag her into the car, using the bicycle as a barrier, but when he realized he couldn't, he got back in the driver's seat and tried to run her over. Being discouraged by yet another failure, she managed to hide behind a downed tree. The woman saw it as hell when a ranger just so happened to be walking by. He immediately radioed a description of the vehicle, a blue Chevrolet truck, and the person who was arrested as they were leaving the park. The culprit was identified as a 28-year-old man. On April 10, 2002, Daryl David Rice received his sentence of 11 years and three months in jail after pleading guilty to the attack in March 1999. In relation to the instances of Laura Winans and Julian Williams, Rice was charged. To refresh your memory, the young women's deaths were reportedly expected to occur around May 28th, give or take 30 hours. It was discovered that Rice entered the park at around 8 o'clock in the evening by reviewing surveillance camera footage from that time. Dated May 25th. He returned to the park the following day at 5 hours p.m. and was seen on camera visiting the park on June 1, 1996, the day the young women's bodies were discovered. Rice knew he would likely receive the death penalty so he hired a strong defense team that eventually had the accusations against him withdrawn. A hair discovered on the sticky tape, used to bend the young woman, was later determined through new DNA testing technologies to not belong to Rice. He was cleared of those charges in April 2004 due to insufficient evidence. But Rice's legal struggles were far from ended. The blue pickup truck he was driving when he was stopped belonged to his father, who resided close to Highway 29 in Virginia and was accused of being the Route 29 stalker. His attorney expertly handled the problem once more. When Rice was named as the attacker during the 2005 trial, Carmelier Shomo, the woman who had successfully resisted the attack and broken her ankle in the process, pointed to a completely different person when she was shown photographs of men for identification prior to the trial. Years ago, in the middle of the night, the defense was able to sow a seed of doubt in her mind making her wonder if Rice was the criminal. The defense team successfully exploited this uncertainty, which led to the charges being dropped. Additionally, there was no evidence linking Rice's actions to the Alicia Reynolds case, which is regarded as an incident involving the Route 29 stalker. Cases of harassment on the highway were only seized following Reynolds' disappearance. Additionally, nothing suggested Rice's involvement in the incidents in question. Spotsylvania and Orange. Despite numerous circumstantial evidence that the Route 29 stalker was in fact him, it was impossible to prove. As a result, the identity of the driver of the pickup truck that scared women is still unknown. Even with the given prize, the police made a concerted effort to solve these crimes, but they were unable to come any closer to the offender. 15-year-old Carol Robinson was at her friend's house on June 24, 2002, in Columbia, South Carolina, while an acquaintance showered. When a man with some pamphlets in his hands approached, Kara was watering the flowers in front of the house. He requested that Kara give her parents the items. He held a gun to her neck as she walked up to him and told her to get in his car. When he brought Kara to his house, she was chained and repeatedly forced to have sex while the kidnapper was fast asleep. Kara was able to free herself, make her way outside, 
and eventually find a police station. She had been held captive at the station for 18 hours. Everything she recollected helped the police find her abductor, but by that point, he had managed to escape. The perpetrator was identified as Richard Mark, 38, an honorable man who appeared to be just like everyone else. Mark is a former member of the military who is married and works. He had left the Navy in 1987 after being exposed to a 15-year-old girl and her three-year-old sister, it was learned. For this offense, he was given a three-year sentence with probation. He was captured by the police in Sarasota. Ivana made the decision to commit suicide after realizing he had no other option and was marked by a gunshot and a burst of light. It was determined that he was involved in the cases of Sophia Silva, Kristen, and Katie Lisk, after inspecting his home and comparing the available evidence. The threads on the corpses of the ladies were an exact match to the strands on his bathroom carpeting. It's unbelievable, but forensic specialists were able to locate Kristen Lisk's fingerprints in the car's trunk five years after the crime. DNA Testing by examining the facts, it was finally determined who killed Sophia Silva Kristen and Katie Lisk, and it was also shown that his early life had a big impact on who he would become. When Mark was six years old, his father Joseph was giving him a bath, and water went into his eyes, causing him to scream. Mark's father Joseph was an alcoholic, and his mother was openly having affairs with other men. Joseph was enraged by this and that the child at the time claimed that his father intended to drown him. Family members claimed that Joseph also drowned, leaving their dog's mark right in front of him. The pattern of his subsequent crimes is thought to have been influenced by this event, drowning his prey. Additionally, he was looked into for possible connections to the incidents on Route 29 and the Alicia Reynolds case, but none were found. Reports of the Route of 29 stalker ended once the witnesses were dead, and Rice was incarcerated serving his sentence. But soon after, girls started reporting it again. Started vanishing once more in Virginia in 2005. An unidentified 26-year-old woman from Fairfax, Virginia, was being carried into a wooded area after being attacked from behind on Rock Garden Drive, while she was returning home on foot from a nearby store. Dark and poorly populated, it was already. She fought back vehemently and shouted, but the attacker eventually overwhelmed her around 10 p.m. He coerced her into a sexual act before starting to choke her. Thankfully, a bystander who was nearby heard the woman's cries and ran to help. The attacker made it away, and the police were able to collect a sample of his DNA. They also produced a composite sketch, but they were unable to capture him using this information right away. On October 10, 2009, Cassandra Morton, at age 23, was in Lynchburg. Cassandra Morton, age 23, vanished. She was last spotted on Park Avenue, which is located in Lynchburg's downtown. The only information the police could find when her family reported her missing was that she got into a black car with someone. Her remains were discovered six weeks later. Her body had been strewn with rocks by a passerby who had just passed by the last spot she had been seen. 20-year-old Morgan Dana Harrington was last seen in Lynchburg seven days after Cassandra Morton vanished. Morgan Dana Harrington, age 20, vanished in Charlottesville, a nearby city 70 miles distant. On that terrible day, October 17, 2009, she was a student at a technological university. She and her pals went to see Metallica perform, when his opening band was on stage, she informed her friends that she would use the bathroom and then come back. Her pals were concerned because she had been gone for a while. When they called her at 8.48 p.m., she replied that she was outside the arena but was prohibited from entering due to the no re-entry rule. She also indicated that she was going home, but nobody seemed to think about how she would get there for some reason. No one can figure out why she left the arena since she never came back. She said that she needed to use the restroom, yet there are facilities inside the arena. It's still unclear how she got outside, or either it is genuinely unknown, or it is kept quiet for image purposes. Her wallet and phone were discovered the following day in a parking area close to the arena.
Two months later, on January 26, 2010, witnesses were located who had seen a young lady who resembled Morgan Harrington voting at a nearby bridge. A farmer in Albemarle County, 10 miles from the arena where the performance was held, found her bones. Later, the daughter's parents admitted that she was coerced into having a sexual encounter in the final moments of her life. Samantha Ann Clark, 19, vanished in Orange on September 13, 2010, when she was 19 years old. When Samantha left the house at 1.30 a.m. on the day of the incident, her mother Barbara was working the night shift. Her younger brother, who was 12 years old, stayed at home with her. He called his mother to let her know Samantha had left. When Barbara got home the next morning, she found her daughter's pajamas lying on the bed, indicating the teenager had changed before leaving. Admonish Samantha about threats he'd heard from friends. At the time, Taylor was not connected to Samantha Clark's disappearance in any way that the police could discover. The investigation came to a halt since the phone calls were insufficient to support any charges. Age 19 for Saga Smith. Saga Smith, 19, vanished in the same Charlottesville, three years after Morgan Harrington went missing there on November 20, 2012. She informed her roommate of her plans to that particular day as she was leaving her home. No one saw her again after that. The name of the guy she was meant to meet, Eric McFadden, was discovered by the police. He admitted during questioning that he was scheduled to meet with Sage, but that it never took place because he had other matters to take care of while the police were determining their next course of action. Alexis Murphy, 17, left her home in a truck close to Lynchburg, approximately a 30-minute drive away, while McFadden departed. She and her dad had made a deal that she, she had never broken the rule that she had to be home by midnight. The first time Alexis didn't arrive home by midnight was on August 3, 2013, and her grandmother instantly recognized a problem. The calls went to voicemail, so they were unable to speak with Alexis on the phone. Alexis was well-liked on social media and had many of friends. In an effort to locate Alexis, her parents contacted anyone who may have seen her on the day of her disappearance. This effort helped crack the case, attracted a lot of social media attention, and was featured in national news. People talked about the path Alex was scheduled to take via the notorious Route 29 from the shipment to Lynchburg, a movie theater in Charlottesville, Virginia, 40 miles from Alexis's house, and in the other direction from Lynchburg where she was headed, was where her white Nissan, which she usually traveled in, was discovered three days after she vanished. Although the area was cordoned off, Forensic specialists could find no evidence of a crime in the car. One was made in the investigation. Surveillance footage from the Livingston Liberty gas station provided a breakthrough in the investigation. Detectives carefully reviewed the video, which was captured on Saturday, the day Alexis left her house for Lynchburg. A slim-built man who held the door open for Alexis as he entered the building caught their attention in particular. The cashier who worked that day, admitted to the police that there had been a brief exchange between the man and the cashier also clearly remembers a Daffy Duck tattoo on the man's neck and the fact that he was driving a camouflage SUV after Alexis had paid and left for her car. The man exited the petrol station first and Alexis followed shortly after, according to further analysis of the video. However, given that she was traveling in the direction of Lynchburg, this might have been a coincidence. Another video clip of the same person was obtained by the police. It was taken by a camera at an adult business in Charlottesville one hour before he at the petrol station appeared. He bought a movie from the selection offered at those shops, but the key finding was that Randy Taylor was indeed the man who had made the purchase. On the night of her abduction, Samantha Clark had received a call from the same person. The whereabouts of Randy Taylor was promptly discovered by the police. Only 1.5 miles separated him from the gas station and his mobile home. A search warrant might be obtained thanks to video evidence showing Alexis Murphy and Randy Taylor interacting on the day of her disappearance. Anything that might be connected to Alexis's disappearance was taken by FBI officers. Inside the trailer, 
they discovered three items that were particularly noteworthy. Black hair, a severed artificial nail, and an earring stud. In close proximity to Randy Taylor's porch, within 20 meters, they discovered a broken phone that was also taken in for inspection. Within two days, the outcome is showed that it was Alexis Murphy's phone. Analyses proved Randy Taylor's connection to the missing girl, the earring, nail, and hair that were discovered in his home belonged to Alexis. Alexis Murphy was still missing, 11 days after she vanished, despite the fact that Randy Taylor had been taken into custody. When Taylor arrived at the courthouse, he was accused of kidnapping. Taylor began to speak when he recognized that the police were looking for information that would implicate him in both the kidnapping and the death of the missing young woman. However, his statement was now what everyone knew. He said that day Alexis was in his trailer as expected, but she wasn't there by herself. She was there with a black man named Damien Bradley who had dreadlocks. The authorities found evidence that Alexis and Damien Bradley had indeed interacted online and met in person. They visited Taylor's trailer, according to Taylor, to sell plants they were growing, and they had a beer. Taylor utilized a physical struggle between Alexis and her friend at some time to explain why Alexis's DNA was found in the police investigated Damien Bradley's alibi and discovered that he was in another state at the time. It seemed as though Taylor was merely attempting to place the responsibility elsewhere. In the meantime, FBI officers went back to the trailer for another push, and it worked. They discovered Taylor's T-shirt, which was worn the day Alexis vanished, and was now wrinkled below the couch. Eyelashes and hair extensions that are frequently used as extensions were wrapped within. After inspection, it was discovered that the eyelashes and hair were. These pieces of evidence were sufficient to accuse Randy Taylor of both the kidnapping and the murder of Alexis Murphy on May 8, 2014. Randy Taylor was given two consecutive life sentences in July after being found guilty on all counts. Taylor said he would divulge the whereabouts of Alexis's body if his two life sentences were lowered to 20 years in prison in response to Alexis's family, eliminating any remaining concerns regarding his role in the young woman's abduction. Declared that they would not engage in negotiations and would never give Taylor the chance to escape and hurt someone else. Before Alexis Murphy's family had any prospect of being able to say goodbye to her, nearly six hard years had gone. Human remains were found on private land on December 3, 2020, and on February 5, 2021, it was determined that the bones belonged to Alexis Murphy. Although Taylor was said to have disclosed the location of the remains, no agreements were made with him, and his sentence is still in place. It's important to note that Samantha Clark's case, who erred in 2010 and was tied to Taylor, was reclassified on January 15, 2021, and is now being handled as a homicide investigation. On September 13, 2014, Hannah Graham, an 18-year-old student, vanished from Charlottesville. She was last seen in the early hours of the morning at a mall. Extensive searches involving more than 1,000 volunteers were carried out a week after Hannah vanished, but she was not discovered. She was seen on surveillance video and the police found it. Jesse Matthew, 32, was recognized as the individual seen with Hannah in the video recordings. His flat was searched, but he wasn't taken into custody. He was named as a suspect in Hannah Graham's kidnapping four days after that. When a warrant was issued for Matthew's arrest, he had already left. The following day, he was captured in Galveston, Texas. He was thought to be planning to flee the nation and travel to Mexico. On September 29, 2014, it was revealed that information gathered during Morgan Harrington's case linked Jesse Matthew to her death. Remains were discovered in Albemarle County on October 18, 2014, and they were eventually recognized as Hannah Graham's. Notably, these remains were located within five miles from the location of Morgan Harrington's remains. Matthew was charged with Hannah Graham's kidnapping on February 10, 2015, and on September 15 of that same year, he was also charged in connection with the Morgan Harrington case. However, it was later discovered that Hannah Graham and Morgan Harrington were after a month of study. A number of Jesse Matthew victims fled Liberty University in Lynchburg, 
after one of the female students accused him of rape. He was able to avoid punishment nevertheless, since the complainant abandoned the allegations. After enrolling at Christopher Newport University in Newport News a few days later in January 2003, Matthew was once more the target of the same accusations. The victim again retracted the accusations after the university police looked into the issue. Matthew, from January 15 to October 15 of 2003, I attended Newport University. There were two missing ladies during this time. The fate of Without a Trace and their locations are still unknown. No evidence linking Matthew to their cases or the Cassandra Morton case was discovered, despite the police's investigation into any possible connections between their disappearances and Matthew. With this knowledge, there is only one question that can be asked. If the police had done their job properly, and both colleges where the complaints were made, at least two lives would have been saved if Matthew had persevered in the cases without worrying about damaging their image. In Charlottesville, Matthew started working as a cab driver in 2005. It's important to note that in the same year, a woman traveling home from work in Fairfax was attacked. In the Fairfax case, Jesse Matthew was charged with three counts of kidnapping, and the police were able to get a DNA sample from the culprit at the time, which has since been found to match Jesse Matthew's DNA. First off, he was found guilty on all three counts and given a life sentence for each one on October 2, 2015. In addition to the three life sentences he has previously been given as of this writing, in the instances of Alicia Reynolds and Morgan Harrington, he was sentenced to four further life terms for each of those crimes on March 2, 2016. The positions of Sage Smith, Carolyn McDaniel, Samantha Ann Clark, Laura Winnens, and Julianne Williams are still available. It is challenging when you look at these faces. It is difficult to think what additional horrors they may have kept buried in their closets, and it is much more difficult to comprehend the suffering they have caused the victims' loved ones. Share your opinion on this story in the comments, and don't forget to like it. Thanks for watching. Yo. An 18 year old student visited her family for the holidays, but a few days later, she vanished without a trace. The police got involved after her mother started receiving strange messages. None of them were ready for the truth they learned during the investigation, which truly shocked the entire family. On August 9, 1996, a Norfolk, Virginia suburb welcomed Angelica Hadsell into the world. She soon gave birth to two younger sisters, but when her parents got divorced in 2005, the girls stayed with their mother. Angelica had three younger sisters, who she got along well with after her mother remarried in 2010. They had another daughter. In Farmville, Virginia, about three hours away, Longwood University accepted Angelica after she graduated from a nearby high school. In addition to joining two sports teams, she also had a year early graduation goal and had to work quickly to meet it. She continued to travel to Norfolk to see her sisters and parents on a regular basis, despite this. When Angelica was 18 years old, she visited her family in March 2015 with the intention of staying for a few days during her spring break. Angelica was delighted to be able to return to her family, was in a good mood, and enjoyed spending time with them. She got her three younger daughters ready for school the next morning, March 2nd, and then left to go to work, leaving Angelica at home by herself. But when her mother came home from work in the afternoon, Angelica was gone. The back door was open, music was playing, and only a few of her belongings were put into the washer, giving the impression that she had left quickly. This puzzled her mother because she and her daughter were always in contact and she expected Angelica to let her know if she was going somewhere. However, on this particular day, Angelica didn't answer her phone, so her mother wrote to her and inquired as to where she had gone. When asked where she had gone on her walk with friends, Angelica replied that she had gone for one, but she didn't say specifically where. They then messaged back and forth about when Angelica planned to come home and this time her mother noticed something odd once more. She claimed that the messages from her daughter were written in a very distinctive manner compared to how she was used to. Normally, Angelica would send her detailed messages with all the pertinent information, but this time she only got brief 
ambiguous messages. Despite this, the young woman's mother did not have any unfavorable suspicions because she believed that the young woman simply wanted to hang out with her friends and that she was already 18 years old. Angelica didn't return home on that day, but she answered her messages anyway. She continued to evade questions about her location and her intended return time for the remainder of the day, though without providing any clear answers. Eventually, the daughter stopped responding to her mother. She then made the decision to contact Angelica's friends, but was disappointed to learn that no one had seen her and had any idea of where she was. The mother contacted police detectives that evening on March 3rd, after making the decision to do so. The young woman appeared to have left of her own free will at first. A note found in the house soon provided evidence in support of this version. It was probably written in Angelica's handwriting, according to Angelica's mother. One sentence is all there is. Angelica wrote that she needed some alone time with herself because of everything going on in a very strangely worded note. Her family could not comprehend what she was trying to say. She was a happy young lady who studied all her spare time and planned her future. She never made any significant life announcements, so the note seemed pointless. The fact that Angelica left her clothes, wallet, and car at home was also discovered by the police, which already refuted the claim that she left on her own initiative. There was, however, nothing to suggest the opposite at the time. A piece of Angelica's credit card was discovered nearby by Cody, a neighbor who lived close to Angelica's family several days after the investigation began. He told the police about it, and that's when he was named as the prime suspect. He was questioned by detectives for 12 hours because they believed he might be connected to her disappearance. The police did not immediately drop their suspicions despite his denial of guilt. Additionally, according to Angelica's family members, by that point everyone in the neighborhood was aware of the case and many people were attempting to aid the investigation. Teams were formed to scour the area for any proof and everyone started to suspect Cody. After the credit card incident, it was discovered that he and Angelica went to the same university and dated for a while. Soon after, something else happened that seemed to link him to her disappearance. The situation changed quite strangely less than a week after the investigation started when Wesley Hadsall, Angelica's stepfather, stormed into Cody's home and discovered Angelica's jacket there. Wesley, who was helping her friends find his daughter while they were searching for her, instructed them to go to Cody's house and search there for Angelica's belongings because he thought the boy was responsible for her disappearance. The friends went to Cody's house and did exactly that. They discovered her jacket there and immediately informed the police. Again being questioned, Cody was under tremendous pressure. Despite this, Cody claimed he had no idea where the investigators were extremely perplexed. The detectives had a strong feeling that the boy was telling the truth during the interview, despite the fact that the jacket and Cody's home were both very important pieces of evidence. The most crucial thing he did was offer an alibi for the day of Angelica's disappearance, in addition to voluntarily giving his DNA sample, taking a polygraph test, and agreeing to anything else they asked of him. He may actually be innocent, the police concluded after investigating this information. Wesley, Angelica's stepfather, gave them the tip. They told Angelica's friends who had found the jacket. With this knowledge, the detectives acknowledged that the man might have planted the jacket. The key question was, why would he do that? Wesley's involvement in his daughter's disappearance was the most likely explanation. When the police started looking into his background, they discovered that he had been charged with and found guilty of more than 10 offenses, all of varying degrees of seriousness. He was frequently detained for robbery, drug use, and possession. In 2005, he abducted his own wife and brutally treated her for a number of days. In any case, the court was unable to establish his guilt so he was spared any significant penalties. Throughout his life, he had spent a number of times and years in prison. The investigators also learned that Wesley's mother had expelled him from the home a few weeks prior to Angelica's disappearance because he had begun abusing strong, illegal substances. 
He'd been staying in hotels ever since. He was a serious suspect in light of everything that had happened. When asked when he last saw Angelica during the interrogation, the man insisted that he had nothing to do with her disappearance and that he was actively looking for her. Around noon on the day of her disappearance, Wesley claimed to have seen her at a gas station. The detectives looked over the video from the gas station cameras and couldn't find any evidence to back up the young woman's request for a few hundred dollars before they split up. Wesley's co-workers at work said he had taken a few hours off that day because his daughter had asked him for money. Around 2 p.m., he went back to work, nervous as ever. In his statement, there was a clear inconsistency. Wesley claimed to his co-workers that he had to leave because his daughter had requested money, but he admitted to the police that he had unintentionally seen Angelic at the gas station while driving by. There was no reason for Angelica to be at the gas station. Her car was parked close to her house. Wesley explained that the alarm had gone off at the home where he had been living prior to the argument with his wife when asked why he had left work that day. He also mentioned that he had received a notification on his phone. This information was not corroborated by the police, and it did not account for the blatant inconsistencies in his statement. In order to search Wesley's motel room, where he had been residing for the previous few weeks, the police next obtained a warrant. Interestingly, they discovered. Because of his numerous convictions, Wesley had been maintaining a large number of guns and bullets. He was arrested right away because it was illegal for him to possess weapons. Wesley was accused of three crimes, illegal possession of a weapon, breaking into Cody's house and tampering with evidence because of the jacket he allegedly planted in his room, even though there was no evidence pertaining to Angelica there. He continued to maintain that he was doing everything in his power to locate his daughter despite having no involvement in her disappearance. As a result, the court gave him a 20-year prison term, and the detectives kept looking for the young lady. The most intriguing thing they found when they seized Wesley's work vehicle was the GPS navigator, which they sent for analysis to specialists. They also discovered shovel tape and dark gloves inside. According to the information they had on March 4th, the detectives were interested in learning where Wesley had gone in the days following Angelica's disappearance. Wesley left Norfolk and traveled 90 kilometers to a nearby town. He then returned to his job after parking his car somewhere for 20 minutes. On April 9th, the detective arrived at the scene and found his car parked in a remote area close to an abandoned house. They finally located Angelica's body in a nearby ditch after searching the area. Even though she was protected by a piece of plywood, it would have been extremely challenging to stumble upon her because the area around the house was overgrown and inaccessible. As a result, no one could have done so. An unexpected statement was waiting for everyone after the body was sent for a medical examination. Participants discovered a level of illegal substances in the young woman's blood that was three times the amount that would have been fatal for a typical person, according to the results of the process. The shocked members of Angelica's family. The young lady was involved in sports almost exclusively studied, and didn't even drink alcohol. She was not taking any illegal drugs, which no one could believe. A second round of tests was chosen by medical professionals. It is possible to tell if someone has used narcotic drugs in the past by looking at their hair, and this analysis revealed that Angelica had never had any experience with illegal drugs. Because of this, it was virtually impossible to believe that she would suddenly decide to take a triple dose of medication. A piece of plywood was also placed over her body after it had been buried in the ditch. Everything pointed to the possibility that these drugs were administered to the young woman against her will with the intention of killing her while making it appear as though it was an accident. Wesley was interrogated by the detectives once more. When Angelica's body was discovered, the first thing they asked the man who was already in prison at the time was what his work car was doing nearby. The man's explanation, to put it mildly, was implausible. He claimed that he might have been set up and that he didn't go there on his own. He had additionally stated earlier that only he had access to this vehicle. Wesley even suggested that someone might have stolen his car's navigation system driven to that residence and then returned the device while the police gathered evidence. They were able to locate several recordings that demonstrated Wesley was in the city 
where his daughter's body was discovered on the same day, driving his work car from a number of street cameras situated along the route to this house. Even though everything pointed to the man being involved in the murder, the court still required additional proof, so the police worked on this case for several more years in an effort to gather indisputable evidence. Wesley was only charged with Angelica's murder at the end of the investigation because of this. According to the prosecution's account of events, the primary court hearing started in January 2022. Wesley went to the house on March 2nd, where Angelica was staying with the sole intent of robbing her and using her as a pawn in other violent crimes. He had planned to make it look like an accident, but instead, he took her out of the house, carried out his plan, and gave her a triple dose of drugs. The man had carefully thought out his plan, the police discovered repeatedly during countless interrogations, his denials and made every effort to discredit himself. The prosecution was successful in locating a witness who corroborated their story. This witness sold Wesley the same illegal substances that killed Angelica. Additionally, the court heard that the location information from Leslie's phone and Angelica's phone were compared after the police discovered Angelica's phone on the street. Her phone had been next to Wesley's since the young woman vanished, even when messages were sent from her mother's account. It was clear from this that Wesley had taken Angelica's phone and was attempting to reassure Angelica's mother that everything was fine, insisting that their client was innocent, the defendant's attorneys. They said Wesley had nothing to do with it, that the girl was depressed and had decided to take her own life. This account omitted any information regarding who buried her and covered her with a piece of plywood, or why his car was found close to the location where her body was discovered. All of these defenses attempted to account for either coincidences or attempts to frame Wesley. Interestingly, Despot having previously stated numerous times that he did not accept the overdose theory and thought Angelica was murdered, the man's opinion changed in court for an unknown reason and the jury arrived at a decision in less than an hour. Wesley was convicted of murder and given a life sentence. The man stated that he would contest the judgment, and theoretically, he stands a good enough chance of succeeding in having the judgment reversed. As you might have guessed, there isn't a single physical piece of evidence against him. For instance, DNA evidence of his guilt would have been virtually unassailable if it had been discovered on the victim's body. Wesley's work vehicle was actually found close to the location where the young woman's body was later discovered, which is the main defense argument. The fact that this person abducted and violently treated his wife 10 years prior to the incident raises doubts about any of his other arguments, though none of them are particularly strong proof. Does the defense have any stronger evidence, or does the prosecution's version seem to be more convincing? might very well succeed in getting a new hearing by contesting this decision. Your thoughts? Wesley is allegedly responsible for the murder, or is he unrelated? Share your opinion on this story in the comments and don't forget to like it. Thanks for watching. An 18-year-old woman went to another city in her car before going missing. The young woman vanished without a trace, and a week later, her body was discovered in a river. The police had no suspects, and her car wasn't located for years. It wasn't until 14 years later that the young woman's family discovered the horrific reality. The small American hamlet of Covington, Tennessee, is where Lisa Kimmel was born on July 18, 1969. Her parents soon welcomed two more children, and in 1972, the family relocated to Billings. The girl stood out from a young age for her. She worked part-time at a nearby restaurant and assisted her parents in caring for their younger sisters, demonstrating independence and tenacity. Because of this, she acquired a brand-new Honda CRX before high school graduation. Little Miss, as she was frequently referred to by her parents and sisters, was added to the young woman's license plate, and this plate would play an important part in the overall plot. Despite the opposition of her parents, Lisa chose to continue working at the restaurant after graduating from high school in 1987. The young woman planned to pursue a profession in her chosen field against her parents' concerns. They wanted their daughter to attend college. They ultimately decided Lisa would work for a year and still think about attending college. 
Soon after graduating, Lisa was presented with a management post, but she was already in another city. The young woman worked at a huge chain restaurant called Arby's alongside her mother, who was the regional manager there. She was expected to relocate to the Denver suburbs, nearly 900 kilometers away from her home, and run a restaurant there. It was a significant assignment for the 18-year-old, who had just graduated from high school, but Lisa embraced it without hesitation. Her mother also visited Denver frequently for work, and they saw each other virtually weekly. The young woman occasionally drove herself to her family's home in Billings. Lisa worked at a restaurant in the city of Aurora. She moved in promptly, rented an apartment, and was generally enthusiastic about her new situation. She met several new friends. She started dating Ed a few months later. He lived 800 miles distant yet frequently traveled to Aurora. On March 25, 1988, a Friday, Lisa was getting ready eagerly for the weekend. For the weekend, she had numerous plans. To finally reveal her boyfriend to her family, she planned to travel to Billings with him. He resided in Cody, Wyoming, close to where she was traveling. Lisa had intended to pick him up and accompany him on their journey. At around four o'clock, she left Aurora. After traveling roughly 400 kilometers, she had about seven hours to drive to the boyfriend's place. Lisa reached Douglas, Wyoming. Apparently, she was rushing since at 9 o'clock at night, a police officer pulled her car up for speeding based on his radar readings, when the police issued Lisa a $1.120 fine. She was traveling at a speed of roughly 140 kilometers per H. According to state law, she was supposed to pay the money to the officer immediately. The policeman advised Lisa to use the closest ATM close to the road to get the money, since she didn't have that much on her. When they arrived, the terminal did not accept Lisa's credit card. The culprit, who was unable to pay the fee, was detained by the police officer. However, he released Lisa on the condition that she mail the check to the neighborhood police station. It took the young woman roughly four hours to get from Douglas to her boyfriend's residence by automobile. She didn't wait for her that evening, and by the time Ed got up at around 7 a.m., he had fallen asleep. Lisa was still missing at the time. He had no means to reach her because there were no cell phones. Instead, he began making calls to the two states' police departments. Inquiring as to whether anything had transpired, he provided information regarding Lisa and her vehicle. Despite accepting the information, the police decided not to open a case of a missing person. This was due to Lisa's age, 18, and the fact that too little time had gone since her disappearance. After a few more hours, he continued contacting their mutual friends, but none of them picked up. They were aware of her disappearance. He then attempted to reach Lisa's parents, but they weren't at home. He also contacted Lisa's boss. When they returned hours later, their phone was ringing nonstop. To find out if they had heard from their daughter, other persons made simultaneous attempts to contact them. The parents initially believed Lisa had simply been delayed and was still traveling. It was difficult to believe that anything could have occurred to her, given that she had previously taken this path numerous times. However, time went by and she was still missing. By that time, her parents had called Ed and invited him to visit them. In such disturbing circumstances, Lisa's long-planned first encounter took place without her, and two days later, the young woman was still unreachable. The law mandated a 72-hour waiting period before reporting a missing individual. The parents made the decision to begin their own search rather than wait impassively. A small aircraft pilot was contracted by Lisa's father to fly over the area where the young woman was. He hoped this would assist him find where her automobile was supposed to be, but the search was fruitless. Along some of that road, the father also drove his car, but he was unable to spot Lisa. The family continued on after that. The girl's parents called a friend of theirs who was a private investigator and had previously worked for the police. He was able to persuade the neighborhood police agency to accept an early missing person complaint because of his contacts. Sadly, they found no leads, so the police were called right away. Although it was discovered that Lisa had been stopped by their patrol officer the night she vanished, her whereabouts were still unclear. There was just one thing that was certain. Between Douglas and the town of Cody, the young woman in the car had vanished. The area along that path had been searched by the authorities, but there is one major issue. There are hundreds of miles worth of farmland, woods, and mountains involved. To cover the entire area, it required months of labor and thousands of workers. 
The search on the ground therefore made little or no progress. On the morning of April 2nd, eight days had gone when a guy dialed the police. He claimed to be river fishing close to Casper, Wyoming. He once recognized the body that was submerged face down in the river. The fisherman immediately assumed it was her since he had just heard on the radio that the police were seeking for a missing young woman. When detectives arrived on the scene, they pulled the body from the water and confirmed that Lisa was indeed the decedent. Medical professionals examined the body and made a dreadful discovery. Lisa passed away just two days prior to her body being found, so investigators had to figure out where she had been hiding out for the entire time. It was later confirmed that the young woman passed away about six days after going missing. The death was initially believed by the authorities to have happened roughly five hours after she vanished, which later caused misunderstanding. Doctors also found multiple stab wounds and contusions on the young woman's body, concluding that she had been abused while still alive. It appears that she had been thrown into the sea from a bridge while she was still aware. Later, when blood was discovered on the bridge, police corroborated this claim. Medical professionals eventually removed biological material from the victim's body, which was discovered to be a sample of male sperm that appeared to belong to the murderer. It was submitted to a lab, but at the time, DNA analysis technologies were quite limited, and the neighborhood lab lacked the tools essential to recover the offender's profile. Detectives came to the conclusion that the murderer was probably a local person who lived close to the river because of the the young woman had been thrown from a bridge that was in a wilderness location that was far away, had been abandoned for a while, and required turning off the main road into a country road in order to access. Because of this, the police reasoned that only someone who was familiar with the area could have picked this bridge as a place to dump bodies. The detectives concentrated on finding Lisa's automobile because they thought the murderer had drove it somewhere and that it would contain more clues, but the car was never found. They were unable to locate it since it appeared to have dropped into the ground. In the hopes that someone would have useful information, investigators extensively disseminated information about the case to the general public. A lot of people came forward when the case was widely covered on television, and an odd thing started to happen. The police received over a hundred calls in total. People claimed to have spotted Lisa and a Honda CRX with Little Miss license plates. Only these witnesses were from various states, and occasionally even from Canada. The cops believed that appeals were more persuasive. Several days following Lisa's abduction on March 26 and 27, five different witnesses asserted to having seen the same car with the license plate, Little Miss being driven by a young woman who remarkably resembled Lisa. The young woman had to go to work on Monday, and she would never have missed it, so it's difficult to believe that she stayed in the Casper region for a few days for whatever reason and didn't feel the need to call her family. One eyewitness reported seeing a male. Despite making many inquiries, the police were unable to verify that the man was actually seated in the car with Lisa. Seven photographs of the claimed individuals seen with Lisa were compiled by the investigators, but none of them were useful for the inquiry because the descriptions were too varied to single out any one man. The statements of each witness were investigated by the police. They acknowledged that the murderer may have been behind the wheel of Lisa's automobile, but they could find no logical explanation for how Lisa could have spent the weekend driving about without phoning the perpetrator. Apparently, one of the witnesses saw the killer actually drive Lisa's car to hide it, while the rest of the testimony is either incorrect or outright fraudulent. Parents can call 911 from any nearby payphone. Falls Police later discovered that numerous similar automobile types were registered nearby, and it's possible that witnesses saw them while the investigation was going on. Numerous suspects were named by the detectives, but it was later discovered that none of them were connected to the case. Police received a new information six months later. Someone had pinned an envelope to Lisa's clothing, a grave with a letter on a man's behalf. It was stated that he regretted Lisa's passing, and described it as a devastating loss. Stringfellow Hawk, a figure from a well-known TV show at the time, signed the letter. The note didn't initially appear to be odd, but every member of Lisa's family and circle of friends immediately denied any involvement. In March 1989, exactly one year after Lisa's passing, 
the police consequently reasoned that it might have been left by the killer. Disappearance information about the case was presented on a well-known television program about unsolved crimes. The police received numerous tip-off calls due to the fact that it was watched by millions of people across the nation. Detectives from the area had to put in extra time and manpower to confirm them. The volume of tips and leads that the neighborhood police station received after the episode aired, in the opinion of Lisa's parents, was too much for them to handle. They wanted the FBI to investigate the death of their daughter for this reason, but Sheriff Ron Ketchum was very opposed to the concept and declared that he had no plans to abandon the lawsuit. Nevertheless, a year later, with the backing of higher authorities, Lisa's parents were still able to enlist federal detectives in the case. They got involved in the inquiry and sought to collaborate with the sheriff, but he refused to do so or even answer their calls. The investigators were now able to examine a DNA sample from the victim's body at a federal lab because of the FBI's participation. The sample was matched to that of Lisa's boyfriend, and they didn't match. The detectives decided to be absolutely certain, even though he had never been considered a suspect before. They then made the decision to investigate the patrolman who had stopped Lisa just before she vanished. Although detectives acknowledged that he might have filed Lisa and attacked her later, he possessed a recording of a discussion with the young woman that showed him bidding her farewell. The cop gave his DNA sample right away, and it did not match that of the murderers. After a local radio station broadcast a show about Lisa's murder, the next unexpected tip was received. We're called by a witness who claimed that he had witnessed Sheriff Ron Ketchum stopping the young woman in the road on the day she vanished, and there were some pretty suspicious moments at play. The sheriff opposed the FBI's involvement in the investigation and never claimed to have stopped Lisa that evening. Then, exactly two years after Lisa's death, a guy abruptly left the police and made an attempt on his own life. When detectives questioned him, he was able to recover and was receiving psychological treatment. Ron, however, entered a not guilty plea and declined to give a DNA sample. The investigators started to take him seriously as a suspect because everything about him seemed suspicious. But when they were prepared to get a court order for a DNA sample a few months later, the man did offer one himself, and it did not match the killer sample. It's unclear why, if he was unrelated to Lisa's death, the sheriff was behaving in such a peculiar manner. His co-workers noted that he had always been a complex individual who had experienced Vietnam, thus before the young woman vanished, he was acting in this manner. The cops eventually ran out of solid leads. They published more information about the case in 1992, in the hopes of locating other witnesses. The primary account of the inquiry suggests that there may have been many offenders. Most likely, one man abducted and killed Lisa, but someone else assisted in getting rid of the car. The possibility of the young woman being abducted at a traffic stop at a petrol station or someplace else was also considered by the investigators, but it was ruled out. Prior to these occurrences, the young woman was very cautious and Lisa picked her up after his car stalled on the road, and another driver stopped to assist her. Because she was aware of the potential danger, the young woman did not step out of the car and merely slightly dropped her window to speak with him. The case remained unsolved for an additional 10 years because the authorities were unable to pursue any fresh leads. They didn't experience their long-awaited breakthrough until July 2002, the neighborhood's police force reopened the, the killer's DNA sample, was the first thing entered into the FBI database during the inquiry. It wasn't used in mass across the nation until the late 1980s, and even then, it wasn't around yet. When they finally added a sample from Lisa's body, detectives discovered a match right away. The sample belonged to Dale Wayne Eaton, 59, who was incarcerated at the time. In 1997, he had been detained for using a weapon against a young couple and their young child when they were traveling through Wyoming. Wilderness. Dale drove by and stopped to assist as their car stalled. We offered the family a ride to the closest service station, which allegedly belonged to his brother, after he examined the car and indicated there was no way to fix it immediately. After agreeing, they boarded his van. 
Dale declared he was exhausted and needed to sleep a short distance later. He climbed into the rear of the vehicle and asked the woman to take the wheel. He grabbed his rifle and motioned for the woman to get out of the car and onto a country road as soon as it moved. Woman violently twisted the wheel, knocking Dale off balance and causing him to drop his weapon. When they exited the vehicle, the assailant reached for a knife, but the family's father quickly reached for the rifle and struck Dale with the buttstock. After that, the family climbed into his van and headed to the neighborhood police station. Dale was apprehended by detectives after they drove to the spot and found him nearby. Due to the numerous mental impairments that were discovered during his trial, they decided to put him to a closed rehabilitation center rather than imprison him. According to the authorities, he would stay there for a number of years during which he would receive assistance in moving on with his life, finding a job, and other things. After a few months, he managed to escape, for which reason he was apprehended and given a five-year prison sentence. What matters most in this situation is that Dale's DNA was collected before he was imprisoned and submitted into the FBI database. This led to the Lisa Case's investigators ultimately finding a match. He lived nearby and was 43 years old when Lisa was killed. Law enforcement investigated Dale's past in that area and found a long list of crimes he had committed. At the age of 16, he committed his first significant crime. Dale offered to help the woman take the watermelons he had just sold her home. The woman looked at the watermelons after they arrived and noticed they were rotten. After a lengthy altercation in which she refused to pay for them, Dale stabbed her and then ran away. The following day, the man was taken into custody and the court ordered him to receive treatment. He was identified as having many moderate mental illnesses. Following treatment, he kept switching employment since he couldn't establish himself in any position. He eventually got married, and the two went on to have three kids. The couple's 15-year marriage was miserable. They fought frequently and separated. He relocated to Moneta, a city only an hour's drive from Casper, in 1996. There, his in-laws had a bus converted into dwelling and numerous unfinished constructions on the property. Dale made himself at home there. Except for an occasional tiny bed, there were no living quarters in that bus. To take a shower, he would travel to a neighbor's home. Because of this, Lisa's body had DNA from a seasoned serial offender, but authorities weren't ready to arrest him because they needed more proof. Officers showed up to the precinct where he formerly resided. Nearby, a number of neighbors lived, and one of them gave the detectives an intriguing tale. Around the time Lisa vanished, Dale allegedly dug a sizable hole on his property and declared he was going to put, but that never happened, in a septic tank. When the lot was dug up, the detectives discovered Lisa's automobile with Little Miss license plates. With all of this information in hand, the police began to work gathering the evidence they would need to successfully prosecute Dale, they knew they would have plenty of time while he was inside because Dale killed the man who shared his cell with him. He was finally charged with Lisa Kimmel's murder in April 2003. The lawsuit proceeded because the man refused to admit guilt. The prosecution called Dale's other cellmate to testify, saying that the man confessed to him about Lisa's murder and gave him all the details the young woman allegedly saw him on the side of the road, stopped, and agreed to give him a ride. At one point, Dale allegedly started to molest her, but was rejected. Then he pulled a gun and ordered her to his house where Lisa was killed. But nobody accepted this explanation. Lisa's parents warned her against picking up a hitchhiker in the middle of the night in a remote location. Dale had a motive to lie. Either he told his cellmate a lie, or he made it up himself to get his sentence reduced for testifying. The investigation reveals that was not the case. Lisa most likely stopped at a petrol station before Dale attacked her there. Between Casper and Dale's house, they even mentioned a certain gas station by name. Lisa had to pass it on her way there. Cody Dale probably got into her car and used a revolver to compel her to drive to some isolated spot because he frequently drove there to use the public lavatory. Then, he brought her back to his station and held her in the bus because he had no water on the site. He took her to that bridge a few days later, stabbed her multiple times, and then threw her into the sea after deciding to get rid of her. 
Additionally, experts compared Dale's handwriting to that of the note placed on Lisa's grave. They discovered a lot of similarities, but despite the difficulty of calling it evidence in court, Dale was found guilty thanks to DNA evidence found on the body and the car that were both on his property. Even the lawyers were aware of this and made an effort to have their client not receive the death penalty rather than an entire acquito. They cited the mental disorders that prevented him from accepting full accountability for his deeds, but in vain. Dale was given the death penalty when the jury found him guilty. Then Lisa's parents sued him in a civil case, which was approved by the young woman's parents, along with the fire department, destroyed all of the buildings on the land where they were located, after the court ordered that Dale be removed from it. Since Lisa's conviction, this occurred on her birthday. In 2010, the court accepted the appeal and scheduled a fresh hearing despite Dale's attorney's repeated attempts to have the death penalty revoked. The appeal was approved on the grounds that the court erred in imposing the penalty. In addition, the evidence of Dale's cellmate was seized upon by the defense team to take into account the offender's significant childhood mental disorders and developmental deficiencies. Although the man's testimony may have been made up and the jury was not informed that he had been promised a lighter sentence as a result, there is still little chance of the sentence being completely overturned. The death penalty is unlikely because Dale is still incarcerated and is currently 78 years old. In this entire narrative, there is one more point worth highlighting. In the neighborhood where Dale lived, there have been a number of unsolved homicides and mysterious disappearances of young women. Despite the lack of available proof, the police acknowledge that Dale could have been the murderer. His entire life shows a definite propensity towards crimes in Syria. This suggests that Lisa Kimmel wasn't his only victim. Share your opinion on this story in the comments, and don't forget to like it. Thanks for watching. Almost immediately, a first-year college student was discovered dead in her own bedroom. Any one of the police's numerous suspects could have been the murderer. The subsequent breakthrough was akin to a detective story with unexpected turns and a long-awaited revelation made possible by a small DNA sample. We'll explain what happened to Jennifer Halen in this video. Welcome to A to Z Crime Stories. Before we start, don't forget to like this video and subscribe for more. On February 23, 1988, Jennifer Allen was born in Wimberley, Texas, a tiny hamlet in the United States. She grew up carefree and content with adoring parents, a sister named Diana, and loving parents. Her family soon relocated to Bryan, a city located about 200 kilometers away from her village. The young lady enrolled in Blinn College in her hometown after graduating from high school with the intention of studying to become a legal assistant and hoping to make a connection with Jairus Prudence in her later years. She was well-liked, dependable, and friendly by a large number of her friends. She always had a positive outlook on things and was excited about her future career. Jenna moved into an apartment at Autumn Woods Apartments close to her college. She also took a job as a waitress in a nearby restaurant to help pay for housing costs and avoid being financially dependent on her parents in spite of his busy schedule juggling work and school. Spencer Hood, Jenna's boyfriend, and her were frequently together. Even after Jenna moved into a rented apartment, they continued to live apart despite having been in a relationship since high school. Despite occasional disagreements, the couple's relationship had lasted for a while. Jenna, who was 20 years old at the time, finished her shift on April 8, 2008 and Spencer said goodbye to Jenna and went home for about 30 minutes at around 9 p.m. because he had finished studying with her at around midnight. Then they had a brief phone conversation before saying goodnight to one another and retiring to bed. On the morning of April 9th, Spencer realized that he had left his textbook, which he needed for a lecture, at Jenna's house. When no one came to the door, he went to her house to get it. The fact that it was unlocked shocked Spencer. He entered Jenna's apartment, assuming she was still asleep, and went to her bedroom, only to be confronted by a horrifying sight. Jenna was aware that she was dead as she lay lifeless on the ground. 
Spencer sprinted over to the adjacent apartment and pleaded with the occupants to call the police. This call's recording is accessible to everyone. The operator was informed by Jenna's neighbor that she was lying on the floor, not breathing, and in the distance, Spencer's startled voice could be heard. When the police arrived, they checked the apartment and discovered no evidence of the fourth century. The second bedroom's window being open was the only peculiarity. Detectives assumed right away that the killer might have entered the building through it, but this theory was challenged because the door was unlocked. The theory of a potential robbery, which might have prompted the perpetrator to attack Jenna because all of her belongings were in their proper places, was immediately challenged by investigators. Nothing of value was missing, and her purse containing cash and credit cards was hanging right by the front door, which a thief would have undoubtedly taken. Additionally, the apartment was in perfect order. There were no visible signs of a struggle. There was no indication that the murderer had been there recently, and when the police examined Jana's body, they found no signs of serious injuries aside from a bruise on her forehead and a bit of lip. She was lying on her back. She had small blood stains on the carpet next to her body and on the collar of her shirt. Medical professionals examined the body and came to several significant conclusions. First, Jenna passed away just an hour after she finished speaking with Spencer on the phone, about 10 hours before Spencer found her. Second, the cause of death, strangulation, was discovered on her body. The experts also concluded that the unidentified offender did not sexually assault the young woman, but that Jenna attempted to repel him as shown by her fingernails had skin and blood under them. All of these samples were right away delivered to the lab in an effort to collect a DNA sample from the offender. Spencer, her boyfriend, was naturally the first person to be suspected for a number of reasons. First, according to statistics, murderers frequently end up being people close to the victim. Second, the lack of any indications of a forced entry suggested that Jenna might have known the offender and knowingly permitted them entry. Spencer cooperated with the investigation during questioning and responded to all. The police could not confirm Spencer's involvement in the murder at the time because experts had not yet been able to obtain the killer's DNA sample. He was eventually set free, but the police took their time in clearing him of all charges. Jenna's friends, meanwhile, claimed that he loved her dearly and wasn't likely to have harmed his beloved. Detectives then started looking for potential witnesses. In order to determine whether Jenna's neighbors had observed anything, the police questioned them. They quickly located several men who were playing volleyball close to Jenna's apartment building on the night of the murder. They claimed to have seen a strange man at that time emerge from a building close to the young woman's apartment. The fact that this person was only sporting pants caught them off guard. The man appeared to be 26 years old, the witnesses continued. After learning about Jenna's friends, Sean Stevens, who also resided in the same apartment building, told the police about another concerning development in the past. Stevens, a real person, he yelled at Jenna from his window, directly across from her. Although the reason for this behavior was not entirely clear, the police had enough reason to suspect the young man Stevens based on all of these facts. He denied knowing anything about the murder and said he never left his apartment building at night, much less went outside in the open. Without any solid evidence, the police were unable to verify his claims, so they had to release him as well. Along with everything else, the detective looked at the potential Although Jenna's restaurant co-workers and the surveillance cameras supported the theory that the murder was related to Jenna's place of employment, they also revealed that on the day of her death, she had no conflicts with anyone and that similar circumstances had never occurred before. The investigation slowed down after this. The police kept looking for new leads and questioned Jenna's family and friends. Eventually, they were able to get a new lead while speaking with the detectives. Parents of the young woman were able to recall crucial details from two months prior to Jenna's murder that might implicate another suspect. She complained about a repairman performing maintenance on her apartment complex building to her family. One day she found a stranger in her living room after exiting the shower wearing only a towel. 
He responded that he believed no one was home when she asked him what he was doing in her apartment. The man stayed to assess the state of the shower and claimed not to have heard it run. Naturally, inspect your apartment to make sure nothing needs fixing. Jenna was astounded by the circumstance. She identified the man as Jeremiah Rosser, 29, and informed the building manager of the incident. The police carried out a small test. While the other person turned off the shower, one person stood at the front door. In the living room, and even close to the entrance door, one could clearly hear the sound of running water. It was highly unlikely that Rosser missed it and assumed nobody was home in such a scenario. The reason for Rosser's termination was discovered by the police after speaking with the building manager. He stopped showing up for work a few days after Jenna's murder. The detectives searched for the man because everything seemed very suspicious, but they ran into a problem. Rosser left his apartment and they were unable to find him anywhere else. He only has a former wife and two kids, according to what the police were able to learn. Consequently, there were three main suspects in this intricate case. Sean Spencer, Hood Stevens, and Jeremiah Rosser had to wait for the results from the lab where specialists were attempting to extract the DNA sample in order to ascertain which of them was the murderer. They were analyzing the blood on the young woman's shirt and rug, as well as the particles under her nails. They discovered that one of the blood drops on the rug contained genetic material that did not belong to Jenna as a result. The experts were finally able to use this sample, which matched the one taken from the particles under the young woman's nails. Two, the first step in extracting a complete DNA sample was to enter it into the FBI database, but there were no matches. This indicated that the murderer had never before been found guilty of a serious crime. Nevertheless, the obtained sample could now be compared to DNA samples from the three main suspects by the police. Their samples not being collected during the initial interrogations was the only issue. When the detectives attempted to get in touch with them, they were shocked to learn that all three had left the area and that their whereabouts were unknown. Investigators made the decision to use the killer's DNA sample rather than just standing by and waiting for the police to start looking for them. Men who lived in the same complex as Jenna and worked in a restaurant started voluntarily providing DNA samples. They were able to collect 50 DNA samples in total, but none of them matched the sample taken from the crime scene. Spencer was eventually located by the police who discovered that he was staying with his parents three hours away from Brian. The youth gave an explanation of his couldn't deal with Jenna's passing and made the decision to spend time with his family in order to forget about the tragedy. His DNA sample, which he voluntarily provided, was immediately sent to the lab. The young man also gave permission for experts to check his body for scratches that were undoubtedly made by the murderer after all of his skin fragments were discovered beneath Jenna's nails. After that, the police were able to find Stephen's location. He also traveled 720 kilometers to see his parents, who lived near Blinn College. He voluntarily provided a sample of his DNA, which was also sent to the lab. Finding the final suspect proved to be much more challenging, and it had to be done while the police awaited the laboratory's findings. When Rosser and his ex-wife were on the verge of divorcing, the police were able to get in touch with her and she provided them with some unsettling information. Rosser was acting aggressively toward her. He extended his hand, knocked her to the ground and attempted to choke her. He frequently caused scandals as well, which made it impossible to coexist with him. His union with his wife was annulled. Around the same time that Jenna was killed, all of this occurred. The police were able to find Rosser because of his ex-wife. Early October, seven months after the murder, saw this occur. He answered all of the detective's questions while behaving quite calmly during the interrogation. The man also denied involvement in the killing and voluntarily gave a DNA sample, never having been detained in his life. His car was also searched by the police, who made some intriguing finds. A few months prior to Jenna's murder, a laptop with a serial number that was listed in the theft report was discovered in the car. The worst part was that the police also discovered keys to several apartments in the residential complex where he worked, despite the fact 
that he was fired a week after Jenna's murder. Her neighbor had called the police after her laptop vanished from her apartment, but that wasn't the worst part. The manager was required to seize the keys because Rosser had no right to keep them. This all pointed to the fact that the man was petty theft, but could he advance to cold-blooded killing? In the meantime, all three DNA samples were examined by laboratory specialists. Rosser's DNA sample matched the sample discovered under the victim's nails, even though it later turned out that Jenna's boyfriend and her neighbor had nothing to do with the murder. The police detained Rosser right away after learning the results, but despite the DNA match, he insisted on his innocence. Naturally, this was of no assistance to him, and the man was accused of killing Jenna. Rosser was reluctant to give the details of that evening, so the investigators made up their own version of what took place. Rosser apparently broke into Jenna's apartment with the intent to use a key to her door to commit robbery. When the young lady had not yet arrived home from work in the evening before 9 p.m., this could have occurred. Rosser may not have had enough time to complete the intended crime because Jenna and her boyfriend arrived home, forcing the criminal to hide in the second bedroom and wait for Spencer to arrive. It's possible that Rosser opened the window in an effort to sneak out of the apartment without being seen, but that plan did not pan out. Rosser could finally try to leave the apartment through the front door after watching for Spencer to depart and hearing Jenna bid him goodnight on the phone. There are two explanations for what might have happened next. Either he attempted to leave the apartment, but Jenna saw him first, causing him to become panicked and attack her, or he went to her room on purpose with the intention of killing her. Even asserted that the young lady was the victim of his murder because she resembled his ex-wife. The man was prosecuted in court because he refused to accept responsibility for his actions. As is frequently the case in the state's legal system, the process for starting the trial dragged on for several months. But in December 2009, two weeks before the trial was scheduled to start, something unexpected occurred. Rosser finally acknowledged his guilt more than a year after his arrest. In an effort to have his sentence reduced, he and the prosecutor entered into a plea deal. Also, the man asked his parents and two children from his ex-wife were among the people excluded from the investigation from being involved in the legal process. This resulted in the trial being finished in record time. Despite the DNA sample match, the trial might have taken years to complete if he had not admitted guilt. Rosser was consequently given a 55-year prison term. He also received a five-year sentence for stealing a laptop. According to the assistant district attorney, this was the harshest punishment possible for a guilty defendant plea, however, if the investigation had been able to show that the murder was premeditated and planned, Rosser faced a much greater risk of being sentenced to death. Rosser might have been given this verdict. The man was sent to Texas's Rosheron prison, and his first chance at parole won't come until 2036. Rosser could be released early at the age of 55 because he was only 27 when the crime was committed. But if he completes his term, he won't be free until he is 82 years old. He exhibited a lack of eye contact with Jenna's family and friends throughout the trial. He was handcuffed and led into the courtroom wearing an orange prison jumpsuit. The man remained silent and unresponsive with his head bowed, only nodding to his parents when he saw them in the courtroom. The family of the deceased had the right to address the murderer in open court. They all three took advantage of this chance. Sister of Diana appeared in court 60, she said, standing a few centimeters from the offender. I hope Roster will realize the terrible act he had committed. She said she would pray for him and that one day she would be able to forgive the man who killed her sister. Rosa may not have regretted his actions, according to Jenna's mother. She forced the murderer to meet her eyes directly and declared firmly that he would never be able to fully comprehend the horror he had inflicted on their family. Jenna's father initially decided against testifying at the trial but later changed his mind. He made a last-minute commitment to visit any prison where the roster is posted and expose himself as a monster. Additionally, he stated his intention to show up at the hearing when roster applies for parole in 27 years. In addition, Jenna's parents sued the proprietor of the apartment building. 
When their daughter complained to Rosser's boss about his behavior, they were certain that her words were not taken seriously. Rosser's keys weren't seized after his firing either, which shows the manager was careless. If Jenna's complaints had been taken seriously and detention had been paid for Rosser's inappropriate behavior, Jenna's parents think their daughter would still be alive today. The only thing that is still a mystery is Rosser's precise motivations. He admitted to the murder, but he remained silent about his motivations. Whatever the case, it is irrelevant now because his guilt is clear and he deserves to serve his entire life in prison. Share your opinion on this story in the comments and don't forget to like it. Thanks for watching. A woman mysteriously disappeared from her own home and her friends decided to go to the police. At first, it looked as if she herself had gone somewhere, but with each new clue, the case became more and more creepy. Eventually, investigators were able to uncover the mystery, and the truth turned out to be quite frightening. Welcome to A to Z Crime Stories. Before we start, don't forget to like this video and subscribe for more. In New York City, Mindy Schloss was born in 1955. She relocated to Alaska when she was 25 and attended a local medical school there before earning her degree. After receiving a degree in psychiatry, the woman accepted a position as a nurse at Fairbanks Hospital. Many patients in Alaska's remote areas were unable to travel to the hospital on their own, so Mindy and her co-workers would use all available means of transportation, such as boats and airplanes, to reach them even though the majority of the time she had to work in the field. She was passionate about her work and gave it her all. Mindy resided roughly 600 kilometers away from the Anchorage Hospital. She flew to work, spent the week at a hotel, and returned home on the weekends, in August of that year. Mindy, 52 years old at the time, flew back to work after spending the weekend in Anchorage. She regularly requested her best friend Jerry to drop by her house during her absence to feed her cat and give him the medication he required. Her friend called her on Saturday, August 4, to discuss the situation, but Mindy didn't pick up. It seemed odd that she still hadn't been able to reach her all day, so Jerry called a mutual acquaintance who also hadn't reached Mindy all day. Jerry initially believed Mindy had left. She claimed to be away for work, but the next day she remained silent. When no one opened the door when her buddy's friend drove to her house, Jerry used her spare key. At first inspection, everything appeared to be in order. The house was clean, and there were no indications of a struggle or any other negative events involving Mindy. Only after leaving did the jurors notice anything odd. The front door's doorknob was loose, so the woman had used the screwdriver to tighten the screws. She then left and went to work. Jerry called the hospital where Mindy worked on Monday, August 6th, after learning where her companion had vanished to. She never showed up for work, which was extremely out of character for her, and she didn't call any of her co-workers to let them know she wasn't going to be there. All of this suggested that the woman may have experienced something, so Jerry chose to call the police. When Jerry and the investigator visited Mindy's residence once more after the police had taken a complaint of a missing person, they were unable to find any evidence of a break-in. Nothing of value was also gone from the premises, ruling out the likelihood that a burglar had entered the woman's residence. Some of the prescriptions Mindy kept at home were those that required a prescription from a doctor. They were in high demand among drug addicts, so any burglar would have most certainly taken them. When they got into the garage, they saw that Mindy's car was gone. It was also highly odd that the woman only used her car to move around town and always took a cab to the airport. The detectives came to the conclusion that the woman had experienced something quite awful. A forensic team searched the home for any hints, but they came up empty-handed. The hypothesis of a kidnapping was improbable. The police believed that Mindy may have been in an accident. She frequently traveled through rural areas where the terrain was rather hazardous. People can have gone from a cliff unintentionally or became prey to wild animals. However, the authorities were not any closer to solving the crime as a result of this argument, decided to start looking for people who, in theory, might be connected to her disappearance. They started by checking on the acquaintance of Bob Mindy and Jerry. The police were able to immediately ascertain that the man was working far from the woman's home on the day of her disappearance because to the man's want to assist with the investigation. The cops were unsure about the precise time that Mindy vanished. Since Saturday, 
the woman has been in touch. Experts examined her computer and found that the at 1.30 a.m., she used it for the last time. Police decided to ask the public for assistance later that day because they had no strong leads. They sent the missing woman's information to local TV stations and plastered leaflets regarding her whereabouts across the community. The following day, they started getting calls from witnesses, but the most of the leads were dead ends. People claimed to have seen Mindy in numerous locations, including in other states. These leads were never of any use. In the meantime, Bob and his co-workers made the decision to search the region where Mindy may have. The detectives tried a different approach and contacted the bank the woman used. They asked them to check to see if there had been any activity on her cards in recent days, and this is where a serious lead finally awaited them early Sunday morning the day after Mindy went missing. Someone had withdrawn $500 from her debit card, the maximum amount allowed, and she had been out in the country quite frequently for berries or just out for a walk. Unfortunately, the search also produced no results. The bank's ATM video footage was promptly seized by the authorities who discovered a terrible scene. It turned out that an unidentified individual had taken the money out. They were unable to recognize him because of the scarf covering his face. Only until his face was hidden from the camera's view did he remove the bandana. The only option left to the cops was to wait until the man attempted to use some one person's card. The cops received another tip in the meanwhile. They discovered through Mindy's co-workers that she was preparing to, to remodel her house and had at one time employed employees. She and their boss had a disagreement on the reason for the work. Later, Mindy confessed to her co-workers that she was scared of him since he behaved suspiciously when he came to her house. Police checked on the man, but it turned out that he had a plausible explanation for why the woman vanished on that particular day. Another employee who visited her home on Friday about 7 p.m. was also questioned. It. The man was also uninvolved and he had no memory of anything odd happening that evening. Within a short period of time, detectives had a the 500 charge on Mindy's card occurred again early in the morning, but this time from a different ATM, according to a new lead bank security report. The cops knew it was the same individual after reviewing the security camera, but there was something strange on the recording. The man took the cash out and walked away, but he soon went back to the ATM. Pushing buttons as he moved around it, he eventually left once more. After contacting the bank detectives, they learned what was causing his odd behavior. This time the police managed to find a witness who drove up to the exact same ATM when an unidentified man came out of there according to the witness, he got on his bicycle and rode away. It was a significant lead since most people don't remember the ATM taking the card away to prevent the theft. The real owner can get it back by going to the bank with his ID. Of course this was not an option for the criminal, so he lost access to Minnie's account forever. This time the police managed to find a witness. Detectives chose to interrogate everyone in the Mindy area because the available information was still insufficient to draw them closer to a clue. They inquired about any peculiar occurrences or suggested any suspect neighbors. Unexpectedly, a number of locals named a house that was close to Mindy's home. They claimed that there were always celebrations there. The locals were constantly making noise and upsetting the peace. The detectives got there and discovered that there were quite a few residents but they were unwilling to speak with the detectives. A woman who lived just across the street from the house was the next place the detectives went. She claimed that she did not notice anything odd, but it was clear from the way she was acting that she was quite tense. The woman called the police station the following day and begged the detectives to meet, but not at her home. They met elsewhere and the woman told them a spooky tale. A man who lived across the street paid the detectives a visit not long before that. He claimed that police were patrolling the area and requested that she not let them know that he lived here. She heard someone strolling on her porch when she asked why he claimed to be on parole and did not want the police to know where he was at night. She noticed he was the same man when she peered out the window. He walked around, peered into a few windows, and then walked away. Because she was so terrified, the woman made the decision to call the police. Josh Wayne, who was 27 years old at the time, was his name, according to the detectives. When they put him through the database, they discovered that he had been found guilty of murder. He had been suspected of killing a woman by beating her seven years prior, but a jury had found him not guilty. 
Josh spent three years in jail before being charged with tampering with evidence and given a six-and-a-half-year prison term. He was let go. He was immediately recognized as a key suspect by early detectives. When authorities started looking for Josh, they learned from his housemates that he didn't own a car and primarily traveled by bicycle. However, there was just one issue. Man has vanished. Without a trace on Thursday, August 9th, police received a call from a local trucker who claimed to have seen Mindy's car in a parking lot close to the airport, giving them an unexpected new lead. He instantly recognized the automobile after seeing its photo in the newspapers. When detectives arrived on the site, they were able to verify that the car was actually Mindy's. They also observed that a nearby building had a surveillance camera directed at the parking lot, so they asked for a recording. It displayed a man operating this vehicle into on August 4 at 12.30 p.m. He exited the parking lot and appeared to wipe off his fingerprints by wiping down the door handle. Regrettably, the clarity of the camera prevented use from seeing his face. Although it took some time to analyze the samples and there was no assurance they would be helpful in the case, CSI was able to recover some samples while searching the car for prints or signs of DNA. Mindy's purse was on the passenger seat, which might have been a sign that she had been in the car with the offender, alive or dead. Using cutting-edge analysis technologies, they are now obtaining the desired outcomes. A search dog strategy was chosen by the detectives. Since Mindy had been missing for a week, Few people thought this concept would work, but they had run out of ideas and turned to filming dogs. The service both Mindy's car and the ATMs, where the unidentified man had withdrawn cash, were visited by the dog. Three streets away, at the woman's house, the dog followed the route and started walking down the street. She smelled the front door and went straight to the residence that Josh Wayne had formerly occupied. When the service dog pointed straight to the fact that Josh was in Mindy's car close to her house and those ATMs, the detectives, who up until that moment had not believed in the search dog concept, were taken aback. The exercise was repeated the next day by the police with a different search dog. The outcome was the same. The dogs made it to Josh's house after walking the entire distance. The detectives chose not to waste their time investigating, even if it was not unqualified proof that would be accepted in court. They proceeded to the suspect's home after obtaining a warrant for his arrest. But the man hadn't been there for days. After inspecting the building, they discovered the jacket that the mysterious man had been seen wearing on the security cameras by the ATMs. A cash withdrawal slip from Mindy's card was also discovered in the jacket's pocket. They then came across a woman's gold watch and showed it to Jerry right away. The watch belonged to Mindy, the woman said. In order to compare the DNA samples discovered on the, the tests from items from Mundy's home matched, proving that Josh had been in the automobile that belonged to the missing woman. The police were concentrated on apprehending the culprit because the evidence was already significantly more serious. His name was on flyers that were distributed around the city, and they even rented a number of billboards. Detectives said that it was one of the biggest manhunts ever conducted in Alaska. Nearly all law enforcement agencies were involved in the investigation, and at one point locals reported any questionable material. Point after the police revealed ATM camera images, Lisa, a lady, approached them almost immediately. She claimed she had previously seen Josh and was certain he was the person in the picture. The fact that the police did not identify the primary suspect is what matters most in this instance, but what happened next is what made the case turn. Josh's second friend turned up at the police station with a confession. She had been driving him about town for the previous week to assist him get around. He left his bag in the back seat one day, and the teenager and her mother peered inside, where they discovered a phone in the gallery and several more ATM receipts. They also discovered a picture in which Josh is allegedly brandishing a gun for the police. Detectives were already concerned that the suspect may attack someone else while they were looking for him, and now that they knew his phone was also armed, their concerns were only raised. The officers pleaded with Josh's girlfriend to go with them and meet them with a tape recorder so they could record Josh. They would try to persuade him to discuss what he had done to Mindy, but the girl was too terrified and soon refused. She was compelled to participate despite her will nevertheless. On September 2nd, Josh showed up at her house and started yelling at her to give him her backpack. 
She had to quickly come up with an explanation after realizing she didn't have the backpack since the young woman had delivered it to the police. The young woman declined Josh's request to be taken somewhere far from here where he could escape the cops. She offered to let him remain at her house, but Josh fled since he felt uneasy. She decided to follow him covertly in her car and call the detectives along the way after realizing that she would now be safe until the cops caught the man. Josh eventually arrived at the residence of his friend and entered. Police SWAT and the FBI had already started to arrive on the area by that point. Everyone was concerned that the suspect would not give himself up without a fight, and utilizing force, those concerns came true. Josh held two persons hostage who were also there in the home. But after several hours of negotiation, a lawyer was able to persuade Josh to let up. He rarely spoke to the authorities during the interview, but the detectives were slow to accuse him of killing Mindy. Josh was only charged with swiping Mindy's bank card because at that point, they already believed the woman was most likely dead, but they couldn't prove it without her body. As a result, the FBI agent decided to get crafty. He recounted the accusations made against Josh and said they were all false. When Mindy went to the police to report the card theft, the investigator said that they had evidence that he was the one who had taken the money from someone else's card. The suspect became upset when he heard this and questioned what games they were trying to play with him. The FBI agent was ultimately persuaded by Josh's response that Mindy had been murdered, but the police still needed to locate Mindy's body in order to accuse Josh of the crime. They had no possibility of locating Mindy's remains if they became buried in the snow because it had started snowing early in that region. About a hundred miles away from Anchorage, in the vicinity of the town of Wasila, an electrician called the police on September 13th. He saw a woman's body in a wooded area and knew it was Mindy at once. The lab's experts verified that the deceased was in fact Mindy. The woman had been shot in the back of the head, according to the medical assessment, and her body had been burned to death. When the bullet was found, it was discovered that Josh had been captured using the same firearm that had fired the shot. The only thing left for the cops to do was to reconstruct the sequence of events that resulted in Mindy's demise. The specialists continued to search every square inch of her home for signs of Josh's presence in the interim. It was incredibly challenging to perform. They had to gather almost every hair from Mindy's home's floor and test it in the lab. Months passed but ultimately was successful in locating a hair that belonged to Josh. The detectives now had concrete evidence that the suspect was present in the victim's home on May 18, 2008, ten months after the murder, thanks to DNA tests that had proved this. Josh's ex-girlfriend Lisa, who had recognized him from a picture of him next to an ATM, declined to appear in court, which created an unusual situation as the prosecution gathered witnesses to testify against Josh. She frequently visited her ex-boyfriend incarcerated, and the duo once declared their investigators were surprised by this turn of events because they had intended to help Mary, but they soon recognized what was going on. Family members are not allowed to testify against one another under the U.S. Constitution, and Josh likely persuaded Lisa to marry him for this reason. There was just one issue. The marriage was quickly deemed null and void after it was consummated. Marriages between inmates were forbidden by the estate law. However, the investigators questioned Josh's extreme behavior in protecting Lisa from interrogation and testimony. Was it actually? Investigators tried to talk to the young woman but initially were unsuccessful. However, eventually Lisa herself contacted them and claimed that Josh confessed to her about the murder during one of her visits to the prison. According to Josh's story, there was a party at his house on Friday night, and Josh, who had no other means of support, decided to sneak into the house next. The young woman was likely aware of a lot more information. Josh flung open the door to the home and started looking around for valuables. He suddenly understood that if he continued to let Mindy live at this point, he would not be able to avoid going to jail. He seized the woman, led her to the restroom, and bound her hands since he didn't want to go back there. The criminal then went to his house to grab a gun, while also taking a few useful items to utilize in the kidnapping. He wrapped her legs in sacks and duct taped them before going back to Mindy's house. He then brought the woman to the garage, put her in his own car, and drove out of town, leaving no trail. After a half hour of driving, he pulled off in a wooded area and took Mindy off the road, where he killed her. 
Josh then left her home after cleaning and vacuuming the carpet. The trial didn't start until the following spring. In exchange for Josh confessing to killing Mindy and another lady seven years prior, the prosecution agreed to drop the death penalty. Josh concurred because the goal was to resolve two prominent cases simultaneously. Consequently, at the reading of the sentence, he was given a prison term of 99 years without the possibility of parole. Josh sobbed, but at one point the judge called him a coward for stealing the lives of two ladies, which caused things to get hot. What about the man I killed? yelled the criminal as he leaped to his feet. Right now, his before he could continue speaking, attorneys seized him and put him to quiet. Until Josh himself gave authorities a fresh agreement in 2014, those yells kept the detectives busy for five long years. He consented to tell the truth about killing three guys in exchange for being moved from a local to a federal jail. Given that the criminal's request was so trivial, it appears that the standards were much higher there. The government agreed. Josh claimed that in 1994, when he was just 14 years old, he killed one man in Anchorage. In 1999, he committed murder and killed a third man. The first two guys had been recognized a year later. On the same day, he killed the woman, but the third man's name is still unknown. Josh was definitely engaged in the killings, but the real concern for the investigators is whether he has any additional crimes to his credit that he is keeping quiet about. In any case, the authorities were able to permanently cut him off from society and stop the other murders that were certain to occur. Share your opinion on the story in the comments and don't forget to like it if you like the video. Thanks for watching. A woman's body was discovered in her own house. When the police began their investigation, they discovered several worrying leads. The more they investigated the case, the stranger and more terrifying the information became. They eventually learned the truth after a number of years, but nobody anticipated this turn of events. On March 29, 1948, Karen Gregory was born in Albany, New York. She was the oldest of four children, and from a young age she assisted her parents in caring for her siblings. The girl loved nature and spent a lot of time in the outdoors. She also enjoyed sports. After graduating from high school, she wanted to work in the field of art. Karen enrolled at Rochester's Nazareth College, where she graduated with a Bachelor of Arts and a Bachelor of Science. She then spent some time teaching art in an elementary school before deciding to pursue a career as a graphic designer. She relocated to Florida in 1983 when she was 35 years old, where she met David McKee. He was a manager for a company that offered Vietnam War veterans consulting services and he and Karen quickly grew close. The two were attracted to one another and dated for just over a year before David asked her to move in with him in Gulfport in the spring of 1984. Before this, Karen commuted frequently to David's home because she shared an apartment with a friend. On May 22nd, the woman accepted this offer and started gradually moving her belongings there. Karen finally packed up her apartment and left it empty after taking the last of her possessions. She admitted to being a little anxious to her neighbor. In order to speak at a conference, David had to travel to another state for work, and she would have to stay alone in his home for a full week. The woman left the apartment and went to her friend's home. There, they had a great time. Karen expressed to her friend how content she was with David and how happy she was to finally be moving in with him. After the friends finished talking around midnight, Karen went to David's house he made several calls home the following day, but no one picked up. He called Karen's neighbor because he believed she might still be living in her old apartment, but the woman claimed she hadn't seen Karen in a while. David contacted Karen's sister and a few of her friends the following day, but none of them had seen her. All day long, he tried to get in touch with her, but he never heard back. In an effort to reach Karen before she left for work on May 24th, David called the house once more in the early morning hours. However, there was still no response. He called her boss later and learned that she hadn't arrived for work. David was now extremely worried and worried that something bad might have happened to Karen. Contacted the neighborhood hospitals and police departments to ask if they had seen anyone resembling Karen's description. He made the decision to call his neighbor Amy after learning that they had nodded. 
Amy looked out the window and answered in the affirmative as Karen's car parked in front of the residence. David's worry was only increased by this. He instructed Amy to visit the residence and rap on the door. He remained on the phone with her until she left to carry out his request because he was so anxious. There was no response when Amy knocked on the side door. She then circled the house and noticed that a window was open. Karen's name was repeatedly called out, but no one answered. When she pulled back the curtain and put her arm through the open window, she was astounded by what she discovered. She could see the hallway from the bedroom window where a woman's bloodied body was lying on the floor. Amy was hidden behind a wall and couldn't see the face, but she recognized the person as Karen, who, after she recovered from her shock, ran back to her own home where David was, keeping the call going. Before hanging up and dialing 911, she grabbed the phone and told him that something terrible had happened. Rapidly arriving medical personnel could only confirm Karen's demise. Due to the amount of blood throughout the house, even seasoned police officers were horrified as detectives started their investigation. Karen had fought her assailant all the way to the end. From the hallway to the front door, there were bloodstains. Several pieces of broken glass were scattered around. Investigators discovered that several hair strands matched. Karen's hair color was ingrained in the shattered glass. They hypothesized that she almost made it outside before her attacker cornered her in the restroom. A bloody footprint on the floor gave investigators their first indication of the crime. There were no bloodstains on Karen's feet, so the police concluded that Karen's killer was responsible for the footprint. The killer was in the bathroom, but it was not clear why he was barefoot. Police requested any information regarding a black Ford Ranger pickup truck they were searching for. They made it clear that no conclusions should be made just yet because the driver's involvement in the young woman's disappearance has not been established. Additionally, the sheriff made a 24-hour tip line announcement. A separate number had to be assigned. On the sixth day, when the number of calls had surpassed several hundred, police made an announcement that they were recruiting volunteers to search the area. People are divided into groups and assembly points are set up. The volunteer's task was to search the area for anything that might be relevant, and this time, Bangor and Old Town, two nearby towns, were included in the search area. The police called received more than 500 responses. About 400 people from the area were present, along with 100 professionals from different counties. There were horse-drawn and off-road vehicle search parties. The authorities tried to use every resource they could, given the size of the operation and the challenging terrain. They even used aerial photography in the hopes that the footage might reveal information useful to the investigation. The police made a depressing announcement the day after the search, precisely one week after Nicole went missing. The body of the young woman was discovered nearby Old Town in a wooded area not far from Road 43. They had no pressing need to release any information, stating only that a service dog found the body, which was covered in branches. The police soon disclosed that they were investigating a homicide, and the following day, May 20th, they reported the arrest of a suspect. It turned out to be Kyle Dewey, a 20-year-old local. At the time, no information was available, and the public was kept in the dark for a while. He was formally charged with premeditated murder the following day. It was later discovered that he was already in prison when he was arrested. Prison. For evading the police and a motorcycle accident last year, the man had received a 90-day prison sentence. Kyle had been on the outside until three days before Nicole's body was found, when he started serving his sentence. The young lady had known Kyle for several months, according to her friends. She complained to several friends that Kyle had tried to kiss her the day before she vanished and that Nicole had to put up a fierce struggle to stop him. It was well known that he had custody of his four-year-old daughter, and resided with his parents. In a detion, Kyle was seeing Sarah, an 18-year-old girl, and he worked for a nearby provider of disability care. The judge agreed to his attorney's request for a preliminary hearing to take place behind closed doors. The judge's decision was criticized as a result of the public and media not having access to information about the case. Several hundred locals gathered before Nicole's funeral on May 26th to pay tribute to her memory by launching a judge eventually lifted the public disclosure ban on the case a few days after the funeral as a result of public pressure. 
and some disturbing details were revealed. Police first discovered that Kyle's computer was used to register the fake Facebook account and that his IP address was used for all subsequent sessions. As a result, Kyle was responsible for tricking her out of the house just before the murder, and the medical examiner's report made it abundantly clear that the young woman had passed away on the day of the murder. Kyle's brother and his girlfriend, whom the suspect was dating according to Sarah, whom the suspect was dating, Kyle confessed to her about the murder a few days after it occurred, were two of the police's key witnesses at the time of Sarah's disappearance. This took place right away after Sarah was summoned for questioning. She realized that although there was no proof, the police had suspicions about Kyle. He was questioned as well, but he responded that the day the young woman vanished, he was at work. Kyle informed his brother that Nicole was drawn to the the man intended to make it appear, as though Brian Butterfield had abducted her and was holding her captive in a remote location using a false Facebook account. The young woman, Kyle thought, would fall in love with her savior if he could find her and free her. To put it mildly, it all sounds odd, but there is more to come. Just keep in mind that this is the perpetrator's brother reported account. The subsequent sequence of events went as follows. Kyle enticed Nicole to a remote area along Hudson Road. When Nicole arrived at the designated location, he was already there waiting for her, hiding in the bushes, his face covered by a ski hat. Her head was taped after he pounced on her, loaded her into his father's black Ford Ranger pickup truck and drove off. He said the car was parked close by. Kyle took her away from the scene of the kidnapping. The young woman showed no signs of life as he started to pull her out of the vehicle. When he realized that the duct tape was preventing her from breathing, she died. In a panic, he made the decision to keep his girlfriend from finding the body. Kyle repeated the tale while supplying more information. He claimed that on the way back to his house, he stripped Nicole of nearly all of her clothing and threw her out the window before hiding the body. This was done to ensure that his DNA would not be discovered by the police. The young woman's belongings, including several pieces of clothing, were discovered by the police. Almost exactly where Kyle had attacked Nicole was where they were. The crucial detail in this situation was that Kyle told his girlfriend almost exactly where he had struck her. The reason the police were able to find Nicole's body in the body was because Sarah went to them and gave them the whole story. Despite Kyle's refusal to accept responsibility, the situation was not in Kyle's favor when the police learned the full scope of the medical examination and more damning evidence arose against the suspect. Kyle's DNA sample was precisely matched by blood that was discovered under Nicole's fingernails. A few days after the murder, the boy was interrogated and there were deep scratches on his face. Attributed to a workplace injury he had, the injuries to the young woman's neck also provided further proof that strangulation was the cause of her death. This contradicted Kyle's claims that if he had taped the victim's mouth, there wouldn't have been any such injuries, as he told his brother and the young woman. The trial dragged on because his attorney asked for a psychological assessment, but an intriguing thing occurred a few months after his arrest. After a stolen gun was discovered in Kyle's house, he was charged with theft. The man had previously been detained for robbery on several occasions, but each time he was released after paying a fine, a trial was scheduled for February 2015 after an examination revealed Kyle to be entirely sane. The defendant was in custody prior to the start of the trial while awaiting trial. The correctional officer where Kyle reported to serve a sentence for eluding police and a motorcycle accident was one of the witnesses whose testimony Kyle's attorney sought to have removed from the case file. Kyle was there to serve a sentence. The officer claimed that the man was acting extremely anxious and even crying when questioned the cause of his anxiety. It's not about the time limit. It's about what else I've done, Kyle allegedly said. The case started on February 22, 2015. According to Kyle's attorney, his client is not guilty of the murder and the investigation was totally biased. He was at home, the defense claims, and Nicole was attacked by someone else while he was away. Sarah, Kyle's girlfriend, was mentioned as a potential suspect. Nicole was allegedly hated by Sarah because of Nicole's relationship with Kyle. The attorney asserted that she had access to Kyle's computer 
and used it to set up a phony account on which to blame her boyfriend for the murder. This theory was unsupported by any evidence and was in conflict with the facts. Kyle used both his computer and his phone to access the fake account. Additionally, he changed his personal account to a fake one by logging in via one app. As a result, it was obvious when he logged out of one account and into another right away. Sarah was also not supported by any physical evidence, unlike Kyle, whose DNA was found on the victim's clothes, which the murderer threw away on his way home, as well as under her fingernails. The following witness was the actual Brian Butterfield, who claimed that Kyle had been angry with him for a long time because Brian had dated his ex-girlfriend. He believed that this was what prompted Kyle to set up a phony account in his name so that he could later use it to frame the young man. The prosecution also provided correspondence screenshots demonstrating that Kyle was speaking with both Nicole and other young women underage. The next witness was Kyle's coworker, who we worked with at a disability care business. The defense attorney for the defendant insisted that Kyle's face scratches developed while he was at work, but the witness refuted this. In accordance with his account, he and Kyle were at the residence of a woman who was afflicted with mental illness on May 11th and 12th. She attacked Kyle at one point when she became irate, leaving several scratches near his eye on his face. Kyle sought assistance at the hospital, but was informed the following day, May 13th, on his face, a co-worker notices fresh scars. This took place immediately after Nicole vanished. Another co-worker claimed that Kyle left the office at around 9 p.m. on the day Nicole vanished, and, despite being on duty all night, did not return until 6 in the morning. He also requested that no one be informed of his absence at the same time. Four prisoners who Kyle had interacted with, while detained pending trial, were also called before the court. They all claimed that Kyle had told them he had killed the woman. He strangled her while giving the impression to others that it was an accident. He acknowledged that he had initially intended to carry out the crime. The testimony of an inmate named Scott Ford, who had spent the majority of his life behind bars and had a reputation for being knowledgeable about the legal system, was even more fascinating. Kyle decided to ask about the best way for him to get away with his crime after being in touch with him for a while. Then, Kyle penned several versions of what had transpired in the coal on paper and handed the all of these accounts shared one thing in common. Kyle acknowledged that he had set up a false account and tricked Nicole into going to a deserted area, but he went on to give various accounts of what had happened. He initially claimed that his initial plan had been to simply kidnap her before rescuing her. However, he refused to accept duct tape, and the young woman died as a result. Nicole reportedly fainted from fear after being startled out of the bushes, according to him. Kyle drove while taping her mouth shut. He took her out of town and found she had no pulse. Another explanation was that he neglected to use the duct tape and the girl died in vain. According to a different account, the cow jumped out of the bushes and grabbed her torso before realizing that he had actually squeezed her throat, which caused her to pass out. As we can see, each of these tales appeared to be completely illogical, but they all contain information that will be extremely helpful for the investigation. Kyle went into great detail about where and how he attacked her and where he hid. He not only described the body, but also the precise spot where while wearing a ski mask, he had attacked the young woman. Only the murderer would have known these details since they were all kept a secret until the trial started. When the sheets were examined by experts, they discovered Kyle's DNA and fingerprints. The trial had its share of challenges. Kyle's younger brother, who had testified against him in court two years earlier, started to dispute the assertion that he had admitted to the killing. The difficulty lay in the brother had meticulously documented everything that had occurred, information that he could only have obtained from Kyle. Kyle was the only person who remained silent throughout the entire trial. Even when testifying for himself, he refused. He was given the opportunity to accept a deal from the investigation in which he would receive a lighter sentence for confessing, but he turned it down. The final court hearing, where the decision was made, took place on March 6, 2016. Kyle was found responsible for Nicole's deliberate murder. His family members and lawyer attempted because of his age and the fact that he had a young daughter 
but the judge would not impose a lighter sentence. For both the murder and the kidnapping, Kylie was sentenced to 60 years in prison. The judge stated during the closing arguments that Kyle's guilt in the case was obvious and that the evidence against him was overwhelming. He fabricated several different accounts of what occurred and made every effort to get out of jail rather than expressing regret and confessing. The court declined to commute his sentence because of this. The judge was also inclined to think that Kyle had. He had been working on a plan for weeks, a plan to kill Nicole. The Goal's parents praised the sentence as just and expressed their desire for him to never be released from prison again. They also spoke about the risks of social media, using the murder of their daughter as an example, in a number of interviews and appearances on different television programs. They believed that if the perpetrator had not been given the chance to impersonate someone else online, the tragedy might have been prevented. However, Kyle has supporters. Even without fake accounts, we could eventually reach the point of murder. Share your opinion on this story in the comments and don't forget to like it. Thanks for watching. A woman was traveling home when she mysteriously vanished. Her friends started looking, and the police eventually joined them. Everyone hoped she would be okay and go home soon. But within a few days, such horrific details about the case came to light that even seasoned detectives were taken aback. We'll explain what happened to Gemma McCluskey today and why this case shocked the entire nation of Britain. On February 5th, 1983, McCluskey was born in England. She was raised in a big family. In her teenage years, the girl had two older brothers and devoted parents. Gemma, she made the decision to give acting a shot and in 1997 she was given a few bit parts. She was offered a part in EastEnders, one of the most well-known British TV shows, in 2000 when she was just 17 years old. Gemma made an appearance in over 30 episodes in total. After that, her mother fell seriously ill, and someone had to take care of her, forcing her to temporarily give up her acting career. After receiving a successful operation to remove a brain tumor, the woman unfortunately developed an infection during the procedure that was not curable. Gemma has since shared an apartment with her mother and Tony, her brother. Her brother looked after their mother while she was at work. She worked as a waitress in a number of bars and clubs. When Gemma was 29 years old in March 2012, she was taking care of her mother, going to work, and occasionally hanging out with friends as usual. However, one day, her friends noticed that they couldn't get in touch with her because she never picked up the phone, didn't reply to social media messages and didn't show up online. Her friends were numerous, and they they realized there was a problem right away and that Gemma hadn't been seen in a few days. Gemma had not been seen or heard from since their last meeting with her friend Erica on March 1st. Her brother visited the club where she was scheduled to work on March 3rd but the staff reported that Gemma had not arrived. Tony and his brother Danny made the decision to call the police at that point. They didn't believe that their sister had just left on them because they knew she would never abandon their ailing mother without giving them prior notice. After receiving a report of a missing person, our own investigators questioned Tony first because he lived with Gemma and may have been the last person to see her. Tony's testimony was crucial. There was a problem, though. Tony had been using marijuana regularly for many years, and his addiction was well known to the family. He couldn't even recall the exact day he last saw her. As a result of this habit, he was constantly having memory and concentration issues. After seeing Gemma, he also remembered seeing his sister on March 1st. He had smoked a lot of marijuana, as usual and nearly filled the apartment with water. Fortunately, Gemma was home and turned off the water after Tony decided to fill the bathtub and promptly forgot about it. She left the apartment after that to meet her friend Erica. Around six o'clock, according to Tony, is when he claimed to have left, and his sister remained unaccounted for. When Gemma and Erica talked about the bathtub incident, Gemma once more expressed her frustration with her brother's actions. He was a window washer by trade, but he despite being 35 years old, he spent almost all of his money on marijuana, 
and Gemma frequently felt like she had to constantly take care of him. After reporting the incident to the police the following day, Erica met Tony to go over the situation once more and attempt to come up with a theory as to where Tony's sister might have gone. The man, who was depressed, frequently broke down in tears and held himself responsible for what had occurred. He claimed that as a result of the bathtub incident, Gemma had once more lost faith in him. His addiction had already upset his family members before. Gemma's friends turned to the neighborhood paper in the meantime and asked to write about her disappearance. Journalists interviewed Gemma's brother and produced an article. Everyone hoped that news coverage would help identify any potential witnesses to the woman's appearance on March 5th. The cousins of Gemma made the choice to plan extensive searches. They attracted a large number of volunteers who combed the street and distributed flyers. In an effort to find leads, the sisters also actively shared information on social media. They did get their first lead on March 6th, but it wasn't what they were hoping for. In a call from an unknown number, Tony was instructed to bring two million pounds sterling to the Benefit Railway Station outside of London if he wanted to see his sister alive. Shortly after, the same unidentified caller made a second call and instructed him to bring 500 in Iraqi currency in addition to the money. On the third call that followed, the unidentified caller threatened to kill Gemma if they didn't get the money. Tony called his sister and asked to speak to her, but the caller informed him that she was locked in another room and that she frequently experienced violence. So he advised Tony to get the money out quickly. Danny, the other brother of the missing woman, was also called by the same person. Despite the fact that the number was concealed in each case, the police made an effort to track these calls. They were able to locate the caller, Sam Dunn, a 19-year-old Kent County resident, very quickly. His house was not far from the railroad. A judge issued a search warrant for Dunn's home after the caller's station where the money was ordered to be brought, and Dunn was taken into custody. The boy later admitted during questioning that he and his friends saw a post on social media about the woman's disappearance and decided to play a joke. So the police quickly came to the conclusion that the boy had nothing to do with Genesis' appearance. There were two numbers, Tony and Danny, but investigators soon found that this story also contained errors. The young man claimed the calls were he was merely seated next to him and had made something for him. The police were able to identify the caller as Sam and were unable to locate any additional parties. The court disapproved of the boy's joke as a result, and the boy was given a six-month prison term. Once more, the detectives lacked any leads. By reconstructing the events of that day, they were able to determine that Gemma left Erica's apartment around 1.17 p.m. and went home. She made several calls to Tony along the way and got home at 1.50 p.m. The CCTV footage proved this. Even though the police were almost certain that Gemma had been kidnapped by the time her phone was turned off after 18 minutes and had since been turned on, there was something odd about the timing of her movements. How could he have done that 18 minutes after the woman arrived home if, as is most likely the case, her kidnapper had turned off her phone? The most likely scenario was that Gemma was attacked inside her apartment, but Tony was present and their mother was in the hospital at the time. Investigators discovered a concerning conclusion. Could her brother be involved in her disappearance in some way? He smoked a lot of marijuana, and people who have serious addictions are frequently capable of monstrous acts. After further investigation, detectives discovered that Gemma's sister and mother had reported Tony to the police on numerous occasions because he occasionally displayed aggressive behavior and even attacked Gemma. Questions were also raised about the brothers' actions during the investigation. While the friends of Danny and Gemma were actively searching, Tony sat at home and expressed his hopes for return of Gemma and wanted to be at home in case she did. He only joined the surge once the case started to receive attention from major TV networks. Police contacted him once more in an effort to elicit more detailed information about what transpired that day. Tony claimed that he last saw his sister between 1.30 a.m. and 3 p.m and that she left after that because her phone was turned off at 2.8 p.m. His account raised doubts. However, Tony was under the influence of marijuana almost constantly, so relying on his memory would not be prudent. Unbiased on March 6th, five days after Gemma vanished, 
there was a very alarming development in the case. A suitcase struck a boatman as he was navigating a London canal at some point. It opened after the collision, and the stunned boatman saw what was inside. Inside was a body of a person. Upon closer inspection, experts discovered that the torso was missing its head legs, and arms. The lower back of the body belonged to a woman and bore a bow tattoo that matched Gemma's. Investigators immediately requested DNA testing to determine they used DNA from her toothbrush to fully match the body and identify it. Gemma McCluskey was the deceased. The woman's death and the horrifying information that her body was discovered in a suitcase shocked her family and friends. Nobody could understand how she could have experienced something so terrible. Everyone was waiting for the police to solve the murder case they were currently handling. They issued a resounding statement on March 7th. The very next day, researchers revealed that Tony McCluskey had been detained on a murder suspicion. He was unable to recall the events of that day, and his odd actions while looking for Gemma indicated that he was not at all interested in doing so and that he knew she had already passed away. Tony was the most likely suspect due to the circumstances surrounding her disappearance as well. Police believed that he may have snapped and killed his sister using large amounts of marijuana given that they had a fight that day over the overflowing bathtub and he was known to have an addiction. This over time can cause severe mental issues and a person is fully capable of committing impulsive crimes. Detectives grew more certain that Tony might be the murderer during the initial interrogation. He didn't dispute his guilt or that his sister was murdered. Instead, he simply replied, no comment. Investigators looked through his smartphone and discovered messages from his sister. He sent Gemma a message the day after she vanished with the words, I love you, and a few other sentiments. He wrote Jim, call me when you get this message several hours later. What will we be eating tonight? Do you have work tonight? Detectives discovered a peculiar fact. Despite years of correspondence with his sister, he never once confessed his love for her. Instead, he wrote to his girlfriend the day after his sister vanished to apologize for not writing the previous evening. All of this did not indicate his guilt, but the police soon discovered much more compelling evidence. They discovered that on the day that Gemma vanished, Tony used a false name to order a taxi to a location close to the house. Tom discovered the route from the company's detectives after they reviewed footage from nearby security cameras. They could see Tony putting a sizable suitcase in the trunk of the car in the opening frames of the video that was recorded during the man's taxi ride. It was evidently very weighty and the driver's testimony supported this assertion. He inquired about the contents of the suitcase after observing the man attempting to lift it. It was, according to Tony, a sizable music system. He requested to be taken to the canal side street where his sister's body would eventually be discovered. After questioning the neighborhood residents, the police identified one witness, a student who was on her apartment's balcony when she noticed a man dragging a sizable suitcase toward the canal. When experts looked at the taxi truck, they discovered blood traces. It was identified as belonging to Gemma by DNA testing. Detectives were convinced Tony was transporting the same suitcase that contained his sister's body after gathering these clues, and on March 10th he was arrested, accused of murder. When the police searched their apartment, they discovered even more concerning evidence, a knife with barely perceptible blood traces, as well as blood stains in the bathroom that they had attempted to remove. All of this pointed to the woman being murdered in her own home, but one particular incident left the detectives with some unanswered questions. There should have been a lot more blood, as the woman's head arms, and legs had been severed from her body. The drainage pipes in the entire house were examined by experts, but they did not. They thought Tony may have laid something like plastic wrap or a tarp on the bathroom floor before gradually disposing of the blood with a lot of cleaning supplies after discovering noticeable blood traces there. Tony was observed purchasing trash bags the day after the murder on store security cameras. Investigators believed that he could use them to remove the body remaining components from the house. Soon after this version was verified, divers who kept searching the canal discovered bags with legs and arms there without DNA testing. The fact that they belonged to Gemma was already known to all, 
and later laboratory experts could only confirm this. Investigators changed their strategy because Tony resisted speaking to them despite having a substantial body of evidence against him. The police showed his father surveillance footage that showed Tony loading the suitcase into the taxi's trunk on the day Gemma was killed. The father agreed to speak with his son in an effort to obtain a confession because he was certain that he was responsible for the murder. However, it only partially succeeded during Tony explained what had happened that day to his father during the conversation. He claimed that Gemma came home and ignited the argument over the overflowing bathtub by pleading with her brother to vacate her apartment. Gemma allegedly grabbed a knife when Tony made the decision to go to his room and Tony lost all memory of what happened after that. The story sounded like an attempt to shift responsibility for the murder, so the investigators didn't believe it for a second and kept looking for more proof. Police discovered Gemma's head on March 9th and finally, experts were able to identify the cause of death because it occurred in the same canal. The injuries on the woman matched the kitchen knife discovered in her apartment and she had sustained several blows from a sharp object. Detectives have since been working to prepare the case for trial, and Tony has been detained. The victim's brother gradually started to admit his guilt throughout the nearly one-year trial. He wrote to his father frequently, but he insisted that he couldn't recall the murder's final moments. Acknowledged guilt for killing a sister, he claimed that he went into a virtual coma and lost control during the argument. Tony insisted that he never intended for his sister to pass away and that he is incapable of acting in such a way while being rational. The court case started in January 2013. The prosecution thought Tommy became enraged when his sister asked him to leave the apartment during their argument. He simply wouldn't have had enough money to rent his own place given his propensity for marijuana. Perhaps this had an impact, significant part in what followed. The prosecution asserted that Tony fatally stabbed his sister after doing so. Based on the expert's findings, he took the body to the bathroom, laid down something akin to a tarp there, and used CCTV to dismember it there. Gemma's torso was placed in a suitcase and dumped into the canal by Tony. After that, he made several trips with garbage bags filled with additional body parts and other pieces of evidence, some of which he also threw into the water. His father was unable to bear to even listen. He left the courtroom to put an end to it all, and he didn't come back until they had finished talking about the specifics of his daughter's murder. Although Tony didn't remember it at all, he acknowledged that he most likely killed Gemma. He claimed that it might have been self-defense after his sister allegedly yelled at him while holding a knife. He did not know what happened next. His explanation was viewed as a blatant lie by the prosecution. An invited witness, a psychotherapist, stated that memory loss brought on by marijuana use is extremely rare and additionally, Tony had a clear plan to dispose of the body in order to conceal what he had done. Even though shock and amnesia should have subsided quickly, it took him many hours. In addition to dismembering her body and scattering the pieces throughout the canal, he also dialed a taxi under a false name and scrubbed the bathroom floor thoroughly afterward. All of this suggested that Tony was conscious of his actions and had a strategy to avoid punishment by destroying all evidence. Gemma's early years in court a friend also gave a testimony in which she disclosed that from a young age, her brother had been beating and humiliating her. Gemma occasionally had to cover up the signs of physical abuse with sunglasses. The witness claimed that Tony had no feelings for his sister and had always hated her. Only because it was convenient for him did he move in with her and their mother. He didn't even have to buy food or pay rent. Tony's lifestyle was ideal for him because he spent almost all of his income on marijuana. However, when his sister attempted to evict him, he lost it and murdered her. Tony was found guilty of murder by the jury after the trial's conclusion on January 30th. He was given a life sentence with the option of parole after 20 years. The victim's body was disposed of like a true maniac, the judge said in his closing remarks and it appeared that Tony hoped it would never be discovered. There was no indication that the murderer felt regret for what he had done because he exhibited no emotion during the reading of the verdict or the trial itself. After Tony started serving his sentence, he was moved to a different prison because someone had set a price on his head. 
another. It is unknown if this had anything to do with Gemma's murder or if he had argued with some other prisoners. After making an effort to stand by his son during the entire trial, Tony's father ultimately made the decision to stop communicating with him. The man claimed that he could not abandon Tony because he was his own son and he would lose two children at once. However, in the end, the man realized that Tony had no remorse for what he had done. Even then Tony did not seem to have any strong feelings. It seemed that his own family did not matter to him at all. Their mother passed away the same year that Tony didn't care about his own sister at all. The worst part is that none of this can be attributed to drug abuse. He had been abusing and humiliating Gemma since she was a young child, so there is no excuse for what he did. The realization of what kind of monster Tony is forces Tony's brother and father to live with that realization for the rest of their lives. Genuinely is. Feel free share your opinion on this story in the comments and don't forget to like it. Thanks for watching. A young woman never made it home after leaving work with plans to pick up her son and take him shopping. Her abandoned automobile was discovered five hours later, the door open, headlights on, and engine running, close to another town. When the truth was eventually revealed, the police launched a search and the case quickly took a very unexpected turn. Even seasoned investigators were taken aback. They had not anticipated finding the truth in the manner that they did nor did they anticipate such a resolution. On October 27, 1972, in the American city of Decatur, Illinois, Karen Slover was born. She met Michael Slover, her future husband, at Richland Community College after graduating from high school. Their son Colton was born less than a year after they were married in 1992, following their time in college. The pair had to put in a lot of work to provide for their child's needs, as well as their own. Karen had to return to work a few days after giving birth because of this. Michael spent the most of his working days with his parents, who had volunteered to look after the child. Karen worked at a number of different places over the ensuing years before settling on the local newspaper, worked in the advertising division, was able to rapidly establish her rapport with the team, and was generally happy with her position. The pair's relationship started to go south a few years after the birth of their son. Karen told acquaintances that Michael would frequently lose his cool and strike her when they were arguing. She chose to seek for divorce as a result, and the court granted her custody of Colton. Nevertheless, her pay from the newspaper did not allow her to employ a babysitter for her child, thus she was unable to do so. The parents of Michael consented to go on, covering for her at work while she was with him. She started dating David Swan after the divorce. The two of them lived apart, but they were in regular contact. In 1996, when her kid was three years old, Swan and her son got along well and had no significant issues in their connection. Karen started to consider relocating to a different location and attempting a career as a model. She began searching for positions that would suit her needs, and shortly after she got an invitation from a significant modeling agency in Georgia. The relocation had been much anticipated by her. But on September 27th, she worked at the editorial office until the very last minute to save money for her first date with her son. At approximately 5 o'clock in the evening, Karen told her co-workers that she would be picking up Colton from his grandparents and taking him to the mall. Karen never picked up her son that evening, despite the woman's plans to attend her acquaintance's wedding and her desire to purchase a suitable attire. The woman went gone for several hours, at this point. She didn't get in touch with roughly 10 p.m. That evening, a patrolman in the vicinity of Champaign, Illinois, saw a suspicious-looking vehicle parked on the shoulder of Highway 72. The headlights were on, the engine was running, and the driver's door was open. When the police got closer, he saw that no one was inside the car or in the vicinity, contrary to his first assumption that the driver was attempting to address the car's issues. The cops discovered Karen's documents in a woman's purse inside the vehicle, a box of food from a cafe and a half-eaten chocolate bar. Everything suggested that the woman had just gotten out of the car and was going to be back any moment, but she was nowhere to be seen. When the police looked up the license plates on the vehicle, they discovered David Swan was the owner. When he got in touch with him, 
he found out that Karen had borrowed the man's car while hers was being fixed. According to him, the mother was scheduled to pick up her son from her grandparents that evening, so as the automobile was being brought to the police station, investigators went to their house. Police station, where it was examined more thoroughly by the forensic specialists. The woman was scheduled to arrive soon after work, according to the parents of Karen's ex-husband, but she didn't show up at all during the day. There was still Colton, and his mother could not have abandoned him. The police started to think that the automobile theft did not go through as planned, or that the woman might have been taken. The placement of the car was determined to be inconsistent with the events of that evening, which was observed by detectives right away. Karen went to her after leaving the office. Before heading to the store, Osmond used to live with his parents. She had the wisdom to find her automobile about 60 kilometers away. This implied that a criminal might have placed the car there in an attempt to confound authorities. The woman herself had to pick up her kid and get ready for a wedding that was scheduled for the following day, so she could not have ended up close to another city. As experts searched the vehicle for any traces, such fingerprints, police chose to speak with staff members at shops, salons, and hair salons. Prescience. They went there the following day and showed them pictures of Karen, but nobody had seen her. Although fingerprints were not found in the car, forensic specialists thought something was off. Cement residues were discovered on the passenger seat, although Ash David Swan said they weren't there when he gave the car to his girlfriend. Questions were also raised when multiple tall grass stocks were discovered in the salon. There were a few loose coins inside the automobile, which was parked on an unvegetated section of the road. However, it did not produce a lot of credible leads. Following word of Karen's disappearance, friends, family, and co-workers launched extensive searches. While some groups went door-to-door -door in the city, others put out flyers along the route where her car was discovered. The women worked for a newspaper, and the management offered a prize of $10,000 for information leading to her location. However, as of October 1st, none of this worked. After receiving a worrisome call, Fishermen observed the 50 kilometer from Decatur, on the coast of Lake Shelbyville, is a waste bag. They opted to carry it with them to dispose of later because they thought it odd that someone had left trash in such an abandoned area. The men soon discovered, though, that it was far from trash. The fishermen made the decision to examine the contents of the bag because it was heavy and well sealed with tape. The sight of a woman's head inside startled them. The moment the investigators realized that Karen might be the victim, they asked to see her dental records, prove her identity. Their suspicions were validated. The head really belonged to her. As this was going on, divers and police combed the water, quickly discovering multiple other bags containing additional portions of Karen's body. Medical professionals determined that the woman died from seven gunshot wounds. Following the unidentified perpetrator's dismemberment of her body, possibly with a gasoline saw, her body was placed in bags with an extra chunk of concrete added for weight. Investigators surmised that the murderer hurled the pieces from a lakeside bridge. They even discovered prints on the railings. But these fragments were insufficient for a comparative analysis. Even after a few more packages turned up and washed up on the coast in the days that followed, the authorities were still unable to locate every portion of the victim's body. Investigators deduced that the person who killed Karen was probably someone who knew the victim well and harbored hatred for her, given the ferocity of her murder. This clarified why the offender used a seven shots in all. Because of this, they started searching her close friends and acquaintances for potential possibilities. Detectives were informed by the woman's friends that her ex-husband had threatened and occasionally physically assaulted Karen during their disagreements. The detectives chose to question him after this immediately raised concerns. Michael claimed to have spent the entire day at his three jobs as a bar bouncer, a karate instructor, and a security guard at a supermarket store. The man left the business after his shift. He worked out at the gym right away at around 3 o'clock in the afternoon. He then went home, showered, and headed straight out to work at the bar. Upon thorough investigation, the man's account was found to be credible, 
and his alibi held up for the entire day. Michael was seen by many at all three of his jobs, and the investigator even noted the precise moment when Karen left work and her car was discovered. This gave Michael a strong alibi for the whole day and eliminated him from the investigation. As that happened, everything became a lot more intriguing. It was discovered that David Swan had been arrested for violence in the past and had also pretended to be a police officer. In addition, the man's mental health issues resulted in his being admitted to a mental health facility following the disappearance of his fiancée. He took an active part in the hunt and never passed up the chance to speak with reporters and do interviews. The police saw this as a little suspect action as David attempted to draw as much attention to himself as potential. They surmised that the man was attempting to avoid being suspected, which is common when the murderer is a close relative of the victim. This individual may be the most involved in the media, urging the authorities to apprehend the offender and maintaining a central position during the entire inquiry. David also gave false information to his acquaintances on his relationship with Karen. He informed them that they will soon tie the knot, but according to her pal, the couple had only been dating for a month and Karen wasn't even considering getting married. Investigators also discovered at this point that David was the owner of a chainsaw, which he occasionally used to butcher deer after hunting. Considering that Karen's body was mutilated in a like fashion, this served to confirm suspicions against him. Apart from that, the man had a gun the same caliber that was used to murder the deceased, but the biggest problem was that he had an alibi for the night the woman vanished. David was scheduled to serve as a chauffeur at his friend's wedding, but he arrived significantly late. Consequently, the man was without an alibi for approximately 45 minutes, during which time Karen was murdered. With everything taken into consideration, the investigators came very close to concluding that he was the murderer. The individual was interrogated for almost four hours in an attempt to extract a confession. The police heard something intriguing when he started to recount all he had done that night. After David claimed to have taken money out of an ATM, the detectives asked to see footage from the device's camera right away. They were shocked to learn that this narrative was true. David did take out a cash withdrawal at the time to complete his alibi. Immediately all suspicions were removed from the man since he was physically unable to kill Karen and drive the car to another city. The detectives had very much ran out of leads by this point. One additional action that might eventually lead them to the murderer was taken. In the city proper, tall grass like the kind in Karen's car was frequently discovered abandoned or on outskirts parcels of land. It was continuously cut down as mandated by law. The police spoke with locals as they strolled about the city's periphery, urging them to report any unusual activity they may have noticed. In an attempt to identify further suspects, the investigators persisted in questioning Karen's friends and family. It was revealed to them that the woman's relationship with her ex-mother-in-law had not always been cordial. Even though her grandson had a mother of his own, Jeanette Slover was quite close to him and did not want to part with him. The oddest revelation was still to come. Jeanette appeared to view Colton as her own child rather than her grandchild, and Karen occasionally had to physically remove him from their home. After learning that Jeanette had periodically given Colton the runaround, the police decided to re-interview Slover and get a closer look at her. Jeanette stated that she had spent the entire day at home with her grandson and that when Karen failed to arrive at the scheduled time, she attempted to contact her on their home phone. Moment, but the woman chose not to respond. After requesting call logs from their residence, the authorities discovered that Slover had never spoken to Karen on that particular day. Instead, their phone had made numerous outgoing calls to their son Michael's number. Less than an hour had passed since Karen's ex-father-in-law left the house to buy Colton toys at a nearby store, he told the police. Upon verifying this information, the inspectors discovered that the business had never carried toys made by that particular manufacturer. The man's absence around the time of Karen's death raised suspicions. The investigators started to take Slover's involvement seriously and even came up with a potential reason. Considering how devoted Jeanette was to Colton, 
the victim was preparing to relocate to another state to pursue a career as a model, and her son would have followed her. Theoretically, she might have killed him to prevent him from leaving her. It was also discovered by the investigators that Slover owned an automobile company. They had a sizable piece of property that was turned into a used car parking lot, but it has been mostly idle for a number of years. Similar to the ones that had been found in bags containing pieces of Karen's remains, the area was strewn with broken concrete blocks when the police arrived after obtaining a search warrant. The detectives were unable to verify that they were the same blogs, though. Furthermore, they hired a lawyer after failing to locate any proof and refusing to speak with the police any longer. At that point, the inquiry had stopped because the investigators had no more leads. It wasn't until 1998, two years later, that it was picked up again by a different group of investigators who wanted to look into the area Slover's shop was located in. They thought that Karen might have been murdered there and that there had to have been some proof left. Regarding the Slover family, they had all relocated to a different state during that period. Colton was residing with them prior to the relocation, having been put up by Michael's sister Mary. Hired repair workers. This worried corporations, but cops demanded proof. In 1998, forensic experts and military installation authorities assisted investigators in their second hunt. They needed as many personnel as possible to cover every square inch in six months. They inspected each stone's top layer for blood before fruiting. Karen wore rivets and a button in her jeans on murder day. After that, she found another blouse button. This supported the police's argument that the woman's body was sliced and stored on business property. While their daughter Mary watched Colton, investigators suspected Jeanette and her husband. Jeanette shot Karen directly when she picked up her son. Karen and her husband brought her body to their shop, but not the buttons. The police determined Karen's ex-husband cut the lawn the night of the murder after talking to every neighbor. Only the investigator's version was supported. Jeanette and her husband drove Karen's car into beautiful grass from the city. Michael knew and helped his parents hide the crime. The grass inside the car may have confused investigators. Another witness told detectives the Slovers burnt something on the premises the day of the murder. They disposed of evidence this way and more. Karen's body was found in the packages with the most horrible evidence, shocking the police. Slover and a dog shed black hair on the cassette. A warrant was issued after investigators sampled the Slover's black, Labrador's dog brush. Police found a complete DNA match in the brush, corroborating the family's case. Jeanette and her husband strengthened their relationship for everyone. They hurried to sleep their dog out of fear it was engaged in the crime, but it was too late. On January 27, 2000, officials arrested Jeanette, her husband, and her son after this proof. All three were accused of murder. Although the family denied it, trials lasted until 2002. Jury convicted them despite evidence and testimony. Michael, his father, and Jeanette earned 65 and 60 years in prison in 2003. Judge rejected their appeal. The story seemed over, but Karen's child had further issues. Mary, Michael's sister, adopted him. The court obtained custody over Karen's parents. Do Mary know about her relatives' murder charges? If she watched Colton while her parents stole the body, she may have been an accomplice. Karen's parents kept asking the court for exclusive custody and parental rights for Mary. Following the judge's order, Colton lived with his maternal grandparents in 2003. Mary hated Karen throughout this process, and the court found she sought to make the child forget his biological mother. Mary frequently told acquaintances she hoped her dad was alive. They're all serving time. Jeanette's husband and son can be released after 2030, but she can be released early in 2029 at 80. They fail to appeal the verdict and claim innocence. Share your opinion on this story in the comments and don't forget to like it. Thanks for watching. A woman's body was discovered in her own house. When the police began their investigation, they discovered several worrying leads. The more they investigated the case, the stranger and more terrifying the information became. They eventually learned the truth after a number of years, 
but nobody anticipated this turn of events. On March 29, 1948, Karen Gregory was born in Albany, New York. She was the oldest of four children, and from a young age, she assisted her parents in caring for her siblings. The girl loved nature and spent a lot of time in the outdoors. She also enjoyed sports. After graduating from high school, she wanted to work in the field of art. Karen enrolled at Rochester's Nazareth College, where she graduated with a Bachelor of Arts and a Bachelor of Science. She then spent some time teaching art in an elementary school before deciding to pursue a career as a graphic designer. She relocated to Florida in 1983 when she was 35 years old, where she met David McKee. He was a manager for a company that offered Vietnam War veterans consulting services, and he and Karen quickly grew close. The two were attracted to one another and dated for just over a year before David asked her to move in with him in Gulfport in the spring of 1984. Before this, Karen commuted frequently to David's home because she shared an apartment with a friend. On May 22nd, the woman accepted this offer and started gradually moving her belongings there. Karen finally packed up her apartment and left it empty after taking the last of her possessions. She admitted to being a little anxious to her neighbor. In order to speak at a conference, David had to travel to another state for work, and she would have to stay alone in his home for a full week. The woman left the apartment and went to her friend's home. There, they had a great time. Karen expressed to her friend how content she was with David and how happy she was to finally be moving in with him. After the friends finished talking around midnight, Karen went to David's house. He made several calls home the following day, but no one picked up. He called Karen's neighbor because he believed she might still be living in her old apartment. But the woman claimed she hadn't seen Karen in a while. David contacted Karen's sister and a few of her friends the following day, but none of them had seen her. All day long, he tried to get in touch with her, but he never heard back. In an effort to reach Karen before she left for work on May 24th, David called the house once more in the early morning hours. However, there was still no response. He called her boss later and learned that she hadn't arrived for work. David was now extremely worried and worried that something bad might have happened to Karen. Contacted the neighborhood hospitals and police departments to ask if they had seen anyone resembling Karen's description. He made the decision to call his neighbor Amy after learning that they had nodded. Amy looked out the window and answered in the affirmative as Karen's car parked in front of the residence. David's worry was only increased by this. He instructed Amy to visit the residence and rap on the door. He remained on the phone with her until she left to carry out his request because he was so anxious. There was no response when Amy knocked on the side door. She then circled the house and noticed that a window was open. Karen's name was repeatedly called out, but no one answered. When she pulled back the curtain and put her arm through the open window, she was astounded by what she discovered. She could see the hallway from the bedroom window where a woman's bloodied body was lying on the floor. Amy was hidden behind a wall and couldn't see the face, but she recognized the person as Karen, who, after she recovered from her shock, ran back to her own home where David was, keeping the call going. Before hanging up and dialing 911, she grabbed the phone and told him that something terrible had happened. Rapidly arriving medical personnel could only confirm Karen's demise. Due to the amount of blood throughout the house, even seasoned police officers were horrified as detectives started their investigation. Karen had fought her assailant all the way to the end. From the hallway to the front door, there were bloodstains. Several pieces of broken glass were scattered around. Investigators discovered that several hair strands matched. Karen's hair color was ingrained in the shattered glass. They hypothesized that she almost made it outside before her attacker cornered her in the restroom. A bloody footprint on the floor gave investigators their first indication of the crime. There were no bloodstains on Karen's feet, so the police concluded that Karen's killer was responsible for the footprint. The killer was in the bathroom, but it was not clear why he was barefoot. After examining the victim's body, medical professionals determined that she had sustained about 20 stab wounds and had been subjected to violence. Experts also removed biological material from the murderer. Sadly, DNA testing was not available in 1984, so this clue was ineffective in identifying the murderer. 
Several bloody fingerprints were also discovered on her body, but they couldn't be used because they were too smudged. Experts estimate that the woman was attacked the same night she returned home from her friend's house because she was killed, about 30 hours before she was found. Another element caught the eye of the viewer right away. As soon as the police and medical personnel arrived, they noticed Karen's body was covered in a lace corset over a shirt. Evidently, the offender did this. After investigating the scene thoroughly and gathering all relevant information, the police gave Karen's friends permission to begin clearing up. The women didn't want David to arrive and witness all this horror. All of the victim's friends and acquaintances knew how much he loved her and wanted to at least somewhat lessen his suffering. David had to travel across the country to his conference because it took a long time to get home. And in the meantime, the detectives started questioning the neighbors. The crime rate was incredibly low, and the neighborhood was regarded as being quite prestigious and secure. They even had a neighborhood watch and many residents who knew one another. When neighbors keep an eye on the peace and notify the police of any suspicious activity, they are in agreement. The neighborhood watch did not carry out its duties in this instance, though. Detectives learned that 16 locals were attacked on May 23rd at 1.15 a.m. None of them called the police after hearing a piercing female scream because they all claimed that the scream quickly stopped and they did not get the impression that anyone might be in danger. Even the neighborhood watch leader, who practically lived across from the victim, did not think it was necessary to call the police. He heard a muffled scream while working on his motorcycle in the garage and listening to the radio. The man left the garage and walked down the street without seeing anything odd before coming back. On the morning of May 23rd, a neighbor who lived across from David made an intriguing observation. She noticed that his front door was open, and that night she also heard a scream, but she didn't connect the two. One specific element of her account stood out. The door was lit when the police responded to the call. Given that the body had been in the residence for about 30 hours, the perpetrator might have tried to hide his tracks by returning and shutting the door. Notably, none of the notable properties displayed any indications of forced entry. Doors. Despite the fact that there were no indications of forced entry, detectives theorized that the perpetrator might have entered through the back window. Karen either knew the killer and let him in herself, or she left it open the entire night. Another intriguing observation was provided to the detectives by the neighborhood watch chief. An unidentified man pulled up to Karen's home in the evening of the day following her murder. He exited the vehicle, rapped on the door a few times, and continued to scan the area. He then went back to the vehicle, but some. He returned a short while later, holding a piece of paper in his hand, placed it on Karen's windshield and then started his car. As soon as they arrived, the police checked the vehicle and discovered a note that read, Karen and David, hi, I stopped by around 7.15 p.m. but didn't see any signs of life. I have what you requested, but I doubt I'll be back because I have a lot to do tonight. Given that Karen had already been dead for almost a minute when this person arrived, the detectives immediately noticed the warning that there were no signs of life. Such a choice of words throughout the day was very unsettling. Investigators searched for Peter, who was mentioned at the end of the note. He had actually been right there all along, it turned out. The man visited their home soon after learning about the body's discovery from Karen's former neighbor. The man actively participated and responded to all inquiries. He voluntarily gave them his fingerprints and revealed what, in Peter's account a few days earlier, he was doing close to the victim's home. Despite the fact that David was already scheduled to leave for a week-long business trip, Karen allegedly informed him that David would also be attending the dinner when she called and invited both of them. Peter was also questioned by the detectives about what he meant in the note when he said, I have what you asked for. The man claimed that he had borrowed a cassette from them and intended to give it back. Another oddity was that Peter allegedly failed to notice the numerous broken windows or the almost completely covered path to the front door. Windows. The man insisted that during their conversation, he hadn't noticed anything or paid any attention to it. An extensive cut on Peter's hand was spotted by one of the detectives, 
the man covered the scratch when the policeman examined his hand and remarked that he always gets scratches after playing with dogs or fixing his car. The detectives decided to check his alibi because all of the aforementioned seemed very suspicious. Peter claimed that he was sleeping at home the night of the murder, and his neighbor told the police that this was true. Didn't rush to rule him out of the running because an alibi like that could easily be a fabrication. However, the detectives quickly identified another suspect, David Karen's boyfriend. He claimed that night that he was sleeping in his hotel room and was in Rhode Island, which is 2,000 kilometers from his home. However, the police discovered a very intriguing clue at the crime scene in a local Rhode Island newspaper published on May 23rd, the day Karen was killed. The detectives began to wonder if it was real because it was so strange. Before his upcoming conference appearance, David could have taken a flight to Florida, murdered his girlfriend, and then come home. They estimated travel and flight times from airports and came to the conclusion that it was feasible. Since David allegedly slept alone in his hotel room that night, no one was able to verify his alibi. The neighborhood watch chief added his observations as well. When the woman visited his home, he had repeatedly observed arguments between Karen and David. David, on the other hand, was adamant that their relationship was wonderful and rarely did the couple have arguments. When questioned about the newspaper, David replied that he had purchased it on May 21st from a shop close to his house. To have the week's weather forecast with him, he was going to bring it on the trip. When investigators visited that shop, the clerk said they did indeed sell that newspaper. He even recalled David having purchased it on January 21st. The clerk said the paper actually released that issue a few days ago, as is customary for printed newspapers. As a result, Doubts about David vanished from the the man noticed the absence of a white lace corset that Karen had purchased for herself a few months earlier, one that was strikingly similar to the one worn by Karen's killer. When they asked him if anything was missing from her home in the background, the detectives assumed right away that the despicable criminal had taken it as a trophy as a result of this. A finely detailed drawing of a watch bearing the name Steven Fischler's signature was discovered in the victim's home and the police chose it to follow this lead. The detectives were contacted by a specific detail. Attention blued seemed to be on the paper. The detectives asked Karen's co-workers after quickly learning that Stephen and Karen were employed by the same business. They discovered a lot of fascinating data. Nearly all of the staff members described Stephen as being rather strange. He made a concerted effort to win over all of his female co-workers. He showed them images that were pornographic. He even attempted to persuade his colleagues to read a pornographic poem he had written. Every single woman who worked with him acknowledged that he frightened them. Karen also expressed her displeasure with his conduct on numerous occasions, but management paid little attention. He denied giving Karen that drawing when the detectives spoke with him. In order to prove his innocence, he also said he barely knew the victim and offered to submit to a polygraph test. The most intriguing part started when the investigators swiftly set up such a test. Everything seemed to be going smoothly at first, but after one of the questions, Stephen abruptly admitted that he had killed Karen. He immediately changed his mind after a brief period of time and asserted that he was unrelated to it. Strangely, the polygraph operator failed to find a lie in either situation. The detectives were perplexed by this but were unable to rely on the polygraph results. This tool is far from ideal and simply cannot tell whether someone is telling the truth or not. They also realized that Stephen was obviously a very strange person who could say anything at that moment. Soon after, experts examined his drawing and came to the conclusion that ketchup, not blood, caused the red stain. They started to wonder if Stephen had anything to do with Karen's slaying. Despite having so many potential suspects, the police were unable to compile sufficient evidence to convict anyone, and the case went unsolved for a number of months. Detectives kept looking for new leads but were unsuccessful. This persisted until December when an intriguing event took place. Residents of Gulfport organized special events to celebrate the retirement of a well-respected local. There were numerous attendees, including Mary, who struck. The murder of Karen Gregory 
was brought up during their conversation with an additional police officer, and Mary unintentionally mentioned that she too had heard Karen Gregory's piercing scream that night. The officer noticed a peculiar detail right away. Mary lived two blocks away from Karen's home, and at first the police didn't even question the occupants of such far-off homes. The scream must have been extremely loud because the woman could hear it. However, the neighborhood watch chief, who practically lived Karen's neighbor across the street, described it as muffled. But the man clearly could not consider it quiet if the neighbors two blocks away heard it, especially given that he was at the time in his garage with the door open. Despite the suspicions raised by all of this, the police took their time in questioning the head of the neighborhood watch. He was George Lewis, a 22-year-old. He was a firefighter by trade and was close with almost every police officer at the neighborhood police station. All the neighbors spoke highly of him and said that he lived with his wife and young child. However, the detectives were unable to disregard Mary's account. When George had some free time, they asked him to call and come to the station. The man concurred but never appeared. Before this, it should be noted, he frequently dropped by the station just to visit with his friends. It was difficult for the case's lead detective to consider George as a murderer because he was even present at his wedding. In just one month in January 1985, they were able to communicate with him. This cream, according to George, didn't seem to be very loud. If he remembered anything else from that evening, he thought that this might be his fault, but George told him the same thing, with the exception of the brief period when his testimony was being taken for the first time. He claimed that after hearing the scream, he exited the garage and started to walk down the street, but this time he said that he had only gone up to the road to take a look before coming back. This discrepancy in the testimonies did not seem significant given the length of time that had passed since then. Nevertheless, the police wanted to make sure he was telling the truth, so they offered to have him take a polygraph test. To their surprise, George agreed but did not share it with anyone. The man later confessed to concealing one fact from the detectives during a conversation with them. He asserted that he saw an unidentified man close to Karen's home the night she vanished. The only thing George could recall about the man was that he was tall, had red hair and a beard. Once again, the detectives questioned whether he was telling the truth. George was at a loss as to why he hadn't mentioned this man during the initial interview, but he was afraid that the man might harm his family because he knew where he lived. Despite this, the police made an effort to pursue this tip and identify the man, but they were unsuccessful. In addition, it was completely dark outside and there were almost 30 meters between George and Karen's homes. George insisted on his account, so the police reenacted the events of that day despite the detectives' claims that the man could see the color of another person's hair in such circumstances. At night, he approached George and asked him to describe the man standing 30 meters away. Since he was blind, the detectives were even more skeptical of what he was saying. Nevertheless, they strolled the neighborhood and questioned the populace. Have you seen a suspicious man with red hair who might wander the streets at night? Several women admitted to their surprise that they had occasionally seen a man looking into their windows while it was dark. None of them were able to make out the man's face, but one woman did and he resembled George Lewis a lot, in her opinion. She wasn't completely sure because it was pitch black outside, and the man bolted for the door. Although George acknowledged that he occasionally peered into his neighbor's windows, he insisted that he did so only to ensure their safety. As the leader of the neighborhood watch, he claimed he was only checking to see if everything was all right with them because he was responsible for the neighborhood's security. However, all of this did was fuel suspicions against him. George consented to an in March 1985. He changed his story once more during the second polygraph examination. He acknowledged that he saw the man in front of Karen's house, that he spoke to him, and that the man threatened to kill him if he revealed who he was to anyone. Once more, the polygraph examiner picked up on a lie, so the investigator directly questioned George. Did he kill Karen Gregory? The man responded negatively, and his assertions were again regarded as false. The detectives then decided to speak with George's wife, who informed them that she had awakened that night from piercing cry and was extremely terrified. Her husband was nowhere to be found, 
when she searched the house and went to the garage, where the light was also off. After that, the woman went back home and waited in the kitchen for her husband, who didn't show up for another 30 minutes. The detectives also made the decision to investigate George's past. They spoke with his ex-wife, who revealed that while George appeared to be kind, caring and responsible, in actuality he was extremely aggressive and frequently raised his hand to her during arguments. He even choked, she continued. Afterward, the investigators occasionally spoke with George's close friends, who also provided some intriguing details about the months prior to the murder, when Karen wasn't yet living with him, but still paid him visits on occasion. The detectives discovered that George occasionally engaged in orgies and mentioned that he wanted Karen to join them. He also discovered that he told his friends that he liked her. The police also discovered that George had a secret in the summer of 1984 during these conversations with his friends. He had an affair with a young lady who lived a few houses away. They talked to her and discovered additional information. The girl acknowledged that George gave her a white lace corset for her 17th birthday. The man made her wear it, even though it was too big for her. When Karen's boyfriend saw the corset, the police asked her to give it to them. He claimed that a corset that was exactly like Karen's had vanished from the home and that its measurements were accurate. The first concrete evidence against George came from this, but the after taking a footprint from him and sending it to FBI specialists for comparison with the footprint discovered on Karen's home's bathroom floor, the detectives dug even deeper. The results eventually returned with a perfect match. When George was summoned back to the police station in March 1986, the detectives repeatedly questioned him about whether he had been at Karen's home on the night of the murder. Up until the detective informed him of the examination's findings, the man maintained his denial. George kept denying everything for the next few minutes, but then he changed his story and told the police that he saw a red-haired man near Karen's house, ran inside, and discovered that everything was covered in blood and that Karen was lying in the hallway with a cut to her throat. He then declared that he would never again remember that horrifying experience. Of course, the detectives didn't believe his story for a second because it was so absurd. But George was correct about one thing. The victim's throat did have a cut on it that hadn't been there before. Even if his story was true, he wouldn't have been able to see the cut because there was so much blood on Karen's body if it had been made public. At least skilled medical professionals couldn't see it until the blood had been removed. This meant that unless George was the murderer, he could not have known about the cut. It took everything mentioned above for authorities to apprehend the man. His detention occurred on March 15th. He might have received the death penalty for what he did almost two years after the Florida murder. Although they did not share the police's conviction that George was the murderer, George's close friends and his co-workers in the fire department still thought highly of him and made every effort to assist him. These people mortgaged their homes and even donated a portion of their pay to George's wife and child, in addition to raising $300,000 for bail on his behalf. George was consequently freed in late December. He continued to reside in his home for an additional six months while the trial went on until June 4, 1987. George's attorneys insisted that the man hadn't killed anyone and hadn't altered his account of what happened when speaking with the police. However, when the suspect was given the opportunity to speak, he concocted an entirely different tale. The same thing happened at the beginning. He spotted a man close to Karen's house, ran inside, and discovered her body. George was extremely ill after visiting this website, so he ran to the bathroom and puked. This appears to be how he attempted to explain the, there was a clear distinction here. If he had entered Karen's house barefoot at first, the bloody traces would have extended from where he discovered her body to the bathroom, but they weren't there when asked why he didn't call the police. George claimed that at the time he was only 22 years old and that he was too terrified to tell anyone. It's important to note that the man had worked as a firefighter since he was 18 and frequently encountered horrific circumstances, but when he, he found his neighbor dead and for some reason, he was unable to even call the police. George had feelings for Karen for several months, the prosecution insisted. 
He waited until her boyfriend went away for a week before deciding to exploit the circumstance. She was assaulted by George after he broke into her home, but she was able to scream and even fight back. He eventually killed her and violently treated her. His wife thinks there might be an easy explanation for the footprint he left on the bathroom floor. Only 30 minutes had passed since the scream when he arrived home. It appears that he tried to wash the blood-stained clothes in the bathroom and removed the blood-stained socks from his shoes. The jury ultimately found him guilty after the two-week trial. When his sentence was about to be announced a month later, the judge abruptly set the date for a new trial. It was successfully pushed through by George's attorneys. They insisted that the police had tampered with some of the evidence and that the prosecution had not been able to fully investigate. All parties involved in the process were taken aback by the judge's decision because it is unusual and required them to show their client's guilt. The prosecutor was able to appeal this choice and it was overturned in 1989. George ultimately received a life sentence. The man had no prior criminal history, so the death penalty was ruled out. Since then, George has made several attempts to appeal his sentence but has been rejected each time. Many of his friends and family members still thought he was, despite all the information and proof against him, he is innocent. 52-year-old George passed away while incarcerated in 2014. He remained adamantly innocent up until the very end, even speaking in an interview about how difficult it was to endure the punishment for a crime he did not commit. It's important to note one thing. However, none of the 16 neighbors who heard Karen scream dared to call the police. The patrol could have quickly arrived at the scene because the police station was close by their street. The detectives working on this case quickly acknowledged that Karen's life might have been saved in this situation, but it was not. Share your opinion on this story in the comments and don't forget to like it. Thanks for watching. In June 2000, 15-year-old Leah Freeman vanished, leaving a small town in shock. With rumors swirling and a distraught boyfriend, Nick McGuffin, desperately searching, the police investigation took unexpected twists. Witness testimonies, concealed evidence, and advanced DNA testing would lead to revelations and suspicions. Dive into the mysteries and uncover the truth behind Leah Freeman's disappearance in this video. At 10.15 p.m. on June 28, 2000, the Courtright home received a call. The phone was answered by Corey Courtright. Nick McGuffin, Leah's 18-year-old boyfriend, was the one who inquired as to her whereabouts. Nick had picked up Leah from their house about 4 p.m., which caught Corey off guard. Little did she realize the difficulties she would face in the future. Nick McGuffin, who was three years older than Leah Freeman, went to the same school as her. The two young people finally began dating after becoming acquaintances at some time. This alarmed Leah's mother, Corey, who had learned that her daughter and Nick shared more than just a spiritual bond. They also had a physical one. Around 4 p.m. on that day, Nick drove up in his vintage Mustang to pick up Leah. Leah bit her mom by before leaving in the car. The young pair enjoyed listening to loud music while driving. Nick claims that he dropped Leah off at the home of her closest friend Sherry at around 7 o'clock. They agreed that he would pick her up from there at 9 o'clock. But when he arrived there, Leah was gone, and the guy Leah was staying with told him that they had gotten into a fight, which caused Leah to get furious and leave. Leah was nowhere to be found when Nick started driving around the streets looking for her. Nick encouraged Corey not to worry and reassured her that he would locate Leah and bring her home at around 7 a.m. as their chat came to an end. On June 29th, still waiting for her daughter to come home, Corey called Nick's house to inquire about her whereabouts. Shortly after they reported her missing to the police at the station, Nick was shocked because he thought she was at home. Leah climbed into the car with Nick, and Corey recalled the moment she last saw her daughter. He claimed that after speaking with Leah's mother on the phone, he kept driving around the city looking for the teenager, substantiating his allegation that Nick had been stopped by the police twice the day before owing to he was pulled over by the police on several occasions, all of which he stated he was looking for Leah. He asked his buddy Kristen Steinhoff for assistance after being stopped for the second time owing to a problem with the car. They then drove around the city for nearly an hour in her car, but it did not work, and they went their separate ways. 
According to Nick, he then made the decision to walk close to Leah's house once more. Around 2 a.m., I noticed a light inside of her. He went back to his own house with peace of mind, assuming she was already there. Starting with his friend whom he had left Leah with the night before, the cops started looking into what Nick had disclosed. Sherry corroborated Nick's account by stating that Leah had visited her home yesterday, but fled following their disagreement. Sherry explained that Leah wanted to go for a run, but her mother wouldn't let her since Leah often gets in trouble for asking to go for a run. Nick picks her up, sending her home alone. Leah heard her friend and her mother having this chat, became offended, and left Sherry's home right away. Sherry claimed that she attempted to stop Leah, but that she was enraged and continued to leave. And while Leah was at Sherry's, Nick spent time with his friends at a nearby lake, according to his friends. Later, the authorities produced evidence indicating the young people had met there with a purpose, and Nick's involvement was a key factor in their plan. Leah loathed him and their disagreement very much. Kristen, a friend of Nick's, also corroborated his claim that they were looking for Leah in her car. There have never been any high-profile crimes in Kokio, a little town with a population of just under 4,000. The disappearance of Leah Freeman raised a lot of controversy in the neighborhood. When Leah left her friend's home, the police looked for any witnesses who may have seen her. It was discovered that she was last observed alone in a downtown area close to her school. It's possible that she was on her way home, but it has now been discovered that she never arrived. Leah's mother disputed the police's assertion that her daughter had simply run away from home, saying her daughter had no justification for doing so. Nick's home and car were the subject of search warrants issued by the police. The only noteworthy discovery of the car search was the missing lining in the trunk. Otherwise, it was absolutely empty and devoid of any tools or a spare tire. The detectives found nothing of significance in the house. His father, Nick Nick, began to understand that he had changed from my witness to the only suspect during the interrogation when it was stated that everything had been taken out because of a fuel leak. Nick attempted to disregard the accusations that he was somehow connected to Leah's abduction as he kept looking for his loved one by distributing flyers bearing her picture. Three days after Leah Freeman vanished, something happened that caused the police's perception to shift away from the idea that the young woman might have been abducted. The woman had fled. Near the school where Leah was last seen, a man who worked at a nearby vehicle service business approached the police. He recalled that on the night of the young woman's disappearance, he had been working late and was about to leave when he saw a shoe by the roadside that looked like one of his kids' sneakers, which they occasionally brought to his business. He took it home after picking it up. The father didn't recall anything until Leah's disappearance caused a stir. He turned it over to the police after assuring them it wasn't his children's. The footwear belonged to Leah, according to the young woman's family, who confirmed this. It was discovered on Northern Elm Street close to the local school and cemetery. Her right foot belongs in the sneaker. It was Leah Freeman's shoes, according to the results of the forensic investigation. A week later, something was found that clearly suggested the missing young woman had suffered a terrible fate. In the, the second sneaker Leah owned, it was in the Hudson Rich area, about 7.5 miles from where the first sneaker was discovered, on an old logging road, a remote location where one might easily conceal themselves from prying eyes. A forensic examination of the sneaker revealed dry stains of a dark red hue that contained Leah Freeman's biological material. Leah's mother claims that the police didn't start treating her daughter's absence seriously or stop thinking her a runaway until the sneaker was found. Were organized by the police to search the area after a second shoe was discovered. On August 3, 2000, five weeks after Leah Freeman vanished, one of the search teams detected a strong stench and found her body. Leah's mother, Corey Courtright, had been holding on to the hope that her daughter would finally return home. In the vicinity of Lee Valley Road, it had been hurled over the brink of a narrow brook. The area was very forested, and there was no one there. If not for the potent stink, the body might have remained unnoticed for a lot longer. The murderer had picked a decent location nearby to conceal the body. The prolonged exposure of the body to the high temperature caused extensive decomposition making it impossible for investigators to collect any usable evidence. Another factor was the local police's inexperience with such investigations. The map reveals the following. Leah was last seen close to the school, not far from where her right shoe was discovered. 
The body was recovered 2.5 miles from the place where the left sneaker was found, which was located 5 miles from the right one. The cops were further perplexed by the body's detachment from the shoes. As a result, after the body was discovered, the inquiry stalled rather than making the anticipated progress. The police were reticent to divulge anything, and it was clear from the lack of any arrests or charges that they had no solid leads. Meanwhile, rumors started to circulate in that despite the fact that the young man appeared to be grieving over his loved one's passing, most people in the small village of Coquille think that Leah's boyfriend, Nick McGuffin, was involved in everything and was concealing something. The majority of people accused him. As they had no other suspects, the police again called him in for interrogation. Despite their pressure, however, there were no breakthroughs in the investigation. It became clear that the investigation had reached a standstill a year later. Police did not have any fresh suspects. Nick. After another six years passed, the small town that was shaken by the high-profile crime slowly returned to normal. In 2007, Nick's daughter was born, and society started to accept him again. However, for Leah's mother, Corey Courtright, life seemed to have stopped the day she lost her daughter. She never stopped reminding the local police chief about the unsolved case eight years later. The detectives were unpleasantly surprised to find that the evidence gathered in 2000 was dispersed, and some of it was completely useless. Witness testimonies from that time were reviewed, and dozens of people were interviewed once more, including Kristen Steinhoff, Nick's friend. Mark Daniels took over the Coquillo police, and he gave the case a fresh perspective by assembling a team of specialists from across the state. Her remarks on the night of her disappearance were different from what she had claimed eight years prior. She recalled how Nick visited her home that evening about midnight, and the two of them had a cigarette. Nick then began kissing her, but it didn't last long since she objected. Nick McGuffin was called in for additional questioning after her testimony, rekindled earlier suspicions about him. Kristen's testimony was corroborated, and he acknowledged that what she had stated was accurate, but he had been reluctant to do so in 2000 when the police had publicly suggested that Leah might have the most surprising development was the appearance of a witness years later, who claimed to have seen Leah and Nick after she left her friend's house. Leah was only 15 at the time, which could have provided a motive for Nick to commit the crime, and could have landed him in jail. Leah Freeman's body was discovered on August 23, 2010, ten years after she passed away. Her boyfriend Nick McGuffin was taken into custody and accused of being the cause of death. The prosecution used the testimony of two witnesses during the trial. Leah and Nick were allegedly seen by a witness at nine o'clock. The day she vanished, close to the establishment where the first pair of sneakers was discovered. Nick allegedly tried to drag Gila into a car as they were shouting. According to the prosecution, it was at this time when Nick allegedly hurt Leah, as evidenced by the stains on the shoes. Someone who claimed to have had an argument with Nick in 2002, and that Nick had threatened to treat him the same way he treated Leah was the second and most significant witness. This accusation was understood as this witness was the ex-boyfriend of the young lady Nick subsequently married, which would have influenced his testimony, but the prosecutor ruled out the likelihood of prejudice. Nick McGuffin refused to confess guilt, but in the absence of any tangible proof, he only had the testimony of witnesses. Nick McGuffin was found guilty of Leah Freeman's involuntary manslaughter by ten of the jury's twelve members. When the verdict was revealed on July 19, 2011, Eleven years after she passed away, he received an eleven-year prison term. The mother experienced her first moment of comfort upon learning that the person who had kidnapped her daughter was now in jail, but the narrative doesn't end there. In 2014, Nick McGuffin's relentless insistence on his innocence and his prolific letter-writing to multiple human rights organizations produced results. One of these organizations became interested in his case, and Jazz Parakow, his new attorney, started looking into the facts and witness accounts that had led to the guilty conviction. As she learned, in addition to the, the police concealed vital information that would have impacted the jury's verdict due to the lack of tangible proof connecting Nick McGuffin to the killing of Leah Freeman. The fact that Leah's clothing contained traces of gray automotive paint that did not coincide with the hue of Nick's car during the trial was kept a secret. Although it was stated that the Mustang's interior had been completely cleaned when it was originally checked, pictures from that time clearly showed otherwise. 
Witness statements disputed the prosecution's witnesses' assertions that I witnessed Leah and Nick fighting outside the school at around 9 o'clock, but these unreported testimonies claimed they weren't brought up in court. Leah was seen by witness Nick Backman at 9 o'clock. Leah was out on her own that evening while he was at an ATM. Additionally, the authorities seized the ATM videotape, which showed that his meeting occurred at precisely 904 p.m. In the ten years between the discovery of the corpse and the footwear and Nick McGuffin's arrest, during which time technology advanced, one of the most serious instances of police professionalism occurred, had significantly progressed, especially in the area of DNA testing. As is well known, one of the sneakers identified as containing Leah Freeman's biological material in 2000 had significant crimson stains. The police mysteriously chose not to send the footwear for more examination after 10 years and the chance to learn more using new technologies. This decision ultimately had a big impact on Nick McGuffin's life. The attorney got in touch with the lab that had tested the shoes in order to request a copy of the original DNA analysis result in 2000 and was shocked to learn that, in addition to Leah's DNA, his DNA had also been discovered on the footwear. However, the male DNA was so minute that at the time, technology could not further identify it, and its discovery was no longer mentioned anywhere in the police records. Nevertheless, the police decided not to conduct a further investigation in 2010, despite having all the available options. The footwear were submitted for re-examination in 2017, thanks to Nick's defense, and the results showed that both male and female DNA was present. However, the detected samples were so small that it was impossible to obtain comprehensive information for comparison with the FBI database. They could only reveal similarities when compared directly to the DNA of the person who left them. The sneakers, both inside and outside, did not belong to Nick McGuffin, Nick McGuffin's guilty judgment was reversed on November 29, 2019, and his case was given back to the prosecutor who had been in charge of it during the 2011 trial. The prosecutor claimed that simply because McGuffin was found guilty was overturned doesn't mean he's innocent given that Nick had already completed nearly all of his 11-year sentence and the new evidence. The prosecutor chose not to pursue a new trial against him. On December 17, 2019, Nick McGuffin was released from prison. He now intends to hold the authorities accountable for erasing 10 years from his life. The investigation into Leah Freeman's killing is still ongoing, but possibly new techniques will one day be developed that will allow for a more precise identification of the murderer. Mom Corey Cartwright is still of the opinion that the individual is Nick McGuffin. Share your opinion about this story in the comments and don't forget to like this video. If you enjoyed it, thank you for watching. The police started looking for a girl who had spent the night at her friend's house before she vanished without a trace the next morning. Her bedroom window was wide open and all of her belongings were still there. No one suspected the dark secrets that would soon come to light in the small town. Welcome to A to Z Crime Stories. Before we start, don't forget to like this video and subscribe for more. Amanda Lenka was born on June 7, 1991 in Tennessee. She grew up in a big, loving family with many brothers and sisters before moving with their parents to Spring Hill, Florida. She loved spending time there because she had many friends there. White Cloud was a quiet, peaceful town with a population of only one 400 people. Most of its residents knew each other, children played without adult supervision, and no one worried about their safety. Amanda was passionate about dancing, writing poetry, playing multiple musical instruments, and being a very positive child. During school breaks, she always went to her grandparents' house in that town. On June 20th, Amanda spent the night at the home of her best friend. They chatted, had fun, and went to bed late. The next morning, her friend woke up and discovered Amanda was not in the room. The bedroom windows were wide open. She went to the kitchen and looked all over the house, but Amanda was nowhere to be found. Amanda had just completed the seventh grade of middle school. She spent the entire summer in White Cloud with her friends, went for walks, and enjoyed her vacation. Belongings, such as clothes and a backpack, were left in the bedroom. When the friend reported Amanda missing to her parents, they called her grandparents, walked several blocks, and called the parents of Amanda's other friends, but no one had seen her. 
Then the relatives decided to contact the police because they realized that Amanda could not have left without notice, especially in just her pajamas. First, investigators spoke with the friend of Amanda, who claimed that she did not see Amanda L., the girl's friend's parents, as well as her brother and sister, were in the house at the time of the disappearance, but none of them heard or saw anything. Police also tried to find witnesses who lived nearby that night, but they came up empty-handed. On the first day of the investigation, the investigators came to the conclusion that the girl had likely left home on her own initiative and run away. This version outraged Amanda's relatives, who insisted that the girl had no problems at home and was happy to spend the entire summer in White Cloud. In addition, they pointed out that the girl left all her things including clothes in her friend's room and that five people did not hear anything. It was difficult to imagine a scenario in which Amanda could have been abducted without waking up her friend who was sleeping just a meter away. When word of Amanda's disappearance spread throughout the neighborhood, the police received numerous calls from witnesses who claimed to have seen a similar girl in various locations, which only increased the detective's certainty that Amanda had fled her home. Unable to confirm any of these leads, the investigators decided to check the girl's computer in the hopes of finding some information that could aid in the search. They discovered pertinent information. Although there were inconsistencies, these correspondences made no mention of a potential meeting and were about routine, everyday matters. The investigators still believed they had enough evidence to confirm their suspicions at the time. However, word of Amanda's correspondence with a particular man quickly spread among the city's residents, leading many to believe that she had run away to meet him. Because of this misunderstanding, the investigators did not really use the full scope of their resources. If they had officially classified this case as a kidnapping, they could have enlisted the FBI and other agencies in the investigation. Instead, they chose to focus on the case themselves. Meanwhile, Amanda's family was posting flyers and giving interviews to various media outlets, insisting that Amanda could not have fled on her own initiative. On July 5th, mushroom pickers went to a forest about 10 kilometers from White Cloud, where they discovered a human body and reported it to the police. Investigators arrived at the scene and immediately recognized the body as Amanda, because she was lanky and wearing the same pajamas she had disappeared in. Despite their half-hearted search for her, they never found any serious leads on her possible location, and the investigation dragged on for several weeks, confirmed her identity, and discovered that Amanda had died the night of her disappearance after suffering multiple blows from a heavy object. Investigators came to the conclusion that the victim had been killed elsewhere before being brought to the forest, but they were unable to find any significant leaves so they decided to speak to everyone who knew the girl. Over the course of the following few days, police interviewed about 400 people, or nearly one-third of the population of White Cloud. However, since the young man with whom Amanda had communicated online had the word killer in his nickname, they decided to take another look at him. While this did not produce any answers, the police also decided to consider the possibility that the victim actually went to meet him and was killed there. However, this theory still had many flaws. For instance, there was no evidence to support the idea that the girl would have gone to meet someone in the middle of the night while wearing pajamas, and there was also no evidence that the, in an effort to find some new leads, detectives decided to examine all of Amanda's possessions, which resulted in a breakthrough. They discovered her personal diary, which contained very disturbing information. Shortly before her death, Amanda wrote that a certain man had been harassing her, and the next several pages were torn out. The investigator could not identify this person, and soon the version of his involvement was no longer taken into consideration. Leave in the case, police attempted to identify the man's identity. They spoke to all of Amanda's friends and asked if the girl had brought up anything regarding this. Several of her friends acknowledged that she had indeed told them about it, and even named the man Cecil Wallace, he was the stepfather of Amanda's friend with whom she had spent the night for detectives. This information was a real surprise they had been searching for the killer throughout the town and beyond, and in the end, T. But the testimony of the friends was not enough to arrest him. Investigators had no substantial evidence against the man, no DNA samples were found on the victim's body, and the court documents did not indicate whether she had been subjected to violence. Detectives questioned Wallace, but he denied any involvement in the crimes the police themselves wondered how the man could have done all this unnoticed 
In a small house where his wife and three children slept without serious evidence or confession, they could not detain Wallace, therefore. The detectives continued to work on all possible leads soon after an interesting fact emerged. It turned out that Wallace's sister Candace worked in the police department that was handling Amanda's case. Moreover, the woman actively helped her brother and his family during the interrogations. She literally told him what to say and how to behave. But that was not all. Five years ago, she was fired from another police department for falsifying report on her brother's accident. She wrote that he was driving on a road Wallace claimed that a deer ran out in front of him as he was driving. But in reality, the man was drunk and had an accident. At that point, other detectives were already working on Amanda's case, and they questioned the impartiality of the local police's investigation, but they were unable to confirm that anyone else could be assisting Wallace. The investigator spoke with Wallace and his family several more times, but this did not produce any results. They continued to search for any leads, but instead of finding any four years after the murder in 2008, detectives turned to the National Center for Missing an Explosion after receiving repeated complaints from the Wallace family that their home had been vandalized. The town's unanimity that the man was a murderer and that his sister was covering it up only increased in negative sentiments. Wallace continued to live among them freely, which only heightened these feelings. Three more years passed before the police finally got a new lead that changed everything. In 2011, a 27-year-old Texas woman who grew up in White Cloud went to a news website from her old town where she found information about Amanda's murder and swore it was her. She then contacted the police. They had gone through all the case materials, conducted new interrogations, and tried to find new leads. Ultimately, they came to the same conclusion as the local detectives that there was not enough evidence to make and in 1998, when the victim was 13 years old and still a resident of that city. She spent the night at the Wallace home because she was friends with his second foster daughter. In the middle of the night, a man broke into their room and assaulted both of them before threatening to keep quiet. The victims were too terrified to call the police, so they never reported what had happened. In Amanda's case, she made the decision to contact the police, and then she provided them with a statement that assisted investigators in moving closer to the arrest of the suspect. They spoke with many people in White Cloud, who might have been impacted by Wallace's actions, and this tactic was successful because they were able to identify several women who admitted that the man had touched them inappropriately. This incident occurred between 1998 and 2002. The victims were then between the ages of 13 and 16. Putting all this information together, police detained Wallace, 43, in October 2011. Wallace was charged with sexually assaulting these victims and was also the first person to be officially named as a suspect in Amanda's case. Detectives had no doubt that Wallace was responsible for the murder, and at the preliminary hearing, he was given bail of $150,000, and other family members assisted him in raising the funds the trial was scheduled to start in a month. While waiting for this, Wallace returned to work. The locals were not happy that he had been released on bail. They frequently protested outside the company's office, demanding that this man be fired on November 10th on the day of the first court hearing an unexpected turn occurred. Wallace did not show up at the appointed time, and the police immediately declared him wanted. A few days later, Wallace was found in a local jail. Detectives who did not anticipate this turn of events were forced to continue the inquiry after the suspect passed away. They could only rely on strong evidence that could connect him to Amanda's death. They obtained a search warrant for his home in an effort to find any evidence connected to Amanda's murder. They looked around every corner, tore down some walls and lifted floorboards, but they found nothing. After gathering the necessary evidence, detectives turned their attention to the suspect's sister Candace, believing that she was protecting her brother and wanting to know if she was aware that he had killed Amanda. Candace was detained in August 2012. She was accused of deliberately misleading the investigation, but that was just the beginning. Throughout the course of the investigation, Detectives discovered that Candace had been concealing her brother's drug dealing during those times. Candace also advised him to always carry a cigarette with someone else's DNA on it, so that if necessary he could plant it at the crime scene. Detectives also concluded that at least nine people knew about Wallace's crimes, but remained silent. All of them were members of his family. The police were also of the opinion that at least nine people knew about Wallace's crimes, 
but remained silent. Wallace's sister could not provide consulting services on a case that she was working on as a police officer, given that she had been assisting her brother through interrogations. She broke this rule and was ultimately punished, but Candace insisted that her brothel was involved for another two years before making a deal with the police in which she admitted to lying to the investigators in exchange for the dismissal of two other charges. If a person has committed a minor offense, they can be given several weekends in jail. This way they receive a punishment, but it does not significantly affect their life. The convicted person can continue to go to work and spend time with their family, of course. This is a dubious practice where the convict is only required to be in the jail building for two days a week and can freely roam during the rest of the time. In 2004, medical experts only handed over part of Amanda's remains to her family so they could hold a funeral. The remainder was to be kept by detectives during the investigation, but after Wallace's death, a decision was made to hand over the remainder to the family. The detectives were sure that Candace had helped her brother avoid punishment, and because approving it 100% was not possible, she received such a light punishment. Amanda's family was forced to undergo yet another trial. She also works to change the law to change how the police search for missing children. The mother insists that investigators should not conduct an investigation based on their subjective assessments and consider the disappearance as a voluntary escape from home. Thus, there is almost no doubt that Wallace committed the disappearance. However, there is still some doubt that Wallace committed the disappearance. Given that there is no information in the court records regarding whether the victim was subjected to violence, two assumptions can be made. He likely assaulted her but did not leave his biological material, so the investigation decided not to disclose this fact because it was unnecessary. Detectives could also withhold this information for the sake of the investigation in the hopes that the criminal would reveal facts that had never been revealed. His prior crimes also speak in F.A. The detective suggested that all of Wallace's relatives who were in the house on the night of the murder were aware of the crime and may have even assisted in it. Wallace had at least three victims using the same scheme, and all of them stayed at his house overnight. The question is why he killed Amanda. Perhaps he intended to intimidate her like the others, but the girl threatened to tell the truth to everyone or she tried to flee from him and he panicked. The fact that Wallace settled the score with his life before the trial speaks in favor of his guilt, even though he took the specifics of this crime to the grave, as his wife, son, and daughter were present, which may have explained how he was able to attack the victim without waking any of his family. In any case, even without a final ruling from the court, Wallace will no longer be able to harm anyone. Share your opinion in the comments, and don't forget to like this video if you liked it, Thanks for watching. What happened to Sheila Josephine Harris and why this case angered the public? Sheila Josephine Harris was a young woman who won a beauty contest and was discovered dead in her own apartment. The police started looking for the murderer without realizing the repercussions it would have. Sheila Josephine Harris was born on February 26, 1963, in Douglas County, Nevada. She knew she wanted to be an actress or a model from a young age. Therefore, she actively competed in numerous beauty contests during her school years. Sheila won a local beauty contest in her district in her senior year of high school and planned to compete for Miss Nevada and Miss Carson City in case of victory. Despite such ambitious plans, the young woman decided to pursue a higher education in the field of business and trade after graduating. They later remarried and had two more daughters and Sheila actively assisted her mother in caring for her younger sisters. They tried to see each other as often as possible, but due to her studies and work, they were only able to spend time together a few times a week. On January 4, 1939, the young woman rented an apartment and took a part-time job at a supermarket to cover her living expenses. The young woman took her studies and work very seriously because she wanted to have a good education and provide for herself independently. Sheila was scheduled to start her morning shift at the supermarket the following day, so she wanted to go to bed early despite his injury. Stephen decided to see her off, and they parted at the entrance to the residential complex the following day. Sheila did not show up for work. The store manager noticed her absence and was greatly alarmed. Stephen had recently broken his arm, and the young woman occasionally visited him. He once called Sheila's home phone, but there was no answer so we got in touch with her mother to find out if anything had happened. At first, 
Sheila's mother assumed that Sheila had simply overslept. But when the building manager said he had called Sheila's home phone, the woman became alarmed. She decided to visit Sheila's apartment, but she asked a friend to go with her because she was too worried and afraid to go alone. The mother arrived at. She entered the apartment and was greeted by a horrifying scene that caused her to scream. Sheila lay in bed without any signs of life. Blood was all around her, and bruises could be seen all over her neck. Although a friend had tried to prevent the mother from seeing this heartbreaking scene, the woman still went inside and saw her dead daughter. When the police arrived, they started to investigate the crime scene and discovered that the young woman had been strangled and had suffered severe injuries. Medical examiners determined that the young woman had been tied up and subjected to violence. The perpetrator had dealt her several blows, probably with a board or other heavy piece of wood, and then strangled her with an electric cable, which caused her death. Investigators were unable to find the board or the cable in the apartment, but they did find wood chips underneath Sheila's clothing and body. In 1982, professionals were able to remove biological evidence from the murderer, who may have been the murder weapon, but they could now perform a DNA test. The brutality with which the attacker treated his victim initially led the detectives to believe that this crime could have been committed haphazardly and that the perpetrator might be mentally unstable. However, it soon became evident that this attack was meticulously planned. First, there were no signs of forced entry on the door, which means that the attack was carried out without using force. Investigators believe that the perpetrator was not a first-time offender and may have been a serial killer or someone who had previously committed a similar crime because Sheila must have allowed the perpetrator in on her own. No one else in the apartment building heard anything, and the killer took a wire and a wooden board, depriving the police of two crucial pieces of evidence. Sheila chose the apartment because the rent was low and she could not afford to live in a more prestigious neighborhood on her salary from the supermarket. This only complicated the police's work since many people in the neighborhood knew Sheila. With almost no evidence, investigators started looking for witnesses. They interviewed all the building's residents, but none of them noticed anything suspicious that night. The first day, the police had the most obvious suspect. Sheila's boyfriend Stephen's statistics show that it is often people close to the victim who commit such crimes, and Stephen might have been the last person to see Sheila before the murder. He said he accosted her a month after the murder. Investigators carefully studied local residents and tried to identify who might be involved. They questioned about 70 men, but they were unable to establish their involvement. When local media learned that the detectives were considering Stephen as a suspect, they quickly learned that his family had strong ties to the police. His brother was the sheriff of Carson City, and his father previously held the same position before retiring, so as a result, newspapers started to smear the young man's name. The young man also had no alibi for the rest of that day and was unable to prove that he did not enter Sheila's apartment. Residents of Carson City demanded that the teenager be immediately arrested and some even called for the death penalty. The situation was further complicated by the Carson City residents' conviction that Stephen was responsible for the crime and that his brother and father were using their position and connections to conceal it. This led to people protesting writing angry letters to Stephen and his family, and even threatening violence. Investigators tried to determine if the boy had a motive for committing such a crime after speaking with Sheila's friends and learning that the couple had never experienced any significant issues and that the young woman had never complained of aggression from Stephen. In addition, the victims had serious injuries that required the killer to exert significant effort, and Stephen had a broken arm at the time. He was also arrested for being drunk in public. The detectives started to believe the boy was innocent as a result of this, but it was too late. Under pressure from the public's threats and constant accusations, Stephen committed suicide before he could be completely cleared of suspicion. As a result, the police had only one candidate for the murderer's role. David Winfield Mitchell, a gardener and handyman who was assigned to the apartment building where Sheila lived. However, there was no direct evidence pointing to Mitchell as the murderer. When suspicions against Mitchell started to grow, detectives re-interviewed residents of the complex and other employees to see if anyone had noticed any strange or suspicious behavior from the gardener, and in doing so, they learned that the man could enter any apartment in the complex to perform some repair work, and that shortly after the murder, 
he resigned and left in an unknown direction. The police tried to find him, but he seemed to have disappeared. When attractive young women passed by, he kept his eyes off them and watched them silently until they disappeared from view. Several tenants thought this was odd, and investigators began to suspect that he was the person who killed Sheila. A man was declared wanted, but over the following years they were unable to find him. Meanwhile, forensic scientists had one more trick up their sleeves. They discovered a hair in the victim's apartment that may have belonged to Mitchie. Tobago and experts were able to determine that the hair found matched his ethnicity. DNA analysis wasn't yet available in those days, so they couldn't determine a 100% match with Mitchell's DNA. In 1986, four years after the murder, the police finally received a lead on the man's whereabouts. He was living outside the state and was soon arrested. During questioning, Mitchell denied his guilt, and the detective said only one thing, a hair that presumably belonged to him. Investigators continued to suspect Mitchell of killing the young woman, but they lacked solid evidence and realized the case had no chance of success in court. As a result, they decided to free Mitchell because no judge would have found him guilty based solely on one hair which could have in fact been left there during cleaning. Since that time, there have been no developments in this case. Sheila's mother learned about how new DNA analysis technologies could help solve such crimes and contacted the detective in charge of the case. The woman persuaded him to send the killer's biological material to the laboratory and request a comparison with Mitchell's. Since they couldn't prove the man's guilt, they practically put the investigation on hold until 1999 13 years after the murder, after the 1986 interrogation, after a protracted wait, the investigators received the long-awaited results. The semen sample from the victim's body completely matched David Mitchell's DNA. Experts also concluded that the voice heard in the victim's apartment belonged to him. As a result, the police had 100% proof of Mitchell's guilt. However, Mitchell had returned to his native country and obtained employment as a security guard in a government institution. This presented a new challenge for the investigators. In order to extradite Mitchell, which was difficult, they had to go through all the bureaucratic red tape and demonstrate to the government of Trinidad and Tobago that Mitchell was the one who committed the murder. This process took several years, and federal authorities and the state government engaged in talks with the other state for the following seven years, until 2006 when a decision was finally made to extradite him. The suspect was brought to Carson City, and soon one of the most high-profile murder cases in recent memory took place there. Second, journalists focused heavily on the fact that the victim's friend Stephen had committed suicide due to accusations against him. The court had to decide whether David was the real killer, or whether the entire town mistakenly believed Stephen was guilty. Mitchell's attorney used these societal uncertainties in his strategy and insisted that David was not the real killer. They had another indirect argument on the day of the murder. Stephen had a cast on his hand. First, the young man was unlikely to have been able to inflict all these injuries on the victim with one hand. Second, particles of the cast would undoubtedly have been found at the crime scene, but there were none. The prosecution side refuted these arguments by citing compelling evidence that DNA testing in modern conditions has extremely low chances of error. In the late 1960s, when the suspect was living in New York, he was sentenced to 10 years in prison for assaulting three young women in their homes. Mitchell broke into their home, tied the women up with an electric cable, and subjected them to violence. After his release from prison, he moved. On the prosecution side, during the trial, they revealed information that had not been made publicly available before. In spite of his prior sentence, Mitchell received only three years in prison, of which he served one and a half years, and was released on parole. He was then supposed to be deported to his native country. However, the man vanished from the police, moved to Carson City, and got a job as a gardener in that same complex, all the while avoiding capture. The young women managed to fight him off. They called the police and nine months later Mitchell was arrested. The investigation after Sheila's murder also raised concerns because the investigators had no knowledge of Mitchell's criminal history, contrary to the prosecution's version on the night of Sheila's murder. David knocked on her door and said that he had something he needed to do. If the system had not allowed him to leave so early, 
the young woman would likely still be alive. The same is true for the management of the residential complex, who, without knowing it, hired a serial rapist who fled from the police, which he used to stun the victim, and Mitchell committed all these crimes alongside her before fleeing the scene with the board and the electric cable. Because the jury reached a unanimous verdict in less than 30 minutes, David was given a life sentence without the possibility of parole, but his attorney argued for leniency by pointing out that Mitchell had been reformed and had lived an honest life for 25 years after the murder. David was 63 years old when we started his prison term. He spent most of his life on the run, and now he only has to spend the rest of his days in prison. Sheila's mother thanked the court for not allowing this monster to walk free. She claimed that if he hadn't been released early in the 1980s, her daughter would still be alive today. However, one question still remained that perplexed investigators. How did he get away with it? The offender was obviously serial, so it is likely that he may have attacked other women. He evaded capture for 25 years, so it is likely that his acts may have caused harm to other people. However, it is unclear whether the police will be able to find the truth. Share your opinion in the comments and don't forget to like this video. If you enjoyed it, thank you for watching. When a young woman went to the parking lot of her school to go to a sporting event, she disappeared without a trace. Soon, a very creepy discovery was made, and the police got involved. It took detectives 28 years to solve this creepy mystery, and none of them knew it would be the first of its kind. Sarah Yarborough was born in Portland, Oregon, on June 12, 1975. Her parents soon moved to a different state and settled in the town of Federal Way, which is close to Seattle and is basically a suburb of it, had two brothers and helped her parents take care of the youngest one. She was close to him from a young age. Sarah was involved in music and ballet. She worked hard in school so she could get into a good college. Because of her good grades, she went to New Zealand twice as part of a school program. Later, Sarah joined her school's cheerleading team. She also had a lot of friends. Sarah was 16 when she went to an event with her cheerleading team. They met at the school building where the bus would pick them up. But Sarah got the time wrong. She thought the bus would pick them up at 8 a.m., but it was not supposed to come until 9 a.m. Sarah's friends started to arrive, but no one saw her. Some students saw her car in the parking lot, but there was no young woman. Students thought this was strange, but no one could reach Sarah because none of them had cell phones at the time. Around the same time, two 12-year-old boys were walking around the school grounds. They saw a strange man come out from behind some bushes, look at them, and walk away in the opposite direction. The boys thought he was strange, but they did not pay much attention and kept walking. The children thought she was dead when they saw her lying on the ground with no signs of life. They ran home to tell their parents, and the parents of one of the boys went with him to the scene. The father of the other boy decided to follow the suspicious man the children had seen. His son told him that he saw a car that looked like a Chevrolet Nova pull away from that spot. Since he lived near the school, he went outside to try to find that car. At one point he was able to the man lost sight of it, and he could not find it again. In the meantime, the other boy's parents came to the school and realized that the young woman on the ground was probably dead. They ran to the school building and called the police. When the police arrived, they confirmed that the young woman was indeed dead. From the marks on her neck, they were also able to quickly figure out that the dead woman was Sarah. They concluded that the victim had probably been strangled. Officers found Sarah's shoes, pants, and socks, but nothing else. They found her purse and car keys inside the car in the school parking lot, which led them to think that she may have been attacked right next to the car and then dragged behind the trees. The body was taken to a medical examiner, and the police started looking for clues. Bushes near her body. They said he was a tall man in his early 20s with shoulder-length blonde hair, a dark raincoat, and black trousers. Soon, the police found another witness with a very surprising story. A man out for a jog saw a strange scene in the same wooded area. A young woman was lying next to some bushes, and a man was hovering over her. The young woman was not moving at all, so the witness thought that in both cases, the man and the young woman were still on the side of the road. It did not seem to him that a crime was being committed. The witness told the police that he had just moved to the U.S. from another country and did not know what was normal behavior there. However, he still gave the police a rough description of the killer that matched what the children said about him. 
who had been near the school, but no other useful leaves were found. In the meantime, medical experts looked at Sarah's body and decided that this triangulation was the cause of her death. Apparently, the person who killed her used her own tights. In addition, a serious injury was found on the young woman's head. The experts thought that from this below, the victim lost consciousness, which was consistent with the runner's story. He saw that the young woman on the ground did not move at all. In almost every piece of Sarah's clothing, they found traces of male semen from the same person. However, in 1991, there was no common DNA database, so all the detectives could do was compare DNA samples from specific suspects. The medical examiner also told the detectives that Sarah's body showed no signs of sexual abuse, even though forensic scientists had found traces of male semen on her clothes. Sarah got to school almost an hour early, and she was the only one in the parking lot. Her killer probably saw her there and waited for her to get out of the car, then hit her on the head with something until she lost consciousness. He then dragged her from the parking lot and put her behind some trees, where her body was later found. The killer took off some of Sarah's clothes and did sexual acts on her before strangling her with her own belt. Police were able to find Sarah's body because it was in a Chevrolet Nova. However, they were disappointed to find out that the driver of that car had just been delivering donuts that morning. His DNA did not match that found on Sarah's clothes. It seems that the kids just saw the car driving down the road next to them and thought the killer was in it. Over the next few days, police continued to look for witnesses and new leads, but they did not make much progress. On Monday, school started again, even though all the students were horrified by what had happened. The murder had happened only a few meters from their school, and the killer's identity was still unknown. The young women were afraid. Teams arranged to walk each student to her car or bus so they would not be left alone on the street. Detectives found that there were about 70 potential witnesses in and around the school that morning, and they talked to each of them. However, they did not learn anything new. Based on what the two children and the jogger said, a rough sketch of the killer was made and sent to all local newspapers and TV stations. The story got a lot of media attention. Hundreds of tips came in, and investigators looked into each one but none of them led anywhere. At one point, they got a tip about a man who fit the killer's description and had a criminal history, but his DNA did not match the killer's sample. Since then, the case has been on hold for many months. In total, the police got about 4,000 different leads, and they tried to follow each one, but they did not have enough resources. As investigators continued to look for the killer and new cases came up every month, time was also working against them. When Sarah's family found out that the police did not have enough resources to handle all the tips, her grandfather did what he could to help. He worked for a technology company and persuaded management to give the police department a very powerful computer with 150,000 memory chips. Still went along with it. With this computer, police officers could store information about all the leads in one place, process them faster, and sort them in a way that made them easy to study. Despite this, every lead led them down a dead end and in the years that followed, they made no progress. Two years later, Sarah's classmates graduated, and before graduation, they decided to honor their friend. They raised a lot of money and used it to build a memorial to Sarah. In metal next to these things was a picture of the young woman's dog reaching for her purse. Over the years that followed, the case was reopened and all the evidence was looked at again, but the police were still unable to find out who did it. During this time, the police talked to thousands of people and took DNA samples from nearly 300 possible suspects, but none of this helped. In 2011, 20 years after the woman went missing, the case was still unsolved. He heard about a company that was working in the field of genetic genealogy. The policeman contacted the company and asked if they could try to find relatives of the person whose DNA was found on the victim's body. Unfortunately, they failed. In 2011, Genetic genealogy was just starting to become popular, so the experts did not know how to search for both male and female relatives. DNA of a man, they could only look for family ties with other men, and vice versa. They also had to deal with laws that said they could not use genetic data samples to look for relatives of suspects. However, it did lead to some interesting results. For example, the team of researchers the detective approached had already been working for years to make a genetic pedigree of the first people who came to the United States. After looking at the killer Sarah's DNA, they found that he was related to one of the ship's passengers, Robert Fuller. 
However, it was almost impossible to track him down this way, since there were just over 100 people on the ship at the time. But over the centuries, they have had more than 25 million descendants. Also, the detectives did not know that he had made the Sarah Yarborough case the first of its kind, even though his idea was not new. The detective tried to use the information he had and tracked down several men with the fuller surname who lived in his town at the time of Sarah's murder. He found photos of them and met the only witness, a jogger, and two men who had found the body as children. Unfortunately, neither of them recognized the killer in the photo. Finally, the investigators asked for DNA samples from every fuller in the area and sent them to a lab. Experts found that one of the men was a distant descendant of Robert Fuller from that same ship. However, he was not the killer, and he did not even know that any distant relatives lived near him. The killer may have been so distantly related to him that his family never knew of the connection. The detective retired in 2017, and the case was given to a new team of investigators, Test in 2011. By that time, scientists knew a lot more about how to study genetic material, so they agreed to try to trace the killer's family tree. It took them two years. First, they used public databases to find even the most distant relatives of the killer. Then, they tried to manually trace their family ties to find people who lived in Federal Way at the time of Sarah's death. In total, they had to get rid of several thousand people before they found the right one. Sarah's clothes most likely belonged to one of her two brothers, who were 33 and 27 years old at the time of the murder. The older brother, Patrick Nicholas, turned out to be a violent criminal with a long criminal record. His DNA sample was in the FBI database, so he could not have killed Sarah because his DNA would have shown a match back in the 1990s. The younger brother, Patrick Nicholas, has also been on the police's radar. Radar for violent crimes including crimes against children. But that was before the DNA samples of such criminals were added to the database. Detectives immediately set up a surveillance of the man. The man, who was 55 at the time, lived in a nearby town called Wellington. The police had been watching his every move for two days, and soon the chance came up. Patrick went to the laundry, and while he was waiting for his clothes to be washed, he went outside to smoke. The police put it in a bag marked Evidence and went back to Patrick's car. The next time Patrick went outside to smoke, a handkerchief fell out of his pocket. The men did not pick it up and went back to the laundry room. The police were happy to take the second piece of evidence in case the experts could not get a DNA sample from the cigarette bite. However, the experts were able to get samples from all of these items easily, and the very next day they arrested the... The sperm that was found on Sarah's clothes in 1991 was a perfect match for Patrick's DNA. The judge immediately issued a warrant for the man's arrest, and the police took him into custody. It took five days from when investigators first learned his name to when he was officially charged with murder. When his biography was leaked to the media, many people began to ask why a man with such a criminal history was not even considered a suspect for all those 28 years. At age 19, Patrick Nicholas went up to a police officer and said, I am the guy who killed my mother. Young young woman and got into her car where he tried to abuse her. The victim was able to get away but she had to jump into the river and swim for a long time to get far enough away. Patrick spent four years in prison, and then he was let out. The next time the police caught him, he was trying to abuse an underage young woman. He was arrested again, but his DNA was not in any database. Patrick's biological grandfather was adopted and grew up under the adopt -a family name. One of the men who found Sarah's body as children in 1991 said Patrick was without a doubt the killer, and he admitted it. He was only 12 years old when the body was found, but the killer had known him for years. The witness was always afraid that the killer would come after him, and it was not until Patrick's arrest that he finally felt safe. Patrick's trial did not start until 2023. The man insisted he was innocent, and his lawyer tried to challenge the main evidence, DNA, which showed that Patrick Seaman was on the victim's body. Lawyer also tried to question the accuracy of the DNA analysis, but experts said that those claims were completely false. Patrick was eventually found guilty of first-degree murder without premeditation. On May 25th, he was given a sentence of 45 years and 8 months in prison, which makes it very unlikely that he will ever get out. During the reading of that sentence, Patrick did not show any emotion, 
unlike Sarah's family, who spoke to the judge about how they were thinking about Sarah. Investigators for bringing the killer to justice, even though he had avoided justice for 28 years. Share your opinion on this story in the comments, and don't forget to like the video if you liked it. Thanks for watching. The student got off the bus and was nowhere to be found. Without a trace, her body was found in a field the next day. The police looked for the killer for 39 years, but it was not until 2019 that they were able to find out what really happened. We will tell you what happened. Helene Sinsky. Helene Przinsky was born on April 6, 1958, in Huntington, which is near New York City. She was the youngest of three children. Her older brother and sister were 12 and 9 years old, respectively. The girl grew up with love and care, got along well with her older relatives, and was a positive, bright person. When she was 14, her father got a job offer, and the family had to move to the small town of Hamilton near Boston. There, she went to the local school and developed a passion for after high school. She went to Wheaton College, which was 110 kilometers from her town. It was close enough for her to visit her family often, and it also had a great writing program. Helen got used to being a college student quickly. She did well in school and was involved in college life. Eventually, she got a chance she was excited about. She was going to do an internship at a radio news station in Denver, even though the city was more than 3,000 miles away from our college. Helene was excited about the opportunity. In addition, her uncle and aunt lived in Denver and agreed to take her in for the internship. She also went with a classmate who studied journalism in January 1980. Helen, then 21, flew to Denver and began working at a radio station. Every day she had to take the bus from the office to her home. The trip took about 30 minutes after which she had to walk several miles. On January 16th, she left the radio station as usual at 6 p.m. and went to the bus stop. The only thing was that she never showed up at home. Her aunt immediately began to worry because Helen had always warned her before. If she planned to be somewhere late, the woman waited a few hours but at half past 11 she decided to go to the police after all investigators had already begun a search immediately fearing that her disappearance might be connected to a recent string of attacks on women in the area. They calmed the area along Helen's route all night, but could not find her in the morning. A woman approached the police she was driving her car through a suburban area of Denver with her children. At one point they noticed someone lying in a field near the road. The mother stopped. The car walked closer and saw the body of a young girl with no signs of life. The police arrived on the scene and immediately identified Helen. Her clothes were partially missing, her hands were tied behind her back, and all her personal belongings were also missing. Later medical experts determined that the girl had been stabbed nine times and abused. The death occurred between 8 and 10 p.m. A person who saw Helene get off the bus at 5.30 was able to be found by the cops. She had several kilometers to walk from the bus stop, and it appears that the perpetrator attacked her at that point. Law enforcement agencies surveyed the area near where the body was found, but they were unable to find almost any clues other than shoe impressions, presumably size 44, that led from the road to the body and back. By then, medical examiners had found biological material on the victim's body and clothing that appeared belonged to the killer, except that in those years it could not help the investigation because the science of studying DNA was only at an early stage of development. But the samples were sent to a laboratory for storage, hoping that they would help identify the perpetrator in the future. Police turned to the public for information using newspapers and local television they tried to find witnesses, who might have seen Helen that night. Soon they were approached by a woman who at about 10.20 p.m. saw a man near the field where the body was found. He was standing on the side of the road next to a car. Unfortunately, it was dark outside at the time, and the woman could not get a good look at the man she provided the police with, only generalities that could not help them in any way. Then the detectives took a very interesting step with the consent of the witness. They invited a hypnotist to the station, and the woman was able to remember more details on the basis of which it turned out to draw a portrait of this unknown man. It is hard to say whether the hypnosis session really helped the investigation, but the fact remains that at that time the police had nothing but this drawing, but they could not find a single suspect, and the case froze for years Helen's college diploma was given to her after she died as a way to remember her.
The school also named an alumni award after her because she was always involved in college life. The investigation was not reopened until 1998. Eighteen years after the murder by then, technology in the field of DNA research had progressed markedly, and researchers had entered samples of biological material into the FBI database. Unfortunately, no matches were found. This meant that the perpetrator had no previous criminal convictions, at least not since they began taking DNA samples from convicts 15 more years past. And in 2013, the local police department created a unit to handle unsolved cases. They reopened the investigation into Helen's murder, but no new leads could be found. A DNA sample from the victim's body never showed up in the FBI database. This meant the girl's killer had not come to the attention of the police for other possible crimes all this time. Throughout all these years, Helen's relatives and police were not the only ones trying to find the truth. The girl's high school friends with whom she was in the choir took an active part in the investigation. Decades after her murder, they continued to press detectives to review the case regularly. They also gave interviews to get the story out to the public and distributed flyers about Helen's murder along her bus route. In 2017, the case was reopened again, and this time the detectives had much more to go on by this point. Forensics had begun to make extensive use of genetic genealogy, by which the perpetrator's identity could be deduced through his relatives. Of course, this was a very complicated and time-consuming process. Moreover, this method worked only in the case if the relatives of the DNA possessor were in the publicly available genetic databases. There are several of these, and they are mostly used to search for family members in 2018. Police turned over available DNA samples to the Parabon Lab, which had already helped solve hundreds of similar cases. Experts looked at about 3,000 matches, including even distant relatives of the alleged killer. They had to get rid of people who did not fit the age range or could not have committed the crime for other reasons. In the end, they decided that the person with the DNA was probably the son of a woman named June Estes, who was dead at the time. The problem was that she had four sons, but the lab was only able to identify two of them. They were 10 and 11 years old. A year went by before something unexpected happened. A woman named Jessie put her DNA sample into a public database which was the best way to find criminals. Experts at Parabon saw that Jesse was a close relative of Helen's killer and contacted her. After a more detailed DNA test, they found that Jesse's third cousin was the killer. Detectives asked the woman for information about her family to finally find the suspect. Immediately after uploading her data into the database, the woman began collecting information about her family tree and asked both of her parents to enter their DNA into the database. Through this, Experts at Parabon determined that the killer was related to Jesse on her father's side. Unfortunately, the search for an answer will drag on for several more months. Expert detectives and Jesse's family worked together to get closer to the owner of the DNA from the murder scene, and soon it finally happened. The cops were able to reach a relative of June Estes, and he gave new details about her older sons. It turned out that the woman suffered from mental problems, and after her next breakdown, her father took the boys and took them to another town. Their names were William and Curtis, and the detectives were to find out which one of them was the killer. The answer was not long in coming. The Cavs immediately discovered that William had been incarcerated multiple times, and his DNA sample was entered into the FBI database in 2010. Given that the sample from Helen's body has been run through that database repeatedly since then, William was not the killer. The downside of this database is that it only shows a full match, not a partial match, even when brothers are involved. 39 years after the murder, the police had a prime suspect named Curtis White, who also went by the last name Clanton. It turned out that this man had a long criminal history. When he was 18, he knocked on a woman's door and asked to use her phone. Once inside, he grabbed a knife and abused the victim before running away. He was quickly caught and sentenced to 30 years in prison but he was released after only four years because he was defended. Curtis moved in and got a job as a gardener in the area where Helen was killed. He later moved to Florida, which is where the officers went to look for him in 2019. Curtis was 62 years old at the time and worked as a trucker. Before charging him with Helen's murder, investigators wanted more hard evidence. After a week's surveillance, they got a hidden DNA sample from him, but it wasn't enough. Followed to a club, he confessed to a brutal murder, life sentence granted at 82. 
Victim's family found closure after almost 40 years. Other cases possibly linked but unproven. Justice served partially. Share your opinion on this story in the comments and don't forget to like the video if you like it. Thanks for watching. A 28-year-old woman mysteriously vanished from her own home, leaving her bedroom light on. They had been looking for her for months, and the story started to sound like a detective show. The police had barely looked into the case, so the missing woman's parents turned to an independent team of former detectives. It was only thanks to them that the horrible truth came out. Kate Waring was born and raised in Charleston, South Carolina. She had two boys and loving parents who tried to give them the best of all. Kate loved animals from a young age and started volunteering at animal shelters when she was in her teens. She also danced, had many friends, and was a very positive person. It seemed like the woman grew up in a good place, and in some ways she did. However, just before she went to college, she told her parents that someone close to her family had abused her as a child. To be found, this was a big surprise for Kate's parents, who had no idea what their daughter had been going through for years. After the woman told them this terrible secret, her parents did everything they could to help her, but the effects of such a trauma only got worse over time. First, Kate had problems with alcohol, and then with drugs. At one point, her parents suggested she get help, and she agreed, home and live with her family, which was also supposed to help her deal with her problems. At the time, Kate was an adult and living on her own, but she agreed to come home anyway. At first, therapy seemed to be helping, but Kate still could not let go of the past and start living life to the fullest. The psychiatrist she went to diagnosed her with depression, but at one point, everything changed. Her father, who constantly yelled at her, died, offered to take Kate on a trip anywhere in the world she wanted. The woman was excited by the idea and soon decided she wanted to go beyond the Arctic Circle. Her dream was to see polar bears. Even though she had been hurt by animals, they started looking for tours and soon bought tickets. They were going to get to the Arctic Circle by ship, and Kate could not wait for this exciting journey. At this point, Kate's parents watched as her depression got worse. When they finally went on the trip, Kate was thrilled. She and her father had a great time and the woman gained a lot of good feelings on the ship that took them to the Arctic Circle. During the trip, Kate met another tourist from Russia. They talked and wrote to each other. By the end of the trip, Kate liked him, and after he went home, she decided to go to Russia. There, she met him again, and she even thought about staying in the country. Kate's visa was up for renewal, so she had to go back home. Despite this, it seemed like the woman had finally gotten over her depression. She planned to fix visa problems back home and even started writing a book for her kids. It seemed like her life was finally getting better. But on June 12, 2009, everything changed. Kate was home alone while her family was away on business. She always called her father to let him know she was okay, but she did not this time. He called Kate, but she did not answer. After a while, he asked his wife to come home and check on their daughter. Kate had had problems with alcohol and illegal drugs in the past, so her parents were still worried. When her mother got home, she did not find Kate there, but the light in her room was on. It looked like she had been out for a while and would be back soon. Her mother waited a few hours, but Kate still was not home. She also found that Kate had at home that needed to be taken regularly. Despite their worry, Kate's parents decided not to worry and wait for their daughter to show up. Kate was already 28 years old at the time, so they knew she could live her life. Kate's father decided to wait until Monday, when he would call the police. On Monday morning, the father got a call from the bank. An employee told him that a man had come into the office and tried to cash more checks. Kate Waring, they could not get in touch with the woman herself, and her father was in charge of her account. The whole thing seemed very strange. The woman's father knew that his daughter only had a few hundred dollars in her account, which is why the bank security service called him. They said the woman's signature looked real, and they gave the name of the man who had brought the check. His name was Ethan Mack, and he did not know him. Real One assumed that this man was a friend of his daughter's, but he still went to the police because Kate was still not talking to him. The police started looking into the man's disappearance, and the first thing they asked Ethan was about his relationship with the missing man. 
Ethan said that he had known Gay for years and that she had given him the check to pay off her old debts. He also said that he often gave her money for clothes, jewelry, and other purchases, confirmed that she and Ethan had been friends for a long time. According to them, they had never been in a relationship, but they had always been close. Ethan said that he and Kate met on Friday night and went out to eat at a restaurant. After dinner, he drove Kate home and went about his own business. He even showed the detectives letters from Kate that backed up what he said about the dinner. Ethan let the detectives look around his house, where he lived with his wife and the situation with the check was still strange to the police, so they were not in a hurry to let him go. Eventually, Ethan called the police station and asked them to leave him alone. The police tried to piece together what happened on that Friday night when Kate was last seen. She went to see her therapist in the afternoon, then to the gym, then to the store, where she bought a bottle of wine. Surveillance cameras caught her talking to someone, but they could not figure out who it was. During the investigation, she may have been talking to Ethan, who later picked her up and took her to a restaurant. The woman's parents also remembered that on the day she went missing, Kate told them she was in trouble but she would not say what it was about. They did not remember this until a few days later. Unfortunately, none of this helped in any way, and as the weeks went by and the woman was still missing, her parents thought the police were not doing enough. Kate Waring's case was given a second chance, and a group of former police officers led by a lawyer named Andy Savage took it on. This group had been looking into cold cases on their own, and Kate Waring's case interested them in particular. The group was made up of five men, all of whom had a lot of law enforcement experience. One of them was former Detective James Randolph, who first looked in Kate's bedroom. There, he noticed two suspicious things. The first was a package he was worried that she would never skip a drug on her own, and the fact that she had left the package at home was a red flag. Next, he found Chinese money on Kate's bed. This was strange because Kate's parents had no idea where the woman got the money or why she needed it. Then, a team member named Bobby Minner got involved. He was an expert at finding information about people on the internet and finding them. His skills came in handy. Kate called her friend James around 10 p.m., but he did not answer. She left him a very disturbing voicemail in which she said that someone had stolen her credit cards. He went on to find out that her phone was last used at 1.53 a.m when she called her own voicemail box number. For some reason, Bobby found out that the haul was made from the James Island area, which was just a few miles from Kate's house. He talked to a few people he knew who lived in James Island and found out something strange. Ethan Mack, who had agreed to let the police check out his and his mother's house, did not actually live there. Instead, he rented an apartment in a nearby building. Eugene was very lucky to find out these details because one of his close friends turned out to be the owner of the apartment Ethan had rented. As the team of detectives dug deeper, they found out that Ethan Mack had the team decided to look into the case on their own. They found out that Ethan had a girlfriend named Heather Camp. When they asked Kate's parents if they knew the woman, Kate's mother told them a strange story about how she met Heather a month before she went missing. She and Kate were on the same train from Washington, D.C., where the woman was having trouble getting her visa to Russia. After meeting Ethan, the woman was going to Russia. Kate agreed to help and loaned her a certain amount of money. A few days later, Heather told Kate that her daughter had died in a car accident in New Jersey, which made no sense. Heather did not go to New Jersey, and her behavior suggested that her daughter's death did not bother her. Another strange fact was that an Indiana fraud case had been filed against Heller. This was because she was pretending to be a licensed doctor and forging the necessary documents. The team gathered a lot of information that made them look at the case from a different angle. They gave all of this information to the police, but they did not want to look into the case any further. The team realized that the only way to get the police to look into the case was to give them false information. In order to find out what happened to Ethan, the team took extreme measures. First, Eugene Frazier asked a friend who rented Ethan's apartment to put a hidden camera in front of the door. They also put a hidden GPS tracker on Ethan's car. This let the team track his movements and see what he was up to. It was not long before it paid off. After looking at Ethan's itinerary, 
the former detectives figured out that he had been to follow his steps and found out that at each of these pawn shops, the man sold different pieces of jewelry in small batches. Unfortunately, they could not find out if the jewelry belonged to Kate, but the detectives felt like they were getting close to a clue. After a while, they ran into a big problem. The owner of the apartment where Ethan and Heather were staying told them that he was going to kick them out for not paying rent. The team knew that if they moved out, they would lose so. They tried hard to persuade the owner not to do it. At the same time, the detectives quickly came up with a new plan. They asked the owner to give Ethan and Heather more time to pay their rent, but they had to sign a contract promising to pay it back. This trick worked, and as soon as the landlord gave the team this contract, they sent it to the lab. Their goal was to compare Ethan and he to see if they were the same person. Signature on the very check for $4,000. And here they have their long-awaited break. The specialist said with absolute certainty that the signature on the check was written by the same person who had signed Heather on the contract. This meant that it was Heather who had forged Kate's signature. But the team knew that the lazy police would not listen to them. So they came up with a new plan. Ethan that the apartment needed to be treated for bucks. The head of the team put on an exterminator suit and went to the apartment with the owner ahead of time. The detectives waited until Ethan left the apartment and noticed that his car had pulled away from the house. When James and the owner went inside, they got an unpleasant surprise. Ethan was at home. It turned out that Heather was driving his car, but it was too late to call off the whole operation, so James had to change his plans. James listened to the story about the need to get rid of the bugs and asked Ethan to wait outside the apartment while dangerous chemicals were sprayed. Ethan, who did not suspect anything, agreed and went outside at the same time James started to carefully search the apartment for any evidence that might link Ethan to Kate's disappearance. James looked in Ethan's backpack and looked at what was inside. Chinese money was the first clue, since the same bills were on Kate's bed. James could not find any more clues, so he and the landlord pretended to do the processing and left. The team had to come up with a new plan. When they looked at the camera footage in front of Ethan's apartment, they noticed that one man came in a lot. It turned out that this man was a neighbor of the couple named Terry Williams. The detective thought that Williams might know something about Ethan and Heather's role in Kate's disappearance, so they took a risk and decided to would tell the police what Williams' friends had done to Kate. They took the bag of cash and went to William's apartment with this offer. However, the detectives were in for a surprise. When they knocked on William's door and told him about their offer, Heather was there and heard everything. It turned out that Heather was cheating on Ethan with Williams. When Heather heard the detectives talking to Williams, she got scared. She called Ethan and screamed. Williams over the next few days, they tried to figure out what to do next. But then another surprise happened. William called them and invited them to his house for a talk. When the detectives got there, he told them that Ethan and Heather had not told him anything directly, but he thought they had done something bad to Kate. He then took an iPod off the shelf and said that Heather had given it to him just days after Kate went missing. iPod. And thanks to the serial number, they were able to figure out that it did belong to Kate. This set of clues was enough to send the team back to the Charleston Police Department, and this time the local cops could not shrug off the job. After looking at everything the team had found, they finally arrested Ethan and Heather. At the first interview, Heather agreed to help with the investigation as long as the police helper got minimal punishment. Wadmala Island, about 20 miles from her home, the police sent out a search party and combed the area all day. But Kate's body was not there. It soon became clear that Heather had just lied to them. Andy Savage then came up with another plan. He knew that Heather was probably involved in Kate's murder. But he met with her and said he would help. Heather is sure that this is her only chance. And Kate agrees. She said that Kate's body is still on the outskirts of Wadmala Island, near Polly Point Road. She also gave a specific location. The detectives went there without the police, and they were disappointed when they did not find Kate. But the next day, they went back, and they did. The woman's remains were found, but medical examiners could not figure out what killed her. In August 2009, Heather signed a confession to murder, obstructing justice, and check fraud. The police found that the woman had been a con artist for years, and on that train from Washington, D.C., she chose Kate as her next victim. She later started dating Ethan, but he was not in a hurry to plead guilty. 
and his trial started in October 2010. On the day she went missing, Kate found out that Heather had cheated on her and stolen her credit cards. She threatened to tell her father, who would probably call the police. Heather told Ethan, who sided with her even though she had been friends with Kate for a long time. According to the investigation, Kate had dinner that night with Ethan and Heather. Heather was also there. Heather may have promised Kate that she would return the credit cards and money that were in Ethan's apartment. When all three of them got to the restaurant, Heather could not take it anymore and attacked Kate. The court did not believe Heather's story and gave her 39 years in prison. Ethan, on the other hand, got 25 years. The difference is because Heather was also charged with fraud. It could be the basis for detective movies. On the one hand, we have Kate who was hurt badly as a child and turned to alcohol and other drugs. She found the strength to change her life for the better and beat her depression. On the other hand, we have the sad fact that her life was cut short by a mix of betrayal and greed. Ethan Mack was her close friend for years, but he killed her for the sake of his new lover. When they found out that the woman had a history of drug problems, they put the case on hold. This is where people with useful skills and a desire for justice came to the rescue. A group of independents did more than the entire police department and it was only because of them that the killers were sent to jail and Kate's family was relieved of the heavy burden of ignorance. It is important to note that not a single police officer was involved in the case to the truth. And what do you think about these minor infractions? Is it possible to use surveillance and fake searches to show that someone killed someone? Leave your thoughts in the comments. And if you like the movie, do not forget to click the likes button. During a fire, a 19-year-old student was discovered dead in her own apartment, but the fire was not the cause of her death at all. The detective realized right away that they were dealing with a murder, but there was little to no evidence to support their suspicions. The police have many suspects, but only one tiny, seemingly insignificant detail helped them solve the case. Missy Gruba was born on April 26, 1974 in the American city of Burleson. Texas. Because of her family's humble lifestyle, she worked a variety of part-time jobs during her school year to help pay for her own schooling. Missy decided that she wanted to be a teacher even before graduating, and in 1992, she enrolled at the University of Texas at Arlington, which was about 40 kilometers from her home. Missy also decided to rent a place closer to campus and work two jobs to pay her rent and tuition without the help of her parents, but sometimes even that wasn't enough to cover a bill. In addition, she received good grades and participated actively in the local church even before graduation. Despite having a busy schedule, Missy called her mother every day when she got home. It had become a tradition for them that their daughter would call her and let her know that she had returned from work, even if it was already night. On the evening of April 7, 1994, Missy also called her mother. They spoke for about 10 hours. The young woman was in the middle of her senior year of high school. Around 3 a.m., Missy's downstairs neighbor called the police to report hearing loud noises coming from the apartment upstairs, including breaking glass and banging. Thinking there might have been a robbery going on, she called the police. The squad arrived on the scene, and a short time later, the fire department received a call to the same address. It turned out that there had been a fire. Since the building was small, the firefighters were able to locate the source of the fire, which was Missy's apartment on the second floor. When the firefighters entered the apartment, they saw a terrible sight. The young woman was lying on the bed with no clothes on, and the fire was raging all around her. The firefighters immediately realized she was dead so as to evacuate the residence. When the firefighters first arrived at the young woman's apartment, they smelled a strong gasoline odor. After thoroughly inspecting the apartment, the firefighters were confident that they were dealing with intentional arson. Someone had stabbed the young woman several times, leaving numerous bloody wounds on the bed. As for the fire itself, the firefighters immediately believed that it was purposeful arson as well as when they first arrived at her apartment they smelled a strong gasoline odor. Dead young woman inside, but the arsonist had shut the front door. 
reducing the size of the fire and making it difficult for the flames to continue to burn. The police quickly identified the deceased as Missy Gruba, and while her body was handed over to the medical examiners, they came to the conclusion that she had passed away before the fire began. This was supported by the stab wounds on her body and the absence of smoke tra. They also discovered that the girl had been abused and were able to obtain a sample of the abuser's DNA as a result. The police discovered a knife in Missy's apartment that they believed to be the murder weapon but there were no prints on it and it appeared the killer had washed it in the sink before setting it on fire. The DNA sample from the victim's body was also ineffective. The police had their first lead almost immediately because it turned out that Missy had filed a police report on a co-worker she had worked with at the coffee shop a young guy had lost his place and was looking for someone to stay with for a while until he could find a new apartment of all his co-workers. Missy was the only one who agreed to help and let him stay with he regardless of her. The co-worker only stayed there for a few days. One day, Missy returned from work and was about to deposit the day's tips into her piggy bank. She continued to set aside small sums to supplement her tuition and rent until she had nearly $1,000 saved up. However, that day, the young woman discovered that all of her money had vanished. Since no one else had spare keys, she immediately accused her co-worker. He denied wrongdoing, but Missy insisted. When the young woman went to the police, the man may have harbored resentment toward her and decided to exact revenge. If he hadn't known that Missy had already done so, he might have killed her just to prevent her from doing it. The police began looking for this man. He had quit his job and vanished, so the investigators had a pretty good suspect. The man had the keys to Mrs. Apartment, so he had no trouble getting in. The letters were found in the victim's apartment, and judging from their contents, he and Missy were having some sort of relationship. They didn't live too far apart, but they frequently wrote to and from each other. The young woman was a devout Christian who had never had a boyfriend. She also mentioned in her letters that she wouldn't be ready for an intimate relationship until she was married. Her companion initially shared this viewpoint, but over time the letter's contents grew more explicit. The detectives were pleased with their discovery and decided to run the man through the database. To their surprise, they learned that he had a prior conviction for violent crimes. Given that Missy had also been seen before the murder, this was enough to make the young man a suspect. He was found and questioned, but he denied any involvement and had no good alibi. The boy claimed he was sleeping alone in his house when Missy was killed, but Missy was killed between midnight and 3 in the morning. So his claim had a third suspect, the man. Itchment of the cafe where Missy worked told them about an incident that occurred just before her death. The young woman reported to the manager that one of her co-workers, Jeff, had stolen some items or money from the cash register. The theft charges were confirmed and the man was fired afterwards. He later caught up with Missy and started accusing her of losing his job and leaving him without a livelihood. During this conversation, he said he was going to kill himself. During this conversation, he said he was going to kill himself. During all of this was more than enough for the police to question the man. But while the detectives were attempting to learn his address, something unexpected occurred. Jeff's girlfriend entered the station and claimed she was afraid of her boyfriend and suspected him of killing Missy. It turned out that the man had not been home the night of the murder and he had never been there before. When he was found and brought in for questioning, Jeff acted very brazen and kept smiling. He bombarded the detectives with various stories that were inconsistent with reality claiming that Missy was actually obsessed with him and wanted to date him and that was why his behavior was so bad. The man repeatedly mentioned the story that he had been fired because of a complaint from Missy and he had been furious about what she had done. When the detective said that Jeff's girlfriend denied this alibi and that he was at home with her the night of the murder, he just laughed and said that Jeff did agree to provide his DNA sample voluntarily given that there was no evidence against him and the DNA analysis could have taken over a month. However, a few days later, Jeff's girlfriend called the police, upset and reported that the man had kidnapped her. He held her hostage for eight hours, threatening to kill her if she tried to flee. Eventually, he released her and the young woman immediately called the police. They started looking for Jeff right away but he had already escaped. Despite this, the detectives were almost certain that he was responsible for Missy's murder. They put out a search for him on a kidnapping charge, but the man seemed to have vanished. Meanwhile, 
Experts at the lab were able to almost certain that Jeff was the murderer, but the lab's results disproved the theory. As a result, they were left with only one suspect who had not provided his DNA sample and who had not yet been found. A colleague of the victim who she had allowed to stay with her but a month had passed since the murder and the plea police were shocked to learn that both samples from Jeff and Missy's boyfriend had a different blood type. As mentioned earlier, Missy occasionally worked as a nanny. One of her regular clients was a young couple who lived in the same complex. They had a young child and the woman was pregnant with her second or partners. Missy's mother called the investigators and said she remembered a strange detail the young woman had told her on the phone a few days before she died. She didn't give it much thought and didn't decide to share with the police until a month later. According to the mother's account, a few days before her daughter's death, a man came to Missy's house to talk even though it was getting close to nightfall she let him and Lewis told her that his relationship with the young woman had been strained recently and that he just needed someone to talk to but what followed was something that struck the police as extremely strange Missy said to her mother that after the chow, she told her that after the chow. Lewis told her that he was going to detectives found it difficult to believe that a 32-year-old man and his father would visit a 19-year-old woman's home at midnight and then engage in a pillow fight. But according to Missy's account of the incident, that is exactly what happened in a conversation with her mother. Missy didn't give it much thought, but the police decided to check on the man and discovered that Lewis had no criminal history, had served in the army, and was a model employee at the restaurant. But Lewis said, I hope they catch whoever killed and raped Missy as soon as possible. He later added that they might never find the offender because all the evidence was destroyed in the fire. The problem was that the police never revealed that the victim had been abused before she died. It wasn't in the newspapers or reports, and it wasn't mentioned in any interviews. The man was calm and forthright in his responses to all of the police inquiries until the detectives asked him for a DNA sample, at which point Lewis became visible, nervous and questioned why they needed his DNA since the fire was supposed to destroy all traces of the perpetrator and his sample would have nothing to compare it to. The man said that he and Missy did talk a lot but that he had nothing to do with her murder. Lewis' behavior changed dramatically when the detectives told him they had a sample of the killer's DNA. He said he urgently needed to take his child somewhere and left the station promising to return the next day to take the DNA test but he never did. It is important to note that the police also withheld the fact that the experts received a sample of the killer's DNA so no one knew whether they had this evidence or not. Man was no longer working there. The manager reported that the man's girlfriend had called and asked for Lewis to take a few days off because he had to leave town. Additionally, the detectives learned that Lewis had married his girlfriend the day after he was questioned. At this point, they could only speculate as to the motivation behind the marriage, but first they decided to speak with his wife, who revealed that Lewis had called her from work the day of the murder and announced that he was going to leave town. Lewis told his wife that he had run by Missy's house and noticed the fire. He went up to her apartment and saw that the place was engulfed in flames and the young woman herself was lying on the bed. Lewis tried to save her by giggling. He returned after 2 a.m. and his wife noticed that he smelled strongly of smoke and gasoline. The man was also coughing constantly and his nose had traces of soot. His wife asked him what had happened, forced him to run outside reportedly his wife was pleased with the story, and they went to bed as you have already realized the detectives found a number of suspicious his points in the story even setting aside the fact that the man decided to go for a run in the middle of the night. His further story defies any sense of reason. First, how could he have gotten into Missy's apartment without keys after the fire forensics found no evidence of forced entry on the door according to Lewis's account? He entered the victim's apartment after she had already passed away. Additionally, if his account is to be believed, Lewis decided to go to bed after witnessing the death of a young woman he had known for a year and a full-fledged fire in the home next door. His wife, it appears, did not feel the need to intervene either. The police also learned Lewis's blood type from his wife and it matched the blood type found on the victim, sufficient to place a man on the wanted list, but his whereabouts remained unknown. The wife also claimed that she didn't know where her husband had gone, but the detectives didn't believe her by that point. Instead, they suspected that the woman was purposefully protecting Lewis because, in their opinion, 
he had given her a significantly altered account of the murder in which he had no choice or Missy had attacked him herself. In other words, he had persuaded her under false pretense immediately after Lewis's wife gave them information about where he might be. Police from the city of San Antonio discovered a burnt-out car that belonged to Lewis and that his mother lived in the same city. Detectives went there and found the man, who was then arrested at the station. He acted extremely tense, lying on the floor sobbing, and generally looked like he was on the verge of a breakdown. Lewis's story then turned genuinely bizarre when he said he didn't remember how events unfolded after that but he may have stabbed her while denying that he had set the apartment on fire. The man did not actually deny his involvement in setting the fire. This account did not go well with the fact that the young woman's body was found with many wounds and bruises, let alone the fire. Given that Lewis did not directly confess, the case went to trial and the man continued to maintain that he and Missy had a consensual intimate relationship that night. This made the detective's job difficult, but now they could take a sample of his DNA at that point. They already knew that Lewis's blood type matched the killer's, and all they had to do was wait for the DNA results. Eventually, the experts found a perfect match, and Lewis was charged with murder. According to the investigation, Lewis claimed that he did not remember stabbing Missy but did remember getting a knife from the kitchen. He also claimed that he remembered that there was a fire in the room but that he did not start it. Lewis had long had a crush on Missy and was even somewhat obsessed with her because of this one intriguing fact. He had lived in her condominium and worked in the same restaurant as her for almost a year. In addition, in the days prior to the murder, Lewis had visited Missy around midnight for no apparent reason, which also seemed odd to the investigators. According to their version, Lewis had gone to her apartment on the night of the murder in order to persuade Missy to have intimate contact with the young woman who was the victim of the murder. There were hundreds of similar complexes in their city, so it would be logical to assume that Lewis had chosen this particular place in order to live closer to Missy. Possibly the story about the run and the attempt to save Missy came about only after investigators began to suspect Lewis and informed him that the fine had not destroyed the killer's DNA upon learning this Lewis could have persuaded his wife to believe the story about the run and the attempt to save Missy. He and Lewis flew into a rage. He abused her then killed her and went to get gasoline after setting the apartment on fire. He returned home and told his wife some made-up story in which he detectives theorized that Lewis had married her only so she would be legally entitled to not testify against him. As for Lewis himself, the court sentenced him to life in prison with the possibility of petitioning for parole in 2034. However, aside from the young woman receiving CPR, it appears that his wife really didn't know the truth. She was also not charged in any way. The court determined that he had long sought to seduce the young woman and eventually decided to commit the crime after which he saw only one way out to kill Missy to avoid prison. As a result, the court concluded that he had long sought to seduce the young woman and eventually decided to commit the crime after which he saw only one way out to kill Missy to avoid prison. The police were able to solve a very complicated case in which the most improbable was the culprit they only attracted attention to. Lewis may have gotten away with it if it weren't for that small detail, and Jeff was eventually apprehended and sentenced to four years in prison for kidnapping his own girlfriend. Share your opinion on this story in the comments and don't forget to like if you liked the video. Thanks for watching. A 16-year-old girl went out for a run and disappeared. The police launched an investigation that would eventually last for 38 years. When the truth did come out, people were literally shocked. It turned out that the case could have been solved in just a few weeks, but instead, it took almost four decades to find answers. In this video, we tell you what happened to Joyce McLean. Joyce McLean was born on September 4, 1963, when she was young. Her family moved to a tiny town called Melnocket, located almost on the edge of the United States. From an early age, she had a passion for music. The girl quickly mastered several instruments, but her favorite was the saxophone. She loved to compose her own compositions and was a member of the school music group. In addition, she was a member of the cheerleading team, played soccer, and in general was a very active participant in school life. At the end of the summer vacation in 1980, Joyce was preparing for her approaching age of 17. 
She had only recently received her driver's license, and she planned to go to the lakeshore with her friends and relatives to celebrate her birthday. She was even going to invite a local musical group to celebrate her birthday. Joyce had two more grades to finish after which she planned to go to college. The girl was preparing for this in advance, so she studied only with honors, as well as earning various sports and musical achievements. On August 8th, she and her friends spent the day at the lake. Afterward, she decided to go for a run. Joyce loved sports, but running was not her favorite activity. Despite that, she was going to play in high school soccer games during the new school year and she made every effort to keep herself in shape. The girl went out for a run at about 7.30 p.m. Normally, she would run with her friend, but she was busy that night. Joyce had a standard route. She would do a few laps on the road that went around her tiny town. It usually took about an hour, but that night, the girl never made it home. Several hours had passed since Joyce had left, and her mother was beginning to get seriously worried. The girl always let her parents know where she was going, and if she had gone for a walk with friends after her run, her parents would have already known about it. Her mother decided to go looking for her and drove around town in her car. She asked around all the neighbors who came her way, but no one had seen Joyce, considering the vast majority of the people in this small town knew each other. A few more people joined the search. Night was approaching, and the girl was still nowhere to be found. Then the concerned parents decided to call the police. Local officers immediately joined the search, and in the hours that followed, more and more citizens took to the streets. They combed the route Joyce was running, as well as the area behind the school. Unfortunately, there was no sign of Joyce. With each passing hour, panic increased, and there was little hope of finding Joyce alive and unharmed. It was the middle of the night, and the police had completely ruled out the possibility she might have gone out with some friends. The problem was that everyone she knew was at home and later joined the search. Joyce's parents simply couldn't imagine their daughter deciding to go out alone until very late at night. They were unable to locate her, and the search dragged on for two days. During that time, police officers, along with residents, continued to explore the area until they finally made the heartbreaking discovery on August 10th. Joyce's body was found just 60 yards from the school playgrounds, not far from the trees. The girl was lying on the ground. Virtually all of her clothes were missing, and her hands were tied behind her back with a piece of blue cloth. The police immediately realized that the victim had been hit hard in the head, but a more detailed analysis was to be done by a medical expert. After examining the body, they concluded that the girl had received multiple blows to the head and that her death occurred on the evening of the same day she disappeared. Despite the almost total lack of clothing, the unknown perpetrator did not abuse her. Unfortunately, no other information could be obtained. There were no foreign DNA samples on the body, and even in the early 1980s, the technology was only in its infancy. The first person in history to be convicted thanks to DNA testing was not arrested until 1987. So, the police were faced with a complex investigation with a minimal set of clues. Shortly after the discovery of the body, officers discovered Joyce's clothes, but that did not bring them any closer to a solution either. News of the brutal murder quickly spread through the town plunging it into a very grim state. As is usually the case, the inhabitants of such tiny towns in the middle of nowhere had never encountered a murder. Adding to the anxiety was the fact that the killer was still out there, and his identity remained unknown. Given the complete lack of evidence, several theories swept through the town. The most popular theory was that Joyce's body had been found near a place where less fortunate youths congregated. They often drank alcohol there at night and also took illegal substances. People thought that a group of such tipsy guys might have molested Joyce and things got out of hand. The police even checked with locals who regularly spent time in those groups, but they were unable to establish their involvement. Another theory was that the killer might have been a man who came for seasonal work. Hundreds of people came to this area on a regular basis since there were not enough local people to fill all the jobs. But even here, the police could not find any evidence. Some even began to suspect the volunteer who discovered Joyce's body. The fact was that he had spent most of his time surveying the area in tandem with another volunteer. On the morning of the last day, however, he went out to search alone. Because of this, there was a theory that he was involved. But even here, the police could not confirm his guilt. 
there was another version. It turned out that the same night Joyce disappeared. There had been a serious accident not far from the city. A 19-year-old local resident had snuck into a garage and stolen a gas tanker before crashing into another vehicle. He sustained serious head injuries and slipped into a coma for nine days, making it impossible for the police to question him. And when he woke up, he pleaded not guilty. The investigators didn't know what to do next. They had no evidence or witnesses. As a result, the case went into a long drawer for years, during which time the police were unable to get any closer to a clue. Eight years later, Joyce's relatives created a petition calling for coverage of their daughter's murder on a national unsolved crime show. This would get the word out to viewers across America and draw the attention of potential witnesses. There is always the possibility that someone heard or saw something but, for some reason, did not report it to the police. The petition gathered 6,000 signatures, and the authors of the program agreed to do their own story. It was broadcasted in 1989, and the police did indeed receive a lot of appeals, but all of the collected information turned out to be either erroneous or outright false. Unfortunately, this happens in almost every well-known case. People either make mistakes or simply lie and fabricate non-existent facts forcing the police to waste time and resources on checks. The case stalled for several more years, but all the while, Joyce's mother continued to fight for the truth. In the mid-2000s, she decided that new technology and techniques in forensics could help uncover evidence that had been missed in the 1980s. To do so, experts needed to exhume the victim's body, but there were challenges. Initially, Authorities denied the mother's request for an exhumation. They believed that in almost three decades, any possible evidence simply had not been preserved. But the woman continued to insist, and in 2007, she managed to move the issue forward. The medical expert Peter Cummings of Massachusetts contributed greatly to this effort. He was born in East Mill Market and was only five years old at the time of Joyce's murder. Despite such a young age, he remembered well the horror in which his town had been plunged. Peter admitted that it was these events that guided him into the field of forensics and medicine. When he learned that the authorities had rejected Joyce's mother's petition for an exhumation, he contacted her and asked her not to abandon the idea. Peter believed that the remains might have been preserved enough to try to extract evidence from them. He also contacted one of the leading forensic experts in the United States, and he took an interest in the case. Joyce's mother decided to take the initiative and organize an independent examination. The exhumation required about $20,000, which the family did not have, but they had the support of concerned people who, after so many years, still remembered the case. With their help, the family quickly raised the necessary amount, and the exhumation took place in 2008. To the surprise of many, experts did unearth some important evidence, but at the time, they kept this information secret. Investigators only said that the discovery would not be followed by any immediate arrest, but the police immediately reopened the case. A few months later, it was reported that unidentified people had desecrated Joyce's grave. The police said they did not know if it had anything to do with the murder investigation. The next major twist came a year later, in 2009, and that moment may have been pivotal as law enforcement announced a prime suspect for the first time in 29 years. Let's take it back to 1980 as we recall a few hours after Joyce's murder. A local man stole a gasoline truck and got into a serious accident, causing him to fall into a coma. That man was 19-year-old Scott Fournier, and in 2009, he was put on the bench for possession of illegal material with minors. It seemed like the two cases were unrelated, except after the sentencing. The judge suddenly announced Scott as a person of interest in the Joyce McLean murder case, urging the man to confess to what he had done. This news greatly surprised Joyce's relatives. They were well acquainted with Scott and knew that the police were considering him as a suspect because of that accident. But why had a judge officially declared him a person of interest after a long 29 years? The lead detective in the case declined to comment on the situation. He only said that they had made significant progress since the exhumation and the investigation was well underway. Scott was already 55 years old at the time and refused to plead guilty. The case went to trial, and he spent nearly two years in jail awaiting his first hearing because he didn't have $300,000 for bail. The trial didn't begin until 2018, 
and the public finally learned something really strange. It turned out that Scott had repeatedly confessed to killing Joyce just weeks after the fact. On one occasion, he cried and confessed to his mother and sister that he had killed Joyce. On other occasions, he told a local priest, an acquaintance of a married couple, and a co-worker of his. Some of these confessions did not reach the police until years later, but some became known almost immediately. Scott was questioned, but he began to deny his guilt. He referred to the head injury he sustained in the accident. According to him, he really thought he killed Joyce but now believes that in reality, it never happened. He was questioned a total of 27 times, and Scott kept changing his story. At first, he told the police that he killed Joyce by stabbing her several times with a glass insulator from a power line that was lying nearby. The girl was indeed killed right under the power line. Scott further stated that he tied her hands, abused her, and fled. The police were confused by one fact in this story. Firstly, they were unable to identify the exact murder weapon, even though a glass insulator was found near the body. Second, Joyce had not been abused, as the medical examiner's report attested. But otherwise, his story was very close to the truth. In the following interrogations, he stated that he had killed Joyce in the company of other guys. Then he said he had just watched them attack her. He then changed his statement again and said that these guys forced him to participate in the crime. There were many stories like this, and during the investigation phase, the detectives just got confused. They had no hard evidence against Scott, and his story changed every time they questioned him. For this reason, he was not arrested all those years. It was only in time that they managed to gather enough evidence to bring the case to trial. Two witnesses helped in this, a priest and a colleague of Scott's who both heard him confess. The colleague asked Scott how he got away with it, and Scott replied that he had simply filled the police with false accounts of other people's involvement and that it threw them off the scent. The colleague reported the conversation to his superiors but not to the police. Apparently, they never passed the information on to law enforcement. He admitted to the priest that he did not abuse Joyce because she was on her period at the time, and that was a key factor. The police never divulged this information, although they became aware of it after examining the girl's body. It turns out that Scott simply could not have known such details unless he himself was the killer. Scott's attorneys insisted that all the evidence was circumstantial. They wrote off their client's confessions to the head injury he sustained in the accident. They also cited the fact that the police did not arrest him immediately after he first confessed to the murder. In addition, the attorneys rebuked the court for refusing to consider other suspects. For example, they tried to pin the blame on the man who discovered Joyce's body, Peter Larley. That morning, he was to go in search of the girl paired with another volunteer. They had arranged to meet at 6 a.m., but Peter never showed up. Later. The volunteer learned that he had gone out early and found the body. But there's an odd point here too. This volunteer's sister lived next door to Peter, and on the morning of that day, she saw the man leave the house at dawn. According to the woman, he had a large gym bag in his hands, and when he returned home after finding the body, he looked happy and smiling. This story seems dubious, if only for the reason that the volunteer did not report all of this to the police until 16 years after the murder. That already seems strange, and it is impossible to verify the authenticity of his words. Unfortunately, Peter Larley died of a heart attack just two days before Scott's arrest. For this reason, no one will ever know why he came out earlier, but the police said that there is no evidence that he was involved in the murder. The prosecution denied all the arguments of the defense. They assured them that the police had looked at all possible suspects and had not been able to find even a hint of their involvement. Scott, on the other hand, gave many reasons for suspicion. Even his stepfather told the police early in the investigation that he suspected Scott of the murder. According to him, a few days before the incident, the boy said he planned to start running in the evenings. He also mentioned that he felt sympathy for Joyce. Moreover, when Scott first confessed to the murder, he was asked to show where he had attacked Joyce. The boy led investigators to the exact spot where the body was found. They cited several other witnesses to corroborate the theory that he was involved. On the evening of Joyce's murder, at about 9 p.m., a couple saw Scott run by the scene of Joyce's murder with a bottle of liquor in his hands, except, according to them, an unknown young man was running beside him. 
They didn't know at the time that's where the girl's body would be found, but they later reported it to the police. An hour and a half earlier, two local teenagers had also seen Scott and an unidentified young male running through that area. The trial lasted just over two weeks, and the final verdict was handed down on February 5, 2018. Scott was found guilty of Joyce's murder, sentencing him to 45 years in prison. At the time, the man was 57 years old, a sentence that virtually guaranteed he would spend the rest of his life behind bars. In 2019, Scott's attorneys appealed, which helped them schedule a new hearing. The court, however, did not change the original sentence. According to the judge, the evidence against the perpetrator was exhaustive, and all the arguments of the defense had no weight. Joyce's relatives lifted from their shoulders the heavy weight of ignorance that had been with them for 38 years. All the time, they had fought for the truth, and it was her mother who contributed the most. This woman dedicated her life to getting justice. Eventually, she went even further and helped pass a law that enabled the authorities to start allocating substantial funds for the creation of unsolved homicide squads. One obscure point remains in the whole story. Who was the other guy seen by witnesses? Scott's involvement here is almost obvious. He knew so many details that the police never disclosed publicly. It just can't be written off as conjecture. But what about the two groups of witnesses who told the police the same thing? Could it be that Scott committed this crime in the company of some other person? This point is also questionable. After Joyce was killed, Scott stole a gasoline truck and had an accident, but he was the only one in the car. Where did his supposed partner go? Is it possible that they separated immediately after the murder? And yet, the version of the second killer seems dubious. Share your opinion on this story and don't forget to like if you liked the video. Thanks for watching for This gruesome story that took place in England over the years has become one of the most famous criminal cases in the country. A young woman was killed while walking in the park with her two-year-old son, who was the only witness. The police couldn't find the perpetrator for 16 years, and when the case was finally solved, they were accused of catastrophic mishandling. It turned out they had committed numerous mistakes that cost the lives of many people. In this video, we will show you how a single murder case evolved into something much larger over 16 years and how it all came to an end. was born on November 23, 1968, in a village near Colchester, England. She grew up in a decent full family. Her father was an army officer, and her mother was a housewife. From an early age, the young woman took part in various volunteer programs helping the elderly and children with disabilities. At age 11, she enrolled at Colchester High School for Girls, where she was active in dance, singing, and acting. All of her teachers insisted that the young woman had real talent and should develop in that direction. However, Rachel herself was more deeply into the study of history and English. After school, she got a job as a lifeguard at the pool in Richmond. Rachel later planned to try her hand at hosting a television program for children in 1988 when she was 20 years old. Rachel met her future husband, Andre. The couple began dating, and a year later, they had a son Alex together. Other they moved to an area of London called Bella. By then, she had already been offered a job as a model but she decided to devote her full attention to her family for a few years and then tried to get a job in television. On a summer morning, July 15, 1992, Rachel took her son and their Labrador for a walk in the local park. At the time, Alex was only a month away from his third birthday. This park in Wimbledon's common neighborhood was popular with the locals. There were always a lot of people there during the daytime mostly parents with children and dog walkers. Despite this, because of the large area and the abundance of greenery, it was always possible to get away from prying eyes and enjoying nature and solitude. Unfortunately, there was a downside to this. At about 10.06 a.m., a woman walking in the park noticed a gruesome scene a young woman was lying on the ground. There was a lot of blood around, and a small child was sitting next to her. The victim was Rachel. Several dozen police officers arrived on the scene. They had to cordon off an area of four square kilometers where there were hundreds of potential witnesses and possibly the killer detective soon realized that none of the park's visitors had seen either the moment of the attack or the killer himself. No one except for one witness Rachel's son Alex they were to get all the information from the two-year-old boy. 
Of course, this was extremely difficult to do. The child was first admitted to the hospital for examination to make sure he was not injured. Later, the detectives did get some information from him. He said he and his mother were approached by a tall thin white man with brown hair everyone in the park was questioned it took the police almost an entire day but it only took a few hours for reporters to get the whole country to hear about this gruesome crime rachel's case instantly caused a wide resonance which is not surprising a young mother died in front of her child in one of the most popular parks in london residents of britain were even more shocked when the newspaper leaked information from the pathologists report rachel had been stabbed 49 times with a sharp object there was enormous pressure on the Metropolitan Police Society demanded that the sadists be caught and punished as quickly as possible, and detectives did indeed have to work at an accelerated pace. In the first few weeks, they interviewed 548 men, 32 of whom were even arrested for a short period of time, but all to no avail. The police simply had no leads. The only thing the experts were able to find was a tiny piece of organic material that they thought might be connected to the killer. But in 1992, technology simply didn't allow them to study it. By September, investigators were left with no suspects, so they enlisted the help of Paul Britton, a renowned profiler, to compile a description of the killer. Here's what he came up with. He is a man in his late 20s to early 30s, most likely living alone. All of his hobbies are also socially unrelated. He's interested in knives and the occult and has sadistic fantasies. In addition, he lives near the park at the request of the police department. This profile, along with this catch, was shown on television. After that, they received at least four calls, all with the same matching name Colin Francis Stagg. In addition to the fact that he fit the sketch, the police ran his name and realized that he had already been on their radar. The fact is that the stag had tried to enter the park the day Rachel was killed. Colin Stegg, 27, had led a secluded lifestyle. He had lost his job and was struggling to find money to pay for housing and food. He had a dog that he walked every morning in Wimbledon Common Park. According to his testimony, on the day Rachel was killed, he went there with his dog, but because of a severe headache, he quickly went home and went to bed. Toward evening, he felt better and decided to take his dog out for a walk again. However, on this approach to the park, he was stopped by the police. Stay calmly answered all questions and gave his details. The police had no evidence against Egg, but he seemed to them to be a suitable candidate for the role of the killer. In addition, the press kept pressuring law enforcement agencies, and they needed a breakthrough in the case urgently that same day Stagg was brought to the police station where he was held for three days when questioned he denied any involvement in the murder. But the detectives were beginning to believe more and more the opposite first occult books were found in his home, which coincided with the profiler's suggestion. Second, the police were able to find two women who gave some disturbing details about Stagg. One woman accused him of exposing himself in front of her in that very part. In his defense, Collins said he was just sunbathing in a secluded part of the park, and the woman came there herself. Another woman reported that she had been exchanging intimate letters with him for some time in one of them, and he confessed to her that he dreamed of having sexual intercourse outdoors. All this was already enough for the police to consider Colin a pervert and finally believe his involvement in the murder of Rachel, except they knew that all these circumstantial arguments would not stand a chance in court. For this reason, the man had to be released on the advice of his lawyer he agreed to pay a fine for exposing himself to a woman in the park though he continued to insist on his innocence detectives, along with a profiler, came up with a very unusual plan that was supposed to help force a confession. A Metropolitan Police officer under the pseudonym Lissy James began writing column letters of intimate content. She said she knew the woman stake had corresponded with before. Despite the ridiculousness of the situation, the plan worked. Colin responded to all the letters, and each time their dialogues became more and more explicit and perverted. Lizzie played the part of a woman with violent and sadist hobbies, sometimes even illegal, and their communication lasted five months. All this time, Stagg insisted that they finally meet in person, and the detectives decided it might actually help to get a confession out. The location and date was set at a park. Lizzie didn't go there alone. 
but Stagg didn't know that plainclothes officers were keeping an eye on them in case the man decided to attack their colleague during the conversation. Izzy on the provider's advice shared with Colin a fictional story about her secret hobby. She revealed that her ex-boyfriend was into the occult and that they performed a ritual sacrifice on a living person together. Stagg took this information rather calmly. At least he kept in touch with Lizzie, and they spent a few more hours together and parted ways. After that, they met a few more times. And finally, the police decided to move on to the final part. Walking in the park, Lizzie talked to Colin about Rachel's murder. She told him that she wished he had been the murderer because she was aroused by thoughts of the crime, but it didn't work. Stagg apologized to her and told her that he had nothing to do with the murder. Lizzie tried to get him to confess several more times, but he kept denying his involvement. It looked as if the police had botched a six-month operation. They couldn't get any evidence that Stake had killed Rachel, but the detectives were still convinced they were right. That's why they did arrest him in August 1993. At the interrogation, Colin was told all the cards and that all this time, he had been in correspondence with a police officer. He read excerpts from these letters describing various perversions and was also introduced to the real Lizzie herself. Stagg was shocked but, on the advice of his lawyer, refused to answer police questions investigators had hoped to the last that, under such pressure, he would confess to the murder. But he did not. All they had to do now was to take the case to trial all this dragged down for a year which Stake spent in custody when the case finally went to trial as lawyers blew the prosecute. In arguments to smithereens even the judge was forced to admit that the whole operation with Lizzie James was overkill and that the police had behaved in an extremely unprofessional manner. In September 1994 Colin was acquitted of all charges and released Lizzie James later resigned from the police citing serious psychological trauma from the operation the police who had spent more than three million pounds on this investigation were deadlocked they had not a single the suspect and most of the detectives continued to think the stake was the murderer and they were not alone in this opinion the newspapers and the public continued to blame him for what happened every time he went out on the street he caught the embittered looks of passers-by almost the entire country believed that the murderer had gotten away with it and this only added to the hatred towards stack this went on for years. The Rachel Nickel case was finally hung in the balance, and the police made little effort to look for new suspects why when they were all sure of Colin's involvement by then. Rachel's husband, along with Alex, had gone to live in Europe for several reasons. First, he was constantly harassed by journalists, which reminded his son of his mother's murder. Secondly, the father felt it was not safe for his son to remain in London. He was the only person who had seen the murderer for a long time. No one knew which country they had moved to. Later, journalists did get wind that they lived in Spain and France. In 2000, Scotland Yard took up the case and assigned a new team to it. They studied all the collected material and witness statements, but they failed to find a new suspect. Only three years later, they announced that they had found DNA from an unknown man and Rachel's clothes analysis technology had only just matured to such a capability. And in 1992, such a discovery was simply impossible to even in. 2003, this tiny sample which took experts 18 months to find was not enough to establish identity. The data from that sample was only enough to rule out unsuitable people and a year later in 2004, the police finally had a new suspect. His DNA was already in the database, and a comparison with a sample from Rachel's clothes showed mixed results. That man was the 38-year-old Robert Knapper, a convicted murderer and serial rapist who, at the time, had already spent 10 years in a halfway house. His biography is striking in two ways the cruelty of his crimes and the ease with which he evaded justice later. Because of this, the police would face a wave of outrage from the public Napper first came into the hands of law enforcement in 1986. He was then given a suspended sentence for assault with an air gun in 1989. He broke into a young mother's house and abused her. For the next four years there was a series of similar attacks, but the police did not tie them together and could not reach the suspect. What followed was something truly amazing. Napper confessed to his mother that he had carried out all these attacks. She called the police and told them everything. And what do you think? They found no connection between the crimes and the woman's story, so they didn't look into the Napper's involvement. 
The only thing the mother could do was convince her son to see a psychiatrist. When Napper came back from there, he said that the specialist thought he was crazy but took no further action. A short time later, he assaulted and abused a woman and her child in Crystal Palace Park. This happened just weeks before Rachel's murder, but again the police failed to see the connection. This was by no means the only such attack in Crystal Palace Park, and police at some point figured out that one man was committing the crimes from the words of witnesses. They compiled a sketch of him. After the publication in the newspapers, several of Napper's neighbors contacted the detectives. They all pointed to the man and the police called Napper for a blood sample. He simply ignored the request, and the detectives did not go looking for him. They simply forgot about him. In November 1993, London was rocked by another high-profile crime which, as it later turned out, was also committed by Napper, a young mother, Samantha Bassett, who was attacked in her room. In addition, the perpetrator did not spare her young daughter. What he did to them shocked even experienced detectives. The police photographer who arrived on the scene could not return to work for several months because of the shock of what he saw. Remarkably, the same profiler who had been brought in to investigate Rachel's murder worked on all of these cases, and he believed that all of these attacks had nothing to do with each other. The detectives also saw no possible connection to Rachel's case because they were 100 sure that Colin Stay was guilty. The team of investigators handling the attack at Crystal Palace Park also saw no connection. Napper was nearly 190 centimeters tall, and based on witness testimony, the perpetrator was shorter but the maniac made one mistake in the attack on Samantha Bassett. He left a fingerprint in her apartment that allowed his identity to be run through the database. Napper had previously been fingerprinted after he stalked a woman in the street. He was not arrested until May 1994. When questioned, he denied guilt and was extremely calm in his apartment. They found maps of London on which the locations of the attacks and murders were circled, including the place where Rachel was murdered. They also found several nodes on how to properly abuse women. Shortly before that, police found a knife in the very park where Rachel has murdered. The fingerprints on the handle matched Napper's, but even that wasn't enough to make detectives consider him the killer because they were still convinced Colin Stegg was guilty. Napper, however, was still considered a suspect in Rachel's murder for a while, but those charges were quickly dropped. The thing is that Napper said he was at work that day in 1995. Napper went on trial for the murder of Samantha and her daughter. The prosecution struck a deal with him in which he pleaded guilty to manslaughter and the court sent him to a closed psychiatric hospital instead of the prison. The fact was that Napper had been diagnosed with a number of disorders, including Asperger's syndrome and schizophrenia. Because of this, the maniac could have avoided prison anyway, with or without a confession. As a result, the judge sent him to provide a more psychiatric hospital for treatment with no time limit. Later, detectives wanted to question him about Rachel's murder but the doctors forbade it because they feared it might aggravate the Napper's mental status back to 2004. The new team of detectives on the Rachel Nickel case finally began to take a closer look at Napper as a suspect after they compared his DNA to a small sample found. On the young woman's body, the results were very mixed. That sample wasn't enough to confirm the similarity. It was only enough to rule out other suspects in Napper's case. The results did not do with 100% certain the investigators kept digging further. Using new technology on Rachel's clothing, they managed to spot a microscopic piece of pain. Experts examined it and concluded that it matched the pain on the Napper's iron toolbox. Prior to his arrest, he worked as a storekeeper for the Department of Defense. It is not entirely clear how we could have gotten a job there with his set of mental disorders, but the fact remains he combined assault and murder with his day job. It took Scotland Yard three years to prepare this case for trial, and in 2007, Napper was charged with the murder of Rachel Nickel. During the first hearing, he pleaded not guilty, which prolonged the trial for almost a year at the end. Napa agreed the same deal he had been offered 12 years earlier, a change of plea to manslaughter in exchange for a confession on December 18, 2008. 16 years after the murder, he finally confessed for Napper himself. The verdict did not change anything. He was left in the same hospital, under heavy guard. Most likely he will never be released. But the news made a lot of noise all over Britain the police suffered it the most, 
fixating on Colin Stegg and completely ignoring Colin Stegg and other serious leads. Instead, the investigation was divided into three separate lines. Each team of detectives looked for different criminals while behind all the attacks and murders what? Napper that the same year 2008 Stagg sued the police department for £706,000 a record for Britain for unwarranted criminal prosecutions. The Metropolitan Police also issued a public apology to him. He subsequently wrote several books about his life experiences. In them, he described what it was like to be accused of murder. Stagg admitted that for 10 years, his life was effectively ruined by journalists and the police after the whole of Britain finally believed in his innocence he decided to spend all the compensation on travel expensive cars and other things that brought him joy. In 2010, a special commission issued a report criticizing the actions of homicide detectives. This document was called a catalog of wrong decisions and mistakes, and the reason for this is not only the fact that the murder could not be solved for 16 years. The whole point is that if the police had done their job properly, they could have arrested Napper before he killed Rachel Samantha and her daughter. No disciplinary action followed. However, all of the detectives involved in the case retired, and one of the lead investigators passed away. As for Rachel's son, Alexei, did not give his first interview until 2017, 25 years after the incident. He said that growing up without his mother had been problematic, but that he had found the strength to let go and move on. Shortly before the interview, he went to the very place where his mother was murdered, and at the moment, he was able to finally let go of the heavy weight of the past one can only hope that this story, like others like it, will serve as a lesson for law enforcement agencies around the world. It is too late to speculate about whether or not the police could have saved Rachel and Samantha, but it is never too late to draw conclusions and prevent future crimes. Please share your thoughts on this story in the comments and don't forget to like this video if you enjoyed it. Thank you for watching. In a small town, a horrifying crime unfolds. A happy family shattered by a shocking incident. They lived an exemplary life until one fateful morning. The police received two distress calls and what they encountered was straight out of a detective thriller. For seven long years, the truth remained hidden and the case became a mystery that captivated an entire town. Suspicion falls on the victim's husband, but he maintains his innocence. Can the truth be unraveled? Honey Debate was born on July 31, 1976, in a small American town of Ellington, Connecticut. She had two sisters and a brother. From an early age, Connie stood out for her kindness and desire to help people which earned her many friends. Later on, fueled by these qualities, Connie decided to pursue a medical education. She studied at the University of Connecticut and then found employment in the sales department of a pharmaceutical company. In addition to her career, Connie became the vice president of a charitable organization in her town, which provided free emergency medical assistance to people. She also desired to create a large and close-knit family. In the early 2000s, an opportunity presented itself when she met a man named Richard and a romance blossomed between them. The couple got married on July 4, 2003, and a few years later, they had a son. Three years after that, their second son arrived. Around the same time, Connie and Richard decided to move into a new home, purchasing a large house in a quiet neighborhood on the outskirts of Ellington. It was an ideal choice for their expanding family, with a spacious house and a large backyard where their sons could play. Moreover, their close friends lived in the same area, and they frequently spent time together as families. For many years, they led an exemplary life. However, everything changed on December 23, 2015. That morning, the police department received two calls in quick succession. First, the security company alerted them that the alarm had gone off at Richard and Connie's house. Five minutes later, Richard himself called the police, requesting assistance. The officers promptly arrived at the house only to be greeted by a horrifying sight. One of them entered through the open front door and immediately noticed a trail of blood leading from the staircase in the basement to the kitchen. Following the trail, the officer discovered Richard in the kitchen. The man was partially tied to an overturned chair with zip ties, lying face down on the floor with wounds visible on his body and another plastic restraint around his neck. The officer called out to him, 
and Richard replied with a single sentence, he's still in the house. The police immediately requested backup and began searching both the building and the entire neighborhood. Soon after, they made another horrifying discovery as they descended to the basement. They found Connie's lifeless body with a gun lying next to her. Meanwhile, Detectives freed Richard, and while they waited for an ambulance, he recounted what had happened that morning. At around 8.10 a.m., Richard had taken their sons to the bus stop from where they would go to school. Afterward, he returned home, changed into his office attire, got into his car, and headed to work. Meanwhile, Connie was preparing for a sports activity taking place at the local charity organization's gymnasium. Shortly after Richard left home, he received a notification from the security service about an alarm triggered at their house. This had happened before due to their cat, whom they often left home alone. Richard also realized that he had forgotten to take his laptop, which he needed for work. Therefore, he decided to turn back. Before turning around, he messaged his boss, informing them that he would be delayed and then drove back home. Richard arrived at the house sometime between 8.45 a.m. and 9 a.m. Upon entering, he heard a noise on the second floor. As he went upstairs and entered his and Connie's bedroom, to his horror, he saw an unknown man rummaging through the closet. The intruder was dressed in camouflage clothing with his face covered. As soon as the perpetrator noticed Richard, he lunged at him, knocking him to the floor. The assailant demanded Richard's wallet, bank cards, and their PIN codes, otherwise he threatened to wait for his family and kill them. Almost immediately after that, Richard heard the garage door open, indicating that Connie had returned from her activity earlier than expected. He shouted that there was someone in the house and told her to run. The intruder had it downstairs, but Richard attempted to stop him. During the struggle, the unknown man managed to push Richard off the stairs and he fell to the first floor. While he was regaining his senses, Connie ran to the basement where they kept two handguns and the assailant pursued her. A few moments later, Richard managed to stand up and followed to the basement. However, by the time he reached there, the unknown man already had the gun and in the next second, he shot Connie. The sound of the gunshot was so loud that Richard was almost deafened for a few minutes. He thought he heard a second shot shortly after but wasn't certain. Afterward, the assailant made Richard sit on a chair and bound his hand and leg with plastic restraints. Then he put down the gun, picked up some tools lying in the basement, and inflicted several puncture wounds on Richard with them. Following that, the unknown man knocked over some items, took a blowtorch, and began burning them. Apparently, by using the blowtorch, the intruder attempted to eliminate evidence. Afterward, he turned to Richard and directed the torch toward him. Due to being only partially restrained to the chair, Richard managed to stand up and knock the torch out of the assailant's hands. He grabbed it and directed it toward the attacker, setting fire to the mask on his face. The unarmed perpetrator immediately fled the basement, and shortly after, Richard went upstairs to call the police. While Richard was recounting the incident, the police thoroughly searched the house and an area several kilometers around it. However, they failed to find the suspect. The only thing they discovered was Richard's wallet, which was lying on the lawn in front of the house. Investigators called in canine units with search dogs in an attempt to track the killer. They allowed the dogs to sniff the wallet as the perpetrator had held it for some time. However, it didn't work, and three different dogs kept leading the detectives back to Richard. Following that, the canines were taken through the house hoping they would detect the scent of an intruder, but that also yielded no results. Detectives found it strange because trained dogs are usually capable of detecting human presence even days later. But in this case, none of the three dogs picked up anything. Another peculiar aspect was the timeline of the incident. According to Richard, approximately five minutes had passed between the moment he entered the house and when the assailant fled. Considering that Richard returned home between 8.40 a.m. and 9 a.m., everything should have ended no later than 9.05 a.m. However, the security company only reported the alarm activation at 10.16 a.m. and Richard himself called the police a few minutes later. It seemed that he had spent over an hour in the house before contacting the police. Additionally, there was too little time between Connie's departure for her sports activity and her return. Meanwhile, 
Richard was taken to the hospital where doctors determined that his injuries were not life-threatening. Their detectives interviewed him again, hoping to obtain a description of the attacker. Richard stated that the intruder was tall and well-built, but his face was impossible to see due to the mask. Forensic experts examined Connie's body and found that she had sustained two gunshot wounds, one in the abdomen and another in the back of the head. The detectives had very few leads and they continued to talk to Richard, hoping to gather more details. The more questions they asked, the more suspicious his answers became. Initially, Richard claimed that he had left for work while Connie was getting ready for her training session. But in the hospital, he stated that he couldn't recall with certainty who had left first. He also couldn't remember if he had activated the alarm before leaving or if his wife had done it. Richard also changed his version of events. Initially, he claimed to have heard a noise on the second floor as soon as he entered the house, but now he stated that there was no noise and he only noticed the intruder when he went upstairs and entered the bedroom. He also said that the assailant didn't push him down the stairs from the second floor, but rather he tripped and fell himself. However, the main inconsistency was regarding the moment of the murder. Richard stated that he rushed into the basement and witnessed the assailant taking the gun from Connie before shooting her. However, initially, he claimed to be unaware of how the attacker acquired the weapon. Furthermore, according to Richard, the basement was pitch dark, leading the detectives to wonder how he could see what was happening. Then Richard also added that he couldn't see Connie's body due to the darkness, so he wasn't certain if his wife was dead. Another suspicious element was the superficial wounds inflicted on Richard with pliers. They posed no real threat, but the interesting part was that most of them were on the left side of his torso, considering that Richard was right-handed and his right hand was not restrained to the chair. He could have self-inflicted those wounds. Additionally, there were no bruises or contusions on his body. According to Richard, he fought with the assailant and fell down the stairs, which should have resulted in abrasions, but there were none. Richard's shorts had blood stains, but forensic analysts found inconsistencies with his story. If someone had inflicted wounds on him with a sharp object while he was sitting on the chair, at least a few drops of blood should have landed on the lower part of the shorts, but there were no traces there. The same applied to the area in the basement where the assailant struck Richard with pliers. There should have been a considerable amount of blood on the floor near the chair, but the investigators found only a few small droplets. That wasn't all. According to Richard, after the attacker fled, he regained consciousness after a while and then crawled up the stairs from the basement to the first floor. However, there was not a single trace of blood on the steps even though Richard was injured and should have been bleeding. Another peculiar detail caught the attention of the detectives while examining the crime scene. They noticed that the basement window was open. The police considered the possibility that the intruder entered the house through that window, but there was an interesting point the locks had been removed from the inside. The same was true for another window and the investigators decided to conduct a small experiment. They attempted to open it from the outside but they succeeded only when one of the officers struck the frame and shattered the glass. This led the detectives to doubt that the intruder could have opened the window even without the locks without breaking the glass. All these factors made the investigators question the authenticity of Richard's story. They went back to him at the hospital and asked if they had any problems in their marriage, to which he stated that he had a mistress, but Connie was aware of it. According to his account, he and his wife wanted to have a third child, but Connie was unable to conceive. That's when Richard proposed the idea of surrogacy and he chose his former classmate as the surrogate mother. She had recently gone through a divorce and wanted to have a child. Richard and his wife presented her with a plan she would conceive Richard's child and then the three of them would raise the baby together and the woman agreed. Initially, they planned to proceed with medical fertilization procedures, but it turned out to be too expensive, so they decided to do it in a more natural way, and Richard engaged in intimate relations with the woman, resulting in her pregnancy. He claimed that Connie was completely okay with the arrangement and supported everything that was happening. The detectives had serious doubts about the credibility of this story as it sounded highly unnatural. They continued to question Richard, and his account changed once again. Just a few minutes after telling the story, he stated that, in fact, 
Connie and his friend never met or spoke to each other. He also admitted that he wasn't sure if his wife knew about the pregnancy. During further conversation with the police, he confessed that he had been cheating on his wife with his former classmate for several years and Connie was unaware of it. The detectives reached out to the woman and she stated that she entered into a romantic relationship with Richard less than a year ago. She knew he was married but believed he was in the process of getting a divorce, as he had told her so. The woman became pregnant in June, six months before the incident occurred. Richard insisted that he had already hired a lawyer for the divorce and planned to finalize the process before the baby's birth. However, investigators found out that he hadn't contacted any lawyer and all of Connie's acquaintances confirmed that she never mentioned anything about a divorce. All of this was enough for the detectives to consider Richard as the main suspect. However, they couldn't find any substantial evidence against him, so the police started considering all possible scenarios. That's when they discovered something interesting friends and relatives of the family informed them that Connie had repeatedly complained about a contractor with whom they had issues. He had done poor quality work on their house, and the couple tried to get a refund, but the contractor turned out to be quite aggressive. Connie admitted that she was genuinely afraid of him. It was because of this issue that Richard and Connie purchased two guns and installed an alarm system. Investigators looked into the contractor but he had an indisputable alibi for the time of the murder. Eventually, they returned to their prime suspect, the victim's husband. For months, the police had refrained from publicly declaring him a possible murderer. All of Connie's friends and relatives believed that an unknown robber was behind the crime and sympathized with Richard. Detectives spent a lot of time talking to Connie's closest friends. They stated that if she had discovered her husband's infidelity, especially that his mistress had become pregnant, she would have undoubtedly confided in them. Other acquaintances of the family noted that Richard had been behaving strangely after the murder. He didn't appear depressed or upset, and a few days after his wife's death, he even asked a few neighbors, where do you usually order food from? Digging deeper, the police discovered that Connie and Richard were facing serious financial problems. Connie was unaware of where their money was going, while Richard secretly spent it on his mistress. They also found a note titled, Why I Want a Divorce on Her Smartphone. In the note, she listed Richard's constant lies, mistreatment of her and the children, his unauthorized use of her money, and more. Based on this, investigators concluded that Connie had been contacted contemplating ending the marriage, but she had no idea about her husband's secret life. Further examination of the financial aspect revealed that just five days after the murder, Richard attempted to withdraw $500,000 from his wife's insurance account but the request was rejected by the security service. A month later, he received a $75,000 check from his wife's employer. All of this indicated that Richard may have had selfish motives for the murder, but it didn't prove his guilt. Another curious fact was that Richard canceled the contract with the security company only 19 days after the murder. If his story about the intruder was true, it would have been the most illogical move, endangering not only himself but also his two sons. Desperate to find any evidence, the detectives obtained a search warrant for all electronic devices in the house, and finally, they stumbled upon something significant. Collecting all this information together, the police were able to reconstruct the exact timeline of events. At 8.44 a.m. in the morning, the security system recorded the garage door opening and closing. Investigators determined that Connie had left for her workout because at 8.53 a.m. she was captured on camera near the gym. At 8.50 a.m., Richard, who was still at home at that time, first deactivated the alarm system and then reactivated it. After that, he was supposed to leave the house and go to work, but at 8.59 a.m., he again disabled the alarm using his remote control. Considering that the remote control works within a few meters of the system, Richard had to return home, which aligned with his claim that he went back to retrieve his laptop. However, there is one problem. He stated that he received a notification of the alarm being triggered on his way to work. During that time frame, though, the security system did not record any breaches, indicating that he didn't receive any notifications. At 9.02 a.m., Richard accessed his email from a tablet, and two minutes later, he wrote to his boss that he would be delayed because his alarm had gone off. 
Another inconsistency emerged here. Not only were there no actual alarm notifications, but Richard also lied to the police in his email. He claimed to have sent it immediately after receiving the notification while being several kilometers away from home, but the tablet data showed that he was at home when he sent the email since it was connected to the home Wi-Fi. It appeared that he spent a minimum of four minutes inside the house before he supposedly encountered the intruder, and everything that happened thereafter took less than a minute, which was theoretically impossible. However, the crucial evidence came from Connie's fitness tracker. She arrived at the gym at 8.53 a.m. but left a few minutes later because the classes were canceled. At 9.08 a.m., the bracelet stopped tracking steps. Based on this, investigators concluded that Connie got into her car and drove home. The journey took eight minutes. Here is where it gets interesting. According to Richard, the assailant attacked his wife almost immediately after she entered the house. But the bracelet data contradicted this. The data showed that the woman walked 370 meters inside her house between 9.18 a.m. and 10.17 a.m. in the morning. Data from her social media account also showed that she was online for six minutes during this time frame. This means that Connie entered the house at 9.18 a.m. and was alive for nearly a whole hour completely contradicting her husband's story. The crucial factor here was that the police had not just theoretical inconsistencies, but full-fledged digital evidence to support their case. Gathering this detailed information took the police over a year, and in April 2017, they finally arrested Richard. For the vast majority of his acquaintances, this event was a real shock. They had no idea what evidence the police had managed to gather and continued to see Richard as the victim. The man was accused of murder and initially, the bail amount set for him was $5 million. However, his lawyer argued that Richard had a clean criminal record and two minor sons under his care. As a result, the amount was reduced to $1 million, which he promptly paid. Richard spent a whole five years waiting for trial as the process kept getting postponed. The trial finally began in April 2022, and during this time, the man's lawyers managed to gather many interesting facts. The defense presented evidence that six DNA samples belonging to an unknown individual were found in the house. They also pointed out that there was only a minimal amount of gunpowder on Richard's hands, and if he had been the one who fired the gun, there should have been much more. The prosecution refuted these arguments, stating that the gunpowder test was conducted several hours after the man was taken to the hospital, giving Richard ample time to remove most of the traces. Regarding the DNA, there was no evidence to prove that it belonged specifically to the mysterious intruder. Anyone who had visited Richard and Connie's house at least once could have left those samples. In turn, the prosecution presented a detailed digital timeline of the couple's movements that morning, contradicting all of Richard's statements. The evidence indicated that the woman died an hour after she was allegedly shot by an unknown intruder as she continued moving around the house and using social media without any indication of distress. Richard's own story became a significant argument for the prosecution as he repeatedly changed his statements. All the contradictions in his words were used as further evidence of his deceitful storytelling. The trial lasted for 22 days, and on May 10, 2022, the jury found him guilty. Richard was sentenced to 65 years in prison but he continued to insist on his innocence. This trial was a difficult ordeal for Connie's relatives and loved ones as they only learned about all the evidence against her husband during the process. Until that point, many of them still believed in the story of the unknown robber. But once all the cards were laid out on the table, no one doubted Richard's guilt anymore. However, his lawyers announced plans to appeal the verdict until it was reviewed, but so far, these attempts have not yielded the desired result. As for Connie's sons, they remained in the custody of her relatives. At the time of the murder, they were six and nine years old, but the children lived with their father until the verdict was reached. Please share your thoughts on this story in the comments and don't forget to like this video if you enjoyed it. Thank you for watching. woman spending time with her family on a normal Saturday morning heard the doorbell ring and went to answer it. What happened next resembled more the plot of a horror movie than a real-life incident.
It took the detective more than 30 years to unravel this terrible mystery, the ending of which shocked and angered everyone. Marlene Warren was born on April 15, 1950, in Michigan, USA. She grew up without a father and since her teenage years dreamed of having a large and close-knit family. Very soon, that dream came true. The girl married a man named John, and they had two sons. But just a few years later, an unexpected tragedy struck the family. Marlene's husband died suddenly of an illness, and the woman was left alone with two small children. Since then, she has spent most of her time at work, trying to provide for her sons alone. Although she struggled with this, she sacrificed everything for her children. Six years after her husband's death, she met a man named Michael Warren, and they soon married. The man was a used car salesman, and after their marriage, he opened his own business in that area. By that time, Marlene was already making good money, but instead of spending it all, she tried to save it. The woman invested in Michael's company and also helped him in the management. The man himself was also good at this business, and in the following years, it began to bring them decent money. Over time, Marlene and her husband expanded the business. They bought several properties to rent, and their finances took off. The family moved to an upscale Miami suburb called Wellington, buying a large house there. They seemed to have built a near-perfect life. But in 1988, Marlene suffered another tragedy. Her oldest son was killed in a car accident. For the woman and her youngest son, Joseph, it was a huge blow. After all the difficulties they had gone through, their life had just gotten better when suddenly fate presented them with yet another test. Yet they found the strength to move on. After this tragedy, Marlene became even closer to Joseph because he was her only closest relative. Her husband also helped her to recover from this loss. After the death of her son, the woman began to think about selling the properties that she and Michael were renting out. Despite the fact that this business brought in good money for Marlene, it was associated with constant worries. There were often situations when tenants delayed rent or lost it altogether. In each such case, the woman did her best to find the best solution. It was very hard for her to put people on the street because she was a good-natured person and well remembered the financial difficulties she experienced with two small children. On the other hand, she and her husband could not let people live in their homes for free, and eventually, Marlene wanted to get rid of the business so that she would no longer face such moral dilemmas. Two years had passed since her son's death, and the family was just beginning to recover and return to normalcy. But something terrible and unforeseen awaited them once again. On the morning of May 26, 1990, Marlene was at home with her son and three of his friends who came over for breakfast. Their kitchen was located so that they could see the driveway through the windows. At some point, the doorbell rang, and Marlene went to open it. Her son saw a white Chrysler parked in front of their house. The next second, the woman opened the front door and saw a man in a clown costume holding two balloons and a bouquet of flowers on the doorstep. Marlene said, how cute is that? But the next second, something unexpected happened. The clown pulled a gun out of his pocket and shot the woman in the head. Her son and his friends rushed into the hallway where a heartbreaking sight awaited them. Marlene was lying on the floor with blood everywhere. The man in the clown suit looked at them for a few seconds, then got back into his car and drove away. Marlene's son called an ambulance, after which he decided to chase after his attacker. At the time, his leg was in a cast after an injury, and the guy couldn't drive. He told his two friends to stay with his mother, asked his friend to drive, and drove with her in the direction the attacker had gone. But by that time, the clown was out of sight, and they never managed to find him. Marlene was taken to the hospital in an unconscious state, and the detectives began their investigation. The first thing they did was talk to everyone in the house. The woman's son said that he could not see any signs of his attacker. He was wearing a suit and makeup, gloves on his hands, and a wig on his head. The only thing the son remembered was that the perpetrator had very dark eyes. His friends added that the clown was quite tall, and his shoes stood out strongly against the costume. They looked like work shoes. A neighbor who was walking his dog near Marlene's house also saw the clown, but he was unable to share any significant sightings with police. Investigators put out a search for a white Chrysler and began searching for other evidence. Of course, Marlene's husband, Michael, was the first to be suspected. That morning, he had just left for the racing stadium in Miami, and at the time of the attack on his wife, he was not at home. From the first hours of the investigation, the police had several good reasons to think about his involvement. First, they found out that Marlene and her relatives really liked clowns. There were a lot of pictures and figures depicting these characters in their house. This suggested that the attacker knew this fact and chose such an outfit for a reason. Secondly, just two hours after the incident, the police received an anonymous tip from a woman who called the investigators and said they should look into Michael Warren and a woman named Sheila Keen. Sheila, who was 26, worked with Michael at his car rental company. Digging deeper, the detectives learned of rumors that there was a secret affair between them. 
their relationship had been speculated about by some colleagues, so they immediately shared this information with investigators. Here, the police discovered another possible motive. If Michael was in a relationship with another woman and wanted to break up with Marlene, he had one problem. Most of the real estate and business that the family owned were written down to his wife. In that case, Michael would lose an impressive part of his fortune in a divorce. The police immediately checked the man's whereabouts at the time of the attack, and it turned out that Michael was in a car 110 kilometers away from the house and had two friends with him. Investigators concluded he would not have been physically capable of committing the crime. Upon learning of the attempt on his wife's life, Michael rushed to the hospital and has not left her room since. Officers spoke with Sheila, and she stated that there was no romantic relationship between them, and she had nothing to do with the crime. The woman added that she was at work at the time. Detectives also interviewed Sheila's husband, who said he was aware of rumors of an affair between his wife and Michael but could not confirm whether or not it was true. The man added that his wife had moved out about a month ago, and in fact, they were no longer together. Although the police had no evidence to link Michael and Sheila to the crime, they continued to consider their involvement highly probable. Given that the husband could not have physically been outside his house that morning, the police wondered if Sheila could have been the clown because of the costume. None of the witnesses could determine the gender of the assailant for certain, and Sheila was known among her colleagues for her character. The woman was responsible for dealing with clients who were delinquent in rent payments, and most of these cases led to serious conflicts. So Sheila always carried a gun with her. After doctors removed the bullet from Marlene's head, experts determined that it had been fired from a .38 caliber handgun, remarkably the same caliber as Sheila's. The cops went to examine the weapon, but Sheila claimed that the gun had been stolen or lost months before the incident, leaving the detectives with no tangible evidence. They continued to dig deeper and learned that after Sheila moved out of her husband's house, she had moved into a rental apartment. Investigators heard rumors that Michael was paying for the place. A new interesting discovery awaited the police officers. While their colleagues were trying to establish where the perpetrator took the clown costume, balloons, and flowers, they found that on May 24, two days before the attempt on Marlene's life, a woman came to the costume store near Sheila's apartment. The store was already closed, but the woman persistently knocked on the door until someone opened it for her. She urgently needed a clown costume, a wig, face makeup, and a red nose. The store clerk sold her the items. They described her as tall, thin, with dark hair. The balloons and flowers were traced to a supermarket about a mile from Sheila's apartment. The salesman stated that the same items had been bought by a woman just a few hours before the attempt on Marlene's life. He described her as a tall, thin young woman with long dark hair. The salesman also mentioned that the female customer exhibited rude and somewhat masculine manners. The investigation had lasted two days, and on May 28, the doctors informed the police that Marlene had died. The case was reclassified as a homicide. Detectives continued to look for more possible evidence against Sheila. They obtained a warrant to search her apartment. While waiting for the warrant, they were informed of a similar car in a parking lot located 13 kilometers from the victim's home. Investigators got there and verified that it was the same Chrysler the killer was driving. Inside, they found long dark hair and orange fibers that looked like pieces of a clown wig. During a search of Sheila's apartment, the police found the same orange-colored particles and work boots that matched the witness's description, a similar model worn by the clown on the day of the murder. However, the police faced a major problem. Without DNA analysis, all the evidence against Sheila was circumstantial. They couldn't charge her with murder without concrete proof. But in 2013, a new team of investigators reopened the case and requested a re-examination of all available evidence. Advanced technology and DNA examination and other physical evidence had emerged since 1990. After several years of examination, experts found that the orange flecks in Sheila's apartment, the car, and the murder scene were identical. The crucial clue came from comparing the DNA of hairs found in the white Chrysler to Sheila's DNA, which resulted in a perfect match. Armed with this incontrovertible evidence, detectives were able to take the case to court, and in 2017, Sheila was arrested. She pleaded guilty to second-degree murder in exchange for avoiding the death penalty. Her attorneys claimed that she feared for her life and took responsibility for someone else's crime. However, it is widely speculated that she took the plea deal to receive a lenient sentence. The court sentenced her to 12 years in prison, reduced further due to time served and good behavior. As for Michael, his involvement remains unproven, and he remains free. Marlene's son expressed his gratitude to the persistent detectives who never gave up on the case. He managed to rebuild his life, opened his own small construction firm, and moved forward despite the immense tragedy of losing his mother. Share your opinion on this story in the comments and don't forget to like this video if you liked it. Thanks for watching.
a young woman moved to another city for her studies and stayed with an acquaintance. What happened next seemed like a twisted plot of a detective movie than a real-life situation. For several years, this story troubled the police until the unexpected truth finally came to light. Jonah Berry was born on October 26, 1983, in Bristol, Tennessee. She was lively and sociable, had many friends, and was always the life of the party during her school years. She was also part of the local cheerleading team. After high school, Jonah enrolled at East Tennessee State University, where she studied psychology and criminalistics. While studying, she also worked part-time at a children's educational center. During her time at the university, she met a guy named Jason White. They dated for several years, and shortly before graduation, they got engaged. In late 2004, when Jonah was 21 years old, she decided to pursue a master's degree in psychology, which required her to temporarily move to Knoxville to study at a different university. After working at the Children's Center, Jonah realized her passion for this field and aspired to become a child psychologist. Meanwhile, her boyfriend continued his studies in another state, aiming to obtain a law degree. Despite the distance, the couple communicated every day and started preparing for their wedding, which was only a few months away in Knoxville. Jonah planned to find her own accommodation but stayed with her friend Jason Amami for the first few weeks. He had studied with her and her boyfriend at the university, and after graduating, he moved to Knoxville. He lived in a two-bedroom apartment and agreed to host Jonah until she found a place of her own. Jonah found two part-time jobs at a jewelry store and a children's hospital. On the evening of December 5th, after finishing her shift at the store, she went to the shopping center to buy Christmas presents. When she returned home, she packed some gifts intended for the children at the educational center, chatted with her apartment neighbor, and went to her room. There, she talked to her boyfriend on the phone and went to sleep around 4 a.m. Jason and mommy woke up to a woman's scream. He thought Jonah had a nightmare and headed to her room. At that moment, a man emerged from the room and Jason noticed a knife in his hand. The assailant immediately attacked him, delivering several blows. Jason tried to defend himself and managed to push the attacker away at some point. He ran out of the apartment and quickly ran to the neighboring residential complex, knocking on every door, hoping someone would call the police. But no one opened for him. He then sprinted to the nearest 24-hour store, almost a kilometer away. The store clerk called 911 upon seeing the bloodied man and Jason recounted what happened. The police arrived at his home and discovered Jonah lying on the floor next to the corridor door that connected five apartments. The young woman was alive but barely responsive. As the paramedics prepared to load her into the ambulance, a police officer asked if the attacker was still in the apartment and Jason thought he saw Jonah nod ever so slightly. The officers thoroughly searched the entire building and the surrounding area but failed to find him. Jonah was swiftly transported to the nearest hospital, but despite the efforts of the doctors, they were unable to save her. Medical experts determined that she had sustained over 20 knife wounds, leaving them with virtually no chance of saving her life. As for her neighbor, the assailant had managed to inflict eight wounds on him, with only one being serious. The medics provided him with the necessary care, and his life was not in danger. Meanwhile, detectives began investigating the crime scene. From the blood pains in the corridor, they deduced that Jonah had attempted to reach out to her neighbors and seek help, but none of the four residents had opened their doors. Next to the door to Jonah's room, investigators found the murder weapon, a kitchen knife belonging to Jason. The assailant had struck with such force that the blade had bent. Additionally, the police discovered blood traces near the back door of the apartment and on the staircase leading from the second floor to the street. Considering that Jason and Jonah had exited through the front door, the detectives concluded that the murderer had left the crime scene through the back door. Another lead awaited them in Jason's room. They found a partial footprint that the perpetrator may have left when following the apartment owner and launching the attack. Considering the brutality with which the killer had dealt with Jonah, the police suspected that the crime was personal in nature. Their first step was to closely scrutinize Jonah's fiancé, Jason White. Despite him being approximately 1,000 kilometers away from Knoxville, all friends and relatives attested to the couple having a wonderful relationship and there seemed to be no motive for the fiancé to commit such a heinous crime. The young man only learned about his fiancé's death at 10 a.m. when her mother called him. He said that after hearing the news, he fainted and took a long time to recover. He had to ask his neighbor to book a plane ticket for him and pack his suitcase since he was incapable of doing anything himself. Detectives thoroughly examined his alibi and concluded that he physically couldn't have traveled to Knoxville and returned by morning. As a result, he was eliminated as a suspect, and the investigators turned their attention to Jonah's neighbor. Unlike the victim's fiancé, the neighbor had no alibi. Jason was in the same apartment as her and could have committed the crime. Friends and relatives of Jonah were also suspicious of him, with some considering him the most likely killer. Others accused him of fleeing the apartment and leaving the young woman alone, 
leading the victim's parents to not even want him to attend her funeral. Immediately after Jason was discharged from the hospital, the detectives began interrogating him. The young man stuck to his initial version of events, he woke up to a scream, saw an unknown man, and was attacked when he managed to push the assailant away. Jason rushed to the front door and ran outside, attempting to reach the neighbors. He believed that Jonah had also managed to leave the apartment since he no longer heard her screams. However, the police were hesitant to believe this account. The first thing that made them suspect Jason was his injuries. Seven out of the eight wounds proved to be non-life-threatening, and the last one on his right hand could have been sustained during both defense and attack. Furthermore, forensic experts found no signs of forced entry in the apartment, indicating that the perpetrator was already inside. Jason himself mentioned that he had taken out the trash through the back door that evening but couldn't remember if he had locked it or not. Detectives continued to press him, paying particular attention to the door he used to run out onto the street. Jason insisted that it was the front door, but the police suspected he was lying. If he had exited through the back door, it would explain the bloody traces near the door and on the stairs. In that case, it would further implicate him. Additionally, the police accused him of using and selling illicit substances and behaving aggressively when unable to obtain a dose. Jason denied all of these allegations, but the investigators kept bombarding him with various accusations. After spending several hours with Jason at the police station, the detectives offered him a polygraph test, and he agreed. They brought in an expert who asked leading questions, and at the end of the interview, informed him that the polygraph indicated that he had given false answers. Upon hearing this, Jason entered a state of close to hysteria. He screamed that he had nothing to do with the crime and feared for his life as the real perpetrator was still at large. However, the detectives didn't believe him. Nevertheless, they couldn't arrest him for murder since there was no evidence against Jason. They had to wait for the laboratory experts to finish examining the few pieces of evidence found in the apartment. Then, an unexpected turn of events occurred. On the knife used as the murder weapon, three DNA samples were found, those of the deceased young woman, Jason, and an unknown male. The unknown male's DNA was also discovered in Jonah's room, on the back door handle, and on the staircase used by the perpetrator to flee. Furthermore, a fingerprint left by the victim's blood was found on the knife handle, and it didn't match Jason's fingerprint. These discoveries made the police doubt that he was the killer. The evidence confirmed that someone else was indeed present in the apartment that night. However, comparing the DNA samples to existing databases yielded no results. Despite the detectives no longer considering Jason as the murderer, public opinion remained against him. He was accused of fleeing and abandoning his girlfriend instead of trying to protect her. In addition to that, Jason began to suffer from post-traumatic stress disorder. Soon, another interesting fact emerged. It turned out that the polygraph operator had simply misinterpreted the instrument's readings. In reality, there were no signs indicating that Jason was lying. Furthermore, the police had no actual evidence linking the young man to illicit substances. They accused him solely to exert additional pressure. Most importantly, the police initially downplayed the severity of the injuries Jason sustained. In reality, he had suffered serious harm, with his lung and neck being severely damaged. Full recovery was unlikely. Due to these police reports, the insurance company only covered 25% of the medical expenses, and Jason experienced significant financial difficulties. After Jason ceased being a suspect, the police began questioning him as a witness. Based on his statements, they created an approximate profile of the attacker. The situation was complicated by the fact that Jason couldn't clearly see the assailant's face, as the room was dark, and the perpetrator immediately attacked him when he exited the room. Detectives also discovered something interesting in Jonah's room, a camp and near the back staircase. There were scattered discs and a stereo player. Initially, they assumed these items belonged to the victim or Jason, but Jason denied it. According to him, none of those belongings were in his apartment, implying that the killer left them behind. The investigators handed the approximate portrait of the suspect to journalists, and after its publication in the news, the police received hundreds of potential leads. People provided information about acquaintances who even remotely resembled the portrait, and the detectives followed up on each lead. One of them seemed particularly intriguing to a detective. They were informed that in the vicinity of Jonah's murder, there was a group of teenagers known for breaking into houses to commit theft. One of them, a 19-year-old named Michael Perkafau, resembled the suspect's portrait, and the police began searching for him. It wasn't easy since the young man was already wanted for theft. However, now that he was suspected of potential involvement in the murder, dozens of police officers joined the search. They eventually located him and brought him to the station. The investigators immediately noticed his footwear. The pattern on the soles resembled the footprint left by the killer. They collected a DNA sample and fingerprints from him and sent everything to the experts. Meanwhile, they interrogated him. During the questioning, the detectives were in for an unexpected surprise. Michael confessed almost immediately that he and his friend had indeed broken into Jonah's apartment that night. According to Michael's account, their intention was to steal valuable items from Jonah's apartment. 
but his friend grabbed a knife and attacked her. However, the detectives quickly became skeptical of his story. Firstly, the details Michael provided didn't match the actual facts, and secondly, there were no traces of the presence of two outsiders at the crime scene. The laboratory result only confirmed their skepticism. Michael's DNA and fingerprints did not match those found at the murder scene, and the same applied to his shoes. The pattern on the soles was different from the footprint in Jason's room. Eventually, the police realized that the young man was simply lying. Such situations occur quite often, where individuals take on someone else's guilt. Some do it to seek attention, while others lie in hopes of receiving rewards for information. It's unknown what motives drove Michael, but his story turned out to be fabricated. Since then, investigators have interviewed over a thousand potential suspects and collected around 400 DNA samples, but they haven't found a single match. From the early weeks of the investigation, a reward was announced for information leading to the resolution of the case. The amount increased each month and reached $60,000 in December of 2005, one year after the murder. The state governor added $20,000 from his own pocket, further drawing public attention. Despite the numerous leads, all of them proved to be dead ends, and the case remained unresolved for several years. In 2007, Jonah's parents decided to advocate for changes in the state's legislation. They found it astonishing that the perpetrator's fingerprints and DNA were not found in any of the databases. Considering the brutality of the crime, the parents refused to believe that it was his first offense. Later, they learned that, under the laws of Tennessee, fingerprints and DNA samples were only taken from convicted criminals. Jonah's parents resolved to rectify the situation and participated in the creation of a new law that mandated the collection of these samples from all individuals arrested for violent crimes. The authorities supported this initiative, and in May of 2007, such a law was enacted. Two months later, a breakthrough finally occurred in the case. The police arrested 22-year-old Taylor Lee Olson for violating the terms of his parole. The man had been convicted of theft, and during a search of his home, marijuana bushes were discovered, leading to his rearrest. Olson had an extensive criminal history, primarily consisting of thefts, check forgery, and car thefts. He had been arrested multiple times, but his fingerprints and DNA were never taken until now. Despite living with his girlfriend and their newborn daughter, Olson regularly committed crimes. It turned out that Olson had already come to the attention of investigators five months prior. They received a tip about his possible involvement in the murder, but for some reason, the police never attempted to take his DNA for analysis. However, now that he was arrested for violating the terms of his parole, they finally decided to question him about the Jonah case. Olson denied his involvement in the murder and willingly agreed to provide his DNA sample. It was handed over to experts, and soon, the detectives received a report from the laboratory. Taylor's DNA fully matched the sample found in the victim's apartment. Following this, his fingerprints were taken, and they also matched the print found on the murder weapon. Olson was subsequently arrested, and the detectives brought him in for questioning. At first, he denied his guilt, but soon, he decided to confess. Taylor explained that on that night, he wanted to steal Jonah's car and entered the apartment through the back door to take the keys. When he entered the young woman's room, she woke up and started screaming. That's when Olson grabbed a kitchen knife and struck her multiple times. Although he claimed he did not intend to kill anyone and it all happened accidentally, the detectives doubted the truthfulness of some aspects of his account and leaned toward the belief that Taylor had initially planned the murder. It was possible that he had been stalking the victim for some time, indirectly supported by a fact mentioned earlier in the investigation. Jonah's friends told investigators that she had been followed by someone in a car. At the time, they couldn't find any evidence to confirm it, but after Olson's arrest, they considered the possibility that he had indeed been stalking her. Despite the doubt surrounding some details, nobody questioned Olson's guilt. His DNA and fingerprint were found on the murder weapon, indicating that he had inflicted the knife wounds on the victim. Olson's trial was scheduled to begin in mid-2008, and by that time, he had already hired a lawyer. Apparently, the lawyer advised him to retract his confession, and Taylor provided a new version of events to the detectives. Now, he claimed that he had entered the apartment together with his friend named Noah Cox. According to Olson, when he entered Jonah's room to take the car keys, she allegedly woke up, grabbed a knife, and struck him multiple times. Olson ran out of the apartment through the back door while his friend went into Jonah's room, where he grabbed the knife from her and killed the young woman. This account also did not convince the police. No fingerprints or DNA of other individuals were found at the crime scene, making the involvement of someone else unlikely. The detectives were awaiting the start of the trial, but it was never meant to happen. On March 28, 2008, Taylor Olson ended his life in his prison cell. Notes addressed to his family, Jonah's relatives, and the police were found next to him. In the letter to the detectives, he once again claimed that his friend Noah Cox was the actual killer and apologized to Jonah's family and his own. The detectives continued to believe that Olson was the one who committed the murder, yet they repeatedly questioned Noah, but no evidence of his involvement could be found. Jonah's parents also believed that he lied. 
In their opinion, if Taylor was truly innocent, he would not have taken his own life. It was much more likely that he simply didn't want to spend his entire life in prison. Moreover, for several months after his confession, Olson continued to maintain that he entered the apartment alone and that no one was with him. If he was trying to protect his friend, why did he suddenly retract his confession and start accusing him of the murder? Share your opinions on this story in the comments and don't forget to like this video if you enjoyed it. Thanks. A woman in Australia left her home and disappeared without a trace, leaving her husband and two children behind. Relatives tried to contact her, but after several weeks of unsuccessful attempts, they decided to turn to the police. An investigation was conducted, and it was concluded that the woman was not in danger and had the right to control her own fate. Since then, she has not contacted her family. Only 40 years later did they learn the shocking truth. Lynette Joy Dawson was born on May 5, 1948, in the Australian state of New South Wales. She grew up in a large, loving family with two brothers and a sister. Together with her parents, they lived in the small town of Clovely, which is essentially a suburb of Sydney. Lynette was a cheerful child, had many friends, and always tried to help her loved ones. Her parents decided to send her to Sydney Girls High School, believing it would be the best choice for her. The school often held events in conjunction with Sydney Boys High School, and in 1965, at one of these events, Lynette met a boy named Chris Dawson. They were both 16 years old and soon the couple began dating. After finishing school, Lynette decided to pursue a career in medicine. She wanted to help people, so she chose to become a nurse. At the same time, she took a part-time job at a childcare center. When Chris and Lynette were 21, they decided to get married. The couple got married in 1970. The newlyweds moved to the northern suburb of Sydney called Bayview, where the woman got a job at a local hospital. Chris was actively involved in sports and played professional rugby since 1972. He had a twin brother named Paul, with whom they were in the same sports team. Later, they both decided to end their professional careers and became physical education coaches at one of the Sydney schools. Chris and Lynette dreamed of a large family, but they struggled to conceive for a long time. After six years of unsuccessful attempts, they began to consider adopting a child from an orphanage. But Lynette finally became pregnant, and the couple had their first daughter, followed by their second. Lynette and Chris were happy to finally have children. Their family seemed exemplary to friends and acquaintances, but soon the first signs of trouble began to appear in this idyllic picture. Lynette's friends started to notice bruises and injuries on her body periodically. When asked about it, Lynette claimed that it was nothing serious and her friends shouldn't worry about it. Lynette's friends were concerned for her, but they didn't see what was happening as something truly terrible. In those days, domestic violence wasn't considered a serious crime in the eyes of a significant portion of society in Australia. Moreover, everyone who knew Chris considered him a loving husband and caring father who never showed signs of aggression and was a positive person. Therefore, their friends tried not to interfere in their marriage and hoped that the couple would solve their problems. But the relationship between Lynette and Chris only continued to deteriorate. Lynette noticed that her husband had cooled towards her and was worried about the future of their family. A few years after the birth of their daughters, they decided to use the services of a nanny. Chris suggested this job to one of his 15-year-old school students, Bev McNally, but she didn't stay in this part-time job for long. She witnessed Chris raising his hand to Lynette twice and decided to leave. After this, Chris offered this job to another of his 16-year-old students, Joanne Curtis. After some time, Joanne had problems in her family, and Chris offered her to stay with them for some time so she could spend more time looking after the children until the situation in her family improved. Despite her kindness and desire to help people, Lynette was against this. She was deeply concerned about the problems in their own family and didn't want someone else to be constantly present in their home. However, Chris insisted on it, and in October 1981, Joanne moved in with them. The young woman lived with them for about a month until Lynette discovered that her husband was sleeping with Joanne. It was a real shock for her and another blow to their marriage. She kicked Joanne out of the house but decided not to divorce Chris. Lynette wanted to keep their family together for the sake of their children, and she continued to love her husband despite his actions. Just a few months later, on December 3, 1981, Lynette faced yet another shock. Chris left her a note saying that he was leaving the family. He wrote that he would move to another city with Joanne and asked his wife not to portray him in a bad light to the children. Lynette was devastated by this news, but a few days later, she was surprised again. Chris returned home because Joanne changed her mind about avoiding him in another city and asked to be taken back. Meanwhile, Chris spent New Year's Eve with Joanne, leaving his wife alone with the children. At that time, Joanne moved into Chris's brother's house, which was on the same street. Despite everything that was happening, Lynette wanted to keep their family together no matter what, so she decided to enroll in family therapy. 
Chris was against this idea, but she managed to convince him. She went to see the specialist right after New Year's, and it seemed that the therapy had a positive effect on their relationship. Chris started to spend more time with his wife and showed a desire to fix everything. On January 8, 1982, Lynette called her mother and told her that the family therapy was going well. They also agreed to meet with her and other relatives at the local beach the next day. Her mother thought that her daughter's speech sounded a bit unclear, as if Lynette was drunk. The woman explained that Chris had prepared some alcoholic drink for her. The next day, the relatives were waiting for Lynette on the beach, but she never showed up. They called her at home, and Chris said that he had driven his wife to the bus stop that morning. She was going to the store to return some clothes that didn't fit. However, she never returned home and her relatives began to worry. In the evening, Chris called Lynette's mother and told her that his wife had contacted him by phone. She said that because of the problems in their marriage, she had decided to be away from home for a while and gather her thoughts. Her relatives thought that what was happening was strange as they were aware of the problems that had been building up between the spouses for years. But they still couldn't imagine Lynette leaving her two daughters. She loved her children more than anything in the world and never mentioned considering the possibility of going somewhere. Days passed, but Lynette still didn't contact her family, which only added to their worry. On January 12th, Chris reported that Lynette had called their home phone and said that she was okay. Since then, he had spoken to her a few more times and told her relatives that she had been using her bank card. Despite this, her family continued to doubt that Lynette was okay. She didn't know how to drive and didn't take any items that she might need for a living. She even left behind cash that was hidden in case of an emergency. Three weeks later, Lynn. Ed's eldest daughter started first grade as the school year in Australia begins in January. But Lynette missed this event, which caused even more concern for her relatives. They were practically certain that something bad had happened to her, while Chris said that she continued to regularly call home, and the last such call was at the end of January. Since then, Lynette hadn't been in contact. On February 18th, six weeks after Lynette left home, her husband went to the police. He filed a missing person report and expressed suspicion that amid all the problems in their marriage, Lynette could have joined some religious organization or even a cult. Her relatives denied such a possibility as Lynette was not religious and didn't attend church. The police began a search, but they had absolutely no leads. Lynette's mother and other members of her family were certain that she would never leave home, abandoning her daughters. So they believed that she had been kidnapped or some other tragedy had occurred. Despite this, the police concluded that Lynette had indeed left home as they had no evidence of the contrary. They tried to find her for some time and then stopped the investigation. Chris posted a message for Lynette in the local newspaper calling for her to come home. He wrote that he loved her and was eagerly awaiting her call. He also called all of her friends, trying to find any information about his wife's whereabouts. Despite Chris's eagerness to find Lynette, he divorced her a year after her disappearance, and the next year, he married Joanne Curtis, his former student and lover who had moved in with him. On January 10, 1982, a day after Lynette went missing, Joanne became the stepmother of Lynette's daughters, and Chris, not wanting to traumatize the children with the stories of their mother's disappearance, told them that Joanne was their real mother. Lynette's relatives were not happy about what was happening, but they couldn't do anything about it. They stopped relying on the police, as they had long ago stopped investigating due to the complete lack of leads. Moreover, they didn't even try to question all of her relatives and friends, and the case was abandoned almost immediately without a proper investigation. Chris and Joanne moved to Queensland with the children, selling their old house. Chris almost completely cut ties with his former wife's relatives, only occasionally calling her mother. Later, Chris and Joanne had a daughter. Six years passed, and during that time, Lynette never contacted anyone. This continued until 1990 when something unexpected happened. Chris and Joanne divorced, and soon after that, Joanne contacted Lynette's relatives to pass on shocking information. She said that she had suspected her husband of murdering his ex-wife all this time. According to her, a month before Lynette's disappearance, Chris had talked about hiring a hitman to get rid of her. On the very day she disappeared, he told Joanne that Lynette had left forever and would never return. She also advised the police to search the backyard of the house where Lynette and Chris lived. In 1991, the police questioned Chris. He said that his ex-wife was just trying to tarnish his name and that he had nothing to do with Lynette's disappearance. He admitted that the woman was intentionally doing this to get custody of their daughter after the divorce. At that time, the court was deciding who would have custody of their child, and Chris's arrest would have been beneficial to Joanne. Police seized phones from Chris and his brother, but nothing suspicious was found. So investigators once again abandoned the case, considering Joanne's words dubious. The case remained dormant for another nine years until 2000 when the police decided to excavate the backyard of Chris's old home. But there was a catch. Due to insufficient funding, they only dug around the pool area. 
This area was chosen after police talked to the new homeowners. According to them, during the sale, Chris persistently asked if they planned to change anything exactly in this place. The only thing that the police managed to find was a torn pink cardigan. Investigators admitted that it could have belonged to Lynette and contained some evidence, but DNA analysis found no matches with Lynette. A year later, the case was once again brought to attention. This time, the deputy state prosecutor concluded that Lynette was killed by someone she knew. Police resumed the investigation, questioning her friends and relatives, but they failed to find any leads. Only in 2003, two years later, investigators publicly announced that they considered Chris a suspect. They wanted to charge him with murder, but it never happened due to the complete lack of evidence. The man could not be convicted, but investigators managed to find many witnesses who reported that Chris and his brother regularly had intimate relationships with their school students. However, no charges were brought on this matter and as a result, the case stalled again. In 2006, Chris claimed that he saw his wife among the extras of a series filmed in England, but no one could find any evidence to support his words. In 2010, police announced a $100,000 reward for information about Lynette's disappearance, and four years later, they doubled the amount. Despite the large number of appeals, this did not bring any results and they failed to find any reliable leads. In 2015, police dug up a section of Chris's former home, trying to find his wife's body, but they were unsuccessful. The turning point in this case came in 2018 when a podcast about Lynette's disappearance was released and gained massive popularity in Australia. Arguments were presented in favor of Lynette's husband being responsible for her murder. The podcast was listened to by several million people, which led to a wave of public outrage. Australians accused the police of negligence and demanded that the culprit be punished. The podcast author, Hadley Thomas, spoke to Lynette's relatives and tried to find new leads, although he was unable to find any new evidence against Chris. The public outcry was enough to initiate a new investigation. As a result, on December 5th of that year, detectives arrested Chris for the first time on charges of murder. He continued to insist on his innocence and was released on bail before the start of the trial. The trial dragged on for several years. In 2019, he appeared before a judge and claimed that he did not kill his wife and that the trial should have started in 2020. But Chris's lawyers consistently delayed the process. They insisted that due to the widespread coverage of the case in the media, their client had a biased attitude towards him. So they demanded that they abandon the jury and conduct a trial where the judge would make the decision. In May 2022, this demand was approved and the trial finally began. Chris's lawyers insisted that there was not a single piece of evidence against their client and all the charges were based on societal bias due to the podcast. According to them, the author presented his opinion in such a way that many believed in Chris's guilt and refused to adequately evaluate the situation. Despite the lack of direct evidence on the prosecution side, they built their case on a multitude of indirect factors. Relatives and acquaintances of Lynette who had repeatedly seen signs of abuse on her body testified in court and Lynette had admitted to them that Chris was responsible. Their neighbors who witnessed the man beating her also testified in court. Relatives and acquaintances of Lynette who had repeatedly seen signs of abuse on her body testified in court. Lynette had admitted to them that Chris was responsible. Their neighbors, who witnessed the man beating her, also testified in court. They recounted that the day before Lynette's disappearance, when she returned to family therapy, she had bruises on her neck. One of the key witnesses was Joanne, who revealed that as she grew older, she realized how unhealthy her relationship with Chris was. He became obsessed with her when she was only 15 years old. He would leave notes in her backpack at school and ask her out. On days he was persistent and didn't take no for an answer, so the young woman felt like she had nowhere to turn. According to Joanne, Chris completely controlled her life. He told her what to wear, who to talk to, and what to do. He monitored her every move and couldn't stand it when things didn't go according to his plan. As a result, the woman concluded that the man could have easily killed his wife. According to the prosecution, Chris had wanted to end the marriage for a long time, but he would have lost part of his property in custody of the children in the divorce. So he decided to kill Lynette and stage her disappearance. In addition, he wanted to get rid of her so that she wouldn't interfere with his relationship with Joanne. Chris's lawyers, on the other hand, insisted that Joanne had made all of this up to intentionally slander her ex-husband. They also called several witnesses who claimed to have seen Lynette years after her disappearance. These testimonies became the mainstay of the defense, but there was no evidence to support their claims. The prosecution believed that these testimonies were simply fabricated and that if Lynette was alive, she would have contacted her relatives and daughters over the years. As for the phone calls that Chris allegedly received in the first month of her disappearance, no evidence of their existence could be found. The prosecution argued that the woman was already dead at that time and the man made it all up to convince Lynette's relatives that she was okay. In their view, Chris killed the woman on January 9th, drove her body in an unknown direction, and hid it because the police were negligent in their work. 
In those years, no proper investigation was conducted, although the killer's motives were always obvious. The trial lasted for 10 weeks, and on August 30, 2022, the judge found Chris guilty. A few months later, in early December, the sentence was announced, 24 years in prison with the possibility of applying for early release after 18 years of imprisonment. Considering that he will be 92 years old by then, Chris may simply not live to see that time. After the sentence was handed down, Lynette's relatives, including her eldest daughter, spoke. She no longer doubted that her father had killed her mother and said that his actions had destroyed her life. The woman demanded that her father confess where he had hidden Lynette's body so the family could finally bury her. But Chris remained silent and looked at the floor while his daughter spoke. Despite the fact that almost 41 years have passed since Lynette's murder, her relatives still hoped to find her remains. Chris, who is now 74 years old, continues to insist on his innocence. But even his own children do not believe him. Thus, one of Australia's most high-profile cases was solved, in large part thanks to a podcast that drew the attention of millions of people to this unjust story. If the police had conducted a proper investigation from the beginning, the killer could have been punished immediately after the crime, not after four decades. Share your opinion in the comments and don't forget to like this video if you enjoyed it. Thank In 2021, a young woman named Riley Goodrich went on a first date with a guy to the movies. However, the evening took a tragic turn. Although the case was quickly resolved, there are still many strange and shocking aspects to it. In this video, we will recount the events unfolding for Riley Goodrich and Anthony Baraja. On July 26, 2021, a tragic shooting occurred in California, resulting in the loss of two teenage lives. Some of my regular TikTok viewers may be familiar with Anthony Baraja, a 19-year-old famous TikToker with almost 1 million on the app and posted videos of himself singing, doing pranks on his family, and sharing moments from his life. On the 4th of July that year, he attended a party where he met an 18-year-old named Riley Goodrich. Although Riley wasn't as popular on the app, she had a decent following of over 20,000. She was studying marketing on a full scholarship at Grand Canyon University and was home for the summer visiting her parents. Described as a nice and easygoing young woman, Riley got along well with Anthony. They spent time together whenever their mutual friends would meet up and eventually decided to go on a proper date, just the two of them. Riley informed her father about meeting someone, but he was skeptical when she mentioned that Anthony was a famous TikToker. However, on the 26th of July, 2021, Riley excitedly prepared for her first date. Anthony had recently returned from a holiday in Hawaii and wanted to impress the Goodrich family. He brought souvenirs for the entire family when he came to pick up Riley. Her father was touched by this gesture, seeing it as a sweet act, and he finally started accepting Anthony. The couple then set off for their date. Anthony planned to take Riley to her favorite restaurant called Wood Ranch. After enjoying some food, they headed to the cinema. Anthony had acquired tickets for a late-night showing of the new Purge movie at the Regal Edward Theater, scheduled for around 9.35 p.m. During the date, Riley sent a few text messages to her mother to keep her updated on how things were going. At some point during the movie, she messaged her mother, mentioning that she found the storyline a bit dull and silly. Little did they know that this would be the last message Riley would ever send. After the movie ended, the theater employees began cleaning the theater, only to discover a horrifying scene. Riley had been shot in the head, and Anthony had been shot in the eye. Tragically, Riley was pronounced dead at the scene, while Anthony was rushed to Riverside Community Hospital and placed on life support. The doctors found several projectiles in his brain, and the police recovered three bullet casings and one projectile in the theater. An investigation quickly commenced, aiming to uncover what exactly happened that night. It didn't take long for the police to find the person they were looking for. Only six tickets were purchased for the 9.35 p.m. showing of the Purge movie, including the ones bought by Anthony and Riley. Through ticket records, the police identified a 20-year-old man named Joseph Jimenez as another ticket purchaser. An anonymous tip led the police to Joseph, who had gone to watch the movie with three friends that night. According to the three friends' accounts, Joseph left during the middle of the movie and returned with a bag, claiming to have a strap. His behavior, including mumbling and talking to himself, made them extremely uncomfortable. They devised a plan to leave, without raising his suspicion. They excused themselves, telling Joseph they needed to use the restroom, and left the theater without alerting the staff or contacting the police. With Joseph now alone in the theater, he committed a despicable and cowardly act. He approached the unsuspecting teens from behind and shot them. Riley was shot in the back of the head, resulting in her immediate death. Anthony, upon hearing the gunshots, turned around, and Joseph shot him in the eye. The sound of the movie masked the sound of the gunshots, so none of the staff heard anything unusual. At around 11.28 p.m., two witnesses saw Joseph running out of the theater and escaping into his vehicle. 
The following day, the police went to Joseph's house. He had called the Riverside Sheriff's Department, claiming that someone was following him, but it was the law enforcement officials who were there to search his home. Joseph was seen yelling and brandishing a handgun, but thankfully, no one else was injured. He surrendered to the police without much resistance. The caliber of the handgun he waved at the police matched the one used in the shooting. Furthermore, a movie ticket for the Forever Purge was found in his wallet, placing him at the crime scene. Initially, Joseph was arrested for the murder of Riley and the attempted murder of Anthony. However, the charges were soon changed to two counts of murder as Anthony succumbed to his injuries a few days later. Despite Joseph blaming the voices in his head for what happened, stating that they tormented him for over eight months, no motive has been established. He claimed that the voices threatened harm to his friends and family if he didn't shoot the young couple in the theater. Nevertheless, he didn't explain how killing the couple would save his loved ones. Joseph had been diagnosed with schizophrenia eight months prior to the shooting but had recently stopped taking his prescribed medication, citing running out and neglecting to refill it. He told investigators that the voices were overwhelming that night, making it impossible to concentrate on the movie. Thus, he went to his car, retrieved a gun, shot the teenagers, and swiftly fled. He was arrested the following day. Joseph faced a special circumstances allegation of lying in wait, which refers to hiding and waiting for the right moment to launch an attack. This charge carries the death penalty. Currently, he is being held on a $2 million bail. There is no indication that he knew the victims before the attack, and their status as TikTok influencers doesn't appear to have played a role in the crime. Joseph offered his condolences to the victims' families in a statement, expressing regret for his actions, stating, I wish I didn't do it. One unsettling aspect of this case is that Joseph's friends who were with him that night faced no repercussions. They weren't charged, even though they failed to notify the authorities despite their fears about Joseph's potential danger. Their decision to leave him behind indicates that they knew he was acting strangely and might have possessed a firearm. While they might not have known the extent of his capabilities, they had enough concerns to exit the theater. The theater has since implemented purse checks before allowing entry. Riley's father advocates for the introduction of metal detectors in movie theaters, similar to those used at sports events. However, the cost and practicality of such measures make them nearly impossible to implement. This case is a heartbreaking reminder of the senselessness and innocence lost, as two teenagers were simply enjoying their first date together. It serves as a poignant reminder that life can be unpredictable and fleeting. I will strive to provide updates on the case in the future, and I will leave them pinned in the comments. Share your opinion on this story in the comments, and don't forget to like this clip if you liked it. Thanks for A young woman was found dead at her workplace. Detectives found several unusual clues, but they were unable to catch the culprit. Several years later, when the police re-examined all the clues, they made a very unexpected breakthrough. Harry Nelson was born on December 13, 1980 in the small American town of Lavern, Minnesota. She had loving parents, a younger sister, and many friends. Carrie was kind, empathetic, and always tried to help her loved ones. After graduating from the local high school, she enrolled in college in the neighboring state of North Dakota. She wanted to become a doctor so that she could help others. While in college, she met a young man named Mike Callan, and they became engaged. After a while, Carrie tried to balance her college studies with part-time work at the National Blue Mound State Park located near her hometown. Her duties included selling park tickets and escorting guests who came to relax at the camping site, go hiking, or see the bison. Carrie worked there for the second season in a row, and she loved the place. In addition to being a relatively easy job, she could also spend a lot of time in nature, enjoying the picturesque landscapes. On May 20, 2001, she went to work as usual that day. Besides her, only one young woman named Rebecca, who was doing an internship at the park, was working there. In addition to her main duties, Carrie had to train and introduce Rebecca to the work process. Carrie's shift started at 8 a.m. and was supposed to end at 3.30 p.m. For most of the day, she was with Rebecca, explaining the work nuances. Around 12.45, Rebecca went to the office building located at the other end of the park, and Carrie stayed in a small room at the entrance. Rebecca returned around 2.30 p.m. She entered the building through the back door and immediately saw a horrific scene. Carrie lay motionless on the floor with a pool of blood near her head. At around the same time, a shocked Rebecca heard the front door. Thinking it might be the same person who attacked her colleague, she immediately ran out through the back door and rushed home. The young woman lived in a house located within the park grounds because her father was a manager, so she quickly ran there. Rebecca told her parents what had happened, and her father immediately ran there, while the young woman's mother called the police. The man arrived at the building and found no one there except Carrie. He tried to feel her pulse and realized that she was dead. 
After that, he closed the curtains, locked the front door, and called 911. At around the same time, another call came into the police. It turned out that the room Rebecca discovered her colleague's body inside, a park visitor walked in, not the attacker. The woman went to the registration desk and saw Carrie's body next to a puddle of blood, then returned to her car and also called 911. Police arrived on the scene and began their investigation. The young woman's body was lying behind the registration desk, where phones and cash registers were located, and things and papers were scattered around. One of the phone receivers was off the hook, the plastic pen of Carrie's chair was broken, and its pieces were on the floor. Based on this, the police assumed that a struggle had taken place between the victim and the attacker. After talking to the managers, the investigators found out that two bank bags intended for money storage had disappeared from the building. In addition, cash was taken from the cash register, with the total amount stolen being approximately $2,000. Dollars. On the floor, detectives found several clues, men's wristwatches with a torn strap and a pack of cigarettes. Considering that Carrie did not smoke, the police assumed that the cigarettes were left by her killer. As for the watches, they assumed that the young woman tore them off the perpetrator's wrist during the struggle. Large particles of orange-colored stone were also found on the floor. The manager told investigators that these particles likely came from the decorative stone with the park's name, which was located on the registration desk. The police searched all the rooms and could not find the perpetrator. Considering that blood spatters were visible on the walls and ceiling of the room, they immediately assumed that this stone was the murder weapon. At the same time, their colleagues blocked the road leading to the park entrance and began questioning all visitors. The couple who stopped at the campground reported that around 2.30 p.m., a white car with a brown vinyl top drove past them at high speed. Unfortunately, they did not remember the model or license plate number of the vehicle. The investigation was complicated by the fact that there were no surveillance cameras in the park since crimes were very rare. The available evidence included a wristwatch, a pack of cigarettes, and the vague testimony of witnesses. Medical experts examined the victim's body and concluded that the cause of death was blows to the head with a heavy object. They suggested that the perpetrator may have used a large decorative stone, but this version could only be confirmed after its discovery. According to the investigators, the attack on Carrie occurred between 2 p.m. and 2.30 p.m. They found a love letter that she had written to her fiancé at her workplace. In the letter, Carrie expressed her eagerness for their wedding and described her desire to have two children. She put the date and time of 2 p.m. that day on the letter. Another interesting fact was that the men's watch found next to the victim's body stopped at 2.16 p.m. Perhaps they stopped working just after Carrie had taken them off her attacker's wrist. Police cordoned off the park and began searching for additional clues. Five days later, they found the decorative stone in a nearby stream. Apparently, the killer took it with him and threw it into the stream from a bridge while driving over it. Medical experts compared the relief of the stone with Carrie's head injuries and confirmed that it was the murder weapon. However, the water had washed away all fingerprints and DNA traces that the perpetrator may have left. No other clues were found, and the case remained unsolved for months. A year after the murder, a prisoner serving time in the local jail came forward to the police. He told them that his cellmate, Anthony Powers, had boasted to him about being responsible for Carrie's murder. Detectives investigated and found that Powers had an extensive criminal history, mostly for bank robberies, which had landed him in jail multiple times. Interestingly, Powers had escaped from prison shortly before Carrie's murder and was caught after the fact. However, his fingerprints and DNA did not match those found at the crime scene. Moreover, the witness's description of the murder did not match reality. The detectives concluded that both prisoners were attempting to deceive them for a reward of $50,000 for information leading to the solving of the case. Since Powers was already serving a life sentence, additional charges did not scare him. Additionally, in the event of a guilty verdict, he could have avoided being transferred to a federal prison and remained in the state correctional facility, which he preferred. The case remained unsolved for several years. Detectives regularly reviewed the case, hoping to find new evidence, but their efforts were fruitless. They even put up a photo of Carrie in their office to remind themselves of the case. Every day. In 2007, the case was reopened. By that time, DNA analysis technology had significantly advanced and experts re-examined the wristwatch. This time, they were able to identify three precise DNA profiles, one belonging to Carrie, the second to an unknown man, and the third to an unknown woman. Both of these samples were run through the state database, but no matches were found. Then the detectives remembered an interesting detail, a special sticker was found on the pack of cigarettes discovered next to the victim's body. In those days, each state had a labeled tobacco products, so the police knew for sure that the pack was purchased in South Dakota. The detectives sent the DNA samples to their colleagues in that state, 
and here they had a long-awaited breakthrough. When they ran these profiles with the South Dakota database, one of them showed a complete match. The man turned out to be 35-year-old Randy Laroyal Swanee. This name had never appeared in police reports in Carrie's case, so it was a surprise for the investigators. Randy turned out to be a serial robber, and at that time, he was serving a 30-month sentence in a South Dakota prison. At the time of the murder, he was out on parole. The police also discovered that he had a light-colored Oldsmobile Delta at that time, which matched the witness's description. The investigators checked his fingerprints, and they matched several prints found at the murder scene. Despite all this, the detectives wanted to gather as much evidence as possible before charging him. Randy had only one month left to serve in prison, so the police decided to act as quickly as possible. They spoke to his wife, not mentioning what her husband was suspected of. The woman was already used to Randy regularly coming to the attention of the police for robberies and thefts, so she was not surprised by their visit. The detective showed her photos of a watch, and the woman immediately confirmed that they belonged to her husband. She also said that she sometimes wore them, and the investigators immediately realized that the last DNA sample from the watch belonged to her. Then they decided to reveal everything and told her that they suspected her husband of killing a young woman. The woman burst into tears, but the police quickly realized that she was primarily scared for herself. Learning that her DNA might be on the watch, she thought that she too would be accused of the murder. On April 19th, detectives came to visit Randy in prison and attempted to speak with him without specifying what he was being suspected of. However, Randy refused to talk without a lawyer present. After the unsuccessful interrogation, Randy called his wife. As all prison calls are recorded, the police were able to listen in. The woman was angry and asked what he did. She revealed that the detectives were investigating him for a murder that occurred in Blue Mound State Park and was more worried about her DNA being found on a watch. At times, she began to cry and scream that she didn't want to go to jail for a crime she had nothing to do with. Randy, on the other hand, repeated that he knew nothing about it. The woman actively cooperated with the police, providing her DNA samples and allowing them to search their home. She also gave them several photos of Randy, one of which showed him sitting behind the wheel of a white car similar to the one witnesses saw. In another photo, the man's watch was visible and was fastened to the fourth clasp, just like the watch found at the crime scene. Additionally, his wife confirmed that Randy smoked the same brand of cigarettes that were found near the body. All of this was enough to take the case to trial. Randy was charged on May 8, 2007, one day before his release. He was immediately transferred to a prison in Minnesota and the prosecution began preparing for the trial. According to their version of events, Randy initially chose the park building as an easy target for robbery. There were no cameras or guards, but there was cash. When he entered, Carrie may have been in another room. Seeing that nobody was there, Randy began stealing money from the cash register. But the young woman returned and caught him in the act. A struggle ensued, and the man may have used threats to make her open the safe. Afterward, he took a decorative stone and struck her more than five times because he feared leaving a witness alive. Even his relatives, including his wife, testified against him in court. They all said that Randy regularly committed thefts, used banned substances, and had serious gambling problems, which constantly put him in debt. His former cellmate told how Randy mentioned leaving his watch at the crime scene. Another cellmate claimed that after the police came to interrogate Randy in jail, he said, this time they got me. I'm looking at life. Randy's lawyers insisted that he had nothing to do with the murder. According to their version, Randy lost his watch sometime before the incident, and the real killer found it. However, this version conflicted with the results of DNA analysis. There were three samples of genetic material on the watch, Randy's, his wife's, and Carrie's. Randy claimed that on that day, he went fishing near a town about 150 kilometers away from the park. However, since he supposedly was there alone, no one could confirm his alibi. He also said that he had been in the park only once long before the murder. He admitted that he left his fingerprints there at that time, but there was another discrepancy. One of Randy's fingerprints was found on a leaflet that was made only four days before the murder. All defense arguments had no weight and contradicted real evidence, and Randy's lawyers tried to blame someone else. First, he called Powers and another inmate to testify, but their story still did not match reality. Then he began to harass the victim's fiancé, constantly hinting that he could be the real killer. The trial lasted until August 15, 2008. After six hours of deliberation, the jury found Randy guilty. He was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. After that, he continued to insist on his innocence and filed multiple appeals, but they were all rejected. From the beginning, all his defense was built on absurd versions that contradicted DNA analysis and other evidence. So, there are no chances for his case to ever be reconsidered. Share your opinion on this story in the comments and don't forget to like this clip if you liked it. Thanks for watching. A 19-year-old young woman, 
Nana Dirksmeyer was found dead in her own apartment. Investigators began investigating and quickly discovered several disturbing facts, but they were unable to solve the case for several years. Until the truth came out, everyone was shocked and outraged by the turn of events as no one expected such an outcome. Nana Dirksmeyer was born on December 26, 1985, in Russellville, Arkansas. She grew up in a very large family with four brothers and one sister. When Nana was 10 years old, her father passed away, which was a tragedy for the entire family, but they were soon to face an even more terrible shock. Sometime later, the young woman confessed to her mother that her father had repeatedly subjected her to violence. She was afraid to speak up while he was alive, and her confession was a real shock to her mother, who had no idea what her husband was capable of. Despite such a tragic experience, Nana found the strength to move on and later decided to help other young women who had become victims of similar crimes. For this, she joined a volunteer organization where she provided support to children in need. During her school years, Nana began dating a guy named Kevin Jones. The young woman also took part in beauty contests and achieved significant success in this field. She won several local contests, which allowed her to compete for the title of Miss Arkansas. In addition, Nana actively participated in the life of the local church and sang in the choir. After high school, when Nana was 19, she and her boyfriend enrolled in Arkansas Tech University located in their hometown. The young woman decided to rent her own apartment as she wanted to start an independent life. After completing her first year, her boyfriend decided to change his major and transferred to another university, which was an hour and a half drive from their city. By that time, the couple had been dating for about five years, and it was their first time living in different cities. On December 14, 2005, Kevin returned home for Christmas holidays. He stopped by Nane's apartment before heading to his parents' home which was about 16 kilometers away from the city. The next day, both of them had plans. Nana had to take her last two exams and also meet with a young woman from the volunteer organization. Kevin was going to take his mom, who worked as a librarian, to a school event. On the morning of December 15th, at around 9 a.m., Nana sent a message to Kevin wishing him a good day. He was waiting for Nana to call him after her exams and let him know how they went, but she wasn't answering his calls or messages, and he began to worry. Around 6 p.m., Kevin took his mother to the school event, but he couldn't shake the thought of why Nana wasn't answering her phone all day. Eventually, Kevin decided to call his friend, who worked as a pizza delivery guy in the area where Nana's apartment complex was located. Kevin asked him to stop by and check if everything was okay. His friend quickly arrived and saw that Nana's car was parked in the parking lot and the lights were on in her apartment, but nobody was answering the door. He told Kevin about this, and then Kevin told his mother that he was worried about his girlfriend and wanted to go to her apartment to check if everything was okay. The woman agreed, and they went to the apartment complex together. Kevin's friend was waiting for them there, and all three of them started knocking on the door, but there was still no answer. Kevin had a key, but he left it at home that day because he didn't plan on stopping by Nane's. A few minutes later, Kevin and his friend tried to open the front door because they thought something bad might have happened to Nane, but they couldn't get in. Then Kevin remembered that there were sliding glass doors in the back of the apartment. Approaching them, he immediately noticed something strange. Nana took her safety seriously, so every time she was home alone, she put a special removable grill on the back glass door, mainly used against burglars. But this time, there was no grill, and the doors themselves were unlocked. Once inside the apartment, they immediately noticed blood on the blinds, and a shocking sight awaited them in the bedroom. Nana was lying face down in a pool of blood, wearing nothing but socks. Kevin rushed to her and tried to lift her but immediately realized she was dead. Meanwhile, his mother called the police. Investigators arrived at the apartment and began examining the crime scene. They immediately suspected that the victim had been struck multiple times on the head with a table lamp that was found on the floor. They also discovered a bloody fingerprint on the lamp, which they believed may have been left by the killer. Next to the victim's body, they found her phone with the battery removed on the bedside table. Investigators found an empty condom wrapper. After examining all the doors and windows, they found no signs of forced entry. Medical examiners studied the victim's body and confirmed that the table lamp had been used as a weapon, with the metal base of the lamp matching the victim's head injuries. In addition, the victim had multiple knife wounds. According to the pathologist, the victim had died between 10.30 a.m. and 1 p.m., and there were no signs of sexual violence, which puzzled the detectives, considering that the victim was found without clothing. They first suspected a sexual motive for the crime. However, experts suggested that the perpetrator may have used a condom, the wrapper of which was found in the apartment, making it practically impossible to determine the presence of sexual violence. In the end, the police had no evidence, but one interesting detail emerged. The crime scene was not thoroughly examined, with investigators failing to collect blood samples from the blinds on the back door or search for shoe prints in the apartment, which could have been used as evidence. Moreover, they didn't even go to the second floor of the apartment. 
These oversights were explained by the fact that the investigators found their suspect, the victim's boyfriend, almost immediately after arriving at the scene. The first thing that made them suspect Kevin's involvement in the murder was the fact that he had a large amount of the victim's blood on him when he entered the apartment and ran to her. He tried to lift her up, and upon realizing that she was dead, he hugged and held her. The police found this behavior strange and suspected that Kevin had done it deliberately. By hugging the victim and getting covered in her blood, he may have destroyed potential evidence and compromised the crime scene. It would be difficult for investigators to prove his guilt. For example, if Kevin's clothes or nails were found with the victim's blood, it could easily be explained that he hugged the victim after discovering her body. Another suspicious moment was that Kevin went to check on his girlfriend not alone but with his mother, and he also invited his friend to the apartment. Investigators believed that this way he secured two witnesses who found the body with him and saw him covered in blood. The police talked to Kevin for a long time right outside Nani's apartment, and from their questions, the young man realized that they considered him a suspect. Then he said something that made the investigators even more convinced that he was the killer. Understanding that he was suspected, Kevin began arguing with the investigators and mentioned that he constantly watches law and order and knows that they are trying to make him guilty. These words also seemed strange to the police. In addition, they found out that the key to Nane's apartment was only with three people, the girlfriend herself, her mother, and Kevin. Considering that no signs of breaking in were found, they assumed that the guy used his copy of the key to enter the apartment. Kevin was taken to the police station for interrogation for several hours. He told his version of events that day and insisted that he had nothing to do with the murder. In turn, investigators directly accused him of this and urged him to confess. During the interrogation, another fact emerged that the police considered strange. Around 4 p.m., after numerous attempts to call his girlfriend, Kevin sent a message asking if she was alive. Given that Nana was already dead at that time, the investigators found this suspicious. While the guy did not demand a lawyer and tried to answer all questions, the investigators talked to him for several hours, constantly increasing pressure. Towards the end, they not only accused him of the murder directly but also manipulated the facts. Detectives said several times that there was incontrovertible evidence against him and the only way to lighten his fate was to confess to everything. After the police left the interrogation room and left him alone, Kevin stood up and started punching the back of the chair. For the investigators, this became another sign that the young man had a tendency to violence and could commit murder. However, in reality, the police had no evidence that could link Kevin to the murder. Medical experts found that Nana had tried to fend off her attacker, meaning that there should have been bruises and scratches on the killer's body, but none were found on Kevin. Despite this, the detectives continued to believe he was guilty and tried to find evidence. They interviewed over 50 people, hoping to find any witnesses, but it yielded no results. However, after talking with Nane's friends, the police learned something important. It turned out that shortly before her death, she had started seeing another guy secretly from Kevin. Investigators immediately checked this person, but he had a solid alibi for the time of the murder. This fact added even more suspicion to Kevin because now he had a motive. The young man could have come to Nane's house without warning, seen an empty contraceptive package, and realized that she was cheating on him. In a fit of rage, he could have killed her and then fled the scene and planned a way to avoid responsibility. This version was consistent with the nature of the injuries inflicted on the victim. She was killed with particular cruelty, which, in most similar cases, indicates strong personal animosity of the killer towards the victim. A few days later, Kevin agreed to undergo a polygraph test. The operator concluded that the young man gave numerous false answers, and one of the investigators even claimed that this was the worst result on a polygraph in his 28-year career. However, there is one caveat here. The person who read the device's readings was not a certified specialist. He was just a police officer who had not undergone the necessary training to work with this device. But this did not bother the detectives. After the interrogation, they again put pressure on Kevin, trying to force a confession. They claimed that all his acquaintances and relatives already knew that he killed Nane. The police really told everyone that Kevin's guilt was practically proven and that he would soon be arrested. They convinced the victim's parents that he was the one who killed their daughter, although they refused to believe it until the end. The day before the funeral, a farewell ceremony was supposed to take place in the church, and Kevin had been helping to organize it. Since early in the morning, he was called in for questioning again, with the promise of being released before the start of the ceremony. In the end, Kevin spent seven hours at the police station and missed the ceremony. Nobody present knew he was being questioned, so many assumed that Kevin didn't show up due to guilt over what had happened. Nane's parents didn't even want him to come to the funeral, as investigators had already convinced them of his involvement in the murder. But Kevin still came and sat far away from her relatives. By that time, experts had finished examining the evidence that the police had taken from the victim's apartment. Upon inspecting the light bulb in the desk lamp, they found a fingerprint that belonged to Kevin. 
It had been left by Donnie's blood, which indicated that the fingerprint could only have been made during or after the murder. This became the only available evidence for the investigators, but they continued to dig under Kevin for several more months, hoping to find more evidence. They were unable to do so, and on March 31, 2006, they decided to try to obtain a conviction with the available evidence. The young man was arrested and charged with murder. At that time, many residents still believed that he was guilty, so Kevin's lawyers first requested a change of venue to another district. They were concerned that the jurors might be negatively predisposed against their client and render a guilty verdict without sufficient evidence. This request was granted, and the trial began in another city. The defense called a witness who provided Kevin with a solid alibi. A plumber had come to his parents' house that morning and saw him there around 10.30 am. The prosecution insisted that Kevin could have had time to go to Nanae's and commit the murder, as according to medical experts. She had died between 10.30 am and 1 pm. They also presented an interesting fact. Kevin's phone had been turned off between 10.30 am and 12 pm. This time frame coincided with the time of the victim's murder. Furthermore, data from Kevin's phone showed that he only started calling his girlfriend at 4.30 pm, although during questioning, he claimed that he had been trying to contact her all day. However, at that time, the young man may have meant not only calls but also messages. Lawyers presented two more witnesses whose testimony disproved the possibility of Kevin committing the murder. One of them was Kevin's grandmother, who said that on that day, she saw her grandson near the gas station and gave him some money to have a snack at a cafe. Another witness saw the guy between 12.30 and 1 p.m. near the restaurant, and the establishment's cameras recorded him having lunch. Thus, the young man simply could not have committed the murder and returned back in time. Lawyers also challenged the fact that Kevin could have left a bloody fingerprint on the lamp during the murder. In that case, by the time the body was discovered, the blood should have dried up, and the experts who came to the apartment that evening wrote in the report that the bloody fingerprint was slightly damp, confirming that Kevin could have left it accidentally when he found Nane's body with his mother and friend. But that's not all. It turned out that based on the table lamp, which was used to hit the victim, fingerprints were also found, but they did not belong to Kevin, and checking them against the databases did not yield any results. Lawyers insisted that these fingerprints belonged to the real killer. Lawyers also pointed out that the police did a very poor job from the first minutes. They did not inspect the entire apartment which could have missed many potential clues. At the trial, a medical expert who examined the victim's body spoke, and an interesting statement awaited all participants in the process. He determined that after death, the victim's body lay on her back for some time after which she was turned face down. This could indicate that the young woman was still subjected to violence. The expert confirmed that he did not find any direct signs of this but added that he could not rule out such a scenario. Finally, lawyers presented the main trump card. According to the official statement of the prosecution, no fingerprints or DNA were found on the empty contraceptive package found next to the victim's body. But lawyers ordered a retest, and this time, the experts found male DNA. The analysis showed that it did not belong to Kevin, and checking it against the databases did not yield any results. The trial lasted over a year, but in July 2007, the jury delivered its verdict. They found Kevin not guilty of the murder of Nana due to lack of evidence. For the victim's relatives, who had believed him to be the killer from the first weeks, this decision was a shock. They continued to believe that Kevin was responsible for her death, and now he had managed to avoid punishment. Despite their client being acquitted, the legal team promised to continue working on the case and find the real killer. Considering that the police were fixated on Kevin, no one expected them to finally do their job properly. The first thing the lawyers did was to get the DNA from the contraceptive packaging compared to all the men who knew Nane. All these people voluntarily provided their samples, and none of them matched. This went on for two months until something unexpected happened in September 2007. The police arrested a man named Gary Dunn for robbery, and that's when things got interesting. Firstly, this man had already been convicted for attacking another woman. Secondly, he lived in the same residential complex as Nane. Thirdly, in the early stages of the investigation, the police considered him a suspect but quickly switched their focus to Kevin as they believed he was the killer. Given all this, the boy's lawyers requested a DNA test, and there was a long-awaited breakthrough. The sample from the contraceptive packaging matched Gary's DNA. It turned out that after the young woman's murder, investigators even questioned him using a polygraph. Gary, who was 26 at the time, passed it completely, even though in that case, the interrogation was also conducted by a non-certified specialist. Moreover, none of them even checked this person's alibi. Then Gary said that during the murder, he was shopping with his mother. After his DNA matched the sample from the victim's apartment, investigators finally bothered to check this information. 
the alibi turned out to be false. Gary really went shopping with his mother, just not at the time of the murder, as confirmed by the receipts with the purchase dates, and Gary even showed them to the police. But they simply disregarded such important information. They saw that the dates on the checks did not match the day of the murder. This was stated in the reports, but for some unknown reason, they either did not attach importance to this or somehow did not notice that the days did not match. In the end, experts compared Gary's fingerprints with those found on Nane's table lamp, and they matched. However, a serious problem arose here. The fingerprints and DNA matched, but not 100%. The judicial system has certain norms according to which the necessary coincidence indicators are established for guilt recognition. In Gary's case, these indicators were insufficient, although there were practically no chances that the DNA and fingerprints belonged to someone else. The investigators were likely guilty. Firstly, they did not study all the available evidence immediately after the murder as the rules require. It is possible that the DNA samples deteriorated slightly while not being properly studied a year after the murder. Secondly, the police could have missed many other clues because they simply did not search the entire apartment. As soon as the detectives received all this information, they arrested Gary and charged him with Nane's murder. Interestingly, at the time of her death, the man was on parole. In 2002, he attacked a woman who was running in the park, knocked her down, and started beating her, telling her that he was going to kill her. The woman managed to escape and ran to her car, while Gary fled the scene but was quickly found. The man spent 19 months in prison, after which he was released early. Interestingly, his DNA sample was not entered into the database. The trial of Gary began in April 2010, and there were many interesting things waiting for everyone. His own wife testified against him, saying that he was an aggressive and dangerous man. Gary regularly raised his hand against her, and the woman seriously feared for her life, so she was afraid to leave him. But the most interesting thing was that a few weeks before the victim's death, she saw her husband spying on Nana through the window of her apartment. Based on this, the prosecution assumed that the man had premeditated the attack. Given his criminal history, Gary clearly had a tendency towards violence, and he may have been keeping a close eye on Nana since she lived just a few meters away from him. On December 15th, he decided to act. Apparently, he knocked on her apartment door and came inside under a false pretense, where he grabbed the table lamp and struck her several times before assaulting and killing her. Because Gary used contraception, medical experts could not definitively say whether the victim had been sexually assaulted, but all the evidence pointed to it. Gary's lawyers denied his involvement, but he had no real alibi, so they focused on trying to blame Kevin. According to the lawyers, Kevin found out that the young woman was cheating on him and killed her. Kevin even had to testify in court and listen as they tried to paint him as the true criminal. Unfortunately, the prosecution could not use Gary's fingerprints or DNA as evidence, even though the match was practically undeniable. As a result, the jury could not come to a unanimous decision, and the trial was declared a mistrial. A new trial was not far behind, and its key difference was that a woman who Gary had nearly killed in 2002 testified in court. She told her how the man had attacked her and how she barely managed to escape. But despite this, the second trial also ended in nothing as the jurors did not reach a consensus. Consequently, Gary Dunn walked free as a free man, although his guilt was practically obvious. But a few years later, he did earn himself a prison sentence in 2018 when Gary was 39. He committed two separate crimes in one day. First, he attempted to kidnap a woman from a church parking lot, but she managed to fight him off. A few hours later, Gary stripped down in front of another woman in a mall parking lot and was soon arrested. Given his criminal history and the fact that he is practically a killer of Nane, the court decided to sentence him to the maximum term. Gary received 15 years in prison for these two incidents, and he is serving his sentence to this day. Despite having the right to petition for early release, authorities are unlikely to grant Gary such an opportunity. Additionally, they have the right to accuse him of Nane's murder for the third time, but they're not rushing to do so. The likelihood of the new trial ending in the same way as the previous two is very high, so investigators are trying to gather more evidence and prepare a stronger case against Gary. As for Kevin, after everything that happened, he pursued the study of law and, in 2011, he sued two police officers from the authorities of Russellville and Gary Dunn. He claimed that they were trying to pin someone else's crime on him, ignoring many clues and refusing to do their job properly. During the preparation for the trial, Kevin found out that, in fact, Gary's polygraph test results also showed lies, but investigators still did not consider him a suspect. Unfortunately, his lawsuit was dismissed due to the statute of limitations. As a result, negligent police officers did not face any consequences for letting the real killer roam free for years. And maybe, there again, in a few years, they will also not be punished for the fact that all acquaintances and relatives of Nana believed for years that Kevin was the murderer. Only a few years ago, 
Her parents stopped believing this and restored their relationship with him. Now, Kevin works as a lawyer and strives to help those who suffer from police negligence or unprofessionalism. Share your opinion about this story in the comments and don't forget to like this video if you enjoyed it. animation studio in Japan has climbed to 33 as Asia correspondent Rene Henry explains it's the country's worst mass murder in almost two decades. Today's video focuses on the tragic Anim Studio massacre in Kyoto, Japan, which stands as one of the most horrifying crimes in recent history. This heinous act was the result of the hatred harbored by a single individual, resulting in the loss of numerous innocent lives. Before delving into today's topic, I'd like to remind you to subscribe to our channel and activate the notification bell to stay updated with our latest content. If you find this story compelling, please share it widely. We eagerly await your thoughts and opinions on the matter. On July 18, 2019, at approximately 10.30 in the morning, a Japanese national targeted one of the three buildings belonging to Kyoto Animation Carrying a cart filled with liquids, this man entered the building without any resistance since there were no security personnel or employees at the doors. He had been surveilling the location for three consecutive days, ensuring a smooth entry. Without uttering a word, he proceeded to pour the contents of his cart, later identified as gasoline, throughout the offices, floors, and foundation. As the bewildered staff attempted to comprehend the situation and the man's motives, panic and fear gripped them when they realized the nature of the substance. The man's chilling words, die, die, echoed through the building. Despite their attempts to restrain him, the employees were unsuccessful. In that critical moment, several employees surrounded him. Realizing his escape was impeded, the man ignited a lighter and set himself ablaze. He swiftly fled the building, following a meticulously planned exit strategy. However, he suffered severe burns due to the rapid spread of fire, intensified by the presence of highly flammable gasoline. Losing consciousness some distance away from the studio, the situation spiraled out of control. Frantically, everyone inside the building ran for their lives, with only a handful managing to escape before the fire engulfed the premises. Those fortunate enough to flee identified the perpetrator as the individual responsible for the inferno. Tragically, most individuals remained trapped inside, unable to find a means of escape. Their bodies succumbed to the flames, and the screams grew increasingly desperate. With each passing moment, the number of victims continued to rise as the fire ascended to higher floors, spreading CO2 gas throughout the building. Approximately 70 employees were present that day. In a mere 30 seconds, the fire consumed the entire first floor. Within a minute, it had engulfed the second, third, and subsequent floors. The only viable escape route was to reach the roof but the spiral staircase proved to be a hindrance due to its limited capacity. Time proved insurmountable. The dense smoke rendered visibility impossible for some, making it difficult to breathe. Some lost consciousness, while others, fully aware and alive, resorted to unthinkable measures in a desperate bid to survive. Panic, terror, and fear gripped everyone within those walls. The fire trucks arrived after considerable delay, endangering the lives of those trapped inside as they struggled to control the massive blaze. It took five hours to gain some semblance of control and a full 24 hours to extinguish it completely. Subsequently, the police took charge of the situation, transforming the scene into a horrific tableau reminiscent of a horror movie. Charred corpses littered the hallways and corridors. The final death toll reached 34, with 36 individuals injured. Two among the injured later succumbed to their wounds, while the remaining survivors endured a year of medical treatment and multiple operations. Despite their best efforts, scars marred their bodies, permanent reminders of the tragedy. Some individuals never fully recovered and continue to bear the burden to this day.
Among the survivors was Shinji Yuba, the 41-year-old man responsible for the attack. Born in 1978 in Japan, little is known about his childhood. It is, however, established that his parents divorced when he was young, and he lived with his father. Isolated and lacking companionship, Yuba's psychological state deteriorated after his father's suicide in 1999. His behavior grew increasingly aggressive, even threatening his neighbor with death over a request to lower the volume of his radio. In 2012, Yuba perpetrated a robbery, brandishing a weapon and demanding money from a shop owner. Consequently, he received a three-and-a-half-year prison sentence, which he served in its entirety. Following his release, he came across a quiz in a newspaper, sponsored by the Kyoto Studio. This annual competition featured multiple stages, culminating in the winner's story being adapted into a studio series with a monetary reward. Intrigued, Yuba applied for the contest but was rejected during the initial stage. Undeterred, he resolved to try again the following year, determined to win. He submitted his story to the studio, only to face rejection once more. Disillusioned and frustrated, Yuba contemplated giving up. However, toward the end of 2018, while watching a series produced by the same company, he became convinced that his ideas had been plagiarized. The company vehemently denied any wrongdoing, dismissing his claims as baseless. The events Yuba accused them of stealing were trivial occurrences, common in various series, egg, friends going on a trip, swimming, and enjoying specific foods. Convinced of the company's attempt to deceive him and feeling wronged, Yuba sought to confront its manager. However, his attempts to communicate were rebuffed, leaving him no choice but to exact revenge through an extraordinarily twisted plan. Yuba began hacking into the email accounts of numerous employees associated with the company, sending death threats over an extended period. Although the company took precautions and stationed police officers at the building entrances and exits, they were withdrawn once the threats ceased. Yuba had cleverly employed an unbreakable code, concealing his identity as the sender. During this lull, he meticulously planned and executed the criminal act that led to the tragic incident. After two months in a coma, Yuba emerged and underwent numerous skin grafts. Due to the overwhelming number of victims requiring similar procedures, artificial skin grafts were performed on him. Once his treatment concluded, Yuba faced charges of premeditated murder and received a death sentence by hanging. However, due to the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic, the execution was delayed. Currently, Yuba remains incarcerated, while multiple parties advocate for a life sentence considering his potential mental disorder, which could mitigate his punishment. The aftermath of this incident and the extensive media coverage prompted several changes in the country's constitution. One significant amendment pertained to gasoline regulations, with restrictions placed on the sale of large quantities to individuals. Strict protocols were implemented for its purchase. Additionally, companies were mandated to deploy security personnel at building entrances and exits, ensure the presence of fire evacuation stairs, distribute manual fire extinguishers throughout the premises, and adopt smart lock systems designed exclusively for employees. The tragic events of that day and the subsequent fallout had a profound impact, prompting critical legal reforms and highlighting the imperative need for enhanced safety measures to prevent such tragedies from recurring. Thank you for watching. If you enjoyed this video, please give it a thumbs up and remember to subscribe. Click on one of the two videos on your screen for more When this news made the headlines throughout Singapore, nobody believed it. Singapore is one of the safest countries in the world, having only had one serial killer in its history. However, the murder of Ayakanu Maria was no joke. In 1984, the 34-year-old caretaker was killed, dismembered by a butcher, and cooked into curry. Unfortunately, the curry turned out to be far from tasty, and several people complained about its foul taste. 
when the police finally took on the case, they unraveled a very complicated story. In this article, we will explore who murdered Ayakanu, why they did it, and how they managed to get away with it. Well, on January 9, 1987, the police department in Changi, Singapore, was having a slow day, as usual. Not many serious crimes occur in Singapore, which made the following event all the more strange for the police officers. Detective G. Alagamale's pager buzzed. It was his trusted informant. The informant informed Detective G that he had been wanting to talk about this for two years and couldn't hold it in any longer. He claimed that two years prior, he had consumed a very peculiar curry at the Orchard Road Presbyterian Church, and there was something off about the meat. He was convinced that he had unknowingly eaten Ayakanu Maria's remains. As a detective in the sixth safest country in the world, where the murder rate is 0.17 per year, Detective G found it hard to believe his informant's claim. He initially thought the informant might be intoxicated or playing a prank. However, when Detective G dismissed the matter, the informant became even more serious. He insisted that he knew all about Ayakanu, an Indian-born immigrant who came to Singapore in 1980 with his wife Ramia and their three children. They resided in a small house behind the Presbyterian Church. Ayakanu worked as a caretaker for the Public Utilities Board's Run Holiday Chalets, located along Biggin Hill Road. Some members of his family also worked at the church. However, Ayakanu mysteriously disappeared at the end of 1984, and the informant was convinced that he had been consumed in the curry served in January 1985. Detective G didn't know how to react. The story was not only disgusting but also outrageous and difficult to believe. Nonetheless, when he returned to the police station, he decided to share it with his superiors. Since there wasn't much happening at the station at the time, they told Detective G that he could take on the case if he wished. Little did they know that Detective G was about to uncover one of the most haunting and bizarre cases in Singapore's history. Detective G wasn't going to waste any time. He was deeply intrigued by this crazy story, and as soon as he looked into the name Ayakana Marifa Mufu, he discovered a missing person file from December 1984. Surprisingly, it turned out that Detective G's own wife had reported Ayakanu missing. According to her report, Ayakanu was supposed to borrow money from his employer and go on vacation in Gunting Highlands, Malaysia, a location known for its casinos at the time. The police initially dismissed the case, assuming it was a man running away from his family, and it was soon forgotten when the family never contacted the police again. However, there were several peculiar aspects about this missing person file that caught Detective G's attention. Firstly, he found it highly unlikely that Ayakanu would go gambling or borrow money from his employer, especially since he had recently borrowed $600 to pay for his children's school books. This meant that he still owed money to his employer and had no funds left for gambling. On the other hand, it didn't seem like Ayakanu was planning to abandon his family. He had made appearances before his planned vacation and he had even taken days off work just before Christmas Day, indicating his intention to stay home for the holidays. So why would he disappear just two days before going on vacation? Furthermore, there was something else that stood out as the biggest clue of all. Mia, Ayakanu's wife, had reported him missing but then abruptly stopped all contact with the police. In Ayakanu's case, nobody seemed to care. His wife and children even left their home months after his disappearance. Mia took a caretaker job at Fucho Methodist Church and brought her family along as if she knew Ayakanu was never coming home again. Throughout early 1987, Detective G spoke to everyone who knew Ayakanu, not just his family but also neighbors, churchgoers, church staff, and anyone who might have heard something. It was during these conversations that a clearer picture started forming in the detective's mind. Contrary to what he expected, most people didn't express sympathy for Ayakanu. Instead, they seemed relieved, saying things like good riddance. It turned out that Ayakanu was a notorious raging alcoholic who brutally abused his wife, Ramia, on a daily basis. He would beat and kick her in front of their children and even in front of Ramia's brothers, who also resided in Changi. The neighbors could hear their fights and witness Ramia's daily bruises. There was another side to the story as well. In traditional Asian culture, divorce is rarely considered an option, and those who choose to divorce often face significant shame and may even lose their family's support. 
Understanding this cultural context, Detective G started piecing together what had actually happened to Ayakanu. Detective G made a significant discovery. One of Ramiya's brothers, Balakrishna, worked as a butcher in mutton cellar. In Detective G's words, a mutton cellar would have heavy choppers, which seemed to fit well with the case. If the informant's story was true and Ayakanu had been turned into curry, a butcher would have the knowledge and tools to dismember his body. However, Detective G had a hunch that there were more individuals involved, and he wanted to gather all the names before making any moves. This way, he could ensure that no one would escape before being apprehended. By March 23rd of that year, Detective G had identified three more suspects, two men and a woman working at two churches involved in the finance ministry holiday bungalows in Changi. That night, officers from the special investigation section conducted a large raid, Several locations were simultaneously raided at 2 a.m., resulting in the arrest of eight suspects. All of them were Ayakanu's relatives, including his wife, her three brothers, their wives, and Ramiya's mother. Balakrishna, Ramiya's brother, worked as a butcher and mutton seller. Her other two brothers, Krishnana and Jamligam Chandra, worked as caretakers at the Finance Ministry Holiday Bungalows and the Orchard Road Presbyterian Church. Out of the eight suspects, some adamantly denied their involvement, while others remained silent, wearing a composed poker face and waiting for the police to take action. However, one of them eventually broke under the pressure from the officers. According to their confession, the murder occurred inside the Presbyterian Church's caretaker quarters on December 12, 1984. Rainia's three brothers had confronted Ayakanu, intending to warn him to stay away from their sister, threatening to beat him up. However, Ayakanu resisted and wanted to fight back, leading the brothers to decide to end his life. They restrained him on the ground and bludgeoned him to death with an iron rod. Here's where the story takes an even more gruesome turn. The family realized that they couldn't simply bury Ayakanu's body in a wooded area, as they would likely be caught. Given Balakrishna's butchering skills, he took his best meat cleavers and proceeded to dismember Ayakanu's body, just as he would with mutton. The family then cooked numerous batches of curry and biryani using Ayakanu's meat. These traditional Indian dishes were heavily spiced with chili powder to mask the terrible taste. The larger bones and skull were crushed and placed in black plastic bags, which were disposed of in various rubbish bins throughout the neighborhood. As for the curry, there was a significant quantity of it. Ayakanu's family packed it into large bags, some of which were simply discarded like spoiled restaurant food. Others were taken to various local churches in Changi, Singapore. Unbeknownst to the churchgoers, many of them consumed the human curry. During their investigation, the police spoke to a sanitation worker who had come across a tightly sealed bag filled with curry while cleaning a large dumpster. Intrigued by the pleasant smell and apparent freshness, he decided to taste it. However, the taste was so awful that he had to spit it out. As the police interviewed numerous churchgoers in the area, they uncovered the grim reality that many of them had unknowingly consumed the disturbing curry. In December 1984 and January 1985, the three brothers and Ramia were charged with murder, while Ramia's sister-in-law, Mary Mandui, and mother Kamachi were charged with abetting the crime. The case garnered nationwide attention, making headlines all over the country. Jagajit Singh, the director of the Central Investigations Department, described the case as unusual because the victim's remains were never found and the murder had not been reported. The disposal of the body added to the bizarre nature of the crime. Here's where the story takes an even stranger twist. Three months later, all six suspects were brought to court, and Detective G and his dedicated team of officers were confident that the family would be convicted and sentenced to imprisonment. They had a suspect's partial confession, testimonies from various individuals who knew Ayakanu, and a reasonably clear theory to present to the judge. The trial drew a crowd of 200 people and garnered significant attention across Singapore. Facing the death penalty, all six suspects stood before the court as journalists from around the country anxiously awaited the verdict. However, the prosecutor, Cushion, declared that there was no way to proceed with the case. Firstly, Ayakanu's body had been disposed of meticulously, leaving no trace behind. The murder weapon was never found, and even Balakrishna's meat cleavers provided no substantial clues. It's possible that the police did not scrutinize them closely enough, 
or DNA analysis was not feasible with the technology available in 1987. Ayakenu's killers may never face full justice as the police only had an outrageous confession and reports of the bad curry. Consequently, all six suspects were discharged and released, and the case was dismissed. However, it's important to note that they were not acquitted and they could still face charges if sufficient evidence is presented in the future. The police promised to continue their investigations in hopes of gathering more evidence against the family. On the day of their release, the three brothers were arrested again under the Criminal Law Act. They were held in Changi Prison for four years. Yet, today, Ayakanu's killers roam free, potentially under aliases and protected from police scrutiny. However, Ayakanu's death is a complex story. Should Ramia face the death penalty? Does her husband's constant abuse justify her brother's decision? And to what extent should Ramia be held responsible if the murder was not premeditated? These are all questions that add layers of complexity to the case. Let us know your thoughts in the comment section, and before you go don't forget to like this video and subscribe for more. This is the story of how a murderer can avoid punishment for years, even though many facts point to his involvement. In a small town, a 13-year-old girl disappeared, and her disappearance was not noticed until 24 hours later. This case remained unsolved for over 10 years, and only in the summer of 2021 did it come to its conclusion. In this video, we will tell you what happened to Haley Dunn. The story took place in the American town of Colorado City, Texas. This place is a typical low-rise America with an area of 14 square kilometers. Only 4,000 people lived in the town. On Christmas Day 2010, the town had a New Year's atmosphere. Residents decorated their homes, participated in festive events, and had fun. 13-year-old Haley Dunn was no exception. For Christmas, she was given a new iPod, which made her very happy. Haley lived with her mom, Billy, her boyfriend, Seen, and her older brother, David. Her mother divorced her own father, named Clint, when the girl was 10 years old. However, they never stopped communicating. In fact, her father lived literally across the street from Haley's house, so they saw each other almost every day. The girl was very close to her father and tried to spend time with him as often as possible. Family and friends described the girl as cheerful, funny, and energetic. She was a member of her school's cheerleading team, participated in athletics, and played the saxophone. Haley was also on three sports teams. On December 26, the girl spent most of Christmas at her father's house, unwrapping presents. Afterwards, she came home, played video games, and went to bed. The next day, her stepfather and mother went to work as usual. Billy left her cell phone at home so the children could contact her. Before she left, she peeked into her daughter's bedroom while she was still asleep. Seen was working in another town, which was about a half-hour drive away. According to him, he had an argument with his boss that day, which resulted in him being fired and leaving work just 10 minutes after he arrived. He then drove to his mother's house, spent some time there, and returned to Colorado City about 3 p.m. in the evening. Seen went to pick up Billy from work, and when they arrived home, Billy noticed that her daughter wasn't home. Seen told her that the girl had gone into his room that afternoon and told him that she was going to her father's house. After that, she planned to go to a friend's house and spend the night. Haley often stayed overnight at her friend's houses, so her mother took this information calmly. Small towns like this often have the illusion of safety, so parents are less worried that something might happen to their child. The next day, December 28, Haley never came home. Billy decided to call the parents of a friend at whose house her daughter was supposed to spend the night. To her mother's surprise, they weren't even aware that Haley had planned to spend the night at their house. She hadn't shown up. It was further revealed that the girl hadn't even stopped by her father's house. Then, Billy got worried and decided to ask her neighbors if they had seen her daughter. She went door to door, and no one had seen the girl that day. Around 2 p.m., Billy went to the police, but they decided to take the easiest route. The police's main theory was that she had run away from home, which initially hindered the investigation. A voluntary escape is not investigated on the same level as a missing minor. They searched Billy and Clint's homes and brought search dogs to the scene. The next day, they picked up Haley's trail from the house to a local motel. It was very strange that none of the motel employees had seen this girl. She wasn't captured on any security cameras, 
and a full search of the building yielded no results. Train dogs pointed to a motel, but the girl apparently never showed up there. As news of Haley's disappearance spread through the city, dozens of concerned people joined the search. Some looked around the area while others printed and handed out flyers. Here we come to another strange moment. Clint, the girl's own father, practically never left the street. He looked in every corner, every possible nook and cranny, even looked in dumpsters. According to him, he just couldn't sit at home and wait. Meanwhile, Billy and Seam were not so enthusiastic. The mother handed out flyers but refused to go around the neighborhood looking for her daughter. She explained that searching gave her the impression that they were already looking for her body and that there was no chance of finding the girl alive. As for Seen, he took absolutely no part. But that's not the strangest thing either. On December 31, four days after the girl went missing, Billy and Seen threw a New Year's Eve party. They had friends over, listening to music, drinking and partying. A behavior exhibited by a mother whose daughter had disappeared without a trace seemed simply absurd. On January 3, a week after Haley's disappearance, the police finally declared her missing officially. This declaration allowed more serious agencies, such as the FBI and the Texas Rangers, to get involved. Representatives from these agencies arrived in Colorado City and began their investigation. Meanwhile, volunteers continued to calm the area and over 100 billboards were posted throughout Texas and beyond, seeking information about the missing girl. Detectives completely ruled out the possibility of Haley escaping. Firstly, they couldn't find a reason why Haley would choose to take such a step. The day before her disappearance, she had been in a fine mood, and throughout the rest of the time, she showed no signs of a tendency to run away. Secondly, all of her belongings were left behind in her room. If she had decided to run away, she would have taken something with her. The detectives quickly realized they needed to take a closer look at Billy and Scene. Their passive attitude towards the girls' search and the New Year's Eve party raised serious questions about their concern for Haley. Further investigation revealed that on December 27, the same day Haley allegedly spent the night at a friend's house, Scene and Billy had withdrawn $140 from their bank cards. They admitted using the money to purchase illegal substances, which they consumed that evening while their children were away from home. On January 6, the police reported that Billy and Scene had been questioned using a polygraph. The results were very interesting. Billy failed on two attempts, the first while under the influence of substances, and the second result showed her lying. Scene also failed two interrogations and walked away before finishing the third round of questioning. Following this, Billy suspected Seen's involvement in her daughter's disappearance and demanded that he move out of her home. On January 12, the police officially announced that Seen was being treated as a suspect. Several facts contributed to this decision. Firstly, it became known that Seen and Billy's relationship had been strained, with Seen having previously threatened both Billy and her daughter with violence during arguments. Secondly, among Seen's belongings, numerous sheets containing information about serial killers were found. It later emerged that both Seen and Billy had taken an interest in similar topics. Additionally, the police examined Seen's phone's geolocation data, which revealed inconsistencies in his account of the day Haley disappeared. While he did arrive at work and stayed for 10 minutes, he did not go to his mother's house as he had claimed. Instead, he returned to Colorado City and headed to Billy's house. It was only later that he drove to his mother's house. It's important to note that the police tracked the phone's location via cell towers, which have a range of several miles, allowing for only a rough estimation of Scene's whereabouts. Moreover, interviews with Haley's friends and acquaintances uncovered even creepier details. Haley repeatedly expressed fear of Scene. She admitted to her best friend that she preferred spending time outside or at friends' houses because she didn't feel safe around him. She once confided in her grandmother that she often saw Seen standing in front of her bedroom door in the middle of the night, causing her to fear he would enter the room. Additionally, during a conversation about Haley's disappearance with her uncle, he expressed disbelief that anyone would harm a child. Seen's response was extremely strange, as he said, it's like killing a deer. Armed with this information, the detectives concluded that Haley had not lived in a prosperous family. Her mother and stepfather frequently drank, used illegal substances, and hosted parties. Seen's behavior raised significant suspicions, but there was no direct evidence against him. Eventually, the police. 
contacted Child Welfare, who made the decision to remove Haley's older brother from the home. On February 24, the police searched the house where Sean lived with Billy and his mother. A shocking discovery awaited them, a removable drive and hard drive containing over 100,000 obscene images of minors were found. The police also seized Sean's laptop, but apparently did not have the opportunity to examine its contents. Sean's father came to the station and demanded the return of his son's equipment for reasons unknown, and the police complied. Surprisingly, Sean received no punishment for possessing such illegal material on his computer. On March 17, police officers went to Billy's house to question Sean. Although a woman initially claimed he wasn't home, the officer presented a prearranged warrant and entered the premises, discovering Sean hiding inside. Billy, who had been concealing him, received 90 days in jail and a year of correctional time. She was sent to a correctional facility in Travis County, where she stayed after her release. In 2012, however, the couple finally broke up as Billy seriously considered Sean's involvement in her daughter's disappearance. Since then, the case had effectively stalled, with no new evidence emerging and volunteers unable to find any trace of the missing girl. This continued until March 16, 2013, when a hiker discovered human remains. Near Lake J.B. Thomas in Scary County, experts conducted the necessary tests and determined that the remains belonged to Haley Dunn. Her body was found about 20 miles from her home. Police have not disclosed the cause of death, but sources say it could be blunt force trauma. After the discovery of the body, the investigation reignited. Authorities offered a $15,000 reward for any information leading to the capture of the culprit. Their focus turned back to scene, but nothing had changed since the girl disappeared. The police simply didn't have direct evidence against him, but they had circumstantial evidence. The girl's body had been found only a few miles from Sean's mother's house, which matched the geolocation data on his phone, given the short distance. Sean could have easily left the body in that area without anyone knowing. Moreover, he grew up in the area and would have known where it was best to hide the body. However, the investigators could not find any other clues, and the case was frozen again for many years. Despite this, the girl's family had to wait four years to bury her remains. A memorial service was held in January 2017. In 2018, Haley's father, Clint, expressed his belief that Sean and Billy were guilty. According to his version, Sean's mother either helped cover up the truth or was directly involved in the murder. That same year, Clint began giving numerous interviews and actively publicizing the case. He stated that in the early years of the investigation, he tried not to pester the police with constant questions, but his patience had run out. The detectives did little to investigate, and his last hope was to spread the word widely in an effort to bring the perpetrators to justice. In 2019, an unknown person wrote to Clint, claiming to have found several items that might have belonged to Haley in 2011. At that time, the person was in high school and was unaware of the missing girl, so they didn't report their findings to the police. The true information about the items has not yet been disclosed by the police. Sometime later, New information emerged from private investigator Erica Moore, who was handling the Haley case and kept in touch with Clint. In October 2019, she started receiving messages from various women in Texas, stating that they were being aggressively harassed online by a man registered under the name Casey. This man was not only sending lewd messages, but also explicit photos and videos of himself. Considering Scene had the same middle name, Erica asked the women to send her the photos and videos. Her theory was confirmed, as it was indeed seen. Erica persuaded one woman to go to the police station and file a report on scene, but they refused to press charges and even accused the woman of falsifying the facts. Erica's plan to put a potentially dangerous criminal behind bars for stalking women on the internet did not work. The case went quiet again until an unexpected development in May 2021. Erica and Clint were invited to the district attorney's office for an urgent meeting. There, they received the long-awaited announcement that Haley's killer would be arrested in June. However, the specific information was kept secret until June 14, 2021. After 10 years of waiting, the police finally took Scene into custody and charged him with the murder of Haley. He is currently in jail awaiting trial, with a bail set at $20 million. The police have not disclosed the new evidence that led to his arrest, as it is being kept secret until the trial. Prior to the arrest, the police obtained permission to take a DNA sample from scene. 
which may have some connection to Haley's belongings found back in 2011. Upon learning of her ex-boyfriend's arrest, Billy made a very strange statement, expressing no surprise about Scene's involvement in the murder. She also thanked God that he would now be punished for what he had done, even though she had actively obstructed justice during the early investigation by defending Scene. The trial date is yet to be announced, and it is uncertain whether a conviction will be obtained, depending on the significance of the evidence that the police are currently withholding. However, Scene remained at large for over 10 years, despite all the evidence pointing to his involvement in Haley's murder, including her complaints to friends and relatives, possession of forbidden materials involving children, and constant lies during interrogations. Clint, unlike Billy, put forth his best efforts and played a crucial role in the case's potential resolution. Erica Moore, in one interview, hinted that the case might not have been solved without his active participation. More details of this case and, most importantly, the court decision are expected to come in the near future. Currently, all indications suggest that Scene could face a conviction, and in Texas, that would mean a guaranteed death penalty for what he did to the child. Unfortunately, this cannot bring back Haley Dunn and give her a long and happy life. A 20-year-old student went for a run and disappeared without a trace. The whole country was watching for her, and the police could not find a single clue. The truth revealed through surveillance footage shocked all of America and sparked fierce controversy. Today, we will tell you the story of Molly Tibbetts and what her disappearance led to. Molly Tibbetts was born on May 8, 1988, in San Francisco, California. When she was in second grade, her parents divorced, and Molly moved to Gawa with her mother and two brothers. Her father, however, continued to maintain a close relationship with his children. After high school, she enrolled at Yawa State University as a psychology major. In her spare time, she worked at a day camp at the Regional Medical Center. She had an active lifestyle, played sports, and had many friends. She spent the summer of 2018 in a tiny town called Brooklyn, which is also in Yawa. It is barely over three kilometers in size and only has 1,400 people living there. It would seem that in such a quiet place where everyone knows each other, nothing terrible could happen. On July 18, 2018, Molly was going for a run. She was living in Brooklyn with her boyfriend, Dalton Jack, at his brother's house. On the evening of that day, she was in the house alone. Her boyfriend was away at work in another town 210 kilometers from Brooklyn. Molly sent him a picture on Snapchat and went out for a run at about 7.30 p.m. The next day, Molly was supposed to go to work, but she never showed up. This seriously disturbed her family and boyfriend. They all knew that the girl was extremely responsible and never missed work without warning. In addition, she did not respond to calls and messages. As a result, the parents decided to contact the police, who began a search for Molly. From the early days, the case began to attract increased attention across America. As for the residents of Brooklyn, the disappearance of a young girl was a real shock. Nothing like this had ever happened in this quiet town before. People had never locked their doors and were sure of their own safety. Molly's father, Rob Tibbetts, came to Brooklyn from San Francisco and took an active part in the search. He handed out flyers with her photographs, questioned people, and tried in every way to help the investigation. The parents did not give up hope until the very last moment that their daughter would be found alive and unharmed. Three agencies got involved in the search for the girl, the Iowa Division of Criminal Investigation, the Federal Bureau of Investigation, and the Powasheet County Police Department. Together, they worked on more than 2,000 leads and interviewed about 500 people. The search for Molly was scattered throughout Brooklyn's neighborhoods. At one point, law enforcement received a report that Molly had been spotted at a truck stop in Kearney, Missouri, 380 miles from Brooklyn. The police checked this information and could find no confirmation. The police, as is proper in such cases, checked the theory that her boyfriend was involved. Statistically, most crimes of this nature are committed by relatives or loved ones, but not this time. The boyfriend's alibi was ironclad. He really was in another city and physically couldn't have been in Brooklyn that night. Time passed and the search for Molly yielded no results. The Criminal Investigation Division announced a cash reward for any information leading to the girl's return alive and unharmed. The amount grew steadily and eventually reached $366,000. This was a very substantial amount of money, 
even by U.S. standards, and for the state of Viola, the reward was a record. At one point, the police said they were narrowing the search for Molly to a few locations around Brooklyn, her boyfriend's house, several local farms, a gas station, a truck stop, and a car wash. But none of it helped to locate Molly. The police received hundreds of leads, each of which led to a dead end. There was one episode, however, that struck me as odd. The owner of one of the pig farms where the police concentrated their search was extremely reluctant to contact law enforcement. He denied any involvement in Molly's disappearance but refused to take a polygraph examination. All this made him an excellent candidate for the role of suspect, but there was no evidence against him. This meant that the police could neither interrogate the man nor search his farm. The police tried to find some connection between the farmer and Molly's disappearance, but they were unsuccessful at least at that time. However, everything changed on August 21st. A few days earlier, a law enforcement source told reporters that the police had found the body of a young white woman. Of course, everyone immediately assumed it was Molly, and they were right. On August 21st, the police issued an official statement. Molly Tibbetts' body was found in Powshik County, where Brooklyn was located. The parents identified their daughter, and the investigators immediately noticed she was missing two items she always took with her, a smartphone and a fitness bracelet. Soon, the medical examiner made an official conclusion. The girl was attacked by several blows with a sharp object. This further shocked the residents of Brooklyn. They all knew each other and could not even think that there was a violent criminal among them. The newspapers also broke the story, making the whole of America talk about it. The solution to this gruesome crime was nor did the police have much hope in the case, given the complete lack of evidence. No one believed that the girl and child could be found. Compounding the situation was the fact that crucial time for the search had been lost in the first few days. 24 years had passed. Mark had started a new family and he had two daughters. He had long ago stopped believing that he would one day see Charlotte and Mark alive. But in 2001, the case took a new turn. Charlotte's daughter from her first marriage, Jennifer, flew to Hawaii and went to the police station. She convinced them to reopen the case of her mother's disappearance. The detectives agreed put Charlotte and Mark's information into the missing person's database and created a computer portrait of Mark growing up based on his childhood photo. The first thing the detectives decided to do was to interrogate Mark because his behavior in the early stages of the investigation seemed strange to them. There was no mention in the old documents that the man had called the police station by phone two days after the girl and child disappeared. It said he did not come to the police station until three weeks later. This led detectives to believe that Mark may have been involved in their disappearance. Even though 24 years had passed since then, the police tried to find any witnesses who lived near Mark and Charlotte's home. Of course, most of the residents had already changed, but the detectives were lucky enough to find one senior citizen who had lived there back then. He remembered Mark and Charlotte and told the detectives an interesting fact. According to the pensioner, the couple often quarreled, and he heard them shouting, the detectives then decided that the case was getting close to a solution and Mark was indeed guilty. He was called in for questioning and told about the witness who had heard his regular arguments with Charlotte. Mark did not deny that there had indeed been verbal altercations between them. He also asked to see a married couple who would never fight. Detectives tried with all their might to prove his guilt and offered Mark to voluntarily undergo an interrogation with a polygraph. The results were ambiguous. The specialist who read the testimony could not give a clear answer whether the man was guilty or not. A polygraph is inherently an overrated instrument. It is not physically capable of showing whether a suspect is lying or not. Dozens of factors can affect its results, which can be mistaken for the truth and vice versa. If an innocent person is very nervous during an interrogation or withholds completely different information that is relevant to the questions, the polygraph can make him out to be a liar. In Mark's case, the polygraph was of no use either. But the detectives decided to approach it from a different angle. They obtained a warrant to examine the house where Charlotte and Mark lived in 1977. What interested them the most was the terrace built shortly after the girl and child went missing. They speculated that Charlotte might not have gone anywhere that day, but might have been hurt by her husband in another quarrel and ended up in the ground under the terrace. It is not clear how the police imagined the events of that day and how an infant fits into the story, but they had no other versions. Forensics dug through the backyard and examined the terrace, 
but they were unable to find any trace of anyone's remains there. It is not known if they compensated the new owners of the house for the two days of digging in the backyard. The detectives admitted they had nothing else to work with and set the case aside again. As a last resort, they took DNA samples from Jennifer and Mark, hoping it would someday help. The case went into a long, drawer again for a full 10 years. But after that time came the grand finale to this whole tangled story. Steve Carter, 35, of Philadelphia, had wondered about his past from an early age. He grew up in an orphanage, and at the age of four, he was adopted by a wealthy New Jersey couple. The U.S. Army officer and his wife loved the baby and cared for him as their own. Steve also loved his foster parents, but he always wondered how he ended up in the orphanage. In 2011, he stumbled upon an internet article that told the amazing story of Caroline White, who had been kidnapped from the hospital when she was just 19 days old. Decades later, Caroline was browsing missing children's websites and found her childhood photo there. She realized with horror that it was her current parents who had kidnapped her from the hospital. Steve Carter was inspired by the story and began researching the same sites. He entered his birth information on his certificate and was immediately speechless. The first result showed an adult photo of him taken by artists based on a baby picture. The resemblance was so strong that Carter could not even move in shock. He realized he was the same Max Barnes who had gone missing in Hawaii with his birth mother. After recovering from his shock, Steve made the decision to take a DNA test. Taking the opportunity through a missing child search service, their database contained DNA samples of Mark and Jennifer taken by the police 10 years earlier. After eight months of waiting, the test showed an exact match. Steve Carter turned out to be Mark's Barnes. Police instantly reopened the investigation. The missing infant found himself 34 years later, but the circumstances of his disappearance were still a mystery, but not for long. His birth certificate helped solve the mystery. First, the certificate was not issued until a year after the birth of the child. Second, his name was Tenzin Amia, and his mother's name was Jane Amia. That's what helped the police connect the two key strands because that name had already appeared in the reports not long after Charlotte and the child disappeared. The police received a strange call shortly after. A woman reported that a girl with an infant baby had knocked on her door and asked for milk to feed her. The police arrived on the scene believing that the girl was in an inadequate state. She was taken to a psychiatric clinic for evaluation and the infant was handed over to the guardianship authorities. This girl was Charlotte. After a few days in the hospital, she secretly escaped and was never seen again. The child remained in the care of the state because he did not even have a birth certificate, and it was impossible to identify his relatives. When the truth came out, everyone had a legitimate question. Why did the police not compare the disappearance of the girl and the baby to another situation, especially when the infant was left in the care of the state? Couldn't they have realized that they had the very same child in front of them? Now, 34 years later, it's hard to answer that question. Perhaps the police simply didn't know about the disappearance because the two cases were handled by two different precincts. Steve, who by then was working in a prestigious job and had a family of his own, decided to make contact with his half-sister and biological father. They were shocked when the man revealed his own disappearance. No one believed anymore that the infant might still be alive. Although we don't know what happened to Charlotte, the ending of this story can definitely be considered happy. Statistics tell us that the chances of finding missing children after so many years are zero, but the case of Mark's Barnes was one of the rare exceptions. He grew up in a wonderful family, received a good upbringing, and became a successful man. Most likely, Charlotte was indeed suffering from a serious mental disorder. She knocked on the door of a stranger asking for milk to feed her son. Perhaps the call to the police saved the infant's life. Who knows how Charlotte's mental state would have changed in the future? It is still unknown what happened to her, and it is unlikely that the mystery will ever be solved. Considering that she never tried to contact her husband or find her son, the woman could have died a short time after escaping from the asylum. A 16-year-old girl, Fawn Cox, lived with her parents and younger sisters in a small two-story house situated in a rough residential neighborhood. Despite their limited means, Fawn helped take care of her siblings, attended church regularly, and enjoyed swimming. At 16, she took on a part-time job at a local amusement park during her summer vacations in 1989. 
welcome and it is e crime stories before we start don't forget like video and subscribe for more on july 26th after finishing her shift at around 10 pm fawn's mother and younger sister picked her up by car since public transportation would have been time consuming upon returning home fawn went straight to bed as she had to work the following morning sleeping alone on the second floor her sister Amber was babysitting for a neighbor, while Felicia chose to sleep on the cooler first floor where the only functioning air conditioner was located. The next morning, at around 9 o'clock, the family was awakened by the alarm clock in Fawn's room, which she failed to turn off. Concerned, her mother and younger sister went to her room, where they were met with a horrifying scene. Fawn lay lifeless on her bed, her neck visibly bruised, devoid of pulse. Despite calling for an ambulance, Fawn had already passed away several hours earlier. Medical experts determined that she had been strangled and also subjected to abuse prior to her death. The police faced a challenging investigation. Despite the murder occurring in a small house with poor soundproofing, Fawn's parents and sister heard nothing due to the loud air conditioner on the first floor. The only unusual occurrence was noticed by Fawn's sister, their anxious, barking poodle. However, they attributed the dog's behavior to pregnancy, unaware of its significance. Upon examining the crime scene, the police made several important discoveries. They theorized that the attacker or group entered the house through a second-story window overlooking the backyard. A nearby park trailer facilitated access to the window, which had been left open due to the lack of air conditioning on the second floor. In Fawn's room, investigators found crucial clues, short hairs, small blood stains, and traces of semen on her bedsheet, all sent for laboratory analysis. Several items were also missing from the house, while others were found discarded on the ground outside. Further inspection revealed that items had been taken from a closet in an adjoining room on the second floor. It appeared that the perpetrator had been hiding in the closet, waiting for the household to sleep. However, since Fawn's sister didn't sleep in that room that night, the missing items went unnoticed. Another peculiar clue emerged, an old army cap found in Fawn's room, which her relatives claimed to have never seen her wear. Detectives believe that the killer may have left the cap behind accidentally. Despite the substantial evidence, the police struggled to identify suspects quickly. In 1989, DNA forensics were underdeveloped, and genetic databases were not commonly available. Detective Benjamin Caldwell, in charge of the case, proposed a theory that multiple assailants, familiar with the house, were involved. They not only knew how to access the second floor through the backyard but were also acquainted with the room layout. The next step for the police was to seek witnesses. They interviewed neighbors, friends, and relatives of Fawn but obtained inconclusive information. Complicating matters was the impoverished neighborhood, home to various criminal gangs, making it challenging to bring potential perpetrators to justice. Before we continue don't forget like video and subscribe. One month after Fawn's murder, the case finally gained momentum. The police obtained a witness who provided crucial information that had not been made public, lending credibility to their account. This witness led the police to three teenage suspects, one of whom was in the same class as Fawn. The boys were arrested and questioned, but they vehemently denied any involvement in the murder. During a search of one of the suspects' homes, stolen items from Fawn's room were discovered. This evidence was sufficient to charge all three teenagers with murder. However, the detectives faced disappointment yet again. Firstly, the witness suddenly recanted their statement and ceased cooperating with the investigation. Secondly, DNA analysis conducted on blood, hair, and semen found at the crime scene did not definitively match the samples collected from the suspects. In those years, the technology for precise matching was not available, yielding inconclusive results. Nevertheless, one of the detainees provided valuable information during an interrogation. He confessed to breaking into Fawn's house that night with the company of other boys and stealing items. He described how he accessed the second floor through the canopy and revealed previously unknown details. According to his account, when he threw a tape recorder out of the window, the handle detached and fell. He hid it under a nearby bush, and the police indeed found the item in that exact location. However, the young man quickly recanted his confession and stopped cooperating with the investigation rendering it inadmissible in court. Consequently, the police had to release the suspects, and the investigation came to a halt once again. It is likely that the witnesses were intimidated, and without their testimony, the case had minimal prospects. One of the suspects did serve eight months in jail for stealing items from Fawn's house. The case remained dormant until the early 2000 seconds when the police reopened the investigation. The first step was uploading DNA samples from the crime scene to the CODIS database, which had been established several years earlier, 
and contain DNA profiles of individuals involved in serious crimes. Unfortunately, no matches were found for the killer. The creation of this database was a result of significant scientific advancements in DNA analysis and allowed the police to reanalyze DNA samples from the original suspects using more advanced techniques. This time, experts conclusively determined that the hair, semen, and blood did not belong to any of the three individuals. This discrepancy was perplexing considering the suspects were found in possession of Fawn's belongings. Detectives speculated that the three boys had indeed burglarized her house that night but had an accomplice who perpetrated the abuse and murder. This raised further questions. Could it be that four criminals entered the house undetected, killed Fawn, and left without a trace? The police had no answers to this question and the case once again reached a standstill. As the years passed, the hope of solving Fawn's murder dwindled for her family. They remained convinced that the three initial suspects had been present in their house that night and might hold information about the killer but would never disclose it. The only possibility of uncovering the truth lay in a DNA sample stored in the police lab. Before we continue don't forget like video and subscribe. The authorities, their lack of resources and the sheer number of unsolved cases posed significant challenges. In 2018, an intriguing development occurred. Fawn's younger sister, Amber, disclosed previously unknown details about the crime on a well-known American forum dedicated to unsolved crimes. The forum had gained a reputation for reliability over its two decades of existence, and its participants had assisted the police in solving several high-profile cases. Amber's identity was verified, adding credibility to her post. She revealed that she worked as a nanny during the week and only stayed at home on weekends, sleeping in the same room on the second floor through which the burglars had entered. If criminals had indeed broken in, they would have been immediately noticed. Additionally, they would have needed to surveil the house and wait for Fawn's mother and younger sister to arrive to pick her up from work. Despite Amber's revelation, the case remained unsolved. However, it was now 2018, and advancements in DNA research had come a long way. New analysis tools were leading to the resolution of numerous long-forgotten cases. Fawn's relatives, aware of these advancements, questioned why the police were not reopening the murder investigation. They persisted in their conversations with the detectives, only to receive the same response each time. That extended DNA testing required funding and the police had numerous cases to prioritize. Thus, the relatives had to wait for their turn and for funding to become available. Taking matters into their own hands, the family launched a fundraiser in 2019. They aimed to cover the full cost of DNA samples and offered a $10,000 reward for any information leading to the capture of the perpetrators. The case received extensive media coverage, and through interviews and appeals, many caring individuals responded to the family's requests for assistance. The necessary funds were quickly raised. However, their hopes were dashed once again when the police department refused to initiate the investigation using the funds provided by the victim's relatives. The lead detective explained the challenges that would arise from such a situation. If the relatives of one victim could pay for tests and expedite the results, hundreds of other families who had been searching for years for the murderers of their loved ones would also expect the same right. Implementing such a system in practice would be impossible, as only a few laboratories worldwide conducted innovative DNA tests. With a simultaneous influx of requests, their resources would be insufficient. Paraben Nano Labs, a leading company in the field, had made significant advancements in DNA analysis, including identifying a person's relatives from minimal genetic samples and creating an approximate portrait of the DNA's owner. The family believed that this lab should take over the study of the samples from Fawn's bedroom on the night of her murder. Fawn's relatives suspected that the police were not actively pursuing the case due to their impoverished background and the neighborhood they lived in. Murder investigations were not prioritized for families like theirs. In an interview, Fawn's sister expressed her belief that if the murder had involved a wealthy or influential family, the investigations would have been conducted promptly. Unfortunately, the process could not be expedited, and it wasn't until late 2020 that a significant breakthrough occurred. However, the family was unprepared for the shocking truth that followed. With funding from the FBI, the police sent the samples from Fawn's room to a lab for detailed DNA analysis and a search for potential relatives of the DNA's owner. The semen sample found at the murder scene was primarily examined. In November 2020, they finally identified the individual to whom the DNA belonged, Fawn's cousin, Donald Cox. The revelation shook the entire family. At the time of Fawn's death, Donald was 21 years old, and his possible involvement had never been considered. 
Donald had a troubled history and had been frequently incarcerated for misdemeanors such as theft and drug possession. However, during those years, DNA samples were not collected from such criminals, which delayed the resolution of the case. Donald died of an overdose in 2006, and his death was investigated due to suspicious circumstances. A DNA sample was preserved during that investigation but was not entered into the FBI database since he was a victim not a perpetrator. Once the experts informed the police about this discovery, they matched the sample with the semen found at the murder scene, resulting in a 100% match. Despite the significance of this revelation, the police closed the case and did not file new charges against the three original suspects. Fawn's sister believed that there was no point in trying to obtain a confession from them. While the suspects had been present in the house that night, they may not have witnessed the actual murder. It was possible that Donald had been alone in the house and subsequently attacked Fawn. Felicia, another sister of Fawn, added that the three suspects had already faced consequences for their actions. Throughout the unsolved case, the entire neighborhood was convinced of their guilt, leading to negative treatment and consequences for them. Furthermore, after the case was closed, it was revealed that the police initially learned about the suspects from the family of one of them. The family members noticed a Nintendo console among his belongings and remembered that it had been stolen from Fawn's house. This information became public knowledge through news reports, and everyone in the neighborhood was aware of the details. In any case, proving the guilt of the three original suspects was impossible. The relatives of the victim finally knew the name of the killer, but he lived for 17 years without facing any punishment for his crime. During that time, he continued to have contact with his family, but his addiction to illegal substances ultimately led to his demise, rendering him no longer a threat to anyone. Like the video if they found it appealing. A 15-year-old girl disappeared from her bedroom under mysterious circumstances. Police, the FBI, and hundreds of volunteers searched for her, diving into the case. Detectives uncovered many eerie facts and eventually solved this disturbing case. In this video, we tell you what happened to Riley Grossman and why the public was outraged when they learned the bitter truth. Don't right, forget to like this video and subscribe for more. Riley Crossman was born on December 22, 2003, in the small American town of Martinsburg, West Virginia. Her parents divorced when she was young, and the girl moved with her mother and younger sister to Berkeley Springs, a town 40 kilometers from Martinsburg. After a while, her mother began dating another man, and they had two more children. However, Riley maintained a close relationship with her father and regularly went to visit him. The girl attended Berkeley Springs High School and took dance and singing lessons. She also had a boyfriend named Hayden Lacey. According to her parents, there was a great relationship between them. Riley was happy, and she and her boyfriend even had a joint Instagram account where they posted pictures together. Her mom, Chantel Oakley, worked two jobs. On May 7, 2019, she took off early from her morning shift because she wasn't feeling well. When she arrived home, she texted Riley that she was going to sleep in before her evening shift and asked her to wake her up when the girl returned from school. Riley came home at about 3.30 p.m., woke up her mother, and went to her room. Chantel's roommate's mother was also in the house with her that day, effectively replacing her grandmother and looking after the younger children. Chantel returned from work at about 10 p.m. As she walked past her daughter's room, she saw that her door was closed but the light was on behind it. Her mother thought Riley was getting ready for bed and went to bed herself. Almost immediately, she was still not feeling well and wanted to get a good night's sleep before her morning shift the next day. At about 7.15 a.m., Chantel peeked into her daughter's room before she left for work, but Riley wasn't there. She didn't see anything suspicious about that, though. School started at 7.45, and the girl could have gone there already. Riley's school was only a short walk away, so she got there on her own. About halfway through the day, her mother got a call from the school saying that Riley had missed some classes. This alarmed Chantel slightly, but she still didn't see it as a major concern. Her daughter could have just skipped a few classes and gone out with friends. At about 3.30 p.m., Riley's grandmother began to worry. The girl should have been home by now but still wasn't. Then she contacted Chantel, at which point her mother already suspected something was wrong. Riley was always calling or texting her to take time off to go out with friends after school. But that day she didn't get a single message from her daughter. Her mother had sent her several messages, and they had all failed to reach their destination. Then she tried calling her, but each time it went to voicemail. This indicated that Riley's phone was either dead or had been turned off for some reason. Chantel also called Riley's own father, hoping that the girl might have gone to him. However, he too did not contact his daughter that day. The mother asked her grandmother to go to the school and look for Riley there. 
The grandmother went there, but she was unable to locate the girl. None of the teachers knew where she could be either. Around 5 p.m., Chantel decided to take a day off from work and drove to the school, but she couldn't find her daughter either. She spotted her boyfriend in the parking lot and asked if he had seen Riley. But Hayden stated that he had spent the day on an out-of-town trip and had not even contacted her. Together, they went around the school grounds, looking in and around the building itself, but the girl was nowhere to be found. After a while, her mother decided to go home, hoping that Riley might have returned there. Alas, she was not there either. After waiting some more time, she decided to go to the police. By then, the girl's father had arrived in Berkeley Springs and went in search of his daughter. He drove around the small town asking people he met if they had seen Riley. With a population of just over 600, most of the residents knew each other. One of the local teenagers said he saw her walking down the street, but unfortunately, this information did nothing to help him find Riley and investigators thought the boy was just mistaken. The police quickly began a search, interviewing everyone the girl knew. None of her friends had seen Riley that day, nor had she shown up at school. At the same time, several teachers noted that she was present in their classes. This misled the detectives at first, but it soon became clear these teachers had simply failed to notice the girl's absence and flagged her down. From conversations with Riley's acquaintances, the police began to reconstruct the chronology of events. They found out that on the evening of May 7th, the girl was on the phone with her boyfriend until 10.30 p.m., and she answered her friend's messages on social media until midnight. What follows is something very strange. At 5.40 a.m., Riley called her boyfriend by video link, but he was asleep at the time and didn't answer. The detectives immediately suspected something was wrong. Why was Riley trying to contact him at such an early hour? The girl's mother assured her that Riley would never run away from home. She simply had no reason to, given that she was the eldest child in the family. Her mother treated her very gently, almost never forbade her to go out with friends or a boyfriend, allowed her to go to her father's house in another town at any time, and generally did not control her every move. The only thing was that Riley always informed her of her plans and asked permission. Considering that, the girl was only 15 years old at the time of her disappearance. She had no driver's license, so leaving town on her own in a car was not possible. This indicated that the theory of an escape seemed unlikely. Instead, the detectives considered kidnapping as the most likely theory. The same evening, Riley's mother contacted law enforcement, and they began a search for the girl. Police officers searched the school, surrounding area, and combed the town. Community volunteers who cared about Riley joined the search. Small town residents, thinking something like this could never happen to them, were shocked. Soon, the police decided to search Riley's bedroom. There, they found the first grisly piece of evidence, a pillow and sheets with small blood stains. They sent the items to a lab for DNA testing, which confirmed that the blood belonged to Riley. It became evident that something terrible had happened to the girl. After the discovery of the blood, it became clear that Riley had not gone somewhere on her own initiative. It was up to the police to figure out what had occurred. The fact that her mother had not noticed traces of blood earlier was explained by the bed being made, and she didn't think to lift the blanket. The blood trail indicated that the girl had likely been attacked in her house. The police needed to identify the perpetrator. The search escalated, with more volunteers and equipment being provided. Press conferences were held to spread the story to the public in the hopes that someone might have noticed or heard something useful. The local police were joined by the FBI, Department of Homeland Security, and state police. Together, they continued the search, but with no results. Eventually, on May 15, law enforcement decided to bring in additional forces for a large-scale search. The next morning, they announced that Riley Crossman's body had been found about a 40-minute drive from Berkeley Springs, near a country road on a small mountain. It was clear that it was a murder, not an accident, as the body had been hidden away. Medical examiners couldn't determine the cause of death due to extensive decomposition despite it only being just over a week since Riley's disappearance. Several other strange things were noticed, such as the girl wearing only one shoe and different clothing than what she was supposed to be wearing. Traces of whitewash or plaster were also found on her clothes. The case was reclassified as a homicide, and the police had to find the perpetrator. During re-interviews of Riley's relatives and acquaintances, discrepancies arose in the testimony of Andy McCauley, Chantel's roommate. Andy initially claimed he didn't leave work on Riley's birthday, but a neighbor saw a different car parked in front of their house. Andy's driver's license had been revoked, making it suspicious. The neighbor shared this observation with the police, leading to further questioning. Detectives determined that the vehicle belonged to one of Andy's co-workers, who often picked him up for work. Andy changed his statement multiple times, initially denying involvement, then admitting to using the pickup truck to buy illegal substances. More strange discoveries awaited the detectives. Riley's mother was asked about any oddities in her roommate's behavior. She recalled something unusual, 
which she shared with the police. On May 8th, the day her daughter disappeared, Andy had indeed been acting suspiciously when he returned home that night. Chantel told him about Riley's disappearance. The man immediately said he would go looking for her, got on his bicycle, and rode off. However, when the woman returned home from her search, she found Andy asleep on the couch as if nothing had happened. This behavior was very strange. All of Riley's relatives had been combing the streets until late at night, helped by concerned townspeople, while Andy simply went to sleep as if nothing had happened. In addition, one day after the girl went missing, Chantel called Andy and recorded the conversation. Unfortunately, its full content was not disclosed. All we know is that Chantel was already suspicious of Andy at this point and linked it all to his addiction to illegal substances. The police then spoke to Andy's co-worker and found out that, in fact, the man had been absent from work from about 9am until about 2pm. The co-worker also stated that he believed Andy had banned substances with him to begin with, so there was no reason for him to go somewhere to get them. The detectives then searched for the green Dodge and found a large stain of dried plaster in the trunk. Forensics showed that it was the same substance found on Riley's clothing. Investigators also led service dogs to the pickup, which detected a deadly smell in the trunk. Two of the exact same bolts were found near Riley's body. The police soon found another inconsistency in Andy's statement. They examined camera footage from nearby communities and found that on May 8, the man was only a few miles from where Riley's body would later be found. He was caught on gas station store cameras and on several traffic cameras. It was all very strange. Andy didn't have a driver's license, was usually picked up by other people, and got around on his bike. But this day, for some reason, he took someone else's car and drove around for half a day on unfamiliar routes. Another co-worker told the police that on May 8th, Andy asked him for three construction bags. Detectives were also approached by Angie's former co-worker who told an even creepier story. He said that he and Andy had never gotten along, but between about 2 a.m. and 4 a.m. on May 8th, Andy called him dozens of times and also sent a whole bunch of messages. He was in a panic and said he needed to hide with someone right away. Andy explained that he was in possession of illegal substances and was afraid of being caught. This former colleague did not let him in that night but later reported the story to the police. In his defense, the man stated that he had taken illegal substances at night after which he noticed a police car parked not far from his house and panicked. However, the police department checked this information and found that none of their cars were in that area. This meant that Andy's story was a common lie. All of the above was enough for the police to arrest Andy the day after the body was found and charge him with murder. The man denied guilt, so the case went to trial. The case then stalled for more than two years as the trial did not begin until September 27, 2021. This was due to the coronavirus and the limitations associated with it, as well as the peculiarities of the US court system where such delays are the norm. Nevertheless, even more gruesome details of the case emerged during the course of the trial. For starters, Chantel, in her speech, provided one disturbing detail about the evening of May 7. That afternoon, she returned from work at 10 p.m., and Andy was asleep on the couch. When she entered the room, the man immediately woke up. When she saw his eyes, Chantel immediately thought he had taken illegal substances. Andy had used powerful drugs before and even had a criminal record for possession, of which the woman was well aware. Further, the prosecution revealed information about disturbing messages sent from Riley's phone shortly before her disappearance. At 11 p.m. on May 7, the girl texted her boyfriend that Andy had just gone into her room. Twelve minutes later, she sent another text where she wrote that she was scared. She never contacted him again. Unfortunately, Hayden had already gone to bed at that time and did not see these messages. By morning, they had already been deleted. At trial, he also said that Andy had repeatedly entered Riley's room that night. The girl was video chatting with her boyfriend, and Hayden could hear him enter the room. Andy asked her to do the dishes and talked about some other mundane things, but Riley was unequivocally afraid of him. She asked the guy not to pass out while Andy was in her room. It also came out at trial that Andy had called Riley several times around 3 a.m., but she wouldn't pick up the phone, and on the third time, she blocked his number altogether. The whole thing was very creepy and incomprehensible. According to the prosecution's version, Andy made these calls to see if Riley was communicating with her boyfriend at the time. Later, the records of these calls were deleted from both phones, but the cell phone provider still had them. Despite all this, the prosecution had no evidence to indicate what had happened that night. They speculated that Andy killed Riley late that night, waited until morning, and drove to work. He then borrowed a co-worker's car, drove to the house, picked up the body, and took it to a secluded spot. He then cleared the message and call history from her phone and got rid of it. It also emerged at trial that Chantel and Andy's own mother not only knew about his addiction to illegal substances, but they also knew that under their influence, the man was becoming aggressive and dangerous. The final court hearing was held on October 5, 2021. 
Despite the fact that all available evidence was circumstantial and did not directly connect Andy to the murder, the jury reached a guilty verdict. He was found guilty of murder and sentenced to life in prison. Further consideration was given to the possibility of parole. Andy's attorneys asked to give their client the option after 15 years, but the judge ultimately ruled for life without the possibility of parole. As the judge pronounced the sentence, Andy showed no emotion. He also seemed detached and uninterested at previous hearings. Apparently, he had resigned himself to the inevitable. But what about motive? Because of the degree of decomposition, the experts could not establish whether Riley had been abused. However, this is the most obvious option, even though the court could not prove it. This story was widely covered in the American media, and people's opinions were divided. Some put part of the blame on the girl's mother, who brought a convicted drug addict into her home and built a family with him. At the trial, she assured them that it had never even occurred to her that Andy might harm her children. Others defended the mother, believing that she could not have foreseen such an outcome. She worked two jobs most of the time to feed her family, and perhaps she didn't even have time to think about how her decisions might affect her children. What remains unclear is the moment of that 5.30 a.m. video call made from Riley Hayden's phone. Was the girl still alive at that moment, or did Andy make the call to throw off the investigation later? Do you think Chantel should be blamed for the situation? Tell us what you think and don't forget to like this video. Take care and thanks for watching. Don't forget to like this video. Take care and thanks. This mysterious story took place in early 2020. A 16-year-old girl disappeared under strange circumstances, but unraveling the case only made it more confusing. Even though the police have completed their investigation, the case is still one of the most mysterious in recent years. In this video, we will tell you about the gruesome story of Selena Shelley Fay and try to answer the big question, did the police really resolve the case, or did they cover up what really happened to her? Before we start don't forget to like this video and subscribe for more. A Native American, Serena Shelley Fay, was born on June 18, 2003, on the Indian Reservation of Bighorn County, Montana, in a town called Harding. People she knew described her as a kind, cheerful, and very active girl. She loved to play basketball, had many friends, but her main hobby was horseback riding. Selena seriously considered opening her own farm when she graduated from high school, as well as participating in races at the professional level. Even with all the tragedy her family had endured, she kept a positive attitude. Originally a family of five children, Selena's 11-year-old twin sister committed suicide in 2014, leaving no hint as to what prompted her to complete such a tragic move. In 2017, Selena's brother was killed by a police officer, and that same year, Selena's older sister was killed under the wheels of a car. She was walking along the road when an unknown driver hit her and fled the scene. That left only two of the five children. It's hard to believe how much pain and suffering one family can endure. Alas, the tragedies in their lives did not end there. Selena spent New Year's Eve 2020 with friends. They went to a party at a country house where they stayed until the next day. On January 1st, Selena and five of her friends, which included four young men and one girl, drove back to Harding by car. Then, the story gets weird, to say the least. Nevertheless, this is the official data from the case file, and we will read it first. The car malfunctioned on its way into town. The driver parked it at a nearby stop and tried to fix the car. He managed to fix the problem temporarily, but he stated that the car could break down again at any time. For this reason, he asked Selena and her friend Orlando to wait at the stop until his mother drove up there to pick them up. Since she was just under 15 minutes away from the stop by car, the story sounds highly questionable. Why did the girl's friends decide to drive on, leaving them at a bus stop in the middle of nowhere? But that is exactly the way things were, according to the driver. There was also a version that after fixing the car, the driver had to leave immediately, otherwise, the car risked stalling again. And Selena and her friend at the time had gone too far, and the guys decided to leave without them, sending the mother of one of them after them. But this version is not reflected in the police documents but only cited by the local media. What follows is actually confirmed information. The driver's mother had indeed come to the bus stop to pick up the girls, but they were no longer there. Thinking they might have been walking around somewhere nearby, the woman began to look for them. At one point, she did come across Orlando, who was sitting in a ditch looking lost. Her shoes were missing, and all her feet were covered in scratches. Selena was nowhere near her. The shocked woman tried to ask Orlando what had happened, but she said she had absolutely no memory of how she got there and didn't even know where she was. Then, the woman contacted Selena's parents and told them she was missing, and they immediately contacted the police. The first thing the police did was talk to Orlando. She still couldn't remember the details of what had happened. She only told the detectives that she had seen Selena just walk off in the direction of the road into a field, and her friend never saw her again. 
Upon hearing this story, Selena's parents couldn't understand why their daughter would go off in some unknown direction for no apparent reason. The problem was that it was freezing outside, and the girl was clearly not dressed for the weather. She was wearing a light jacket, sweater, and jeans. I think you've already realized how strange this whole story is, but that was just the beginning. On the same day, police organized a large-scale search within a radius of about 6 kilometers of the place where the girl was last seen. Hundreds of people, including service dogs, mounted police, helicopters, ATVs, and even drones with heat sensors, were involved. The FBI also became involved very quickly. The case may have taken on such proportions because of a sad statistic, Native Americans in Montana go missing far more often than other segments of the population. Most of the time, police are as reluctant as possible to investigate these cases and sometimes refuse to do so at all. Locals regularly come out in protests and try to reach out to the federal government, but Native Americans continue to go missing. In addition, Selena's relatives immediately turn to news outlets for help in making the story public and speeding up police work. News of Selena's disappearance quickly spread throughout the city, and hundreds of volunteers joined the search for her. Most were also Native Americans, including students from her school. Adults helped scour the area, and teenagers posted flyers and distributed information about their classmates' disappearance throughout the city. But the search yielded no results. Of course, police examined the car in which Selena and her friends drove home and also questioned all her friends who had been with her that day. And here are things that are just as strange, investigators have not released any information related to this. The friends may not have told them anything useful, but the public was waiting for at least some details. Then, the police decided to pursue another theory, what if Selena had been kidnapped from that bus stop? This theory ran counter to the story of a friend who claimed Selena had gone into the field, but the kidnapping theory received some support as well. A witness reported seeing a green car with Wyoming plates near the bus stop. As the days went by, the search yielded no results, so most people began to consider the kidnapping version as the main one. Reports poured into the police that people had seen the girl in various places, but all these leads proved useless. The police also tried to track the location of the girl's smartphone, but they were unsuccessful. It was turned off. The investigation continued in such ignorance until January 20th. On that day, three weeks after Selena's disappearance, the most mysterious event in the whole story happened, the girl's body was finally found. It was found just a mile from that very bus stop. The body was discovered by the Bighorn County Sheriff, who went by the Indian name Big Hair. Let's refresh your memory on key points, hundreds of volunteers on foot, dozens of horseback riders, service dogs, a helicopter, drones with heat sensors, and a search radius of about 6 kilometers. For all that, the body is found within a kilometer of the bus stop. At this point, everyone had one question, how could they not notice? Of particular note is the fact that the place where Selena was found is practically a bare field. The Bighorn County Sheriff's Office said the preliminary version is that death was due to natural causes. On February 28, more than a month after the body was found, the results of the medical examination came back. The report, signed by four doctors, cited hypothermia as the cause of death. All of this raised even more questions and distrust on the part of the public. Not only were search parties unable to locate Selena in an open field for 20 days, but she also allegedly died of hypothermia a kilometer from the road. Let's take a look at what the temperature was that day. According to a local news site that publishes daily weather information, it was about 8 degrees outside in the afternoon. January 1st, Selena was wearing a light jacket and sweater, although it was not enough for a long and comfortable stay outside. Is it possible for a healthy 16-year-old girl to freeze to death? After all, there was a highway just a kilometer away from her where cars passed by regularly, and she could call for help. How should events have developed so that the girl deliberately waited to die in one place and managed to freeze to death at 8 degrees Celsius? Of course, all these questions fell on the police. Investigators said that drones and a helicopter were obstructed by poor visibility that day due to heavy fog, and that foot and other units simply did not notice Selena, even though they were passing within a few hundred meters of her. As for the dogs, they were service dogs but not search dogs. In addition, they were kept on a leash because many strangers were involved in the search, and the police were afraid to let the dogs go so that they would not attack those present. To Selena's family, as well as the entire Native American community, these excuses seemed utterly unconvincing, and they demanded a thorough investigation into her murder. To them, it looked as if the girl's body had been placed there after the first wave of the search ended. But there was one big problem here, the Bighorn County Sheriff who led the police in this case and personally discovered Selena's body had a very murky history behind him. In 1995, when he was still a simple officer, a Native American woman accused him of violence, but the man denied the charges and was not convicted. Two years later, his service weapon was used in a murder and the would-be sheriff was put on trial again. 
There, he claimed his weapon had been stolen and had nothing to do with the case. All charges were dropped again. But here's the strange thing, he paid the victim's family a portion of the amount they demanded in the lawsuit. Later, he went to court again for assault and battery, but here too, he received no serious punishment. Not surprisingly, the community was slow to take this man at his word. Despite the FBI's involvement in the case, relatives and acquaintances of Selena began to suspect that the sheriff himself might have something to do with the murder of the girl and the further cover-up of this fact. But here, another question arises, even if we imagine that the sheriff grabbed Selena that day and took her to an undisclosed location, what next? The four medical examiners signed a report that clearly stated there were no marks on the girl's body indicating a violent death. They could only confirm death from hypothermia. Given the FBI's involvement, could the sheriff have gotten the four doctors to cover something up? Or could he have kept Selena outside until she actually died of hypothermia? It sounds doubtful. There is another version of what happened. The teens were drinking on New Year's Eve, as the initial toxicology report indicates, but no one knows what they did the next day. They may have continued drinking or taken some kind of illegal substance. As for alcohol, it is unlikely to be relevant. A person would need to drink a lot to just go into a field, lie on the ground, and stay there long enough to die of hypothermia. Even taking into account the fact that Selena was only 16 years old, this theory is somehow not believable. But the version about banned substances could explain a lot. First, let's remember Selena's friend who was sitting in a ditch with no shoes and scratched feet. Then, let's remember the extremely strange story about the broken down car and the unclear reasons why the boys left the girls at a deserted bus stop. Perhaps the teens did take something, but it was too much for the bodies of the two girls. The boys could have gotten scared and just left them at the bus stop. But this theory is greatly undermined by the fact that the driver did call his mother, who came to pick up the girls just 15 minutes later. Would he have done so if the girls were in an inadequate condition? Most likely, teenagers would not have involved their parents in such a situation. But there are a few odd things about their company. First, Selena's friend posted several short videos on Snapchat from that trip. One of the moments shows someone standing in front of the open hood of the car, trying to fix something. At the same time, near the back passenger seat, two guys are arguing aggressively about something. What was going on there is still unknown. All the people who were with Selena that day are silent. What's more, two of them have moved to other states, and Orlando has deleted her Facebook page. It's all very strange. It's been over a year, and none of them have responded to the questions that are still troubling the local Native American community and other concerned people. Nor have the police made any comment about the other teenagers. There is a persistent impression that something is being carefully hidden in this story. As a result, we have a closed case where the official version seems too dubious because, according to it, Selena just went into the field, walked for a few hours, and then just lay on the ground. After all, the police were already on the scene a few hours later, and if she had continued to walk around, she would definitely have been spotted. Furthermore, she could not be found by hundreds of people with modern technology, and 20 days later, her body appeared a kilometer down the road. It looked as if she had been placed there after the active phase of the search was over, although the police assure us that there were no tire tracks or other evidence that the body might have been moved near this spot. One can't trust the police in this case, given the history of the sheriff. One seriously doubts that the police investigation can be considered objective. However, the FBI was involved in the case, and they certainly wouldn't cover up some provincial sheriff. As we can see, each version faces its own contradictions. Now, one and a half years later, the girl's family is still trying to find answers. Out of five children, they have only one son left. They are asking to spread the story about their daughter so they can have a chance at a new, honest investigation. What do you think happened to Selena after all? Share your opinion in the comments and support the video with a if you liked it. Thanks for watching and thank An 11 year old girl vanished from school, leaving no trace, and remained missing for years, making it an eerie and bewildering case in California. With numerous unexpected turns and peculiar facts, this perplexing investigation held the attention of millions worldwide. After 45 years, the truth was finally unearthed, but the story didn't conclude there. In this video, we'll delve into Linda O'Keefe's journey and explore why this inquiry captivated countless individuals globally. Before we start don't forget to like this video and subscribe. Linda O'Keefe, born on May 24, 1962, in Newport Beach, California, USA, Linda O'Keefe grew up in a tight-knit family. Her father worked as a machinist, while her mother was a seamstress. Linda had two sisters, an older and a younger one. Fond of drawing, playing the piano, and cherishing nature and animals, Linda embraced life with enthusiasm. 
Whenever warm summer days arrived, she seized the opportunity to visit the beach, a mere 800 meters from her home. Additionally, she actively participated in the Girl Scouts and attended summer school. In July 1973, Linda, then 11 years old, attended school nearly every day. Typically, she rode her bicycle to school. However, on the morning of July 6, her piano teacher, residing a few houses away from the O'Keefe family, kindly offered to give her a ride home after classes ended around 1.30 p.m. In need of her bicycle that day, Linda used the school phone to call her mother and requested a pickup. Unfortunately, her mother was preoccupied with work and preferred not to be interrupted, advising Linda to walk instead. Despite the distance between school and home being just over two kilometers, Linda hesitated after talking to her mother. She even shed tears, prompting the school secretary to consider giving her a ride. Regrettably, the secretary needed to travel in the opposite direction, relinquishing the idea. Shortly after leaving the school premises, Linda lingered outside the building for a while before embarking on her journey homeward. The route typically required no more than half an hour, yet the girl experienced a noticeable delay. Initially, her mother dismissed it, assuming Linda had met friends and decided to take a stroll. However, as the hours passed, her concern grew exponentially. By 6 p.m., overcome by worry, Linda's mother began reaching out to acquaintances whose children lived nearby, inquiring if they had seen her daughter. Unfortunately, None of them had encountered Linda that day. When Linda's father returned from work, the family initiated a search. They scoured the neighborhood, including the path Linda would have taken from school. Initially, they presumed that the girl, resentful of her mother's refusal to pick her up, intentionally delayed her return home. However, as darkness encroached and Linda remained unfound, they decided to involve the police. Officers filed a missing person report and commenced their investigation. Simultaneously, Linda's father and older sister traversed the neighborhood in two cars, attempting to reassure residents, while her mother remained at home, contacting numerous individuals who might have caught a glimpse of Linda. The search persisted throughout the night, with law enforcement scouring the streets and parks utilizing search dogs and helicopters, yet the outcome remained inconclusive. The following morning, more officers joined the search, and local newspapers reported on the extensive efforts to locate the missing 11-year-old girl. Around 10.30 a.m., a bicyclist, accompanied by a friend and their son, ventured into a park approximately 9 kilometers away from Linda's residence. They visited the park as part of the botanical circle, observing local fauna. As the father and child approached the ditches to observe frogs, they stumbled upon something unexpected. Intrigued by a light object in the grass, the man approached and discovered a partially submerged human body. Having read about the ongoing search for a missing girl in the morning newspaper, he immediately suspected that the body belonged to Linda. Urgently, the man and his companions hurried out of the park, heading to the nearest payphone to report their discovery. En route, they encountered a police officer who had been involved in the search for Linda. Sharing their account, they informed the officer and proceeded toward the location together. The investigators swiftly confirmed that the deceased individual was indeed Linda O'Keefe. She was attired in the same clothing she had worn to school, with her backpack lying nearby. Remarkably, the dress she wore had been handmade by her mother. However, Linda was barefoot, and her shoes were nowhere to be found near the body. Detectives meticulously examined the crime scene discovering tire tracks in close proximity to the body but no other significant clues. The medical examiners determined that Linda had died from strangulation, estimating the time of death to be between 11 p.m. and 2 a.m. It became apparent to the investigators that Linda had likely been abducted shortly after leaving school, implying that the perpetrator had held her captive for approximately 12 hours. Furthermore, the victim had endured abuse, and traces of DNA were discovered on her body, which were preserved in the laboratory as DNA analysis was not yet available during that time. With limited substantial leads, the detectives focused on locating witnesses. They interviewed Linda's friends, school staff, 
and residents along the route she would have taken home. Their efforts soon yielded results. One of Linda's friends had spotted something unusual while the girl was walking home. A turquoise van approached Linda, slowed down, and continued driving alongside her. Unfortunately, the friend lost sight of Linda and the van shortly after. Two additional witnesses came forward. A 19-year-old girl and her mother were driving in a car around 100 yards from Linda's school when they noticed the girl engaged in conversation with the driver of a turquoise van that had stopped beside her. This encounter occurred around 1.15 p.m. Given their proximity to the O'Keefe family and their familiarity with Linda, they found it surprising that she was conversing with an unknown adult male. Intrigued, they decided to observe the situation. The passenger door of the van remained open, and Linda stood in front of it, engaged in conversation with the driver. Eventually, she entered the vehicle. Subsequently, the van departed, and the witnesses did not pay significant attention, assuming Linda had been picked up by a relative or acquaintance, given their belief that she would not willingly enter a vehicle with a stranger. Following these accounts, investigators obtained a rough description of the driver a white man between the ages of 24 and 30, with curly blonde hair and an elongated face. Unfortunately, the witnesses could not recall the license plate number or make of the car. Nonetheless, this testimony provided the most substantial lead in the case, prompting investigators to issue an all-points bulletin, APB, on the suspect and his vehicle. The APB circulated throughout California, but it proved futile in apprehending the perpetrator. Detectives maintained regular communication with the witnesses, hoping they would recollect additional details. Hypnosis sessions were even conducted, partially aiding their memory recall. Although the witnesses managed to provide some supplementary information about the suspect's vehicle, the details were too insignificant to lead to the killer's identification. Another witness emerged, a woman residing near the area where Linda's body was discovered. At approximately 10.30 p.m., the witness heard a woman screaming, with words like, stop hurting me, abruptly cut off. Given the proximity and timing, it was likely connected to the time of Linda's death. Detectives also received an intriguing tip. On the morning of Linda's body being found, an artist was painting in the park. Noticing the multitude of police cars, he grew curious and observed the situation. At one point, he noticed something peculiar, a young man lurking in the bushes, close to his location. Inquisitive, the artist approached the man and inquired about the commotion. The young man appeared deeply concerned and revealed that the police had discovered the girl's body. Despite being positioned far from where the body was found and unable to discern any specific details, the man's foreknowledge of the situation raised questions. The artist described him as a slim white male between 18 and 24 years old, approximately 180 centimeters tall, with blonde hair and sideburns. The description closely matched the accounts of the van's driver provided by the previous witnesses. Consequently, investigators deduced that this individual was the killer and had chosen to monitor the police activity that morning. Despite having a detailed description of the killer's appearance, Locating him in the vast city proved challenging for the police. However, two days later, an unexpected turn of events occurred. Peter Wooden, an 18-year-old who lived near the O'Keefe family and was in the same class as Linda's older sister, came forward and confessed to the murder. The news spread rapidly, shocking the community. The police interrogated Peter for seven hours and searched his parents' home, where he resided. He was formally charged with murder. However, three days later, another surprising twist unfolded. The investigators announced that Peter had been exonerated of all charges and released. His confession contained numerous inconsistencies, with the only coincidences aligning with information already publicized in the newspapers. Moreover, he deliberately provided false testimony that contradicted the actual evidence. Furthermore, the two witnesses who had seen Linda with the van driver unequivocally stated that Peter was not the individual they encountered. Their familiarity with Peter, as he lived nearby, made it clear that he was not the same person. Consequently, 
The police concluded that Peter had fabricated the confession as an attempt to draw attention to himself. While it was possible that he may have had mental health issues, he had no connection to the murder. Following this turn of events, the detectives were left without any solid leads. The search for the van and its driver continued throughout the town, with the entire community, including Linda's classmates, actively participating despite objections from the police. However, these efforts yielded no results. In the initial month of the investigation, 175 individuals were questioned, and every inch of the route from school to home was meticulously searched. The police appealed to the public for assistance. Weeks later, a rough sketch of the van's driver was released, yet it failed to generate any substantial leads. Detectives initially hesitated to release the sketch, fearing that the man might flee the town. However, the urgency to solve the case prompted them to employ additional resources each passing day. Two months later, a new lead emerged when another girl was assaulted in the same neighborhood. An unidentified man had forcibly taken her into his van, transported her to an isolated location, and subsequently released her after committing the crime. Investigators speculated that Linda's killer might be responsible for this new incident, but inconsistencies arose. The assailant drove a white van, and the description of his appearance did not match the information provided by witnesses in Linda's case. Eventually, detectives identified a suspect, a 32-year-old trucker, and his guilt was proven. Witness testimonies confirmed that he bore no resemblance to the man Linda had been seen conversing with. Consequently, investigators concluded that this man had no involvement in her murder. Since then, no significant evidence has emerged in the case, although detectives have continued working on it throughout the years. In 2001, 28 years after the murder, DNA samples from Linda's body were sent to a laboratory to extract the killer's DNA profile. Although they successfully obtained the profile, the man was not found in the FBI database. This indicated that the killer had not been previously convicted in other criminal cases or that the offenses occurred before DNA collection became commonplace. Years later, advancements in DNA analysis technology allowed investigators in Linda's case to turn to a private lab called Parabon in 2018. Utilizing DNA phenotyping, which reveals various traits of a person's appearance based on their DNA sample, Specialists created two portraits of what the perpetrator might have looked like at the ages of 20 and 60. Remarkably, these portraits closely resembled the descriptions provided by witnesses who had seen the suspect 45 years earlier. Typically, police would release these portraits in the media to garner public attention and seek information from individuals who may have known the man. However, the investigators took an unprecedented approach. On July 6, 2018, Precisely 45 years after the murder, they took to Twitter and posted a series of messages in the name of the victim herself. The 68 tweet series detailed Linda's final day, portraying her perspective and recounting the events of July 6, 1973. Each message was meticulously selected by the detectives to construct an accurate representation of that fateful day. The Twitter narrative concluded by stating that the search for Linda's killer had remained unsuccessful followed by the release of the perpetrator's portrait on behalf of the girl. Now, 45 years later, I can speak again, and there is something important I have to tell you. There is a new lead in my case, a face obtained thanks to the DNA of the killer, which he left behind. This technology didn't exist in 1973, but now it can change everything. This innovative approach instantly captured the attention of a vast global audience. While police had previously shared information on old unsolved cases via social media, a narrative presented from the victim's perspective was unprecedented. Although the portrait of the killer alone could not solve the case unless someone recognized him and reported to the police, the investigators aimed to generate as much attention as possible. In total, over 7 million people viewed the series of tweets. The police received numerous tips and potential identifications of the perpetrator, prompting the detectives to spend several months investigating each lead. Unfortunately, they were unable to find a suitable suspect among the information provided. Nonetheless, 
the investigators remained resolute, particularly with the immense public interest that Linda's case had garnered. Once again, they turned to Parabon, requesting assistance in identifying the killer's relatives through his DNA. A similar endeavor had been attempted by forensic scientists in the early 2000s, but the necessary tools were not yet available. However, almost two decades later, the situation had changed. Parabon's experts successfully located individuals related to the DNA's owner, providing investigators with crucial information that could lead to the identification of the perpetrator. After months of extensive research and utilizing private DNA databases, investigators in Linda's case were able to identify the killer's third cousin, bringing them one step closer to solving the case. However, their breakthrough took an unexpected turn when they discovered that the killer's own DNA was present in one of the private databases. James Allen Neal, a 72-year-old man living in another state, emerged as the prime suspect. In January 2019, detectives visited Neal's residence to gather a sample of his DNA, a necessary step for legal proceedings. They set up surveillance and collected items from his garbage, which were sent to the lab for analysis. Although initial attempts to obtain a DNA sample failed, they successfully retrieved one when Neil discarded a cigarette butt during a parking lot encounter. The DNA from the sample matched the DNA found on Linda's body, conclusively linking James Neal to the crime that had remained unsolved for almost half a century. A few days later, a press conference was held to announce the arrest of James Neal. Born in 1946 in Chicago, Neal's family later relocated to California. Throughout his childhood, he experienced regular abuse and humiliation from his parents, which led to aggressive behavior from an early age. As a teenager, he engaged in various petty offenses, including burglary. After dropping out of school, he pursued short-lived jobs but never maintained stability for more than a few months. James Neal had an extensive criminal history, having been arrested over 12 times for crimes ranging from theft to robbery. However, he often received minimal punishments and swiftly returned to his old ways. At the age of 25, he married for the first time, and the couple settled in the Los Angeles suburbs, a short distance from where Linda lived. It was two years into their marriage that he committed the heinous act of killing Linda. During this time, James's wife was pregnant, and he was already on probation for lesser crimes in another state. In the subsequent years, Neil was cited multiple times for theft and counterfeit activities, and he briefly served time in prison for violating probation terms. After his release, he encountered further legal trouble for traffic violations. He divorced his first wife, with whom he had two daughters. He later lived in different states before returning to Colorado, where he married another woman in 1997. They had a daughter together, joining her child from a previous marriage. Further investigation into Neil's background revealed potential involvement in numerous cases of child abuse, although he had never been held accountable for these actions. In 1995 and 2004, he allegedly kidnapped two girls, subjected them to abuse, and then released them. However, he was never proven guilty in these instances, leaving him free to continue his activities. Police suspected him of being involved in at least five additional similar cases where unidentified men in cars abducted girls from the streets. In 2010, a girl from the same church as Neil accused him of molesting her when he was 63 years old. The victim provided accounts of several similar incidents, and Neil eventually confessed. However, the case inexplicably ended up being suppressed, with the victim retracting her accusations, and James Neal went unpunished. He resumed his regular life, remaining off the police's radar for the next nine years until his arrest for Linda's murder. During the trial, Neal consistently denied any involvement, claiming he had never abducted any girls. When shown a photo of Linda, he stated he had never seen her with a man and suggested she resembled one of his daughters. Despite his denials, the presence of his DNA on the victim's body left little room for doubt, making his guilt apparent to investigators. Additional evidence was gathered to strengthen the case, 
including attempts to ascertain if Neil owned a turquoise van. However, no confirmation of this fact was found, which was explained by his employment at the time as a worker in an apartment complex, providing access to a service van. During the search of Neil's residence, investigators discovered several hard drives containing illegal materials, along with similar photos and videos on his smartphone. Notably, his computer revealed an interest in the history of violent criminals apprehended through DNA analysis, suggesting his awareness of the potential link between DNA and crime solving. Another chilling revelation occurred during the examination of Neil before his placement in a cell. A tattoo bearing Linda's name was discovered on his wrist. However, it was later confirmed to be an eerie coincidence, as James had acquired the tattoo long before the murder. The trial, originally scheduled for February 2020, was postponed due to the pandemic. Throughout the proceedings, James Neal maintained his innocence, but the overwhelming evidence against him left little doubt about his role in Linda's murder. However, the case never reached trial, as in May, Neal was hospitalized and succumbed to lung cancer two days later. Unaware of his illness at the time of his arrest, it was too late for medical intervention. Finally, the case that had haunted investigators for half a century found closure. Detectives continue to believe that Neil may have had numerous additional victims, and they remain committed to investigating in that direction. Linda's parents, who had long since passed away, carried the burden of guilt throughout their lives, particularly Linda's mother, who blamed herself for not picking her daughter up from school. Linda's sisters expressed gratitude to the investigators for their unwavering commitment to solving the case, although they regretted that their parents did not live to witness the day justice was served. Share your opinion on this story in the comments and don't forget to like this clip if you liked it. Thanks for watching. In 1999, a mysterious disappearance occurred in the United States that still haunts people's minds today. An 11-year-old girl was left alone for 90 seconds and literally vanished. Years later, police would find a bill with I am alive written on it in the girl's name. In this video, we've compiled all the information we have on what happened to Michaela Biggs on January 2, 1999, in the American city of Mesa, Arizona. Before we start don't forget to like this video and subscribe for more. Two sisters, 11-year-old Michaela and 9-year-old Kimber, were walking close to home. It was a chilly evening, and it was just beginning to get dark outside. Despite the height of winter, Arizona is a warm southern state, so Michaela brought her bike and rode alongside her sister. At one point, the girls thought they heard the sound of an approaching ice cream truck. They put speakers on them and turned on music to alert children to the approach of a favorite treat. The girls hurried home to ask their mother and change for ice cream, then returned to the street. However, the ice cream truck was nowhere to be found, and the girls began to wait. At some point, Kimber got cold. She told her sister that she would run inside to get a jacket and come back. When she arrived back, Michaela was no longer there. The bike was lying on the road with its wheels still spinning. Beside it lay the two coins the girls had prepared to buy ice cream. Kimber came home and told her mother that Michaela was missing. Neither she nor her mother had yet allowed even the thought that anything could have happened to the girl. The mother thought that Michaela had gone to a neighbor with whom the family was friendly, but the girl was not there and the mother realized that something terrible might have happened to her daughter. Immediately thereafter, she went to the police. It is worth noting that the police response was very fast. Already in 30 minutes, a helicopter was in the air. The law enforcers stopped all suspicious cars, bypassed the surrounding houses. That day, volunteers from the girls' school handed out and posted flyers with her picture. Those pictures would later appear in storefronts and on billboards along roads throughout Arizona. Police searched dumpsters and inspected hundreds of homes. Detective Butch Gates and Jerry Giselle were assigned to the case. The cops questioned every ice cream vendor in the state and could not establish that at least one of them was in that area at the time of the girl's disappearance. Detectives reconstructed the chronology of events and came to an eerie conclusion, the girl disappeared in just 90 seconds. That's how long Kimber had been missing. The spinning wheel on the bicycle confirmed the fact that the abduction had taken place extremely quickly. Search dogs, the help of which was used by the investigation, could not get a trace of the girl. And when they did, they took only a few steps in the direction of the road. The fact that the dog takes the mark of the person only when the missing person left on their feet only reinforced the main version of the police. The girl was put in a car, taken away, and it all happened in a matter of seconds. The situation was complicated by the complete lack of witnesses. Despite the fact that the girls were playing in a street filled with houses, none of the neighbors saw them that night. 
Later, there was information that a man tried to kidnap the two girls right out of school. The children were 10 and 11 years old at the time. Police checked the information for a connection to the disappearance of Michaela, who was just 11, but the kidnapping turned out to be a failed prank. There was less and less evidence, so police began working out the standard theories. When a child goes missing, parents and other relatives are always checked, given that Michaela's mother was at home. At the time of the kidnapping, investigators took on the girl's father, Darian Biggs. From the beginning, no one really believed in his involvement. Why would a father kidnap his own daughter, especially in such a way, in the middle of the street, in a short period of time when his other daughter was running home? However, it soon became clear that the man had lied about his alibi. During the first interrogation, he stated that he was at work at the time of the abduction, which turned out to be untrue. In reality, he was spending time with his mistress. What happened next was even more interesting. The man failed the polygraph questioning, and his wife admitted that she knew about the cheating. Darian himself had told her about it a month before it happened. The couple thought about divorce. Despite the fake alibi, the police eventually stopped considering the father as a suspect. Even in the event of a divorce, his wife had no plans to forbid him from seeing his children. He simply had no motive. In addition, the detectives acknowledged that the lie detector results may have been influenced by the emotional state of the father, whose daughter had just been abducted. He may even have laid some of the blame on himself and thought that if he had been home with his family, the tragedy could have been avoided. Detectives also tracked Darian's movements that evening and determined that he simply would not have had time to hide Michaela. The man showed up at home very quickly after his spouse called him to report his daughter missing. Detective Giselle later stated that Michaela most likely did not know her abductor. If it had been the father, she would not have thrown the bicycle and change on the ground. The girl tried to run away from the stranger but simply did not make it. During the investigation, police regularly had leads that led nowhere. An anonymous man called detectives and reported that Michaela's body was in an abandoned factory on the outskirts of town. Police combed the area but found nothing. Later, they received an email from an anonymous man claiming that he was the one who had kidnapped the girl. The FBI fairly quickly traced the sender's IP address and sent a SWAT team to his home in the city of Phoenix. It turned out that the sender was a 12-year-old boy who had just decided to make a joke. Meanwhile, the police had reached a stalemate, beginning to process even the most incomprehensible theories. They combed through 35 abandoned gold mines in the county and then even questioned nearly 500 psychics who could supposedly help the investigation. Of course, this went nowhere. One witness was found who had seen a mint-colored jeep shortly before Michaela was kidnapped. The driver was quickly found and proved innocent. After that, the police were already desperate to find the girl because there was literally not a single clue left in front of them. This went on until September 27, 1999, when the quiet county was shocked by another event. A woman living near Biggs returned home and walked into the kitchen to find a middle-aged man with his pants unbuttoned. Without uttering a word, he jumped on the woman and began strangling and abusing her. The perpetrator then set fire to the house and left. Apparently, the attacker thought his victim was dead, but the woman survived. Her neck was broken, but she was able to reach the phone and call an ambulance. Already on her way to the hospital, she whispered to the doctors from her last breath, Michaela Biggs, the girl who is missing, he took her, you must save her. The whole town was shocked again, and events swirled rapidly. The police took up the case and arrested the assailant. He turned out to be D. Bullock, a well-known alcoholic in the area who lived with his wife and three children, repaired wrecked cars, and occasionally disrupted public order. His house was only two blocks from Biggs. D. was one of the first to volunteer to help find Michaela and willingly let the police into the house to search, but not into the trailer in the backyard. For the trailer, he demanded a warrant. This behavior was extremely bizarre. A man with a bad reputation volunteering to help find a missing girl, giving the police a look around his house without any questions, and suddenly forbidding them to look in the trailer. From then on, Bullock became the prime suspect, even though his wife provided him with an alibi for the time Michaela was kidnapped. No one believed her story, and most likely she was just afraid of her husband. Detectives began digging into Bullock's past and discovered that he had been tried three times for violence and molestation, as well as for kidnapping minors. He didn't get out of prison until 1995, and at that time, none of the neighbors had any idea what kind of monster lived next door. Several times a week, Michaela took private piano lessons from a neighbor who lived across the street from Bullock's house. This suggested that the man may have known the girl long before she disappeared. After Bullock was arrested for assaulting the woman, the police searched his house again and planned to investigate the trailer he had kept them out of earlier. But they were disappointed. The trailer had disappeared without a trace. This was a major blow to Michaela's parents. They were sure their daughter was there, alive or not, but she had disappeared, and the police were unable to trace her location. Bullock was sentenced to 15 and a half years in prison for the September 27, 1999, attack on the woman. 
he categorically denied any involvement in Michaela's disappearance. This was not surprising, for the attack on his neighbor and the atrocities he committed. 15 years in prison would be a lenient sentence by U.S. standards. A confession to kidnapping an 11-year-old girl, on the other hand, could have landed him straight in the electric chair. The parents could not accept that their only hope for the truth was gone. The mother and father wrote Bullock a letter directly to the prison, asking the ultimate question, whether he had anything to do with Michaela's disappearance. No one hoped to get a confession, but the criminal's answer took them by surprise. He wrote that the conversation was too personal and suggested that her parents visit him in prison. At that moment, hope rekindled in the hearts of the parents. The Bullock would confess, but they were greatly disappointed sitting across from the perpetrator. The father asked if he had anything to do with his daughter's disappearance. Bullock simply replied that he had nothing to do with her disappearance. The conversation continued in this vein for several more minutes, after which the perpetrator simply picked up and left accompanied by security. It looked as if he was just teasing the parents, giving them false hope and destroying it by looking them in the eye. For a sadist like Bullock, the suffering of others can bring unsurpassed pleasure. This is apparently why he arranged the meeting with the grief-stricken parents. Afterwards, Michaela's father confessed that he was convinced that Bullock was involved. He stated, I was sitting a few feet away from the guy who killed my daughter and there was nothing I could do about it. At this point, even the most staunch hopes of solving the case were abandoned. Absolutely everyone believed that no new leads would ever emerge. Years later, they would realize that they were wrong, but more on that later. On the fifth anniversary of Michaela's disappearance, the parents buried an empty coffin, finally saying goodbye to their daughter. During this time, their marriage broke up. They changed residence and were reluctant to contact journalists. Until 2018, the case went into a long drawer. The police simply had nothing to work with. But out of the blue, an event occurred that stirred up all of America. On March 14, 2018, a dollar bill was accidentally dropped at a police station in Nina, Wisconsin. On it was written in stubby handwriting, My name is Michaela Biggs, kidnapped from Mass, I am alive. The bill was found by a local resident who was collecting coins and dollar bills in a jar. He was the one who came across the dollar, after which he reported the find to the police and they instantly reopened the investigation. Michaela's mother rushed nearly 2,000 miles away to look at the handwriting and see if the message was actually written by her daughter. Other relatives also came to the station, but they all made a disappointing statement. The handwriting looked nothing like Michaela's, and the name was misspelled. The mother suggested that the bill might be someone's extremely unfortunate prank. The other relatives also supported this theory. Despite this, the police attempted to trace the bill's path. Alas, it was almost impossible to do so. Paper money changes owners so many times that it was impossible to find the author of this inscription. Experts who studied the bill suggested that the inscription was made by an adult man who was trying to imitate the handwriting of a child. Despite all this, the message on the paper bill seems highly suspicious. Could it have been someone's prank? The chance of police and relatives finding out about the bill are extremely slim. It could have been passed around for years, or it could have settled in a bank vault and no one would have noticed it. The fact that it ended up in the hands of a concerned person who reported it to the police is more of a miracle than inevitability. As for the handwriting, the most obvious version cannot be ruled out. Michaela may have written in a hurry for fear of being caught. Besides, she had been missing for nine years before the bill appeared. Assuming someone held her captive, did they give her something to write all that time? In nine years without practice, handwriting can change beyond recognition. There is another question no one knows the answer to, how long ago was this writing made? The bill could have been in circulation for years, or it could have appeared shortly before it was discovered. It's worth remembering about Bullock, who was supposed to be released from prison in 2017. Perhaps this evil prank is his doing, suffice it to recall how he tormented unhappy parents by giving them false hope. Perhaps we will never know the answer to all these questions again, or this case will once again shake the world with unexpected details. Kimber, who was the last person to see her older sister before she was kidnapped, still can't forget that gruesome January night. For a long time, she blamed herself for going home to get her jacket. But now she realizes against an adult kidnapper, she would have been helpless. Kimber raises her young son, to whom she constantly talks about his aunt Michaela. She calls her an angel who looks out for him. The girl, as well as the rest of her family, are sure that Michaela was kidnapped by Bullock. But without evidence, it can never be proved unless the criminal himself decides to confess in order to deal another blow to the missing girl's family. Do you think there's any hope that the writing on the bill was done by Michaela herself and she is still alive? Write your thoughts in the comments below the video. Also don't forget to like the video if you like it. Take care of yourself and your loved ones.